Welcome to the ultimate smart contract security assembly and DeFi curriculum that has ever existed, existed, existed. So buckle up and let's get froggy. This is the most advanced security auditing EVM assembly and DeFi course ever created. And it's not for everybody. Are you ready? Smells like Web3 is getting a little bit safer. Welcome to the most cutting edge smart contract security and auditing course ever created. And there was so much content, we had to actually break it up into two parts. This is part one. During this part one, I'm going to ingrain in you the skill set that the top security and DeFi researchers use to keep protocols secure. For those of you who want to get a job becoming a smart contract security researcher or auditor, which by the way, right now has a average salary of 120 to 130K. This is for those of you who want to get a job at a top Web3 security firm like Open Zeppelin, Siphon, or Trail of Bits. This is for those of you who want to become a smart contract security researcher or auditor, a top competitive auditor a top bug bounty hunter where rewards skyrocket to up to three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars a year. But I have to warn you, only the tippity top percent are going to make it there. This is for you who don't care about becoming a security researcher, but you want to become one of the best smart contract developers on the planet. And of course, this is for those of you who are sick of seeing all the hacks in Web3 and want to jump in and want to do something about it. But more important than salary or careers or anything, this is your chance to get in, be a badass and contribute and getting Web3 where it needs to be. There is massive demand for us to level up for security right right now. At the end of the day, repetition is the mother of all skill. And that's why at the end of part one, you won't have just done one security audit or security review. You won't even have done two, three, four. You'll have five security reviews under your belt taught by professionals that you can put on your portfolio and say, look at how amazing I am. So we take this novel approach to learning to jam pack these teachings into you. But not only that, we're also secretly going to be teaching you DeFi the whole time. At the end of this, you are going to have a Uniswap fork audited. You are going to have a Compound and Aave fork audited. Whoa, Patrick, that sounds really hard. We're going to take you step by step. But you don't have to just take my word for it. The instructors of this course to take you along in your journey are some of the best in the entire industry. For myself, I'm one of the lead instructors for this course, and this is my fourth ultimate mega monstrosity Web3 and smart contract development course, where previously we have created both the number one and number two most watched smart contract development course on the planet. And thousands of students have gotten hired at top Web3 companies through them. I'm also the co-founder of smart contract security firm Cyphern, where we also do competitive audits on the Codox platform. But don't just take my word for it. Additionally, this course is made in part with The Red Guild, starring Tincho, legendary security researcher in the Web3 space. Tincho himself was previously the lead auditor at Open Zeppelin, which if you've here, you've probably used their contracts before. They create and maintain security focused projects like Damn Vulnerable DeFi and are funded by the Ethereum Foundation since day one, because even the Ethereum Foundation recognizes how important and talented this group is. And then finally, they have collectively discovered vulnerabilities in protocols like ENS, Lido and Optimism, resulting in hundreds of thousands of dollars in bug bounty payouts. So yes, the co-creator of this course is one of the best the industry has ever seen. But even then, it's not just us two. Additionally, we have guest lecturers for some of the best, including Pashav, one of the top solo independent security researchers of all time. Owen from Guardian Audits, responsible for security research on projects like GMX. Juliet, a Cypher team member and ex-Aragon DAO specialist. Alex Rohn being responsible for integrating tens of billions of dollars of contracts, including Chainlink and Compound. Johnny, a professional security researcher and course creator. Andy Lee, a fellow security YouTuber and Sigma Prime. And then finally, Jocelyn, head of blockchain at Trail of Bits, one of the top security firms of Web3. And and also insight from Hans Fries, the number one competitive auditor for the first half of 2023, and a whole list of other people who helped bring this course to life. Now, in this part one, these five security reviews, these five audits, these five portfolio projects, I've specifically made them, I've specifically stuck specific bugs in them to fine tune your learning process for this journey. In these audits, in these security reviews, you will learn how to identify, report, and then mitigate the top hacks in all of Web3 and a lot of hacks that go under the radar. Reentrancy, MEV, reward manipulation, failure to initialize, invariance breaking, mishandling of ETH, missing access controls, oracle manipulation, stigma to replay, storage collision, weak randomness, and so much more. This is for any Anybody who wants to make Web3 more secure, start their career in Web3 or empower the skill set that they already have. So with all that being said, your journey begins now. Are you ready? Unlike my previous courses, 
This one has a number of prerequisites. We will have a refresher section in case any of these aren't ironclad for you. But let's start by going over those and talking about what else you'll need to be successful in this course. This is not for beginner developers. If you're unfamiliar with any of these terms here, I got news for you. You got some prerequisites to do. People who want to take this course and be the most successful need to have a basic understanding of blockchain basics, solidity fundamentals, and working with a smart contract framework like Hard Hat or Foundry, ideally Foundry, because that's the main tool we're going to be working with in this course. Things like storage, self-destruct, fallback functions, ERC-20s, these should not be unfamiliar terms for you. We will do a quick refresher at the beginning of this course, but we do expect a certain level of skill to start this security course. If you've taken my Foundry full course, you are perfectly up to speed with the prerequisites. In the GitHub repo associated with this course, we've got more resources to help you get up to speed as well, and we'll get to that in a minute. If you've already done some security and done some auditing, perfect, you're in the right place. We're gonna level you up even harder. And additionally, we're gonna teach you how to not just be an auditor, but a security researcher. Keyword here is researcher. We're going to give you the skills so that every time these attackers come up with new attacks to break our systems, you can go out, pump that security researcher iron and get better at defending. And for those of you who are coming with a security background already, just jump to the sections that you want to go to. We've got the entire curriculum for this in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Link to that is in the description. And additionally, for those of you watching this on YouTube, at some point, we're going to kick you over to Cypheron Updraft. And the reason we're going to do that is because we've made Cypheron Updraft to specifically hypercharge your learning experience and make you learn more efficiently and faster. And in fact, one of the first to do's that we're going to have you do is to sign up for Cypheron Updraft. Don't worry, it's completely free. I absolutely love Web3 and the ability it gives us to do all these fantastic things. But not only that, I love taking smart contract developers, security researchers and hypercharging them, hyperfueling them with the knowledge and power to get into this space and become productive and start doing amazing things. I think the key to being successful in the Web3 space is having a phenomenal foundation, a phenomenal base. And for security, that's what we're going to give to you in this video. And that's why I'm incredibly excited that you're here with us on this journey. I think security is one of the most important things to unlocking the future of Web3. Look, I've been doing this for years, and I know a lot of you have seen my videos and you know the drill, you know what I'm about. And same as always, I am 100% confident that if you follow along with us on this journey, if you watch this video to its completion, you will come out the other side armed with the knowledge to be a positive force in the smart contract security, auditing, and safety space. So let's begin our journey by talking about some best practices. That way, you can get the absolute most out of this course and be as effective as possible. Now, there are two links in the description that I want you to pause the video right now, go into the description and click on and open up. First one is going to be a link to Cypheron Updraft. And the second one is a GitHub link to a repo, also known as a repository, with all the code and all the lessons and everything we're going to be covering in this video. This is going to be your Bible for the duration of watching this video. It has everything that we're going to go over. It has all the code, context, text, et cetera, that you're going to need to be successful in this video. And I'm going to be referring to it pretty often as we go through the course. Additionally, in this GitHub, there's a discussions tab right here that you can click on. And in here is where you can ask questions, discuss with other people taking the course, interact with members helping out, and it's where you can discuss anything that you're having trouble with. And additionally, once we do get to the coding portion of this course, it's a good idea to code along with me as I'm explaining things. So having the video up as well as your coding screen is a good idea so you can follow along with me as I'm explaining it. Now we're going to be keeping all of the code in here up to date, but sometimes things change and something that I do in the video might not be the most up to date best practice. So we highly recommend that you sign up for a Cypher and Updraft because the most up to date lessons and texts and code is always going to be on Cypher and Updraft. So be sure to refer to that if the code isn't exactly matching up what you're seeing on video. Take breaks. I cannot tell you how many people have tried to rush through these courses and be like, oh, I'm going to finish in a single weekend. Your brain doesn't work like that. Your brain needs time to absorb the information. So take breaks. Maybe every 25 minutes to a half hour, take a five minute break. Or maybe you like working in longer chunks. Maybe take a whole hour and then take a 15, 20 minute break. Don't try to rush through the whole video in a day. You're not going to retain the information. 
go outside, go for a walk, grab some ice cream, get some coffee, go to the gym. Your brain needs time to have the information settle. Maybe every two hours, just step away. Maybe be done for the day. Work at whatever pace makes sense for you. Everyone's going to have a different learning pace. There is no right speed for this course. I've had people take my courses in two weeks, in three months, in six months. It doesn't matter. Pick a pace that you can do and stick to it. Not only work at your pace, make sure that I'm talking at a pace that makes sense for you. There's a little gear icon in the YouTube video here where you can change the speed of how I'm talking and how fast the video is going. So if I'm talking way too fast for you, then you can slow me down. But if I'm talking too slow, then you can speed me up. So make the adjustments you need to make me go the speed you want me to go. Now, a giant video like this can be kind of hard to triage where you left off. So using the GitHub repo with the timestamps in there is a good way to say, ah, okay, I was on lesson one. Let's click the link there to jump right to the timestamp. If you pause a video in YouTube, you can actually right click and say, copy at current time and maybe drop that into a notes folder somewhere so that you can always just pick right back up where you left off. Or like I said, you can use some of the timestamps in the GitHub repo associated with this course. And of course, this course is modular. So you can bounce around topic to topic and go to where you want to go. Like I said, go the pace and take the learnings that you want to do. And after every lesson, it might be a good idea to go back and reflect on each lesson to really make sure the knowledge gets ingrained. Repetition is the mother of skill. And we're going to be repeating a lot of smart contract development. Blockchain development and open source development world is incredibly collaborative. So be sure to use tools like, of course, the GitHub discussions tab, Ethereum Stack Exchange, the decentralized Q&A forum, Piranha, issues on different GitHubs, artificial intelligence, and more. And like I said, we'll give you more tips on how to most effectively use these sites in the future. And the reason I'm putting so much emphasis on this and that I will continue to put so much emphasis on this, knowing where to go for information and how to collaborate with people is often more important than your smart contract knowledge. Because oftentimes you're gonna run into issues you don't know how to solve. So we're gonna teach you to unblock yourself on this and really anything in life. Plus syncing with other people in the space makes it way more fun. Now, before we jump in super deep, let's talk about the current state of Web3 security. So the image in front of you is from a group called Chainalysis, and it represents the total value stolen in crypto hacks and number of hacks for over the last six years, basically prior to this year. And as we were saying before, you know, it's we're almost at the end of 2023 and we're almost on track to do something similar to 2021. This number is outrageous. That's 3.1 billion dollars stolen in 2022 and it looks like for 2023 we might be around three billion maybe two point something billion in any case it's a really big number and why is this so important why, why are these numbers so staggering well the DeFi tvl today is around 40 billion dollars right and the DeFi tvl hacked was around 3.1 billion dollars so in this uh, image it says 3.8 billion that's total hacked 3.1 of those billion were directly from DeFi. So if you do the math, that's around 7% of all DeFi TVL, uh, which is pretty terrible. So we have this amazing future of finance, this amazing thing that's Web3. And it's kind of like saying, you know, a bank teller saying, hey, like, welcome to DeFi. Welcome to the DeFi bank. By the way, there's a one in 20 chance that if you put your money here, it will be gone by next year. There's a guy named Peter. He runs this this newsletter called Blockchain Threat Intelligence. He recently did a top 10 list by risk by number of money stolen. And you can see that list here. However, this is only as of early June 2023. This number has since been updated to something more like this. So the ordering hasn't actually changed. But for the first six months of 2023, price oracle manipulation attack was the most common attack vector. You'll learn about that later. Reward manipulation, then stolen private keys kind of a big jump, insufficient function, logic error, and, and all these other issues resulting in millions of dollars lost. As of the most recent list here, it looks like actually stolen private keys is number one, reward manipulation being number two, and price oracle manipulation number three. Reentrancies are a bigger issue, misconfiguration, governance issues. There's all these 
issues that are popping up and these numbers keep climbing and climbing as the year progresses. As of recording, it's October and we've seen multi-million dollar hacks just within the last couple of months. And this is unfortunately right now is the norm and this is unacceptable. So we can now ask, you know, what's going well? What are we doing poorly? And how do we move forward here? And the reason this is so important is because we need to reduce this number in order for us to go mainstream. If this is what retail ads, if this is what hedge funds are confronted with when they come to our space, they're never going to come to our space because there's no way in hell a teacher's pension fund is going to put their money in a location where they have a one in 20 chance of getting wrecked. Absolutely not. So there's a number of things going well. Number one, you're taking this course. So that is going well already. We're getting more of these pre-deployment security experts. Education in the Web3 space is improving. Tooling is improving. Protocols are taking security more seriously, which is great. You know, protocols are kind of, protocols often have this question that they want to ask themselves. Okay, should I spend a million dollars on security or should I suffer a $100 million attack? Luckily, more often than that, they're choosing to focus on security as opposed to getting attacked. Spending money on security represents a 99% reduction of getting wrecked costs. We're getting more pre-deploy security experts, you know, like, like Cypherin, Trail Bits, Open Zeppelin. We're getting competitive auditors like Codehawks. We're getting independent researchers like Peshav. We're getting people who to jump on these leaderboards. We're getting better and better at doing these audits and these security reviews. We have all these competitive audit platforms like Codehawks coming out, giving people a chance to actually start their journey and actually grow quickly. Competitive audits are one of the fastest ways to grow and learn in the Web3 industry. The education in the space is improving. We've got solid. We've got this course that we're teaching right now. We've got more YouTubers coming out with more content. Solid in particular is a tool that we're going to be learning later on in this course, and it's going to be a way we can actually research and learn the latest and greatest findings that other security professionals have found and reported. However, there's a lot of stuff that's not going very well, such as centralized technology still plaguing Web3, a lack of post deployment practices, which we're going to go over towards the end of the course, not following security best practices, and there's this large community security disconnect. We've seen a lot of hacks where a leak in private keys or using a centralized technology causes the hack. And we need to move to a place where that's no longer the case. Post deployment practices are still subpar. Some of the top hacks for this year, people didn't even notice them until, you know, up to an hour or longer after the hack actually occurred. Not everyone is using a bug bounty to continue having security on their protocol. We're still seeing people skip out on audits, skip out on security reviews, and get hit by some of the most common attacks ever. The reentrancy vulnerability has been around since 2016. We know what it is, we know how to look for it, and people are still getting hit by it. Price oracle manipulation is another one protocols are constantly being hit with, and we've known about for a long time. And then finally, we're seeing a huge disconnect between the community and security professionals. An audit doesn't necessarily mean a protocol is safe for users. And sometimes even if an audit happens, maybe users don't even read the security report. We've seen security professionals say, hey, there's a good chance that this whole protocol can rug you. And sure enough, it does rug users, but nobody read the report. So there's lots of ways we can improve. There's lots of room for growth in the Web3 security industry, which is why I'm so excited that you're here learning about this. Because if we don't fix this issue, we will never move past this. We will never see the ultimate goal and we will never deliver on the promise of what Web3 is. And again, if you don't know what the promise of Web3 is, you need to go watch my Foundry course or you need to watch the Why Web3 Matters video or blog that I've written. Links to that, of course, in the GitHub repo or Cypher and Updraft associated with this video. And again, Peter from the Block Threat Intelligence did a phenomenal state of DeFi a few months ago at the DeFi Security Summit. I will leave a link to that in the GitHub repo and Cypher and Updraft as well for you to view if you want to learn more about the current state of Web3 security. Web3 has the ability to change everything about life and everything about the financial ecosystem as we know it. But we're only going to get there if we lock down our security from developers and security researchers like yourself. So... Now that we're caught up to speed with why Web3 security is so important, but let's go into a little bit of a refresher on Solidity, on Foundry, on some of the tools that are prerequisites for this course so that we can always be on the same page. Now, before we do that though, in each one of these sections, if we scroll down, we just went through the introduction, resources, and prerequisites, and we just finished section zero. If we scroll down to the bottom of each one of these sections, 
we have this exercise section. These are going to be exercises to give you more opportunities to learn and to grow and sometimes put yourself out there. The exercise for lesson zero is going to be the easiest one, but it's also one of the most important ones. Your exercise for lesson zero is going to be write yourself a message about why you want to do this. Don't tweet this out. Don't LinkedIn this out. Don't post this anywhere. This is for you. Write this on your whiteboard. Write this on your notes. Write this on your VS code, wherever you want to write this. Make it as long as possible. Make it really emotional. Make it, you want to feel it in your core why you want to take this course and why you want to reach the other side. Is it money? Great. Are you trying to make a ton of money? Awesome. Are you trying to save Web3? Are you trying to do a lot of good for the world? Are you trying to become somebody? Write down as many reasons as possible, but reasons that you really believe in. Don't bullshit yourself and don't send this anywhere. Studies show that if you share your goals and you share your rationales for doing something, it can often diminish your motivation to do it. So this is just for you. There will be times where I will tell you to tweet out loud and be happy for your accomplishments. But for this one, this is just for you. I'm even going to take it one step farther with you and I'm going to make a directory. MKDIR, security course, CD security course. Now I'm in my security course repo and I'm going to open this up in my VS code. You can use whatever code editor that you want. I like to use Visual Studio Code. And this is where I'm going to put all my notes. I'm even going to make a new file, notes.md or whatever you want to call it. And here's where I'm going to do my first exercise. Which if I go back to the course, my exercise is this. Write yourself a message about why you want this. Okay. My answer. And then write your answer here. You know, my kids save Web3. Cuz Lambo. Whatever reason that you want. Now pause the video and write out your answer. Write down where you want to see yourself at the end of this course. Where you might want to go. And if you don't know where you want to go, that's okay. You can find out at the end of the course. The reason you want to do this, the reason you want to write these down is because when it gets hard, when these audits get hard, you want to fall back on this list and go, okay, this is why I'm doing this. Is it for your family? Is it for your friends? Is it for you? Is it so that you can drive a, a nice car? You can have a nice life. Whatever reason, just be honest with yourself, write the answers down. And when it gets tough, when it gets hard, come back to this list. And then at the end of your notes, write, I'm committed and let's do this. And once you finish that, congratulations, you've taken your first step to becoming a security researcher. Congratulations, and let's do the Solidity Refresher. All right, so now we're going to do the Solidity and Smart Contract Refresher. If you're a little unsure or you're a little hesitant, just do this. Walk with me here just to make sure we're all on the same page. So if we scroll down to the table of contents, this is going to be section one review. Let's go down here and let's let's start the review. So first is the prerequisites and the environment. So to take this course, you will need some type of text editor. I like to use Visual Studio Code. There will be a link to Visual Studio Code in the GitHub repo and Cypher and Updraft. For those of you who are a little bit more security savvy, you can use VS Codium, which is a free open source software binaries of VS Code. So it removes a lot of the nasty Microsoft stuff that might come with VS Code. And for this course, we're going to be mainly working with Foundry. If you're more familiar with Hardhat or Brownie or some other framework, you can absolutely follow along with this course with your framework of choice. There are going to be some Foundry specific things that we do though, but if you want to learn how to do them in your tool, you are absolutely more than welcome to do so. If you don't have Foundry, you can come go to installation and just follow along the documentation here to install it. Because you already took my course though, you already know how to install Foundry. And you know that if you run Foundry up, it'll download and update all of your Foundry tools and you can run Forge, help, which will print out the help here. You'll have access to cast as well, which we're going to be using. You'll also have access to chisel, which we will also be using and tools like that. So if you're following along with me here, just try to make sure you have all of what I have. Feel free to pause the video to get up to speed. If you're using a Windows machine, you're going to be using Windows with WSL. This way, all the Linux commands that we run in our terminal will work for you as well. 
I'm going to leave a link to a timestamp in the Foundry full course where Vasily walks you through installing WSL if you're unfamiliar with it. Linux and Mac users can just work with the environments that they already have. You know how to work with AI tools like Find, P-H-I-N-D, or ChatGPT, or whatever AI of choice. Find is one that's kind of nice because it will search the web. If I looked up how do I install Foundry for the ETH ecosystem, it actually will try to read all these links that it does a Google search on, compile an answer for you, and give an output here. You should have accounts for Piranha, which is more than a Q&A forum specifically for Web3, the Ethereum Stack Exchange, which is one of the best resources as well for Q&A, and obviously you should have a GitHub repo as well. Like I said, you're a security researcher. Sometimes, guess what? You're not going to know the answer to something and you need to be bold enough to ask the questions. Of course, you'll be able to go to the discussions channel. And I want to make this extra crystal clear. One of the worst things you can do as a security researcher is pretend you know something that you don't. If you don't know something, you simply say, I don't know. I will find out. If you're unsure how to answer, you have three defaults. Yes. No, or I don't know. If you know something, say, yes, I know something. If you don't know, say, I don't know. And if you're not sure if you know, you will say, I don't know. Se specifics are incredibly important when it comes to security research and bullshitting other people is not going to help anybody. And it's going to rob you of growth opportunities. So swallow your ego and ask questions. You will learn 10 times faster. You will help other people learn. And people will say, wow, this person asks a lot of really good questions. Wow, I wish I had the confidence to ask questions as easily as this person does. Ask questions. Don't pretend you know everything because you don't. And again, all of this can be found in the Foundry full course, also in Cypher and Updraft. All right, let's talk about the Solidity prerequisites. You should be familiar at this point with Remix. You should know how the compile button works. You should know how the deploy button works. You should be able to deploy something locally and deploy something to a testnet using a MetaMask or whatever wallet that you have. Ideally, you're familiar with doing all your coding locally or with some cloud provider or something like that. So you should be able to follow along with me here with no problems. If I do MKDIR, basic sulk project, CD basic sulk project, and I run forge init, you should recognize this setup on the left-hand side with your scripts, your SRC, your tests. If you're not familiar with Foundry, that's okay. You'll become pretty familiar very quickly. So in here we have, we have a very basic counter smart contract, which has a set number and an increment number. We have a storage variable number, which can get increased when calling increment and change directly when calling a set number. All of this, everything in here should be very familiar with you at this point. We have the license identifier, we have the Solidity version, we have a contract here, etc. You should be able to run forge build and be familiar with forge build and compiling your contracts. I have my tests in the test folder, counter.t.sol. I can run these tests by running forge test. In the basic test setup here, we actually have two different types of tests. We have kind of a regular test where we have an assert equal, we're saying, Okay, take this counter contract and increment it, and we should see the counter number be one. But we also have a fuzz test. So a fuzz test as a refresher here, we take a variable, we pass it into our test here, and this represents some random number. So we're going to run this test with a certain number of runs with a certain number of random numbers where X is just random numbers. And no matter what X is, this will always hold. We go to our foundry.toml and we click this link that it comes with, we can actually scroll down in here and see there's a variable to change the number of fuzz runs. So down here, let me grab this whole thing, copy it and paste it in here. Right now runs is set to 256. So if I hit up, I hit enter, we'll see our test fuzz ran 256 times. That means it tried running this test with 256 different random numbers. We could change this to something like 600. And maybe we just want to run this test. I can run forge test dash dash MT, paste that, and we'll just run this singular test. And we do indeed see it runs 600 times. So Foundry attempted to put a random number in here for X, 
600 times. It did 600 different numbers to make sure that this always held. Now, there's a separate type of fuzz test that's a little bit more advanced called stateful fuzzing. They're also known as invariant tests in Foundry as well. So we talked about fuzzing and invariants much later in the Foundry course. So this might not be something that you're very familiar with. So we are gonna take some time and watch this video to learn about what fuzzing or stateful fuzzing and invariant tests are and specifically what they look like. So let's go ahead and watch this subsection. Now, if you don't totally understand this at the end of this video, that's okay. We're gonna be teaching you how to do more of these later on in the course. So this is just so that you're at least familiar with the terminology. All right, contracts are written and tested. Can I ship my code? No, I can easily break this with a flash loan attack. Ah, crap, I didn't think about that. Let me fix. All right, how about now? <laughs> I'm like a flash loan on Ave. I can use that loan to lock up a CDB on FakerDAO, and I can exploit the Oracle by re-entering your dinner reservation at Chili's, causing a bridge malfunction on the flux capacitor, bypassing the possibility, meaning I can exploit your contract. I exploit your contract. Most of the time, hacks will come from a scenario that you didn't think about or write a test for. But what if I told you that you could write a test that cannot check for just one scenario, but every scenario? Let's get froggy. Fuzz testing or fuzzing is when you supply random data to your system in an attempt to break it. So if this balloon is our system slash code, it's us doing random stuff in an attempt to break it. <coughs> this is chain link. Now, why would we want to do all that? Let's say we have this function called do stuff. It takes an integer as an input parameter, and we know that no matter what we give it as an input, our variable should always be zero, should always be zero. The fact that this variable should always be zero is known as our invariant, or our property of the system that should always hold. In our balloon example, if we market our balloon as indestructible or unbreakable or unpoppable, the invariant that would hold would, this balloon cannot be broken. And unlike this balloon in real life, we can write a test that will call the do stuff function many times with random data and check to see that our should always be zero variable is always zero. Now, a normal unit test for our code might look like this. We pass a single data point, we call the function, and then we do our assertion to make sure that should always be zero is in fact zero. And with this, we might think our code is covered. But if we look back at our do stuff function a little bit closer, we can clearly see that if our data input is two, should always be zero will end up being one. This would break our invariant. Should always be zero, will not be zero. Now this may seem obvious for this function, but sometimes you'll have a function that looks like this. It would be insane to write a test case for every single possible integer or scenario, so we need a programmatic way to find this scenario. Now in our code, we also see a second exploit, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now there are two popular methodologies to find these edge cases, fuzz tests slash invariant tests, and symbolic execution slash form of verification. We'll save the latter for another video. If we were writing our code in Foundry, this would be our unit test. Writing a fuzz test in Foundry where we do all this random inputting is gonna be really similar. Instead of us manually selecting our data, right in our test parameter, we'll add our variable, comment out this line, and that's it. Now, when we run a Foundry test here, Foundry will automatically randomize data, run through our code with a ton of different examples. This is as if they run with data equals zero, data equals one, data equals this number, that's a T, but whatever, you get the picture. Now, if I run my unit test, you'll see that the unit test actually passes. However, if we run this fuzz test, you'll see it actually gives us an output where it says, assertion violated, counterexample, gives us the call data, and the arguments. It was able to find out by randomly throwing data at our function call that two breaks our invariant, AKA it makes it such that should always be zero is not zero. Now it's really doing semi-random data instead of purely random data. And the way your fuzzer picks the random data matters. It won't be able to go over every single possible U256. So understanding how your fuzzers pick the random data is an advanced thing that you should learn later on. At the moment, I think the Trailerbit's Echidna slash optic integration is probably the best fuzzer out there and it easily has the best logo of all time, but Ripped Jesus is a solid second. So now that we have our counter example here, we can use this to go back into our contract, find out, ah, okay, so we are doing this wrong, delete this line, and then run our test again and see that it does indeed pass. What's important is this number down here, the number of runs. So this did 256 different random inputs to make our test run. In Foundry, you can change the number of runs in your foundry.toml file by just adding a section like this, rerunning your tests, and now you'll see it did a thousand different examples. The number of runs is really important, obviously, because more runs is more random inputs, more use cases, more chance that you'll actually catch the issue. And now congrats, that's the basic of fuss testing. Let's just do a little recap here before going further. The first thing you need to do is understand our invariant or property of the system that must always hold. 
and our example should always be zero was our invariant. Understand your invariant and then write a test that would input random data to try to break that invariant. Now, if we go back to our example contract though, you'll see with our fuzz test, we were able to find this first use case. However, it didn't find this second scenario where should always be zero was set to one if hidden value was seven. In order for this to revert, hidden value would need to be seven. And the only way to set hidden value to seven would be to first call do stuff with seven, which would set hidden value down here and then call do stuff again with anything. Our fuzz test as written would never be able to find this. That's because this fuzz test is known as a stateless fuzz test, which is where the state of the previous run is discarded for the next run. If we go back to our balloon example, stateless fuzzy would be doing something to the balloon for one fuzz run, then discarding that balloon and blowing up a new balloon for each fuzz run. However, instead of doing stateless fuzzing, we could do stateful fuzzing. Stateful fuzzing is where the ending state of our previous fuzz run is the starting state of the next fuzz run. For example, instead of blowing up a new balloon for each one of these runs, we just use the same balloon to do multiple random things to it. Combined is considered one fuzz run. So a single fuzz run on a stateless fuzz run would be having data be seven, calling do stuff, just using the same contract that we just called do stuff on, and then call another function on it. If this was a unit test we had, we would of course see this get violated. But as you can see, with sufficiently complicated code, coming at these very specific scenarios are gonna be missed. To write a stateful fuzz test in Foundry, you need to use the invariant keyword and it requires a little bit of setup. And don't get too confused by the invariant keyword here. Yes, it's being a little overloaded. Write an invariant test in Foundry, we first need to import this STD invariant contract and inherit it in our test contract. Then we need to tell Foundry which contract to call random functions on. Since we only have one contract with one function, we're going to tell Foundry that my contract should be called and it's allowed to call any of the functions in my contract. So we'd say, hey, the target contract for you is going to be the address of example contract. Foundry is smart enough to know, okay, it's going to grab any and all of the functions from my contract and call them in random orders with random data. So it's going to call do stuff with random data, and then it's going to call do stuff with random data, and then it's going to call do stuff with random data since do stuff is the only function. Now we can write our invariant by saying function invariant test always is zero public and we can just add our assert assert our example contract that should always be zero is zero so it'll run do stuff with some random data if it happens across seven it'll set hidden value to seven and then it'll call do stuff again with hidden value starting at seven which will trigger this conditional so now if we run this test we can see it does indeed find a sequence where our invariant or our assertion or our property is broken. We can see first on my contract, it's going to call do stuff with an argument of seven, and then it's going to call my contract with an argument of some random number because it doesn't matter what the input is after it sets it to seven. So now that we have that, we can go back to our code, remove this, come back to our test, rerun our test, and we'll find that. Our code is now safe and sound because our invariants hold up. Now, an important aside on the term invariant, Foundry uses the term invariant to describe this stateful fuzzing. Stateless fuzzing is when you give random data to an input to a function to see if it breaks some invariant. Stateful fuzzing is when you give random data and random function calls to a system to see if it breaks some invariant. In Foundry, fuzzing is stateless fuzzing and invariants are stateful fuzzing. So when people are talking about invariants in Foundry, they're usually talking about stateful fuzzing. If they talk about fuzzing in Foundry, they're talking about stateless fuzzing, even though they're both technically fuzzing. There's an issue on the repo to potentially change the name, but I digress. So in a real smart contract, your invariant won't be that a balloon shouldn't pop or some function should always be zero. It might be something like new tokens minted is less than the inflation rate. There should only be one winner in a random lottery someone shouldn't be able to take more money out of the protocol than they put in. And let me tell you what, at this point, congratulations, you've learned the basics of fuzzing. This is something that even some of the top protocols in this space don't use. And this is something that we in Cypherin use to find high severity vulnerabilities in smart contracts. Hey, I'm Alex Rohn, co-founder at Cypherin. We use invariant tests during our audits to identify vulnerabilities that are often difficult to catch purely with manual reviews. That's not to say they're a silver bullet. They are in no way a replacement for experts manual review, but they certainly can aid in the audit process. This needs to be the new floor for security in Web3. If you're working with a protocol that isn't doing stateful fuzzing or invariant or fuzz tests, red flag, get them to use it, make a PR. Number one, understand what the invariants are. Number two, write functions that can execute them. Do not go to audit without these. Don't let your auditors let you get away with not having them. So this video was just to give you the basics. And if you want to learn the advanced fuzzing strategies on how to fuzz like pro, 
be sure to watch our next video on the topic as that'll give you the keys to write professional fuzz and professional invariant tests. Come on, gang. Let's make Web3 better, and I'll see you next time. All right, so now that we know a little bit more about fuzz testing and invariance, we're going to go on to some common EIPs and ERCs. We will learn more about fuzz testing and stateful fuzzing later on in this course, but you should be at least familiar with the concepts at this point. So if I have a code base and I want to install, you know, maybe an ERC20, I know how to actually import them from GitHub. So if I go to like Open Zeppelin Contracts, which is a popular library for smart contracts, I can actually just grab this Open Zeppelin slash Open Zeppelin Contracts. And in Foundry, I'll do forge install, paste it in, dash, dash, no, dash, commit. And I'll be able to install these contracts in here into my project. Now what I can do is I can go to foundry.toml and in here I can say re mappings equals and I'll say at open zeppelin slash contracts equals lib slash open zeppelin slash contracts slash contracts. And now what I can do is I could maybe make a new file called mytoken.sol. I would do some like spdx license identifier. MIT, Pragma Solidity, carrot 0.8.13, contract my token, and I would import, import ERC20 from at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC20, ERC20.sol. So I am using GitHub Copilot. This is a VS Code extension that adds a little AI into my terminal. It, it tries to predict what I'm going to code next, and it's very useful for writing tests and writing a lot of basic boilerplate. So now I can do constructor, and I can go command click on this and see what the constructor this is. It looks like it takes a name and a symbol. So I can say my token is ERC20, and then I would do like ERC20 of you know, my token name, MTN for the symbol. And just like that, and boom, now I have a minimal ERC-20. For those of you unfamiliar, we'll do a quick video refresher on what an ERC-20 is, and then on what an ERC-721 or an NFT is as well. Now first, let's define even what are ERC-20s. So ERC-20s are tokens that are deployed on a chain using what's called the ERC-20 token standard. You can read more about it in the ERC-20 token standard here, link in the description as well. But basically, it's a smart contract that actually represents a token. So it's token, but it's a smart contract, it's both. It's really cool. Tether, Chainlink, UniToken, and DAI are all examples of ERC-20s. Technically, Chainlink is in the ERC-677, as there are upgrades to the ERC-20 that some tokens take that are still backwards compatible with ERC-20s. And so basically, you can think of them as ERC-20s with a little additional functionality. Now, why would I even care to want to make an ERC-20? Well, you can do a lot of really cool stuff with it. You can make a governance token, you can secure an underlying network, you can create some type of synthetic asset, or really anything else. In any case, how do we build one of these ERC-20s? How do we build one of these tokens? Well, all we have to do is build a smart contract that follows the token standard. All we have to do is build a smart contract that has these functions. It has a name function, a symbol function, decimals function, et cetera, all these functions. We need to be able to transfer it. We need to be able to get the balance of it, et cetera. And again, if you want to check out some of the improvements that are still ERC-20 compatible, like the ERC-677 or the ERC-777, you can definitely go check those out and build one of those instead. Yes, a glorious guide to NFTs and ah. Look, NFTs are hot right now. NFTs, also known as ERC-721s, are a token standard that was created on the Ethereum platform. NFT stands for non-fungible token, and is a token standard similar to the ERC-20. Again, ERC-20s like Link, Aave, Maker, all those goodies that are found on the Ethereum chain. An NFT, or a non-fungible token, is a token that is non-fungible. This means that they are starkly unique from each other, and one token isn't interchangeable with any other token of its class. A good way to think about it is one dollar is interchangeable with any other dollar. One dollar is going to have the same value of another dollar. Those are fungible tokens. That's like ERC-20s. One link is always going to be equivalent to one other link. By contrast, is going to be NFTs. Those of you nerds out there would know, like, a Pokemon would be a good example of an NFT. 
your one Pokemon is going to have different stats, different movesets, and isn't interchangeable with any other Pokemon. Or maybe a more relatable one is like a trading card, a unique piece of art, or the like. So that's what these NFTs are. They are non-fungible, non-interchangeable tokens that, for the moment, are best represented or thought about as digital pieces of art that are incorruptible and have a permanent history of who's owned them, who's deployed them, etc. Now, like I said, NFTs are just a token standard. So you can actually make them do much more than just be art. You can give them stats, you can make them battle, you can do really unique things with them, you can do pretty much whatever you want with them. But right now, the easiest way to think about it, and the most popular way to think about it, is by calling them art, art, art. It's art. Or some type of collectible or just anything that's unique. So like I said, they're just tokens that are deployed on a smart contract platform and you can view them on different NFT platforms like OpenSea or Rarible. And these are the NFT marketplaces that let people buy and sell them. You obviously can do that without these marketplaces because it's decentralized, but they help and give a good user interface. Now, like many of you out there, my initial thought to NFTs was, okay, this sounds pretty dumb. But I think that that was dumb. I think art does have a lot of value, and I think that artists are not always paid fairly for what they do. And this is actually a huge issue right now in the modern day world, where an artist can make some type of art, people just copy paste it, you know, everywhere, and, uh, and they never get attribution for what they made. So having a really easy decentralized royalty mechanism or some type of mechanism where these artists can get accurately comped for what they're doing, I think is really important. I love music. I love movies. Those are pieces of art that I digest and I really like. And I think it's fair for them to get comped appropriately because they are providing value to my life. I think NFTs are a great way to solve this issue as kind of having these decentralized audit trails and, and royalty trails that we can set up and and see really transparently without having to go through some centralized service. So that's the basic gist of it. Let's talk some more about the standards. The ERC721 standard or the NFT standard. This is the basis of it all. There is another standard that's semi-fungible tokens, the 1155. We're not gonna talk about that here, but you can check it out. The main differences between a 721 and an ERC20, on ERC20s they have a really simple mapping between an address and how much that address holds. 721s have unique token IDs. Each token ID has a unique owner. And in addition, they have what's called a token URI, which we'll talk about in a minute. Each token is unique. Each token ID represents a unique asset. So since these assets are unique and we wanna be able to visualize them and show what they actually look like, we need to define those attributes of the object. If it's a piece of art, we need a way to define what that art looks like. If it's some type of character in a game, we need a way to define that character's stats in the the NFT. This is where metadata and token URIs come in. So if you know anything about Ethereum, you know that sometimes gas prices can get pretty high, especially when it comes to storing a lot of space, it can get really, really expensive. So one of your first questions might be, well, are they storing these images and, and these art pieces on chain? And the answer is sometimes. Back when they were coming up with NFTs and artists were deploying stuff, the ETH devs and the artists were like, yeah, art, let's do that art. I'm just gonna deploy this one megabyte image onto the Ethereum chain and oh God, it's so much gas expensive. How do I hit the delete button? How do I? It's not dumb. It's not deleting. <laughs> and they realized that if they put all this art on chain, it was going to be incredibly expensive. So to get around this, what they did is they put in the standard what's called a token URI. This is a universally unique indicator of what that asset or what that token looks like and what the attributes of that token are. And you can use something like a centralized API or IPFS to actually get that token URI. A typical token URI has to return something in this format like this, where it has the name, the image location, the description, and then any attributes below. Now, if you're like me, your first question would probably be, We pull from a single source. Seems pretty centralized. This is a current limitation of the NFT ecosystem. There is often this talk of on-chain metadata versus off-chain metadata. Because it is so much easier and cheaper to store all your metadata off-chain, a lot of people will use something like IPFS that is decentralized, but does take a little bit of centrality to keep persisting, but they can also use their own centralized API. However, obviously, if that goes down, then you lose your image, you lose everything associated with your NFT. All right, great. So now that we know some of the more basic aspects of smart contracts and what we should be doing and what, what we're expected to know here, let's also go into some of the more advanced things that I expect you to know for this course. The first one is gonna be storage. So all smart contracts have this thing called storage. 
Anytime I create a state variable in my contract, it creates a little storage slot for that variable. It puts that variable in a storage slot. So if I have three variables like this, number one, number two, number three, number one, these take up three storage slots. A constant or an immutable variable won't show up in storage because a constant or immutable variable is stored directly in a contract bytecode. We can actually use Foundry to see what the storage of a contract is. Excuse me, this should be lib. And then I can do a forge build to compile everything like that. Now, if I do a forge inspect counter storage, I'll actually be able to get a layout of what my st what storage looks like in my counter contract or any contract that I'm working with. If I scroll up in here, we see at slot zero, we have our number at slot one, we have our number two, and that's it. We don't see our number three because a constant. If I took out the constant keyword and I reran this, forge inspect counter storage, we would now see number three is indeed at slot two. Let's watch a quick video refresher on storage in case we're unfamiliar. Now, everything I'm about to go through is in the documentation, and there is a link to this, of course, in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Whenever we have one of these global variables or these variables that stay permanently, they're stuck in something called storage. You can think of storage as a big giant array or a giant list of all the variables that we actually create. So when we say we have some contract called fund of storage and we have a variable called favorite number, we're basically saying we want this favorite number variable to persist. Right. We saw in a lot of our examples, we had a favorite number variable that we could always call to see what this contract's favorite number was. Well, the way it persists is it gets stored in this place called storage. Now, storage works as this giant list associated with this contract where every single variable and every single value in this storage section is slotted into a 32 byte long slot in this storage array. So, for example, the number 25 in its bytes implementation is 0x00 with a ton of zeros, 19. This is the hex version of the UNT256. This is why we do so much hex translation. This is the bytes implementation of a UNT256. And each store slot increments just like an array starting from zero. So for example, our next global variable or our next storage variable just gets slotted at the next slot that's available. So Booleans, for example, get transformed from their bool version to their hex. And we modified our sum bool variable to be true, and the hex addition of the true boolean is 0x00001. Every time you save an additional global variable, or more correctly, one of these storage variables, it takes up an additional storage slot. And what about variables that are dynamic in length or that can change length? What about something that's dynamic? Well, for dynamic values like a dynamic array or a mapping, elements inside the array or inside the mapping are actually stored using some type of hashing function. And you can see those specific functions in the documentation. The object itself does take up a storage slot, but it's not going to be the entire array. For example, my array variable here at storage slot two doesn't have the entire array in storage slot two. What it has actually is just the array length. The length of the array is stored at storage slot two. But for example, if we do my array dot push 222, we do some hashing function, which again, you can see in the documentation what that is, and we'll store the number 222 at that location in storage. The hex of 222 is 0x00000DE. So it gets stored in this crazy spot. And this is good. This is intentional because 32 bytes may not be nearly big enough to store my array if our array gets massive. And it wouldn't make sense for it to put the elements inside the array at subsequent numbers, because again, the size of the array can change and, and you're never gonna be sure how many subsequents that you need. So for my array, it does have a storage slot for the length. For mappings, it does have a storage spot as well, similar to array, but it's just blank. But it's blank intentionally so that Solidity knows, ah, okay, there is a mapping here and it needs a storage slot for its hashing function to work correctly. Now, interestingly, constant variables and immutable variables do not take up spots in storage. The reason for this is because constant variables are actually part of the contract's bytecode itself, which sounds a little bit weird, but you can imagine what Solidity does is anytime it sees constant variables name is it just automatically swaps it out with whatever number it actually is. 
So you can kind of think of not in storage is just a pointer to 123 and it doesn't take up a storage slot. Well, when we have variables inside of a function, those variables only exist for the duration of the function. They don't stay inside the contract. They don't persist. They're not permanent. So variables inside these functions like new var and other var do not get added to storage. They get added in their own memory data structure, which gets deleted after the function has finished running. Now you might be asking, okay, well, why do we need this memory keyword, especially when it comes to strings? We saw before that we had to say string memory. The reason we need it for strings is because strings are technically this dynamically sized array. And we need to tell Solidity, hey, we're, we're gonna do this on the storage location, or we're gonna do it into the memory location where we can just wipe it. Arrays and mappings can take up a lot more space. So Solidity just wants to make sure, okay, where are we working with this? Is it storage? Is it memory? You have to tell me. I need to know if I need to allocate space for it in our storage data structure. And again, everything here you can read in the Solidity documentation. All right, next is gonna be the fallback and receive function. So Solidity smart contracts by default will reject getting any ETH sent to them. So they have these two functions, fallback, which we can make external payable, and then receive, which we can also make external payable. They work like this. If you make a call to a contract and message.data is empty, if it is empty, it'll check to see if there's a receive function. If there is, it'll call it. If not, it'll call fallback. So this is like, for example, if you sent ETH to a smart contract without any data, it would call this receive function. If there's no receive function, it'll just do callback. Now, if there is data, it'll just immediately call this callback function. And this is what these two look like. Fallback could 100% not be payable. And in this case, if there's no receive function, fallback obviously won't get called if you send ETH to the contract. Without these functions, a contract cannot accept native ETH. Solidity will automatically compile this contract to reject any ETH sent to it. In our Foundry course, we took some time to learn more about how to actually encode anything. And so we're gonna copy this into Remix to review that now, because this is definitely one of the harder sections from the last course, but it becomes more and more important, especially when we get deeper and deeper into security. So to get started with encoding and do a refresher here, we're gonna watch a clip from the Foundry full course, which explains encoding, and then also explains eventually how to use encoding to call any smart contract from any other smart contract. So let's go ahead and watch a clip from the Foundry full course. So from a really, really high level, this is basically how you concatenate strings, right? This is how you combine strings together. And we're gonna jump over the remix to actually explore this abi.encode pact and this ABI encoding stuff a little bit more. Now, the section that we're about to go through is definitely advanced, and we're gonna be going over some really low level stuff and how Solidity works behind the scenes, how the binary works and this thing called opcodes and all this crazy low level, tricky, difficult things to understand. If you want to move past this section, there are timestamps in the GitHub repo to help you move past this. However, I do encourage you to at least try to absorb most of this material. If you don't understand it the first time, that's 100% okay. This is more advanced anyways. For most of your basic projects, you won't really need this information. It's only later on, once you get more advanced, that knowing all this is really going to make you a phenomenal Solidity developer. And when you approach this section, when you approach this sub-lesson on EVM opcodes and coding and calling, just know that if you don't 100% understand it the first time, that is okay. If you want to watch this section a couple times, fantastic. So if you want to jump over to Remix and follow along, let's do it. Now in our contract section, let's go ahead and create a new file. We're going to call it encoding.soul. And remember, all the code that we're going to be going with in here is going to be in this sub-lesson folder of the Hardhat NFT FCC. And all the code we're going to be working with is going to be in this encoding.soul. And then in a little bit, we're going to work on this callanything.soul. So we're in this encoding.soul, and let's just make our basic code here. So we'll say spdx license identifier MIT pragma solidity caret 0.8.7 like that. We'll do contract encoding. Boom. Compile. 
or Command S or Control S, great, things are looking good. Now remember, the whole purpose for this is to first understand what's going on here and more about this ABI.encode packed stuff. So let's first just write a function that shows us wrapping ABI.encode packed with some strings and wrapping it around a string is going to return a string. So we could do function combine strings or concatenate strings. This will be a public pure since we're not going to be reading any storage. We'll say returns string memory and we'll say return string abi.encode packed. Hi mom, comma, let's put space in here. Miss you like so. So we need another parenthesis here. Okay, great. Now let's go ahead and deploy this. We'll stay on a JavaScript VM. We'll deploy encoding, coding.sol. And we'll come down here. We'll click combine strings and we get that whole string output. Hi, mom, miss you. So what we're doing here is we're encoding hi, mom, miss you together into its bytes form because abi.encode packed returns a bytes object and we are typecasting it by wrapping it in the string thing to be a string. And Solidity says, okay, yeah, bytes to string. That's fine. That totally works. And this abi.encode packed, one of these globally available methods and units. And actually in Solidity, there's a whole bunch of these. There's this Solidity cheat sheet, and there's going to be a link to this in the GitHub repo as well, that has a whole bunch of operators and it has a whole bunch of these global variables and methods. You can see if we look in here, we look for abi.encode packed, we see abi.encode packed right here. If we scroll down, we'll see some more that we're familiar with as well. Like for example, message.sender, sender of the message, message.value, there's a whole bunch of other globally available methods and variables that we can use when we're coding our stuff. Now, I will say though, in 0.8.12 plus, you can actually do string.concat, you know, string A, comma, string B, if you want to, instead of doing this ABI.encode packed, but I still wanted to show you the ABI.encode packed because it's a great segue into all this ABI stuff that we're about to go over. But let's focus on this encode packed thing. So what is actually going on here? Well, before we dive deeper into this encode packed, let's understand a little bit more about what happens when we send a transaction. So when we compile our code, and again, all these pictures are going to be in the GitHub repo. Remember back to ethers.js, we had those two files. We got a .abi file and a .bin or .binary. Back in our ether simple storage, when we ran yarn compile, the two main files that we got were this simple storage.abi, which was this, you know, th this ABI thing that we've become familiar with. And then the simple storage.bin, which is the binary, which is a whole bunch of just numbers and letters and stuff we didn't understand. And you can see that in Remix too. Like if we were to compile this, you go to compilation details, you get a whole bunch of stuff in here, right? You can see the ABI in here, which this is kind of like a different way of viewing that ABI. We also get this bytecode bit and it's this object that has the same stuff that has like those random numbers and letters, but this is actually the binary. This is actually what's getting put on the blockchain. It's this binary. It's this low level stuff. Now, when we actually send these contracts to the blockchain, we're sending, like I said, we're sending this binary thing. That's exactly what we're sending to the blockchain. And remember how, again, back in our ethers project, we saw what is a transaction, right? A transaction has a nonce. It has a gas price, gas limit, two value data. We kind of skimped over the VRS a little bit because that's kind of that mathy component of the transaction signature. But again, back in our ethos project, we did this as well, right? In our deploy script, ended up sending a transaction ourselves using just ethers. We passed a nonce, a gas price, gas limit, two value. Data was this massive thing to deploy our contract and then also the chain ID. We didn't work with the VR and S because ethers does that for us, but there's also this VR S component that we, we don't bother to look at. When we send a transaction that actually creates a contract, the two is going to be empty. We're not going to send this contract deployment to any address, but the data of this is going to have the contract initialization code and contract bytecode, right? So when we compile it, we, we get all this code, like how do you initialize the contract and then what the contract actually looks like. So if you look at any of the contracts that you deployed, for example, I'm going to look at our raffle that we deployed. If you go to the transactions of your contract, we can see create raffle, right? Let's go to that transaction. 
if we go down and click to see more in Etherscan, we can see this input data thing. And once again, it's got all this random garbled numbers and letters. This is that binary data of the contract initialization code and the contract bytecode, right? What we send in our transaction is this data thing. We send this, this weird bunch of jarbled nonsense. Now we're gonna head back to Remix and I'm just gonna leave this as comments in here. In the encoding.soul and the GitHub repo, there is a ton of comments in here explaining exactly what I'm explaining. So if you wanna follow along there, you can as well. But now in order for the blockchain to understand, okay, what do these numbers and letters even mean? You need a special reader. Ethereum or the blockchain needs to be able to read all this stuff. It needs to be able to map all these random numbers and letters to what they actually do. How does Ethereum or Polygon or Avalanche know that all this nonsense is basically telling it to make a contract? You kind of think of it as saying like, take off your coat. The only reason that we as human beings understand what take off your coat means is that we understand English. We're all reading English. For Solidity and for blockchains, instead of English, they read these numbers and letters kind of like words. Just instead of take off your coat, it's like deploy contract and the contract does X, X Y, Z and all this random stuff. So this bytecode represents the low level computer instructions to make our contract happen. And all these numbers and letters represent kind of an alphabet, just like how take off your coat is an alphabet. And when you combine them like this, it makes something that to us makes sense. You can kind of think of the alphabet for these as what's called opcodes. If you go to create a new tab, if you go to evm.codes, we'll get to this place where it just has a list of all these instructions. On the left side, you can see this thing called opcode, and then you can see name. So this opcode section is saying, hey, if you see a zero zero in this bytecode, that zero zero represents this opcode stop, which does what? Which halts execution. If you see a zero one, you're going to do some addition stuff. A zero two is multiply. There are all these opcodes that are kind of like the alphabet or the language of this binary stuff, right? And they go all the way down to, to FF self-destruct. These opcodes also have, and that's what this is reading, right? So if we look at our transaction here and your, yours might be a little bit different, 061 says, okay, the first thing we want you to do is the 061 opcode. And if we go to EVM opcodes, we look up for 61 saying push to place two byte item on the stack. That's exactly how it's reading this. Any language that can compile down to this opcode stuff, down to this specific set of, of Ethereum opcodes or EVM opcodes is what's known as the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. So being able to read these opcodes is sometimes abstractly called the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. The EVM basically represents all the instructions a computer must be able to read for it to interact with Ethereum or Ethereum-like applications. And this is why so many blockchains all work with Solidity, because Solidity compiles down to this bytecode here, and Polygon, Avalanche, Arbitrum, Ethereum, they all compile down to the exact same type of binary, and they all have the exact same readers. Now, why are we telling you all this stuff? You might be saying, hey, Patrick, this is cool and all, but it looks like ABI.EncodePact, all that does is concatenate strings. ABI.EncodePact can do actually way more. And if we look at these global variables, ABI.EncodePact is like, what, the third one down the list? Because it's a non-standard way to encode stuff to this binary stuff that we just talked about. We can actually encode pretty much anything we want to being in this binary format, basically. And let's take a look at, at encoding something. So let's create a function called encode number. And this will be a public pure function since we're not gonna read any states. And we'll say returns a bytes memory. So we're gonna have this function return a bytes object. We're gonna have it return the, what this number is gonna look like, but in binary. So we'll say bytes memory number equals abi.encode one, and then return number. So we're gonna encode number down to its ABI or its binary format. So I know a lot of the times when we say, oh, what's the ABI, what's the ABI, right? Previously, we say, oh, the ABI is, is this thing, right? It's, it's, it's all these inputs and outputs. This is kind of the human readable version of the ABI, but again, the ABI is the application binary interface. We want to encode our numbers down to it's basically it's, it's binary. 
this ABI.encode is going to be a little different than like the ABI that you see when you're looking at compilation details. This is technically like the ABI. It technically is how to interact with this contract. However, it's not the actual binary version of it. So we're saying, okay, uh, encode this number one down to its binary version so that our contracts can interact with it in a way that they understand. So we're just saying, okay, cool. That number one, let's make you machine readable. And if we go, we compile this and we deploy this, right? Let's delete that, that old contract. We deploy this. We now have combined strings and encode number. If we click it, we get this big hex thing. This is how the computer is going to understand the number one. Now we can encode pretty much anything. Actually, we could encode a string. So we'll say function encode string. We'll make this a public cure as well. It'll return a bytes memory because we want to give it that binary stuff or that bytes stuff. And we'll say bytes memory some string equals abi.encode some string and then return some string. Now let's compile that. We'll delete our old contract, deploy that, encode string. We get this big, big, big object here. And this is the binary. Now you'll notice something here. There's a ton of zeros and those zeros take up space, right? That's a lot of space for the computer to take up, even though they're not really doing anything. They're just kind of taking up space. So solidity also comes with this abi.encode pact, which performs pact encoding of the given arguments. And you can read more about it in the solidity docs if you want. And this is called the non-standard pact mode. And it does the same encoding with some stipulations. Types shorter than 32 bytes are concatenated directly without padding or sign extension. Dynamic types are encoded in place and without the length. Array elements are padded, but still encoded in place. You can kind of think of encode packed as sort of like a compressor, right? It's the encode function, but it compresses stuff. If we wanted to encode some string, but we wanted to save space and we didn't need the perfect low level binary of it, we could do function encode string packed make this a public pure and have it return a bytes memory. And we could say bytes memory, some string equals abi.encode packed. Once again, some string. And so we're doing encode packed instead of encode. And we'll return some string here. We'll compile this and we'll see the difference, right? We'll compile, we'll delete our old one. We'll deploy this. Now we have encode string, which again, that's what encode string is going to give us. And we have encode string packed which returns us this much, much smaller bytes object here. So you see the size difference. If we're trying to save gas, encode string packed is going to be a way for us to save a lot more gas. Now, abi.encode packed is actually really similar to something that we've done before, which is typecasting. If we did function encode string bytes, public pure returns bytes memory, bytes memory some string equals bytes some string turn some string these two are going to look nearly identical right so if we compile we'll delete our old contract we'll deploy this encode string bytes which gives us this and encode string packed using the abi encode packed they give us the exact same output whereas encode string still gives us this big piece. So the two of these get the same result, but behind the scenes, they're doing something a little bit different. And I'm not going to go over exactly what that is, but uh, I've left a link inside of the code here if you want to learn more, which is exactly what we're doing in our NFT, right? We're doing abi.encode packed. We're combining two strings by putting them together. We're encoding them to their bytes implementation, to their packed bytes implementation, and then we're just typecasting them back from bytes to string, and that's how we concatenate them. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, okay, cool, great, Patrick, I'm all set, I understand this, I'm happy to go back to my project, and if you wanna do that, absolutely go for it and skip over this section, but some other views might be going, okay, Patrick, this is seems pretty cool, but I'm sure this encode packed and this encode function aren't just here to concatenate strings. They probably have some other function. What, what do they actually do? Well. If that's what you're asking, I'm glad you ask, and I'm glad you're curious because we're going to find out. Now, not only can you encode stuff like strings and numbers and really anything, but you can decode stuff. So I could say function decode string public here returns string memory, string memory, some string 
equals abi.decode. This is going to take a couple parameters. So if we look in the docs here, abi.decode, it takes as a first argument, the encoded data, and then it takes a tuple. You can kind of think of it as a list, but not quite a list, a set of types to decode this into, and it returns the number of parameters that you gave it. So we might want to say this string memory, sum string, let's give it as input, this encode string function, the result of this encode string function, right? Which again, is going to be this big thing. So this is kind of equivalent to sticking this massive thing in here, but we're just not going to stick the massive thing in there because that's really big. So we're going to say, let's decode the result of encode string and let's decode it into a string because we need to tell solidity, Hey, we're going to decode this, but it, it doesn't know what to decode it into. It does, it's like, okay, cool. I can decode this, but like, what, what do you want me to do with it? And we say, Oh, Oh, this is a string. So decode it into a string and then we can do return some string. Now, once again, we deploy that old con or we delete the last contract, we deploy this new one. So encode string, encode string, where is encode string? Encode string returns this massive thing. As a human being, we're like, God, uh, I, I can't read that. Computers can read that, but we can't really read that. So we say, okay, let's decode that back into its string form. We hit decode string and we get back some string. And now we can actually multi encode and multi and decode, right? We can encode as much stuff as we want. So I can say function multi encode public pure returns bytes memory. We're going to encode a couple things. We'll say bytes memory sum string equals abi dot encode sum string comma. It's bigger. So we're going to encode two strings here. We're going to encode some string and it's bigger. So we have two strings we're going to encode and we'll return some string, even though it's, you know, bytes. And then we can actually multi decode. So we'll say function multi decode. This will be a public pure returns. We'll say it returns two strings, string memory and string memory. And instead of doing string memory, some string equals ABI decode, we'll say string memory, some string comma string memory, some other string. So we're going to get two returns equals ABI dot decode. Let's decode this multi encode result, which is the doubly encoded strings into a string and another string. And then we'll return both of these or some string. There we go. And then we'll return some string and then some other string. I need a semicolon here. So now when we deploy this, close this out, deploy this new one, right? We now have this multi encode, which gives us this even bigger bytes object, right? Because this is two strings encoded. And now if we hit multi decode, take a second, what do you think it's going to put out output? Let's go ahead and hit it. Now it's going to give us two strings, right? It's going to give these two strings, some string, it's bigger. So we can tell solidity to encode a bunch of stuff. And then we can even decode it by telling it, okay, this big object here, it's two strings combined, and then we decode it. Now you can even multi encode with that encode packed thing, right? We could do function multi encode packed public pure returns bytes memory, and then bytes memory some string equals abi encode packed some string comma it's bigger, and then return some string. We could do this, right? But this is going to give us the packed version of these two strings. So the decoding actually isn't going to work on this because this is packed encoding. So if we tried to do, I'm going to say this doesn't work. We tried to do function multi decode packed public pure returns string memory, string memory, some string equals abi dot decode multi encode packed and then in a string kind of exactly what we did above to if we do return some string, what do you think is going to happen? Well, let's, uh, let's try it. Delete the old contract, deploy a new one. We'll do multi decode packed, multi encode, multi decode packed. And we actually just get an error. Solidity basically goes, um, yeah, this looks like it's packed. I don't know how to decode that. But instead, what we can do is we can do function more t string cast packed make this a public pure 
returns string memory, string memory some string equals string multi encode packed return some string. This one will work, right? Because again, this packed encoding is kind of similar to just typecasting. So we'll compile, we'll redeploy, multi string cast packed. We get some string, it's bigger, right? And we don't have a space here, but we should have put a space in there. Now that we've learned more about this in ABI.encode and decoding, and we know that, okay, this is what the computer, this is what Ethereum, this is what the EVM or any EVM compatible chain is looking for. It's looking for this byte code. It's looking for this, this binary stuff. And we just learned a little bit more about how to encode different variables into the binary, into that data bit. Well, uh, what do we do now? Now, since we know that our transactions are just gonna be compiled down to this binary stuff, what we can do then is we could actually populate this data value of our transactions ourselves with the binary the code is going to use. So here's our transaction for a contract deployment. The data field of the contract deployment is going to be all that binary code of the contract. For a function call, the data piece is going to be what to send to the address, what data, what function to call on the two address. Let's look at another one of our transactions on Etherscan, right? On one of our contracts, you don't have to. I'm gonna look at enter raffle from a previous section. And if we select down, we look at input data, it says function enter raffle, method ID. But if we look at the original, this is what's getting sent in the data field. It's this binary, it's this hex, it's this weird low level bytes thing. This is how the Ethereum blockchain or the or whatever EVM chain you're working with knows which function to call. It translates this into a function. And we can do the exact same thing and call these functions ourselves. So what we can actually do with this crazy newfound data encoding stuff, what we can actually do is send the data field of a transaction ourself in a transaction call. Remember back in this Ethers throwback where the, this data thing was the contract creation code? Well, instead, we could populate this data thing with our function call code, the exact function that we want to call in the binary in the hex edition. Now, you might be thinking, oh, well, why would I do that? I can always just use the, the interface, the ABI, all that stuff. Well, maybe you don't have that. Maybe all you have is the function name. Maybe all you have is the parameters you want to send. Or maybe you want to make your code be able to send arbitrary functions or make arbitrary calls or do random, really advanced stuff, right? That's where sending our function calls directly by populating this data field is going to be incredibly important. So remember, I said you're always going to need the ABI and the contract address to send a function. Now, when I said you always need the ABI, originally we were kind of talking about this thing, this big, this big thing, which is cool, which is the ABI, but this is like the human readable ABI. We can also do it with the not human readable ABI. And additionally, you don't need all this stuff. You can really use just the name of a function and then the input types to send a function call. So the question is then, okay, how do we send, how do we send transactions that call functions with just the data field populated? And then the next question is, how do we populate the data field? What do we populate the data field with to, to make one of these function calls? And then how do we send these transactions? Solidity actually has some more low level keywords, namely static call and call. We actually, we've used call in the past before. Does this code look at all familiar to you? Well, it should, because this is, we use a similar setup in our fulfill random words for our lottery, right? We sent money doing this recent winner dot call, right? Recent winner was the address of the recent winner and we did dot call. And then we had this weird stuff in this brackets here and then nothing in the parentheses. So we did actually, essentially, we used this call keyword previously, but we didn't really tell you what it did. So call is how we can call functions to change the state of the blockchain. Static call is basically how at a low level we call our view or pure functions, right? Static call is going to be like, okay, don't change the state of the blockchain with this one. Just give us the return value. So this is kind of similar to like a view or a pure function at, at low level. There's also a send word, but like basically forget about it. <laughs> We're just going to be working with call and static call. And, you know, later on we'll learn about another one called delegate call, but don't worry about that for now. 
Recentwinner.com, like this, in these little squiggly brackets, we said, okay, we updated the value directly of our transaction in Solidity. So which again, if we had these transaction fields and we just directly updated value in these little brackets, right? We can also directly update gas limited and gas price in these little brackets if we wanted to as well. And in here, these parentheses is where we're gonna stick our data. Since all we wanted to do with our withdraw function previously was send money, we said, okay, send money, change the value that we're gonna send, but don't pass any data. Keep that data bit empty, which is why, again, remember how we hit this button before, right? And we had call data be empty. That's the, essentially running this command with call data be empty, with this section be empty, and then just updating the value that we sent with the transaction. And so it's this section that we can use to populate data to actually call specific functions. I'm gonna put a whole bunch more comments here. So in our squiggly brackets, we're able to pass specific fields of a transaction like value. And in our parentheses, we're able to pass data in order to call a specific function. But in here, there's no function to call since we were just sending Ethereum. If we wanna call a function or send any data, we can do this in the parentheses. Oh, and I think I spelled that wrong. Now that we've learned more about this in ABI.encode and decoding, and we know that, okay, this is what the computer, this is what Ethereum, this is what the EVM or any EVM compatible chain is looking for. It's looking for this byte code. It's looking for this, this binary stuff. And we just learned a little bit more about how to encode different variables into the binary, into that data bit. Well, uh, what do we do now? Now, since we know that our transactions are just gonna be compiled down to this binary stuff, what we can do then is we could actually populate this data value of our transactions ourselves with the binary the code is going to use. So here's our transaction for a contract deployment. The data field of the contract deployment is going to be all that binary code of the contract. For a function call, the data piece is going to be what to send to the address, what data, what function to call on the two address. Let's look at another one of our transactions on Etherscan, right? On one of our contracts, you don't have to. I'm gonna look at enter raffle from a previous section. And if we select down, we look at input data, it says function enter raffle, method ID. But if we look at the original, this is what's getting sent in the data field. It's this binary, it's this hex, it's this weird low level bytes thing. This is how the Ethereum blockchain or the or whatever EVM chain you're working with knows which function to call. It translates this into a function. And we can do the exact same thing and call these functions ourselves. So what we can actually do with this crazy newfound data encoding stuff, what we can actually do is send the data field of a transaction ourself in a transaction call. Remember back in this Ethers throwback where the, this data thing was the contract creation code? Well, instead, we could populate this data thing with our function call code, the exact function that we want to call in the binary in the hex edition. Now, you might be thinking, oh, well, why would I do that? I can always just use the, the interface, the ABI, all that stuff. Well, maybe you don't have that. Maybe all you have is the function name. Maybe all you have is the parameters you want to send. Or maybe you want to make your code be able to send arbitrary functions or make arbitrary calls or do random, really advanced stuff, right? That's where sending our function calls directly by populating this data field is going to be incredibly important. So remember, I said you're always going to need the ABI and the contract address to send a function. Now, when I said you always need the ABI, originally we were kind of talking about this thing, this big, this big thing, which is cool, which is the ABI, but this is like the human readable ABI. We can also do it with the not human readable ABI. And additionally, you don't need all this stuff. You can really use just the name of a function and then the input types to send a function call. So the question is then, okay, how do we send, how do we send transactions that call functions with just the data field populated? And then the next question is, how do we populate the data field? What do we populate the data field with to, to make one of these function calls? And then how do we send these transactions? Solidity actually has some more low level keywords, namely static call and call. We actually, we've used call in the past before. Does this code look at all familiar to you? Well, it should, because this is 
we use a similar setup in our fulfill random words for our lottery, right? We sent money doing this recent winner dot call, right? Recent winner was the address of the recent winner, and we did dot call, and then we had this weird stuff in this brackets here, and then nothing in the parentheses. So we did actually essentially, we used this call keyword previously, but we didn't really tell you what it did. So call is how we can call functions to change the state of the blockchain. Static call is basically how at a low level we call our view or pure functions, right? Static call is going to be like, okay, don't change the state of the blockchain with this one. Just give us the return value. So this is kind of similar to like a view or a pure function at, at low level. There's also a send word, but like basically forget about it. <laughs> We're just going to be working with call and static call. And, you know, later on we'll learn about another one called delegate call, but don't worry about that for now. Recent winner dot call like this. In these little squiggly brackets, we said, okay, we updated the value directly of our transaction in Solidity. So which again, if we had these transaction fields and we just directly updated value in these little brackets, right? We can also directly update gas limited and gas price in these little brackets if we wanted to as well. And in here, these parentheses is where we're gonna stick our data. Since all we wanted to do with our withdraw function previously was send money, we said, okay, send money, change the value that we're going to send, but don't pass any data. Keep that data bit empty, which is why, again, remember how we hit this button before, right? And we had call data be empty. That's the, essentially running this command with call data be empty, with this section be empty, and then just updating the value that we sent with the transaction. And so it's this section that we can use to populate data to actually call specific functions. I'm going to put a whole bunch more comments here. So in our squiggly brackets, we're able to pass specific fields of a transaction like value. And in our parentheses, we're able to pass data in order to call a specific function. But in here, there's no function to call since we were just sending Ethereum. If we want to call a function or send any data, we can do this in the parentheses. Oh, and I think I spelled that wrong. Next, upgrades, proxies, delegate call. These are all incredibly important parts of the auditing journey. You're going to work with a lot of protocols that use proxies that use delegate calls. So, so you need to be very well versed in how these actually work. In the Foundry Full course, we did a run through of what a proxy is. We did a, a minimal delegate call example and a minimal small proxy example. So we're going to watch some clips from the Foundry Full course that go over what a proxy is, what how delegate call works, and you're going to code some smart contracts to do it. All right, now with all this being said, let's turn up the heat and let me show you a small proxy, a minimal proxy example that shows how a contract can be used as a singular address, but the underlying code can actually change. And all the code we're gonna be working with once again in the Hard Hut Upgrades FCC sub lesson small proxy dot soul. And you can go ahead, copy paste this code if you want to follow along. So you don't have to code along with me here, but you absolutely can if we want. Now, I will say this is going to be one of the most, if not the most advanced section of the entire course. So feel free to go ahead and skip over this sub lesson if you want to just move on to learning how to actually build these proxies without really understanding what's going on behind the scenes. However, it is still really powerful if you do understand what's going on behind the scenes. So I have this minimalistic starting position right here. I have small proxy is proxy and I'm importing this proxy.soul thing from Open Zeppelin. Open Zeppelin has this minimalistic proxy contract that we can use to actually start working with this delegate call. Now this contract uses a lot of assembly or what's something called Yule and it's an intermediate language that can be compiled to bytecode for different backends. It's a sort of inline assembly inside Solidity and allows you to write really, really low level code close to the opcodes. Now we're not going to go over Yule, but I'll leave some links to the Yule documentation if you want to learn more. Even if you're a really advanced user, you really want to try to use as little Yule as possible because since it is so much lower level, it is much easier to screw things up. However, like I said, for this example, we are going to be using a little bit of Yule. Now in this proxy that we're going to be doing, we have this delegate function, which inside this inline assembly, which is Yule, it does a whole lot of really low level stuff. But the main thing that it does is it goes ahead and it does this delegate call functionality. If we look here, we can see it's using a fallback function and a receive function. So whatever it receives a function it doesn't recognize, it'll call fallback and fallback calls are 
delegate function. So anytime a proxy contract receives data for a function it doesn't recognize, it sends it over to some implementation, to some implementation contract where it will call it with delegate call. In our minimalistic example here, we have a function called set implementation, which will change where those delegate calls are going to be sending. This could be equivalent to like upgrading your smart contract. And then we have implementation here to read where that implementation contract is. Now, to work with proxies, we really don't want to have anything in storage. Because if we do delegate call and that delegate call changes some storage, we're going to screw up our contract's storage. The one caveat, though, to this, we do still need to store that implementation's address somewhere so we can call it. So EIP-1976 is called the standard proxy storage slot, which is an Ethereum improvement proposal for having certain storage slots specifically used for proxies. And in our minimalistic example here, we set byte32 private constant implementation slot to that location in storage. And we'll say, okay, whatever is at this storage slot is going to be the location of the implementation address. So the way our proxy is going to work is any contract that calls this proxy contract, if it's not this set implementation function, it's going to pass it over to whatever is inside the implementation slot address. That's what we're going to build here. So we have this small proxy is proxy and we'll create a real minimalistic contract. So we'll say contract implementation A and we'll just give it a UN256 public value and then function set value UN256 new value public. We'll say value equals new value. And so this is going to be our implementation. So now, anytime somebody calls small proxy or small proxy contract, it's going to delegate call it, it over to our implementation A and then save the storage in our small proxy address. So we're going to call our small proxy with the data to use this set value function selector. So let's make it a little easier just to figure out how to get that data by creating a new helper function. We'll do function get data to transact. And we can get the data using the ABI.encode with signature that we learned in an earlier lesson. So function get data to transact. We'll pass it a UNT256 number to update. So we'll give this the number we want to call a new value. We'll have this be a public pure that's going to return a bytes memory. And we'll just say return ABI.encode with Signature set value uint256, comma, number to update. So you remember this from our call anything section. And if you don't remember how to do that, remember to refer back to our NFT section to learn how to call anything and use abi.encode, abi.encode with a signature, and call anything with its raw bytes. We're going to get the data to transact. And we know that when we call implementation A from our small proxy, we're going to update our small proxy's storage. So we'll create a little function in Solidity just to read our storage in small proxy. So we're going to say function read storage, and this will just be a public view. And we'll do returns, returns, you went to 256 value at storage slot zero. And we are going to use a little bit of assembly here since we are doing all this low level stuff. And we're going to call the S load opcode to read the value at storage slot zero. We'll say value at storage slot zero, and we're going to set it. And then in assembly, this is how we set things. We're going to set it equal to S load of storage slot zero, and then it will return this value here. So we're reading directly from storage. Oops. And then we need a little parenthesis here. Sorry. So now, so let's go ahead and deploy our small proxy and let's deploy our implementation A. Now, our small proxy has a function called set implementation. So we're saying, OK, anytime we call this proxy contract, we're going to delegate call the functions over to here. So we're going to grab con implementations A's address, paste it into set implementation 777. So this is the data of set value UN256 with that number to update encoded in it. So if we call our small proxy with this data, our proxy contract is going to go, 
oh, okay, this is a function. Uh, I don't I don't see that function here. We're going to call our fallback, right? Which again is coming from Open Zeppelin, and our fallback is going to do this delegate, which is this low level stuff, but it's basically just doing a delegate call. We're going to call our fallback function, and then we're going to get the function in the implementation A. We're going to borrow this function, and we're going to use it on our on ourself. So if I copy this, the implementation has been set to being this address down here. So all the logic is going to be down here. So when I go ahead and I grab this, I paste it into call data and I hit transact. Looks like it went successfully went through. If I read storage now, we see that it is indeed 777, which is incredibly exciting. Now, this is incredibly beneficial because now let's say we want to go and update our code, right? We don't like contract implementation anymore. So let's go ahead, copy contract implementation A and we'll make a new one called implementation B. Now let's say whenever somebody calls set value, we do value equals new value plus one or plus two. Let's go ahead, let's save this, let's compile this and let's deploy implementation B. We'll grab implementation B's contract address. We'll call it on set implementation in our proxy and essentially we have now upgraded from implementation A to implementation B. Now, if we use this same data here, we're still going to call set value with 777, but instead we're now delegate calling to implementation B instead of implementation A. So if I call, if I put this data into the low level call data and I hit transact, it looks like it went through. Now I read storage and now is 779 since doing value equals new value plus two. So this is a minimalistic example of how upgrading actually works. Now this is incredibly beneficial because we can always just tell people, hey, make all your function calls to small proxy and you'll be good to go. But like I said before, this also means that the developers of this protocol can essentially change the underlying logic at any time. This is why it is so important to be sure to read contracts and check to see who has the developer keys and if a contract can be updated. If a contract can be updated and a single person can update it, well, guess what? You have a single centralized point of failure and technically the contract isn't even decentralized. Now, something else I was talking about in the video is function clashes, function selector clashes. Right now, whenever we call set implementation, the proxy function set implementation gets called because we don't trigger the fallback because we can see the function is here. However, if I have a function called set implementation in our implementation, this one can never be called. Whenever we send a function signature of set implementation, it's always going to call the one on the proxy. This is where the transparent proxy that we're going to be working with can help us out here and the up universal upgradable proxy can help us too. And I'm not going to go too much deeper into these now, but we've left some links in the GitHub repository to teach you more about these selector clashes and how those two proxy patterns that I just mentioned, the transparent and universal upgradable can get around these. If you're confused by anything in here, go into this discussion thread and make a new discussion about proxies. Make a new discussion about the assembly, about the Yule set implementation. This is a great time to connect with other people taking the course and ask questions here, because I know that this is a really advanced section and requires you having gone through a lot of those sub lessons that we've gone before. And if it takes you a couple times of playing around with solidity and playing around with remix, I definitely recommend you do so. This is a section where seeing really is believing. And I want you to jump into Remix and I want you to test this and I want you to play around with this and see what you can break and fiddle with. And then finally, we need to know about self-destruct. This isn't something we went over a whole lot in the Foundry Full course, but essentially self-destruct is a keyword in Solidity that will destroy or delete a contract. What makes it extra special is any ETH that's inside of that contract will automatically get forced or pushed into whatever address that you push it. So most of the time, if we don't have a receive or a fallback, you won't be allowed to push any ETH into this contract unless you use self-destruct. So if ever you're looking for an exploit, if ever you're looking for an attack where you need to force ETH into a contract, self-destruct is gonna be your tool to do that. If we copy this code base from Solidity by example, and we pop over into Remix, 
you can actually see it directly in action. So you can find this here, Solidity by example, hacks self-destruct. This is also in the GitHub repo. Let's create a new folder. We'll do self-destruct attack.sol. We'll paste it in here. We can see here, we have this ether game where we call this line, where we say require the balance of the contract is less than the target amount, which is gonna be seven ether. And we get the balance of the contract like so. Then we have this claim reward function as well. What we can do with this attack contract is we can self-destruct it and force money into this contract here, making the game unplayable. So if I compile this, let's go ahead and deploy these. So first we'll deploy the ether game. Ether game, we'll deploy it. And you can see, if we scroll down, I can put in one ether here, deposit. Now the balance is one ether. And then I can go ahead and I claim the reward as well. And we gotta get the balance up to seven. So let's deposit one ether a few more times. Two, do one again, deposit. Let's actually just do four, deposit. Oops. Let's do one again, deposit. Now we're at four, one again. Whoops, that's 10. One again, now it's five. One, one again, deposit six, one again. Okay, now it's at seven. Now I can claim the reward, it goes back to zero, and I've withdrawn all, withdrawn all the ether. You'll notice I cannot send it more than one. If I try to do two and deposit that, it fails. I can't send it directly any ETH because it doesn't have a fallback or receive function. So you might think, ah, okay, it'll never, we'll never be able to break this. Now, what can happen is, since this looks for a winner here, if they're the seventh person, they become the winner. If we force the money in to seven, the winner will never be set and the game will be forever broken. So if we kill everything again, let's redeploy our ether game and we'll copy the address. We'll deploy our attack, paste the ether game in here. We can have two people deposit to set the balance to two. So deposit, we'll deposit again. Deposit. Now the balance is two of the ether game. Now, if we call attack with five, we scroll down, we call attack. You can see that that indeed went through. Now the balance of the ether game is seven, but the winner is going to be nobody. Can anyone deposit? If I try to deposit, those will fail because the deposit function we have require the balance is less than or equal to the target amount. And if we add any ether, it'll be greater than. So now nobody can deposit anything and there is no winner. So nobody can claim anything and the game is essentially broken. So this is the self-destruct is a way to delete a contract and then force any value into some other address. And then finally, we want to know how to run fork tests or doing mainnet fork tests. There's a couple different ways we can do this. If we run forge test dash F or dash dash fork, we can add a URL of something like mainnet. And what we'll do is we'll create a fake local version of mainnet and we'll run tests against something like mainnet. This way we won't have to add in all of our contract addresses or anything. So this is where we'd get your alchemy URL or, or whatever. You might do you know, mainnet alchemy URL. Or excuse me, excuse me, not fork. It's a fork URL. And this would be like alchemy.com slash blah, blah, blah. It looks like mine isn't set, which is all good. If you do set yours, for example, maybe in something like a .env, so you could run fork test dash dash fork URL. Mine set as mainnet RPC URL. Oops, excuse me, forge test fork mainnet and be able to actually interact with and work with mainnet contracts locally. So you don't actually deploy anything. There's another way you can do this. In your setup, in your test, you can run function setup public. There's a cheat code called vm.create select fork, where you can add something like a block number to fork at a certain block number and then URL or alias, where you can add like your URL or you can go to your foundry toml. You can add a new section in here called RPC endpoints, something like mainnet equals, and then add your you know, environment variables or whatever, or your, or your URL if you have it, you know, mainnet RPC URL, 
And then in your test, we can say mainnet, since that's the alias in here. And I would want to do import test from forge std test.sol. We'd say counter is test, because it has the test contract has this VM thing. And now if I just run forge test, this test will actually automatically run a fork. It doesn't really say anything here, but we actually worked with our forked URL for all the tests in here. And fantastic. All right, fantastic. So that's the refresher for Solidity, for Foundry. If any of that was confusing, if any of that was new to you, be sure to watch the Foundry full course, except for you know the fuzz testing or the stateful fuzzing or the invariant test stuff. If that was a little weird to you, no worries. We're going to go over that more in this course. But anything else, be sure to watch the Foundry full course or go to Cypher and Updraft and select the most recent Foundry course that's out there. That's what's going to scale you up the fastest. But with that being said, at this point, you've done the refresher. You're now ready to embark on the smart contract security auditing journey. The way this is going to work is the next lesson, we're going to go over high level smart contract security stuff. What is a smart contract audit? What is a security review? What is all this stuff? What does one look like? And then sections three through eight, we're actually going to do live audits with real code bases specifically created to teach you the different exploits and to teach you what it really feels like to do a smart contract security review or look at these code bases and really give you the practical skills to go out there and become a security researcher and become potentially a smart contract auditor, depending on your terminology. But before we move on, if we come back to the GitHub repo or the Cypher and Updraft, go down to section one, we scroll down, we do have some exercises. Number one, join the CodeHawks slash Cyphern Discord. This is the CodeHawks competitive audits Discord, as well as Cyphern, as well as Cyphern Updraft. And it's a phenomenal place to meet other people working on exactly what you're working on. When I first started in this space several years ago, I joined a Discord and I made a ton of friends that I'm still working with to this day. It's a great place to meet people, bounce ideas off of other people, etc. But remember, still use the forums for asking your questions. And then what you can do actually is you can copy paste a link to the forum to the discord to get the attention of other people in the discord. But we want to use the forum so that AIs can index our questions so that web searchers can scrape our questions. And so that we can have a, a better history and easier way to flip back to that knowledge for other people who have similar questions. Your exercises for the end of lesson one, join the code hawks slash siphon slash updraft discord and go for a walk and buckle up because our next section is what is a smart contract audit? What is a security review? What does it all look like? We're going to teach you from a high level and then all of the next sections are going to be implementing that knowledge. Take a walk. Congratulations on finishing the refresher. You deserve a coffee and I'll see you in the next one. So now we're finally going to look into, okay, what is a smart contract audit? What is a security review? I'm sure you think you know, but let's make sure you actually know. Now, even though we just talked about smart contract audit, smart contract audit, smart contract audit, I'm here to tell you that that term is terrible. And instead, you want to use the term security review. So much so that I had a t-shirt that says security review, yes, smart contract audit, no. The Spearbit team has a wonderful thread as to why we should make this change and why it's important to have this change. When you're doing these reviews, it's not an audit. It's not a guarantee your code is bug free. It's a review. It's a security focused review. The audit makes it feel like there's some type of guarantee. Maybe there's even some legal implication. Security review is free of all that. You are looking for as many bugs as possible and you are looking to make sure the code is secure as possible, but an audit is kind of a terrible term. We've got a link to the Spirit Thread, a popular security company that talks a little bit more about why this is so important to get this terminology correct. However, a lot of protocols are still going to look for smart contract audit, so it's important we know we know that these are interchangeable. A security review is a smart contract audit. Protocols are still going to look for audits, even though they're definitely security reviews. Because we're in the know, because you're a security researcher, you are now smart enough to know that security review is the correct term. I digress. Now, break out your notepads because we're going to be talking about what a security review is, 
and what the process actually looks like. So right in the GitHub repo associated with this course, we have this three phases of a security review and what it exactly looks like. Now, the thing is, there's no silver bullet to smart contract auditing. We're going to learn a couple of different strategies. We're going to learn two in particular, one that I'm calling the Tincho and one that I'm calling the Hans for actually approaching these. But really, there isn't a silver bullet. There's going to be a lot of different strategies and a lot of different pros and cons of working with different strategies. But on a high level, here are going to be really what a smart contract audit looks like or feels like. This is on YouTube from the Cypher and Audits YouTube channel. Additionally, if you'd like, you can send this to clients so that if they are not really sure what to expect out of one of these security reviews, this will give them a high level overview of what they should expect from working with you once you complete this course and you become a professional security reviewer. Oftentimes, protocols actually don't know what to expect from a security review, and they're not sure what a correct one looks like. So if you're going to be doing private audits or traditional audits or working with a firm, sometimes part of your job is going to be teaching them, hey, here's what a security review entails, and here's how you can work with us to make sure this goes as well as possible. A smart contract audit is a time boxed security based code review on your smart contract system. An auditor's goal is to find as many vulnerabilities as possible and educate the protocol on best security best practices and coding best practices moving forward. Auditors use a combination of manual review and automated tools to find these vulnerabilities. Now, why are these so important? Why is it critical that you get an audit before deploying your code base to a live blockchain? Well, for starters, there are entire websites dedicated to how many hacks happen. Last year, we saw the most value ever stolen from smart contracts, with almost $4 billion stolen. Due to the immutability of the blockchain, once a smart contract is deployed, you can't change it, so you better get it right. The blockchain is a permissionless, adversarial environment, and your protocol needs to be prepared for malicious users. But even more so than that, an audit can improve your developers' team's understanding of code, improving their speed and effectiveness in implementing features moving forward. And it can teach your team the latest and greatest tooling in the space. Often, just one smart contract audit isn't even enough, and protocols go on a security journey that includes many audits and many different services like formal verification, competitive audits, and bug bounty programs. We'll break these down in a future video. There are a lot of companies that offer smart contract auditing services, like Trail of Bits, Consensus Diligence, Open Zeppelin, Sigma Prime, Spirit DAO, Mixbytes, Watchpug, Trust, and of course, Cyphern. Additionally, there's a lot of independent auditors that do great work as well. A typical audit looks like this. Price and timeline. First, a protocol needs to reach out, and they can reach out before or after their code is actually finished. Ideally, they reach out sometime before their code is finished, so the auditors can have time to slot them in. Once they reach out, the protocol and auditors will discuss how long the audit will take based off of scope and code complexity. The scope of the audit is going to be the exact files and commit hash that's going to be audited. How long the audit usually depends on how many lines of code slash complexity. You can see a very, very rough approximation of how long an audit takes on your screen now. Of course, this depends firm to firm, audit to audit, and tool to tool. So take these with a very large grain of salt. Additionally, it's this duration that sets the price. And same thing at the time of recording, prices range wildly depending on who's doing the audit, how many people are doing the audit, how complex the code is, and more. And these initial conversations are really just to get a ballpark estimate and slot you in to the auditor's schedule. Commit hash, down payment, start date. Once you have a commit hash, you can finalize the start date, and final price. The commit hash is the unique ID of the code base that you're working with, so the auditors can know exactly what code they're going to be looking at. Some auditors will ask for a down payment in order to schedule you in. Audit begins. The auditors will use every tool in their arsenal to find as many vulnerabilities in your code as possible. We'll give you some tricks in a minute to make this a successful step. Initial report. After the time period ends, the auditors will give you an initial report that looks something like this, with all their findings listed by severity, usually categorized into highs, mediums, lows, informational slash non-critical, and gas efficiencies. High, mediums, and low represent the severity of impact and likelihood of each vulnerability. Informational, gas, and non-critical are findings to improve the efficiency of your code, code structure, readability, and best practice improvements that are not necessarily vulnerabilities, but more ways to improve your code. Mitigation begins. The protocol's team will then have an agreed upon time to fix the vulnerabilities found in the initial audit report. Sometimes, depending on the severity of the findings, this might mean you have to start from scratch, but more times than not, you can just implement the recommendations the auditors give you. This is usually much shorter than the audit itself. Final report. After the protocol makes these changes, the audit team will do a final audit report exclusively on the fixes made to address the issues brought up in the initial report. Then, hopefully, the protocol call and auditors have a great experience together and will work together in the future to keep Web3 secure. Now, there are a few key things that you can do to make sure your audit is successful as possible. To get the most out of your audit, you should have clear documentation, a robust 
test suite, ideally including fuzz or invariant tests. Code should be commented and readable. Modern best practices are followed. There should be an established communication channel between developers and auditors during the audit, and an initial video walkthrough of the code should be done before the audit starts. The most important part of the process is going to be during the audit. To get the best results, you want to think of you and your auditors working together as a team. One of the best ways to do this is to have a dedicated channel where auditors can ask questions to developers. The developers will always and forever have more context over the code base than the auditors ever will because they have spent so much more time working on the code base. And the more documentation, context and information that you can give to the auditors, the better. This way it can be easy for anybody to walk through the code and understand what it's supposed to do. In fact, 80% of all bugs are actually business logic implementation bugs. This means that these are bugs that have nothing to do with some weird coding error and are just somebody not knowing what the protocol should be doing. So it's vitally important that the auditors understand what the code should be doing. Having a modern test suite and tooling can also make auditors spend less time fidgeting with your tooling and more time finding issues. Post audit. We highly encourage you to take the recommendations your auditors give you seriously. Additionally, after an audit, if you make a change to your code base, that new code is now unaudited code. It doesn't matter how small the changes. We've seen a ton of protocols saying, oh, I'll just slip in one line of code. And sure enough, that's the line of code that gets exploited. And often, depending on the seriousness of your protocol and how many users you want to use it, one audit might not even be enough. Working with multiple auditors and getting more eyes on your code will give you a better chance of finding more vulnerabilities. What an audit isn't. Now, here's the thing. An audit doesn't mean that your code is bug free. An audit is a security journey between the protocol and the auditor to find as many bugs as possible and teach the protocol different methodologies to stay more secure in the future. Security is a continuous process that is always evolving. No matter how much experience someone has, people at all levels have missed vulnerabilities. On the unfortunate day that that happens, be sure that you and your auditor can jump on a call quickly to try to remedy the situation and maybe consider getting insurance for your protocol as well. So now with that being said, now you have a good idea of what a smart contract audit entails and what to expect end to end. A smart contract audit is a security journey end to end, leveling up your protocol so that you can have all the best practices and security know-how to deploy your code to a live blockchain forever. And of course, if you're looking for an audit, be sure to reach out to the Cypherin team, link in the description. And as always, stay safe out there and we'll see you next time. Now, this is going to be a little bit different from a competitive audit versus a private audit. And we'll talk a little bit more about the difference in a later video. The competitive audit mindset is really to find as many high impact bugs as possible and optimize for time doing so. Whereas a private audit or a private security review, your protocol is to do whatever it takes to make sure the client is safe. Competitive audit, you don't really have that requirement. That should be your requirement, but the private audit, it's really your job to make sure you do whatever it takes to make sure the client is safe. At a very high level, here's the entire audit process. Get context, use some tools and do some manual reviews, and then write the report. And like I said, we're gonna watch this video a little bit later on the Tincho method that he used to audit ENS, which actually netted him a $100,000 payout. However, the more in-depth audit process is this right here. It's broken into three phases. We have an initial review where we go through the code base and we scope it out. Right, we scope it out. Maybe we'll figure out how long it'll take us. This is where we do some pricing. We'll talk about this a little bit later. We get all the dependencies and we just kind of scope it out. We don't really dig deep into anything. Then finally, we do some reconnaissance. This is where we actually start walking through the code. We, just, we maybe we start running some tools. We start actually doing stuff. Then we do some vulnerability identification. This is where you identify the vulnerabilities and you figure out exactly how these exploits work. And then you write a report on all these vulnerabilities that you found, and importantly, how to make the protocol more secure. You should be taking notes. I want you to write this down. In your report, your job is to do whatever it takes to make the protocol more secure. And this is for a private audit. This is for a traditional audit, a traditional security review. For competitive audits, it's a little bit different. You're hyper-optimized for time. You're hyper-optimized for finding as many high vulnerabilities as possible, but in a private audit, you write the report to teach the protocol. In a way, you're an educator like me, congrats. Anyways, after you give the protocol the report on all the fixes that they should make, the protocol will then take time to actually make those fixes, right? So they'll fix the issues, they'll retest, 
and add tests to, to catch for these issues moving forward. And they should make a bunch of changes based off your recommendations. Then there's a final phase called the mitigation review. This is where the protocol then gives the code back to you and you check to make sure that the code that they added actually fixes the issues and importantly that they didn't introduce any new bugs. In a competitive audit, sometimes some projects forego this process, but a lot of competitive audit platforms like CodeHawks have something called like a mitigation contest where they allow a secondary contest with a smaller prize pool to also mitigate these issues. Now, the key to all of this is right here. Repetition is the mother of skill. The more you do these security reviews, the better you're going to get. This is again why you're a security researcher and we're going to be teaching you a lot of skills to to learn as, and absorb as many tips and tricks and information as possible. So on a high level, that's the smart contract audit or smart contract security review process. That's the whole thing. And this plays a key role in the entire smart contract development life cycle or the software development life cycle. So there's a link in the GitHub repo associated with this where they talk about the smart contract developer life cycle, where it's essentially plan and design, develop and test, get the audit, deploy, and then monitor and maintain. And here's where a lot of people mess this up. So this is the OWASP or the Open Source Foundation for Application Security. I'm not exactly sure what the W is for, but they talk a lot at length in this document about how security is not just a step. It's part of the process and it's a continuous journey. So doing a smart contract audit to check some box is the wrong way to think about this. There's so much more to smart contract security than just doing this audit, doing this single point in time review. And in fact, much later on in the course, if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see we talk at length about post deployment with bug bounties, incident response, monitoring, blockchain sleuthing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Smart contract security is a crucial part of the smart contract development lifecycle. You especially want to be thinking about it before you deploy and after you deploy. After you deploy, you definitely want to be monitoring and maintaining your code. You 100% want to do a smart contract security review or audit or ideally several. And you also need to plan your post deployment before you actually deploy. So if you've written all your code and you think, oh, I just get an audit and ship, uh, that's wrong. And if you are a security researcher, you should tell your clients that they're actually wrong. There's two tests that I tell everybody to look at before they get an audit, before they do a security review. And it's this nascent XYZ simple security toolkit, or I would argue even more importantly is this thing called direct test. So this is a list of questions by Trail of Bits that the protocol should have answered before they go to audit. If you're working with the protocol, you need to tell them, hey, are you even ready for an audit? Are you even ready for a security review? Let's see if you can answer these questions. If not, you're not ready. And I'm going to read them to you now because I think it's important that we drill these into your head. Do you have all actors, roles, and privileges documented? Do you keep documentation of external services, contracts, and oracles? Do you have a written and tested incident response plan? Do you document the best ways to attack your system? Do you perform identity verification and background checks on all employees? This one might seem very weird. If you have a system that's centralized and you have some people that you don't know if you can trust, you should probably figure that out. Do you have a team member with security defined in the role? This is absolutely crucial. Pick somebody on your team and say you are now responsible for security. This will give your project some ownership mentality over security and make sure that whenever there is a hack, you know exactly who to look to for these attacks. Do you require hardware security keys for production systems? This is kind of more traditional Web2 OPSEC security here. Something like a physical YubiKey is a good tool for securing accounts and better than maybe like an authentication app and even way better than like SMS. We'll talk a little bit more about basic OPSEC a little bit later in the course. Do you define key invariants for your system and test them on every commit? This is going to be running that invariant that stateful fuzzing test suite to use the best automated tools to discover security issues in your code. We're going to learn about these very soon. Do you undergo external audits and maintain a vulnerability disclosure or bug bounty program? We are going to teach you how to do these external audits or these external security reviews. And we're also going to be talking about vulnerability disclosure and bug bounty towards the end of the course. And then finally, have you considered and mitigated avenues for abusing users of your system? So basically, have you thought about attackers? Anytime you want to deploy code or you want to work with a team that's going to be deploying code, these 12 questions must be answered. And I would even argue that 
If a protocol doesn't have these answered, then you would tell them, hey, like we can't ship until these are answered. And maybe we don't even do an audit until all of these are answered. So that is the wrecked test. The nascent audit readiness checklist is kind of a different take on these questions, but it's something similar where you can walk through and check off whether or not these are done. We'll talk later about post deployment planning, bug bounties, disaster recovery drills and monitoring, but this is a very essential step of any smart contract deployment process. Like we showed before, the response time on a lot of popular hacks hasn't been so hot. And then only then can we get into the smart contract review where we go line by line through the code and actually find these vulnerabilities. Now, we're going to be working with a lot of different tools in this curriculum, but let's go over some of the most important ones. And once we get into the actual audits, you'll see how they work and how they fit into the whole picture. So the front line of defense is going to be your classic test suite, right? This is going to be your foundry, your hard hat, your brownie, Aporks, even Remix has tests and uh, RIP Truffle. We're going to see some really robust test suites in some of the coming projects that you should model and tell your protocols to model afterwards so they stay more secure. We'll talk about test coverage and more in the coming security reviews. Next, static analysis. So static analysis is going to be automatically checking for issues without actually executing anything. Hence, the debugging is going to be static. So these are going to be tools like Slither, Fornalizer, sometimes Mithril, Adarin. These are your tools that don't run any of your code, but just kind of dumbly look for some pattern matching. We are going to be working with Slither and Adarin pretty heavily throughout this curriculum, and you'll learn how to use these. Next, fuzzing or fuzz testing. As we've gone over before, this involves providing random data as inputs during testing. And it's a phenomenal way to very quickly see if there's some weird bug in your smart contracts. Stateful fuzzing is kind of the level up of, of this. And we talked about this in that video we saw earlier. This is fuzz testing, but the system remembers the state of the last fuzz test and continues with that state in the new fuzz test. It has nothing to do with checking whether or not your cat is fuzzy or not, although this one would definitely pass. We're going to learn how to write some of these stateful fuzz tests, some of these invariant tests, and work with invariants in the coming audits. There's more type of tests like differential tests, chaos testing that we're going to skip over. But just know that, again, as part of your security research portion of your journey, you definitely want to always be exploring new tools, new testing, et cetera. And then finally, formal verification. So formal verification is a generic term for applying formal methods, FM, to verify the correctness of hardware or software. We're going to be learning about formal verification much later in the course because its use case is often very specific. Applying formal methods often just means converting the code base to math and using mathematical proofs to prove that the code does something or doesn't do something. One of the most popular types of formal verification is going to be symbolic execution, which basically takes your solidity function and turns it into math or a set of Boolean expressions. Matt, Manticore, Sertora, Z3, these are all tools in the symbolic execution and formal verification space. And then finally, AI tools, uh, TLDR, right now they aren't very good. We will be and we should be using AI as a sanity check or a way to answer some question very quickly or find something in a code base. At the moment, we've seen some memes of this project has been audited by ChatGPT. If you see that, do not put any money in it stay far away from it and know that the project probably isn't taking security seriously. And then finally, for some extra homework here, there was this phenomenal research study on this GitHub repo here, link in the GitHub description and Cypher and Updraft, where they go over all the machine findable bugs versus non-machine findable bugs. Like what bugs in real life can be found with tools versus what bugs can be only found with some type of manual review. And at the moment, around 80% of all real world bugs and competitive audit bugs are machine unauditable, meaning some type of machine or some type of tool wouldn't have found it. This includes different types of AI tools. At the moment, this tells us two things. Number one, our tools aren't good enough yet and we need better tools. And then number two, human auditors and human security researchers are absolutely crucial because the vast majority of bugs are not gonna be found from some tool at the moment. And this checks out because the vast majority of bugs are often business logic, incorrect implementations, as opposed to some weird solidity cryptography weirdness. And you'll we'll learn more about this as we proceed in this course.
Now, a question that a lot of new security researchers ask is, what happens if I do an audit or security review and the protocol gets hacked and the protocol gets wrecked? Well, I asked that exact same question to Tincho and here's what he had to say. Let me approach you slowly, okay? So sure. I will first say, I have always been of the idea, I know some people will disagree with this, perhaps it's an unpopular opinion, but I have always been of the idea that a security code review, like an audit, should be valuable enough on comprehensively as a as as an effort that I do on a code base beyond the fact that I find or not find a critical issue. Okay? So I should be able to provide value to whoever is working with me, to whoever is trusting me, beyond the fact that I did or did not find a critical issue. Obviously, obviously, the less critical issues that you miss, the better the safer you will be, the more reputation that you will have in the space, and the more that people will call you and the safer Ethereum will be. And I wouldn't agree with that more. But again, I don't think auditors are the sole responsibles of finding or not finding an issue or an issue being exploited in mainnet or not. They do have a saying, they do have some degree of their of responsibility. Yeah, perhaps, because they were actually hired to provide an assessment of the security of the code and they did their best and perhaps they missed something. And that can happen and has happened and will continue to happen. But it's naive to think, in my opinion, that just because an auditor missed something, the whole blame of thing is on the audit. I think that if vulnerability was missed, there's a whole chain of events that happened for that vulnerability to actually be exploited. It was introduced. It wasn't caught in the test. It wasn't caught in peer reviews. Then went to auditors, to multiple rounds of audits. It wasn't caught that. Then it went to a public contest. Nobody caught it. Then it went to a back warranty program. Nobody paid attention or nobody caught it. And then it went to production. And after four months, somebody exploited it, right? So I think there is a whole chain of events. And perhaps when it was exploited, nobody was monitoring that system or nobody was actually putting runtime security into the into the security of the smart contract. So that means that nobody was paying attention to certain parameters of the system that actually allowed for the vulnerability to be opened up and many, many things, right? So what I mean is many things can go wrong. I don't think when something is missed or something is attacked on mainnet is the sole blame of, of whoever audited it. But as an auditor, depending on the deal that you have with the client, it might be the case that you can actually help, right? You can actually help mitigate the impact of the vulnerability. You can help contain the attack. You can help identify, even do some threat analysis if you have th those capabilities in your team to actually identify the hackers, like whatever. If you are to be the trusted security partner of your clients, probably when they are hacked, you want to be there. You want to be there supporting them. And at the end of the day, in reality, your responsibility will be that of, will be really limited to the agreement that you sign with the client. But given that you want to be trusted, that you want to be supportive, that you want to have a good relationship, you will be there to help them in whatever the scenario. 100%. Security is a journey. And whenever there is a hack, it's because a lot of things broke down and a lot of things didn't work. You and the protocol need to work as a team to make sure the protocol is safe and secure. Now, as I've said a few times, we need to have this attackers and defenders mindset. We need to always be learning. We need to always be leveling up. As we proceed through these audits, I'm going to be giving you a ton of different tools for you to learn, for you to grow, and I'm going to be giving you exercises sometimes for you to continue to get that knowledge ingrained in your head so that you can keep getting better and better. We've already gone through some of the top attack vectors, but here is that list more recently updated. Thank you so much, Peter, from Block Threat Intelligence again for this list here. Private keys being the biggest, then reward manipulation, price oracle manipulation, insufficient access controls, logic error, function parameter validation, reentrancy, governance, misconfiguration, etc. These are all going to be bugs and issues that we're going to learn and we're going to go over in the coming security reviews that we're going to, that we're going to walk through together. So with that being said, congratulations. We've gone over a lot of the high level of what a smart contract audit is, what a security review is. Let's do a quick recap of this section. 
A smart contract audit is a time boxed security review looking for security vulnerabilities. The goal of a smart contract audit or security review is to inform the protocol to be as secure as possible, update changes to their code base to make them more secure. There's no silver bullet to auditing or doing security reviews. There's no one size fits all. However, a security review is often broken up into three phases. Initial review, where you do the scoping, reconnaissance, write up vulnerabilities, write up the report, protocol fixes it, and then you make sure the fixes actually work. Security is a crucial step in the smart contract development lifecycle, and it shouldn't just be an afterthought, and it shouldn't just be some box you check. You need to have a security mindset from day one, and you need to be thinking about the post-deployment planning, monitoring and maintaining, deploying, and et cetera. And like I said, we're gonna go over these one by one. We're gonna start with the security review, the pre-deploy step. We're gonna be working with a lot of different tooling in this course, like static analysis, like Slither and Adarin. We're gonna be working with invariant tests and fuzzing, formal verification, AI, et cetera. Before a project actually goes and gets an audit, they should go through a simple security checklist or at least go through the RECT test, 100%. We need to always be learning and we need to keep in mind the top attack vectors so that we are prepared as security researchers. I'll update this image by the time this course goes live, but here are some of the top attacks that have been happening in 2023. And that will probably happen in 2024 and 2025 as well. Reentrancy is an issue that's been live since 2016 and we're still getting hit by it. However, hopefully with you taking this course, we will drop that number to zero. I think that's a very attainable goal for us in 2024. Drop reentrancy issues to zero hacks. Let's see if we can at least do that. And finally, your exercise here. Sign up for one security slash web three newsletter. The reason that this is so important is because you are now, like we said before, a security researcher, keyword researcher, and you need to have a constant influx of education and learnings. You're going to see that we're actually going to study other people's audit reports. We're going to study other tools. We're going to use a tool to actually help us do that called Solidit. And we're going to be continuously learning from all these hacks that happen. Anytime there's a hack, there's an exploit in this space, that's a learning opportunity for us to get better as security researchers and know how to prevent that exploit in the future. So your goal is to sign up for one of these newsletters here. It doesn't even matter. Some of these aren't even newsletters, but sign up for one. You can go to Cypher and Updraft, Blockchain Threat Intelligence. This one is a paid one, but they're absolutely phenomenal. We are going to use Solidit later in this course, so maybe you just sign up for it now. Rec.News is one of my favorite. Week in Ethereum, one of my other favorite. Consensus Diligence, Officer CIA, there's a ton of different resources to sign up for. So take your first step here and sign up for one of these. The only way you're gonna stay ahead of the attackers is if you constantly have a stream of information. So looking forward to you signing up. And with that being said, you've now completed the high level overview of what a smart contract audit even is and what the process looks like. Now, we're finally gonna flip over to your first audit password store audit. At the time of recording, this was a CodeHawk's first flight audit. Again, CodeHawk's first flights are competitive audits that are much easier. They're tailored for new security researchers. You can't win any money from them, but they make the process of getting feedback, learning how to do these much, much better. And they're from dummy code bases that I've made or somebody else has made. So with this all being said, take a minute, take a breather, review your notes, go for a walk, go get a coffee, because now we're about to jump into our first audit. We're gonna teach you how to do an end-to-end -end audit report with this incredibly minimal code base. And we're gonna stop the hacker from destroying our smart contract. And we're gonna learn a lot about the audit process from doing so. So take that break and I'll see you in the next one. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you've just gone for a walk. Hopefully you've taken a break and absorbed all that high level information that we just went over. Everything that we went over in this, what is a smart contract audit or a security review, we're going to actually now implement in these coming audits. The next sections three through eight are now gonna be actual audits, actual security reviews that we're gonna go through together. And we're gonna start with the password store audit. So if we scroll down or we click that in the table of contents, 
We now are on section three, your first audit or security review, the password store audit. And before we actually jump into this, let me show you what we're going to build here. We're going to focus on this as if you're doing your own private audit or you're working for a firm. For example, if you're on the Cypher.io website, you'd click this like request an audit button and you'd get this little form to answer. You get the inbound and then you do the audit. So we're going to be practicing this as if we're Cypher, as if this is a real live audit. However, we are going to learn all the skills needed to actually compete in a competitive audit as well, like CodeHox. And in fact, later on, we'll actually teach you how to sign up and work with CodeHox and engage in these competitive audits and do as best you can. And we're going to learn from some of the best people in the world, such as Hans, who is the number one competitive auditor in the world for the first half of 2023. So before we actually start going through this, let me show you what the final results are going to look like. So if we scroll down a bit, we can actually see a couple of different things here. We can see security review v1, v2, v3, and v final. To show you how we're going to be ending it, let's go ahead and click on the final here. And in here, we can see the password store audit and all of its code. If we scroll down, there's a readme with all this getting started information, usage, audit scope, and everything like that. If we go to this audit data folder, we can click on that. We can actually see a lot of different information in here. There's a readme, which will teach us how to create our own audit report that we can add to our own portfolios. We can see this markdown file, which has a markdown list of vulnerabilities. We can see there's going to be at least two highs found in this code base. We can see some write ups for the issues. And then we have this report.pdf, which looks approximately like this. So this, is, so this is going to be a more professional looking report, obviously, with some stuff not filled in that you'll be able to give to a client, you'll be able to give to a protocol after you do your own audits. At the end of this audit, not only are you going to have a professional looking PDF and audit report that you can add to your portfolio, but you're going to learn all the markdown, you're going to learn all the tips and tricks to getting this set up. And then of course, we are going to finally go through a couple of minimal bugs in this code base. So since this is our first audit, we're going to start really small, really minimal. And in fact, there's even less than 20 lines of code in here. Now, before we jump into this and actually start looking for bugs, some of you actually might be able to find these bugs right off the bat. We're going to get, put you through a scenario because doing security reviews aren't always as straightforward as you might think. Remember, you are the security researcher here. You are the security experts. And oftentimes protocols are not, they don't have the knowledge that you have. So that's going to be the end product. That's going to be what we're going to finalize with. But our starting point is going to be very different from what you just saw here. So that's going to be our ending point. Now, if we scroll down a little bit more in here, we see the section called remember the phases. Remember, the phases are going to be the initial review, protocol fixes and mitigation review for this audit or this security review. And most of them in this course, we're going to be focusing mainly on the initial review because after the protocol fixes the code base, you basically just redo the initial review, but without the scoping because you've already basically scoped out the code base. So we're going to be focusing on scoping, reconnaissance, vulnerability identification and reporting here. But now that we know what to expect and what we're looking for and what we're going to be doing here, let's go ahead and let's start our first audit, our first security review. And to do so, we're going to start with a little scenario. Now, so the first step of a security review, as we've said before, is going to be the scoping phase. This is when you're going to get the contract and understand the scope of what you're going to be doing a security review on. For this exchange with the password store audit, here's how it's going to go down. Yeah, um, hi, I'm the password store audit team. We're looking to get this code base audited ASAP because we want to get it listed somewhere officially. Hi, password store. I'm beginner auditor number one. Really excited to help you out with your code base. Could you send your code base over to me? Yeah, of course. Uh, here's the Etherscan link to our code base. So that's the exchange the protocol had. If you're in the GitHub repo associated with this course, go to section three, scroll down or click down to the table of contents to the section three. And this is what they sent you. Security review code V1. They sent you this Etherscan link of this contract that has been verified on chain. 
So first of all, great that it's been verified on chain, but right away, this should be a red flag to you. You will get protocols who just send you an Etherscan link to their protocol asking for an audit. And I'm here to tell you that it is not acceptable for you to do an audit or a security review on a code base that is exclusively on Etherscan. What are you looking for as a security researcher? Yes, you're looking for as many bugs as possible, but also you're checking to see for code maturity. If there's no test suite, if there's no deployment suite or any of that, how mature is this code base? It's your job as a security researcher to make sure that every protocol that interacts with you leaves more educated on how to make sure their code bases are secure. You want to make sure that they are armed with the knowledge to be as safe as possible. But not, not only that, you want to make sure they don't get wrecked so that they don't make you look bad because if they get wrecked, they're going to blame you, the security researcher. So not only do you want to make sure that they have a secure code base so the protocol is safer, but you want to make sure they have a secure code base so that they don't go around and, and blame you for giving them a bad audit. You want to do everything in your power to make sure the protocol is as safe as possible. Do you have assurance the protocol is safe if all they've sent you is an Etherscan link? And the answer is a fat resounding no. And here's what they send you. They send you this Etherscan link. Where do you think we should start our audit review with this Etherscan link? I'll give you 20 seconds to think about it or pause the video and write down where you think we should start this. Seriously, go back to your notes and write it down. Really think about it. Where should I start auditing this? This is the code base the protocol has sent you. Pause the video and then hit play once you've written it down. One of the things we learned about was this thing called audit readiness, where we talked about the simple security checklist and we talked about the rect test. Let's go back. What is the rect test? Ah, oh, there's a whole bunch of questions here. Do you have all actors, roles, and privileges documented? Well, let's see. Um, there's actually no documentation outside of a couple of comments. Ooh. Do you keep documentation of all the external services, contracts, and oracles you rely on? Well, there's actually no documentation here. Do you have a written and tested incident response plan? Well, it's just the code. Do you document the best ways to attack the system? No. Do you perform identity verification? I don't know. Is there somebody with security defined? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. No, 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 no. This code base does not pass the rec test. And in fact, it's going to be really difficult for us to even audit it since it's just an Etherscan link. So I'm going to tell you right now, protocols are going to reach out to you and give you an Etherscan link and say, hey, we will pay you money if you give us an audit. And a big reason a lot of these protocols do something like this, most exchanges have a requirement that an audit is needed and verified code is needed in order to get listed on an exchange. So maybe they just offer you $500 or something like that. Hey, audit my ERC-20. And I'm here to tell you that that is unacceptable for you to take them on as a client. Remember, what is your job? To make sure they are more secure. So this is where you as a security professional need to turn around and ask them these wrecked questions. So this was a trick question. If you answered with, I'm just gonna jump in and start looking for bugs. Sorry, I tricked you, you're wrong. That's not where you should start. Now, what you can do if a protocol insists that they're not going to do a test suite and they're not gonna do anything like that, is you can say, hey, I'm happy to help you out. Maybe you just pay me an additional consulting fee for me to do all the development work and make you a test suite and a deployment framework and, and add all the bells and whistles to make sure that this is a very mature code base. Because as this code base is with just this Etherscan link, do you have assurance that this protocol is safe? And the answer, like I said, is a resounding no. So let's go tell Password Store that they need to update their code base. And I'm going to harp on this because this is going to happen to you as a security professional. Maybe you won't have to deal with it as an auditor, but I'm going to practice this as if you're going out in the world to become a solo independent security researcher, etc. Hi, Password Store. Thank you so much for this Etherscan link. This is a great start. However, do you have a test suite? We want to have every assurance that your code base is safe and secure. Do you have a Git repo or maybe on GitHub or GitLab or something like that where you have a testing framework associated with this code base? Oh, my goodness. Yes, I'm so sorry. Yes, we have a Foundry test repo set up for this. Let me send you that Git code base. Great point. All right, so now we're back in the Git repo associated with this course. And the client has sent over their updated code base, which is great. So this is going to be this security review code V2. So we now have a much better, a much more verbose, a much better framework here, right? We've got an SRC. 
Looks like we've got the actual code base in here, which is fantastic. We've got a script for how they actually deploy everything. And we scroll down and the readme looks like a basic Foundry project. So it's not quite exactly what we want here. Also, there's no test folder. Not only that, but we're not even exactly sure what we should be auditing. Did they make changes to this stuff in this lib folder? I mean, probably not. We're familiar enough with Foundry to know that. They probably don't care to have this script thing. They probably just want us to do this SRC, but we need to make absolutely sure we know exactly what they want us to do a security review on. So before we agree to start doing an audit, you wanna make sure you finish this scoping phase where you onboard the protocol, you onboard the client. This is where you ask those questions like the rec test, et cetera. Now in the GitHub repo and Cypher and Updraft associated with this course, we've actually added a document in here. So if you scroll down, you go to this minimal onboarding questions. This is what we can use to actually ask the protocol for the minimal amount of information we need to actually start doing this audit, start doing this security review. We've also got this more extensive onboarding questionnaire that is a derivative of what we at Cypher use to actually ask protocols, but we'll learn this later. Let's start with this minimal onboarding questionnaire and let's go through this. This will give us a lot of really important information on how to work with the code base, how to advise the protocol to see if they're even ready for an audit or a security review and set us up the best for success here. And these are some of the minimal questions that we wanna ask the project. Number one, we need to know about the project and all the documentation. As we said earlier, most bugs found in projects actually come from business logic implementations. So we need to understand what the project actually does so that we can look for places where the code doesn't match up with what the project is supposed to do. We need to understand the stats of the code base. We need to know how big it is. How many lines of code are there? How complex it is? This is incredibly important for us as security researchers so that we can understand the timeline. Most of the time, private auditors will charge based off of how long they think a code base is gonna take them to audit because your time is value. There are other payment schemes such as pay per vulnerability, or if you're doing a bug hunt, or if you're doing a competitive audit, those have different payout mechanisms as well. But for the time being, we're pretending like this is a private audit and we're getting paid for our time. So we need to have a good estimate of how long this is gonna take us. And the way we do that is by looking at how big and complex the code base is. We need to understand how to set up the project. For example, how to build the project, how to test the project. We need to ask the protocol that. And then some of the most important information is going to be the security review scope. What is the exact commit hash that we're going to be working with here for this code base? Products are constantly fixing and changing their code bases. And we don't want to spend time on something that they've already fixed or that they're going to fix. So we want to know the exact commit hash that they're going to be deploying on chain. We want to nail down exactly what the protocol is planning on deploying and how they plan on deploying it. If they have a repo URL, we want to know what's in scope and what's out of scope. And then we want to know some compatibilities. For now, this isn't going to make too much sense to you why we need this, but later on, this is going to become really important. Compatibility such as what Solidity version they're going to be using, what exact chains they're going to be working with, what tokens they're going to be integrating with, etc. We're also going to need what roles are in the system. This is going to be what powers there are, what should they shouldn't do, what are the different actors. For example, maybe there's a buyer, a seller, an arbiter, an only owner, etc. We need to know all the different roles. And then finally, we need to be aware of any known issues. What bugs are not going to be fixed? This is especially important when it comes to competitive audits, but this is really important for private audits as well. So this is going to be the bare minimum we're going to need from a project in order to do a security review. And if a project gives you pushback on giving you this, that's a telltale signal that they're not taking security seriously, or it's your job to inform them why this is so important and why this is needed. As a security researcher, you're also kind of an educator. You need to be educating these protocols on how to make them safer. So this code base that we got from them is a great step up, but like we said, there's no tests, there's no documentation, we don't know the scope, etc. So let's send this minimal onboarding questions to them, have them fill it out, and we'll come back. Uh, you need documentation? All right, fine. Yes, yes, you're right. I want to make sure this code base is secure. I don't want to get hacked. Let me finish writing my documentation and I'll get back to you very soon. All right, so now we're back in the code base. We can finally now come back down, back to section three. We'll scroll down and now we have security review code V3 right here. And you'll see we're on this new branch called onboarded. And if we click in here, there's actually three different branches. The main branch is that first one that we got where there was a whole lot of nothing, right? It had the default foundry set up like this. Then we have this 
onboarded branch here, which is the one that they just sent us, which we're going to go over in a second. But we also have this audit data branch as well. Now, this audit data branch is going to be basically your answer key. And for all repos moving forward, we're going to have this audit data folder, which is going to have essentially the answer key for most of the findings and most of the audit write ups in these. We want to start with whatever branch that we've actually onboarded the protocol, right? We've figured out the scope. We've got the documentation. We've got tests, et cetera. In most of the audits moving forward, the main branch will be the onboard branch and the audit data branch will be the answer key branch. However, for this one, the main branch is going to be this horrible one without any tests. And this onboard branch is the one once we've onboarded them and they've answered all of our questions. With that being said, now we finally have this. What we can do is we can scroll down and we have this minimal onboarded filled.md. So we see the questionnaire is in here as well, but we have the filled out questionnaire. So if we scroll down in here, the project has finally answered all the questions. So they've filled out the number source lines of code complexity score. So this has already been filled out. However, I will say that the number source lines of code and the complexity score is normally something that you're actually going to set up. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But we have the requirements. You need Git and Foundry to work with this code base. Awesome. We have a quick start. We should be able to run this quick start and actually build the contracts using this quick start. We have a way to test things. Fantastic. We just run forge test. We have the exact commit hash, which looks like this. And now if I copy the first couple of characters in this commit hash and we go over to this branch here, I can go actually into the commit history and see exactly where that commit hash is. If we scroll down, we can see that the exact commit hash that we're going to be working with is this one right here. Now, what you can do sometimes is you can we can actually view those commit details right in GitHub and then maybe even browse files and we can see exactly what that code base looks like in GitHub. And I'm also going to show you how to get this code base on your local directory. Checking out that exact commit hash is going to be the quickest way to make sure that we're working with the exact same code base. I'm going to tell you, though, for the duration of this course, it's fine if you don't check out the exact commit hash. But for real audits, that might be something you want to do. Anyways, let's keep going. So we have the commit hash. We do indeed see this commit hash in their history. We have the exact repo URL. That's the one we're on right now. And we have this in scope versus out of scope contracts. So the contracts that we're going to be testing for the security are going to be just this password store dot soul. This is all we're going to be looking for. Now, depending on the maturity of the protocol you're working with, maybe you want to advise, hey, you know, can we take a look at your deployment process as well? Can we give you feedback on your tests, et cetera? This isn't something that you do in a competitive audit. In a competitive audit, this is the only file and or folders you're allowed to get points for. But in a private audit, sometimes it might make sense to tell the protocol, hey, let's review your deployment process. But for this security audit, we are only getting paid to look at this password store dot soul. We come down to compatibilities. It looks like they're using 0.8.18 of Solidity and they're going to deploy to the Ethereum mainnet chain and they're not working with any tokens. We've got the roles figured out and this is already going to give us some insight into how the protocol actually works. This is already going to give us some documentation. There's an owner which is going to be the user who can set the password and read the password and we have outsiders. No one else should be able to read or set the password. So we already know a little bit about the protocol just by having these roles. As we read the documentation, we're going to learn more about how these roles actually work and this protocol actually gave us some documentation in the readme. We'll go over that in a second. And then finally, known issues. And for this course, we've actually set most of the scoping details right in the readme. So if we scroll down in the readme of this repo, we can actually see most of that information in here as well. The requirements, the quick start. We've got some additional information about usage, but we have testing, coverage stuff, which we'll talk about in a bit, the audit scope, chains of deploy, roles, et cetera. And then finally at the top, we have the about section, what this protocol is going to do. And I have some spelling errors. I will fix that. <laughs> but for this protocol, this is going to be our documentation, which is really small. And maybe you give the protocol some feedback. They should have more extensive documentation. However, this code base is also really small. So we're going to say this is fine for now. So let's actually run this quick start and get this code base into our setup. So I'm going to copy this line, come over to my VS code. And we're going to run this line, git clone. We're going to clone the repo. And then I'm going to open it, code three dash password store on it. We're going to pull it up 
in its own VS Code right here. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the code thing in VS Code is the same as doing like file open in whatever text editor that you're in, so that all the files on the left hand side are just the files inside of that folder. So we've essentially just opened this folder up in our code editor here. But now that we have this, what we can do now is we can just check out that exact commit hash that is part of the audit scope. So we'll copy this here. We'll come in here. We'll do git branch. Actually, we see we're on the main branch. We actually want to be on the onboarded branch, but we can just do git checkout and paste that commit. And we get this long output here, switching to this branch. You are in a detached head state. You can look around, make experimental changes and commit them. And you can discard any commits you make in this state without impacting any branches by switching back to a branch. If you want to create a branch to retain commits you create, you may do so by switching to a branch. So basically, you can do a whole bunch of stuff in here, but nothing is going to get saved. If you want to save any of the changes that you make, which I recommend you doing so, you want to switch to a branch. So we can run git switch dash C and we'll say and we'll call it password store audit. And now if I run git branch, I see we're on this branch password store audit, which is great. And you can see if we click the readme, we can see this is indeed the onboarded one because we see the getting started. We see the requirements. We see there's a test folder, etc. So now we're finally ready to start looking at the code base now that it's finally scoped out. Now, this scoping project kind of becomes autopilot the more you do this. It might seem like it was a little intense now, but we went over so much intentionally because we want you as a security researcher to be set up for success. If they don't give you a commit, maybe you do a ton of work on some protocol and they go, oh, no, we didn't want you to test that. We wanted you to test this other commit and you've wasted a ton of time. So this will save you making sure you have all this information and just by you asking this, these questions, even just this minimal set of questions, you're going to teach the protocol so much about security and so much about just some of the requirements are there. So there's just one more thing we want to go over, and then we're finally done scoping the contract, and that's getting the stats of the protocol. There's a tool that a lot of people use called C-Lock or Count Lines of Code. This will work for pretty much any code base you work with, whether it's Solidity, Python, Rust, whatever. And all it does is exactly what it says. It counts the lines of code. So if we scroll down in here and we go to the download, there's a couple different ways for us to download this and a couple different places that you can download this or you can just install via a package manager, which is how I recommend installing this using like NPM, apt, you know, brew if you're on a Mac, etc. I'm not going to show how to actually install this because at this point you should be advanced enough where you know how to install and you know how to work with this the way that you like best. You'll know you'll have it installed right if you can run CLOC dash dash help like so and you get uh, an output like this. So what you can do now is you can run CLOC and then put in the directory or the files that you want to count the lines of code on hit enter and it'll get a little output that looks exactly like this. It'll say, here are the number of files, which is going to be one. Here are the number of blank lines, the number of comment lines, and the number of actual lines of code, which is 20. So when you're actually filling out this onboarding form, let's go back to that. You can say the NS lock or the number of source lines of code is going to be 20. The reason that at least getting the number of source lines of code is really important is because as you audit more, as you do more security researching, you'll start to learn around what pace you can audit a code base. This will give you a good estimation for how long it'll take you to do it. So the first time you audit a thousand lines of code, you'll now have an estimated timeline for how long it takes you to audit or do a security review on 1000 lines of code. Of course, the more often you do security reviews, the faster you will get. But it's still a good idea to to start thinking about, OK, this code base is this big. It took me this long. So future code bases will take me X long. And this will allow you to tell the protocol you're working with exactly how long it'll take you to audit the code base. A quick note, oftentimes competitive audits have a slightly quicker timeline but it depends on the competitive auditing platform. Once you do get a good idea at how fast you are, it'll help you actually pick competitive audits where the timeline actually matches up with your skill set. Or you can pick a competitive audit where it actually pushes you to go even faster. But yes, most of the time, the stats like the complexity score in NSLOC, or like I said, the number of source lines of code are for you. 
So we've learned a ton just from this initial scoping phase. Let's do a quick refresher on all the things we've learned because just this part of the course already has taught you a lot. So let's do a quick refresher of everything that we've learned so far. We've learned that first of all, we are security researchers. When we're scoping out a smart contract, if they just send us an Etherscan link, that does not give us good assurance that they have a mature code base. We wanna make sure these protocols are safe and secure and we wanna educate them Hey, you need a test suite, you need documentation. Smart contracts are the most adversarial environment on the planet, and we need to treat them as such. So great, if they send you a code base that at least is in a smart contract development framework, but doesn't have tests, it doesn't have any documentation, well, this isn't gonna help you. Most of the bugs that we often find are business logic bugs. So we need to know what this code base does. So we have to go back to the protocol and say, hey, great, thank you, but we need more information. And sometimes it'll be part of your job to help the protocol understand this and help get them up to speed with the best security practices. If you don't know where to start, you can use this minimal onboarding form to work with a client to get the bare essentials for scoping out a code base. And once you get more advanced, we can do a more extensive onboarding form, which we'll go over later in the course. The security review final code base has the actual answer key for all the bugs in here. And this final security review v3 has the final onboarded test suite. You can customize this onboarding form to whatever you think makes the most sense here. And for competitive audits, they will already have this filled out for you. But this is the bare minimum that you're going to need the code base to look like to enable you to actually do a security review. You're going to need to know how to clone it, how to build it, how to test it, and then exactly the commit hash, the exact files and scope you're going to be working with, the sulk version, and the chains you're going to be working with as well. You are on a hunt for information. So with that being said, huge congrats for getting this far. I know this might seem a little bit verbose, but it's really important and it's gonna save you a ton of time moving forward, especially if you become an independent auditor or you start a firm, or this will give you the information for when you do a competitive audit, the absolute essentials of what you need to look for and what to keep in mind when working on them. So now that we're finally all set up, we can finally start going into step two of the first phase, which is gonna be our recon step. We've done the scoping, now let's go into recon. And to start our recon, to give us a framework on how to actually approach these code bases, we're gonna learn from the security legend master Tincho himself. Tincho is part of the Red Gill, which is a smart contract and EVM security firm. They do a ton of phenomenal security work in the EVM space, and sometimes they do a lot of stuff for free and for fun because they're security maniacs. Tincho is also one of the developers and security researchers who helped me create this course. He was the previous lead auditor at the security firm Open Zeppelin, and he's gonna be walking through his basic high-level way to approach doing a security review on these code bases. So a huge thank you to Tincho and the Red Guild for all the work that they put into this and all the work that they do in the EVM ecosystem. So we're gonna watch a video where Tincho actually walks us through his process of auditing the ENS code base, which is very popular EVM Ethereum based code base. What's crazy about this video is we filmed it and he was saying, hey, I'll walk you through my process for auditing ENS. I'm in the middle of auditing ENS. And two weeks later, after we filmed it, he found a critical vulnerability in the protocol and the protocol ended up paying him a $100,000 bug bounty for finding this bug. So yes, his system works. So let's learn from Tincho, the Tincho method, of auditing smart contracts, and let's watch this video. This is Tincho, Ethereum security researcher, previous lead auditor at Open Zeppelin, and creator of Damn Vulnerable DeFi. And today we have the pleasure of talking with Tincho, going over his auditing process so that you can learn how to make damn unvulnerable DeFi. To do this, we're going to be doing a live mock audit of the Ethereum name service GitHub, seeing exactly some of the tools and techniques that Tincho would use to audit this. I don't have a super formal auditing process. I really think that everybody will find their own ways. I will just show you briefly some things that I do today. Link to the full interview in the description. Let's get froggy. So this is a repository for ENS. The first thing that I would do is obviously go to a repository. You would clone the repository to my local environment. But if you are like very unfamiliar, you should probably go to the documentation. At least I don't know, read the introduction. Now he says there's no formal audit process, but this sounds like a good step one. Download the code, read the documentation. Read the fucking documentation. Here we have the architecture. It's telling us like already some 
keywords that we will need to understand at some point, such as what a registry is, what a resolver is. Already, I will get familiar with this. Probably these are contracts that I'm about to see in the code and so on and so forth. One thing that you can do also after reading some documentation is looking at audit reports. If we go to the actual code, we will realize that there are lots of things. Wait a minute. What the heck is that logo? What wonky text editor is Tencho using? That, my friends, would be VS Codium. It's different from VS Code. VS Code is a product owned by Microsoft that actually sends a lot of your usage information over to Microsoft. VS Codium doesn't do this. They have removed, I think, telemetry and some things related to Microsoft. Tencho said he's just been trying it out recently, but maybe it's a security alpha leak. Um, so multiple contracts in here. Already we see uh, lots of folders. It's using hard hat from what I can tell. These days I like projects that use Foundry more than those that use hard hat. So in that case, what I would do is I created another folder in which I have a Foundry local setup. Why do you like Foundry better? Why do you make this Foundry local setup? It's faster and I can write quick tests only using Solidity. So I will do whatever thing that I want to do here by just an easy way to have something quick and dirty to test things quickly. Bring and use the tools that you're most familiar and best with. I think that's super important. And don't be afraid to bring your disgustingly horrible, dirty, dirty tests. But anyway, already we saw that it's quite complex. So what I would do in this case is there is a command line utility that I would use, which is called CLOG. CLOG will help you count lines of code. And so I would use CLOG. It would give me a nice output that you can actually parse to a CSV. And instead of doing this here, what I would usually do is I would move that to a spreadsheet that I have the scope for ENS, right? All these files are now ordered here. And now I can have a better view in terms of how many files do I have, how complex they might be. So apparently I have 59 files and now I know the name wrapper will be one of the most complex contracts perhaps, right? Because it has more than 700 lines of code. Another approach to do this scoping phase, you can actually use this tool by consensus, which is called Solidity Metric. So you can run it on a project and it will actually give you a nice report of the code base and at its level of complexity. And then I will have a column stating where the thing that I'm doing is not started, it's in progress or it's done. So this is his next step. He either uses Solidity Metrics or C-Lock, ranks other contracts that he needs to audit based on complexity and starts going through it, moving contracts from not started to in progress to done. A very organized approach. When you do this alone, it might seem silly, but when you work in teams, it's quite important. As the audit progresses, I will be less and less focused on this file because probably this is super complex and will be related to either. But most of all, it's very useful, at least for me at the beginning of the audit, just to understand what am I might looking at. Once I have this table, I, think I usually start with the little Legos and then I go move up in complexity. So in this case, I will probably, I don't know, start with the ERC20 recoverable contract. Here it is. And it's quite short. Say, okay, it's Zonable, inheriting from open zeppelin as an auditor, probably I can take that for granted, which is out of the scope, and I will assume that's working correctly. And it has a single function to recover funds. Okay, it has access control, so this is probably fine as long as they are handling access and controls in the right way. This is fine. And it's actually doing this, right? So we start with the small little building blocks or Legos, as Tincho said. And now you're going to see Tincho's brain start switching into, how can I break this? As an auditor, you might start wondering where this is good for any token out there, right? Where it's possible to actually execute a transfer on any address that the owner passes here and where that could be problematic for ill behaved ERC20 tokens. And if you're familiar with USDT, for example, that could be problematic in this. Ah, now we're seeing him drawing on his expertise, knowing that USDT is a weird token. USDT actually doesn't return a Boolean on its transfer firms, whereas a lot of other tokens actually do. What the f USDT? When you see that only owner function, do you think, okay, is this a DAO? Is there a single person who controls? What are your thoughts? At least at the beginning, I wouldn't worry about it too much. At some point, I will read documentation about roles of this. But yeah, at some point, I should probably understand at some point who's the actual owner. Okay, let's say that you think that this is okay. So what I would do usually is I would take notes in the code, right? So in this case, I would say like access control, okay. For example, just to have a note saying that I was here. Or you can have a question like Patrick said, is this governance, right? And let's say this was an issue, so I would do this. I shouldn't be, I don't know, let's say shouldn't be owner. Another thing that I do to take notes is actually have notes files in the same place. Very raw notes, very having a file where I can 
quickly dump ideas that I have. At some point, things will go well. I would have an issues list here. I will start listing, I don't know, in line, blah, 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 or file, blah, 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 list issues. Take notes in the code in a notes file somewhere. Just have a place where you can dump thoughts. Maybe you can even use a note-taking plugin. I don't use any plugins. That's because I don't like having the UI clutter too much with stuff. Yeah, I, a note-taking extension was a dumb idea. And one thing that you have to be careful when you start with the very little things, so it's very easy to go deep into the rabbit hole of the single thing that you are trying to audit, is that, for example, I have very little knowledge of DNS. I'm not like super familiar with it. And I got like very like down into DNS because I was just paying attention to this single resolver. And that led me to realize that after, I know, two days, I was growing familiar with DNS, but I was losing the big picture of actually, hey, I'm actually auditing ENS. So it's very easy to go deep into the rabbit hole of the single thing that you are trying to audit. Remember to jump out of the rabbit holes. Perfect. So at some points in during the audit, you will realize that you might need to test things. So in this case, I saw these two functions. One is going from a bytes thing, returning an address, and the other is doing the other way around. You might say it's okay, but if you're lazy, you can actually use Foundry to help you in that. So what I did in this case, I used my very handy hacky Foundry repo that I have in here, and I actually copied these two functions to a contract. Like I just took them, not even trying to do fancy imports or whatever, just Raw copying and pasting them here. And I did a quick test, a fast test in which I provide an address. I pass that address to this first function. And the result of that, I pass it to the other function. And I want to make sure that I always get the same address as a result. A lot of times, yes, you're going to write code and not just do manual reviews. Tensho here wrote what's called a fuzz test, which you should absolutely smash that like button because we're going to have a video on that sometime in the future. Use your tools to validate findings that you have an inkling are wrong. In the cases where I have to set up more complex stuff, perhaps having a separate folder with a single project is not that convenient because I would need to set up the whole ENS system and that wouldn't be that convenient. So in those cases, I would go to the actual testing environment of the project. If you're doing a private audit, how important is the process of, it, of talking and interacting and, and keeping communications with the client open? I would say it's almost fundamental. Usually developers will have much more context than you as an auditor on what the system is intending to do. So you can spend a whole week trying to figure out on your own where this modifier should be in this function or not. But if you actually send a question to the client and tell them, hey, should this be here or not? And they will tell you, yes, it should be here. You can see it in test, blah, blah, blah. You can see them as companions during the audit and you should rely on them. You can rely on the client. AO protocol. Is your code good? You think so? <laughs> Hell yeah, my work is done. Having said that, it's also important not to trust too much. At the end of the day, they are trusting you as the expert. So in this, in that sense, I would advise, okay, keep the clients at hand, ask questions, but also be detached enough. Since they built the code, they have spent more time thinking about the code and looking at the code than you ever will. Ask them questions and don't be afraid to ask questions. I guess at this point, what's the next step? Are we wrapping up now? Are we writing the report up? What do we do next? The thing is, I always get the feeling that you can be looking at a system forever. It, there's always one additional line that you can check. There's always one additional attack that you can think of, one additional potential cause, my vulnerability and everything. So what I do is I time bound myself. To have a certain level of confidence when you're shipping the report that you did your best and you thought of every single possible attack or vulnerability that you could think of in that limited amount of time. Time bound yourself. When you're going through this code, how are you thinking of different attacks? Like when you're looking at a piece of code, how do you get that context of what different types of attacks to think of? Yeah, I don't have a checklist. Very difficult to translate experience in doing it. Have this adversarial mindset or try to at least. There's lots of knowledge that can come from oh, every single day reading vulnerability reports, every single day reading or reading responsible disclosures that are published reading all these reports, I read newsletters, like, I don't know, I have this constant influx of security-related information to Solidity that little by little, I think you start growing the intuitions, the experience that actually help you identify quickly 
things that can happen in smart contracts. And always remember that you can miss things. There's no perfect auditor. I think that everybody has audited sufficient enough and complex enough systems. They have all missed issues. And it's okay. Security is a, it's a thing that we have to approach from many different angles. And auditing is just one thing that must be done, but it's not the only one. Knowing that you're doing your best, in the, knowing that you're putting your best effort, every day growing your skills, learning, grows and intuition and experience in you. Something that I always say is to audit, to me is 50% funding vulnerabilities and 50% delivering readable report. Once the client starts fixing the issues, they will send you the fixes for the issues. And what you have to do at that point is actually review the fixes and make sure that not only the vulnerability that you highlight in the report is fixed, but actually this has been introduced by the fix. And then you wrap up your whole auditing process with writing a very good report and take the time to do so. Once you give them the report, they will go ahead and fix the issues, come back, say, hey, we fixed them. And then it's your job to make sure that they fix the issues and they didn't reintroduce new bugs. Let's say you give your audit report, you've done your time box, you've done as much as you can, you think you did a good job. Four months goes by, oh my God, $100 million hack. They've ended up on wrecked. What do you do? What happens? Let me approach it slowly, okay? So sure. I will first say, I have always been of the idea a security code review should be valuable enough beyond the fact that I find or not find a critical issue. So I should be able to provide value to whoever is working with me, to whoever is trusting me, beyond the fact that I did or did not find a critical issue. Obviously, the less critical issues that you miss, the better, the safer, and perhaps they miss something. And that can happen and has happened and will continue to happen. But it's naive to think, in my opinion, that just because an auditor missed something, the whole blame of thing is on the audit. This, I think, is a really important final thought. You as an auditor, it is not solely your job to make sure their code is bug free. You share that responsibility with the client. However, this doesn't give you free range to suck at your job. People will notice. Tincho, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all you've done for the Web3 community. And I'm sure everyone will get a lot from this. Okay, Patrick, thank you for inviting me. Bye. Bye. All right, great. So now that we've learned the Tintro strategy, let's finally apply this strategy to the recon phase of this password store audit. Let's jump in. So we've cloned the repo. We have the repo here. We can get started. Now, the first thing that we want to do here is, according to the video, is we want to read the docs here, right? We want to understand what this code base is supposed to be doing. We're here to get context. What is the code base doing? How does it work, et cetera? So let's read the docs. And if you're on a Mac and you hit Control Shift V, that'll put you into this README view state. Also open up the command palette and do markdown open preview like this to see the README in its very nice form like this. There might be an extension that you have to install for VS Code if that's not working for you. But in any case, let's scroll down. We'll read the docs. Docs are really minimal. This is going to be a smart contract application for storing a password. Users should be able to store a password and then retrieve it later. Others should not be able to access the password. Great. So now we have the context. We've already read the roles at the bottom, like the owner and the outsiders. So we have some context for what this is supposed to do. And just by reading this, we should already start thinking of some attack vectors, right? Just by reading this. Users should be able to store a password and then retrieve it later. Okay, is there some place where we can break it so that somebody can't retrieve it later? Where a user can't store a password? Others should not be able to access the password. Is there a way we can find that others can access the password? Just by these two sentences, we can already start thinking of different attack vectors for this code base. So we've read all the docs. We think we have a pretty good understanding. Maybe we draw diagrams. Maybe we, you know, maybe we use some graph or whatever. For now, let's actually use that tool, Solidity Metrics, to scope out and see all of the files even though we know it's just one let's let's practice using it so this is for visual studio code this solidity metrics extension you can find it on the visual studio code marketplace if you're using visual studio code you can also just look up solidity metrics and you'll get this and you would just install it like so once you have solidity metrics installed what you can do is you can right click on the folder, or you can command click or control click if you're on a Windows, all the different files that are in scope, then right click and then run Solidity Metrics. And what this will do, 
and it'll give you this little report. And once we have this report, we can go back to the command palette. Again, this is only for VS Code. And we can look up export this metrics report. We can export it and we'll be able to see it now in its own file like this. And we'll now have the HTML of the report here so that we can view it later if we like. Now, if we're doing Tincho's methodology here, we can scroll down to this section here where we have all the files in all of their lengths and we can copy paste it into something like Google Sheets or our own sheets or we can copy this into something like Notion, Google Sheets, whatever you want to do just so that you have a list of the different files. Since there's only one file in here, we're not going to go ahead and do that. Now, Solidity Metrics is especially powerful when it comes to Solidity because it includes files, it excludes any node modules or libraries or tests or anything like that but it also adds all these other really nice bells and whistles. It adds like a little fun little report down here. But one of the best ones I think is all the way down at the bottom is this inheritance graph, this call graph, and this contracts summary. So you can see a list of public and external functions. Public and external functions are gonna be the ones that people can actually call. So these can, are gonna be the ones that if a hacker wants to attack this, these are probably the functions that they're gonna call. We can see this call graph where we can see internal calls and external calls. So it looks like get password calls this password store not owner to some defined contract. This can be really helpful just for understanding how a code base works and what it looks like. Since this is really small, it doesn't really help us too much, but once we get more advanced, it can help us a lot. So for now, since we know that this is the only code base for us, we can actually start jumping right in here. So since this SRC password store is the only file in scope, we can actually just start doing our walkthrough in here. Now, the next step that Tincho did was he just started walking through the code, basically line by line, looking for vulnerabilities. And really, I would even take a step back and I would say you're still kind of in this recon phase. You really want to understand end to end how this protocol works. Looking for bugs oftentimes is a direct result of you trying to understand this code base to the core. How does this code base work? What is this code base supposed to do? So let's even just start there with what is this code base supposed to do? We know that people should be able to store a password and others shouldn't be able to see the password that we store. So let's try to find that functionality. We'll start right from the top and start going line by line. You can kind of start wherever you want. Sometimes I like to start with what I like to call the main functionality, which I would argue is set password. But for this one, let's just start right from the top and start working our way down. So SPX license identifier MIT, that looks normal. Pragma Solidity 0.8.18, that looks normal. As of recording, this is not the most recent Solidity compiler language. Maybe this is something that you wanna check out. Maybe this is a bad Solidity compiler version. So what I like to do, or we showed with Tincho is sometimes, and let me disable GitHub Copilot, maybe I'll put like a little cue here for question. I'll say, is this the correct compiler version? And now I know if I do like a search on this entire code base for dash dash Q, these are gonna be questions that I've asked about the protocol that I can come back to later. What I'll also do as I'm going through this is I'll create like a dot notes.md and I'll just dump some thoughts here. Maybe I'll dump attack vectors. Oftentimes I'll write my own about the project in my words. Really, this is for you to take whatever notes are helpful for you. Some people, like some people on the Cypher team, actually print off the source code to highlight it to take notes. So Zero Kage, one of the security researchers on the Cypher team, he'll actually print everything off, use different color highlighters, do pens all over the place, and really get a visual feel of what the code base looks like and where the bugs actually are. And you can set this up as however you want. Maybe some ideas about the project, but whatever note taking methodology works for you. The more you do this, the better you'll get at figuring out your flow. Definitely one of the first things that I'll do is, is I'll do this part right here. A user should be able to set a password and retrieve it. Other users should not be able to see my password. Okay. All right, cool. So now we finally get to, I'm going to toggle the word wrap just so that these wrap around. So now we get to this, this bit, this comment here. All these comments can be thought of as extended documentation. So at notice, this contract allows you to store a private password that others won't be able to see. You can update the password at any time. Okay, great. More context as to what this protocol is supposed to do. All right, next, contract password store looks good. 
We've got an error that's following this really nice convention. That's awesome. Maybe if they were following, you know, a worse convention like this or something, I might put a note here. And for note, maybe use better convention, better error naming convention, or maybe I'll even do like an at audit dash I for informational. Maybe I'll do just a dash dash I for an informational finding. You'll learn more about informational findings in a minute, but just whatever note taking methodology you want to use is great. But let me just put it back to what it was. All right, looks like we have two state variables or two storage variables. And maybe I want to take a note in here to make this more clear. I work with this cool package called headers from transmissions 11, which allows me to make really nice headers. So maybe I'll go headers, state variables, and this will give me this really nice header that I'll copy. Maybe I want to paste this in here myself just to let me know, hey, this next section is state variables. Maybe I'll do that again. But instead here, I'll say events, events like this. But again, whatever note taking methodology you want to do. So we have two state variables, s owner and s password. So it looks like they're using the naming convention where they do s underscore to signify storage variables. And it looks like there's only two storage variables here, some type of owner and password. Looks like they're both private. And just by reading this, I can probably know, okay, this is the password that try, probably trying to store and set and retrieve. Okay, great. And they have an event here, set new password. Okay, cool. So in the constructor, we have this s owner equals message.sender. So we know the s owner is going to be the owner of this contract, right? Okay, great. And this is the person who's probably going to set and retrieve the password. And now we come down here and we finally basically reached this, this piece where users can finally set and update the password. So let's go ahead and read this. And notice this function allows only the owner to set a new password. Okay, cool. So we've learned about the owner recently that's set in the constructor. And the parameter that's passed is new password, the password to set. Sometimes some protocols won't have any documentation. And this is where going back to what Tincho said, having a communication line with the protocol is incredibly helpful. This is where you might get on Telegram with them or whatever and say, hey, what's this function do? This one is a little bit obvious, which is good. The documentation says, hey, somebody should be able to set the password. This is clearly the function that does that. Well, let me just put it back. If this wasn't clear, maybe I'll put a note here for a question. What's this function do? right? Since we know what it does, we don't need to put that there. But again, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to get context. We're trying to understand what this code base does. Now, right away, we should see a bug here, right? Just by reading this documentation here and reading this function, we should see an issue. I'll give you a quick second to pause the video and find out. Maybe you've already figured it out. Can you see the bug in this function just by reading the documentation and reading this function? So the notice says this function allows only the owner to set a new password. If we look at this, it looks like we have set password, string memory, new password, external. We just automatically set the new password. Maybe we might put a question here that says, can a non owner set the password? And it looks like at a quick glance, yeah, a non-owner can set the passwords. So then maybe we might ask, should a non-owner be able to set a password? And the answer is probably not because the docs say that probably not. So maybe we'll do at audit or whatever comment you want to do here. This is probably going to be a, a high. Any user can set a password. So we've already found an exploit. So just during kind of this recon phase, we've already basically fallen into the vulnerability identification phase where we found some missing access control. This is a pretty common attack vector called missing access control, where some function should only be callable by a certain role and anybody can actually do it. So this is one such example. So we have found a vulnerability. Great. Let's pick some naming convention. Let's let's just not do a severity. Let's just do at audit for now when we think we've found an issue and just leave that in our notes. So cool. We think we found an issue. Let's just leave it as kind of raw notes for now and we'll come back to it later. Sometimes you'll find an issue. You'll come back to it later and you'll find out, oh, this actually isn't an issue at all. Right. So we'll come back to this later. But for now, we think we found an issue. Awesome work. Now, if you found this bug before I pointed out to you, 
phenomenal job. You are on the right path. And if you didn't find this bug before I pointed it out, that's 100% okay. A lot of the security stuff does take some rewiring of the brain to get used to. So if you didn't find it, no worries. If you found it, great job, and let's keep going. If you took notes here and you didn't find it, great job. Taking notes is a fantastic step. So in any case, we found a bug. We should be very excited. We should be very proud of ourselves. We are now going to make this protocol more secure just by finding even just this one bug. So huge congratulations. We have found an access control issue. Great. Let's keep going and let's keep walking through this code base. So next, looks like we have the next and last function in this code base. Let's read what it does. This allows only the owner to retrieve the password. Aha, great. Remember, users should be able to store a password and retrieve it later. So great. So this is that functionality of retrieving it later that the docs talked about. Others should not be able to access the password. Okay, great. This allows only the owner to retrieve the password. Okay, great. It looks like there's this erroneous issue here. So this is going to be an at audit. There's no parameter here, right? So this is an issue. It's obviously not a big issue, but there is no new password parameter. It's saying app param new password, the new password to be set. This clearly doesn't have a parameter. This is at least a documentation fix, right? They should probably remove this line from the code base. So let's actually read this now. Function guest password, external view returns string memory. If the message that sender is not the owner, revert. Okay, great. That's that intended functionality. Return s password. Awesome. So this get password does indeed revert if it's not the owner. So this means that users can safely store their password on this contract and they will be good to go, right? Not quite. If you took my foundry course, there should be an obvious bug here. Let's see if you can spot it. Now, if you said private data on chain is not actually private, you are 100% correct. All information on a blockchain is public information. So just because this S password is private doesn't mean it's actually private. So this is going to be an issue as well. So we can do at audit. The S underscore password variable is not actually private. This is not a safe place to secure your password. This breaks the entire protocol because anybody can actually read this. If you're not sure how this is possible, don't worry. We're going to write a proof of code to prove how it's actually possible to read this value off chain. Or you should watch my foundry course because we explain it in that course as well. And you need to go back and go to the prerequisites because we're going to build on a lot of this foundational solidity and smart contract knowledge. So if this is confusing to you, you need to take that foundry full course. So we have two issues here. Number one, we have some access control issues. We said only the owner should be able to set the password and oh, they're missing a check here for this to be the only owner, right? What would that look like? It would look like if message.sender does not equal s underscore owner, then of course revert, you know, not owner, blah, 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 whatever, right? They would need that check in here and that's missing. We also found one where there's an erroneous parameter here. And then finally, we also found an issue up here where uh, it's not safe to store your password on chain. All data on chain is public information. And just with that, with this recon phase of our audit here, we were able to actually find three potential vulnerabilities. We're not sure their severity yet, but we'll get to that in a minute. So congratulations. We found this bug and we can help this protocol be safer. Great work. Now, there's a whole lot more recon that we can do as well. In the readme here, we said, okay, we can do make anvil, make deploy, forge test, forge coverage. There's a lot of things here that we might want to consider doing. Maybe we take a look at the deploy function just to make sure everything here looks good. But again, the scope of this is just this contract, and we've already looked it up and down. Maybe we look it up and down a few more times. Maybe we look for all these questions like dash dash Q. Maybe we look for all these questions and make sure that we've answered them all. Is this the correct compiler version? Yep, it sure is. What's next? Can oh, we've answered those. We found a finding. Okay, cool. And we've run out of questions. So we've answered all of our questions here. Awesome. Maybe we put them in the notes, et cetera, whatever you want to do. 
Anyways, maybe we run forge test just to see what the test coverage of this code base actually is. This is, of course, after we run build to see how many tests there are. Maybe we even do a little peek into the test folder as well just to see what the tests are. So it looks like they have test owner can set password, test non-owner reading password reverts. So it looks like this is good, but they don't have a test that says something like test non-owner can't set password, right? So they only have two tests here, so they probably don't have great test coverage. If you're taking this course, you should know what test coverage is. And we can, of course, do that with Forge coverage. And we can see that their coverage actually pretty good. Coverage can often kind of be a vanity metric. According to their coverage report, they have 100% code coverage. And yet, and yet, we found some pretty severe vulnerabilities. Anybody can set the password. Anybody can read the password right off chain. And we have some erroneous documentation down here. All right, awesome. So maybe we even dump those attack vectors in here, or now we have them. We can just do a little search for at audit. And it looks like we have these three issues that we're gonna have to do a write-up for. So, once we finish the recon phase and the vulnerability identification phase, we need to move on to the reporting phase. So we've identified three vulnerabilities. We now need to communicate to the protocol what we found and how to fix it so they stay safer moving forward. In a private audit, we need to convey inf this information to the protocol to make them safer. We need to prove to them why this is an issue and why they should fix it. And if we're in a competitive audit, we need to do this and we need to prove to the judges that this is an issue. Again, we'll talk about this later. But for now, we need to just convey this information to the protocol. Our job here is as educators. We need to educate the protocol as to why this is an issue, why they missed it, and how to fix it moving forward so they don't run into this again. So now we're gonna do some minimalistic findings write-up. Right now, you're gonna do your first finding report. You're gonna write your first finding, which is gonna be incredibly exciting. If you've never written a finding before, after you finish this, you should 100% celebrate because we're going to teach you the very professional way to do a finding report. Are you ready? You should be. So we go back to the main GitHub repo associated with this course and we scroll all the way up to the files in here. We have this file in here called findinglayout.md. And this is going to be a minimalist markdown layout of what our findings should look like. And if you click the raw button, you can actually see exactly what it looks like in markdown. And we can go ahead and copy this, bring it over to our code base here. Maybe we'll create a, a new folder called audit data, a new file called finding layout.md and paste it in here. So this is gonna be the markdown setup of what this looks like. And again, if you're using Visual Studio Code, Command Shift V on Mac gets this preview of the markdown. So, it's, so you can see what the format looks like or you can open the command palette and do preview, you know, markdown, open preview. And on Mac, it gives me the shortcut here. If you're on Linux or Windows, it might be something slightly different, but that's how we view the impact. So here is the, is the layout for what our finding write-up is gonna look like. You can customize this to whatever you think is best, but this is just gonna be the one that we're gonna recommend for now. Different people have different ideas of how to convey this information as best as possible. So do number one, convince the protocol this is an issue, we need to explain to them how bad the issue is, and then, of course, how they should fix the issue. So in this write-up, we need to get this across as succinctly as possible. So this is the layout that we're going to do to get this. So let's go ahead. We'll copy this. Let's make a new file. We'll just call it findings.md for now, and we'll paste this layout in here for our first finding. What is our first finding? Well, let's go back. We'll do a little search here. We'll look for dash dash at audit, right? And the first one is this top one. The S password variable is not actually private. This is not a safe place to secure your password. So we need to convince the protocol that the private keyword doesn't mean their data is actually private. The private keyword just means other contracts can't read it, but human beings can 100% read from storage. So let's go ahead and write this report. Now we're going to start writing our findings and I encourage you to write them with me. I want to drill into you how to write these well and effectively and repetition is the mother of skill. So let's drill some skill into you. 
So the first thing here is going to be the severity dash number. I'm going to skip this for now because we're going to come back to it. But we want to give this a title. And the way to give a title a really succinct title that's going to come across really well is you want to just give the root cause plus the impact. So what is the root cause of this issue here? Well, the root cause is that data stored in storage is public to anybody. So maybe we say that's the root cause here. Maybe we say variables stored in storage on chain are visible to anyone, no matter the solidity visibility keyword. So this is going to be the root cause. So what is now the impact? Meaning the password is not actually a private password. So this is kind of a lengthy title. This would 100% work, but maybe we can make this a little bit more succinct. Maybe we can just say storing the password on chain makes it visible to anyone. So we have the root cause, which is going to be storing the password on chain. And we have the impact makes it visible to anyone and no longer private. So maybe this is a bit more of a succinct version of that. So title title is going to be root cause plus impact. All right, great. So we have a good title. Next, let's give it a solid description. Again, we need to be succinct, but we need to prove to the protocol and we need to teach the protocol why this is an issue. So maybe we say all data stored on chain is visible to anyone and can be read directly from the blockchain. Let me turn off this. The S underscore password variable is intended to be a private variable and only accessed through get pass through the get password function, which is intended to be only called by the owner of the contract. And then maybe we say we show one such method of reading any data off chain below. So in the proof of concept, we'll actually show that methodology. Now, again, if we preview this, this is kind of what this finding looks like right now, which is fine. However, the bigger the code base is, the more that these variables are going to get kind of get lost in the sauce, if you will. And a pretty common methodology for naming variables and naming functions is to put some back ticks behind them and then also the name of the contract that they're in. So this S password variable is in the password store contract. So we'll name it with password store colon colon S password store and get password is also like this password store colon colon get password. Now, if we preview this, this looks a lot better. And now we know when you see something formatted like this, you know that S password is a variable, get password is a function, and these come directly from the code bases. Okay, great. So here's the description of the finding. The impact, of course, is that anyone can read the private password, severely breaking the functionality of the protocol. Boom. And now the proof of concept, and sometimes this is known as the proof of code, is where we prove to the protocol that this is real. This is a real issue. Oftentimes, just explaining to a protocol, they might go, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever, you dumb auditor, you dumb security researcher. I don't believe you. I think you're, I think you're confused. And this is where you prove to them that this is actually an issue. In competitive audits, these proof of concepts are even more important. If you do not have a proof of concept, it can be very hard for a judge to know that your finding is legit. So this is where the burden of proof is on you. You need to convince the protocol that this is a real issue, and this is where you're going to do that. Now, of course, if you're working with a very sophisticated protocol, and maybe you even ask them, hey, you are aware that anyone can read private data off chain, and they might go, oh, yes, oh my god, you're right. Maybe you don't have to be this verbose, but especially in the beginning of your career, err on the side of being very verbose. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to say the below test case shows how anyone can read the password directly from the blockchain. And we're going to actually try to read directly from the blockchain. So we're going to do a little test case here. So first, let's run Anvil to make a little fake blockchain running. And you should have Anvil if you have Foundry. Now we're going to go ahead and create a new shell. And we're going to deploy this password store to this locally running blockchain. 
And so what we're going to do in here is we're going to run their deployment script, which uh, they've actually got in this make file. Luckily for us, I'm just going to run make deploy because it's already set up. It's already set up to work on the local chain. And so great. So we've deployed password store to here on our locally running Anvil chain. Great. That has been deployed. Awesome. Now here's where we can use Foundry and cast superpower. Foundry has a keyword called storage. So we can run cast storage, paste the address in here, and we can pick the storage slot that we want to read from. If we go to the password store, we know that S owner is going to be at the zeroth storage slot and S password is going to be at the first storage slot. So we're going to say cast storage, the contract address that we got from the deploy script. We'll paste the one in here and we'll do dash dash RPC URL. We'll go back here, copy this URL. We'll do HTTP slash slash paste that in here and hit enter. And we can see we get this output. This is the bytes representation of the my password. If we go to the deploy script, right, we see we do password store dot set password, my password. Great. So that means if we go ahead and we run cast parse bytes 32 string, paste this in here, we get back my password. So we have just read directly off chain the password that's supposed to be private. And we proved that someone is able to do that. So now we're going to take that whole process and put it into this findings here. So I've gone ahead and just copy pasted it, but you can write it out if you like, or you don't have to write this out. But again, create a locally running chain, make Anvil, deploy the contracts, run the storage tool. You'll get an output that looks like this. Parse it with cast parse, and you'll get an output of my password. So we've proven with a proof of code example that it's possible to read this data off chain directly. Now, this might be overkill in a private audit. Maybe they just go, oh, yeah, I know. I get it. You don't have to explain this to me. But for a competitive audit, have just being extra verbose is good. And especially if you're working with a more novice or more junior group of developers, having these proofs here can really open their eyes to say, oh, my goodness, this is, in fact, a real issue. And then finally, we get to this recommended mitigation. And here's where this recommended mitigation isn't an easy one. So the whole purpose of this contract is to store your private password, right? This contract allows you to store a private password that others won't be able to see. Clearly, that doesn't work with the current intended architecture. So we need to think of some ways to prevent this. How can this protocol proceed with this in mind? Well, there's a couple different things we might take in mind. And this is why having a security mindset from day one is so important. The tippity top of Solidity and smart contract developers will have this security mindset from day one, and therefore the whole architecture of their system will be security mindset. This whole protocol basically is useless because of this glaring bug. So how do we actually recommend someone mitigate this? So the write-up that I wrote is due to this, the overall architecture of the contract should be rethought. One could encrypt the password off chain and then store the encrypted password on chain. This would require the user to remember another password off chain to decrypt the password. However, you'd also likely want to remove the view function as you wouldn't want the user to actually send a transaction with the password that decrypts your password. Most of the time for these recommended mitigations, you might even add exactly what code you want to change. But because this is kind of a whole architectural rethink, leaving it as text like this might be OK. But again, this is where our job as security researchers is more like security educators. We want to educate them on intelligent ways for them to secure their protocol to make this safer moving forward. And there might be better ways to write this. I challenge you to come up with a better way to write this. And that way, actually, in the future, if somebody else runs into this bug, you will know how to fix it. All right, great. So we have one of our findings written up. Congratulations, you've done your first write-up and it looks incredibly professional here. Let's take a look at the preview here. Oh, oh my God, oh, it's beautiful. Except for one thing, we don't have the severity. We'll come back to the severities in a little bit, but for now, this is phenomenal. Let's do a quick review on this write-up. We have a succinct title. We don't have the severity, but we'll get that. The title is set up with the root cause, storing the password on chain makes it visible to anybody, and the impact, and no longer private. We've got a succinct description with some wonderful markdown here. We've got an impact that 
is very succinct. Anyone can read the private password. We've gone above and beyond, and we have a proof of code which proves how somebody could read this value off chain using the tools that we have, and we have a recommended mitigation. One could encrypt the password off chain and store the encrypted password on chain, but maybe we even get more information. It's hard for us to say, hey, this protocol should be scrapped, right? We don't want to say that. We want to do our best to educate the developers so they know how to move forward here. Fantastic. So now let's go back. We've got this one out. So maybe we delete it. Maybe we keep it in there, whatever you want to do. But let's move on to the next issue that we found. Missing access control. It looks like this set password, anybody can call this set password and it should only be the only owner. So let's do the same thing. Let's grab our findings layout. We'll copy this. We'll go to our findings.md. We'll scroll down and let's add a new finding. So what is this issue's root cause and impact? The root cause is that set password has no access controls. So maybe we'll say password store set password has no access controls. And the impact is meaning a non-owner could change the password. Root cause, impact. Has no access controls, meaning a non-owner could change the password. Great. So let's write the description. If you want to pause the video to write your own description, go for it. And let's compare notes. So here's what I've written so far. The password store set password function is set to be an external function. However, the NAT spec of the function and overall purpose of the smart contract is that this function allows only the owner to set a new password. So this is a direct quote from the code base. And oftentimes I actually like to put the exact code, the exact issue right into the write up, right? Because when I read this report, this is what it looks like right now, but maybe I have a hard time visualizing what they're talking about here. So sometimes I'll come down, I'll do three little back ticks, I'll hit enter. And in here, I'll write JavaScript so that this markdown formats very well or Solidity or whatever you want. And I'll even go back to this and I'll copy this function and I'll paste it in here. And maybe I'll put my little comment here at audit. There are no access controls. And I'll point to this line where I think the issue is. Boom. I think the issue is right here. So I use this is the little pointer that I use. You can use whatever you want. And if we preview the markdown using that JavaScript keyword, we actually get a little formatting here, which makes it look a little bit better in markdown. Without that JavaScript, it looks a lot uglier. So let's have that JavaScript in here. All right, great. What is the impact? Anyone can set slash change password of the contract, severely breaking the contract intended functionality. Boom. Next, proof of concept and or proof of code. So this one seems pretty obvious, but oftentimes, like I said, you need to prove to the protocol that this happens, that this can happen. And this is where using the protocol's existing test suite can be really helpful. So maybe what I'll do then is I'll jump into this test folder and I'll write my own test that says anybody can call this set password function. So here's where I'm gonna write my own test. So let's say function test anyone can set password and we'll make this a fuzz test as well. So I'll select address, random address, public. And in here, first let's do vm.prank, that random address. And we'll say string memory expected password equals my new password. So in this setup function here, we get the password store contract set up like this. So we'll grab this password store. We'll say password store dot set password, expected password. Yes, you are gonna have to do some coding as a security researcher, congratulations. So we're gonna be a random address and we're going to set the new password. Now we're gonna do vm.prank. We're gonna prank the owner of the contract, which is also set up in this setup function up here, string memory actual password equals password store dot get password assert equal actual password ex equals expected password so here we're being a random address 
and we're proving anybody can actually call this. And to be 100% sure, we should do vm.assume random address does not equal owner. So now we can run this test to make sure 100% that any address can actually change the password. So in here, we can run forge test dash dash MT, paste the name of the test. And we can see that this indeed passes. So now we have a proven, we've proven it with code that this is actually possible. So we're actually going to copy this. We're going to come over to our findings here. And maybe we'll say something like add the following to the password store dot dot soul test file. And we'll do these three backticks again, JavaScript, paste it in here. Once we preview this, sometimes I don't love seeing the test suites. So in the markdown, you can do like this details thing around it. This is some HTML. And now if we view this, it actually gets collapsed into this little details bit. Oh, looks like I need to boop. do that. Let's do that again. Boom. And now it's collapsed in this details bit. If you have this massive test thing, and you don't want the whole thing to show up in the markdown, you can just collapse it with this details bit. And then you can do like a little summary, code, summary, like that, so that it says code instead of details. So we've proven it with code this time, with a test case, and now finally the recommended mitigation. We wanna say add an access control conditional to the set password function. And here is where we can even say JavaScript exactly what it looks like. If meshes.sender does not equal s underscore owner, revert you know, password store, not owner. And if we preview this, we now have a nice little recommended mitigation for the set password function. Awesome. So that's finding number two. So let's move on to finding number three. So finding number three is a bit simpler. Audit, there is no new password parameter. This obviously isn't as damning as the other two findings that we have, but it's still an issue nonetheless. So when we get to severity, we're going to find out why this is a lower severity and how to actually assess severity. But let's go ahead and do this write up the same way we did the other write ups. Once you get really good at figuring out severity, you'll find out that gas and informational severities don't need as extensive write-ups. But for now, let's just pretend this is a finding just like any other finding. So what we do, let's go back up to audit data. Let's copy this layout. Let's put this at the bottom here. Boom. Let's skip severity for now. And we can kind of rush through this one because we've done this a few times now. Okay. Root cause and impact. Okay. The root cause is that the documentation says there is a parameter in this function when there is not meaning and the impact is what meaning the documentation is wrong. So we're going to say the password store get password NAT spec indicates a parameter that doesn't exist, causing the NAT spec to be incorrect. This might be one where we get rid of the impact because the impact is pretty obvious, but for verboseness, we'll just keep it in here. So for description, I'm going to speed through this because this is pretty straightforward. Here's the JavaScript. I'm pointing to this little documentation line right here. The password store get password function signature is get password. While the NAT spec says it should be get password with a string. The impact, of course, is that the NAT spec is incorrect. Proof of concept. This is one where we would just remove it because there's really no proof of concept here. And then finally, recommended mitigation is going to be, we're going to say remove the incorrect NAT spec line. And here we're going to do a fun little markdown trick where we're going to say a diff here. And what we're going to do is we're going to copy this line, paste it in here, and we're going to put a little minus sign here. So if you do three backticks and then a diff, when you go to preview it, scroll all the way down at the bottom, it'll be red, indicating you should remove this line. If we do a plus like this, it'll be green, indicating you should add this line. So the diff is kind of really nice when you have different lines that you want to add. You know, maybe you have a plus and a minus saying you should add this line, which is blank and remove this line. But for now, we're just saying remove this line. So 
diffs are great for recommended mitigations because it'll show exactly which lines you're talking about and exactly what to do with them. All right, phenomenal. We have three write-ups. We haven't figured out the severity yet, but we have three write-ups. The password sort get password indicates the parameter doesn't exist. Oops, I put it in the finding layout. Let's actually put it in the findings list here. Whoops, paste it in. But great, we have three issues. Storing the password on chain makes it visible to anyone and no longer private. The password store set password has no access controls, meaning a non-owner could change the password. And finally, the password store get password NAT spec indicates a parameter that does not exist, causing the NAT spec to be incorrect. So we have three findings like this, and we think they look pretty good. Now, if you have a hard time with write-ups, this is where something like ChatGPT or some other AI is incredibly helpful. Let's say we don't think we did a great job with this write-up. Maybe we'll copy paste it into our AI bot, and we'll just say, the following is a markdown write-up of a finding in a smart contract code base. Can you help make sure it is grammatically correct and formatted nicely? And then we'll put four back ticks, paste the finding, and then four more back ticks. And it's giving us some great feedback. There's a typo in incorrect, we'll correct that. I would also recommend using code format for function signatures for consistency. Minor grammatical adjustments could be made for better clarity. And here's the updated markdown. This should read clear and present your findings in a more organized manner. All right, great, let's copy this. Let's go back to here. And now instead, let's go ahead and delete this, paste what ChatGPT gave me. So AIs are phenomenal for helping write up reports. And let's just do a quick sanity check to make sure it actually did it right. Password store get password net spec. Yep, looks good. Description looks good. Impact looks good. Everything looks good. JavaScript, they used a diff. Spell incorrect correctly. Fantastic. Sometimes it will mess this up, but it is a great way to do a sanity check on your findings if you want to make sure they're actually really good. AI is phenomenal at writing. All right, great. So we have our three findings in here, but we're obviously not done. There's two things we haven't finished yet. Number one, we do not have the severity of our three findings yet. We need to figure out how to do a good severity rating here. And then secondly, this findings.md is a nice markdown file, and it's great for us developers to read this, especially if we're solid with working with markdown. But the protocols and the community and other people, well, they don't read markdown files as well as we do. And they're probably going to want this findings list in a PDF or a more professional looking document. And plus, if we have a professional looking PDF, we can put that on our GitHub. We can add it to our resume of projects we've audited. So these are the last two steps that we're going to take. And again, you can actually find these in the audit data branch of the GitHub repo associated with this course in this audit data folder. So we're going to learn how to make this really nice looking PDF so that the information is in a much more readable state for the protocols that you work with for a private audit. And we're going to learn how to do severity for code hawks, for competitive audits and for private audits as well. And then we're done with this section. You're almost there. You've done phenomenal getting here so far. I know this was a very minimalist code base, very easy code base, but we've learned a ton so far. We'll do a refresher. Anyways, let's go. Severity rating. To figure out the severity rating, we're actually going to go to the Code Hawks documentation to figure out the security rating. There will be a link to this in the Security and Auditing Full Course S23. If we scroll down to Section 3, your first audit, and we scroll all the way down to the bottom in here, we're going to get this severity guide, which will bring us directly to the Code Hawks documentation. In the docs here, it'll be under this How to Determine a Finding Severity. Not the validity. The validity is more for competitive audits. We'll learn about that later. So for us, we're going to separate our categorizations into high, medium, and low. Some security researchers like to add a critical severity rating, and that's optional. If you think that an attack vector warrants a critical, we can add that as well. But for now, let's just pretend there are these three. And the way we can understand whether or not something is a high, medium, or low is looking at the likelihood of the attack versus the impact of the attack. Now, these can get a little bit subjective, but we've more or less come to some standardizations on what some of these look like. Now, to do this, we obviously need to figure out the impact, and then we need to figure out the likelihood. So the impact is going to be something like funds are directly at risk or nearly directly at risk, or there's a severe disruption of protocol functionality or availability. So for example, in our protocol that we just audited, there's no funds in here. 
this password store contract doesn't do anything with funds. However, there is a very specific functionality, the protocol, right? If we scroll to the top, this contract allows you to store a private password that others won't be able to see. This is a very specific functionality of the protocol. And if this is destroyed, well, this whole protocol is worthless. That would be considered high impact. So either funds are directly or nearly directly at risk, or there's a severe disruption of protocol functionality or availability. Medium impact, maybe funds are indirectly at risk, or there's some level of disruption to the protocol's functionality or availability, a lower level. And then low impact, maybe funds aren't at risk. However, you know, maybe a function is incorrect. A state might not be properly handled. Maybe some information it gives out is wrong, but the protocol does what it's supposed to do. However, it might be a little bit off. A rule of thumb would be how pissed off would the users of the protocols be if this attack vector happened? Then we want to figure out the likelihood. This again is a little bit subjective, but you can have high, medium, and low. Something being highly probable to happen. For instance, a hacker can directly call some function to hit that impact. Medium likelihood, maybe some more specific conditions might happen. Maybe if a specific type of token is used on the platform, unlikely to occur. Maybe like, hey, this only happens on Tuesday of a very specific block. If a certain number of nodes collude, this is going to be low likelihood. Now with this, there are going to be some instances where the likelihood is going to be computationally unfeasible. This is lower than low. Like for example, somebody could say, hey, there's a chance that I guess your private key that technically is low likelihood. It is very unlikely to incur, but I would argue it is computationally infeasible. So for computationally infeasible attack vectors, we consider them to have no likelihood or computationally infeasible likelihood, meaning it wouldn't be an attack path. And below we have some examples of some high mediums and lows. And if you want to pause right now and read some of these to get a better idea of what these look like, you can go ahead and do so. However, we're going to use the examples from the password store to figure this out directly. But OK, so now that we know how to evaluate a finding severity, let's use this on our findings page to figure this out. OK, and we can even do this little drop down in VS Code to kind of collapse them like this and we can see them a lot easier. So our first one, storing the password on chain makes it visible to anyone and no longer private. OK, so let's think about this I'll put some put these here so that it doesn't keep auto uncollapsing on me. So let's think about this. What is the likelihood and impact? Well, storing the password on chain makes it visible to anybody and no longer private. Does the password not being private have a high impact? Are funds directly at risk? No. Is there a severe disruption of the protocol functionality or availability? I would argue 100% yes. The whole purpose of this password store protocol is to store a password securely on chain. So I would say the impact is going to be high. This is this is very high impact. It severely disrupts the protocol functionality. Now, what about likelihood? How likely is it that somebody will be able to read this password? Well, guess what? Could a hacker directly call this function and extract money or break the protocol? Well, Yes, it's easy. Anybody could do it anytime. There's no scenario that needs to happen. The instant the password is stored on chain, anybody could read that off chain. So the likelihood of this is also going to be high. And when you have high impact and high likelihood, this sometimes is known as a crit or a critical. And sometimes people like to report criticals. At the moment, we're just going to say a high impact and a high likelihood means the severity is going to be high. So because this is high impact, high likelihood, we're going to change this from S to H, signifying that this finding is high. And we're going to say number one. Typically, you want to range your findings into high, medium and low. And typically, you want to rank your findings in terms of the worst offenders to the least bad. Right. So H1 should be the worst thing, the most crazy thing you found about your protocol. But this is kind of a rule of thumb and you don't really have to go by this. Next, let's go to put this down here, scroll back up and collapse this. OK, cool. Let's delete these. All right. Next password store set password has no access controls, meaning a non owner could change the password. OK, well, what's the impact? Is this a severe disruption of protocol functionality? Yes, 100 percent. It is. This means that if you set your password to store it, anybody else could just come in and change it on you. That is a severe disruption in protocol functionality. So this is going to be very high impact. OK, well, what is the likelihood? Scroll down. Could somebody just call a function and exploit it? Yes, right? 
we look at password store, this set password is just a public function. All they would have to do is directly call set password with a different password and they would change the password. So the likelihood of this is also high. So this therefore is again a high or a crit. So we're gonna say this is H and we're gonna put it in the number two. I would argue that this first one, our H1 is way worse, defeats the purpose of the entire protocol. But this one obviously is also very bad. So we'll do H1, H2. Great. All right. Keeps uncollapsing on me. All right. Final one. The password store get password NAT spec indicates a parameter that doesn't exist, causing the NAT spec to be incorrect. Okay. Well, let's do the same thing. What is the impact of this NAT spec, this documentation being wrong? Okay. Well, are funds at risk? Well, no. Is it a severe disruption of the protocol? Eh, no. Are funds indirectly at risk? No. There's some level of disruption in the protocols? Mm, no. Low impact. Funds are not at risk? Yes. However, a function might not be correct. State might not be handled appropriately, etc. Well, uh, the function itself actually works fine, just the documentation. So this isn't really even low impact. So for this one, the impact is actually none. There is no impact here. This is just wrong documentation. So this is just somebody who's reading the code would get something wrong. What's the likelihood here? Well, it's always going to happen. So it's high, I guess, but the impact is none. Whenever you have an impact being none and the likelihood is high, or maybe the likelihood being none or the, and the impact being high, the severity is going to be informational slash gas slash non crits. So an informational finding is essentially you saying, hey, this isn't a bug, but you should know about this or you should fix this, right? And this can include design pattern improvements. This can include things like test coverage improvements. This can include documentation improvements, spelling errors, et cetera. There's a whole list of different common informational findings that are pretty common to different protocols. And we'll learn about some tools that actually will help you find a lot of these informational findings. But this is the rule of thumb. If you find something that isn't a bug, but maybe they should fix it anyways to make the code more readable, it's an informational. If it's a gas improvement, which we didn't do any gas improvements here, you would consider it a gas improvement. We'll learn about some gas improvement later on. And sometimes these are just called non-crits or NCs. So for this, maybe you'll put I or NC or whatever you want. For me, I'm going to put I. And since this is our only informational finding, we're going to put I number one. Awesome. And we now have the severity of our findings. Cool. Should we do another review of the password store? Why don't you pause the video? Let me know what you think. Write down in your notes what you think. Do we need to do another review of the password store? All right, cool, welcome back. Here's the answer. The answer is maybe. The thing is, you can always look at one more line of code or re-review one more line of code. But at some point, you have to say, I'm done. I'm going to move on to the next thing. If you have any questions left, you definitely want to try to answer those questions. But at the end of the day, we're humans. A lot of the times, we're going to be time boxed on what we do. I could spend the rest of my life scrutinizing this, trying to figure out more methods to prove or disprove my findings or prove or disprove the way different things in this protocol work. But at the end of the day, at some point, you do need to stop. So when we are looking at these code bases, it's really important to get good at time boxing yourself. And we'll learn a little bit more about different time boxing strategies. Oftentimes, a lot of security researchers say, I don't have enough time. And this is probably true. What's even more important is how you manage your time. So you can always look at another line of code. But at some point, you got to write the report and you got to move on. So for now, we'll say we hit the end of the engagement or the competitive audit deadline is coming. This is our list of findings. Let's write up the report. OK, now if we go back to the curriculum, go back to section three, we scroll all the way down. We'll find this section here called your first report, basic markdown report and a template. So this is a GitHub repo that we create specifically for independent security researchers, new firms, and people who want to get familiar with writing reports to generate their own markdown reports. So we're going to turn this list of findings into a more professional looking PDF. We're going to learn some more report generation tools later in the course, 
but this is going to be the most basic one for you. And then you can add this PDF to your portfolio. All the documentation for working with this is inside of this repo here. And this will allow us to generate, like I said, this nice looking report. So to get started here, the first thing we're going to need to do is install Pandoc and Latex. So I'm not going to go through actually installing this because at this point you're at least an intermediate developer and I don't need to walk you through actually installing this. And the other thing you're going to need to install is this Latex project. You'll need both of these for this to actually work. You'll know you've done this right if you can run Pandoc dash dash help in your terminal and you get an output like this. Again, this is where if you're a Windows user using WSL, it's really important. Once you have both of those installed, you're going to want to install a latex template. So this latex package is a way for us to generate these PDFs with the help of Pandoc. And it comes with these templates built with this dot latex syntax. So in this Git repo here, if we scroll to the top, we have this template right here that we can click on and we can see we scroll down. It's this really weird looking set of kind of like markdown slash HTML looking thing. If you want, you can actually just copy it. And what you want to do is when you install Pandoc, you want to go to your home directory. It'll actually in your home directory, it'll install a folder called cd.pandoc right here. And in here we have a templates folder. So we can go into the templates folder ls and we have some different templates in here. You want to add this, I have no idea how to pronounce this, this eisvogel.latex file in here. And that's this file. You can just copy paste it right in here. All this stuff is what's going to format our PDF to be PDFified from our markdown file. So go ahead and install that in there. And there's a lot of different custom latex templates. And this is how you can customize your PDF in the future using your own template, using a different template, whatever you want to do. I've worked with ChatGPT. ChatGPT is actually pretty good at LaTeX. So working with ChatGPT to build some really cool template is something you can definitely do. Once we do that, we can come back to our directory here and then we can go back to our file. Okay, great. We have these two installed. We have this installed. We want to add your logo to the directory as a PDF named logo.pdf. So in here, we have our audit data. We want to add our own logo in here. So for me, I'm going to go ahead. I've got this Siphon brand folder where in here I have this logo.pdf file, which I'm actually just going to drag over here. You can copy paste whatever you want to do. And then I have this PDF extension for VS Code, which allows me to see PDFs. If you go to extensions, you look up PDF. I'm using this one VS Code dash PDF. If I disable this and I reload VS Code, now when I open this PDF file, it's just going to be a jarble of nonsense. So we're going to reinstall this PDF. We're going to re-enable it. So now I'll be able to see the logo in my VS Code. Great. So we've added that in there. You can add your logo. You can do whatever you want here. And then finally, we want to run this command, but I actually skipped over the first step. Sorry about that. Add all your findings to a markdown file like report example.md. Add the metadata you see at the top of that file. So if we scroll up, we have this report example.md, which if we click raw, we'll get kind of this crazy looking weird output like this. So this is a markdown file, but it's got all of this Pandoc stuff in it. So all of this stuff is text that Pandoc understands, and then the rest of it's kind of classic markdown stuff. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy this into our VS code. Let's create a new file. We'll call it report.md. And so this is going to be our official report and we're going to paste it in here. And let me just do a quick walkthrough of how this works. So up at the top, we have our title of the report, the author. This is where you're going to put your name, right? You're going to put the date in here. And these are, again, these are some Pandoc latex syntax. Again, you can use ChatGPT to help customize it. For now, we're not really going to spend a whole lot of time on here. Again, this is some Pandoc latex stuff here. You're going to want to change your name here from Cypherin to whatever else you're working with. You'll see it's pulling in that logo.pdf here. So it's actually going to include that logo.pdf in this line. And if you want to change it, you would just change that. Great. Uh, your report starts here. So everything under here is what you're going to customize. So prepared by you, you know, this is where you put your name in here, maybe a link to your profile. You put a list of the auditors like yourself, you know, maybe you even use security researcher instead. 
We've got this table of contents in here, which is awesome. There's another fantastic markdown extension that I use a lot called uh, Markdown All-in-One. That's this one right here. And this Markdown All-in-One comes with this command called Create Table of Contents or Update Table of Contents. And any time in here with this, if I add anything with the little markdown hashtag pound thing, like something, and then save, the table of contents automatically updates with this markdown. And again, if we preview it, now we can go directly up to something, right? We can click on these and, and drop down to where they are. Great, so that's really helpful. And we have this table of contents that comes with it, which is awesome, and we can walk through this. So the protocol summary, this is where we as auditors are going to say what the protocol does. This is going to be in our own notes. So the protocol does X, Y, and Z. I'm going to copy paste what I have here. Hey, password stores a protocol that it does blah, 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 gets the user's passwords. The protocol does blah, 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 whatever. A disclaimer, this is always helpful for whatever client you're working with, knows that, hey, this isn't a guarantee your code is bug free. We have our risk classifications section where we tell the client what we actually use to classify high, medium, and low severities. Then we have our audit details here, which we're going to put in the commit hash, something like this, and then we'll paste, you know, whatever commit hash that we're working with. The findings described in this document correspond with the following commit hash like this. We're going to put the scope here, and this is actually where we already have that in our readme. We go down here. That's this right here. However, we're actually going to run into an issue. A couple of these characters don't exist. So I'm going to run the doc just so that we get the error. And then I'm going to show you how to fix it. We're going to do the roles where, again, we have the roles here. And I think I spelled something wrong, but outsiders. Uh, great. We have an executive summary. This is where you can kind of put a summary of how the audit or the security review went. You can say something like we spent X hours with Z auditors using Y tools really whatever you want. Hey, we found some really interesting things. We didn't find anything. This is kind of whatever you want to put here. Then we can do a little summary of the issues found here. So we can do severity and number of issues found. And then we can do a little bit of this save. So my markdown auto formats here, you can also do the command palette and just do format document like this so that it'll auto do this whenever you save. But here we'll do highs, medium, low info total and I saved and it automatically formats. So we found two highs, zero mediums, zero lows, one informational for a total of three, save auto formats, fantastic. So here's our little issues found. Uh, you can copy this chart from the doc as well. And then finally, we can add our findings. So we have all of our findings in here. Let's grab the two highs first. So I'm gonna collapse them copy them. So findings oh, should be medium, low, informational, yes, this should be like that. We're going to paste the highs in here. We're going to grab the informational. We're going to copy that. We're going to scroll all the way down, paste this under informational. We're going to get rid of gas because we don't have any gas. Fix some of the spacing in there. And we're going to get rid of medium and lows because we don't have any of those either. All right, great. So now we have our markdown formatted, our markdown in this report.md. So now we have this report.md using our template. Now it's finally time to turn this into a beautiful looking PDF report. So if we go back to audit report templating, we have this command, this pandoc command, we can copy paste to actually run it and actually generate the report. But we are gonna run into an error so we're running pandoc instead of report example.md. This is going to be the name of the markdown report we just created. So this is going to be report.md. The output name of the PDF is going to be report.pdf. We're going to say we're going to go from markdown template. This is the name in that dot pandoc folder. And then we have to do this dash dash listings for some of the formatting to work. And if we run this, oh, we're in the wrong file. First of all, we need to go into the audit data directory. Now let's run this again. You'll see we actually run into an error here. You're going to get some crazy weird output like this. Hey, invalid UTF-8 byte sequence. Blah, 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 blah. See the latex document for blah, blah, blah. And this is kind of all buffooey. ChatGPT is great at answering these latex errors. But we see it's giving us this character, which if we go to report.md, we do a find on. It's mad about this. 
So what we can just do is do a little changing it with some characters that it actually recognizes. We'll pull back this up. We'll clear out the terminal. We'll rerun the command. And if we've done this right, you know, hide the terminal. We can go in here. We can click report.pdf. And oh my goodness, we've got a wonderful PDF report of our security review that we can give to the client, we can ha be happy with, and we can be like, wow, we are so professional. You have now done it. You've created your first professional PDF. So we are gonna do a quick review, and I know we said we're done, but I want you to do one more thing. Go to your profile, create a new repository, and call it My Audit Reports, or call it Security Reviews, or call it Updraft Portfolio, or call it Code Hawks Learnings, whatever you want to call it. Let's add, you know, let's call it Code Hawks. Let's call it Code Hawks Security Portfolio. We'll make this public, create a repository whatever you want to call it. And what you're going to want to do is we're going to scroll down. We're going to upload an existing file. I'm using a Mac, so I can just go ahead and right click, reveal it in Finder, but you can use whatever you want to use. And we're going to go back over here. I'm going to grab this report.pdf. Actually, I'm going to rename it real quick. Date 2023, 11, 01, password store audit. It's great to date your audit reports so that they are stored in order. And we're gonna grab this PDF, paste it in here. And we're gonna scroll down, hit commit. And now we can add a readme later saying, hey, these are my portfolios, whatever. Now anybody can click this and see your portfolio. Oh, this, sh this should be password store audit. Whoops, sorry about that. Can see your portfolio of your smart contract auditing and security journey, giving you a history of all the work that you have done. Congratulations, you have your first audit report, you've set up your portfolio, huge, huge congratulations. Let's do a quick review of what we've learned in this first security review, because we have learned a lot, and then we'll go to the exercises and if you want to, obviously, optionally, the NFTs, which will come very soon after I finish recording this. So let's do a quick review of what we've learned. So first thing we learned was we're going to get a lot of protocols giving us just Etherscan links, just saying, hey, can you please audit this? This is not acceptable. We learned that we need to onboard different protocols and we need to work as security researchers and educators to teach these protocols how to be safer. And what is absolutely essential? Well, they need to have a test suite. They need to go through some onboarding questionnaires. There's some minimalistic things a protocol needs to think about before they actually even go to audit. So we've learned about actually onboarding and asking these protocols questions to make sure they're thinking about security in the correct way. We've learned we want to get all the documentation of the protocol. We need to know how to build the protocol. The exact scope of the security review we're doing what is in scope? What solidity version? What chains? What tokens? We'll learn more about that later. What roles? Known issues, etc. We learned how to start estimating how big a code base is. One of the methods that we use is going to be with Solidity Metrics, which is a tool specifically for Solidity that gives us this nice little output of number of source lines of code and complexity score. But we also learned that we can use CLOCK as well. This will give us these stats so we have a good idea of how long one of these audits or security reviews is going to take. We learned about the different phases of doing a smart contract audit or security review. And everything we just talked about was in this scoping phase. We learned that after scoping, we go to recon where we're actually looking for bugs. Vulnerability identification where we tinker, we try to figure out, oh, is this actually a bug? We question, we take notes, we comment, etc. And then finally, we learned how to do a really good report. We didn't go over the last two phases where the protocol fixes it and adds tests and retests. And then we do a mitigation review because it's essentially the same thing, just a little bit quicker since we already have so much context for the code base and we can just look at the differences. We learned from security researcher wizard Tincho about his process 
for finding bugs and doing smart contract security reviews. He says, read the docs, take notes, go from small to large. You can watch his video, rewatch his video. We have a full length interview with him in the description of this video here. If you want to watch that as well, where we ask him a lot more questions about what he does and how he is so good at what he does. Now, finally, we did our first security review and we found a couple of very simple, very easy bugs, but we found some bugs nonetheless. Missing access controls is actually a very unfortunately common bug that we see in the wild relatively often. So we saw a missing only owner bug where in our password store function, this set password store should have been only owner. There should have been some section here saying only the owner of this contract can set the password. Now, luckily enough, this documentation was good enough that it allowed us to spot the bug, but sometimes you're not going to have any docs and you're still going to need to find this. So this is where understanding what the protocol is supposed to do is going to be absolutely crucial for finding bugs like this. Now, oftentimes this missing only owner, this access controls issue isn't going to be as obvious as this. And this is why getting the roles for the protocol is so important because when a protocol has 10 different roles and there's 10, 10 different types of users, it can be a little bit harder to look for the specific access controls that are needed for a function. So, or maybe a role is misconfigured or somebody was given privileged escalation when they shouldn't. These can get very tricky. This obviously was an obvious example of that. And then finally, exploits private data. We have this S owner. We have this S password variable, which we said, hey, we got the private keyword. So that means it's private, right? Obviously not so. So anybody on chain can obviously see that this was a bug. So we found these two different exploits for this. And then finally, we also found in our findings, if we scroll down, we also found a little NAT spec one where we had a NAT spec saying, hey, there's a parameter here when that parameter didn't exist. With those exploits that we found, we actually learned how to write a phenomenal write up. And we use this template here to write a great write up. We used root cause plus impact. In our findings list, we scroll to the top, storing the password on chain makes it visible to anyone and no longer private. We have the root cause and then we have the impact. We scroll down. Password store set password has no access controls, meaning a non-owner could change the password. Root cause, impact. And then finally, this last one was an informational. Doing root cause impact is a little bit less important for the informationals. With these write-ups, we wrote a succinct description and we use some phenomenal formatting. We use some back ticks. We use the contract name, two semicolons, the function or variable name. We used back ticks when we were talking about code. We used back ticks here and we had a phenomenal recommended mitigation. This first one was a very difficult recommended mitigation. And if you talk to seven security researchers, you're going to get seven different answers for this first one. This is why this first finding is why security is so important and needs to be thought about from day one. The second finding was a little bit more straightforward, and we were actually able to write some code to point exactly to the line where there is an issue right in our markdown. But then we actually added a test case that we can copy paste into the test suite to actually prove that it's an issue. So we wrote a proof of code for our proof of concept, which is the most surefire way to prove to a protocol or prove to a judge that there is an issue. And then finally, we did an informational write up where we use this really nice little diff syntax to make it very clear to somebody where an issue lies. We learned that we can use AI to help us with this whole process. And sometimes even AI can help us when we're running and working with tools, but we'll learn about later. We learned that we could always look at another line of code, but at some point we need to stop and we need to be done and we need to write the report. We learned about severity classification and what the difference between a high, a medium and low is, which is based off of the matrix of likelihood versus impact, which can get a little bit subjective. But as we go on, we'll get better and better at figuring out where that line actually is. And due to the severity, we figured out that we had two highs and an informational. Storing the password on chain makes it visible to anybody and no longer private. This was a high impact. This essentially ruins the entire functionality of the protocol. That is severe disruption of protocol functionality, making the impact high and anybody could see this at any time. So the likelihood was high. We had an additional high impact, high likelihood with our H2. And then we had an informational down here because it had no impact. We learned that informationals are a way to say, hey, this isn't a bug, but maybe you should check this out and, and fix it. 
And then finally, we learned how to write a basic markdown report and turn it into a PF using this audit report templating. Now, the more you work in this space and the more audits you do and the more security reviews you do, the more you'll figure out your own style, right? Maybe you'll write your own report template. Maybe you won't use Pandocs. Maybe you won't use LaTeX. Maybe you'll hire a designer for all of your reports. Whatever you want to do, this is just one way to help you make a professional looking PDF. And with all that said, I want to just say again, huge congratulations for getting through this first one. This was the easiest code base by far, obviously, right? It was the smallest code base. Bugs were pretty obvious. But at the same time, if you had a hard time finding the bugs, that's OK. That's all right. They are going to get harder. The hardest part of this first section is all of this other stuff where protocols will give you bad code or they won't understand what they're missing and they won't understand what they need to do. And getting all that buttoned up is going to save you time. It's going to save you effort and it's going to make sure you're hyper focused on what you're doing. But I want to just say again, huge congratulations for making it this far. This is a massive step in your security journey. And oh, my goodness, we're just getting ramped up. Believe it or not, like I said, at the end of this course, you're going to have at least one, two, three, four, five, six fantastically professional looking security reviews that you can add to your portfolio and they're going to look incredibly badass and you're going to be able to audit this final boss vault guardians which is going to be so sick so before we close this up before we wrap up section three of this course there are two exercises we want to do obviously we're going to have the nft coming soon Number one, you should first tweet about this. You should celebrate the small wins. It can be very encouraging to celebrate the small wins for yourself. It can be very encouraging to jump into the community, jump into the Discord, jump into Cypher and Updraft, and celebrate with other people who are doing this as well. So definitely you want to tweet about how this is going for you. But then secondly, you're going to want to sign up for Code Hawks. Why? Because technically, even now, if you wanted to, you would have the basic skills to compete in your first competitive audit. There's a couple things we haven't taught you yet, but for the most part, you could probably do it. So sign up for Codox because after we do section four, the puppy raffle audit, you technically will be ready to do a competitive audit if you wanted to. And you could drop the rest of the course if you wanted to and just start doing competitive audits because competitive audits are going to be, like I said, one of the fastest ways to learn and grow. However, I will say you should still continue and finish this course. There's a ton of stuff we're going to teach you in a much more digestible manner than doing everything on Codox. But definitely sign up for Codox. We've baked into this platform so many things to help you learn and grow and help protocols stay secure. Most importantly, that you're going to want to compete in the, on this platform as well. So, so those are your two action items for the end of this course. Now is the perfect time to take a break, to go for a walk, to get that cup of coffee, to maybe go to the gym because you've done phenomenally so far. I'm sure you've already learned a lot. I'm excited that you've started your security portfolio and you're going to need to take a break and rest up to jump onto the puppy raffle audit because our code base is going to get a little bit bigger and more challenging. So take that break. Congrats for getting this far and I will see you very soon. All right, welcome to section four the puppy raffle audit. We're also going to be learning about a lot of other things in this space. We're going to be doing manual review and static analysis. Additionally, just like the password store is going to be another project that you can add to your portfolio for projects that you've audited. And the timing on here is actually phenomenal because on the Codehawks platform right now, the puppy raffle audit is a live first flight. So we are going to be showing you how to write a professional looking finding for both a private audit, but also a competitive audit. Codehawks first flights are basically very minimalistic, easier code bases for newer smart contract security researchers. They're going to be very similar to the code bases that we're going to find in this course, except for the last couple of code bases are probably a lot bigger than what we'd find on a first flight. So let's talk about what we're going to learn in this section. We're going to be working with our first bit of tooling, and we're going to be learning what static analysis is and how we can use it to help improve the security of our protocols. We're going to be, of course, going over a lot of different exploits in this code base. Then, of course, we're going to finally write the report at the end. We're going to be doing it a lot faster. 
But additionally, we're going to be showing you how to write a finding for a competitive audit, how these work, what these are, what the differences between a competitive audit and a private audit are, and how we can do our best on these. And at the end, we're going to have even more exercises for us to learn and grow outside of this. So, like I said, we're going to be going over a number of different exploits. This is going to be much more exploit heavy with a much more sophisticated code base. Additionally, we're going to be going over some case studies. One of the best ways to learn about security and stay ahead of the game and stay ahead of the attackers is to constantly and relentlessly be up to date on your game on historical attacks and how they happen. So before we actually jump to the puppy raffle audit code base, we're going to find a ton of exploits in this code base. And of course, we're going to end it with writing a professional audit report. And then also we're going to teach you how to write a competitive audit report that hopefully is good enough that we'll get selected for a selected report. And we will explain what that whole thing is. And at the end of this, you're going to sign up for a code Hawks first flight or a competitive audit. Yeah, I'm already kicking you into doing real things. So, so what we can do is we can scroll down to section four. We can select the repo and we can just about get started. Now, before we actually do, and we will in just a second, similar to the password store, we're going to have two branches in here. We're going to have a main and an audit data branch. Unlike the password store, this project has already gone through a successful onboarding document. And if you look in here, they've got compatibilities, they've got roles, known issues, how to actually get it going, the audit scope, etc. just to make this one a little bit easier. But remember, this isn't always going to be the case. And in future audits that we do in this course, we will need to go over the onboarding and we'll do more extensive onboarding. But for this one, we've already gone through the onboarding details and we have everything that we're going to be working with. Now, same as the password store, we have our main and we also have an audit data branch as well with this audit data folder where you guessed it, all of the audit or security review information is and it's you can think of it as the answer key. Let's not go there because you going through this code base with me and uncovering the codes and uncovering the attack vectors with me is going to be what drills it in you where these attacks are. Because guess what? At the end of the day, keep in mind that us doing these security reviews is to prevent attackers from attacking this. So we need to learn to go through this ourselves. We need to learn to find the bugs and find the issues and make a fantastic report to prevent the hackers from getting this. Because at the same time, you do want to think there are attackers who are looking to break what we're building. And if you don't find them, I'm going to exploit this protocol. So obviously that was a little corny, but there are attackers always looking to break these protocols and we need to keep that in mind when we're working on them. But yes, there are at least four high severity vulnerabilities in this puppy raffle. Here's what I want us to do. Number one, do not look at the audit data branch with the audit with basically the answer key. And number two, take some time for you to walk through this yourself. Take some time for you to review it and you to find bugs and go through the process that we just did. Don't spend too long on it though. Maybe spend 30 minutes if you feel like that's too long, you feel like you're spinning your wheels. If you feel frustrated, just stop. If you feel like you're cooking and you're excited and you wanna keep going, then keep going. This is a phenomenal code base for you to test your skill and see how you're doing. Take at least 20 minutes right now to challenge yourself. How many bugs can you find before we go through them ourselves? This will also give you a good idea of what it feels like to do one of these yourself when I'm not hand holding you. I don't understand this. Wait, I don't get it. Oh, I think that's a bug. I don't understand this. Oh my God, I found something. I am a brilliant wizard. I don't understand this. What's this? Yep, that's definitely a bug. Okay, write that up. All right, keep going. And it's okay if you you feel that up and that down and that up and that down. That's all part of the process. So with that all being said, take some time right now, go through the puppy raffle code base, and then come back and we will walk through it together. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you took some time to actually go through this. And if you didn't pause the video and do that, it's really important for your learning journey. All right, cool. Well, now that you definitely have done that, 
let's jump in and let's walk through this and let's learn about all the different exploits that are in this code base. And of course, at the end of this, you will have a brand new report you can add to your portfolio. So we are in our security course. And of course, remember to be taking lots of notes that you can refer back to, especially for this one, because we're going to be learning about a lot of different exploits in this one. So we have the code base, we're going to go ahead and clone it, get clone, paste it in. And we're going to open this up in its own VS code, or whatever code editor that you're using. And awesome. So let's go ahead. And before we even do anything, let's go ahead through that initial phase of the smart contract security view, which is what it is the scoping phase. So let's go ahead and scope these contracts out. Cool. So it looks like we have this adorable couple of puppies. It is the puppy raffle. And we have this nice little about section up here, which is great. We will read this in just a minute. Uh, we have a really nice readme here. Looks like we need Git and Foundry. We have both of those. Great. We have cloned it. Awesome. We're in the repo and it looks like we can run make if we go to this make file again we can see that if we run make we're basically running remove install build so we're running this remove command all these install commands looks like we're installing open zeppelin at a very specific version this weird bresh pd base 64 thing that we'll have to check out later and then we're going to run this build command okay so let's go ahead and run that so in a terminal i'm going to run make which should run those commands. It looks like it is indeed running those commands. I can see some dependencies being installed in here. I can see we're compiling some files. I see some warnings, which are interesting, and we might want to come back to that. It looks like everything has been compiled at least. I'm going to scroll down. Okay, we can run some tests here with Forge Test. I usually do love running me some tests, but I actually prefer to just run the coverage report just to see, okay, how solid is the test coverage for this repo? Mm, doesn't look so hot. So if I'm doing a competitive audit, that's music to my ears because there's a better chance of me finding bugs. If I'm doing a private audit, I get a little bit nervous because I am going to be responsible for making sure that this is more secure. And I will find bugs, which is great, but this might tell me, hey, the code base you're working with isn't as mature as it should be. But I've gone and run that, great. What's next? Okay, we have the commit hash. So what we could normally do is we do git checkout, paste it in here, but I'm gonna skip that because I'm gonna be trying to update this commit hash to be the most recent push to the repo. We're on the main branch, which is where the code base is. We can see the scope is just this one file, just this puppy raffle.sol. So if we go in here, we can see an SRC where there's only one file in here. Looks like there's a decent amount of comments. Let's do a toggle word wrap, decent amount of comments, a whole bunch of functions in here. Okay, cool, whatever. Compatibilities, Solidity version 0.7.6. That's pretty weird. Chains to deploy contract to Ethereum, and it looks like there's no tokens or anything like that. We have some roles, which are great to see, and no known issues. This project has already been onboarded. They probably at least gone through the minimal onboarding. They probably haven't gone through the more extensive onboarding. Like they probably haven't answered the rec test, but that's okay. Like I said, we'll talk more about that later. Now that we've gotten everything down though, let's move on to working with some tooling. So as smart contract auditors, we want to be using the best tools in the business to make our jobs better. Because if we can just run some tool that'll find all of the bugs or find at least some bugs, that's really helpful. We probably definitely want that. And we already know about test suites. That's one of the tools that we always use, but we can also use something called static analysis. Now here's a screenshot from a presentation that I gave at uh, ETH Denver talking about static analysis and how it works. So static analysis is gonna be automatically checking code for issues without executing. Hence debugging is static right? Most of these tools kind of quote unquote dumbly look for keywords in specific orders. They look for certain patterns. They do pattern matching. They're not actually executing the code. They're not actually running the code. They're just doing pattern matching on the code base. One of the most popular and most powerful static analysis tools is going to be this tool Slither by the Trail of Bits team. And there are a number of other static analyses. And there are a number of other static analysis tools as well, like Fornalizer and a Rust-based one that we've made called Adarin. For this course, we're going to be working with Slither and Adarin on all these code bases to help us find bugs automatically. 
most of the time, these tools should be run before going to audit. So if you're a developer looking to become the top developer, you got to get used to these tools. Sometimes protocols won't be familiar with these and we as security researchers will have to run them ourselves, which is fine. So let's get started with working with Slither. Slither is easily the most popular and one of probably if not the most powerful static analysis tool on the planet. It works for Solidity. They recently add Viper support and it is just a phenomenal tool built in Python, open source. If you want to add plugins, you can actually just make a PR and add some plugins, which is phenomenal. If you come to the Git repo for Slither, you can see how to install it, how to use it, etc. One of the best parts that about this is if you go to this wiki and you go to detector documentation here, these are all the different detectors that are in this tool, this Slither tool. And there are a lot in here. There are a lot of detectors that Slither automatically detects for. If we scroll all the way up to the top, it gives examples for each one. Let me pull up one that is really cool just to show you what it looks like. So here's one. So here's one detector that is in Slither that could actually have helped in the password store. So this is the check is called protected vars and the check just detects unprotected variables that are marked as protected. So if in your code base you add this little at custom security right protection equals only owner, what Slither will do is it'll look for any time this owner variable is changed without the only owner modifier and it will alert you. It'll say, hey, add access controls to the vulnerable functions. So these are some of the types of checks that Slither will actually do for us and we'll actually see some checks when we actually run this. So what we want to do is we're going to come to Slither and we're going to actually go ahead and install it. There's a number of ways to install this. And again, I'm not going to walk through actually doing the install. You can use pip. You can use Git, you can use Docker, whatever you want to do to install Slither. Take some time to do the install. Yes, sometimes these installs can be kind of hard and kind of a pain in the butt. Once you get it down, you're going to be in great shape. For debugging install issues, I highly recommend using ChatGBT or Find and then obviously Google search to help debug these issues because debugging installations is always one of the hardest parts about this job. So, but once you have it installed, you'll be able to use it anywhere and life will be much better. So once you have it installed and I actually use Pipex, so I'm going to run Pipex upgrade Slither Analyzer. This upgrades it since I already have it installed. Pipex is a custom implementation of PIP. Don't worry too much about it if you're unfamiliar with it. But once you have it, you can run Slither dash dash help and it'll give you this massive output like so. And we can read the documentation to actually learn more about how it works. Uh, we can go to usage and we can see run Slither on a hardhat, foundry, dep, or brownie application with just Slither dot. So Slither will actually detect which smart contract developer framework you're using and automatically compile as such. So if I just run Slither dot on this, we're going to actually run the Slither detector and it might take a little bit of time. So go ahead and be a little bit patient here. Oh, mine was actually super quick. This is great. And we can see we have all of these outputs here on things that we should potentially look at. Green is going to mean ah, it's probably OK. It might be an informational, but you might want to check it out. Yellow means, hey, uh, this might actually be an issue. You should probably definitely check this out. And if you see a red, this is a oh, my goodness, you need to check this out. And right away, we can actually see we have two reds that we're running into and we're going to come back to these in just a second we haven't gotten any context for this code base we haven't even read the docs yet but we'll come back to this so this is what the output of slither looks like we'll learn some ways to run slither effectively and easily and quickly but just by running slither i'm going to tell you right now these are issues and just by running this tool it found them automatically with us having to do zero work which is great so obviously we want to use tools where we can The other tool that we're going to be working with is going to be this tool called Adarin. Smart contract developer legend Alex Rohn created this one. And this is actually a Rust based static analysis tool. So you'll need to have Rust installed to work with this. Again, I'm not going to show how to install Rust. But once you have Rust installed, you can just run cargo install Adarin. So I'm going to actually clear this output. Don't worry, we can rerun it. Going to go ahead and run cargo install a Darren. 
looks like I already have it installed. And to run this, you just run a Darren dash dash root and the path to your foundry or hardhat project. So we'll run a Darren dash dash root and we are at the root directory. So we'll do a little dot here. It's going to recompile everything. It's going to give those same compilation warnings. And at the bottom, a little bit differently, it's going to say report printed to report.md. So now if we go in here, we go to report.md, we minimize this, we actually get a audit report borderline ready report in Markdown. And if we preview the Markdown, we can see we have some medium issues, some low issues, and some non-crits or informationals already written up for us to add to our audit reports, which is very handy. So we'll be going through this as well. All right, so we are going to use these static analysis tools. We've already used CLOCK. We've already learned about Solidity Metrics, and we can actually see more in Solidity Metrics. If we run Solidity Metrics again, we can scroll down. There's actually, if we scroll all the way to the bottom, there's actually a couple more helpful things that we can see. We can see an inheritance graph. We can see our puppy raffle is of type ERC721, and it's also ownable. We can see a call graph where we can see what functions call what other functions, which can be really helpful. And then we can see a little contract summary where we can see the different public and external functions, which are gonna be the functions that an attacker would likely call. So this is just a little bit more on the scoping side. Oh, and then one other tool that I should mention as well is this tool called Solidity Visual Developer. So not all code bases are going to, oh, actually this is perfect. So not all code bases are gonna have nice little S underscore to tell you that they're a storage variable. And in fact, just looking at this code base very briefly, we can see that a lot of these variables are just a word. And in the functions, it's the same thing. It's just a word. So it can be very difficult to tell what is a storage variable, what's a memory variable, etc. There's some other helpful VS Code extensions, such as Solidity Visual Developer. This is a tool that some auditors and smart contract security researchers swear by. And after we install this, if we go back to our code base, we can actually now see some of these variables automatically highlighted for us. If it's an immutable variable, right, it's kind of this purple color. If it's a storage variable, it's this yellow color here. If it's a constant, we can see that's highlighted. We can see different arguments highlighted as well. It adds some syntax highlighting to our solidity so that we have a better idea, okay, where is this variable even coming from? What is going on here? So some people really like it. I personally don't like it, but some people swear by it but I'm gonna go ahead and disable it. If you like it, you can absolutely keep it. So in any case, we've gone briefly over some tooling. We've run some tools. We've done a little bit more scoping. I kind of combined them all into this one section, but let's finally get into at least some scoping and at least some reconnaissance where we understand the puppy raffle and what it's supposed to do. And then we'll go back, then we'll do static analysis again, because once we have context for the, how the code base actually works, the static analysis outputs are gonna make a whole lot more sense to us. So let's get some context. Let's do step one of the tin show and read the documentation. Okay, so we're in the main branch of the puppy raffle audit. Let's go ahead and read the documentation. So we have a little about section up here. This project is to enter a raffle to win a cute dog NFT. The protocol should do the following, call the enter raffle function with the following parameters. You have an address array of participants, which is a list of addresses that enter. You can use this to enter yourself multiple times or yourself and a group of friends. Duplicate addresses are not allowed. Users are allowed to get a refund of their ticket and value if they call the refund function. Every X seconds, the raffle will be able to draw a winner and be minted a random puppy. The owner of the protocol will set a fee address and take a cut of the value. So already right away, I have the repo open in my VS code. Let's delete the Darren output actually. I'm gonna be creating my .notes.md, and I'm already gonna start making some thoughts here. One of the things that I love to do is maybe I'll make like a little about section where I'll put about the project in my own words, just to start thinking about, okay, well, what should this be doing? So we have some different functions. Okay, cool, we have some quick start stuff. We've already gone through that. We've already gone the coverage, all that stuff. Okay, cool. So let's actually go through the code base. And here's where, again, you can start going line by line. One of the things that I love to do is actually start from what I call the main entry point of this protocol. 
So maybe I'll do a quick skim of this code base to get an idea of what's going on. But maybe I'll actually start with what I think is the main entry point. And you can generally find a good idea of what the main entry point is going back to Solidity Metrics. So if we go to Solidity Metrics and we scroll all the way down to the bottom here, we can see this contract summary and we can see some of the public and external functions listed out for us. Since this is a Forge project, we could also run Forge inspect puppy raffle methods like this. And we'll, it'll actually print out a list of the methods, but we're actually just going to look over here. So we have enter raffle, which is public. That's going to be one we're going to look at. Refund, public, external, select winners, external. So all these external and public ones are going to be ones that I'm going to be looking at, especially if they modify any state here. So for me, I think that this enter raffle fee is going to be one of the main entry points here. And this is where I'm actually going to start with this enter raffle bit. So we'll read the docs here. This is how players enter the raffle. So, so okay, great. So this is giving us context. Back in the readme, we said, okay, this product is to enter a raffle to win a cute dog NFT. So, so this is how they enter the raffle here. They have to pay the entrance fee times the number of players. Okay, so what are they talking about? What do you mean the number of players? Ah, okay, looking in this parameters here, we have an address array memory new players. So they're probably going to have to pay whatever the entrance fee is times this number of players, you know, and if that's confusing to me, maybe I'll be like, again, question, what do you mean number of players? Okay. Uh, but maybe you think that's fine, whatever you want to do here. Uh, duplicate entries are not allowed. So we're going to be looking for this in this function. And the parameters are new players, a list of players to enter the raffle. Okay, cool. So the function enter raffle address rate new players looks cool. I don't love the syntax here. So so maybe I'm, if I'm doing a private audit, maybe I'm already doing like setting up an informational section where I'm saying variable names are bad because they're saying like entrance fee. So if I command click this, it'll go right to the top. Is an immutable variable? I really like the I underscore type mentality. So maybe I say, you know, I like, maybe I'll just do a note to myself, puppy raffle entrance fee is immutable and should be like, I underscore entrance fee, or maybe, or even entrance fee, you know, some other syntax to let people know that it is a immutable variable. Or if using Solidity, Solidity Visual Developer, obviously that's very obvious. Now, if you're on a Mac, I don't know the keyboard shortcut in a Windows, but I hit Control minus, and this is equivalent to like the back button. So if I like click entrance fee here, I scroll down, click here, and then I hit control minus. I go back to my the last place my cursor was. And I can do that a bunch and just keep going back. Hitting control shift minus is actually the like go forward button. So that's kind of a quick tip. Quick tip. Control minus is the back. Oh, it's actually not control. It's actually uptick back. And then shift minus is go forward, go back, go forward, go back, go forward. Oh, it's actually not control. It's actually like this little up up button. So let's go back, go forward. Windows probably has another way to do that, but I find it really helpful. Keyboard shortcuts are great for being able to rip around your terminal much quicker. People who use Vim or Vi or Emacs also get amazing at keyboard shortcuts, which make your life much faster. So try to learn keyboard shortcuts. Your life will be quicker. And again, we see at the top, okay, this is 0 0.7.6. I don't want to get distracted though. Let's go back to the enter alpha function. Okay, cool. So uh, we have some requires here. We're using an older version of Solidity 0.7.6. So that means, so I don't think custom reverts were a thing then. So maybe I don't say anything here, but maybe I'll do like question were custom reverts a thing in 0.7.6 of Solidity. Okay, so we're doing require message.value equals entrance fee times new players dot length. So if they have zero players, it's gonna be zero. Maybe I'll put a question here. What if it's zero? What happens then? If they add 10 players, they're gonna have to pay whatever the entrance fee is. It looks like it's set to being immutable and it's set as a parameter to the constructor. Okay, cool. Then we loop through the arrays and we push all the new players onto this players array. And if I control click that, it looks like that's another state variable, one of the main storage variables. So the raffle is keeping track of all the players who enter the raffle like this. Now, okay, here's the check for duplicates. They were talking about that in this function here. 
And how do we actually do this? Okay, we loop through the player's storage array, and then we loop through it again using I and J, and then we check to see if players, if there's duplicate players in the array. We've already pushed it onto the array, so this goes ahead and makes sense, and if there's duplicate players, and then we emit an event after that happens. Sometimes when you're looking at code bases, you can kind of smell bugs before you can actually see them. If you see something like this, you should start you should start smelling a bug here because we're doing this thing where we're looping and then we're looping. So at the very least, this double doing double loops in solidity can be incredibly gas expensive. So when you see some bad code, that's usually an indication that uh, maybe there's a bug here. And there is a bug right here. Can you see what it is? So the bug here is going to be a denial of service bug. And oh boy, this is going to be our first bug that we found already. To actually learn about this denial of service bug, we're actually first going to look at a minimized example of this bug. Now, if you're on the Cypher and Security and Auditing full course, GitHub repo, let me zoom a little bit out here. We scroll back up to the, and we hit back to top. We go back to the top. And we go to Welcome to the Course. We scroll down to where, where are we looking for? Resources. Ah, resources. Resource for this course. We scroll down here. We have this exploit resource. We have this exploit resources page with SC exploits minimized. And if we click on this, we'll get to this repo, SC exploit minimized, which is going to be a repository for minimized examples of some of the bugs that we're going to go over, just so that they're a lot easier to understand and they're going to give you chances to practice them. If you scroll down at the bottom, we actually have some buttons for us to click to open up the example contracts in Remix so we can play with them there. And then we'll also have some capture the flags where you can practice finding these bugs in more realistic scenarios in, in these games, Damn Vulnerable DeFi and Ethernaut, and maybe some other as well. Additionally, in this repo, if you go to SRC, there's going to be a whole bunch of different folders with some of the different attacks we're going to go over. And we can actually go to this denial of service DOS to see a very minimalistic example of this denial of service. So let's first go and open this up in Remix. So if we scroll down, we'll go to denial of service. We'll click the Remix button. And this will actually automatically open us up into a Remix, into the Remix IDE with the code base that we're going to work with right in here. And if that doesn't happen, what you can do is you can just open this up. You can go into SRC denial of service, dos.sol, and then just copy paste this in the remix. So let's talk about the denial of service attack and how it works. So sometimes we're going to have diagrams for these as well, but the denial of service attack is relatively straightforward, so we will be able to see this work. So what we have here is a minimalistic contract called DOS, and we have an address array of entrance, and we have an enter function. This is going to be doing the same thing. Essentially, we're going to be checking for duplicates in this entrance array. So every time somebody enters, we do a quick check to see, hey, are you already in the entrance array? And then if they are not in the entrance array, we go ahead and push them onto the array. But here's the issue. The bigger this entrance array gets, the more loops that they're going to have to make, which means the more gas expensive this is going to cost. So let's say there's zero people in the array. When I call enter, it's going to not even loop through this and it's just going to push them onto the array. Not a whole lot of work. But let's say there are 10 people in this array. It's going to loop through this once. It's going to loop through this again. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10. And then it's going to push you into the array. What if there are 100? Guess how many times it's going to loop through this? 100 times. The more people that are in this entrance array, the more times this check is going to get called, which means the more gas is going to get used. Now, you might be just thinking, oh, hey, cool, Patrick, that's that's a gas thing, like whatever. But let's say this is a lottery. Who is spending less money to join the lottery? The person who takes up the first 100 slots or the person who takes up slots 1,000 to 2,000? The person who enters the lottery earlier gets a much better, a much cheaper deal. So filling up these arrays and doing these loops can actually make this contract unusable because it'll become so gas intensive, it'll become more and more gas intensive 
that this function will become borderline unusable, denying the service of this contract. And an attack vector that attackers will take is if they see this and they want to win a lottery, for example, they will blow up. They will call this function a million times so that there's a million people in this array and you cannot enter this function. You cannot enter this lottery if it was the lottery. So that's kind of the explanation. Let's actually see it in action here. So let's go ahead. We'll compile the contract. We're going to go ahead and deploy it here. What we can do is let's go ahead. Oh, we don't need to make this payable. I'll fix that. Go ahead and redeploy. Let's see what happens. So we're going to be this first dummy account. Let's see what how much gas it costs for us to enter. So we pull this up. We'll hit the little debug thing. Let's just look at the execution cost was this much gas. So these are kind of all the gas things. The execution cost is going to be the one that we look at. So when there's zero people, this is how much gas it costs. Now, of course, if we try to enter again, it's going to revert, right? Because we're already in the array. So let's pick a new address and let's call enter again. Okay, great. This one went through. Let's scroll down. Let's look at the execution cost. One, it actually costs less. And the reason for that is actually we had to warm up the storage variable. So so the first time we do this, yes, it is going to be a little bit cheaper, but you'll see as we continue, that's when it starts getting way, way more gas expensive. So now we'll do the third one. We'll enter. We'll scroll down. Execution cost for two people. Okay, now we're starting to go up. Okay, let's look at three people. Let's enter the array or the, yeah, let's enter the array. Execution cost is going up. But as you can see, this number is actually just going to keep going up. And if we were to call this enough times, it would eventually just get become like, let's say this is number 4,500, blah, blah, blah. If we were to call this enough times, it's going to get so gas expensive that you're basically going to need to be a bajillionaire to even interact with the protocol. Again, essentially denying the service of the protocol. If we go back to the SC exploits minimized, we can actually clone this repo. So I'm going to pull this up here. I'm going to scroll down. Actually, I'm going to clone it in my security course notes here. So get clone right here. We're going to open that up. Code SC exploits minimized. If we go to the readme of this to get started, we need Git and Foundry. We just run make to install all the dependencies. And that'll also build the contracts as well. And what we can do is we can look in this test file. We have a, a DOS test.t.sol, which also shows a test of how this actually works. So what we what ends up happening is so first we see we have our, our, our setup where we deploy that exact same denial of service address and we run vm.prank just to warm it up and we enter. And then we grab the cost of A, B, and C, we print them out, and we assert that it's just gonna get more and more expensive for us to go. So we can go ahead and run forge test dash dash MT, grab this test denial service, paste it in, and we'll see it indeed passes, right? If we run it again with some verbosity here, we'll actually see the gas costs creeping up. So we could do something crazy here. We could do like say four, you went to 56, I is less than a thousand, I plus plus, VM dot prank address I, DOS dot enter. We'll do it a hundred times, then we'll do person C, and then we'll see how much it costs. Let's clear this, run the same test. We need to cast it as a uint160 first, cast it as an address. Let's try it again. Boom. We see if a thousand people enter this, this denial of service contract, we go from this much gas to, oh my goodness, way more gas. So we're talking the 1,000th and first person is going to have to spend 5A2, 232, divided by 26, 122, 22 times more gas to get into this. So it's only going to get worse and worse the more people enter this. So this is a denial of service attack. If you want to pause the video right now to take some time to play around with this, feel free. Or maybe try to write your own test scenarios where you test the gas and you test this denial of service type attack. Now is a great time for you to pause the video and run this test yourself and actually play with this and maybe come up with your own test case. So in here, denial of service, maybe you make a more interesting attack vector contract here. Now, denial of service is a legitimate issue. 
And a lot of protocols, unfortunately, fall victim to this attack. So to actually walk us through some real life, real case scenarios, we have Owen from Guardian Audits to walk us through and show you what these look like in the wild in other projects. So here's Owen. All right, guys, we're about to have a look at two different kinds of denial of service attacks or DOS attacks, as they're commonly referred to, that came up in real security reviews of real protocols. And so you're going to see exactly how these sort of vulnerabilities are, you know, they come about in protocols, and then how can you sort of build these frameworks to uncover these exact types of vulnerabilities when you're doing your own security reviews, whether that be in a contest or, you know, a private security review setting or whatever you might be doing. But first, before we dive into these two different types of DOS attacks, of course, who am I? Well, my name is Owen and about two years ago at this point, I founded Guardian Audits. And ever since then, we've conducted dozens and dozens of security reviews with over you know, several hundred smart contracts in scope for these security reviews. And along the process, we've uncovered easily over 100 different high impact bugs and vulnerabilities in DeFi smart contract systems. And so I hope to bring some of the knowledge that our team of security researchers has gleaned over the past two years from, you know, reviewing all of these smart contracts and give it to you so that you can ultimately learn from some of the findings that we found related to DOS attacks. And then hopefully you'll be able to use this moving forward in your own security reviews. Or of course, if you are just a protocol developer interested in security, hopefully you can glean something from these findings and be able to avoid things like this when you're writing your own Solidity code. All right, so without wasting any more time, let's just jump right into the first DOS vulnerability. So I have a particular finding from a report that Guardian did on the bridges exchange. So this was really just an exchange that had a few different features. One of these of course was dividends. So users who were providing liquidity in one of their pairs were able to collect dividends. And so we'll see in just a minute how the design of this, this dividends distribution mechanism was you know, designed in such a way that ended up in there being a denial of service attack. So let's first of all, let's just read the description and then we'll have a look at the code and we'll try and understand exactly what this finding is saying and then exactly what the, the crux of the DOS is coming from. So here in the description, it says, due to the unbounded for loop in the distribute dividends function, there is a risk of a DOS attack. A malicious party can keep generating new addresses and, and minting minimal amounts of the bridges pair token to make distribute dividends exceed the block gas limit, stopping all dividends. So that sounds like quite an issue. Let's have a look at the code and let's try and understand what exactly we mean here. So here we've got the bridges pair contract pulled up here and we can see going down to line 221, which is referenced in the finding, we can find the distribute dividends function. So when we talk about an unbounded for loop, which is what we're referencing here, we have basically a for loop here that is iterating over a length of an array that seemingly, you know, just from, from looking at this, which we'll, we'll confirm in a second, seemingly just from looking at this function, this array has an unbounded length, right? It can grow to any specific size. There seems to be no limit on how many iterations this for loop can do. And so with the logic that is inside of this for loop, if there's enough iterations of this for loop, it will expend enough gas that you literally will not be able to execute this function and, and do all of this, all of the loops required, even though we've got the, the optimized plus plus I here, still not going to save us from iterating over a list that was maybe a thousand addresses long or something like this, right? So that's still going to take more gas than is available in the block gas limit. And, and really, you're, ne you're never going to be able to execute that transaction to distribute dividends. So of course, how can we confirm that this user's list is indeed what we call unbounded, right? How can we make sure that, you know, a 
an arbitrary address is able to extend this list easily. So first let's just, let's have a look at the instances where the user's list is used. So we can see this is where it's defined. And then of course we can see users.push2, and this is in the mint function. And so there's, there's no boundaries on this. The only requirement is that the, the balance of two is zero, which you know can easily be engineered. That situation can easily uh, you know be engineered to add any amount of you know addresses to this list. So this list, if I call mint a hundred times from a hundred different addresses, we will easily be able to push you know a hundred different addresses to this list. And in fact, I mean on top of this, as an aside, there's actually a case here where you can push the same user's address to this list multiple times, just as long as you, you transfer some of these pair tokens you know, out of that address. But that is a, a separate issue. Let's focus on the denial of service aspect here. We can push you know, 100, 1,000, 10,000 different elements to this list. Well then, what do we have to do after that list has grown to be so large? Well, when we want to distribute dividends, we want to call this function the length of users users dot length is you know a thousand ten thousand whatever we we however many we appended to that list and then of course we've got to iterate ten thousand times which of course is this is not going to fit within a you know a reasonable block gas limit and so even such an attack might be you know really easily feasible as you know there, there's no real limit on what's the minimum amount that somebody can mint so if i wanted to mint you know like literally like one single way of you know one of these pair tokens then that's that's not even you know a, a, that's not even a fraction of a cent of real economic value so it can cost me basically nothing except for the gas required to do this i just have to be able to call the mint function X number of times and then fill up the list to a certain point and then we've gotten a list that's literally just too long to iterate over and this distribute dividends function is DOS to denial of service right so nobody will be able to successfully execute this function and so the dividend functionality is basically completely shut down and so this is exactly what we mean when we're referencing an unbounded for loop in distribute dividends and of course the remediation for something like this is to just change the the design change the approach of distributing dividends and the bridges team adopted a dividend per share model which will essentially make it so that you know rather than us having to iterate over every user's ownership of the supply here what we can do is we can automatically just say hey per one Per single atomic unit of supply, this is how much you know somebody has accrued of dividends, and then they'll be able to withdraw that on their own in their own separate transaction later, and that can be computed, you know, when they do that transaction. It doesn't have to be automatically looped over and assigned to each user this way. But of course, DOS attacks are certainly not constrained to simply just unbounded for loops or even just the block gas limit. A DOS attack can actually arise from several different things. So in this next finding here, let's have a look. A finding that we had in the GMX V2 system with one of the reviews that we conducted at Guardian. And let's have a look at exactly what was the crux of this finding because it's actually completely different, is a completely different idea than the, the crux of the finding that we just looked at. So I've got Global One pulled up here. This one is titled, should unwrap native token DOS. So we've got a, in the GMX system, there's a Boolean indicator called should unwrap native token. And this can actually be used to cause a denial of service attack. And we will see exactly how that can be used in just a second. So firstly, let's read the description and then we'll look at the code and see exactly what this means. So it says the should unwrap native token flag can be exploited by users to create positions that cannot be decreased by liquidations or ADL orders. For both liquidation orders and ADL orders, the should unwrap native token flag is set to true. However, the position can be created 
by a contract that is unable to receive the native token, causing the order execution to revert. And this is really the crux of what a DOS attack is. We'll talk more about this in a second. Is really just causing a function or, or a transaction to not be able to execute. That is a denial of service. So we're causing a specific feature of the protocol to be basically unexecutable. So let's have a quick look at some of the actual code here. So first of all, let's go into the decrease order utils function. So when we are processing a decrease order. So when we're processing a, a liquidation, for example, when we need to liquidate a position because somebody has you know, experienced a lot of losses on their position and maybe their collateral that is backing their position is no longer sufficient to support their position, the protocol needs to liquidate them. So we need to come in, grab your remaining collateral and close out your position. And this is something that is absolutely critical to the protocol's ongoing functionality. So liquidations absolutely need to be able to go through. So when we're in this decrease order utils process order function, this is a function that is used to execute liquidations. If we scroll down through all the logic that we, we don't need to pay attention to in, in, in this particular findings case, then we can see in, in the vast majority of liquidations cases, we're going to end up transferring out whatever the remaining collateral is in the user's position back to the receiver. And we're going to use order dot should unwrap native token. So let's have a look at this transfer out function. So this is going to be on the bank contract. So this function takes, you know, the token to transfer out the amount to transfer out the receiver and this flag should unwrap native token. Now, if we go back to the finding here really quick, we can see you know, we mentioned the should unwrap native token flag can be exploited and for liquidations as well as ideal orders, the should unwrap native token flag is set to true. So this will be true for liquidations. And we can see this really quickly. If we go to the, the liquidation, create liquidation order function, we can see that should unwrap native token is set to true in the flags for the order. So we know that when we call this transfer out function for a liquidation, this is going to be true. And so if the token that we are looking to transfer out is the wrapped native token. So for example, if this is on Arbitrum, if it's wrapped Ether, or if it's on Avalanche, if this is wrapped AVAX, then we're going to go ahead and end up transferring out native token. So let's see what happens in this function for transfer out native token. Okay, so here we are with transfer out native token. And what we've got is we're going to basically just call token utils dot withdraw and send native token. So let's have a look at withdraw and send a native token. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically withdraw from the, the wrapped native token contract. So if this is wrapped ether, we're going to go to wrapped ether. We're going to say, Hey, can I get my, my ether back? We're going to get the, the actual ether into this contract. And then we're going to transfer native token and let's find this transfer native token function. What we're going to do is transfer out the amount. We're going to get a specified gas limit to forward when we're doing this. And we're going to call, the receiver and we're going to trigger that receiver. If it's a contract, we'll trigger its receive function or its fallback function. And so if it's a success, that's great. We'll return the, all the, the native tokens were successfully transferred. If they weren't transferred and if this, this external call failed, then we're going to revert with a native token transfer error. And so this is just another mechanism that we're able to use to get this transaction to fail, right? So now instead of overflowing the block gas limit, so having something that would just require too much gas to be able to execute, now we're just straight up causing a revert to happen when we really do not want a revert to happen, right? So what we want is we want this liquidation to go through no matter what ideally, right? So if a position needs to get liquidated, we need to have that position liquidated 
And if I'm able to cause this revert to happen, well, then we have a huge denial of service issue. So how can I cause this transfer, this call to fail, so that instead of hitting the success and returning, we end up reverting? Well, of course, if the receiver is just straight up a contract that cannot accept either, so it doesn't have any sort of fallback or receive function, then there's going to be no way to send value to this receiver contract and this is just going to fail right and then we have that case of ending up with this native token transfer error and there you go there's a dos attack that prevents liquidations from occurring and this is easily achievable if we go ahead and we look at what the receiver address is it is the order dot receiver and then if we look at the the liquidation order of course, the order dot receiver is the account that basically owns the position. So very easily, you could make a smart contract that creates the actual position, and then that will be the account that gets used here. And of course, that smart contract can refuse to receive any ether. And so one way that GMX could have addressed this is, of course, they could have said, you know, false for should unwrap native token, and then we could be transferring wrapped ERC-20 tokens, which would not, unless they have callbacks, they wouldn't open up that risk of, you know, potentially calling a, a third party address and then potentially re resulting in a revert. Or another thing that they could do is they could see, okay, if this didn't succeed, then we could rewrap the token and then send it to that address once again, which is actually the approach that they ended up going with. But in fact, there's actually a few other ways that this could revert and you know, cause a failure here, so cause the success to be false. And that's, you know, of course, like we mentioned, just if the contract isn't set up to accept ether, but also if this gas limit just isn't enough for the contract to execute the fallback or receive function. So maybe those either of those functions have some sort of operation that requires a ton of gas. Well, if they require more than the gas limit that's forwarded here, then that's just going to revert and cause a failure. So cause this to be false, and then we'll get one of these native token transfer errors. Or this particular receiver contract could just be malicious on purpose. And when you call it in either the fallback or receive function, they could just revert on their own. And that would cause the success to be false here as well. So there's a few different ways to get a DOS attack like this to happen. So the crux of a DOS attack is really not boiling down to any specific root cause. It can be caused by a number of things. Really, it just adds up to a transaction that is being prevented from going through or being executed when it really needs to be. And that might be caused by an unbounded for loop and the block gas limit or it might be caused by an external call just failing and preventing the transaction from going through. So here are some frameworks to uncover some DOS attacks just like this when you're going through a code base on your own. So first of all, obviously, every time you see a for loop, you should ask yourself the following question. Is this iterable thing that it is iterating over, is that bounded to a certain size? If it's not, can a user just add an arbitrary amount of items to that list? How much does it cost the user to do that? If the user can do that and add a, a, a nearly infinite amount of things to that list very cheaply, then you might have a critical or high vulnerability on your hands. And second of all, look out for any external calls. This could be anything that is transferring ether or simply making a call to a third party contract. And then once you've found these calls and identified them, ask yourself, is there a way for these calls to fail? And then if they do fail, will that cause the top level external transaction to actually revert entirely? And then if that's true, then how can that actually affect the system? Can it affect the system really negatively? Like in our case, we were able to prevent liquidations or is it maybe a smaller effect or it doesn't really matter? And again, there's a few different ways that you can force an external call to fail. First of all, if you're sending ether to a contract that just doesn't accept it, or if you're calling a function that just doesn't exist on the contract that you're calling it on, and that contract has no fallback function, or 
if you're calling a contract with a specified amount of gas to forward or the remaining 63 out of 64 gas in the current transaction is just not significant enough to execute that external call, then the external call will fail. Or if that third party external address, that external contract just reverts maliciously on purpose, then that can be another way that we get a denial of service attack from an external call. All right, there is everything you need to spot a denial of service attack when you're conducting your own security reviews. I hope that these frameworks serve you well in the future, and I wish you the best of luck with the course moving on. Now that we've understood this, let's go back over to our puppy raffle. This looks very similar to us. So now that we have a hunch, we might put a note here, as we said before, at audit, DOS or something like that. And we can already start writing in our in our dot notes. Hey, maybe we'll put this, maybe we'll put a little hi. We say we found a DOS. And maybe we just leave it here to go back to it later. Or maybe now we go ahead and say, you know what? It's time for us to write the proof of code. Let's prove that this is actually a legitimate issue as opposed to just, oh, I think this is an issue. So the way we're going to prove this is actually an issue is doing what? That's right, writing a proof of code. So let's check if their test suite works for us to borrow it. So I'm going to do forge test. Looks like it does work. Okay, great. So I can use this for me to write my own test suite. So we look in puppy raffle test.soul. We see a whole bunch of stuff in here, whatever. Cool. It sets up the puppy raffle. It looks like we even have some stuff we can probably copy paste. We have this test can enter raffle. Okay, great. And if you're watching this video, I do want you to pause and see if you can write the proof of code before I do. So now's a great time. Pause the video, see if you can write the proof of code, or you can just follow along with me. But I do highly recommend you challenge yourself real quick. Try to write the proof of code for this first. All right, cool. So what we can do is we can copy this test can enter raffle function and repurpose it for our nefariousness. So let's rename this. Let's close this off zoom in a little bit here we'll call this test underscore denial of service or whatever we want to call it so it looks like okay we're doing this address memory players I'm just going to comment this all out for now and I'll just use it as a reference so let's try this out let's enter 100 players so we're going to enter 100 players into the raffle and we can do that like this we can do it all in one fell swoop so we can say UN 256 players num equals 100 we can say address array memory players equals new address array of the players num. And we're going to say for UN256 i equals zero. i is less than players num i plus plus. And we're going to say players of i equals address of i. And this is going to be how, let me zoom out a little bit. And this is gonna be how we're gonna create 100 players with different addresses. So it's like equivalent to doing address one, address two, or address zero, address one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. So we're gonna go all the way up to, from zero to 99, create 99 unique addresses to enter into the puppy raffle, because again, it doesn't allow for duplicates. So we're gonna do that. And what we're gonna do is we're going to calculate how much gas it costs for the first 100 players, and then the second 100 players. So we're gonna, we're gonna see how much gas it costs. So we're gonna say UN256 gas start equals gas left. This gas left function will give us a checkpoint for how much gas certain execution bits cost. We'll say puppy raffle dot enter raffle. We'll do value is gonna be whatever the entrance fee is. So it looks like again, there's this entrance fee. It looks like in our test setup here, entrance fee it looks like it has the entrance fee set up at the top so we're just going to use this so the value is going to be the entrance fee and the input is going to be this new players array that we just created with 100 fake players so we're going to add players and then we're going to say un256 gas end equals gas left okay cool so this is going to this using this gas left function in foundry will tell us here's how much sending 100 players to the raffle is going to cost the first time. So we're going to say you went to 256 gas used first 100 players equals we're going to say gas start minus oops 
minus gas end like this. And just to make sure that there, we're not doing any weird stuff in Foundry, you can do this thing called vm.tx gas price one. We're going to set the gas price to be one here. So we're going to get the actual exact gas price here. So we're going to say gas start minus gas end times tx.gas price. It's probably not really important that we do that, but we're going to go ahead and, and do that. So the total gas is going to be gas start minus gas end. Okay, great. And then we'll even do a little console.log gas cost of the first 100 players, comma, gas used first. Cool. You can even run this right now with forge test dash dash MT paste denial of service in here, copy paste that dash VVV three V's. Oh, and it looks like we got an error. Must send enough to enter raffle. Oops, it's, this should be entrance fee times players dot length. Let's do that. Rerun it. And okay, cool. So gas cost of the first 100 players, that's the gas cost right there. Great. Now let's do this whole thing again. Now for the second 100 players. So to do this, we're just gonna copy paste this whole thing and do this for the second 100 players. So players done, we don't need this. We could say players two. We'll create a new array. We'll go from zero to players num. We'll do players two. So we'll do the same thing, but we'll want to add players num just so that we're doing instead of zero, one, two, three, we're going to do addresses 100, 101, 102. So there's no duplicate still. So then the same thing. So we're going to say gas start second equals gas left. We're going to enter the raffle. And instead of players, we do players two, gas end second. We're going to say gas used second equals gas start second minus gas end second. Gas cost of the second 100 players, gas used second. And then if we are correct, we can say assert gas used first is substantially less than gas used second, like this. So this is our full test. This is our full proof of code here. We're gonna enter 100 times, see how much gas that cost. We're gonna enter another 100 times and see how much gas that cost and see if it's more expensive. And this is an issue because the more people who enter the lottery, the richer you have to be to enter the lottery. It gives a huge advantage to the people who get into the lottery first. So I'm gonna hit up a few times. We're gonna rerun this test. We're gonna see what we get. Oh my goodness, it looks like it costs a lot more gas to enter the second number of people. So we have proved there's a potential denial of service attack here. Bada bing, manual review, you have done it. And now here's where we might take some time, create a new file. Again, we're gonna do findings.md. Maybe you do the write up now, maybe you hold it for later. A denial of service attack. I do recommend you doing some practice, some more practice write-ups because that's gonna help you a lot. Remember, we wanna use that finding layout again for severity and number, title, description, blah, blah, blah. For now, we're gonna walk through this one together, but for some of the future ones, we're not going to practice writing the write-up together. So let's do this write-up though. First, we gotta give it a badass title with the severity and the number. The title, of course, is going to be root plus impact. The root cause plus the impact. So what is the root cause here? Well, it's going to be, yeah, looping through that players array, looping through players array to check for duplicates. That's the root cause. And let's also say where it is in puppy raffle. Where is this? It's in the enter raffle function. Puppy raffle enter raffle is a potential DOS. I mean, we'll say Denial of service DOS attack is a potential denial of service attack. One could argue this is also the impact, but let's just be super explicit. Incrementing gas costs for future entrance. Cool. Root cause, impact. Right. So now that we know the root cause and the impact, let's talk about the severity. What is the impact? Okay, it's going to get more and more expensive for users to go through. Mm, maybe we argue that's a medium because it's going to be expensive for an attacker to do this. 
medium. Maybe this is high. It's going to be pretty expensive for an attacker to do this. And this will just make it really annoying and much harder to use the protocol. So maybe we say this is a medium. Let's go with likelihood. It'll cost the attacker a lot to do this, but an attacker who really wants that NFT and really kind of wants to rig the protocol, they are going to swoop in right away to call this enter function. So maybe we call this medium as well. So let's say impact is medium, likelihood is medium. So let's go with a medium. We'll figure out the number later, but boom. So we figured out the severity. We've got a good title here. Let's go through the description. Now, oftentimes, now at this point, I probably won't do the write up yet because maybe something later on in the audit, I find out, oh, wait, never mind. That bug I found before actually wasn't an issue. Maybe something I learn about the puppy raffle audit later on figures out that, oh, no, that's actually by design. It's supposed to be a denial of service attack. So normally I won't put I won't do the write up yet. Maybe I'll just do audit DOS, go through the rest of the contracts and come back and actually do the write ups towards the end. But you can do it in whatever order that you want. For us, we are just going to practice doing this as if it's good right now. All right, great. So let's talk about the description here. OK, so what happened? So the puppy raffle enter raffle function loops through the players array to check for duplicates. However, the longer the puppy raffle players array is, the more checks a new player will have to make. This means the gas costs for players who enter right when the raffle starts will be dramatically lower than those who enter later. Every additional address in the players array is an additional check the loop will have to make. So a little bit verbose, but again, this is part of the process. So got the description. Next, what is the impact? Great. What is the impact? But before we go to the impact, I do want to just put a note. Technically, this actually creates another issue with front running, but we're not going to go over that in this section. We're not going to go over that in this audit, but that is something that this would also probably create. But um, in any case, let's go on to the impact. So what's the impact here? Well, the impact will be the gas costs for raffle entrance will greatly increase as more players enter the raffle, discouraging later users from entering and causing a rush at the start of a raffle to be one of the first entrants in the queue. An attacker might fill up the raffle, so they are attacker might make the puppy raffle entrance array so big that no one else enters, guaranteeing themselves the win. And again, we don't know that for sure because we haven't read the rest of the contract. But again, we're just writing it up right now. Proof of concept. We could do uh, a couple different methods here. As we've shown before, we could do just kind of a simple one. If we have two sets of 100 players enter, the gas costs will be as such. First 100 players around, what did we get here? This much gas, gas. Second 100 players around this much gas. This is more than three times more expensive for the second 100 players. And here is where we're, we might go ahead and do JavaScript. We'll go back to the puppy raffle. We will grab this loop here, paste that in, do a little at carrot thing here. Maybe do at audit DOS attack. And maybe we actually put this up here in the description. Yeah, maybe we'll put this in the description. Let's pull this up in the description here. That way the impact section is just the impact. So here's where we want to go ahead and write our proof of code. Now, here's where the private audit and competitive audit are going to be a little different. In the private audit, maybe you don't put the proof of code directly into the findings report just because it can kind of clutter it up. But in a competitive audit, you definitely put this in. But let's pretend we're we're just going to be as verbose as possible. Again, maybe we'll do details, details, summary, backslash summary, POC. And then we'll say place the following test into puppy raffle test.t.sol. 
JavaScript formatting, and we'll grab the test that we created. Boom. Paste it in here like that. Awesome. Maybe get rid of some of the clutter that we made, and then maybe we'll put the output, etc. Great. If we do a preview, let's just preview it to make sure it looks good. Yep. Does a little drop down like that. That looks very nice. Cool. Looks good so far. Finally, recommended mitigation. So how do we actually mitigate this? Well, this is kind of a difficult one because if they want to check for duplicates, but they have this array here, well, how do we actually mitigate this? Whenever we're giving a recommendation, we want to try to keep the original functionality as much as possible. So we do want to try to keep it so that we're checking for duplicates here. It would be really easy just to just be like, oh, just don't check for duplicates. And we can do that if we think it's necessary, but ideally we try to keep the functionality. So let's keep that in mind. What should we do to try to keep the functionality, even though we know that it's probably just best to be like, yeah, just get rid of that whole check thing, right? So let's let's think about this. So there are a few recommendations. Mendations. Uh, I'll, I'll add a spell checker here later. Uh, one, we could just say consider allowing duplicates. And if we are going to do this, if we are going to go back on the protocol's original functionality, we definitely need to explain why, right? Why is, why is it cool for us to change their functionality? Well, here's what I would argue. I would say users can make new wallet addresses anyways. So a duplicate check doesn't prevent the same person from entering multiple times, only the same wallet address. So maybe this is one such example here. Number two, maybe we say, okay, they're dead set on keeping this functionality. Maybe we say consider using a mapping to check for duplicates. This would allow constant time lookup of whether a user has already entered. And then here, I'm actually just gonna copy paste my diff that I've already made, just to kind of give an example here. But again, we really wanna be as verbose as possible. So maybe we'll do a diff as well, showing exactly how we would change to do it. I'll show you what this looks like. So I put a little mapping in here. I had to give like a little raffle ID and we, instead of doing this loop, we check, we just check for duplicates on this mapping of only the new players. And ideally this would prevent this attack. So cool. That's one of the recommendations we could give. And that's how we can be very explicit about the recommendation. And then maybe another recommendation I might give, I'm just going to copy paste this as well. Maybe we say alternatively, you could use open Zeppelin's enumerable library. Uh, maybe check that out. Maybe that'll help the protocol. But with that being said, we now have a write up here. It's not totally finished. We just need to give it a number, but we're pretty much good. All right, so cool. We have a finding write up. We're not going to do the write ups for all of them. You're going to do the write ups for some of them, but looks like we've identified how this enter raffle thing works. And now we know that this is actually how people pay for the raffle. It looks like the contract itself is actually going to hold value, right? And this player's array is going to get filled up. So just by seeing this too, we now know, okay, so the player's array gets filled up. Hopefully there's something that clears it. So maybe we'll put a question in here, you know, question, what resets the player's array? Um, maybe any other questions that you have, and you can come back to them later on, right? So we know how people enter the raffle. Ah, it looks like the next function is this refund function. Uh, the other thing that we're really interested in this is this select winner, but let's go ahead with the refund function first, because back in the readme, it said that was a really interesting function. Users are allowed to get a refund of their ticket and value if they call the refund function. So, okay, cool. So we have enter raffle. Let's talk about this refund function now. All right, cool. So what does this do? Okay. Player index, the index of the player to refund. You can find it externally by calling get active player index. Oh, okay. So let's actually go check out that function real quick. It's right here. Get active player index. It's an external view function, a way to get the index of a player. It puts the address of a player and it returns the index. Okay, cool. So if I want to get a refund, I need to get the index by calling this first and then putting in refund here. Okay, cool. The index of the player, uh, it returns the index of the player of the array. If they are not active, it returns zero. Wait, hold on a second. My spider senses are tingling. This seems like that's an issue. It returns zero. Well, what if the player is at index zero? Q. What if the player is at index zero? 
this is probably an attack. So we would do at audit. If the player is at index zero, it'll return zero. And a player might think they are not active. This 100% is going to be a finding in this report. Cool. So we found we already found another bug just in this get player active index. We're going to skip over writing it because it's kind of niche and very specific to this. And we've got a lot more bugs we need to cover in this. <laughs> so cool. Get active players index. Let's scroll back up. Get active players index here. This function will allow there to be blank spots in the array. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's an MEV thing here where people front run this function. So we're going to skip over it for now. OK, cool. So anyways, OK, so let's let's pretend there's no MEV. Let's pretend the active players array works great. Let's look at how this works. OK, so let's get this refund. So first it gets the player address from the player index. So if we command click on the players, yep, this is the address array. So we get the index, we get the player address. OK, cool. We require the player address equals message sender. This makes sense. We only want the player to be able to withdraw their entrance. OK, great. Require player address is not address zero. Looks like puppy raffle player already refunded or is not active. So ah, it looks like so this is probably telling us that once we delete a player, it'll return the zero address. So I guess we'll we'll see that in a second. Ah, OK, we do read that down here once it sends the value out. It says players index equals players of player index equals address zero. So we actually reset it to zero. Uh, it looks like here is where we send the value. So what is this send value thing? So payable message to sender to send value sends back the entrance fee. What is this? What is this send value thing? Well, is there a library that we're using? OK, cool. Using address for address payable. What is address? OK, this is coming from Open Zeppelin. Looks like there's a send value send value function here, which does some requires. It does kind of the classic success require. OK, cool. I'm going a little bit into the dependencies, but just wanted to make sure send value did what I wanted it to do. This send value thing is the equivalent of literally sending value to the message that sender. So and other than the MEV and the other bug that we just found, there's another issue here. See if you can spot it. And we kind of cheated because we kind of found this a little bit earlier. But let's see if you can spot it. Well, if you haven't figured it out, let's go back. Let's run Slither again on this repo and let's see what Slither gives us. Now that we've finally come across this section, if we scroll to the top of the Slither output, oh, actually not at the top. If we scroll down in here, we had this info detectors reentrancy in puppy raffle dot refund. It was yellow and we have a little link to the issue here. So this is a big reason why we want to run these tools, because this is the exact attack vector that we just found via manual review. So this represents a reentrancy attack. So what is a reentrancy attack and how does it work? Well, to explain this, we're going to be doing a little bit of drawings. And again, we're going to be going back to our SC exploits minimized. Remember, if you are in the course here, we can go back to the top. We go to resources for this course it is down here, XC exploits minimized. So we want to go back to this. I already have mine up in a different folder here. Boop. So we're going to look in here and in here again, if we have cloned this already in here, if we go to SRC, we have this reentrancy bit here and we even got some diagrams that we're going to be going through and some minimalist examples as well. So to do this, let's actually go ahead and let's look at this minimal code base first to get a good idea of what this looks like from a minimalist example. So and this was inspired by the Solidity by Example example, which is a phenomenal site if you're looking to learn more about hacks and Solidity, et cetera. So in this code base, we have this contract here called Reentrancy Victim. This is going to be our minimalist contract that we use to explain reentrancy. In here, we have two functions deposit and withdraw balance. In this contract, a user can deposit money and then a user can withdraw money. However, doing the external call in the middle of the withdraw and then changing the state leaves open a 
massive exploit for somebody to steal all the funds with this reentrancy attacker contract. I'm going to take a little screenshot of this and we're going to draw this out with some diagrams because this can be a little tricky to understand. So let me grab this, take a screenshot. And again, you can see kind of the finalized diagrams of these and the minimalist diagram of this in the diagrams example of the contract repo here. I'm going to be using this thing called Excaladraw, which allows us to do some really nice drawing and diagramming of this code base. So here is our contract here. And we're going to look at this little exploit and see exactly how this works. So in a normal scenario, we have like some random user. Let's even put some text here. So normal in a normal scenario, user A is going to call the deposit function, right? They're going to call this deposit function, and then that's going to update this user balance. So user A, they're going to go ahead, call deposit, step one, deposit. And then what's going to happen is user balance is going to be user balance of user of user A is going to be what? Whatever they deposited with. So let's say they deposit and they have value of 10. And let's make this a little bit less weird text. What do we like better? Let's do this. Normal scenario, user deposits. Now their user balance is going to be what? It's going to be 10 or 10 ether. Later on, nobody can touch this. What they'll do later is user A will do number two. At some point, they'll want to withdraw their funds. So they'll do number two here. Number two, they'll call withdraw balance. And then in the deposit, not only will the user balance go to 10, but the contract balance will be equal to 10 ether. And the user, let's say the user, say we'll start with user A starts with 10 ether. So after they deposit, user A is going to have zero ether. Let's pretend gas costs are negligible, right? So after they deposit, this is going to be their setup. Here's the user balance, the contract balance. User A is going to have no money. Then number two, they're going to go ahead and withdraw. And that's going to update the state, right? When they withdraw, they're going to grab the balance. They're going to send the money, right? They're going to send the money back to the user with message.sender.call. And then they're going to update the state. So we're going to say user balance is now going to be zero ether, right? Because we update the user balance right at the bottom to zero. Contract balance is now going to be zero because we sent it all back to the user. And the user A is going to get their 10 ether back, right? So this is kind of the normal scenario of what this is supposed to look like. That's cute and all, but but we are attackers. So let's figure out the attack vector here. So the attack vector, the normal user is going to do the same normal user stuff, right? They're going to go ahead and deposit. They're going to have 10 ether. They're going to deposit. They're going to post their money into this contract. And an attacker is going to see this function here. It's going to see that the contract is going to make an external call and then update the state. So what the attacker is going to want to do is have this external call call a contract that they picked, which is going to call withdraw balance again and re-enter the contract, hence the name re-entrancy, and then just keep sending them money and then finally update their balance to zero. So what does that look like? Well, let me go back into our SC exploits minimized. It's actually right back in here. If we scroll down, we have this contract re-entrancy attacker. I'll take a little screenshot of this pop this into our Excaladraw or pop this into here. Now we're going to change this from user A to victim A. Change this now to one victim deposits. Let's say they do five ETH, right? So this is the victim. We're going to make green for victim, green for naive or right, blue, blue, whatever. Victim deposit five ETH. Now attacker is going to call this attack function, which I'm going to explain in just a second. I'm going to make this red for attack. So down here, if we look at this attack contract, it looks pretty benign, right? So we call attack, which calls deposit, but then it just immediately withdraws, right? That seems kind of like a waste of money. So we deposit one ether, but then we immediately withdraw. What's interesting is when we call withdraw balance, it's going to come up, it's going to call withdraw balance, and then it's going to call, it's going to do message.sender.call. And remember in Solidity, if you have a receive or a callback function, it'll end up calling that receive or callback function. So it's going to call our receive function, which is going to call, you see in here, it calls victim dot withdraw balance again. So it's going to call withdraw balance again, which is going to send it back over here, which is going to send it back. It's going to go back and back and forth, back and forth until this is drained of all the monies. So let's actually write this out so we can see this a little easier. So attacker is going to call attack. So let's create a little 
little attacker person. Let's move this this over. Little one here. Let's move these two over here. This is now going to be attacker, and we're going to make them red because they're an attacker. So, so the attacker, what they're going to do is they're going to call this attack function. Boom! Attacker calls the attack function, and you know, again, after the victim deposit their five ETH, user balance equals five ETH. Right, their user balance in this mapping is going to be five ETH, and then the contract balance is going to equal five ETH because we sent the contract five ETH, and then the user is going to be you know minus five ETH, right? But they should be able to withdraw it later. Except attacker calls attack. What happens after the attacker calls attack? Well, first two A, the attacker is going to deposit one ETH, right? If we look down on the contract here, we're actually calling this normal function victim dot deposit. We're calling the regular deposit function. So the attacker is going to go ahead and deposit one ETH in here. So when they do that, you can actually get I'll do a quick balance update. User balance is going to be of the victim. It's going to be five still, right? We haven't really changed too much. The user balance of the attacker is going to be one because we sent over one. Contract balance is going to be six because we sent over six. User is still minus five. And the attacker, of course, is going to be minus one. Excuse me, I should say victim instead of user. Victim. Now what? Then two B. So we have two A. Then two B is right here. Victim dot withdraw balance. So we'll zoom up. We'll do another little. It's going to come back over here. This is going to be two B. Text here. Boop. Two B. Text here. This is going to be two A or just two, I guess. Two slash two A. And then to B, it's going to call withdraw balance. But here's the issue: when we go to withdraw balance, it's going to say balance equals user balance, which is going to be what the attacker's balance. So it's going to be one ETH, right? But then it's going to do this call right here, which is going to be message sender dot call, and it's going to call back to the message sender with the user balance of one. So what's going to happen then is this contract right here. It's going to call back to our Attacker contract. We're gonna say attacker withdraws, and we're gonna say two C in the middle of the withdraw balance of the function. The receive function is triggered, right? So it's this is two C. So it actually calls back to this receive function right here. Which this, what's gonna happen then? Well, what does this do? This just says if victim dot balance is greater than one, which right now it is. So the balance is going to be if we if we update here. So this is actually going to be 2C, and it's going to send one ETH with it, right? One ETH plus 2C because we're calling withdraw. So it's going to send the money back to us. 2C. This is going to update the balance. User balances haven't been changed yet. However, the contract balance has dropped down to five. The victims is still minus five, but the attacker has gained an ETH from being called back. So what's going to happen now? Well. Our contract, the attacker contract, has done what? Now it's going to call. It's saying if address dot victim dot balance is greater than one. Okay, the contract balance is five. It's going to call victim dot withdraw balance again. Okay, so then this is going to call withdraw balance again. So this is going to be two D contra uh, attacker re-enters contract and calls withdraw balance again. So it's going to grab the balance. And guess what it's going to do? It's going to call message us send it a call balance, and because this balance, the user balance hasn't changed, right? The attacker's balance is still one, so it's going to call. It's going to send money back down again. So this is going to go back down again. Two D, two C D E, and then it's going to be the same thing. I'm just going to copy paste this again. In the middle of the withdraw balance function, the receive function is triggered. This. To E, and you're seeing it's kind of going just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We can see what the updated balances are going to look like. The, the mappings haven't changed at all, but the contract balance has gone down to four because we just sent back another E, and the attacker balance is now up to one. And we're just going to keep doing this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until eventually the state of the contract is such because we have this little if here: if victim balance is Greater than one ether, do withdraw. But once it's zero, it's not going to call withdraw, and it's going to end. And then finally, we see here after all the reentrances happen, we're going to do user balance message us sender update to zero. So only after we steal all the money will the user balance be updated to zero. 
So once all the re-enters happen, so right, we could even just say like repeats, the user balance of the victim will still be five, right? Because we didn't update that mapping. The user balance of the attacker will finally update to zero. So the attacker will finally be zero. The contract balance will be zero because we'll have stolen all the money. The victim will be out five ether and the attacker will be up to all of the money in the contract. So this is how, this is a reentrancy attack at its simplest. We're stealing all of the money in here. Now, and I, I know there are a ton of arrows in here. This little diagram in here is a little bit simpler to see. It's the exact same thing. We're going into attack. Then we deposit some money. We call withdraw, or excuse me, we first call deposit. Then it calls withdraw. The withdraw calls the receive. The receive calls the withdraw. The withdraw calls the receive. Receive calls the withdraw. Back and forth, back and forth until all the money is stolen. And this minimalist example is just an even easier way to show what this looks like. So this is the kind of more specific example, but here's basically what this looks like at a minimalist and really any contract that looks like this. So we call a victim contract, it calls any external contract which re-enters and you just keep looping around. Now the key issue here that made this whole thing an issue is that we updated the user balance down here, right? because every time they re-enter the contract, they reset this balance variable, right? So every time this ran, the balance was always one. If this, we can delete this, was up here, if we did user balance equals zero, the next time they re-entered, since the storage was updated, the user balance here would be zero, and this would run with just zero, which would be fine and it wouldn't steal any money. So that is the kind of in-depth explanation of this attack. If we go down to the tests in here, we have reentrancy test t soul. This actually runs that exact scenario here. Where we prank a victim, we deposit, we check the balance, we finally call attack, and we see that the victim has no money and the attacker got all the money, but we can also see that directly in Remix. So if we go back to the Git repo, or you know, we go to the README in here, whichever one you wanna do, we can scroll down to reentrancy and let's look at this in Remix just so we can really feel and see what this looks like. So, okay, cool. So we have our reentrancy victim and the reentrancy attacker here that we just went over. Okay, this is the one that we just did the diagrams on. This is the one there's a test on that you can read in Foundry as well. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna compile reentrancy.sol and we're gonna deploy both of these. First, we'll deploy the reentrancy victim right? The one with the deposit and the withdraw. So let's deploy that. Okay, cool. Deposit, withdraw, user balance. Let's copy the address. Let's now deploy the attacker because the attacker needs the reentrancy victim address to call this attack function. Let's deploy it. So right now we have these two contracts. They both have zero, both have zero. Let's have a random sucker deposit five ETH in here. So we'll have, we'll go to ether, make this five. We'll scroll down, we'll call deposit. Looks like this went through and it's a little, it's a little small, but balance is now five ether over here. Transaction did go through, right? And if we look at the user balance, we'll copy this account. We scroll down, we we'll go to the user balance of that account. We see it's five ether, right? They can withdraw their balance, right? If I call withdraw, it goes to zero. User balance of this is now zero. We'll go ahead and redeposit. Like this, we'll deposit. Now it's back up to five. User balance is back up to five now. Great. Now we'll go ahead and we'll see it at work here. We have the re-entrancy attacker down here. So we're gonna pick a different address to run this. So we'll pick address two. It needs to send at least one ETH to deposit. And we're just gonna call attack. And you're gonna see this goes down to zero and this gets a whole bunch of money. So we call attack. This now has six ether and this now has zero. So we saw exactly that happen, exactly what we talked about happen uh, in Remix to exploit it. And again, if you wanna see it as a test, this is the test suite that runs the exact same thing if you want to learn more. So, okay, so how do you fix this? So there's a number of different ways that you can fix it. One of the most common is to do this thing called follow CEI or checks effects interactions. It stands for checks effects interactions. 
I don't love this name and some new patterns have come out like CEII or free pi, but this is still a good one to think about. The idea is first you run your checks, like any require statements, any conditionals, then you run your effects. Basically you update the state of your contracts and then your interactions with external contracts. So if we were to set this withdraw balance function up to follow CEI, well, okay, balance, this balance line, this isn't a check. It looks like there's no checks. This is an effect. So let's put it up here. Oh, okay. This is an interaction. So that's not going to go next. This is a state change. So this is an effect. Let's move that up. Okay, cool. This is an interaction. Let's move that up and boom. Just doing that, just following the CEI, we don't have any checks. Just by following the CEI, we should be able to avoid this issue, right? So now that I've made this change in here, let's remove these. Let's go ahead and redeploy these. So we'll deploy the reentrancy victim, copy the address. We'll deploy the attacker now, paste it in there, deploy that. Let's run through that same process. So we have a user. They're going to deposit five ether, right? Go ahead and deposit. Now they have five. All we did before was switch accounts, one ether, and call attack. And this time you'll see what happens. We call attack. And actually reverted. Well, why did it revert? Well, what ended up happening was we called the attack. So we deposited money. We immediately called withdraw, which is fine. But what happened was the withdraw call, it ended, it still ended up calling this, right? Which went back to this contract, hit the receive function. And this said, hey, if the victim address still has more than one ether, call withdraw again. It does because we only took our one ether back. So we called withdraw balance again. However, we withdrew zero because our user balance had been updated to zero. So this said, hey, you got zero balance. So we did message us, send it our call, value zero with no data. And we the transaction reverted because we didn't send any data. We didn't send any value and it went ahead and reverted. And this would have just kept going basically for forever. Uh, and there's no fallback function. There's only a receive function. And this went ahead and reverted because of that. That's how we protect against this. The, the other way to, to, to fix this outside of checks, effects, interactions would be to put some type of lock on this function. So imagine you say like bool locked equals false, and you have some type of locked variable. What you can do is you could say if right at the top, you can say if locked, then just immediately revert. Don't allow anybody in here if this is already locked. And if it's not locked, set locked to being true. And just by that, we've now locked this function from other people being able to enter this contract twice because we have this locked Boolean. And then obviously at the bottom, we'd say locked equals false. The Open Zeppelin Package Manager has this tool called Reentrancy Guard, which allows for this non-reentrant modifier, which essentially does that under the hood. So if you're looking for a professional looking one, you can use this Open Zeppelin non-reentrant modifier. So that's the other way that we can actually do this. Now, one of the reasons that we're spending so much time on reentrancy is if we go back to the GitHub repo associated with this course, and we go to what is a smart contract audit, we scroll down. This is that photo that we showed you towards the beginning of the course, where reentrancy was still one of the top 10 DeFi attacks of the first half of 2023. And I have the updated figure, I haven't put it on GitHub yet. These reentrancy numbers have just gone up. More people have still gotten hit by reentrancies. It is still a common attack vector and is still stealing millions of dollars out of Web3. One of the most frustrating parts about this is what? One of the issues with this is that this, if we go back to the puppy raffle, we run the Slither tool. We have the output here. Slither actually caught it. So they said, hey, there's a reentrancy in puppy raffle. You might want to change that, buddy. This is a very well-known issue and static analysis tools are fantastic at getting them. The other thing that's crazy about this is you scroll back down to section four for the puppy raffle. We've got some links for this. You can look at the case study, the DAO hack. We can click this link that says still plagues us today. Here's a Git repo from this guy, Pascal, who's just an absolute legend. And it's just a historical collection of reentrancy attacks. These aren't even all of them. It looks like the last time he updated it was oh, 11 hours ago. Oh, goodness. This started all the way back in June 2016. And if we scroll down, the most recent one was, I'm recording this October 22nd. The most recent one was today. As I'm recording this, a reentrancy hack just occurred. 
So these are quite common, unfortunately, but we've been seeing these for a long, long time. The most notorious one, one of the hacks in history was that was absolutely wild was the Dow hack. And we can click on this link here to learn more about the Dow hack. Now, when it comes to historical attacks, we definitely want to be studying these. If these hacks are happening in real life, and if these hacks have happened in the past, we as security professionals need to know about them and we need to know how to protect against them. The Dow hack was one of the most notorious hacks of all time. This should be a hack that you study and you know and you understand. So a little bit of a case study here. So the Dow was this absolutely massive, one of the biggest protocols in Ethereum's history. And if you even look up the Dow, or Wikipedia. It had its own page on Wikipedia called The Dow. It was like the thing when Ethereum was first launching. I think it's at some point it had like 9% of all ETH or something like that. Okay, yeah, as of May 2016, the Dow had attracted nearly 14% of all Ether tokens issued to date. So imagine that today. 14% of all Ether was locked in this Dow protocol and it had this massive bug. So this was a big deal had a number of issues, but let's look at just one here. Withdraw reward form, where it does some stuff. It does some checks here. It checks the reward. And if there is a reward, pay out and then update the state. So right here, we have an issue, right? What are we doing? We're making an external call and then updating the state of the contract. Split DAO function as well. You scroll down in here. We do a transfer up here, and then we update a bunch of state variables here, right? So it's just clearly not following best practices. And ultimately, that at the end of the day is what caused the issue. If you want to take some more time to go through this, highly recommend it. And if you want to go take some time to look through some of these attacks, you can absolutely go for it. They are going to be some derivative of what we just showed you. So we just learned a ton about attacks. We just learned a ton about reentrancy. The reason we're harping on this so much is because, like I said, it still plagues us today, which is insane. There are newer types of reentrancy coming out, like this thing called read-only reentrancy, but at the end of the day, a reentrancy is reentrancy. If you make an external call that can re-enter the same function before you update some state, you are going to get hit by this. So let's do a quick refresher of just this reentrancy attack because we learned a ton. So a reentrancy attack at its minimalist looks like this: you have an attacker calls a victim contract, which calls some external contract which calls back to the victim contract and it just keeps going. And the main issue that allows it to keep re-entering the same contract is because you call this external contract before you change some state. So we have a more advanced diagram which says, hey, we call the victim, the victim deposits, the attacker attacks, which ends up calling back to the attack contract, which calls withdraw again, which calls back to the attack contract, which calls withdraw again. And we keep doing that because we only update state at the last second, as opposed to doing it before we do an external call. We learned that this is a very common attack vector and it's very easy to reproduce and see exactly what it looks like, right? We learned we can do this test. We can learn we can run tests for this. We can learn we can simulate this in Remix. We learned that this is very easy to see. We learned that static analysis tools like Slither will actually catch this issue for us which is why static analysis tools are so important. If we screw up as manual auditors, Slither or some other static analysis tool can catch this. Just make sure the static analysis tool you're using is powerful enough to catch a reentrancy issue. We learned of two different ways to defend against this attack. We learned we can do checks, effects, interactions. So we'll do the state change before we do any external calls, or we can use something like a non-reentrant modifier. If we're using Open Zeppelin's non-reentrant modifier, or we can do some type of modifier where we do like if locked, et cetera. This is also known as a mutex lock in computer science. And then finally, we learned that this still plagues us today. We've learned about this repo managed by Pascal and friends. And it's this horrifying running list of all these reentrancy attacks that unfortunately keep happening all the way back to June of 2016 with the Dow hack which had 14% of all ETH in existence. This has been happening for a long time. We know how to detect against this. We know how to prevent against this. And now you do. And now you will never miss a reentrancy attack ever again. Really important attack. Glad you got it. Let's go back to Puppy Raffle. Let's take a note of this. We're definitely including this in our write-up. 
So back down in this refund here, we're definitely saying, ah, audit re-entrancy. And we can see in this puppy raffle refund function, this looks pr like pretty classic re-entrancy, right? We are making an external call before we update state. The attack vector is going to be the exact same. So we're going to, this will enable an attacker to steal all the money out of this contract from other players. So let's take some time real quick to write the proof of code for this and we can finally wrap up re-entrancy. Okay, so we have this puppy raffle, test.t.sol. We can use the existing refund test that they have to run this exploit. So we have this test can get refund. Let's call, let's copy paste this. Let's scroll to the bottom and let's refactor this test for our own purposes to prove this puppy raffle is not very safe. So down here, we'll call this test reentrancy refund, refund. Cool. Looks like it has this modifier player entered mm, for us. Let's just copy paste it and not even use the modifier, but you can use the modifier if you want. Let's see what this is doing. So, okay, cool. So it says address array players equals new address one. Instead of just doing one player, let's do a whole bunch of players. And I believe there's actually a players entered. Yep. Cool. Let's copy this instead. So what this is going to do, it's going to get create an array of four players, one, two, three, four. And we're going to enter this raffle, puppy raffle dot enter raffle with entrance fee times four with the players. So we're going to enter four players into this raffle here. Let's delete all this stuff here. So I said we were going to reuse it and then we're just not. <laughs> we are going to need a an attack contract to do this. We're going to want to send value to our contract, which will trigger our fallback or receive function to re-enter the contract. So let's create a contract, trans C attacker, and we'll model this off of what we were doing before. So we're going to need a puppy raffle, puppy raffle contract. We're going to need a UNT 256 entrance fee, UNT 256 attacker index, and you'll see why we need those in a second. Constructor, say address. Actually, we can just do puppy raffle underscore puppy raffle. And we'll say puppy raffle equals puppy raffle. Entrance fee is going to be puppy raffle dot entrance fee because puppy raffle entrance fee is a public variable. So we can just call entrance fee to get the entrance fee. Now we're going to want to figure out how to do this attack. So we're going to say function. Oh, it looks like ChatGPT even wants to get in on the action. Function attack. This will be external. We're going to be sending some ETH. So we'll make this payable. Address array memory players equals new address array one. We're only going to do it with one player. Players of zero equals address this. We're going to call ent enter raffle ourselves. Puppy raffle dot enter raffle. ChatGPT, thank you. And then we're going to say right after we enter, we're going to get our index and we're going to get a refund. So we'll say attacker index. And this is why we need the attacker index equals puppy raffle dot get active player index address this. And then we're going to say puppy raffle dot refund with our index. And this, of course, is going to kick off the attack. So we're going to enter the raffle first, then we're going to call refund the refund function function refund. The refund function is going to call back to us. And that's where we're going to just keep calling refund until we steal all the money. And in order for us to do that, we're going to need our fallback or receive function. I'm just going to say fallback. We're going to say external payable. And this is where we just say if address of the, yeah, of the puppy raffle dot balance is greater than or equal to the entrance fee, then we're going to steal all the monies by just continuing to refund puppy raffle this uh, and it's going to complain it's going to say hey you should do a, a receive address too yeah okay we'll do receive external payable and let's just create a function steal money internal like this and just do boom both of these are just going to call steal money so that it doesn't matter if it hits the fallback or the receive function so, okay, so we have our attack contract now. We're gonna call attack, we're gonna call refund. Refund's gonna call back to our fallback or receive function. 
We're just going to call steal steal money. We're just going to call refund. We're just going to call back to us. We're just going to call refund. We're just call, and we're going to steal all the money. So we have these four players who entered in the lottery in our example here. We're going to create a new attacker. So we're going to say re-en, re-enter the attacker. Let's say attacker contract equals new re-enter the attacker with the puppy raffle. We're going to do vm dot deal. Uh, let's create a new user. A new user. We'll say address attack user equals make address attack user. We're going to vm dot deal attack user one ether. This is how you give our attacker user some money. And now we're going to get some starting balances. We're going to say unit 56 starting attacker balance or attacker attack contract balance equals address attacker contract dot balance unit 56 starting contract balance equals address puppy raffle balance. And then we're going to run the attack. So vm dot prank attack user. We're going to run attacker contract attack value is going to be entrance fee like so. Then we can do a little console dot log starting attacker contract balance. Thank you, ChatGPT. Console dot log starting contract balance. And then we can do console dot log ending attacker contract balance. And thank you, ChatGPT ending contract balance. We'll see if this works. Zoom out a little bit. This is what our POC, our proof of code looks like. We'll run this forge test dash dash MT paste it in there dash VVV so we can see the console dot logs. Starting attacker contract balance zero starting contract balance four ending attacker contract balance five ending contract balance zero. We have successfully written a POC for reentrancy on this puppy raffle. This is definitely going to be a high. That's definitely an issue. And we're definitely going to write this up. All right. Huge congratulations. You have now learned to protect at least from the number nine and number 10 attack vector of the DeFi world. You should be incredibly proud of yourself. Just by getting this far, you've learned a absolute ton. Be really proud. This is a this is a big hack. This is a common hack. And we are leveling you way up. So let us continue. Let's go back to the puppy raffle and let's continue our audit. So we found a re-entrancy issue here. Fantastic. Now, we are going to get back to Slither in just a minute because there were a ton of notifications in there that we still haven't checked out. But let's keep going across this manual audit, this manual re review, and then we'll come back to Slither in a little bit. All right, great. So we just reviewed the refund function. We've gone through the enter raffle function. Let's keep going. So we understand some more functionality of how the puppy raffle actually works. So we went over the get active player one, and it looks like we found probably an informational where there's this issue down here. Maybe it's a low because somebody might think their active player index is zero, but we found another issue here. All right, and now we have the select winner function. This is a big function. So there's going to be a lot for us to review in here. So what does this function do? Well, it's called select winner. So at least this is easy to read. This function will select a winner and mint a puppy. So based off of what we know of the code base so far, we know people will enter the raffle, they'll go into this players array. So we're going to assume probably hopefully this select winner is going to pick a winner out of that players array, it's going to pick one of the players and hopefully do it fairly. So okay, Looks like we have some checks at the top, which is really nice. Maybe we do a little Q. Does this follow CEI? Is this following checks effects interactions? Well, we're doing some checks at the top. Great. Now that we know about reentrancy, we can even scroll down, just kind of peek. Uh, okay, it looks like it's probably calling I, except for here, looks like it's doing a call and then calling safe mint. Uh, I'm not really sure what safe mint does yet, so maybe we'll come back to it. So that looks like that could be wrong. Okay, well, anyways, so uh, there must be at least four players and the duration has occurred. Okay, so it looks like there's this raffle duration. Where is that? Com I'm going to command click. It's going to bring me to this top. Okay, it looks like there's this raffle duration. I'm going to do a command find. We're going to look for that. Okay, it looks like the constructor actually sets this raffle duration. So 
looks like in once this is deployed somebody adds this raffle duration i'm going to go back back okay so there's so we're requiring the block that timestamp is greater than or equal to the raffle start time plus the raffle duration what's this raffle start time okay it looks like the instant this contract is deployed the raffle start time is the instant it's deployed I'm assuming it'll get updated every single time the raffle restarts. So, and as you can see, we're, we're taking lots of mentally taking a lot of notes here, but because I'm really familiar with the protocol and I'm cheating a little bit, but this is where you, you might be wanting to take more notes. Okay. You might be like select winner. Oops. Picks the winner. There is a raffle duration. Or again, you know, maybe you click this, you command, you go up to raffle duration, be like, uh, E, how long the raffle lasts, or, you know, whatever you want to do there. Okay, cool. So it looks like raffle start time plus raffle duration. I'll have to double check that those are actually getting set correct. Maybe I'll put a question in here. Question, are the duration and start time being set correctly? Come back to that question. Uh, okay, cool. And then we have players.length is greater than e to four. So we need at least four players. It looks like anybody can call this. It's an external function. That's cool. So anybody can. So since anybody can call this, these checks are going to be really important. They look pretty good to me. Raffle has to be over. Need to be at least four players. Okay, cool. And then, oh, what's this? Winner index equals this weird Kachak ABI and code pack message sender block timestamp and block difficulty modded by the players length. So we're getting kind of this pseudo random number and we're modding by the player's length to get the winner index. Uh -huh. To me, this sticks out like a sore thumb because I've been doing this a long time and anytime I see something like this, I get a little bit nervous. So it looks like we're taking this winner index, we're using it on the players array to pick out the winner. And it looks like we're doing a little bit of math here. Okay, winner. Uh, do we send the winner money previous winner equals winner and we sure do we send that winner the money so it looks like we're picking a winner using this method here to select a random winner but the question is is this actually random and this brings us to our next exploit the weak randomness exploit so hint hint here we do a little slither dot i'll zoom in Guess what? Slither catches this as well. So if you scroll up to the top, let's see. Info detectors, puppy raffle.select winner uses a weak PRNG or a weak pseudo random number generator. And we can actually read more about this if we copy this link from Slither, paste it in. And we can see this weak PRNG, severity is high, confidence is medium. We can see a minimalist example in the documentation of Slither, and it looks like it's saying weak PRNG due to a module on block timestamp, now or block hash. These can be influenced by miners to some extent, so they should be avoided. So miners can actually influence these, but it's, it's not just this. There's actually a lot more weirdness that goes into random numbers. And obviously, if you've watched any of my other tutorials, you know that Chainlink VRF is a solution for this, but let's go back over. If you're unfamiliar with this, let's go back over to this, to the SC exploits minimized. Remember, if you go back to the repo associated with this course or Cypher and Updraft, when we scroll down to the welcome to the course, we have the resources section. If you scroll down to curriculum, nope, oh, no, not curriculum. Welcome to the course, nope, not there. Review, nope, not there. Section two, okay, nope, not there either. Where, Where is this? Okay, we're gonna go to resource, introduction, resources, and prerequisites. It's gonna be resources. Scroll down to SC Exploits Minimized. If we scroll all the way down, we have this weak randomness that we can work with. And we can open this up in Remix, or we can go right to the folder. Again, we go to SRC, weak randomness. We've even got some diagrams we'll go through, weak randomness, that's all. So if we're in Remix here, this is what we're looking at. And basically we have this contract weak randomness, and we have this function get random number. So external view returns you in 256. And we're doing something similar to what Puppy Raffle is doing. We're doing this abi.encode packed message sender block.prevrando or block.difficulty block.timestamp. So what this does is we're basically mashing these up, we're hashing them, and then we're 
wrapping them as a uint 256. So it's the combination of these three values that gets us. But these three values are actually very manipulatable. We can actually either influence these directly or anticipate them and know what this random number is. So uh, I'm actually not going to run the test suite here. But if you go to the weak randomness test and we scroll down, we actually see we have this test guess random number, which looks kind of like a silly test. We have random number equals weak randomness dot get random number. And then we just do assert equal random number equals weak randomness dot get random number. We've actually seen exploits in the past where people will either mine or they'll anticipate or, or they'll do something to anticipate a random number. And if you use the exact same random number in the same block, well, that's an issue right there. But there's actually a lot of a lot of weird gotchas with randomness, including, you know, what the Slither tool said, which is miners can influence them. So if we go to the diagrams in this repo, this is the diagram and I'm actually going to pull it up in my repo here. Boom. And so we're pointing to those three things here, message sender, block.programdo and block.timestamp. So first off, this block.timestamp bit. So we have some notes here. Validator node issues. Don't trust the miners. So validators selected to send a transaction could actually do a few things, right? If they get this transaction, if a miner gets this transaction and they don't like the timestamp, they could hold on to it, this transaction, until they get a favorable timestamp. Also, till they get a favorable preferendo, to be honest. They could reject the transaction because the timestamp isn't favorable. Now, them actually manipulating the timestamp has gotten a lot more difficult with the merge. However, there are still things that they can do to mess with this. And on other blocks, on other EVM chains that are non ETH, oftentimes the miners still have the power to adjust this value, adjust the block to timestamp by like a couple of seconds. And maybe that's all they need to break your contract or get the random number that they want. Next, we have this block.prev rando. This is a bit of solidity that came in to replace block.difficulty. So when the merge came out, they started using kind of this random system to pick validators. And so they have block.prev rando instead of block.difficulty. If you go to the actual EIP, EIP 4399, they talk about a whole lot of security considerations, including randomness. So here's the EIP here. We'll, this is the suppliant difficulty opcode with prev randau. If we scroll down to security, they actually talk a lot about this. So there's some security considerations. Number one, there's biasability. There is a little bit of bias that they are allowed to get one bit of influence power per slot. Somebody could refuse a slot and lose the opportunity cost because they don't like the random number. This is obviously predictable because this is a previous random number, so it's not a real random number. So there's a lot of issues that can happen with this, and there's a lot of biasability and, and tweaking of this prev rando thing. So it's kind of a weak bit of security here. If we can't avoid it, we should. And then finally, we have this bit here about message.sender. If the randomness is generated from any field controlled by the caller, they can manipulate that field. So the message.sender obviously is an address, but if you're using message.sender to hash it here, a caller could mine for addresses until they find one that gets them the random number that they want. So this is still weak randomness. And this all makes sense to us, right? The blockchain is a deterministic system. So if we look for a random number inside of the blockchain, we're going to find a deterministic number. So it's really bad practice to use this as a form of randomness. There's all types of ways to attack him, and we want to avoid this at all costs. So this isn't something that we want to do here. And you can play with this in the in Remix. You can play with this in the SC Exploits Minimize repo to play with this some more. But let's go back to our puppy raffle, and let's call this out. Audit randomness. But this is something that we obviously want to avoid. Now we're going to go through another case study, a real live scenario where a real weak randomness exploit was caught and exploited in the wild, costing a protocol a little bit shy of a million dollars. A few years ago, back in 2021, there was an NFT project called Mebix, and we have our guest lecturer, Andy Lee from Sigma Prime and fellow YouTuber here to explain that exploit, how it happened and do a case study on the Mebix exploit. Remember, doing these historical analyses, doing these postmortems is going to make you a better security researcher. When you see these attacks, you really want to dig into them to see how these worked in the wild, to see exactly, oh, how did this happen? How do we prevent this? And what did the code look like so I can spot it hopefully in the future as well? 
To go through that, we have Andy Lee from Sigma Prime to go over this weak randomness case study and talk to us more about exactly what happened, exactly how to fix it, and exactly what went down. So take it away, Andy. Let's take a look at a practical example of insecure randomness in smart contracts. The MeBits NFT was exploited in 2021, which resulted in the attacker obtaining a rare NFT by re-rolling their randomness. MeBits was created by Lava Labs, which was the team behind CryptoPunks, and the premise behind it was that any user who owned a CryptoPunk was able to mint a free MeBit NFT. Now, the attributes of this freely minted NFT was supposed to be random, so certain traits were more valuable than others. But unfortunately, the randomness that was generated was exploitable, which allowed the attacker to repeatedly re-roll their mint until they received the rare NFT that they wanted. Taking a look at how the attack happened, it needed a couple of steps. So the first step was the attacker was able to find out the metadata which showed which traits were valuable compared to the other traits that were available. Another factor was the insecure randomness that was generated from the smart contract which allowed the attacker to repeatedly re-roll their mint until they received the one that they wanted to get. So if we take a look at the metadata disclosure in the contract on line 129 there's a string to the IPFS hash and visiting this IPFS hash we can see there is a JSON blob which already you can see from this comment here that it did disclose which kinds were the rarest type of mebits which with the rarest being dissected visitor skeleton robot elephant pig and human in decreasing order of rarity more information around the rarity of the meba nft could also be found on the mebits website which you can see from the token url function all you needed to do was input your token id and you would be able to see the specific trait that the mebit had so for example on token 16647 you can see the trait type as a visitor which is the second rarest amongst all the traits so taking a look at the mint function, there is an external function in the contract called mint with punk or glyph. It's a external function, so anyone can call this, but it will do a check to see that you are either the owner of a crypto punk or you're an owner of the glyph. If you are the owner of any of these two NFTs, you are able to mint a free nft by calling this particular function in the contract and next calls this internal mint function which assigns a random index to the id and finally this random index is assigned to the owner which called the function to mint the meba nft to see why this was exploitable we have to look at the attack contract and its transactions so we can see on Etherscan that the attacker deployed a contract and repeatedly called a function on the attack contract until it succeeded in minting the NFT that they wanted. Here you can see that there are a lot of failed transactions here. So digging in, we can have a look at the attack contract and what exactly it was doing. Clicking the contract tab on the attack contract, you can see that this is just a blob of a bytecode, unlike the MeBits contract, which was verified. So we can't actually see what is this code doing. But fortunately, we can put this bytecode into a, a bytecode decompiler. So you can see in this attack function that the contract calls mint with punk or glyph. But it has this assert statement here, which would revert the transaction if the MeBit random index wasn't the one that the attacker wanted to receive. So for example, if we look at the transaction details of one of these reverted transactions, you can see that this reverted due to bad instruction, which was because of that assert statement. We can actually paste that particular transaction into Tenderly, which would give you the trace of exactly what happened during that transaction. Here you can see that the attacker calls mint with punk or glyph. 
it goes through and assigns the random index 17145 which is not the amoeba that the attacker wanted to have so it simply reverts on the final line and the transaction never goes through so basically the attacker can just call this attack function over and over again and if it wasn't the amoeba that they wanted to target the transaction would revert and they could simply try again so after six hours of repeated calls where the attacker used thousands and thousands of dollars of gas rare amoeba 11647 was minted which was the visitor trait all right thank you so much andy for that so how do we fix this so pretty much getting a random number off chain is going to be an issue for us and a way we can fix this is we can use something like chain like vrf a commit reveal scheme etc we don't want to use block hash chat gpt commit reveal scheme but right now the most popular by far is going to be Chainlink vrf which is a verifiable random number generator so we want to use some type of verifiable random number generator and it's probably going to have to come from off chain in some capacity which can be a little scary but Chainlink vrf luckily has some guarantees has some cryptographic guarantees that mathematically enforces the number actually is random so if you're unfamiliar with Chainlink vrf you can go obviously go to docs.chain.link I'm not going to go over it here because I did go over it in my foundry course if you're unfamiliar highly recommend you check it out but if we scroll down go to the overview for Chainlink vrf all the docs are in here for you to learn how to use it all right we found another bug and obviously we're, we were, we're going to do a write-up on this at the end but if you want to try to do a write-up on this right now you can absolutely do so and we have barely started going down the select winner function so let's keep going because there's definitely more here all right cool so we have a bad randomness here we change that with chain leaf vrf great so we're going to get a random number we get a random number from some other method in the future get the winner okay total amount collected equals players dot length times the entrance fee so maybe i'll ask a question why not just do i'll put this address this dot balance you know maybe there's a, a rationale for that and then we're going to say okay prize pool equals total amount collected times 80 divided by 100. so this looks like something that this isn't in the docs and this is a question we would probably ask the team is the 80 percent correct it looks like they're probably saying the prize pool is going to be 80 percent of the money and the fee is going to be the final 20 percent here hmm I bet there's some arithmetic error here but we can come back to that in a little bit so price pool looks like the fee here okay maybe maybe a little bit of loss of precision we'll talk about that later and then okay what's this so we're saying total fees equals total fees plus casting uh well that's kind of weird so what is what is this fee so fee goes unit 56 this times this okay well what is total fees total fees is a unit 64 huh where is total fees so total fees is updated here looks like total fees is going to be updated in withdraw fees okay so this is so maybe i'll do a little explaining here so this is the total fees the owner should be able to collect but what is this weird casting here here's again where my my radar is going off i see this and i get really nervous this doesn't look safe to me so total fees is a UNT64. So I could see this from a mile away at audit overflow. And this is a pretty classic error that you're gonna see a lot less in the wild because of newer versions of Solidity don't allow this. But let's head on over to that smart contract exploits repo to understand a minimal version of this overflow functionality here. So we're over here, we can go to SRC, arithmetic, and there's actually a number of different arithmetic errors in here. We have overflow, underflow, and precision loss. So let's start with overflow here. If we just look at this, we have a uint8 public count, and we have this increment function with this weird unchecked thing here. So the notes say uint8 has a max value of 255. So if we add one to 255, we get zero if it's unchecked. Versions prior to 0 0.8 of Solidity also have this issue. So we go back to sc exploits minimize let's scroll down let's go play with this in remix because this remix is one of the easiest ways for us to to see this easily so we'll select remix this will open up this example for us here 
And let's just go ahead, we'll compile this contract. We have our contract here. We're gonna scroll down. We're gonna go ahead and deploy this. And great, we have this increment and count function here. Looks pretty straightforward. We have this uint8 public count variable. We see some notes here. uint8 has a max value of 255. So if we add one to 255, we will get zero. If it's unchecked, versions prior to 0 0.8 facility also have this issue. So if you reach the max value of a uint and it's unchecked or it's an older version of Solidity, it'll actually wrap back around to the beginning. So we can actually really easily see this. If we scroll down, counts at zero. If I add one, counts at one. Let's add five, right? What should the count be now? Of course, it's six. If we add four, now it's gonna be 10. What if I add 255? What do you think the count will be now? Well, 255 plus 10, right? 265, right? It's actually nine because 255 plus 10, like we said, is going to be 265, but that wraps around to nine. So if it's nine and we do 245 increment, we're at 254, let's add one. We're now at 255, let's add one again, now we're at zero. So this is a pretty big issue and there's a lot of different arithmetic issues. One way we could save this is we could just remove those unchecked wrappers right there. there. And now if we compile this, delete this, deploy this. Now what'll happen, let's say we had 255 here, increment, where I count. Now, if I try to increment by just one, it's gonna fail. So count will stay at 255, we won't be able to increment, and we do not have the wrapped issue anymore. So technically, this is always gonna be an issue for uint 256s, but most of the time we consider hitting the max of a uint 256 as computationally infeasible. Asterisk there, because it's just most of the time. There might be a scenario where somebody wants to use a billion decimal places for an ERC-20 and you might actually hit that limit. But this is an example of an overflow arithmetic issue and one way we can actually fix it. Now, the same thing works with underflow, and down here we even have an example of arithmetic precision loss. When you do division in Solidity, if you wanted to divide 255 by, or 225 divided by four, in regular life, you get 56.25. However, what do you think we get in Solidity life? Compile, let's deploy precision loss. Down here, users four, share money 56. Money split is 255. Share money is 56 instead of 56.25. So we've lost some precision here. So, so you always wanna be very aware when we, you do any type of divisions because you can lose some precision. And you will see examples of that in the wild. Now the tricky part here is trying to figure out the impact because maybe ah, point, nobody cares about the 0.25. Maybe people do care about the 0.25. This is where again, it's on you to prove the impact of some of these precision losses. But in any case, so we have figured out that this probably overflows. And you guessed it, we should write a proof of code to prove that this actually exists. Now for this one, I'm not gonna walk through doing the proof of codes because this one's pretty straightforward. A, look, it just overflowed. However, again, I do recommend you pause the video right now, try to write a proof of code to prove that this will overflow if you do something wrong. And then once you're done doing that, of course, let me collapse some of these. You can go back to the repo system with the section, switch to the audit data. And in here, if you go to audit data, there's an audit test with all the answers in here. Proof of codes.t.sol. So you can compare your proof of code to my proof of code. All right, we found another finding. We are cooking. We're finding bugs all over the place. If we were doing a competitive audit, we'd be killing it right now. All right, cool. Let's keep going. So some fixes for this. Fixes for this are gonna be what? Newer version of Solidity, so you don't get that oh, that unchecked stuff. And we probably don't wanna use a UN256. I'm gonna say bigger UNs. And there's a number of different fixes for different arithmetic issues. Looks like this one, we probably would say, hey, use a newer version of Solidity, and what, what are you using a UN64 for? Don't do that, that's silly. And what we can do too is just to check, we could do like chisel, which is comes with your foundry. And to see the biggest uint64, we could do type uint64. 
64.max. We could see if this is a realistic number that would ever have to wrap, right? So if I look at this, and I know there's 18 decimals in, in one ether. Okay, it'd be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If this protocol makes more than 18 ETH of fees, it's going to wrap and have an issue. So this is definitely an issue. We should definitely write this up. Cool. Okay, cool. So we figured out there's this overflow issue here. But I'm looking at this, and I just we just learned something really interesting, right? When we pull up our terminal, we pull up our wonderful little chisel. If we do type, you went 64.max. This is the max value that we get, right? And if we grab this, paste it in here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this is going to be the maximum value for you in 64. But what happens if we collected 20 ETH of fees? What, uh, what happens there? Well, let's pull up the code base. So let's do uint 64, my 64 uint equals uint 64, excuse me, type uint64.max. So now we have this. Zoom in a little bit. Okay, cool. We have the max value here. Now, if we have a uint 256, 20 ETH equals 20. E18. Now we can see 20 ETH. Now we can see what 20 ETH looks like. Okay, great. What if we try to cast our 20 ETH as a UN64? What happens like that? So let's say my 64 UN equals UN64 20 ETH. Uh oh. What's this number? Is that right? Paste it again. Uh oh. Let me copy that. Let's drop that over here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. What the heck? It's now 1.5. So this was a uint 256, but when we casted it as a uint 64, it actually truncated a lot of the values. If we open up our little calculator here, we can see if we take the 20 minus this number, the max uint 64, you see that's the exact number that we get. Because again, we wrapped around. This was an unsafe casting of this variable. So this is going to be an additional finding. Not only do we have an overflow issue, but we have an unsafe casting. You can't just take a UNT 256 and cast it as a UNT 64. UNT 64 is so small. So we're definitely calling this out in our audit report. Audit. Unsafe cast of UNT 64 of UNT. 256 to uint 64. Whew. They're going to lose a ton of fees. If this protocol is incredibly profitable, which we're assuming they want it to be, they're going to lose a ton of fees with this line of code here. So this line of code is causing a ton of damage to this code base. So we are definitely going to make sure we include these in the audit report. Badass. Okay, great. All right, so we found two big issues in this select winner. Oh, crap. Oh, we do have some documentation here. Oh, sorry, my bad. We use hash of on-chain data to generate random numbers. Yeah, that's bad. We reset the active players array after the winner is selected. Okay, good. We sent 80% of the funds to the winner and the other 20% goes to the fee address. Okay, cool. Well, we found a second big bug, <laughs> which is great. Okay, next, token ID equals total supply. So what is this? So we might command click total supply, command click total supply. Oh, it looks like that not working. So maybe I'll look for function total supply in my project. Looks like there's a lot of it. Uh, if we scroll to the top, what is this? Puppy raffles ERC721. Okay, so it's probably coming from here. Okay, it sure is. So and it's returning this token owners dot length. Okay, so it's like the number of token owners. Okay, I'm pretty familiar with ERC721 and you definitely should be as well. Total supply is a pretty common function. So we're going to get the token ID from the total supply. So this is basically E when we mint a new puppy NFT, we use the total supply as the token ID and question, where do we increment the ID slash total supply? We want to make sure that happens so that this token ID doesn't get reused. Okay. So then we do this rarity thing 
We use a different RNG calculate from the winner index to determine rarity. So this is going to be the same issue, obviously, right? At audit randomness. So it looks like they're using message sender and blocked at difficulty to figure out the ra rarity. So again, it's going to be no good. Going to be real, pretty much the same write up. So we found another bug. Awesome work. Let's keep going. Okay. So it looks like it's doing this. If rarity, so we're saying this rarity is a random number. If rarity is less than common rarity. Okay. And so we're modding it with 100. So 100 is kind of the precision. Common rarity is what? Okay. So 70, rare rarity is 25. Legendary rarity is five. So it looks like, okay, we're, we're checking if the rarity is less than 70, we're going to give this token ID to rarity of common rarity. So what's common rarity? Oh, 70. Okay. If the rarity is less than common rarity plus rare rarity, we're going to give it a rare else. It's going to be legendary. Okay, cool. So this is how they figure out the rarity of the puppy. Got it. <clears throat> we're going to delete the players array. So this is it. So a little, little E here, resetting the players array. Cool. Raffle start time. Okay, awesome. Okay, this is a question we asked before. This is going to be resetting the raffle start time. Previous winner. Is this used anywhere? Previous winner? No, it looks like it's just a public variable. So this is kind of like a vanity thing. E, vanity, doesn't matter much. And then finally, we're doing this, which we might even do at audit possible reentrancy again, which again, this would be super easy to fix. We would just pop this safe mint up here, but they didn't do that. And it looks like this is where they send the prize pool and they make sure it actually went through and then they're doing the safe mint. So this is definitely a possible reentrancy. It looks like this select winner function needs to be called in order for the player's array to be reset and the raffle start time to be reset. These are really important. If the player's array couldn't be reset and the raffle start time couldn't be reset, we could potentially be stuck. We would never be able to finish a lottery. Okay, so we have audit possible reentrancy here. Hmm, let's even do a quick thing about this. Maybe we'll write a POC later. I think, okay, so we would call, the winner would call. Let's say they wanted to re-enter the function. Oh, okay, we do have this require up here. Require the block to timestamp is greater than raffle start time, raffle duration. Do we update that? We do. Okay, so we do update the raffle start time. So this probably would revert if they re-entered because of this line. Okay, cool. So this line looks like it's probably protecting us from re-entrancy. So maybe we'll just do Q. Can we re-enter somewhere? Looks like it's probably fine here. This does get me thinking. And again, this is going back to the principle we were talking about before. What's going to make you a really good security researcher is just the more you do these, the more you look at code, you hunt for bugs, the better your BS meter is going to get, the better your sniffer, your bug sniffer is going to get. So I see this and my bug sniffer is starting to go off. I did all these state changes up here and then we're going to send some money. Now, remember, when we send money, we essentially could be calling another function. If this winner is a smart contract, that means we're calling the receive function of this contract. So we should make sure we're not calling and doing some weird stuff here. And it does get me to think. So if we pull back open that SC exploits minimized folder, I'm going to do a git pull because I recently made some updates. But if we go back in here, back in our reentrancy bit, it was this message.sender.call that allowed the reentrancy, right? So when we called withdraw balance, we ended up calling the message.sender and the message.sender was this reentrancy attacker. And what they did with their receive or their fallback was they called withdraw balance. So what if the winner just says, oh, I've got a receive with just a pure revert in it. And the reason my brain starts thinking in that direction is because anytime I see something like this, those are the questions that I want to start asking. Those are the things that I've seen in the past and I've started to build my arsenal on attacks. The more you do this, the better you'll get at sniffing out these issues. So I see this and I go, oh, what if the winner is a smart contract? Will this revert? Well, then they wouldn't win the money and this whole transaction would fail. So that's pretty interesting. So is that a bug? Do I want to report that? Or maybe they accidentally had their fallback messed up. This transaction would fail. Picking a winner could actually get really hard. So we probably do want to record this as an issue. We'll figure out exactly how bad that is and exactly where it falls a little bit later. Like I said, we're just kind of going through this recon right now. Yes, we did the write-up for the DOS, but that was just to 
you know, give you some more practice for writing DOS. So we have another issue potentially down here. It looks like there might have been a reentry issue here, but it looks like it's probably protected from by this require up top before the safe mint actually hits. So that's probably fine. Probably. Maybe you can look into it more and check it out. So the select winner thing is probably an issue. And this whole thing actually is making me think there's another issue with select winner. And yeah, there's a lot of issues in here. Let's go back to where it picks the winner here, right? So we pick the winner with this randomness here. If our transaction picks a winner and we don't like it, do we just revert? This kind of feels like it would turn into a little bit of a gas war. So maybe this is something we come back to. Maybe we'll do a little Q here, a little Q here. Maybe we'll do a dash dash like follow up or something or at follow up just to make absolutely sure I follow up on this. So these are just some of the more questions that I'm thinking about. But in any case, we've done a pretty thorough walkthrough of select winner. Let's keep going. And as always, there may be more bugs in here than we actually go over. And I will likely add more bugs to the final audit report in the audit data branch as we find more bugs. So, OK, cool. So that is how we select the winner. Great. What else? OK, so there's withdraw fees. Nice. We've got a change fee address. And we have some NFT stuff at the bottom. We're getting pretty close to actually being done, at least with our initial pass of this code base. Let's go through this withdraw fees function. So now we've understood how to select the winner. Let's go to the withdraw fees. It looks like this is actually going to be a different address than the owner. It looks like the owner can actually change who the fee address is. OK, cool. Implementation detail. No big deal. This function will withdraw the fees to the fee address. So great. So we understood from the select winner. We're going to send 80% of the funds to the winner. The other 20% goes to the fee address. So we're looking for that other 20% that's collected to go to this fee address. OK, cool. So how does this work? So first off, we're requiring the address this.balance is the total fee address. Well, that's kind of interesting. So we're going to come back to this line in a second. I'm going to give you a hint. There's an issue with this line. But let's keep going. OK, so we check the balance of this. We compare it to the total fees. So initial question that would come up would, would be, oh, OK. So if the protocol has players, someone can't withdraw fees, right? Because if we require the balance to equal the fees, this would mean it, it might be very difficult for somebody to actually withdraw fees. So we might do a little audit here. Is it difficult to withdraw fees? And I'll explain this in a minute if this is confusing, don't worry. But there's another issue on this line. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's keep going. So fees to withdraw equals total fees. OK, so we're casting total fees as a as a UN256 for fees to withdraw. We're resetting the total fees storage variable again. Yep, this is a storage variable up at the top. OK. Total fees equals zero. And then we're going to do fee address dot call value fees to withdraw require puppy raffle failed. OK, so cool. So now we're actually sending the funds. This is at the bottom. So this is following following CEI, which is really nice. Some questions I might be thinking about is, OK, well, what if the fee address is bad and this reverts? Well, it looks like down here we can actually change the fee address. We'll talk about that function in a second, but maybe I'll, I'll put this as a cue to follow up with, you know, what if uh, the fee address is a smart contract with a fallback that will fail. Yep, that's a great question. We'll come back to it. But I want to focus on this line. So there is an issue with fees potentially never being able to withdraw. But I want to focus on this in particular. Require address this dot balance equals the total fees. We're checking just to make sure, hey, we don't want to accidentally take funds that are in a raffle. So maybe we're just being a little extra cautious here. And the idea is, OK, well, this contract doesn't have a receive or a fallback function. So if we send ETH to this contract, it'll fail, right? Well, let's take a quick look. See, here we are in our tests here. Let's actually create a new test. We'll say function test can't send money to raffle, right? We'll make this public. We'll do address sender addy equals make addy sender. VM.deal send addy one ether again. Thanks, chat GPT. Now we'll do VM.expect revert. I'm going to skip the actual revert message. But if we do VM.prank send addy and we do payable sender addy dot, you know, we could do dot call value one ether like this, this should fail. 
right? And then let's do equal bool success. Is that acquire success? Yeah, we should do if and stuff, but you know. Okay, cool. Let's try to run this. Exit out of chisel. Forge test dash dash MT. Paste that in here. This should pass. We shouldn't be able to send any money. Oh, it looks like it fails. Oops, I sent it to myself. Let's send it to address puppy raffle. Sorry. Let's run this again. Okay, cool. It passes, right? Because we don't have a fallback function. We don't have a receive function. So Solidity automatically says, hey, reject any transactions. Reject any money that comes in. So we should hypothetically then be doing a great job of keeping track of our balances. This contract should do a really good job of knowing exactly how much money is in here. However, that is not always the case. And to learn a little bit more about mishandling ETH, let's go back over to our SC Exploits Minimize to learn about this mishandling of ETH exploit. This is a very broad category of exploit, and there are many ways to mess this up, and there are many gotchas here. So there isn't always going to be a perfect fix. And to see this mishandling of ETH in action, we're, of course, going to go back to our SC Exploits repo, which you should 150% have bookmarked. Some resources, scroll down. We go to our SC Exploits Minimized, we scroll down or we look for mishandling of ETH. We have two in here, not using push over pull and vulnerable to self-destruct. The vulnerable to self-destruct is the one that we are going to be looking for here. And of course, if you do not get this code base to pop up and remix, then back in the repo, of course, you can scroll to the top, SRC, mishandling of ETH, self-destruct me.soul and just copy paste this into remix. So here's our contract though. Now, if we're looking at this, it looks pretty similar to some of the code bases we've seen already historically. We've got a variable, total deposits. We've got a mapping for deposits. We have a deposit function where people can add the message.value. We've got this long little message from Tincho. Thank you, Tincho, for writing this code base here. And we have an, a withdraw function, right? So the purpose of this is people can deposit their money and then withdraw it later. Down in this code base, we have some assumptions going on. We're doing this assert, which is kind of similar to a require. Don't worry too much about the difference for now. Where we're saying assert that the address of this, its balance is equal to total deposits. So this function up here is keeping track of all the money in this contract, right? So this is the accounting that we're doing. We make sure that it's accounting things correctly. And then when it is, we go ahead and we transfer the money out. You know, we, we get the amount from the deposits mapping. We subtract from the total amount. We set their deposit amount to zero, and then we send it to the user. Pretty typical, right? If we compile this, we compile self-destruct me, we deploy this, we can actually see this in action. So we can hit total deposits right now, zero. We'll go and deposit one ether, we'll scroll down, deposit. Now total deposits is this. We check our address, copy the address, paste it in here. We can see how much we put in here. We can deposit another two, sure, why not? Deposit, now we have this many, this is the total deposits, I can hit withdraw, and now it is back to zero. But let me go ahead, we'll redeposit one, and now we have one in here. Okay, cool, so we're able to withdraw, deposit, and do all that stuff normally, no problem here. The issue comes from this line. So you might be thinking, hey Patrick, Obviously, this is a bug. You can just send ETH to this contract, this self-destruct me contract, and it'll break, right? Well, let's try to do that. So we can use this transact button down in Remix to actually just send some Ether. So if I do a little one in here, I, if I put a value one in here, scroll down, I hit transact, this will be the equivalent of sending this contract just that one Ether. But if I hit transact, of course, we get this, in order to receive ether transfer, the contract should have either a receive or a fallback payable function. The transaction reverts, basically. We cannot send money to a contract because it blocks getting money, which is a good thing, right? We, we want it to block the money. But self-destruct can surpass that. Now you'll see self-destruct is actually highlighted because in the future it is probably going to be deprecated, but for the moment, it is not. So. The self-destruct keyword, what it does is it deletes this contract and any ETH inside of it, it will force to whatever target you send it. So if right now 
this is the scenario where this is the balance we can normally do with draws and stuff. If I deploy this attack self-destruct me with one ETH, we'll copy the target contract as the target will deploy. Now we have attack self-destruct me. Let's go ahead and send one ETH with our attack function here. If I deploy this, the balance of this contract will now be two. And this assertion up here will break and nobody will be able to withdraw any money. So let's try that out. We'll call attack. If we scroll up. We now see the balance of this is three. It's actually three because I originally deployed the attack contract with one. And then I also sent another one. doesn't really matter. But now you'll see total deposits still shows these values, right? That doesn't change. The internal accounting hasn't changed. But if I hit withdraw, withdraw, it fails. And it fails on this line. So this line breaks our accounting because we forced money into this contract. Self-destruct is a very unfortunately powerful command. And if we go back to our puppy raffle, we're making the same mistake. We were requiring that the address of this balance is equal to the total fees. So, yep, sure enough, audit, mishandling ETH. And we're going to have to do a write-up for this 100%. We're going to have to write a proof of code for this 100% because this looks like this is a pretty big bug and it would make it so that nobody could withdraw fees. Nobody gets their money out, which would really suck. So that's definitely going to be an issue. All right, cool. Now, of course, in the SC exploits minimized, there's also a test case for that test case that we just saw. There is additionally, if you go in here, you go to SRC, mishandling of ETH. There's another mishandling of ETH in here as well where a fix is something called push over pull. If you want to take some time now, I actually have some diagrams for push over pull stuff. If you want to learn about that attack path, you can absolutely feel free to do so. Mishandling of ETH, like we were saying, is a very broad subject. There's a lot of different ways for this to actually happen. Now to further drill this in, in our repo associated with this course, we have this exploits, poor ETH handling stuck ETH without a way to withdraw. We have a case study with SushiSwap. Now, again, one of the best ways to learn and grow is to actually read and understand these attack vectors, these case studies. So this is going to be one of the harder ones, but this is going to be one of these attacks that happened in real life that stole a lot of money where the SushiSwap protocol didn't handle ETH very well and it caused a lot of issues. So this is a phenomenal article to read. I highly recommend you pause the video, read through this blog that's linked in the Git repo associated with this course, and really understand the attack vector. But we're going to go over it very briefly right now. Basically, there is this function in a protocol. It's a batch function, and it allows somebody to make multiple calls in a single transaction. Sounds like something that's very helpful. But what it was doing was via this delegate call command. Now, what makes this bug so tricky is that this is a little bit of a mishandling of ETH and a mishandling of message.value. So, and this is a little bit different from the bug that we just went over because again, this mishandling of ETH is a very broad category. Inside a delegate call, message.sender and message.value are persisted. This meant that if that I should be able to batch multiple calls to commit ETH and reuse my message.value across every commitment, allowing me to bid in the auction for free. So here is where the issue was. It was very subtle. So if any of these calls resulted in something to do with message.value, that message.value would persist. So somebody could essentially make many, many, many calls that used a message.value, but only have to send one ETH. If you wanted to send 100 transactions, that would normally cost 100 ETH. With this call, you could send 100 batch transactions with just one ETH. This was a huge bug for the protocol. So highly recommend you go through this. this is a phenomenal case study about some of the oddities with dealing with ETH and how it works under the hood. The native to token balance system of these blockchains is amazing, but sometimes it can have these very weird under the hood bugs. Definitely be sure to check that out. All right, continuing on, let's keep going with our manual review of the puppy raffle code base. All right, cool. Next, change fee address. Okay, only the owner of the contract can change the fee address. It's got the only owner modifier. Awesome. Let's see if this does what we want it to do. Require owner equals underscore message sender. 
These are coming from the Open Zeppelin library. If I command click into them, I do see they do what uh, I want them to do. I obviously would, would want to double check some of these functions, but I know that they're good. We set the new the fee address to the new fee address. Okay, it looks like we are using the fee address where we want to use it. And then we're emitting an event. Oh, we're emitting an event here. Did we miss some events elsewhere? Withdraw fees, mm, no events here. Mm, select winner, no events here. Looks like we might be missing some events in other functions. So maybe I'm gonna do a little at audit. Are we missing events? We can come back to that. It's highly likely, or or maybe a question here, but for now, I'm just gonna say, hey, are we missing events? Active player, this function will return true if the message sender is an active player. Let's see, where where is this actually used? This actually isn't used anywhere. Is this used anywhere? This is not used anywhere in the entire protocol. Um, hello, at audit, this isn't used anywhere. So even something benign, something small like this is something that we wanna call out, right? When we talk about severity, we always talk about impact versus likelihood, right? So if this isn't used anywhere, what's the impact? It's probably none. What's the likelihood? Well, it's internal view. It's probably none, you know, but it's a waste of gas and it's kind of cluttering up the code base. So this is probably going to be an informational slash gas severity. And we're going to have to add this to our audit report. Okay, next. All right, base URI, internal pure returns string memory. Looks like we're doing some SVG based NFT stuff. If you do not understand this, you absolutely need to take my Foundry full course. The base URI looks like this is going to be the URI for an NFT. Again, if you're unfamiliar with NFTs, 100% take the Foundry full course. NFTs are very common in the DeFi and Web3 ecosystem. And if you're going to be a security researcher, you need to understand how they work under the hood. Okay, so this looks like a pretty classic SVG here. And then we have our token URI function, which I'm not going to explain. Again, we explain this in the Foundry full course. Public view virtual override. Okay, cool. So we're probably overriding the, the open Zeppelin method. We're requiring the token exists. Okay, this is nice to have. This is a view function. Rarity equals token to rarity. Okay, we would check that that actually works. We have the image URI and the rare name. So we have some weird mappings like rarity to URI, rarity to name, token ID to rarity. Where do we update these? Okay, we update these in the select winner based off of these static variables. Okay, cool. Let's go back. Uh, we have image URI, the rarity to URI. We again, we set these in here. Common, rare, legendary. Looks like these are set up at the top. So I probably would wanna double check these IPF IPFS URLs. Make sure these are actually good. Okay, it looks like there is indeed a puppy there. So I probably would check all of these to make sure those are actually good. And then we do a whole bunch of encoding stuff. I'm just gonna tell you guys right now that this is pretty good. We're not really gonna spend any time on this, making sure the metadata of the NFT is correct. But this is something that you'd wanna look into. You know, is there a way for this name to get messed up or the rare name or the image you ride to not show up? How could we break this view function? I think I can think of some potential ways to mess with this but for now let's just pretend that this is fine <laughs> so but all right so at this point we've been through the code base at least once we've made a ton of notes we've put a ton of comments we've found some exploits that are probably definitely exploits we haven't really spent a whole lot of time on state variables on events maybe we'll do a quick walk through those we would generally typically also spend some time on state variables but for the most part we've gone through a thorough review of our code base and now that we've gone through this, this initial review, we've got a ton of questions, right? If we just look up this queue, right, in our code base, we've got a ton of these questions we can go back and start answering, right? So if we go back up to the top, were custom reverts a thing in 0 0.7 of Solidity? Uh, we know that they weren't, so great, I can delete that question. What if it's zero? What if this new players array is length of zero? Okay, so require entrance fee times new players, the length, okay, so it'd be entrance, so it'd be zero, uh, loop through the, the length, which is zero, so it would skip this. Check for duplicates is zero. Ah, okay, maybe this is an issue. Question, if it's an empty array, we still emit an event? So maybe even answering some of these questions is gonna give us more questions, right? We don't wanna emit events if an event hasn't happened. That's kind of a waste of gas, right? This We would call this raffle enter with an empty array. That's pretty lame. 
We should call that out, help the protocol be better. And this again goes back to what we were talking about before. We probably do want to keep going through these questions until we have a good understanding of the answers. We've tried writing proof of codes for them and we really know what's going on. Like we were saying, you can always look at another line of code. And usually one pass through the code base isn't going to be enough. Usually going down the rabbit hole just once, maybe you want to go down again. If there's unanswered questions for you in this code base, that's a good sign that you need to go down deeper. If there's anything you don't understand, that's a good sign that you need to go deeper into the code base. So if you want, I challenge you to pause the video, even with some of these questions that we've asked in here, and see if you can answer them. See if you can go back, answer some of these questions, or maybe ask even more questions. So now's a great time. Pause the video. Try some more yourself. Or you might be saying, hey, I'm good. Like, let's just move on. That's fine, too. So before we actually move on, I do want to just try to answer some of these questions here. What resets the player's array? Mm, do we not reset the player's array? Let's see, where do we reset the player's array? Do we ever call delete players? Ah, OK, so we we set it. We, we reset it down there. Great. My question is answered. What's next? What if it's an empty array? Do we still emit an event? I might do at follow up slash at audit, you know, whatever. Looks like this will probably go in my report. Next, what if the player is at index zero? Ah, what if player is at index zero? It looks like we kind of already answered this. This is definitely going in the report as well. It looks like if if the player is at index zero, we're returning zero, and a player might think, oh, I'm not active. Okay, next question. Does this follow CEI? The answer is no, and I might do at audit, recommend to follow CEI. It's not an issue, and I know it's not an issue, so I might just do audit info, whatever you want to do. Are the duration and start time being set correctly? I think they are. So we're going to remove that question. Again, I'm kind of just speeding through to answer all the questions. Why not just do address this dot balance for the for some of the fees? Yeah, why not? Maybe we'll do at audit dash info. Is the 80% correct? Yes, it looks like it's correct based off the documentation up here. I bet there is an arithmetic error here. There's There might be some precision loss. Maybe I add it to the report, but for the purpose of this course, I'm actually just going to skip it. Where do we increment the token supply slash total ID? So I'm very familiar with Open Zeppelin repositories. I know SafeMint does that. If you're not familiar, I would recommend you check out the SafeMint function. Where do we increment? Oops, that's what I what did I just delete. Oh, OK, so the gas water that I'm deleting this one, excuse me. If our transaction picks a winner and we don't like it, revert. Yeah, so this is probably going to be a bit of a gas war. If when we're calculating this rarity, we don't like what we get. Maybe we just revert the transaction and we just keep calling select winner, revert the transaction, call select winner, revert the transaction, call select winner, revert the transaction until we get us being the winner. So maybe that's an issue that we want to figure out how to solve as well. That's probably going to go into the report follow up or maybe I'm just going to say audit. People can revert the TX till they win. That's not great. Reset the uh, next question. Can we re-enter somewhere? We looked at this. It looks like we can't, but we probably want to follow CEI anyways. What if the winner is a smart contract audit with a fallback that will fail? Well, yeah, that would be an issue. The auditor, the winner wouldn't get any money. OK, cool. Looks like we probably answered that question. OK, if the protocol has players, someone can't withdraw. Yeah, that kind of sucks. Uh, so it's difficult to withdraw fees if there are players. And this is actually going to be an MEV attack as well. But we're going to skip the MEV stuff. We're going to talk about that later. We did the mishandling of ETH. And our last question, what if the fee address is a smart contract with a fallback that will fail? Well, it'll probably fail, but we're going to say it's not a big issue because the owner could just change the owner. Whew, OK, we've answered our questions. Now, there's a couple things we still haven't done. We haven't followed up with Slither. And there's a couple of other code quality things that especially for a private audit, we definitely want to call out. If you took the Foundry full course, you know there are a bunch of design patterns that we absolutely love, and this code base is not following them. Number one, the names of these variables, of these storage variables, could be clear. I love the S underscore mentality for storage. That might be an informational finding that we recommend them do. However, up at the top, we have this carrot here. It's not a great idea to use potentially different versions of Solidity. It's much better to use a single version of Solidity. If we had this caret, this could mean, oh, we're using a floating pragma. And actually, a lot of static analysis tools will call this out. 
So maybe we'll do this audit dash info. Again, this isn't going to cause any impact or anything, but it's just not best practice. So say use of floating pragma is bad. We want to know the exact Solidity version we're working with so that when we run our tests, we're always testing on the exact correct version. That's going to be probably an informational finding in the code base. If we scroll down a little bit, if you followed my full course, we definitely talked about this. We have these numbers 80 and 20 for me at audit info. This is a big no, no. This is what I like to call magic numbers. It's not a good idea just to have numbers in the middle of your code base. There always should be some descriptor which says why this number is here, right? So instead of 80, maybe at the top we would do u into 256, maybe public, private, whatever, public constant, and we would say prize pool per percentage 80, and then maybe we would do u into 256, public constant, fee percentage equals 20, and then u into 256, public constant, pool, precision equals 100. Something like this just to be a lot more explicit. We're saying, hey, the participants are going to receive 80% of the pool. The fee address is going to receive 20 and the pool precision is going to be 100. Having this up at the top will make these not just magic numbers in the code base. The exception to that is usually zero and one are OK to have as magic numbers because they're used kind of a lot. Other than zero and one, it's a good idea to set them at the top. Maybe sometimes two, but really just zero and one are kind of the only exceptions. But even then, you could set those as a constant variable as well. Now, one more point in our foundry.toml, we're using some libraries here, which is great. And if we look in our make file, we actually can see the exact Open Zeppelin version that we're using. Something that we want to be aware of is something called supply chain attacks. So when a protocol is using a library or using some external contracts, you do want to at least make sure that the contracts that they're using are good. And most of the time, what you can do is you can do some research for sure on contracts, but maybe you want to look into the security disclosures of a package. So opens up on contracts, for example, has this security tab where you can learn more about their bug bounty proposal, et cetera. And if we scroll down, we actually see there's a lot of security disclosures for different versions of open Zeppelin contracts. They go from low to high severity. And for example, if we looked at this, Governor votes quorum fraction updates to quorum may affect past defeated proposals. Yeah, that would be a big issue. And we could see, OK, what versions does that affect? Are we using this anywhere in our contracts? Yes, no, maybe. So even though the opens up a contracts are out of scope, we always want to check to make sure, hey, are any of the contracts we are using in our project, you know, like ownable or address, do they have any issues with that specific version of opens up and that we are using? Along with informational findings, it can be optional to do some gas optimizations as well. And those can be reported as informational. Those can be reported as gas. The raffle duration, for example, never is changed, right? And right now it's a storage variable. So maybe in here I'll say at audit gas, this should be immutable because it's never changed. It's storage variable is much more expensive and immutable variable is much cheaper to use. And again, if you do not understand the difference there, definitely take my Foundry full course because we explain all of that. So raffle duration probably should be immutable. We'll probably want to report this. Now, we have two things left to do here. Two things left to do here. We need to go through the Slither slash Darren report. And then we also need to check the code quality slash tests. So let's do these two things. Let's wrap up this code base and then we'll start writing the report. Once we do these two, First, we're going to learn about competitive audits, how they work, how you can participate, and we're going to learn how to submit a finding to a competitive audit platform. And then we're going to write the puppy raffle audit report, including POCs. Now, we're not always going to write the full report together. Why? Because it can be very time intensive to write the full report together for this video. But it is good to practice writing the report, especially with me. When we get to this section, I'm going to have you trying to write your report first, then follow along with me to write the report. If you say, hey, Patrick, cool, man, but I'm just going to try to write the report myself and then compare to you. You can do that, of course, in the audit data branch of the repo. It's in here. Our full report in Markdown in here. And obviously the PDF is in here as well. We also for this lesson have our Adarin and Slither output as well. If you want to compare your Slither and Adarin output to make sure you're doing it correct. But here's the agenda. Let's get through this last bit 
and you will have another smart contract security review or audit add to your GitHub repo and put under your belt. Remember your profile, boom, Codehawk's security portfolio, or you can just say my smart contract reviews, whatever. We're going to create another one for you. Great. Excellent. Continuing. Here we go. All right. Let's finish running Slither. Let's finish running a Darren, and then we can finally get to our reporting step here. All right, slither dot. We need to go through this. We want to go through this entire output. I know it seems like a lot, but we want to make sure that what's being reporting is actually good. So we usually want to start from the most extreme and work our way down. Puppy raffle dot withdraw fees sends ETH to an arbitrary user. Hmm. Okay, let's let's go see this. Withdraw fees function. Okay, function withdraw fees. Let's see this. Okay, here. So it's complaining about this line. If we look at this again, sends E to an arbitrary user saying fees.call this line here. Okay, yeah. Okay, great. That's this line right here. So the issue that Slither is pointing out is that fee address is an arbitrary user and it could be malicious. So let's go ahead and check the Slither documentation to see the attack vector, how it expects to fix it, etc. So the severity is high. The confidence is medium here. So I'm on the Slither documentation now. I copy paste it from there. Confidence being medium means that the tool is medium sure this is actually an issue. So if we scroll down, we can see an example. We have this set destination, destination equals message.sender, withdraw, destination.transfer. So in this example here, anybody can change the destination to send money. So it's saying, hey, somebody can change the destination to send money. So maybe we'll do a quick check to see, okay, well, who has control over what the fee address is? So only owner has control. Okay, cool. Is there anybody else who can change the fee address? Uh, the constructor can, so whoever deploys the contract, and that's it, okay? So this is going to be one where we might ignore Slither because we're saying, hey, the fee address isn't arbitrary, it's intentional. And if we want to ignore a value with Slither, what you can do is if we scroll down in the Git repo in the wiki here, we can actually do slither disable next line and add the detector name. So if we go back, we pull this up, we can see the check is arbitrary send ETH. So what we can do then, if we've gone through, we've checked, hey, this is actually this line is actually OK. We can actually ignore that. Uh, we could either just manually ignore it or we could comment on the code base to have slither ignore that line. So maybe what I'll do is I'll copy Slither disable next line. So we'll do paste it here, Slither disable next line. The detector name we find from the docs, arbitrary send ETH, paste it in here like this. Now, if I run Slither again, it'll actually ignore that line and not put it in our output. So if we scroll back up to the top, now that line is ignored, and that's a great way to cut down on some of the noise that happens in Slither if you're going to be using Slither for some of your audits and you want to really check, really make sure that the output of Slither is nothing. OK, next. All right. What's the next bug? Puppy raffle dot select winner uses a weak PRNG. OK, great. We actually already know that and it's going to say the same line as we do. OK, awesome. Slither picked out the weak randomness as well. Great. Let's keep going. Base 64 dot encodes performs. This is in the library that we have performs a multiplication on a result of a division. So we have this bit here. And this again is where we want to make sure that the libraries that we're using are actually going to be safe. For the purpose of this section, we're going to ignore this, but this would be something you would want to check out. Make sure these libraries are actually doing what they should be doing and see how valid these are for Slither. Okay, next, puppy raffle dot withdraw fees uses a dangerous strict equality. Actually, we already called this out. So in puppy raffle, we have this Address this equals balance total fees. Let's do a little search on that again. That's this line right here. We already called this out. So Slither says, hey, this is a dangerous strict equality. And we said, hey, yeah, this is mishandling ETH. So Slither called this out. We caught this in a manual audit. Thank you so much, Slither. Great. Whoops. What's next? Reentrancy and puppy raffle dot refund. We sure got that. Absolutely. We already got that. OK, next. Whoa, this is a big one. We have some unused returns in our Open Zeppelin library as well. I'm going to go ahead and say, don't bother checking this. If you want to go check these, feel free. This probably should be something that is fixed. 
Again, this is going to be something where we look for supply chain attacks, where our libraries are doing bad things. For this lesson, I'm going to say you can ignore that and let's keep going. All right, now we're into the green section. So these are probably the less important ones or the less likely ones. We have, okay, we have a couple of lacks a zero check on. So Slither says, hey, you probably should do some zero checks on our, our code base. So for fee address, for example, right here, right in the constructor, when we do this fee address, we should probably check for the zero address. So yeah, you know, that's probably good informational finding. Audit info, check for zero address. So this is also often known as imp validation. And most of the time, input validation, like, hey, check for a zero address, check that the number is right, et cetera, is going to be informational unless it can break something later on. In this example, we could just easily update the fee later. And this would be kind of like a human error, like whoops a daisy, they put the wrong address in here, they put the zero address in there. This is a little bit of a quality of life. There have been reports that say, oh, you need to check for the zero address who have reported it as like a medium. But these days, we as a community have pretty much said, hey, these, this input validation, unless it has some downstream security effects, is really going to be informational. So cool. Thank you, Slither. We have another informational check. Puppyraffle.refund has some potential reentrancies. Yep, we actually did talk about that. So let's, so let's go to the function refund. OK, yep, we did. We did talk about that. That's a reentrancy right here. And what's interesting is actually has two effects, right? Obviously, we have the effect here where it can steal money, but we also have this emit raffle refunded. So events actually are an important part of the Ethereum ecosystem. A lot of external tooling reads events to update their system. So for me, if somebody could manipulate what an event emits, I will usually say that those are going to be low. Now, it depends on who you ask. Some people might say events are not that important, so those are going to be informational. Some are going to say they are important, so they need to be medium. I think they're at least low. If you're going to do an upgrade on a contract using social convention and you want to read all the state changes via events, it's really important to have to make sure those events are correct. So for now, my rule of thumb for events is if an, an event can be manipulated, an event is missing or an event is wrong, that is going to be a low finding. That's my rule of thumb. It's going to be different from person to person, but I usually say that these are low severity issues. All right, what else do you have? So there's some reentrancy. We can affect events. We already documented the reentrancy issue. There's a reentrancy in select winner. We already looked at that too. Cool. We talked about reentrancy. Select winner uses timestamp for comparisons. Okay, what's this one? Let's look up this detector. Okay, block timestamp. Severity is low, confidence is medium. Dangerous use of block to timestamp. Block to timestamp can be manipulated by miners. Okay, so we're saying, hey, using block to timestamp is still bad. We're using it for the raffle start time and the raffle duration. It can be manipulated. For us, it's not going to be a big deal if they change the duration by a couple seconds. It doesn't really matter to us. This might be something we put in the code base. And instead of time, we use maybe block dot number or something like that. Maybe this would go as an informational or maybe a low. For this report, we're just going to ignore it for now. Great. Next, Slither doesn't like assembly. We're going to learn assembly much later in this course. There's a whole bunch of assembly in one of the packages we're using. OK, we're going to ignore that for now. Different versions of Solidity are used all over the place. We've already talked about how floating pragmas are bad. The libraries are also using different versions of Solidity. We've already talked about that a little bit. That's definitely going in the report as an informational finding. Puppy raffle dot is active player is never used and should be removed. Great. We found this with a manual review, but thank you, Slither. OK, the one of our library allows old versions. This is no bueno. This might go in the report as well. For now, we're going to skip it. And down at the bottom here, Silk 0.76 is not recommended for deployment. What do you mean by that? Let's copy paste this and see what Slither is talking about. Incorrect versions of Solidity. Severity, informational, confidence, high. Sulk frequently releases new compiler versions. Using an old version prevents access to new Solidity severity checks. We also recommend avoiding complex pragma statements. Recommendation, deploy any of the following Solidity versions, 0.8.18. This is a great finding. Why is this protocol using this super old version of Solidity? Use a stable version of Solidity. This is definitely going in the report. Up here at the top of our code base, we have, hey, use of a floating pragma is bad. We should also say audit info. Also, why are you using 0 
big issue. We definitely are putting this for import. Using 0.7 actually caused this project issues down below with this line here, because this was unchecked math and it wrapped around and it totally wrecked the fee calculation. Using old versions of Solidity is no bueno. Okay, gonna keep going. Solidity doesn't love low level calls. So anytime you do a low level call, it gets mad about that. That's fine, we're gonna ignore that. One of the names of a function is not in mixed case. Okay, maybe this is an informational, but it looks like these are from the library. So we're gonna skip it. Info detector, redundant expression in one of our libraries. Mm, not a big deal. Another, another library issue. Okay, so these library issues are, are getting a little annoying. Can we do something to get rid of all these libraries? Let's just assume for now that all of our libraries are good. If we have that assumption, which you shouldn't always have, but let's say we do, what we can do is actually run slither dot dash dash exclude dependencies. And it's going to exclude all the files in our lib folder. And okay, great, our output is much smaller. So let's keep going with where we were. I'm gonna scroll down. We did the reentrancies, we did the different versions of Solidity is, is active, uh, floating pragma. 076 is no good, low level calls are no good. Okay, loop conditions should use a cached array length instead of referencing length. Oh, this is something that we didn't actually catch. So if we go to players.length, ah, anytime we use this players.length in here, we're actually calling from storage. So we'd wanna cache this. We'd wanna do something like un256 player length, players.length. We'd want to cache this and use players length instead of players length. And this is going to be, you know, at audit gas. However, based off of our previous discussion, we might even get rid of this loop altogether. So great, we should cache those. Okay, next. Ah, okay, we have some variables. Common URI, legendary URI, and rare image URI should be constant. We scroll to the top. Common URI, rare URI, legendary URI, they're directly set in the code and they're set as storage variables right now, which is very gas inefficient. So this of course can be audit gas, should be constant. These should 100% be constant variables. Now again, the thing about gas in your reports, these are kind of optional. They're nice to have, depending on the client, they're not required. Depending on the competitive audit, they can also not be required, but it's good to give, your, give the client as much information as possible. Okay, next, raffle duration should be immutable. We got that. Okay, phenomenal. We've gone through the Slither output. And yes, it might seem kind of tedious, but look how much stuff it found. It found, a, at the very least, it found a bunch of gas optimizations. It found a bunch of bugs that we had to do manual review for. If this protocol just ran Slither before they came to audit, they would have found a ton of issues. That would have made our life so much easier and would have given us more time to work on more complicated issues. This is why it's so important for protocols, for developers, for those of you here who wanna just become better coders to have all this in mind when you're doing your developing because it'll make you better coders. It'll make your auditors and security researchers lives easier, meaning they will have more time to work on bugs. Okay, cool. Next, we're gonna do a Darren. This is gonna be very quick. A Darren dash dash root dot. One of the really cool things about a Darren, it gives us a markdown report that we can kind of just copy paste into our, our final report. So looks like it's finished. We can go over here now. We have this report.md. We'll do a little preview of it. And oh, okay, cool. Looks like we've got a whole bunch of issues. Number one, centralization risk for trusted owners. This is gonna come up more and more, and this is an issue that we didn't really call out. Smart contracts are supposed to be these immutable decentralized contracts, and anytime there is some ownership property, that owner could potentially do something malicious. In this contract, we can kind of ignore it because the only owner thing that they can really do is change the fee address, and they're taking a fee anyways. It's probably not a big deal because the only thing they can do is change the fee address. And that's well known. It's well documented that there's going to be a fee. So maybe we ignore that. All right, what's next? Low issues. ABI.encode packed should not be used with dynamic types when passing the result to a hash function such as cache 256. Oh, okay. So interesting. So we are using ABI.encode packed for some randomness. We're probably going to get rid of this line. Anyways, uh, for us, we're just recommending to get rid of this line altogether. So we might put this in the report as a low. We might ignore it, not a big deal. Solidity pragma should be specific, not wide. 
We already got that. Missing some address zero checks when assigning, when assigning values to address and state variables. We already got that. Functions not used internally could be marked external. This is referring to the, this is this internal function that nobody's using. We could, it's saying, hey, mark this as external, but we're just gonna get rid of it altogether. Constants should be defined and used instead of literals. This is that magic numbers bit we were talking about. Aha, so Darren actually caught this for us. So for example, this 80, it's telling us, hey, this 80 shouldn't be a magic number. You should use a constant variable instead. Awesome, thank you, Adarin. Event is missing indexed fields. Ooh, so we have some events. If we scroll to the top, we have some events. None of them have an index field. Uh, maybe we wanna add that. If we go to the report, we can actually see exactly where those are. We can see more information about these attack vectors. And maybe we just copy paste this into the report. Simple as that. Okay. A Darren done. Slither done. Let's see the code coverage. Forge coverage. It's not very good. Ta da. Ugh. It's pretty bad. So, for a private audit, we probably want to put this as informational. Hey, you need better test coverage. For a competitive audit, this doesn't matter. But for a private audit, yeah, this test coverage is kind of abysmal. This needs to be higher, especially for a code base as simple as this, where this test coverage with a little bit more effort could easily be wrapped up. Okay, with that all being said, you could always look at one more line of code, but at some point you got to write the report. So at this point, we're going to say we are happy with the job that we did. We're reaching the end of our time bound security review, and it's time for us to write the report. We're first going to learn about competitive audits. We're going to submit a finding from a competitive audit. We're going to learn how competitive audits can supercharge our careers. Then we're going to do the full report for the puppy raffle. And we're going to write this together because, again, writing the report is a crucial step to being a security researcher. You need to be able to communicate with the protocols, communicate with judges on competitive audits, why your issues exist and why they're so important for you to fix them. And later on in your career, when you start doing bug bounties, yes, clearly communicating to protocols why your issue is a bug becomes even more important. Because if you're sitting on a $100,000 payout and you do a poor job explaining why there's a bug in this protocol, they're not going to give you the $100,000. They might even demote it. You're almost like a salesman for bugs. You need to be able to explain why the bug is as important as it is to fix. So I highly recommend you write the report with me. You pause the video, write the report yourself and go check it out. But we are going to write the report together here. And we're going to be writing a lot of proof concepts and it's really good for you to practice those as well. But we have already been through a lot. And I know I've crammed a ton of stuff in your brains very quickly. But the good thing is you've learned so much so far. You've walked through an actual audit with me. And you're going to learn how to do a competitive audit, submit a find to a competitive audit, and then do the final write-up. But for now, I want you to pause and I want you to go for a walk. Because that's the only way this information is going to sink in. If you're trying to do hours and hours and hours and hours of this content every single day, it's not going to sink in. So I want you to pause. I want you to take at least 20 minutes, go for a walk, do some push-ups, do some pull-ups, call a loved one, just do something else. Take some time, take a break, and then come back for us to write this right up. You're doing phenomenal so far. This audit is just about done. And I want you to pace yourself for the rest of this because section five is a banger because that's when we start getting into DeFi and your audit portfolio, your security review portfolio is going to take off. So take a break, at least 20 minutes, come back. I'll see you in a bit. Now, what is a competitive audit? A competitive audit is a little bit different from a private audit. A competitive audit is instead of a single person or, or firm doing audit for a code base, you actually put your code base out to the public and have them compete to find as many bugs as possible. For example, here's one of the first completed competitive audits from the CodeHawks protocol, the BeetleFi protocol. And if we hit view final report and we click on one of the findings, 
scrolls all the way down, you'll actually see we have this list of people who actually submitted this issue. Submitted by one, two, three, four, five, six, blah, blah, blah. These are all the different users who found this bug in the protocol. These users are gonna get paid because they found a bug. For example, we can click on a profile and we can see the user's profile, their Twitter, et cetera. They competed in this competition. It looks like they've actually won some money from competing in this and other competitions. So competitive audits are a little bit different from private audits because the main focus is actually gonna be on bugs as opposed to a private audit where we're talking about increasing the code quality, test coverage, et cetera. In a competitive audit, you get paid if you find bugs. And if you find bugs, you win money. Now each competitive audit system has a different payout system, judging system, et cetera. If you go to the Codehawk stocks, you can see for competitive audits, the payouts are currently determined as medium risk shares and high risk shares. So the more people find the same issue, the less it pays out. The idea is if 100 security researchers can find an issue, it's not very difficult to find, and the system rewards finding more unique bugs. This is the civil resistance mechanism so that so that one auditor doesn't submit under 100 different people the same bug to get more money. If you go to the Codehawks documentation, there's actually some examples given a prize pot, who finds what bugs, and how much they'd actually get paid out if you want to know exactly how it works. Now, when it comes to the quality of these audits, it's actually insane. If we go back to the contest page, again, if I scroll down to Beetlefy, if we go to view the final report, we can go down to contest summary, we can see the summary of this audit. They found 26 highs, 15 mediums, 28 lows, and 110 gas slash informational findings. That is a ton of findings on this audit report. Competitive audits have shown to be incredible in terms of finding as many bugs as possible. And they're perfect ways for people to start building their careers and building their confidence around doing security vulnerabilities. Cypher co-founder Hans actually started off as a competitive auditor and was the number one competitive auditor for the first half of 2023. Other security researchers like Peshav also started their careers out as competitive auditors, leveled way up in skill, and now do a ton of solo audits. To date, competitive audits are the best way to start your smart contract security and auditing career. They're a ton of fun, you learn more, and then of course you can win money. And for the most part, when it comes to finding bugs, uh, when it comes to purely finding bugs, competitive audits have proven that they are one of the best, if not the best way to just uncover as many bugs as possible. And in this section of the course, we have an article if you wanna learn more about how effective they are, how they work, and how you can use them to start your security auditing journey. Most of the SOP solo auditors and security reachers of today come from a competitive audit platform like Codehawks, and they're great ways to jump on the leaderboard and start learning. Additionally, Codehawks has this thing called First Flights, which we're gonna have you do. These are much easier code bases, much smaller code bases, uh, like the Puffy Raffle that we just went over, that have been created specifically to give you a chance to Get to know what it feels like to do one of these audits. And they're a ton of fun and they're a great way. They're a ton of fun and they're a great way to learn and grow as a security researcher. Because oftentimes doing security reviews is very daunting, time consuming. These are much quicker, much faster, and you learn so fast. One of the biggest benefits of doing competitive audits is after the competition is over, you'll be able to view the final report and see all the findings that you missed that you should have found and it's how you'll continue to up your game and always be on top of the ball. So with that being said, let's learn how to input our first finding into a first flight. If there's a first flight going on right now, you actually have the skills right now to compete and try your hand and start finding some bugs and maybe submit a finding. Since the first flight that's going on right now is the puppy raffle, which we just went over, and we already have at least one write-up that we've done, we can actually use it and input our finding into the Puppy Raffle first flight right now. If there's a first flight and you wanna jump in, now's a great time for you to take some time and do that as your exercise. Or if you're like, screw it, I wanna jump in, you can just jump into a live competitive audit where there's real money at risk. Just know that obviously the live contests are going to be a little bit more challenging because they didn't intend to have any bugs in their code base. Okay, so if, if you're looking to if you're looking to do much easier code bases and level up your skill, that's where these first flights come in. Let's go ahead and learn how to submit a finding to a first flight. So first thing we need to do, obviously, is we need to we need to sign up for the platform. So if we're going to code hawks, let's go ahead and we'll do become a hawk. I'm going to use MetaMask, but you can use whatever you want here. 
We're gonna go ahead and sign in. We'll hit sign in here. And great, let's create our profile. A wallet address is gonna be needed. Right now, CodeHawks pays out USDC on the Arbitrum chain. Discord is mainly where you'll be able to ask questions to sponsors. Telegram, you can skip. Twitter is if you want people to be able to reach you on Twitter. Same thing with Lens, GitHub, and LinkedIn. But I'm gonna go ahead and hit sign up. I'm going to sign in right here. Name security full course. It's gonna be my username. We'll hit sign up. We're gonna go ahead and sign in. And that's it. And I'm signed up. Cool. Got a little notification. I'm gonna to have to verify my email. And once you're confirmed, you're good to go. Now that we're in, we can just start participating. That's it. We just had to sign up. So let's scroll down. Let's go to the puppy raffle first flight. And obviously we have all the data for the first flight here, all the payouts, the stats, everything that we went over in the course so far. So let's go ahead and submit a finding. If we're on this page, right now it says you, you have no findings for this contest. Here we have a very familiar setup. Let's go to our findings page and we'll grab our title. We don't need to add like this or anything. Grab our title, paste it in here. Obviously we're in the root cause and impact bit. Severity, what, what did we say the severity of this was? Looping through a player's array to check for duplicates is a potential denial of service attack. Okay, we said this was a medium, great. Let's keep that at me as a medium. Relevant GitHub links. These are going to be links to the code base where our finding is, okay? So we're saying our finding was on the for loop. So we need to go to the actual repo for this. So I'm gonna go back to first lights. I'm gonna view this, I'm gonna hit view repo. We're gonna to go to SRC, puppy raffle. Where is that duplicate loop here? Aha, and what we can do, we can click this line and we can hit copy permalink. Go back here, paste it in here, great. So this is the relevant link in the code base for the competition. And again, if you're actually in the GitHub repo, you scroll down, you'll see all the stuff that we would wanna see in a regular audit. Right? Additionally, some stats and the start time, end time, et cetera. We see exactly what we saw when we were auditing it. We see getting started, usage, testing, scope, compatibilities, roles, et cetera. So cool, now we have our finding. This sets it up into summary, details, impacts, tools, use, and recommendations. We are just gonna go ahead and copy paste our write-up because we are quite happy with it. And again, I did a little extra diff at the bottom. You don't have to do that as well. We're gonna paste that in here, okay? And if you want, before you even hit submit finding, we can scroll up, we can hit preview and see what this will look like in Markdown. I think this looks pretty darn good. Little POC looking like that, great. And we're gonna go ahead and submit this finding. And now in our report, we have our medium risk finding. We can view it, we can modify it, whatever we wanna do. And at the end of the competition, this finding will automatically go to a judge. And if our write-up is really good, we can actually get what's called the selected report. If we go to a past contest, for example, let's go back to Beetle, view final report. We select one of the findings. We have this section here called, let me zoom way in here. Selected submission by and then a user. If you are the selected submission, you get a bonus prize payout. So if you write a really good submission, you get more money. This makes it so that if your write-ups are fantastic, you get paid for it. Hell yeah. And then once your findings are completed in your profile, you can go to my findings and you'll actually be able to download your findings and add these as well to your portfolio. Remember, you want to be building your portfolio so people know what a badass security researcher you are. And that's it. And that's how you submit to a competitive audit. At the end of the competition, the judges will get all of these findings and all these submissions. They will go through it and they will rank them. Some platforms also have community judging where you can actually participate in the judging. And Codox has a lot of really cool stuff coming down the pipeline. So be sure to stay tuned for Codox and sign up for Codox because this is going to be the thing that supercharges your smart contract security and auditing journey and will make you the best smart contract security researcher out there. And I hope to see you out there. All right, it's time. We want to actually do some report writing. Now, if we scroll down in the GitHub repo associated with this, we obviously we have our audit report templating repo that we used for the password store that we're gonna use again. But there's a couple of other templates in here as well that you can choose to use if you want. 
So on the Cypher team, we have this tool called the Audit Repo Cloner as well, which will clone a repo and automatically prepare it for Cypher audit report generation. So on the Cypher team, we actually, instead of putting all of our findings in a markdown, we will use issues or projects on the repo instead and automatically generate the report from directly from GitHub instead. We have this other code base called Report Generator Template that does that for us. So it's a template forked from Spearbit, and the Spearbit one is in here as well, where it will fetch all issues from a repository, sort them by severity, generate a single markdown file, integrate that markdown file into a latex template, and generate a PDF report. So the way we have been doing our security review and writing our findings is just kind of in a markdown file. A lot of times when you're working with a team, instead of just everyone kind of combining their markdown together at the end, they'll add issues instead and say like H1, blah, 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 and then add their findings in here. And these tools help to automatically generate the report from the issues as opposed to from your markdown file. So if you want to do audits like that, you absolutely can. But we're just going to continue with writing them in one markdown file and then generating them with our audit report templating code base. Great. So let's practice writing the rest of this report because again, we want to get really good at writing these reports. Like I said, we won't always go through writing the entire report. Sometimes we will just do the finding and I'll have you do the actual report writing. For this writing the report, we're also going to write the proof of codes, which are really important for you to get correct because especially for competitive audits, if you do not have a proof of code, you will not be the selected finding. And you might even just get invalidated right away. You want to get really good at proving, hey, this is an issue. This needs to be addressed for both competitive audits and for private audits as well. So for us to do this, we're going to go to the search bar here. We're going to look for at audit and we're going to walk through this code base. Anytime we have at audit, we're going to turn that into a write up. OK, our first one at audit info use of floating pragma is bad. We actually have that in our report.md from our Adarin tool. Solidity pragma should be specified, not wide. Let's scroll down to that. Where is that? This is a low. I'm actually going to make this an informational, but some people actually mark it as a low. So in my findings, we're going to go to the bottom here, paste it in, and we're going to reformat it a little bit. We're going to do the three ticks. We're going to reformat it a little bit like this, a one like so. And if we want, and if we want, we can go back down, open back up our password store audit, and we can grab that finding layout and that report layout. Let's just copy both of those. Let's create a new audit data folder. Let's paste those in here. OK, now we have the finding layout and we have the report layout. OK, great. We close the password store now and we can use this as our template again. But all right, cool. So that's this. I'm going to have this be an informational as opposed to a low, but OK, great. So I'm going to mark that I wrote this. Report written. OK, also, why are you using 0 0.7? OK, that's going to be an informational, right? What's the impact? There's no real impact. It's just like, hey, this will make your code base better. So let's go back to our findings. Let's make another one. And the informational ordering doesn't really matter. And these can be I know we have this layout, but for informationals, they can uh, they can sometimes be way less verbose. So for this one, I'm just going to say using using an outdated version of Solidity is not recommended. Please use a newer version like 0 0.8.18. And here's where we might borrow from Slither. Go back to Slither We can go to Sulk version finding. Maybe we actually just copy paste this. I'm actually going to do this recommendation, boom, and then maybe at the bottom. Oh, and then we'll just reformat this a little bit. Maybe we even just copy this. Boom from Slither, please. See Slither documentation for more information. Great. OK, report written. Next. Audit gas. This should be immutable. Yes, it should be. This is going to be a gas optimization. So we can go back to our findings page. We'll make a little gas column now. We'll say gas. We'll go G1. Unchanged state variables should be declared constant or immutable. 
And I know we found some constants, so I'm gonna lump these together. I'm gonna do instances. What is this? Raffle duration. We'll say something like puppy raffle. Raffle duration should be immutable, and we'll probably find some more later. Put a little description here. Reading from storage is much more expensive than reading from a constant or immutable variable. All right, cool. Written. All right, next. A lot of guess. This should be constant. Aha. These three should be constant. So we'll do puppy raffle. Boom. Should be constant. What are the other ones? Rare image URI. Should be constant. Legendary URI. Should be constant. Okay. Got that. I'm just going to do written instead of report and written now. Next, info check for zero address. Oh, okay, I think we have that in here. Missing checks. So I'm just going to actually copy this, put it into my findings list. This is going to be informational. We'll call this i3. We're just going to leave that as such. Okay, done. And that's where some of the power of these tools is so helpful. It's great to just be able to copy paste outputs there. Audit gas. We recommended to get rid of this totally, but we're still going to report this as a gas finding. This should be cached instead of constantly reading from storage. So up here, we'll do another one. We'll do G2. Actually, are these triple? Ah, it should be triple, not double. Triple, 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 <clears throat> triple. All right, G2. What is, what is the finding? Ah, storage variables in a loop should be cached. And then maybe I'll do just a diff here. I'm going to grab this, paste it in here. I'll do a little minus. A little plus here. Uint 256 player length equals players dot length. And now we'll do a little plus here. Do a minus here. Do a plus here. Okay, cool. Every time you call players length, you read from storage as opposed to memory, which is more gas efficient. Great. Got it. Written. Audit MEVs. So this refund function actually has an MEV attack vector that we're going to ignore for this. So there's going to be something with MEV. So there are some findings that we're going to come back to. And there are going to be some findings in this report, like we said, that we didn't go over in this course or in this section. So this MEV one, we're going to skip for now. But later on in the course, around section 7.5, we're going to come back to it. So for now, we're just going to say written skipped. We're not actually going to write it. All right, cool. All right, so we're going to do a great write up for this re entrancy here. This is obviously going to be a high. We'll see in just a second. So, what's the actual finding? Well, I could call refund, re enter, refund, re enter, refund, and while stealing all the money the whole time. So, that's no good. So, this is definitely going to be a high. Why? Impact is going to be high because why? I'm going to be able to drain the entire contract of everyone's funds, likelihood is also going to be high because I could all I have to do is enter the raffle and then I can just immediately start stealing money. So it's going to be a H probably going to be our H one. This is probably going to be our best one. So same thing as always. Let's delete this. Let's go to our layout. We've already done the top part. So let's paste this in here. Title is going to be re -en re entrancy attack in puppy raffle refund allows entrant to drain contract or raffle balance. Okay. And normally I write the proof of code first just to make sure it works, but I'll let you in on a little secret. I actually have already done that. So puppy raffle refund function does not follow I the checks effects interactions. And then we're also going to learn about free pie later, but in any case, it doesn't follow either one of those checks effects interactions. And as a result, 
enables participants to drain the contract balance. In the, in the, looks like ChatGPT is trying to give me an answer here. In the puppy raffle refund function, or excuse me, we first make an external call to the message.sender address. And only after making that external call, do we update the puppy raffle players array. So let's go over here. I'm gonna copy the whole refund function. One, two, three, JavaScript, paste it in here. I'm gonna have to remove some of my comments that I put in here. Goodbye, 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 boom. And maybe I wanna to point to these two lines. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a little point. You can do whatever system you want here. Cool, we're gonna to point to those two lines, great. A player who has entered the raffle could have a fallback slash receive function that calls the puppy raffle refund function again and claim another refund. They could continue the cycle till the contract balance is drained. Okay, the impact, all fees paid by raffle entrance could be stolen by the malicious participant. Big, okay, proof of concept. This is where we would wanna write it up. For this one, I am going to walk you through doing the actual test here because I do think Oh, we already did the test. Oh, nice, we already did the test. Okay, cool, so we can just copy paste it in here. <laughs> Great, so proof of concept. Let's first just talk it out. We'll say one, user enters the raffle. Thanks, ChatGPT. Attacker sets up a contract with a fallback function that calls puppy raffle refund. Attacker enters the raffle. Attacker calls puppy raffle refund from their attack contract, draining the contract balance. Now here is where, if I'm doing a private audit, I'm probably not copy pasting my test suite. I'm probably just showing the protocol. Hey, here's my test suite, by the way. I might not put it in the actual audit report, but for a competitive audit, we definitely would put this in the audit report. So I'll say proof of code. This, we're gonna do the same thing we did before. We're gonna do a little details, HTML. Summary, actually summary, code section, three back ticks, JavaScript. And I'm just gonna copy the test that we wrote. So reentrancy attacker, where is this? Okay, test reentrancy refund right here. I'll say place the following into puppy raffle test.t.sol. Boom, and this contract as well. Scroll down and we have this contract here. JavaScript, paste looking good. Let's do a little preview. If we scroll down, we got a whole lot of findings in here. Oh, scroll up, I mean, blah, blah, blah. Details, I click the details. Okay, cool, and the proof of code is in there. Okay, great. Recommended mitigation. To prevent this, we should have the puppy raffle refund function update the players array before making the external call. Additionally, we should move the event emission up as well. Because back in here, we also have this audit low. Hey, we should do this as well. I'm just gonna put it in the same finding. You could argue, you could put it in its own finding. In a competitive audit, these would both have the same root cause, the reentrancy. So they would be the same finding, but some people might argue, okay, they're different impacts. Most competitive audits say, hey, if it's the same root cause, it's the same finding. So, but one might argue, oh, the root cause is the fact that the emissions down here. We're just gonna combine them. One might argue they're separate findings, but either way, it's fine. So we're gonna do a little diff, and I'm just going to copy this refund function, paste it in here. Oh, I gotta get rid of all my, all my notes. And what do we wanna do? Well, we wanna move these, uh, excuse me, we wanna move these up here. So maybe I'll paste these here. 
put a plus sign for both of these. And I want to remove these lines here. So we're going to do a little minus sign for these. If I view that, scroll up, code. Yep, okay, that looks nice and great. And we have our write up for this reentrancy attack. All right, let's keep going. Audit, reentrancy written. We put this one in as well. So this one's written. It's next. Audit. If the player is at index zero, it'll return zero and a player might think they're not active. Okay, great. This is going to be a finding. Now let's think about the impact here. So what is the impact? So, so is any, are any funds lost? Well, no, it doesn't really severe. It kind of severely wrecks the protocol. So this might be low or medium. And the, because if I get my index and it says, oh, you're, a, you're unactive, maybe I go ahead and try to enter the lottery again. So the impact we're going to say is medium. Maybe it's even low. Likelihood is going to be low. It's either going to be low or actually high. This is one of these weird ones because it's going to happen. The first player will have an index of zero, but it's only one player. So to me, this might be a medium or a low. And this is where the subjective na nature comes in. Severity medium slash low the subjective nature of this comes in we want to fix it for a private audit severity doesn't really matter for a competitive audit this is where you ask two different judges you might get two different answers but in any case we want to report this so let's go ahead to our layout let's say it's a low just because no money is stolen a user could check storage where they are in the array this is kind of like a nice to have so i think i'm going to argue that i would argue that this is a low I think it would be understandable if somebody said it was a medium. So let's scroll down where we have gas down here. Let's do lows. This is our first low, which is exciting. We'll say L1, puppy raffle, get active player index, returns zero for non-existent players and for players at index zero, causing a player at index zero to incorrectly think they have not entered the raffle. So root cause, impact, classic. What else? Let's copy this. Boom, boom, boom. Description. We're gonna copy this. JavaScript. Paste it in here, get rid of my comment. If a player is in the puppy raffle players array at zero this will return zero or that's yeah that's fine but according to the net spec it will also return zero if the player is not in the array actually let's put that comment in here boom okay looks good impact i'm actually just going to copy this a player at index zero may incorrectly think they have not entered oops they have not entered the raffle and attempt to enter the raffle again, wasting wasting gas. Proof of concept. This is where we could 100 write a POC, write a proof of code, but since it's low, I'm not gonna spend too much time. I'm gonna say one, user enters the raffle. They are the first entrant, puppy raffle, get active player index, returns zero. User thinks they have not entered correctly, due to the function documentation. Recommended mitigations. There's a couple things we could do here. The easiest one, the easiest recommendation would be to revert if the player is not in the array instead of returning zero. You could also reserve the zeroth position for any competition you could also reserve the zero position but a better solution might be to copy this return an int 256 where the function returns negative one if the player is not active so any of these uh, could work awesome done next audit info recommend to follow cei okay We'll do a little, this is definitely informational because we couldn't find a way to actually re-enter the function. So we'll say I4, puppy raffle, select winner, should follow 
CEI. And you'll notice for a lot of our informationals, we don't really follow the best practices for a title because these are kind of less important. Sometimes they can even be a bit subjective. But if we go, if we want to make this super nice, we'll say Poppy Raffle Select Winner does not follow CEI, which is not a best practice, which see, and this is kind of why it doesn't actually have any impact, but it's just like just not best practice. It's best to keep code clean and see this is where it gets a little bit subjective. What is code clean? and follow CEI, maybe I'll do a little diff, paste it in here, and we'll say, boop, boop, subtract these two lines, put it underneath the safe mint. Boom. Okay, cool. Written. Audit randomness. Okay, yep, 100%. We did a lot of stuff on this. We already wrote the POC. Let's go do this right up. Let me grab the finding layout. So this is not a verifiably random number. Let's talk, let's let's think what's the impact and then what is the likelihood? Okay, well the impact of this is gonna be high, right? Because if the winner can be predicted or changed, does that severely break the functionality of the protocol? Yes, and it could cause somebody to win the money erroneously. Likelihood is also probably high. Why? Because people are going to be self-interested to try to hack this protocol. They're going to want to figure out how to cheat it. So impact high, likelihood high. This is definitely a high. So let's scroll up to our highs. Reentrancy is going to be a big one. I think this is going to be worthy of high H2. You know, the actual ordering doesn't matter too much. But these are both highs nonetheless. So it's going to be H2. Okay, root cause plus impact. We might even borrow from Slither. I look for RNG, weak RNG, do it all module, can be influenced by miners. So we might say weak randomness in puppy raffle, select winner, allows users to influence or predict the winner. Description, hashing message.sender, block.timestamp, and block.difficulty. Difficulty together creates a predictable final number. A predictable number is not a good random number. Malicious users can manipulate these values or know them ahead of time to choose the winner of the raffle themselves. And I'll even put a note. This means users could front run this function and call refund if they see they are not the winner. This additionally, we're going to talk about front running and MEV later on in the course, but this also causes this attack vector here. Okay, impact. Any user can influence the winner of the raffle. Winning the money and selecting the rarest puppy. Ah, also, we use some randomness down here too, actually. So one could argue these are two different write-ups. Uh, I might just combine them here. So weak randomness puppy allows users to influence or predict the winner and influence or predict the winning puppy, right? Because each puppy has different rarity. We're also using bad randomness for the rarity of the puppy. So both of those are bad randomness. So I'm going to combine them into one. They do have slightly different root causes. So in any case, and selecting the rarest puppy. Making the entire raffle worthless if it becomes a gas war as to who wins the raffles. Proof of concept. Okay, a few things here. Validators can know ahead of time the block.timestamp and block.difficulty and use that to predict when slash how to participate. And then I would even say see the, so this is the Solidity developer blog on Prevrando. Also in the EIP itself, we looked at the Prevrando EIP. Blog on Prevrando now, because block.difficulty was recently replaced, replaced with Prevrando. And then two, users can mine slash manipulate their 
message.sender value to results in their address being used to generate the winner. And this would be, if we really wanted to write a proof of code, this is where we would do it. We would fuzz the message.sender so that we become the winner. And then three, users can revert their select winner transaction if they don't like the winner or resulting puppy. So I'm kind of combining a few different attack vectors here into one. I'm also going to reference a blog that I wrote a while ago. I'm also going to say using on chain values as a randomness seed is a well documented attack vector. The blockchain space. Okay, my recommended mitigation, if you watch the Foundry full course, you already know what I'm going to say here. Consider using a cryptographically provable random number generator such as Chainlink VRF. And I might link to Chainlink VRF there. Nice. Okay. What is next? Boom. Written. Audit info. Why not just do address this dot balance? Yeah, we might want to do that. I'm going to skip this one for now because it's not, it's not super important and it'd be informational and I don't feel like doing it. So I'm going to say report skipped. <laughs> it's not a big deal. Uh, audit magic numbers. Yes. OK, this is going to be informational for sure. Scroll to the bottom. I five five use of magic numbers is discouraged. It can be confusing to see number literals in a code base, and it's much more readable if the numbers are given a name. I'm just going to put some examples here. JavaScript. Instead, you could use, I probably would be a little bit more verbose here, but being a little bit lazy with this. And that's OK, because it's a private audit and in a private audit, you can kind of be a little bit lazy if you're tight with the protocol. And I'm going to pretend I'm tight with the protocol and be like, hey, guys, you got to fix this. Cool. And we're being a little bit lazy here, but it's for educational purposes. It's fine. You can read my report for the for the full thing. All right, next audit overflow. Big one. We actually have two issues. There's an overflow issue here and there's an unsafe cast. We did a whole lot of work to understand these. So let's go ahead. Let's write the report here. Let's first figure out the severity. So if this overflows, we learn that we're actually going to lose a ton of money. Losing money is usually high impact. We don't like losing a ton of money. So the impact is going to be high. What's the likelihood? It might be low or medium. I think we'd argue this is medium. We want this protocol to be very successful. We want them generating lots of fees. So let's say the likelihood is medium. If the whole world uses this raffle, this would definitely be high, right? So let's assume the whole world's going to use this raffle. It's going to be a high severity issue. Let's go ahead, grab this finding layout, and let's do it again. And yes, you as a security researcher, you're going to get real good at writing a whole lot of reports because this is how you prove that you're an absolute badass. So H, what is this, 4, H2, so this is H3. Root cause is going to be integer overflow of Puppy raffle, total fees, loses fees. Root cause, impact rate. In solidity, versions prior to 0 0.8.0, integers were subject to integer overflows. And this is where we might do a little uint64. This is what we did in chisel. My var equals type. 64.max, maybe we even pull up chisel, copy this line. And what does this give us? Gives us this number, do a little boops. My var equals my var plus one. So we're just gonna put my var will be zero. Impact in puppy raffle, select winner. Total fees are accumulated for the fee address to collect later in with draw fees. However, if the total fees variable overflows, the fee address may not collect the correct amount of fees, leaving fees permanently stuck in the contract. We don't love that. 
proof of concept. Now we didn't write a POC for this, but I'm going to tell you that I did. So this is a great time for you to actually practice your POC writing or your proof of code writing. Again, if we go to this audit data branch, go to audit data, we have audit tests in here, proof of codes.t.sol. We scroll down, we have the re entry test, test total fees overflow, and it's a little bit longer, uh, which is why I didn't do it here, but I'm gonna copy paste it into the report here. I challenge you to write it yourself. Proof of concept, details, 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 JavaScript, paste my proof of code in here. And then I'll also do a verbal one. One, we conclude a raffle of four players. We then have 89 players enter a new raffle because I figured out it only takes 89 players for this to happen. And I proved it was 89 players in the proof of code and conclude the raffle. Three total fees will be total fees equals total fees plus UN64 fee. And then I found this out in the POC. Wow, ChatGPT got it right because I wrote this somewhere else. Total fees equals this number plus this number. And this will overflow. Total fees equals, I'm going to copy paste from what I know. So it should not be this weird number. It should be these two add together. But since this is a UN64, it overflows. And then finally, you will not be able to withdraw due to the line in raffle withdraw fees. So in this withdraw fees, we also have this line. So our, our fees are going to be different from the balance. So we would doubly not be able to withdraw. So we might even kind of combine these into one finding in a competitive audit. These probably would be two finding two findings, but all good. Although you could use self struct to send ETH to this contract in order for the values to match and withdraw the fees. This is clearly not the intended design of the protocol. So we could force fees into this, but after fees reach a certain point, this dot balance will just be higher than total fees because total fees is a UN64 and we'll just be screwed forever. At some point, there will be too much balance in the contract that the above will be impossible to hit. Awesome, proof of code, great. Recommended mitigation. There are a few possible mitigations. One, use a newer version of Solidity, a uint 256 instead of uint 64 for puppy raffle total fees. You could also use a the safe math library of open Zeppelin for version 0.7.6 of Solidity. However, you would still have a hard time with the uint64 type if too many fees are collected. Three, remove the balance check from puppy raffle withdraw fees. We'll do like a little diff. A little minus sign. Just grab this line here, paste it in here. There are more attack vectors with that final require, so we recommend removing it regardless. This is kind of a messy write up. For a competitive audit, we probably would still need to split this out into its own finding because we'd want to get points for it. Nice. OK, we got the overflow. This is also an unsafe cast. We'll need to do a write-up for this. I think this write-up is kind of uninteresting, so I'm actually just going to copy paste my write-up that I already have. Oh, I'm also going to call this M1 for the looping thing. I think the unsafe cast is a medium, so I'm just going to copy paste my write-up. I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit. Boom. This will be our M2. And the reason I think it's kind of uninteresting is because it's very similar to the finding that we just wrote about with the UN64. So they're both bad. But me forcing you to write that here, I don't think it's going to you're not going to learn a whole lot from doing that. So, okay, great. Audit randomness. Okay, we actually combine this with the other randomness one. 
lot of people will, can revert the TX till they win. We kind of talked about this a little bit as well in the randomness. Again, these could be considered two different findings. We kind of combine them into one. Audit, the winner wouldn't get the money if their fallback was messed up. Yep, that is definitely a finding, right? Okay, so what's the impact? The impact is gonna be if somebody wins the lottery, but they don't have a fallback function. If somebody wins the lottery and they're a smart contract and they forget to do a fallback or receive function, that transaction will revert. Okay, not the end of the world. Somebody else could just enter and then win the lottery. It would suck though. It could waste a lot of gas. Like let's say most people entered the lottery and they were all smart contract wallets. It could potentially take a really long time to select a winner. I guess not really because we can manipulate the winner. Um, so the impact for this might be might be medium, right? It severely disrupts the functionality of the protocol. It's going to make it really hard to start a new lottery if there are all these people in here with smart contract wallets that keep reverting. I think the likelihood might be low as it would be kind of expensive. It would really suck and there would have to be a lot of users who didn't know this. In any case, it's not great. All right, so let's do this right up. I'm going to do a bit of a lazy write up here, but I think doing this one is also important. So we're going to grab our finding. So let's grab our finding layout, paste it in here. I'm going to say medium. This will be a medium three. I think title is going to be smart contract wallet raffle winners without a receive or a fallback function will block the start of a new contest description. The puppy raffle select winner function is responsible for resetting the lottery. However, if the winner is a smart contract wallet that rejects payment, the lottery would not be able to to restart. Users could easily call the winner function again and non wallet entrance could enter, but it could cost a lot due to the duplicate check and a lottery reset could get very challenging. Impact, the puppy raffle select winner function could revert many times, making a lottery reset difficult. Severe disruption of the functionality. Also, true winners would not get paid out and someone else could take their money. Proof of concept. I'm actually going to copy paste this one just because I don't think me talking this out is that helpful. 10 smart contract wallets enter the lottery without a fallback function or receive function. The lottery ends. The select winner function wouldn't work even though the lottery is over. Recommended mitigations. I'm also going to copy paste this because it's not that interesting. But there is this one interesting part. A user, a protocol could just not allow smart contract wallet entrance. I don't recommend this because we want, for example, multi-sigs to work with this protocol. So a better recommendation here, I think, would be create a mapping of addresses to payout amounts so that winners could pull the funds out themselves with a new claim prize function. Putting the onus on the winner to claim the prize. And this is actually a really good pattern known as pull over push. Ideally, you want users to have to pull their money out themselves as opposed to you pushing them the money. Because if you have to push them the money, exactly this might happen, right? Where they have a revert or something like that and they don't actually let you send the money. So this is just a good best practice anyways. We're almost there, getting real close. Okay, so I marked this as a medium. We're getting so close, okay. It is difficult to withdraw fees if there are players. There's some MB, MEV here. Uh, this is also mishandling of ETH. We kind of talked about this a little bit. I probably would still do this as a write-up. I definitely would do this as a write-up, but like I said, I'm not teaching you about MEV yet, so I'm going to say skipped. There is what's called a griefing attack here, and you'll see this in the auto report as well. I'm not going to go over it, but you should read this in the auto report that I put up. And because we already talked about how this line is terrible anyways. But since we have this check in here, if somebody calls enter raffle, this will have money in it. So it can become incredibly hard for this person to withdraw fees because this line is here, right? If these aren't directly equal, this function will fail. So this is just a bad line for like a million reasons. We've already explained the protocol that we need to pull it out. So I'm going to skip it. But 
ideally you would say, hey, this this line enables griefing as well. And you can put that on the report that that users could just be be jerks and not let you withdraw your money. Just instantly enter the raffle every time a new raffle starts. Right. That would suck. And you'd never be able to get your money out. So cool. We're missing events. We're definitely missing events. So we would definitely put this in the findings. I'm going to kind of skimp over it because, again, this is an informational. So I might say I six state changes are missing events. And there's a lot of tools that do this already. But anytime you change the state, you really want to emit an event. We're not doing that. A Darren also talks about how event is missing index fields. We might want to put that into a report as well. This will be in the actual audit report in the GitHub repo associated with this. I'm going to skip writing it for now. But finally, is active players. This is dead code. So they pick this up as well. This is going to be an informational or a gas optimization. Either one works. I'm just going to put as informational dot 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 i7. I would just say what is this function? Puppy raffle is active player is never used and should be removed. Maybe I explain why here, blah, blah, whatever. But with that being said, more or less finished our write up. I'm just going to copy paste most of what we have now. We have more or less finished our write up. Let's turn it into a PDF and then stick this on our site. For some of the ones that I skimped over, like I said, you can come to the actual audit data branch, go to the audit data folder and add in the missing pieces if you want. Try to do the write ups yourself, whatever you want to do. But let's go up to our audit data folder and let's finish this up. We're going to go to this audit report templating to remember how to do all this. Copy paste some stuff in. We can grab stuff from password store. So first off, we're going to need that PDF logo. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to copy paste Cypher and logo in here. You can add whatever you want. Add your findings to a markdown file like reports.md. So let's go to part example.md. Let's see the raw of this. Let's just copy the whole thing. I'll do report formatted dot md paste that in here we'll change this to you know november 1st 2023 packages blah 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 blah, blah cypher okay cool the puppy raffle auto report great leader auditors you blah 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 protocol summary go to the readme I'm going to cheat. Maybe you actually write the protocol summary. Disclaimer looks good. Risk classification looks good. Audit details might go to the readme as well. OK, right here, I'm just going to copy this, paste it in here. Scope right here. We got the roles already. Boom, right here. We know that this doesn't work. So we'll change that. Okay, executive summary. I loved auditing this, blah, 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 whatever you want to write here. Auditing this code base. Patrick is such a wizard at writing intentionally bad code, whatever you want to do here. Issues found. We're going to cheat a little bit here as well. The audit data. We're going to cheat. We're going to grab this. To grab oh not that we're gonna grab this come back what do we find let's go back to our findings we got a high 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 medium 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 low gas gas info 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 infos okay cool so seven infos three highs three mediums in the actual audit report in the github repo we might have a couple of more Three highs, three mediums, one low, two gas, seven, three highs, three mediums, one low, seven info, two gas, total, six, seven, 14, 15, 16 total findings. Now, in a competitive audit setting, that is a badass number, by the way. That is phenomenal to see. Granted, seven of them are info. Still, this is great. So now, we'll just grab our findings. Just make sure these are formatted correct. Copy them. 
paste that in findings. Okay, we have dot dot high M1 medium L1 low gas I1 informational slash non crits. We have a nice looking report here in Markdown with our weird Pandoc stuff in it. Let's do the final step, which is gonna be, if we go back to the readme. Great, we've added our findings. We have those installed. We have this. We have Logopedia. Let's copy this, jump this, CD audit data, paste it in. I think we changed the name from report example. Oops, Pandoc. I think we named it report formatted.md. Let's run it, see if it worked. Looks like it did. And if you have the PDF extension installed, oops, puppy raffle audit report with this beautiful looking PDF of all our wonderful findings. Uh, amazing. And with that being said, congratulations. You have a phenomenal audit report that you can add to your portfolio. What are you gonna do? You're gonna grab this file. You're gonna go back, go to your GitHub, go to your profile, open this up, and you're gonna add that PDF, the markdown, whatever you wanna do into here. If we look at github.com slash Cyphrin, let's go to the repos in here, audit, even orgs have templates. Boom, start that up, audit, Cyphrin audit reports. This readme is very outdated, um, but if you go to reports, got a whole bunch of reports in here, reports MD, some more reports in here. Everybody has an audit reports repo to show off how dope they are. So you should make one too. Audit firms do it, so will auditors do it. This is how you market yourself. So add this to your portfolio. If you wanna call it your training audit report, you can do that as well, but add it, you've done the work. Huge congratulations. Now is a great time to go get some ice cream because I know there was a lot of work here Remember, the bigger thing is we're preventing hacks from happening on this protocol. We're preventing the attackers from ruining our glorious space that is Web3. So congratulations. I'm very excited for you. This is easily my favorite auditing code base. Now, the other thing that we can do here, and I know we mentioned this before, is in the exploits minimized Git repo. If we scroll down, if you want more challenges, if you want to see more examples of these exploits, we have these minimal examples in Remix. You know, we have reentrancy, mishandling of ETH, weak randomness, access controls, and more. We have a link to Remix in here for you to play with them on Remix. And then we have Ethernaut, damn vulnerable DeFi, and case studies. Let me explain ETH real quick. So Ethernaut is this game. You do have to be a bit of a JavaScripty person because you have to do some stuff in JavaScript here, but it is a phenomenal way to practice your skills in a more gamified version. All of these code bases in here, if we go just to the, oops, just to the home place, all of these, there's all these games in here and it's blocked by this, by this fun little thing here. All of these games are a way for you to practice some exploit and practice learning about how this works. I highly recommend you start with Hello Ether so you can actually learn how to interact with this. You will have to do some hard hatty JavaScripty stuff. So if you're not familiar with that, maybe don't, do that, but you can also just deploy the contracts, interact with them on Etherscan or Forge or whatever you want to do. You don't have to do everything via the browser console, although that's definitely the easiest way to do it. So Ethernaut is a great game for practicing out some of these exploits if you want to learn more. And so we have in here some different exploits and a place where you can practice if you're unfamiliar with how they work. The other place is Damn Vulnerable DeFi. So for reentrancy, for example, we have this damn vulnerable DeFi page. This is challenge number four. We can see the contracts, and this is the contract that you would be practicing this on. The damn vulnerable DeFi ones are definitely more challenging. Ethernaut ones are a little bit easier. Damn vulnerable DeFi, a little bit harder, especially because most of the time they are DeFi related. But if you want to complete the challenge, these are also written in hard hat. So we have this it execution bit here where you can complete the challenge. So Somebody should rewrite this in Foundry so that you all can follow along these in Foundry. But in any case, you don't even have to do the write up here. What you could also do is you could also just copy paste the contracts. You know, for example, you could copy paste this into your own Forge project 
and try to figure out how to break it because right in the page, it'll give you the setup. Hey, a surprisingly simple pool that allows anyone to deposit ETH and withdraw it at any time. It has a thousand ETH in the balance already and is offering free flash loans using the deposited ETH to promote their system. Starting with one ETH in the balance, pass the challenge by taking out ETH from the pool. And this would be a way to learn in a kind of a challenge method how to solve the puzzles. So, and then finally in this code base as well, we have this case studies with a link to some case studies for reentrancy attacks. Our man Pascal has a updated list which is unfortunately massive. So if you want to see some of these attacks in the wild and learn from these attacks in the wild, this is where you want to do it. Now that I've given you all this information here, now that you have your report, it's time for some exercises. So there's a whole bunch of exercises for you to do here. Number one, do some Ethernet challenges or some damn vulnerable DeFi challenges. Or if you're like, hey, I don't love hard hat, I can't stand hard hat, uh, maybe skip them. <laughs> but they are phenomenal resources to learn some of these attack vectors. They're phenomenal challenges to do. Yes, you do need JavaScript, but maybe somebody can convince me to re redo them in, in Foundry. We'll see. Number two, sign up for Solidit. So let me talk to you about Solidit real quick and why it is so phenomenal. So this is a quick screenshot of another competitive audit board of another competitive auditor called Code Farina. And this is Hans Fries being the number one for the past 60 days. For 2023, he was also number one for the first half with something like $130 million won or something like that. Just some crazy stats. What he found was that the best way to learn about Web3 security and do better, especially in these competitive audits, was to read the reports of other auditors. So he was using this tool called Solidit to become the number one competitive auditor in the world. And we've created it into a tool to read all reports in one place and be your go to place to learn about security and stay up to date with the latest and greatest. And this 100 percent is a must do for people who want to get better at security and especially for people who want to get better at competitive audits. Studying the latest and greatest findings is the way you're going to stay ahead of the game and continue to keep the attackers at bay. This is the tool that people are using to continue to learn. So first, you'll need to sign up. And great, once you're in, this is the interface that you're going to be hit with. It has a findings searching index. So for example, if I wanted to find any things on like re-entrancies that are highs, I can do a search and find other people's reportings between smart contract auditing firms and competitive audits about that finding and learn from these other people who have done these. A lot of people are waking up and seeing the latest and greatest reports on the Solid platform because it aggregates all of these report write-ups. You can go to the audits page, learn more about the multi-phase audit. You see the different contests that are going on. You see a timeline view of the different competitive audits that are going on, like the Viper compiler, the Steadify, and this shows you all the different competitive audits that you can participate in and jump into. It has a search for different bug bounties. Which protocols have bug bounties? What's the rating? How good these bug bounties are? We haven't talked about bug bounties, but we will much later. It has a leaderboard, which aggregates across competitive audits. The top competitive auditors, oh, there we go. Hans is right there, boom, with a crazy amount of money. Um, look, he's, he's the number two right now across all competitive audit boards and he's barely doing competitive audits. Absolutely insane. MPA docs, MPA paper, solid docs. You can also take notes in this about your findings, about other people's findings, whatever you want to do. This is the go-to tool for leveling up as a smart contract security researcher and seeing what's going on in the industry. So if you want to be a successful security researcher, if you want to become the tippity top of smart contract developer, 100%, you got to sign up for solid. It. Great. What's next? Post a tweet. Celebrate your wins. Post a tweet about how you completed the puppy raffle audit. If you click this link, it'll actually auto generate a tweet for you. I'm not signed into Twitter on this account, so I'm not going to click it. You can sign up for Farcaster, which is a more Web3 e social media. And then finally, you should definitely do a Codehawks first flight. Now that you've done this puppy raffle audit, the Codehawks first flights are actually geared towards somebody like you, somebody who understands security, somebody who understands solidity and who wants to get their feet wet with easier, quicker competitive audits to test out and learn and grow. 
So now is a great time in the course to pause the video, try to quickly do whatever first light is active, or if you're feeling especially competitive, you can try a real competitive audit yourself. Or if you want to wait, you can wait because we do have some amazing DeFi security reviews coming. But I want to give you a huge congratulations for getting this far. This is very exciting. And just by getting this far, you now have a feel for what it really feels like to be a security researcher. You're going to be going through code bases. You're going to be doing a lot of report writing. You're going to be looking for vulnerabilities. You're going to be trying to sniff out bugs based off the bugs you've seen historically. And repetition here is the mother of skill. The more you do this, the better you're going to get. So congratulations on getting this far. Be sure to take that break. Be sure to go get some ice cream. And I'll see you here for the next one. Because in the next one, we're going into Invariance and DeFi with T-Swap. It's been fun and games so far. We're about to drastically level up your skill set with Section 5. So take a break, tweet about how you're doing so far, forecast about how you're doing so far, and we'll see you very soon. All right, welcome back to the security and auditing full course. You've just completed the puppy raffle and hopefully you signed up for Codox. And maybe you've looked at the first flights, maybe you've actually looked at a contest, but you're feeling much more confident about your security and auditing journey, which is great. Well, guess what? We've got a lot more to cover. And of course, if you're in the Git repo associated with this course, we can scroll down, we can find section five, invariance and intro to DeFi T-Swap audit. And if we go on down to this, you'll see a whole bunch of red stuff here, a whole bunch of red stop signs. Let me zoom in just a hair here. So we are going to be doing another walkthrough security review, but we're going to do something a little bit different here. For this contest, don't look at the contracts yet. Don't even look at them. We're going to be learning a lot in this section. And one of the big things we're going to be learning about is this thing called invariance. Now, you might have heard invariance before. We, we did talk about them in the Foundry course, but we really didn't explain their importance. And especially when it comes to security, this is where their importance really shines and you as a security researcher really understand them. Now, here's the crazy thing we're going to be learning in this section. So here's the code base that we're going to be working with. This code base, this T-Swap protocol that we're going to be doing a audit or security review on is a modified version of the Uniswap protocol, which is a DEX or a decentralized exchange in DeFi. And what you're going to learn to do is you're going to learn how to find bugs without even looking at the code. Just by understanding what the project does and its invariance, we're going to find bugs. Now, I've Obviously, this shouldn't be the only thing you do in a security review, but we're going to show how important it is and how powerful it can be for our journey. And we're going to be using a ton of incredibly powerful tools like stateful fuzzing, fuzzing, invariance. If you're unfamiliar with FreePy, we're going to learn about that. And of course, if you've never done DeFi, we're going to go under the hood into DeFi. We're going to learn about what an AMM is, Uniswap. Curve Finance, what a constant product formula is. So we're going to be learning a ton here. We're going to be learning so much that we're probably not going to have that much time to do manual review. We're going to do a little bit of manual review, but this section, this section five, is more for us to learn about DeFi and invariance because both of these are incredibly important and can be a little challenging. DeFi in particular, decentralized finance or on-chain finance or whatever you want to call it, can be difficult to pick up. And this can be one of these sections that takes time. And maybe there's a little bit of frustration here. But I'm telling you, you stick with it, you keep learning, you keep growing, and you will get it. A lot of the time, these DeFi and these finance people use big words to make themselves sound smarter, when in reality, the concepts that they're talking about are just basic math. So we're going to be going over some of the math. We're going to break down Uniswap or this T-Swap protocol into easier pieces to understand. And then we're going to actually do a security review on it using some of these phenomenal tools here. And at the end of this, of course, in the audit data section, we're going to have an audit data folder with all of our audit stuff and all of our security reviews for you to review as well. So, and then finally, we're going to learn a ton of new hacks and new exploits. We're going to learn about some different tooling like Echidna, Foundry, Consensus, Mutation Testing, Differential Testing. We're going to learn more about Solid, about properties. We're going to learn some exploits like weird ERC-20s, callbacks, rebates, reentrances, core invariant breakings. And this is going to be a jam-packed session. 
We're going to try to focus as much as we can on DeFi and invariants, and that's gonna be the focus of this section. But at the end of this, you are going to have essentially audited Uniswap V1. In the audit data folder, if we scroll down to test, there's a differential folder in here with the Uniswap exchange dot vi. Yes, the first implementation of Uniswap was actually written in Viper. And you are essentially going to audit the first Uniswap ever created with a couple of my bugs thrown in. So with that being said, buckle up, get your VS code out, get your popcorn ready, and let's dive in to T-Swap. So we're here at the Git repo associated with the course. What we're gonna do is same as always, we're gonna open this up in a new tab and we're gonna copy this and we're gonna clone it into our security course directory. We're gonna do a little git clone, paste it in here. And we're gonna open this up, five T swap audit into its own folder. All right, great, just to make sure, git branch. Great, we are indeed on the main branch. That is going to be our starting branch for this security review. Now, back in, in Puppy Raffle, Puppy Raffle was already set up for us using the basic onboarding, but this is one where we might actually wanna use the extensive onboarding sheet. So remember, here's our extensive onboarding. You can make this however you wanna make it for clients that you work with, but we've actually onboarded T-Swap for you already. And you're gonna learn why some of these extensive onboarding questions are so important. Information is currency when you're doing these security reviews. As much information as possible, you wanna get your darn fingers on. You wanna get your grubby fingers on all the information you can get out there. So we have some basic info, like website. Maybe the website has got some juicy data. A link to the docs, of course. This is absolutely essential. Without doc some type of documentation, this whole thing is worthless. In this code base, the documentation is gonna be our readme point of contact, white paper. We have the commit hash where normally, this is where we would do like git checkout and then paste this in here. But for the purpose of this course, you can just stay on the main branch, but that is what we would need to do normally to make sure we're on the same commit hash. We could do like a diff between, uh, actually I'll even show you what that looks like now. If we do git checkout, paste that here. We do git branch. Okay, now we, I see we're indeed detached. What we do is I could do git diff this and main, and we can actually see a list of the actual diffs between that branch and this branch. It looks like a lot of it's just kind of formatting. So it looks like it's not really a big deal, um, but that is a way that you can say, hey, is there a diff between these two commits? But anyway, so we have the commit hash, number of contracts in scope two. Uh, if we actually scroll down, we have the scope down here, pool factory and T-swap. Let's go check that. Okay, that's the only ones in the SRC. Nice. S-lock, 374. So this is more than double the puppy raffle. So we want to keep this in mind when, when we do do a manual review. How long this takes us to feel comfortable, we should mentally compartmentalize so that we know how long it takes us to do reviews on this size code base or on this complexity sized code base. Now we have some interesting question here. How many external protocols does the code interact with? And this is something that we haven't done yet, but this is one of the things that we're gonna learn about why it's so important in this lesson. Next, overall test coverage, 41%, yikes. So let's see, let's go to the readme. Let's learn how to actually build this. So yeah, 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 docs, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Okay, again, it started Git Founder. We have those cloned. Okay, run, make, great. I have make, let's run make. Looks like it's gonna install a bunch of stuff. I can even hide the terminal, pull up the make file, scroll down. Okay, make is gonna run remove, install, build. Remove installs modules, install, installs Foundry. Okay, cool. Open Zeppelin. Okay, so just Foundry to open Zeppelin. Okay, cool. And then forge build. Okay, cool. Okay, we get some warnings. Maybe we'll check those out in a little bit. Maybe that could be an issue right there. But let's run forge coverage, see what the coverage of this project is. Okay, it's pretty bad, right? So looking down here, immediately, if we're doing a private review, we're panicking. We're going, oh my goodness, this protocol does not write unit tests. 40% of functions, 37% of branches, they are not running enough tests. If we're doing a competitive audit, we're going, oh my goodness, yay, there are bugs probably all over the place. So just by looking at the coverage here. So check it. Let's, uh, let's go back to main. Oops, get checkout main. Oops, sorry, let's get stash. Sorry, get checkout main. Cool. Now let's run make and now let's install all this stuff. Okay, great. 
Now we can go back to the onboarded dock while it's installing. Great. Menu 220, blah, blah. Okay, cool. Scope contracts. So it's just these ones. Now I gave a new command for this lesson called scope and scope file. So if I run, if I pull up the terminal, it looks like everything is built. Nice. If I run make scope, we're going to get this output here. And the reason I added this to our make file is because these hashtags work very well in the pandoc that we use. Now, if I run make scope file and I go over here, we now have this scope.txt. This is another way for us to format our scope. We're not using kind of the hashtags or the dashes or anything. It looks like that. You can use either one. I kind of like putting this into the report, but you know, really whatever you want to do. Okay, so we have the scope. Nice. And we're learning a little bit more about the protocol. Now, these questions, you're going to see why these are going to become more important for this security review. The product a fork of an existing protocol. The answer is yes here, but for this course, we're going to pretend no. It's actually a fork or a rewrite of the Uniswap V1, which is why it's so great, though. You get to learn about how Uniswap actually works with a couple of my bugs planted in it. But for now, we're going to pretend that it's not a fork. This is a brand new protocol and you're reviewing it from scratch. Does the pro project use ropes? No, we'll learn why this is important. Will the project be multi-chain? No, we'll learn why that's important later on in the course. For now, it's just an ETH deployment. We're not using any oracles, any zero knowledge proofs, but we are going to be interacting with ERC-20 tokens. And once we explain the protocol, you'll understand why we are going to do a Uniswap refresher. No NFTs. Yes, ERC-777s. You'll learn about that in a bit. No off-chain processes, etc. Now, here is where when you're talking to a protocol, it gets interesting. When you onboard a protocol, you do want to ask them about protocol risks. You want to ask them, remember, communication with these protocols is paramount. The more communication, the more you can talk to these teams and more you have a direct line of communication, the better. So we want to be asking them these questions like, hey, what risks are there? Should we evaluate, you know, rogue protocol admin capturing fees? What are we doing about inflationary, deflationary, your C20s? What about fee on transfer tokens, rebasing tokens? In this section, we'll understand all of this. But what's going to happen a lot of times is a protocol is going to go, what are you talking about? What do you mean? What do you mean? My protocol is amazing. I wrote the code. It is so phenomenal. You're not going to find anything. Obviously, that's ridiculous. We are going to find stuff. Known issues. This protocol thinks they're the bee's knees, so they're saying none. They've never had an audit report before. This, again, is really good for you. If you know what some historical issues are in a competitive audit, you'll ignore the known issues, obviously. And previous audit reports can actually give you a ton of context. And typically, you want to read these previous audit reports. Again, this is all part of the building context. Uh, resources. This protocol has none. Uh, and obviously, you know, for now, we're just going to skip the rec test. This protocol has none. But this is where what you're going to do is you're going to pop open your telegram and you're going to say, hey, guys, can we do a walkthrough? Can we get some charts? Can we get an explainer video? Can we get a blog? Can we get something? So we have the readme and we're going to go through this, but we're going to see pretty quickly that it's not as good as it should be. So we're actually going to pretend to be the protocol and we're actually going to walk through a design, a video, et cetera. And I want to make this absolutely crystal clear. When you're working with these protocols, when you're in a competitive environment or a private audit environment, you need to be asking questions. The developers of the protocol are always going to have more context than you will ever have over the code base. So asking them questions is going to quickly make your job easier and allow you to ramp up much faster. It's not a crutch. You're not cheating. Obviously, you want to go through the code base yourself and try as hard as you can to figure stuff out. But when you can't, you need to ask the protocol. And in the beginning of the review, you need to make it known, hey, I'm going to ask you questions. If you're doing a private audit, if you're doing a competitive audit, you need to tell them, hey, people are going to ask you questions. Now, obviously, you don't want to ask them like, hey, like, what's a UN256, right? You want to make good uses of their time, but asking questions is very good. And then ideally, if you're doing a private audit, they 100% should have answers to the rec test, and they should have some answers to some post-deployment planning. If you're doing a competitive audit, this might not happen, but the extensive onboarding as well answers a lot of those questions too. Great. So now that they are onboarded, not as well as they should be, but that's okay. But now that they're on board, now we can actually go into the, the documentation and start to get some context. Now, remember, we're actually going to do some security reviewing of this code base without actually ever opening these up, which sounds insane. I know, but it's because we're going to understand protocol invariants. Now, before we actually go into writing test suites and understanding protocol invariants, first, let's go through the documentation. Let's walk through this, and then we're going to add 
diagrams and videos and stuff where the docs don't do a great job. Like I was saying, this T-Swap protocol is based off of Uniswap. So we're actually going to learn a ton about Uniswap, how these things called AMMs work and decentralized exchanges work. So if you've never done a DeFi security review, this is all part of the job. If this was a raffle, you need to know about raffles. This is a decentralized exchange, so we need to know about decentralized exchanges. Let's start reading and understanding the documentation. This product is meant to be a permissionless way for users to swap assets between each other at a fair price. At the end of the day, this is essentially all the T-Swap aims to do. This is the highest level of abstraction. I'm a user. I have 10 USDC. I would want to I want to sell the USDC and use it to buy WETH, right? So even more simply, you know, I have dollars and I want to buy wrapped ether or WETH, or this is the ERC20 equivalent of ETH. If you're unfamiliar with WETH, now's a great time to look it up. We talked about it in my previous course, but essentially it's just an ERC20 version of Ethereum. But that's all you're doing, right? Or more simply, user starts with 10 USDC and zero WETH, they do a swap and they end with zero USDC and one WETH. So that's what they want to do. You can think of T-Swap as a decentralized asset token exchange. So this T-Swap or, or Uniswap, which is what it's based off of, is going to be something like Coinbase, something like Robinhood, where you can do these swaps and stuff. But instead, it's going to be a decentralized asset token exchange. These are often known as DEXs. You go to DeFi Llama, which is a popular site that tracks decentralized finance protocols. And we scroll down and we can see there's a, a DEXs section. And if you click on DEXs, there's actually a whole lot of different DEXs like Uniswap, Curve, PancakeSwap, Balancer, Sun, Sushi, etc. that all have different code bases. But these are all different type of decentralized exchanges. And they all have different things for pros and cons about each one of them. T-Swap is known as an automated market maker, an AMM. And there's a link here to an article on Chainlink Labs if my explanation doesn't explain it to you. And even right here, Maybe the, the docs here aren't good enough, and maybe you'd go back to protocol and be like, hey, you need to explain AMM better. Hey, where can I learn about this AMM thing? Where can I learn more about this? I'm going to give you the rundown of the AMM, though, of course, in a bit. And there's also this video, Uniswap Explained. This is a video from Whiteboard Crypto. It's a great video that explains Uniswap on a very high level on how it all works. So if you're unfamiliar with Uniswap, you're unfamiliar with AMMs, I would definitely pause the video right now and go check this out. Automated market makers are different from a normal order book style exchange and instead uses pools for an asset similar to Uniswap. To understand Uniswap, please watch this video. Great. So now I'm going to explain automated market makers and how a DEX works differently from an order book style exchange. But if any of this is confusing, please use these resources that I've linked here. Additionally, you know to come to the discussions tab in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Go to discussions, ask some questions, talk about how you're confused, etc. Now, before we explain what an AMM is, let's learn what how an order book style exchange actually works, right? Because this is more similar. This is going to be more familiar to kind of like what a basic exchange sounds like. Right? When you go to Coinbase, Robinhood, et cetera, what does that actually look like? So in an order book style exchange, a user might come to this exchange and say, hey, I want one WETH for 10 USDC. And they're going to place a trade on the exchange. And what they're going to do is they're going to place a trade and it's going to go on this order book thing. So now in this order book, there's this trade here that says, hey, somebody wants 10 USDC for one WETH. So this is user, let's say this is user A, and this is going to be user A's trade, right? So now maybe user B comes along, has one WETH, zero USDC, and goes, oh, well, I want to take that trade. That sounds good to me. And what they're going to do, they're going to submit their trade for one WETH for 10 USDC. And the order book's going to go, oh, wait, these are the same trade. Let's do it, right? This person wants 10 USDC. This person wants one WETH. They both have the funds. So the exchange goes, okay, great. Give me that 10 USDC. I'm going to give it to user B. Give me the WETH. I'm going to give it to user A. These are now good. We can take these off the order books. Obviously, now we're going to update your balances. So your WETH, 10 USDC. Huzzah. We're happy now. Users have made their trades. User A and user B are happy. They've swapped assets, essentially. Now, this order book model is great. It works very well. It's what centralized exchanges like Coinbase and Robinhood have used for a very long time. However, it has an issue. And what's that issue? Well, that issue is going to be gas. It's going to be the EVM, right? Every single time users go to do this, 
you know, if a user wanted to do an order book style exchange on Ethereum, every single time they post an order, that's going to cost gas. Somebody taking the order, that's going to cost gas. It's not going to be instant. They're going to have to wait multiple transactions. It's going to get very expensive very quickly. And users aren't going to want to use this exchange because there's so many transactions and it's so long and it's hard to do all the math. Additionally, over here on the exchange side, the exchange has to do some pretty smart stuff to match up these orders with each other or you have to take an order this is like market making market taking i'm not going to get into that but there's a whole lot more computation that needs to happen on this order book style exchange that makes it very difficult for it to happen on ethereum so ethereum says okay well what if we did something else let's let's do something let's do something different so let's let's go back to our starting points user a is 10 usdc zero weth user b has one weth zero usdc and they still want the other one right actually i should swap these around to make this clearer so the question is okay so basically we want to answer these two questions how do we do this this whole process up here in one transaction because up here the order book the exchange is kind of doing a lot of work right to match these up and and this is there's kind of two transactions when you go to the coinbase ui this happens kind of seamlessly because the centralized unit is doing all this but this is DeFi. we want to be decentralized so how can we do this exchange bit in one transaction and how do we keep these costs down? Well, what people have come up with is this new thing called, you know, AMMs, which is, you know, I'm going to now delete these. Now we're going to talk about AMMs. And this is where the AMM or the automated market maker style comes in. There's a whole bunch of different automated market maker styles, but I'm going to give you the gist of it. Instead of there being an order book and people being placing orders and buying kind of selling from each other, what can happen? and stay with me here, is let's pretend that there's two giant pools of money, if you will. One pool has, or, or reservoirs, or wells, if you will. One has 100 WETH, and one has 1,000 USDC. User A still has 10 USDC, and they want to buy one WETH with this 10 USDC. If we look at these two reserves, or these two wells, or these two reservoirs, we can actually look at the ratio of WETH to USDC in here. Do a little bit of math. We could say, okay, 1,000 USDC divided by 100 WETH is 10. So that means that right now the ratio of WETH to USDC is 10, right? Or another way we could put this is we could say one WETH equals 10 USDC if we're just looking at the ratio of these two wells. Now, this might be a little bit confusing, but stick with me here. So, what if instead of doing this order book thing, we use the ratio of these wells to create kind of a mock price. So what if we said this and we say, hey, you can take a token off one of these piles so long as you put the correct number of tokens based on this ratio into the other pile. OK, that, that might be kind of confusing, but let's I don't know, let's let's try it out with this rule here. I want to take one weth out of this pile, but my smart contract has this rule. You can only take a token off a pile if you put the correct ratio into the other pile. We'll put what? We'll send the 10 USDC and we'll stick it into this pile. So this will be 1000 plus 10 USDC. And then now that we've stuck 10 into here, we can now use this ratio to grab a token back. So now that we've done this bit, we can say, okay, cool. I put the 10 USDC in. Now back, I can get one WETH because that's what the ratio is telling me I can do. So one WETH. So now this is going to be 100 minus 1 WETH. So me doing this, now I get the desired result. I now have 0 USDC and I have 1 WETH. Which means this is no longer the ratio though. The ratio has changed. The ratio is now what? It's now, there's now 99 in here and 1,010. So let me pull out the calculator. So let me pull out the calculator here. So we have 1,010 USDC divided by... 99 WETH. Oh, the ratio is a little bit different now. Now we're saying one WETH equals, what did the calculator say? 10.2 USDC. 10.2. 10.2 USDC. Because we've changed the ratio here. So now this is going to be 99. This is going to be 1010. This makes sense, right? The more people buy an asset, typically the price goes up, right? Supply and demand. User A wanted one WETH, their demand caused the price to go up. 
the supply of USDC went up, so the price went down, right? Classic supply and demand, classic economics here. So just by this buy going through, we've essentially moved the market, if you will. We've created a new price here. This is a minimalist example of how an automated market maker works. It uses these pools and has this bit encoded into a smart contract saying you're allowed to swap assets so long as you keep the ratio between the tokens the same. And if user A bought a ton of USDC, and if user A bought a ton of WETH, they would keep driving the price of WETH up, obviously, because supply and demand. And this way, we don't have to do any order book stuff. We can just have these pools of tokens as long as the ratio between them stays the same and users can swap like this. Now, obviously, if you bought one WETH and you change the price by 20 cents, you would be a, a god and be able to manipulate the market a lot. The number of pools that we've demoed here is probably too small, right? If you could buy one Ethereum and change the price of the Ethereum by 20 cents, you would be able to manipulate the market however you want. So these pool sizes are probably too small, but hopefully this gets the idea across. But now let's take this new state and let's apply it with user B, right? So this is the, the new state of the world, right? This has all happened. This has already gone through. User A's money's in there. The new price has been updated. This rule still applies, but now user B still wants the USDC. So what do they do? Well, they're going to do the same thing. They say, okay, I want 10 USDC, but I need to stick the correct ratio onto the pile. So what do they do? Well, what they're going to do is first, they're going to stick their one WETH into the WETH pile. So this is once again going to be 99 plus one because they have their WETH that they can stick onto the pile. And then this USDC, they're going to get the correct ratio back. Now, what's interesting though is how much USDC are they going to get back? Well, we got to look at what the ratio currently is, and it actually changed from our last transaction up here. So instead of them getting 10 USDC back, let's figure out how much they'll get back. Well, if they put on one WETH, the ratio is one WETH equals 10.2 USDC. So instead of getting 10 back, they're actually going to get 10.2 back because that's what the ratio now is. So now this is going to be this minus 10.2. They're going to get 10.2 and they're going to lose that one WETH because they sent it in and boom, they've made the trade. But now we can update the price again. No longer the price. So what's the price now? Well, calculator. So we have 1010 minus 10.2, right? 99.8. So we're going to have 999.8 divided by 100. And this is going to be the new price down here. So now we have one WETH equals 9.998 USDC. 9.998 USDC, because this is now the new ratio. And this is how an AMM essentially works. Now, this is known as the a constant product AMM, but we'll learn about that more in a little bit. So this is essentially how an AMM works. Now, there's a couple other important points to think about when we're doing this. Every time we do one of these trades in a lot of popular AMMs, we also take out a percentage fee. So maybe like a 0.03% fee. So maybe instead of being just sending one WETH, they would send 0.97 WETH and a 0.03 WETH fee, which would go to either its own location or maybe it stays in the pool and they just lose it. But a lot of them have this fee that they put in here. Now you might be thinking, hey, there's an infinite money glitch here. I can just keep swapping and keep making more money on the way back. There's some other mathematical safeguards that we'll go into a little bit that make it so that you can't just keep swapping back and forth and always make more money. Now, why is having a fee so important? Well, remember over here, there's a giant pool of 1,000 USDC and 100 WETH just kind of sitting here. Where'd that money come from? Why is it just sitting here? Well, let's do another little explainer down here. So here was the initial state of the protocol. And remember, all of this is inside of a smart contract, right? This is the T-Swap protocol or the Uniswap protocol, which is based off of, this is all on chain. This is, a, you know, all in a smart contract. How did these originally get, get here? Well, well, let's go to the other side here. So this smart contract is deployed and says, hey, we have these two pools in here. Hey, we have these two pools in here. Well, there are people who see this. They see this 0.03 WETH fee and they go, they say, hold on, hold on just a minute. This protocol is making fees from transactions. Who's getting those fees? I want some of those fees. How do I get some of those fees? Well, it's the people who put their money into the protocol who get those fees. 
So this 100 WETH and this 100 USDC came from something called a liquidity provider. Somebody needs to put money into this protocol so that people can come in and do this swap thing that we just explained. So let's say this is the current state of the pool. What somebody might do, maybe liquidity provider A, let's say they have 1,000 USDC and they have 100 WETH and they go, hey, I want to park this money somewhere and I want to start gaining a return on my investment. What they could do is they could dump that whole thing in here. So this would be 1,000 plus 1,000, 2,000 USDC and 100 plus 100. They could dump all their money in here. And since they have 1,000 and 100, they're going to have zero USDC. They're going to have zero WETH, but they're going to have a 50% ownership claim of these pools because they have 50% of the ownership. This 50% ownership comes in the form of a token itself. So actually the protocol is going to say, hey, oh my goodness, thank you so much for sending us all this stuff here. Why don't you go ahead and have some WETH USDC LP token, a liquidity provider token. So maybe it gives them back 100 LP tokens. And this represents their claim on the total pool. How do we know it's 50%? We can look at the total of LP tokens. So liquidity provider A has 100. Somebody who put the original 1,000 and 100 WETH in has the other, and that's going to be our liquidity provider B, who originally put in the original 100 and the original 1,000. They're also going to have 100 LP tokens. And so since there's a total of 100 LP tokens, you can see liquidity provider A has 50%, liquidity provider B has 50%. So this is this LP token, that, which represents the share of the protocol. So now that this is the new situation of the world, let's say that liquidity provider C comes along and they have about half of what A and B put in. But they want to be part of this because they're seeing these fees come in and don't worry, we'll learn about how the fees work in just a minute. So they come in and they see this. How many LP tokens are they going to get, right? Well, they're going to take their 500 USDC and their 50 WETH. They're obviously going to stick it into these pools here. So now we're going to say plus 500. And for this one, we're going to say plus 50. So now this is going to equal 250 in the WETH pool. And this is going to equal 2,500 total in the USDC pool. So, so they're going to get some LP tokens. Now they have zero and zero. How many are they going to get back? Well, do a little bit of math here. So they have 500 divided by 2,500, 0.2% of the USDC pool. And if we do the math over here, they put in 50 divided by 250, still 0 0.2. So they hold 0.2% of all the money in these pools over here. So they're going to get 0.2% of all LP tokens. Well, we're going to do some more math. There are currently 200 LP tokens, and this is the math we would do. So there's currently 200 LP tokens. So X over 200 plus X equals 0.2 over one. So we do the math here. This is where our AI like ChatGPT can come into play. We just say, hey, evaluate this X over 200 plus X equals 0 0.2 over one. Or you can just do the math out yourself. A lot of this math stuff is where AI is really, really helpful, right? This is super simple math. There's a billion docs on this. So they even show you kind of exactly how to do it if you're not as good as algebra. But now we get the value for X to satisfy these, this equation, X equals 50. So this is where we go, okay, they get 50 LP tokens, which makes sense. Now a total of 250 tokens and the LP tokens right now resemble, they match the WETH amounts over here. And that's how much the protocol would give us. Now, we have all these LP tokens and stuff. All these protocols have money in the pot, right? And now we can even just dump this. We can just say, hey, all right, there's 250 WETH and there is 2,500 USDC. Now we can go back to our, our little trading example. I'll even zoom out just a hair. Back to our trading example, and we can talk about fees now. So again, why are, are these people so excited to stick their money in these pools, right? Why do they, why do they want to do this? Well, if we copy this again, let's copy these transactions here. Just copy paste this, paste like this. Remember, we have this little fee that goes in here. So what's going to happen is actually this ratio is going to slightly change every single time. So what happens in practice is that these pools actually slowly start to accumulate value. You know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. They slowly start to accumulate value. And as they're accumulating value, these people still have claims to their underlying original investment plus whatever fees come in. So let's look at an example one more time. Now that we have a much bigger starting amounts over here. So this is the whole enchilada here. So the price right now is still the same. One WETH is 10 USDC. How do we know? Well, let's do this ratio math again. Two 
five zero zero divided by two fifty, right? Ten. One weth equals ten USDC. There's a whole bunch of money in this pools already. User A, let's reset our user A friend. They have ten and zero. Once again, user B has zero and one. Zero and one. They want to now swap their ten for one weth. So we're gonna do the same thing. They're gonna send in ten and they're gonna get one back. So 10 USDC, they're gonna get one weth back. However, they're gonna get charged this fee, right? So now there's this 10 USDC plus 0 0.03, which is gonna be 0 0.3 USDC. So if they don't have this, this transaction would fail if they wanna send the 10 USDC. Or this would get docked down to you know 9.7 or something, but for now, let's just pretend that they are actually starting with 10.3 to make the math a little bit easier. So 10 USDC and plus 0 0.3 USDC. So now this pool, we're gonna add 10, 0.3 and now this pool is going to subtract the one so this is going to be now 249 and boom so now these bump up and they look like so so now we have the ratio is going to be a little bit different you can actually delete this but now we have a slightly different amount in here so what happens when one of the lp providers go to withdraw well remember this person has 20 percent of all lp tokens so if they were to withdraw all their LP tokens, they would get 20% of the money back. Remember, they originally put in what? They originally put in 550. Well, let's see how much they get back when they pull out. So in order for them to get their original investment out, they have to send the 50 LP tokens that they have. They're gonna send those 50 LP tokens and in return, they're gonna get the original monies back. But with some math, right? So 50 LP tokens is 20% of all LP tokens. So we'll do 2510.3 times 0.2. So they're gonna get 502.6 back, 502.6. And if we do the 249, 249 times 0.2, they're gonna get 49.8 back, 49.8. They originally sent 500 USCC and 50 WEF, and they got a little more USDC and they got a little less weth, obviously, because there's less weth in the pool. But if we go back to that ratio of, say, one weth equals 10 USDC, we can see the difference in weth here. So we can just do this, this math as well. So 49.8 times 10. So this weth would be equivalent to 498 USDC. And if we do the total value, now they have zero LP, of course. And if we do the total value for eight plus 502.06, you're gonna find out they profited plus 0 0.06 cents. So this is how they make money. Just by these trades, sending these little feeds, they end up profiting a little bit of USDC. And this is just from one trade. So after a ton of trades, they're gonna profit a ton of money. So this is why a lot of people want to be liquidity providers because they just gain yield. The more people make trades, the more fees go through, the more these liquidity providers make money. So at the highest level, that's what's going on under the hood. Again, I want to emphasize this might be a little confusing the first time you look at it. The first time you do it, it might not make sense. The math might not make sense, but this is essentially what's happening from a high level underneath the hood. So I know I crammed a lot into your brain in this section but let's do a quick refresher on what's going on with T-Swap or Uniswap and how these AMMs, these automated market makers work and how they differ from a traditional order book. So quick refresher. So in a traditional order book, in a traditional exchange, a user says, hey, I want one ETH for 10 USDC and they stick it into an order book. They say, hey, this is this trade that I wanna make. Somebody else puts a trade they wanna make or looks at the current trades and says, hey, I'll take that trade and they stick it into the order book as well. And either they get matched up or somebody takes part of the deals. But anyways, this is how traditional centralized exchanges work. They do this order book methodology. Now, this is great. However, they're doing a lot of magic behind the scenes. They're matching up orders. They have this massive list of orders that are in their order book. And this can be incredibly gas expensive and can actually take many transactions on the centralized exchange. So this style is very difficult to work in the DeFi world because if you do a lot of transactions, you're spending a lot of gas. And if you have to wait for somebody to take your trade, you might have to wait a whole bunch of transactions. You might have to wait a whole bunch of blocks. And that's very difficult for us in DeFi. So the question then becomes, okay, how do we keep this process of trading to one transaction? How do we keep the cost down? Well, 
we can do a style called an AMM, where instead of an order book, we have just have these giant pools of money and we use the ratio between these pools as the price of the assets. In order to take money off of one other pile, you have to put the equivalent ratio into the other pile. This is the concept known as the AMM. In specific, this is the constant product market maker or, or constant product formula. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the video. And in practice, there's additionally a fee that gets added whenever people make these swaps on the smart contract. The reason people make fees is because somebody needs to create these giant pools of money and stick their money into these pools. And the incentive that they have to do that is every time these pools accrue fees, the liquidity providers actually make money from the more people who make trades. So that's at a high level how this works. If this is still a little confusing to you, like I said, we we linked to this article from Chainlink as well. And there's this phenomenal video from Whiteboard Crypto that does a great job explaining it at a high level. But remember, this is all part of the get context, right? This is how we do it. We want to get context. Sometimes I will even go the extra mile and I'll pull up the app. You know, when I'm trying to learn a protocol, I will go to the protocol. Sometimes I'll connect, obviously, on a burner wallet and I'll send some transactions through just to test it out and, and see what the transactions look like. But that's if I'm going crazy mode and I really, really want to understand something. So so that's how an AMM works. That is at a high level how T-Swap works. And that's at a very high level how Uniswap works. Uniswap has been through a couple different iterations. V1, V2, V3, V4 is being worked on right now. They're all a little bit different, but at a high level, this is how it works. So remember, this stuff can be confusing. However, you are a security researcher, so you know you're going to use the discussions tab. You're going to use Piranha IO. You're going to use the Ethereum Stack Exchange. You're going to use Discord. You're going to Telegram. You're going to be very comfortable asking questions. And especially if you're doing a private audit, you're going to be very comfortable asking questions to the developers because most of the time, developers work and protocol creators work on very novel solutions that you've never heard of or you've never seen before. So they might not have as good of documentation as this. However, I would probably tell this protocol, hey, you need some diagrams in here. So now if we go back to the Git repo associated with this section, we go to the audit data branch, we scroll down, we now have some of these diagrams in here as well, right? This is something great for you to do with a protocol if you don't understand something. And remember, if this doesn't sit in with you the first time you do it. If this is confusing, that is okay. You take a deep breath. It might not settle the first time, but the more you ask questions and the more you work with it, more sense it'll make. Let's keep going. Let's learn more about this protocol. And I'm going to read from the audit data branch. Don't look at the audit data folder because it's going to spoil all your learnings. So anyways, let's keep going. Let's keep building context. We're still building context. Yes. It's important we understand this stuff from a high level. We want to be asking questions about these diagrams. How does this work? Do you understand it, et cetera? And you know, maybe even if you don't fully understand it, maybe you just jump into the code and you start tinkering with stuff. You know, again, there's no silver bullet to this process. With that being said, okay. Let's keep going. So we're doing this AMM thing. We're doing this swapping thing. But there's, there's other sections. What, what the heck are these other sections? Okay, the protocol starts as simply a pool factory contract. This could be used to create new pools of tokens. Ah, okay, and if you're in the audit data branch, we can scroll up to here. We have this pool factory.sol. There's this function called create pool, which is going to create one of these pools, right? One of these AMMs that we talked about. And it looks like we can have a lot of different pairs, right? If I zoom in a little bit here, we can see there's a USDC weth pool being created with create pool, and there's a link weth pool. So looks like we can use different token pairs to create these pools. The contract is used to create new pools of token. It helps make sure every pool token uses the correct logic. Okay, but the magic happens in each T-swap pool contract. And even right here, maybe this is where I go into SRC and I go, ah, oh, okay, so there's this pool factory thing. They're talking about this create pool function. Oh, okay, that's right here. And maybe even I start poking around with it. Okay, what is this? What is this doing? Okay, so it looks like it's it is it is calling this new T swap pool function. It's got a whole bunch of stuff in here, but it looks like okay, this is the function that's going to be called this create pool. It's going to create this new pool contract, which looks a little bit bigger. But okay, cool. Anchoring some of my my newfound knowledge to the actual code base. You can think of each T swap contract as its own exchange between exactly two assets. Ah, that's kind of exactly what we were seeing in the diagram here. Any ERC20 and the WETH token. Oh, it looks like WETH, the WETH token is probably important. 
These pools allow users to permissionlessly swap between an ERC-20 that has a pool and WETH. Once enough pools are created, they could easily hop between support ERC-20s. Right, that makes sense. So if I have USDC, I swap from USDC to WETH, and then I swap from WETH to LINK, because there's likely going to be, you know, a USDC WETH pool and then a LINK WETH pool, right? Cool, makes sense. Ah, we have a little example. For example, user A has 10 USDC. They want to swap it to buy DAI. They swap their 10 USDC for WETH in the USDC WETH pool, and then they swap their WETH for DAI in the DAI WETH pool. Every pool is a pair of some token and WETH. They give us two of the functions that allow us to swap. Okay, cool. So that's how the swapping works at a high level. Now we talk about liquidity providers as well. We've already went over this, but if you want to kind of read the docs here, read the LP example as well, that'll give you some more context. But fantastic. Now we have a ton of context of what this is supposed to do, right? Maybe we write some more tests. You know, obviously we scroll down and we can see the rest of the actors' roles. Looks like there's LPs and users. That's pretty much it. The actual scope, the commit hash, et cetera. But now let's talk about this thing called the core invariant. Now, every protocol is going to have an invariant or a property or something in the system that cannot be broken. And most protocols have at least one type of invariant, even like an ERC-20 or an NFT, ERC-721. For example, if you go to the GitHub repo with this course and we scroll down, you, you can hit this properties tag and you'll be brought to this trail of bits repository, which shows some of the invariants of different types of tokens. ERC-20s, they have 20 properties or invariants. ERC-721s, they have 19 properties or invariants. ERC-626, which we'll learn about later in the course in the Vault Guardians section, 37 properties. Most contracts have some type of property or invariant, something that cannot be broken. And luckily for us, the developers of the T-Swap protocol have given us the core invariant right here for us to read. Now, sometimes developers are going to get this wrong, and it's our job as security experts to make sure that this is correct. Oftentimes, the developers won't just give you the invariant, they'll give you the docs up here, and you'll need to figure out the invariants because oftentimes they will not understand invariants, they won't have it written down. You should tell them all to take my course so that they can understand invariants better or properties. So we've done a lot of work on invariants in the past. So I've made a number of invariants and fuzz testing videos in the past, and we're going to watch a quick video, which is going to teach us from a higher level what invariants are and some of the approaches that we can take to assess them. In this video, we're going to be working specifically with fuzz tests. So let's go ahead and let's watch that video and learn about invariants and fuzzing. If you came from the Foundry course, you're already a little bit familiar with fuzzing. However, this will be a great refresher because we're going to go a little bit deeper into fuzzing. All right, contracts are written and tested. Can I ship my code? No, I can easily break this with a flash loan attack. Ah, oh, crap, I didn't think about that. Let me fix. All right, how about now? <laughs> if I make a flash loan on Aave, I can use that loan to lock up a CDB on FakerDAO, and I can exploit the Oracle by re-entering your dinner reservation at Chili's, causing a bridge malfunction on the flux capacitor, bypassing the possibility media I can exploit your contract. I exploit your contract. Most of the time, hacks will come from a scenario that you didn't think about or write a test for. But what if I told you that you could write a test that can not check for just one scenario, but every scenario? Let's get froggy. Fuzz testing or fuzzing is when you supply random data to your system in an attempt to break it. So if this balloon is our system slash code, it's us doing random stuff in an attempt to break it. <coughs> this is Chainlink. Now, why would we want to do all that? Let's say we have this function called do stuff. It takes an integer as an input parameter, and we know that no matter what we give it as an input, our variable should always be zero, should always be zero. The fact that this variable should always be zero is known as our invariant, or our property of the system that should always hold. In our balloon example, if we market our balloon as indestructible or unbreakable or unpoppable, the invariant that would hold would, this balloon cannot be broken. And unlike this balloon in real life, we can write a test that will call the do stuff function many times with random data and check to see that our should always be zero variable is always zero. Now, a normal unit test for our code might look like this. We pass a single data point, we call the function, and then we do our assertion to make sure that should always be zero is in fact zero. And with this, we might think our code is covered. But if we look back at our do stuff function a little bit closer, we can clearly see that if our data input is two, should always be zero will end up being one. This would break our invariant. Should always be zero will not be zero. Now, this may seem obvious for this function, but sometimes you'll have a function that looks like this. Okay. 
it would be insane to write a test case for every single possible integer or scenario. So we need a programmatic way to find this scenario. Now in our code, we also see a second exploit, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now there are two popular methodologies to find these edge cases, fuzz tests slash invariant tests and symbolic execution slash form of verification. We'll save the latter for another video. If we were writing our code in Foundry, this would be our unit test. Writing a fuzz test in Foundry where we do all this random inputting is gonna be really similar. Instead of us manually selecting our data, right in our test parameter, we'll add our variable, comment out this line, and that's it. Now, when we run a Foundry test here, Foundry will automatically randomize data, run through our code with a ton of different examples. This is as if they run with data equals zero, data equals one, data equals this number, that's a T, but whatever, you get the picture. Now, if I run my unit test, you'll see that the unit test actually passes. However, if we run this fuzz test, you'll see it actually gives us an output where it says assertion violated counterexample gives us the call data and the arguments. It was able to find out by randomly throwing data at our function call that two breaks our invariant, AKA it makes it such that should always be zero is not zero. Now it's really doing semi-random data instead of purely random data. And the way your fuzzer picks the random data matters. It won't be able to go over every single possible UN256. So understanding how your fuzzers pick the random data is an advanced thing that you should learn later on. At the moment, I think the trail of bits echidna slash optic integration is probably the best fuzzer out there and it easily has the best logo of all time, but ripped Jesus is a solid second. So now that we have our counter example here, we can use this to go back into our contract, find out, ah, okay, so we are doing this wrong, delete this line, and then run our test again and see that it does indeed pass. What's important is this number down here, the number of runs. So this did 256 different random inputs to make our test run. In Foundry, you can change the number of runs in your foundry.toml file by just adding a section like this, rerunning your tests, and now you'll see it did a thousand different examples. The number of runs is really important, obviously, because more runs is more random inputs, more use cases, more chance that you'll actually catch the issue. And now congrats, that's the basic of fuzz testing. Let's just do a little recap here before going further. The first thing you need to do is understand our invariant or property of the system that must always hold. And our example should always be zero was our invariant. Understand your invariant and then write a test that would input random data to try to break that invariant. Now, if we go back to our example contract though, you'll see with our fuzz test, we were able to find this first use case. However, it didn't find this second scenario where should always be zero was set to one if hidden value was seven. In order for this to revert, hidden value would need to be seven. And the only way to set hidden value to seven would be to first call do stuff with seven, which would set hidden value down here and then call do stuff again with anything. Our fuzz test as written would never be able to find this. That's because this fuzz test is known as a stateless fuzz test, which is where the state of the previous run is discarded for the next run. If we go back to our balloon example, stateless fuzzy would be doing something to the balloon for one fuzz run, then discarding that balloon and blowing up a new balloon for each fuzz run. However, instead of doing stateless fuzzing, we could do stateful fuzzing. Stateful fuzzing is where the ending state of our previous fuzz run is the starting state of the next fuzz run. For example, instead of blowing up a new balloon for each one of these runs, we just use the same balloon to do multiple random things to it. Combined is considered one fuzz run. So a single fuzz run on a stateless fuzz run would be having data be seven, calling do stuff, just using the same contract that we just called do stuff on and then call another function on it. If this was a unit test we had, we would of course see this get violated. But as you can see, with sufficiently complicated code, coming with these very specific scenarios are gonna be missed. To write a stateful fuzz test in Foundry, you need to use the invariant keyword and it requires a little bit of setup. And don't get too confused by the invariant keyword here. Yes, it's being a little overloaded. Right in invariant test in Foundry, we first need to import this STD invariant contract and inherit it in our test contract. Then we need to tell Foundry which contract to call random functions on. Since we only have one contract with one function, we're gonna tell Foundry that my contract should be called and it's allowed to call any of the functions in my contract. So we'd say, hey, the target contract for you is gonna be the address of example contract. Foundry is smart enough to know, okay, it's gonna grab any and all of the functions from my contract and call them in random orders with random data. So it's gonna call do stuff with random data, and then it's gonna call do stuff with random data, and then it's gonna call do stuff with random data since do stuff is the only function. Now we can write our invariant by saying function invariant test always is zero public. And we can just add our assert, assert our example contract that should always be zero is zero. So it'll run do stuff with some random data, if it happens across seven, it'll set hidden value to seven, and then it'll call do stuff again with hidden value starting at seven, which will trigger this conditional. So now if we run this test, 
we can see it does indeed find a sequence where our invariant or our assertion or our property is broken. We can see first on my contract, it's gonna call do stuff with an argument of seven, and then it's gonna call my contract with an argument of some random number because it doesn't matter what the input is after it sets it to seven. So now that we have that, we can go back to our code, remove this, come back to our test, rerun our test, and we'll find that our code is now safe and sound because our invariants hold up. Now, an important aside on the term invariant, Foundry uses the term invariant to describe this stateful fuzzing. Stateless fuzzing is when you give random data to an input to a function to see if it breaks some invariant. Stateful fuzzing is when you give random data and random function calls to a system to see if it breaks some invariant. In Foundry, fuzzing is stateless fuzzing and invariants are stateful fuzzing. So when people are talking about invariants in Foundry, they're usually talking about stateful fuzzing. If they talk about fuzzing in Foundry, they're talking about stateless fuzzing, even though they're both technically fuzzing. There's an issue on the repo to potentially change the name, but I digress. So in a real smart contract, your invariant won't be that a balloon shouldn't pop or some function should always be zero. It might be something like new tokens minted is less than the inflation rate. There should only be one winner in a random lottery someone shouldn't be able to take more money out of the protocol than they put in. And let me tell you what, at this point, congratulations, you've learned the basics of fuzzing. This is something that even some of the top protocols in this space don't use. And this is something that we in Cypherin use to find high severity vulnerabilities in smart contracts. Hey, I'm Alex Rohn, co-founder at Cypherin. We use invariant tests during our audits to identify vulnerabilities that are often difficult to catch purely with manual reviews. That's not to say they're a silver bullet. They are in no way a replacement for experts' manual review, but they certainly can aid in the audit process. This needs to be the new floor for security in Web3. If you're working with a protocol that isn't doing stateful fuzzing or invariant or fuzz tests, red flag, get them to use it, make a PR. Number one, understand what the invariants are. Number two, write functions that can execute them. Do not go to audit without these. And don't let your auditors let you get away with not having them. So this video was just to give you the basics. And if you want to learn the advanced fuzzing strategies on how to fuzz like pro, be sure to watch our next video on the topic as that'll give you the keys to write professional fuzz and professional invariant tests. Come on, gang. Let's make Web3 better, and I'll see you next time. All right, great. Now that we know a little bit more about invariant tests and fuzzing tests, let's actually practice doing some. And the reason we're going to practice doing some is because, again, we're not even looking at the code in here yet and just learning how to do these invariant tests. We're going to be able to break this contract. And you want to know why? Well, because, all right, we will look at the code really quickly. If we look at this code, there is a lot of stuff in here. The pool factory is, is pretty minimal, right? We just have this kind of create pool function. But if we look at the T swap pool code base, it's a lot bigger. We've got a lot of comments and a lot of functions and just like a lot of stuff going on that can be very overwhelming. And obviously, whenever we're doing a security review, we want to do the manual review test. But we're human beings and we are likely to miss stuff. So it's good to use the tools that we have to automate as much of the process as possible. So we're going to practice working with invariants and trying to break invariants. Specifically in this section, we're going to be working with stateless and stateful fuzzing and some of the different advanced strategies to get there. You are going to become very good at doing this because it's going to help you a ton. I personally have used this strategy in competitive audits to find bugs just by understanding a protocol's invariant, barely looking at the code base, writing an invariant test suite, and finding bugs just by doing that. So if you're in the GitHub repo associated with this course, there's a couple of other fuzzers you might want to check out as well. The Echidna fuzzer, by the Trail of Bits team is absolutely phenomenal. It's powered by Slither to make it a smarter fuzzer, which is actually really cool. You can look at the Consensus fuzzer as well. This one is a paid cloud fuzzer, so it's not gonna let me show it. And then there's also Foundry, which has fuzzing built in. But let's scroll back up. Let's go back down to the resources here. And let's go to the SC Exploits Minimized. And we're gonna go ahead and work with the code base in here. Now, here's what I want you to do. I know you've already cloned this repo, and if you haven't, go ahead and clone this repo. So in your notes bit here, if we go down to your folder, you have this X SC exploits minimized. If you haven't done a git pull on it already, be sure to do that, CD exploits minimize, clear. If you haven't cloned it, obviously run git clone and clone that repo. I'm gonna do a git pull just to make sure it's up to date. And we're gonna run code period and we're gonna open this up in its 
own VS Code here. So if we go to the readme of this and we scroll down, actually at the bottom, we have this invariant break section. Now this isn't really an exploit, but it's kind of is. Technically every single one of these exploits leads to some type of invariant breaking. All of these exploits are kind of a type of invariant. So if we scroll down here, we have a little bit more information about invariant breaks and the different strategies we're going to take to help break them and, and see where we can find issues. For this section, we're gonna be looking at these three, stateless fuzzing, stateful fuzzing with the open method and stateful fuzzing with the handler method. We're gonna do formal verification in part two of this course. There's a little bit of a formal verification cheat sheet down here. And if you wanna learn more about the difference, you can click that. But let's go over to the invariant break readme, which is over here, where we talk about invariants. And I highly recommend you actually pause the video right now and read this and really understand it. We are going to go through some examples, but if you read this and you understand it, it'll be a lot easier for you to do this next part. Because what we're gonna do is in our code base here, we're actually gonna go to this invariant break folder and I want you to delete it. I want you to remove it. Because in order for you to really get this, you have to practice writing these. So you're gonna write these with me. You're gonna understand what every single piece of code in this does so that you can be an invariant testing wizard, a stateful and stateless fuzzing wizard, and help you break these smart contracts and find these vulnerabilities quicker, more efficiently, and more effectively. So let's go ahead and practice breaking some invariants using some fuzzing, and we're gonna start with stateless fuzzing. We're, and then what we're gonna do, once we break, once we learn all of these strategies for fuzzing, we're gonna come back to our Uniswap code base, and we're gonna say, hmm, there's this x times y equals k core invariant, we're going to understand this and we're going to break it or we're going to try to break it. We're going to try to find bugs without even looking at the code base just by understanding the invariants. So let's learn this so we can come back to this, be super badasses and break this. Great. All right, cool. So we're in our SC exploits minimized code base here. And what I want you to do is look in the SRC. Let's scroll down to invariant break. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Uh, obviously, there's the readme. Uh, as well. I'm actually going to go to that on GitHub. So this is the SC exploits minimize SRC invariant break readme. And we scroll down in here, we're going to start with stateless fuzzing. So stateless fuzzing often known as just fuzzing is where you provide random data to a function to get some invariant or property break, right? We went over this in the video, we talked about, hey, get a balloon, do one thing to the balloon, and then, you know, get a new balloon, do one thing to, do, to the balloon, get a new balloon, just keep trying to pop it, right? Uh, we have a minimized example in here, or if you have some function where the invariant is the function should never return zero, this is what a test might look like. You just do a whole bunch of random data to try to get that invariant to break. In our invariant break folder, to start testing this out, we have this file called stateless fuzz catching .soul, And this is an example where a stateless fuzz test will easily catch. Now, obviously this is very easy because a human being could say, okay, well, if the invariant is that it should never return zero, if I put in two, it's obviously gonna return zero. This is very easy for you to just manually see. There are gonna be examples where it's not this easy, where the code base is sufficiently complex or the code base looks like this, which actually we're gonna solve much later in this course with form verification. Let's go back to stateless, but it's not always going to be this easy. So we want to be able to automate this process as much as possible, especially if we're working with a super, super math heavy function. What we're going to do is we're going to come back to our code base. Like I said, we deleted that test for invariance, and now we're going to practice breaking it. So in the invariant break folder, we're going to open up this stateless fuzz catches and we're going to write our test case to break this. So this is pretty easy. We're going to create a new folder in here, new folder, invariant break. And we're going to create our first test. This is to practice stateless fuzzing. So we'll say stateless fuzz catches test.t.sol. Boom. And we're going to test catching the bug in here automatically using fuzz testing, right? And this is better than doing a unit test, right? Because if I say, oh, okay, this should never return zero. Let's write a unit test. Let's try to, let's just put seven in here. Let's see if it works. Okay, great. It doesn't return zero, right? We want to just keep trying random stuff in here till it works. You know what to do. Let's write this test here. Pragma, boom. I have a snippet that allows me to just automatically set up SPDX license identifier MRT, Pragma Solidity version 20. Let's call this contract stateless fuzz catches test like this. This is gonna be a test. So we wanna import test 
from forge std slash test.sol. We're going to inherit test like that. Great. Let's just build, see if we're doing things right. Yep, looks like it's building. Okay, okay, great. Now we're also going to import that file into here. So import date list fuzz catches from dot 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 src slash invar invariant break slash state less fuzz catches dot so that's what it's called right yep stateless fuzz catches now we're going to do a little we're going to deploy this contract so it looks like this is where github copilot by the way is awesome it's already just like giving me most of this but stateless fuzz catches we'll call it sfc function set up public sfc equals new stateless fuzz catches like so capitalizing the u so now we're going to write a state fuzz test to catch the bug that's in here new stateless fuzz catches boom catch the bug in here so really basically to write it a fuzz test here we're going to say function test fuzz catches bug stateless and we're going to do a uint 256 random number or actually what is the ah uint 128 excuse me uint 128 random number public and what this in foundry what this does is we're going to run this test fuzz catches bug stateless we're going to run this test with a whole bunch of different random numbers and now if we open the foundry.toml and we go to fuzz we'll actually see a number of things here so this is a link here to all of the options which is awesome you can scroll down here you can see some of the different fuzz and invariant or stateless fuzzing options here so invariant this is for stateful fuzzing this is for stateless and stateful fuzzing so the number of runs is the number of fuzz runs right remember when we did that balloon thing so this is going to be the number of different balloons that we use in a stateless fuzz option option the other option that's really important for us here is going to be this seed if you use the exact same seed it won't do random runs it'll do the exact same inputs which actually can be really really helpful because if you do a fuzz run and it breaks and then you do another fuzz run with a different seed and it breaks a different way that can be very difficult to debug i usually run all my fuzzes with a seed and then i'll change the seed when i'm looking to get more coverage but we'll talk about that in a minute so 256 sure seed 02 sure whatever so this will run 256 times maybe we want it to run more and we can try to get it to run more but all we have to do is say okay the SFC's invariant is what? This function do math should never return zero. Okay, great. SFC dot do math random number should not equal zero. And we assert it. Public view. And boom. So what we can do now is forge test dash dash mt, paste that in here, and we'll see if it catches the bug. Boom. It sure did. Reason assertion violated. Here's the counterexample gives us the call data, which is transformed into just saying, hey, if you pass two to this function, you're going to get zero. And you'll see here, it only ran 10 times, right? It didn't run 256 times because I found a revert in 10 runs. This is really important, right? Because again, if I go back to founder.toml and I change this to like two, right? With a seed of zero X two, and I run it again, it probably is not gonna catch it, right? It passes because I didn't do enough fuzz runs. If I do nine here, I run it again. It's probably not going to catch it because I didn't do enough fuzz runs. If I do 10, this is where it's going to catch it. It's going to catch it, right? But if I change the seed to like one and I run the fuzz test again, oh, it looks like it did catch it. Maybe if I change it to seven, let's try a different seed. <laughs> okay, if I change the seed to seven, it actually doesn't catch it. And the reason for that is because the seed here helps input the randomness, right? And so if you use a different seed, you're going to get different random runs on seed seven it didn't try number two by run 10 right and this is why the number of runs is really important i bet you if i put a thousand runs in it'll probably catch it let's try it and sure enough it caught it after a thousand runs right so i'm going to put it back to zero x2 and this is where fuzzing actually has a little bit of a weakness so if we go back to this invariant break readme which i know there's readmes all over the place and we scroll down here we can look at stateless fuzzing down to this kind of pros and cons over here. So the pros are that that was really fast to write, right? That was super quick, right? We wrote a test that's able to find the bug. Awesome. Let's comment it out now just so that it doesn't break our test. <laughs> but if we go to this readme, pros, stateless fuzzing, that was super fast to write. It was really fast to test as well. But some of the cons are, 
Well, first off, it's stateless. So if a property is broken by calling different functions, it won't find the issue. And we'll show you an example of that in a second. The other issue is here is you can never be 100% sure you're good because it's a random input, right? And here's kind of a funny little, little meme. Over here, we have our random number generator, 999999. Are you sure that's random? That's the problem with randomness. You can never be too sure, right? Like hypothetically, that is random, but you never really know. You're never 100% sure. So great. So stateless fuzzing was able to find this function very easily. And this is a tool you can and should use, especially for functions like this, where the function itself has some invariant. The function itself was very easy. It had some invariant here. Hey, this shouldn't return zero. It's the only function in the protocol. This function doesn't call any other functions. Really easy to say this should be fuzz. This would also be good candidate for formal verification, but that's for much later in the course. So now we learned about stateless fuzzing. We've learned how to write one. We've learned how and why they are useful. Let's move on to level two. All right, level two in here, stateless fuzzing. We're now going to stateful fuzzing with open stateful fuzzing. So open stateful fuzzing, exactly what you saw in the video. A past, the result of a past fuzz run is the input to the next fuzz run. So in this example, in fuzz run one, you get a balloon. You do one thing to try to pop it, like you drop it. And if it doesn't get popped, maybe to that exact same balloon, you kick it or drop it, right? This is different from stateless fuzzing, where every single fuzz run, you get a new balloon. You start from scratch on every single run. In this one, in our smart contracts, we will call some function on our smart contract, change the state of that smart contract, and then do it again on the same contract, right? So let's look at this code base here. So state full fuzzing would 100% catch this issue as well, but but let's look at this next function. So we have this function do more math again. Let's try doing exactly what we just did and let's try writing a stateless fuzz test on this function do more math again in this stateful fuzz catches.sol. The invariant of this is that it should never return zero, right? So let's go down, let's create a new file. We'll call it state full fuzz catches test.t.sol. We could borrow a little bit, but let's start from scratch here. So in here, we're going to do, you know, SPDX license identifier MRT pragma solidity 0.8.20. You know the drill contract state full fuzz catches test is test. We're going to have to import test imports test test from thank you. ChatGPT, but you got it wrong. ChatGPT forge std slash test.sol. Great. And now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to import that contract. Import date full fuzz catches from dot 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 src slash variant break slash stateful fuzz catches.sol. Is that right? Yep, that's right. And let's just try to write a stateless fuzz test, kind of exactly what we did before. So remember the invariant here, same thing. This should never return zero. Let's just try doing exactly what we already know how to do. So we'll do a little stateful fuzz catches, stateful fuzz catches, function setup, public stateful fuzz catches equals new stateful fuzz catches. Great, no problem here. And let's fuzz this here function. So you into 128, my number, Let's make sure this cannot return zero. So we'll say function test do more math again, or whatever you want to call it. We'll do a uint, what is it again? 128, uint 128, random number, public. And this is just gonna, we're just gonna fuzz this function, right? Same thing. We're gonna say assert stateful fuzz touch catches dot do more math again of the random number zero. Okay, let's see if we can catch the bug. Let's see if this can ever return zero. And obviously, again, looking at this, we can very easily see the path to make this return zero, but but it's starting to get a little bit harder, right? It's going to get harder and harder to see the path to get these functions to break. Let's try this. Forge test dash dash MT paste it in there. Pull it up. Did it find the bug? Uh, no. Okay, it ran a thousand times. Didn't find the bug. Okay, well, maybe we go, mm, let's go back to the foundry.toml. It probably just didn't run enough times. It didn't do enough randomness. Let's do 10,000. All right, let's run it again. Let's see. Let's see if that does it. 
Okay, no, it didn't run it. Let's do 100,000, right? Is it is 100,000 enough for us to, to find the bug in here? Let's, let's run it again. Oh, good. Okay, now it's, now it's starting to take a little bit of time. Okay, that didn't find it. So maybe we do a million, maybe we do 10 million, maybe we do 100 million, and we wait a full week for this fuzzer to finish running. I'm gonna tell you right now, it's never gonna find the bug. And the reason it's never gonna find the bug is because, okay, looking at this contract, how do you get this to return zero? Well, we say response is my number divided by one plus my value. We're always doing this plus my value thing. So long as all we're doing is calling do more math again, we're always gonna be doing this plus my value and my value right now is one. However, if we change the value, maybe we change this to zero, then we could say zero plus zero equals zero, return zero. So we'd have to call change value first for this to return zero. We'd have to change the state of this contract. And that's what a stateful fuzz would actually find for us. So to run a stateful fuzz in Foundry and try a whole bunch of different paths, what we can do is we want to import this thing called STD invariant from forge STD slash STD invariant dot soul. And we'll say our code is STD invariant test the order here does matter. And this STD invariant, if we command click in here, and it's got a whole bunch of stuff to help us run invariant tests. So down here, we have a list of excluded contracts, excluded senders, target contracts, target senders, blah, blah. This is all to help Foundry nail down, okay, what exactly am I fuzzing? What am I trying random function calls, random data calls on? And what we wanna do in our setup function here is we wanna tell Foundry what contracts it should call random functions are. So this STD invariant comes with this thing called target contracts, function target contracts, or target contract. We say, hey, anything in this targeted contracts list, you should do fuzzing on. You should do stateful fuzzing on. You should call random functions on. So in here, I'm going to say right in my setup, I'm going to say target contract. It's going to be the address of this stateful fuzz catches. Now, Foundry is actually smart enough to read this stateful fuzz catches contract and go, oh, okay, uh, I can call my value, I can call stored value, I can call do more math again, and I can call change value. Those are all the functions. Yes, public variables have functions. Those are all the functions that I can call. I'm just gonna try calling randomly all of them, right? Target contract puts it in, Foundry is smart enough. We'll learn very soon how we can actually restrict that and why we would even want to restrict that. So we have our target contracts in here. We've learned that stateless fuzzing isn't going to work, so let's try stateful fuzzing. Now, to tell Foundry that we want to do stateful fuzzing, we can do one of two things. We can do function stateful fuzz underscore catches invariant public like this, or you can do the invariant keyword. I like the stateful fuzz keyword a little bit better because to me it tells a little bit more explicitly what's going on. This is a stateful fuzz test to try to break some invariant. And then all we need to do is the same thing that we've been doing, right? Assert, we can even copy paste this, put in here, but obviously it's not the return that we're checking, it's gonna be this stored value here, right? So stored value equals response. So if this returns zero, it means stored value will have been zero. So we can just check stored value to check what response is. So we can say, instead of saying stateful fuss dot do more math again, we can say, hey, anytime, this stored value is zero, we've broken the invariant. So we just say assert stateful fuzz dot stored value does not equal zero, make this a public view. And now let's run this again, right? So let's go to our foundry.toml. Let's drop this down to a thousand. Again, we saw that the fuzz doesn't work. Down here, we've got some options for invariants or again, the stateful fuzz runs. If we go to the git repo, we can actually scroll down and see all the different stuff we can do. The number of runs is the same as fuzz. The depth is going to be the number of functions called in a single command. So for us, 15 is more than plenty because there's not even 15 functions, but maybe in a sufficiently complicated smart contract, you want to have the depth be a lot bigger. Fail on revert is something that's important that we're going to go over in a little bit. And the rest of these are kind of less important. Fail on revert is going to be important. So we have run 64, depth 32, fail on revert is true. But let's try this test, try to see if it works. So forge test dash dash MT, paste it in. And boom, it found the edge case. 
it found where this actually breaks or did it. What the heck is this? Now, this is only going to work if you have the exact same seed that I have. You'll get this error here, but it's actually a arithmetic overflow underflow. And since we have the exact same seed, if we run this again, we'll get that exact same error. This is an arithmetic overflow slash underflow. It's not actually breaking our invariant. And here's the exact sequence that found it. It looks like it's a whole bunch of calling do more math again, change value, do more math again, change value, etc. Seems like this is probably an overflow where change value, this my value is was probably set to some huge number. And when we set my number plus my value, it got set to a way too big number. So what we can do to actually ignore these reverts because we only care about the invariant breaking is in founder.toml, we can say fail on revert equals false. So we only care if you set fail on revert to false is we only care about the invariant actually breaking. We only care about our fuzz test, this hitting. So we're saying, hey, any reverts, just ignore that. So now if we run this again, you'll see now if we scroll up, now we finally get assertion violated and you'll see this massive output of all the steps that we took. But if we look at the last couple of steps here, looks like we changed value to zero and then we called do more math again to zero, right? It was the last two steps that are really the only steps we need. But again, founder just trying a whole bunch of different stuff. But it's this fail on revert that we needed to set to false in order for it to actually find this error here. But great. So we found a way for this to actually return zero and break our invariant. Fantastic. Cool. Good job. Let's keep going. Let's keep learning. What have we learned? Well, we figured out how to catch some of these easy bugs, right? This do math function, we could just try a whole bunch of random inputs and fuzz it with stateless fuzzing. We learned stateless fuzzing wouldn't have worked for this one. This wouldn't have worked because you need to call change value at some point to change my value to zero. So we used stateful fuzzing. We also learned though that we had to set fail on revert to false for this to work because it was running into an overflow issue where my value was set to something huge and this response was way too big, right? It was probably much bigger than a U into 56 and it was overflowing. So we had set to false. We said, hey, ignore those. Just find something where response is zero. So now we're going to ramp it up a lot to finally something resembling what we're actually going to be doing for the T-swap audit, this handler stateful fuzz. So in this contract, we actually have a much more complicated contract. This contract represents a vault for ERC-20 tokens, and the invariant is users must always be able to withdraw the exact balance amount. So this one, we do have to get a little bit more context on, but we can see, first off, we're using ERC-20s, and we have this constructor with supported tokens, but we ha basically have two functions here, deposit token and withdraw tokens. And these are gonna be the main functionalities of this contract. Deposit tokens sends tokens in using this token.safe transfer and it updates the internal balances in this token balances mapping. And if we go look at this, it's a mapping of users, address users to a mapping of tokens to a mapping of balance. So if you send, if you deposit a token in here, it will keep track of that internally and then you can withdraw them as well. Only required tokens work. But when we withdraw the token, we get the current balance. We update it to zero and then we transfer the token out. So reading this manually, you might spot the bug, but maybe you don't. But the good thing is we know that this is the invariant. And now just by knowing this is the invariant, we can write an invariant test suite to break this invariant. Users must always be able to withdraw the exact balance out. Now let's try doing the stateful fuzzing open methodology first to see if we can catch the bug. So we'll scroll back down, we'll go to invariant break, we'll create a new file. Actually, let's create a new folder because we're gonna put some stuff in here and just say handler for now, handler, because we're gonna put a whole bunch of stuff in here. And then we're gonna create a new file called attempted break test.t.sol because we're going to attempt to break this using the methods that we've learned so far. So let's go read this and let's see how we can do it. Okay, state less fuzzing probably doesn't make sense here, right? Because we have a deposit and a withdraw, we're probably going to need to do some type of state full fuzzing here, right? Of course, because we 
going to need to deposit and withdraw. So let's set this up. MIT, Pragma Solidity 20, let's zoom in a little bit. Contract, attempted break, test is test. And we're going to have to import test from forge std slash test.sol. Let's also import std invariant from forge std slash std invariant dot salt like this is std invariant test we're also going to import what's the name of this handler stateful fuzz catches handler stateful fuzz catches from dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash src slash invariant break slash handler stateful fuzz catches dot so zoom out a little bit great and let's do the exact same thing we did before right handler stateful fuzz catches handler stateful fuzz catches thank you github copilot function setup let's set this up how do we how do we set this up okay the constructor is an array of supported tokens no problem what we're going to do for this is we're going to use down here we have some mocks we have two different tokens in here. We have mock USDC and yield ERC20. So we're gonna use those two tokens in here. So we can't just deploy this. We're gonna to have to import those mocks as well. So we're gonna do import. These are both just different type of ERC20s in here. Mock ERC20, yield ERC20. These are both ERC20 tokens. Let's import both of them. Mock USDC from dot dot slash dot dot slash mocks or mock mock usdc.sol import yield erc20 from dot dot slash dot dot slash mocks slash yield erc20.sol yield erc20 yield erc20 do mock erc20 or excuse me mock usdc mock usdc setup is going to be public let's go back to this Handler thing, it's an IRC20 in the constructor, IERC20. So let's actually copy this, copy this line from there. We'll paste it in here. So we're going to create that array, IERC20, array supported tokens like this. And we're going to add our yield ERC20 in mock USDC to this supported tokens array. So first we got to launch these tokens. So uh, yield ERC20 equals new yield ERC20 mock USDC equals new mock USDC like this. Now we can say supported tokens dot push mock USDC supported tokens dot push yield ERC20 suppose support it supported tokens. Now in this, we have a user who's going to deposit and withdraw. So let's go ahead and say address user equals make address user. And let's give them supply. Let's give them some tokens. It looks like yield ERC20 gives it to message.sender. So let's have let's do a little vm.prank user. Or actually let's do vm.start prank user. We'll just have them do most of this. VM stop prank. It looks like the mock USDC has a public mint function for us to test. So we'll do mock USDC dot mint user some starting amount. Let's see. What does yield have? Yield has a public constant initial supply. So let's just mint the same amount of the yield ERC 20s initial supply. Yield ERC 20 dot initial supply. Oops. Like this. Uh, oh, mint user. Okay, cool. So a little bit more work here, but again, we need to set this up. There's a little bit more work to set this up, right? So we need to be able to deposit tokens and withdraw tokens, and we need a list of supported tokens. We need to give our user some starting tokens. It looks like when we create a new yield ERC20, we're automatically minted tokens. And when we call mockusdc.mint, we're also minted tokens. Great, we push that onto the, the supported tokens list. And now let's do exactly what we did with the stateful fuzz catches test, right? All we did was add it to the target contract and then just ran it as an invariant test. So great, let's do it. 
So what's the target contract? Oh, excuse me. We got to deploy this one too. Uh -huh. So handler stateful fuzz catches equals new handler stateful fuzz catches. And this is going to be the supported tokens are going to be in here. And then we can just say, same as what we did here, the target contract is going to be this contract. This is the one we want to fuzz. So we'll say target target contract address and we'll paste that right in here. So, so now that we have all this, we got to figure out how do we write this invariant? Users must always be able to withdraw their exact balance amount. Okay, um, let's see how this works. So if we scroll down, the deposit token deposits a certain amount and the withdraw uh, just withdraws everything. Okay, that might make it kind of easy for us to, to do this. So let's do, let's do our function stateful fuzz public or excuse me stateful fuzz underscore test invariant breaks or something whatever you want to call it and we'll do vm dot start prank our user and let's check to see how much our user is going to start with so let's actually create a new variable u256 starting amount and we'll say starting amount equals this value and we'll have the mint the starting amount we can even test that straight up function test starting amount the same public assert starting amount equals yield erc20 dot balance of user assert starting amount equals mock usdc dot balance of user right let's public view forge test dash dash mt paste it in okay great they have the same starting amounts so if i deposit and then withdraw everything the amount that we have should still be the same right so let's try that so we'll do vm does start prank user let's just have them call withdraw we'll do handler stateful fuzz catches dot with draw token mock usdc so we're assuming in this stateful fuzz bit this invariance bit it's going to at some point call deposit and then even when it calls deposit we're still going to be able to withdraw our tokens back so we're going to withdraw the mock usdc i'm going to hit control i'm going to hit copy paste just so i can now do yield erc20 as well vm dot stop prank and now what we can do is we're going to assert that mock usdc dot balance of this address handler stateful fuzz catches equals zero right because if we pulled out all of the funds there's only one person who potentially deposited then it should have zero i'm going to copy paste this line as well because yield erc20 should also have no money in it because we withdrew it and then our user should have the exact same that they started with, right? So let's try it. So we'll say assert mock USDC dot balance of user equals starting amount. And then we'll say assert yield ERC20 dot balance of user equals starting amount. Like so. What do you think is going to happen when we run this test? Well, I kind of already told you, but let's find out. Let's run it. Forge test dash dash MT. Paste it in. It passes. Hmm. But this is kind of weird. So runs 64, calls 2000, reverts 2000. So this actually reverted 2000 times, right? So if we go back to the founder.tom it's because this revert on this fail and revert is false. What if I change it to true and run it again? What do you think is going to happen? Aha, we reverted somewhere. It looks like deposit token failed. Ooh, okay, well, let's clear. Let's do a dash V, 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 just to kind of get a little peek under the hood at why it failed. If we scroll down, uh, deposit token, handler stateful fuzz catches unsupported token. Oh, man. Oh, it's calling deposit token with random tokens 
We only have two tokens that we want to try, but it's just trying all these weird random tokens. Oh my goodness. It's, it's not being precise enough. Of course, it's not going to find anything. It's just going to keep doing all this random crap. And this is where it's actually really important to have fail on revert be true a lot of the time. If fail on revert is false, we wouldn't be able to see in the in the logs here. Oh, my goodness. It's calling really stupid, worthless paths, right? So think of it this way. The way our test is set up right now, it's going to call the deposit function with super random tokens. We only have two tokens that are supported. Maybe in 1000 runs, it uses 1000 non mock USDC or yield ERC20 tokens. That kind of sucks. That kind of makes this whole stateful fuzz thing a little bit worthless, right? So this is breaking. And, you know, if we set this to true, it just says, hey, you know, I didn't find it. But like all of the paths that it did were worthless. Right. It took all these random inputs, but it wasn't restricted enough to do random inputs that could actually realistically happen. So we actually want to restrict the randomness that it can do, which, yes, you can run into issues doing that. If we go back to the invariant break readme, we hide this. Let's scroll down a little bit. Uh, we'll scroll down to the, the stateful fuzzing open. We can see some cons of the stateful fuzzing open is that you can run into the path explosion problem where there are too many possible paths and the finder finds nothing. So we want to restrict using this next method that we're going to learn in a second. It's the stateful fuzzing handler. And if we scroll down, yes, one of the cons for this is it could be too easy to restrict too much and you'd actually miss bugs. So doing this correctly is really important and can be very tricky. If you restrict too much, you're actually going to miss bugs because you're going to miss potential bugs if you restrict too much. But in its current state, this stateful fuzz test is worthless. Doesn't do anything because it's just going to keep trying all these stupid ERC-20s, whereas there's only two ERC-20s we care about. And additionally, here's the other thing that we didn't talk about is we never called to prove. So these ERC-20s could never even get deposited anyways. So we're trying to catch, we're trying to find out if we can always withdraw, and we'll probably never get to withdraw because we didn't even approve this yet. So we definitely should have approved. But additionally, additionally, Whoever's calling deposit token and withdraw token might not necessarily be the only person who has tokens, right? We set this up. There's only one person who has tokens right now. It's user. User's the only person with tokens. So nobody's going to be able to call deposit in the invariant test suite. No one's going to be able to call deposit in the stateful fuzzing test suite. None of them have approved tokens in here. So of course, this is not going to find anything because it's just going to go, oh yeah, like all of your transactions reverted. Even if you set this to a crazy number, a crazy high number. It's just going to try a whole bunch of random tokens, a whole bunch of random users that are not going to have anything when really there's only one possible person user who could deposit in the first place. So we need to restrict this down. But before we do that, let's do a quick refresher of what we've learned so far, because you are learning a ton. Quick refresher. And as always, you're doing phenomenal getting this far. I know we went over this a little bit on the Foundry course, but this is really important to, for you to understand to become a badass smart contract security researcher. This will make you a better security researcher and really help you look at these code bases in a different light. So anyways, let's do a quick refresher of what we learned so far. We learned about stateless fuzzing and how easy they are to work with. That this, that stateless fuzzing is just calling a function a whole bunch of times with different data. We learned about state full fuzzing where we'll call a whole bunch of functions with a whole bunch of different kinds of data. But it has an issue where it might not be restrictive enough. The randomness might be too random. There's too much garbage it could put in. So now we're going to learn how to do the handler based method where we actually restrict the different paths that we can do so that we get realistic fuzz runs as opposed to what you just saw, which was a whole bunch of nonsense, right? So this is always going to fail. This is never going to find anything interesting because there's just too many addresses too many people in the world that could possibly work with this. So we're going to go ahead and comment this out and we're going to try again. We can comment this out as well. So what we can do instead is we're going to want to create two new contracts over in the left here. First one is going to be handler.t.sol and then the next one is going to be invariant. T.sol. 
So this handler.t.soul is how we're going to restrict the types of function calls to stuff that actually makes sense for this code base, right? We're going to have one user who can deposit, one user who can withdraw. Now that might be too restrictive for this, but at least it'll give us a much better sense of if there's actually bugs here. And then additionally, we're going to want to work to set this fail on revert to being true, because if this is false and our test passes, that's not really going to tell us that much information. It could really just say, hey, yeah, all your functions suck and there's way too many paths for me to go down. So I'm going to try a bunch of bad ones, right? So we really want to work to make this true. Having this set to false can be kind of a great starting point, but we really want to work to get this true so that we're only working with valid paths in our handler. So what we're going to do is we're going to work on our handler first. And this contract is going to be how we're going to set up restricting the handler stateful fuzz catches contract, right? So we're going to use this handler to tell our foundry, to tell our stateful fuzzing test suite, to tell our invariant test suite exactly how to handle or how to work with this contract. In this handler, we can say, hey, anytime you call deposit, you need to approve the token. You need to have the token minted. You need to have the tokens, right? Anytime you call withdraw, you need to not revert. You need to do all these things, right? You can think of this handler as a wrapper around this handler stateful fuzz catches so that our invariant test suite actually interacts with it in a way that makes sense where the function calls are not going to be too explosive, right? So just follow along with me. If this is a little bit difficult, like I said, the more you practice this, the better you will get. Be sure to ask questions. And after this, I highly recommend you trying to, to fiddle with this yourself on maybe some old code bases. Practice writing these stateful fuzzings. So you know the drill. We're a new contract. SPDX license identifier. MIT, pragma, solidity, 0.8.20. Contract, handler, like so. Test from forge std slash test dot sol. Handler is test. Okay, so this handler is going to be a wrapper around this contract. It's going to be the proxy for this contract, if you will. So we're probably going to need this contract in here. So let's go ahead and import that. Import handler stateful fuzz catches from dot dot slash dot dot slash src. All right, dot dot slash src slash invariant break slash handler stateful fuzz catches dot so like this. We're probably going to want this to deploy one of these bad Larry's. So when we deploy this handler stateful fuzz, we're going to want to route it to this handler contract. So we'll say constore stateful fuzz catches underscore handler state fuzz catches like this. And we'll say handler stateful fuzz catches equals handler stateful fuzz catches. So now this handler is going to be how we actually interact with the protocol. What do we want our invariant test suite to do? Well, we want our invariant test suite to deposit or withdraw, but only on tokens that are supported. So let's figure out what tokens are supported. It's actually just two tokens, right? We're only working with two tokens. We're working with import yield ERC20 from dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash. Uh, or is that too many dot dot mox slash yield ERC20 dot soul. Yep, that's good. I'm going to copy paste this line. We're going to say mock USDC, paste it like that. That looks good. We're only working with these two tokens here. So we'll say mock USDC, mock USDC, yield ERC20, yield ERC20, like so. And we can have these be as input parameters for this as well. So handler stateful fuzz catches, mock USDC, underscore mock USDC, and then yield ERC20, underscore yield ERC20. And then of course, mock USDC equals underscore paste. Copy, copy this line, paste it here. Let's do yield ERC20, yield ERC20, like this. So I needed to change my formatting real quick. It was really bothering me. Okay, cool. So now we have this all set up here. We can now tell our foundry how to actually interact with this contract. So what we can do is we can say, okay, let's practice depositing, right? So if someone wants to deposit into our handler stateful fuzz catches, then some things need to be true, right? So function, we'll say deposit, deposit, 
Well, first off, we only wanted to deposit one of these two tokens. So instead of letting our fuzzer deposit anything, we could just say, hey, deposit, you know, yield ERC20, and this will be a public function. Or we could say deposit the mock USDC. And we could set it up so that our handler makes it so that only very specific functions can be taken and will fuzz on these specific functions instead. So we can deposit a ERC20. Now let's think about, okay, how do we want this to be able to deposit this? Well, well, first off, we could have anybody deposit in here, but let's just restrict it to just this user, right? So this is probably a little bit too restrictive, but it'll still give us a really good idea of what we're doing. And if we're gonna be using the user, then the amount that we deposit should probably be an amount that the user has as a balance. So for this handler, we can say, okay, so they'll posit some amount U into 256, and we'll say the UN256 amount will be equal to some bound, and this is how you can actually bound variables in Foundry of whatever random amount gets put in, zero, and then yield ERC20 dot balance of user. So now we can only deposit between zero and whatever their balance is. Okay, great. Then we can do vm.start prank, the user, yield erc20 dot approve we can make sure we always approve before we deposit let's approve the address of the handler stateful fuzz catches comma the amount and then we'll do handler stateful fuzz catches dot deposit token yield erc20 and the amount and then finally vm.stop prank cool so now we've set this up so that deposit has a better chance of actually going through. So first off, we're only working with a token that is supported. We're depositing amount the user actually has and we're approving beforehand. Great, let's do the exact same thing for deposit mock USDC. I can even just copy paste. Let's copy paste this as well. And instead of yield ERC20, let's do mock USDC like this, mock USDC, mock USDC. So now, instead of our fuzzer calling random tokens random amounts, we will scope it a little bit where, sure, it's still going to be random amounts, but within a bound that our user has, and, and our user has the token, so they won't error on like, oh, you don't even have this much token, and we always approve, right? So we're restricting the randomness our stateful fuzzer can do by giving it only scenarios that would actually happen. Now, the other thing we're going to want to try is go to is going to be withdrawing. So let's do the same thing. Function withdraw yield ERC20 public. And then we'll say vm.start prank user handler state full fuzz catches dot withdraw token yield ERC20 like so vm.stop prank. And that's it. We don't really need to do anything clever here because all this does is withdraw the tokens. No big deal. And then we're going to copy paste this for the mock USDC. We'll say mock USDC like so. That looks good. Cool. So now we have a handler contract where we can actually interact with our protocol in a way that makes sense. It's going to be less random. Yes, but it's going to be more fine scope to scenarios that really happen. So we don't get those weird reverts that are going to ruin all of our tests, right? So now that we have this handler, this proxy basically set up, we can go back in here and now we can write our invariant.t.sol. Oops, already have that. Oh, already have invariant.t.sol. Great, so we can actually write our invariant tests in here. This is gonna look really similar to this attempted break, but it's gonna be specifically scoped to work with our handler contract as opposed to the actual contract. So what we can do is actually, we can copy this whole attempted break test, paste it in here, Let's get rid of this big comment down here. And all of this is actually going to look pretty good, but with a couple of big differences. So we're going to import the handler from dot slash handler dot t dot soul. We're going to create a new handler state variable, handler, handler. We're still going to mint. We're still going to do the supported tokens. But the difference is instead of fuzzing the actual contract, we're going to fuzz the handler, which again, handles interacting with the actual contract, right? It makes it much easier. It makes it much more sensical. It makes it so that all of our transactions don't revert, right? So we're going to say handler equals new handler. And what needs to go into this, this handler's constructor? Okay, the actual contract, USDC, yield, and user. 
So actually, we do need to launch the actual contract. So we'll say actual contract, mock USDC, yield ERC20, and then the user. And now we're going to very specifically choose these selectors from our handler. So we're going to say bytes for array memory selectors equals new bytes for array do four selectors of zero is going to equal handler dot deposit yield erc20 dot selector copy paste this this is going to be deposit the mock usdc dot selector oops is that not the function let's go see this deposit d does deposit deposit that's better let's try that deposit deposit okay cool so like oops excuse me this should be selectors of one select doors two equals handler dot withdraw mock usdc dot selector and then chat gpt or github copilot help me out handler dot withdraw yield so these are going to be the four selectors we're going to actually do and then finally we're going to say target selector and I like to be very explicit. So when we add selectors, it's really going to go into this fuzz selector object with an address of the address handler. And the selectors are going to be the selectors, right like that. So now we've given it the target selectors and the target address, which is going to be our handler, which is only going to make transactions that make sense, right? So this is this proxy thing that's going on again. So. Now that we've done this, let's try this again. So if we pull back up our attempted thing, we scroll down, we can actually copy this again, paste it over here, uncomment it, because this actual test still makes sense, right? We still, our invariant hasn't changed, right? The invariant is still what? If we go to the actual thing, scroll to the top, invariant, users must always be able to withdraw the exact balance amount, you know, we should say out. They should always be able to withdraw their balance out. We shouldn't lose any tokens or anything like that. So now we have this set up. We can withdraw the tokens and then see, hey, is everything good? Has anything happened? And this makes even more sense because the handler in the handler, only one user is withdrawing and depositing. So now we can finally do this. And let's add like an, another keyword here. We'll call it test invariant breaks handler. All right, let's do this. Pull this up. All right, let's do this. Moment of truth. Forge, test, dash, dash, MT, paste this in here. Let's see if it works. Oh, okay, we have an issue. Ah, it's calling transfer from on the mock USDC. Oh, that's not quite right. Whoops, we should probably do target contract of the address handler. Let's add that in there so it knows to only fuzz that one. Now let's run it. Oh, now that we've told our fuzzer, hey, only work with the with the handler contract because before it was like just trying anything. Um, it got we got this whole crazy sequence in here where we got a custom error actually. Reason custom error. So it looks like calling withdraw yield ERC twenty resulted in some type of error. Oh, that's that's weird. Let's um, what was the error that we got? Let's try dash VVV. Okay, now we have an output here. Let's scroll up. ERC20 insufficient balance. So what do we call? We called withdraw token and we got an insufficient balance. Oh, well, that's kind of weird. That's, that seems a bit odd. Let's just to test this, let's have revert on true be false. And let's let's run it now. Let's see what happens. Looks like this still failed. If we scroll down. We can see kind of this massive output of what happened. This might be a little too much for me. So maybe I go back and I drop the seed for a second and I run this again to try to get a, an easier understanding of what actually happened, right? So maybe a different fuzz run will give me a better solution. Uh, it's still, so give me this custom error. It looks like deposit yield ERC20 keeps giving me some weird error here. It keeps reverting on me, but at least this is giving us much better data than before, right? Before we were reverting on crazy stuff right so let's set this back up let's set this back to true how can we update this to not run into these errors 
Let's see. Okay, still withdraw yield is actually reverting, and the revert is a custom error. So if I go to the actual contract itself, it's failing on withdraw token. Okay, this doesn't have any custom errors, so maybe it's in the actual token itself. So let's go over to the yield year 20, see if there's some weird transfer thing. No, I don't see a, a weird bit here. Oh, there it is though. Custom error here, and let's scroll up. Ah, we're getting ERC20 insufficient balance. So we're calling withdraw yield, calling withdraw token. We're transferring this token, but we're getting insufficient balance. So this is telling us that our handler stateful fuzz catches contract for some reason doesn't have the balance of what it actually needs. Whoa, that's that's a that's, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because down here we're just withdrawing however much they put in. Why is this transfer function failing? Let's let's pop into this yield. Something something must be wrong here. Whoa, what is this? Transfers a value amount of tokens from from to to or alternatively mints or burns them. And then down here, every 10 transactions, we take a fee of 10% and send it to the owner. What the heck? If two equals owner, send it to the owner. Otherwise, if a user isn't the owner and the count's less than 10, send some stuff to the owner. Otherwise, count plus plus. So what needed to happen was 10 transactions needed to happen. Then finally, on the 10th one, the owner needed to get some money, and that actually would break our invariant. Our invariant test suite gave us the knowledge that, hey, there's something fishy with the ERC-20. Let me explain again what just went down, okay? So we had deposit, withdraw, deposit, withdraw of that yield ERC-20 token, right? On the 10th one, it sent 10% of the yield ERC-20 to some owner contract. This breaks our invariant because now there's going to be 10% who's not with the user and that's also not with the contract. It went to the owner. So this actually breaks our invariant. If we go back to this contract, remember it says, hey, the invariant is users must always be able to withdraw the exact balance amount out. And this weird yield ERC20 token is actually breaking that because it has this weird every 10 transfers, there's a fee that goes to the owner. So this weird ERC-20, this weird yield ERC-20 token actually broke our invariant of our protocol. And this is why it's so important to document what external contracts you're working with, including tokens and especially tokens, because this just broke our invariant. Luckily, we had a phenomenal stateful fuzzing test suite that we wrote, and this was able to catch it for us in an automated way. So it was lucky that we had a test suite that mocked all of the tokens that this protocol was going to work with, like USDC and yield ERC-20, so that it was able to catch this. And this brings us to the first exploit of this section, which is going to be weird ERC-20s, because they will be the bane of you. Weird ERC-20s are such a plague to the security community. But before we do that, we just learned a lot, and it might have been a little confusing. And that's okay, because you will have time to practice this, you will be able to practice this, and there's tons of places where you can practice writing this invariant test suite and fiddling with it under and, and understanding it. This stuff is difficult. This stuff is hard. You won't necessarily understand this the first time, and that's okay. Take a deep breath, go on a walk. You're doing great getting this far. We're supercharging you. You've already learned so much. Let's do a quick refresher on what we learned in this section, and then we'll go over to that weird ERC-20 exploit. And then finally, we'll come back and we will use what we learned here to audit this T-Swap protocol. It's gonna be sick, I promise. Okay. So what did we just learn? Well, we learned about stateless fuzzing and how they are great. They're very helpful, but they don't help so much in stateful fuzzing. But then we learned if we have a sufficiently complicated contract, we will want to use the handler method. And the handler method is kind of works as a proxy to call the contract, to call the functions in our protocol so that the randomness is a little bit less random, but it goes down paths that make more sense. And then finally, we got teased a little bit about this weird ERC-20 exploit. So I've just pumped a ton of knowledge into your brain. Now is a great time for you to take a quick break, go for a walk and come back so that we can learn about weird ERC-20 exploits. And then with all this knowledge that we've learned, we will finally go back to T-Swap and do the stateful fuzz testing for T-Swap 
and then we'll do the manual review and you will find some amazing bugs without having to do any manual review work. Take a break. Congrats for getting this far and I'll see you in a couple minutes. Whew. Okay, we can now go back to the Cypher security and auditing full course GitHub and let's scroll back down to T-Swap. Where is T, T-Swap section five? And we just got a little hint into one of the top exploits that happens, weird ERC-20s. So if we click this link here, this weird ERC-20 list, you'll see we get to this repo, D-XO, weird ERC-20. And it's a phenomenal repo that tells us about all the weird oddities of ERC-20s. The one that we just dealt with in, in the SC exploits minimized was a weird ERC-20 fee on transfer token. We saw that the yield ERC-20 token had of every 10 transactions, there was a fee. And that can actually break a lot of protocols. And so this weird ERC-20 tokens talks about a lot of the different weird ERC-20s out there that can possibly wreck your invariants or your protocols. And there's a lot of them. Some tokens have re-entrancies. They're ERC-777s. And like literally just doing a transfer of an ERC-20 token can open you up to re-entrancy attacks, which is ridiculous. Missing return values. Some tokens don't return a Boolean on ERC-20 methods. So if you want to check to see if a transfer actually went through, well, it doesn't return a Boolean, so you have no idea if, if it was true or, or false. And this can be really, really frustrating. Big tokens like USDC, BNB, and OMG actually do this. So this is a big, big issue. Fee on transfer. Some tokens take a fee on transfer, and some tokens don't right now, but could in the future. USDC in particular, let's look at this. Let's go to Etherscan, USDC. If we click on this token, click on USDC, this is arguably one of the worst offenders. If we go to the contract, it's a proxy, fiat token proxy. The USDC token could be upgraded to be anything at some point. So if you want to integrate USDC into your protocol, you need to keep in mind that at some point, Circle could go, eh, we don't feel like doing this anymore and just revert everything. They can also say, ah, you know what? We're going to charge $100 for every USDC transaction. They can do whatever they wanted here they eventually could have all of the issues here. Balance modifications. There's this thing called rebasing token where they mess with the balances of different contracts. Upgradable tokens like USDC, flash mintable tokens, tokens with block lists where they don't allow certain people to transact, pausable, approval raise, prevent on approval, revert on zero value, revert on zero value transfers, multiple token addresses, low decimals, high decimals, different decimals. There's all of these issues that tons of ERC-20s have. And if your protocol is integrating with tokens, ERC-20s, one of the best methods to prevent against this is to know exactly what ERC-20s you are going to work with. At the end of the day, ERC-20s are an external contract and you need to treat them like they're a weird external contract. Even though it might just be like, oh yeah, it's an ERC-20. Obviously it's gonna do X, Y, or Z. Often it's not obvious. So these are usually the easiest gimmies in competitive audits. Most people usually get the weird ERC-20s. Uh, they're still worth reporting because obviously they will keep the protocol more secure. Additionally, we have this token integrations checklist from Trail of Bits, which is phenomenal, which will allow you to, as a builder, keep in mind how to integrate with ERC-20s and then as a smart contract security reviewer, how to make sure a protocol is secure. And this securecontracts.com just in general is a phenomenal website, a phenomenal guide. If you wanna be a top builder, build really cool, build really powerful smart contracts. So definitely be sure to check out securecontracts.com as well. Cool, so now that we learned about this, this is probably a hint as to one of the issues with T-Swap, but we can go back over to T-Swap now and finally, finally start writing our invariant test suite. Now keep in mind, let's go back to the main branch. We have barely looked at SRC, right? We've really just looked in here just to get an idea of what the ABI looks like, kind of like what the contracts look like. But all we're doing is we're saying, ah, I see you, you only have unit tests, but you have a super important invariant. You don't have any stateful fuzzing tests. We're gonna write you a stateful fuzzing test suite and I bet we're gonna find bugs just by doing that and psh, Let's see if that's the case. Zero manual review. All we're going to do is write an automated test suite. And then we will do a little bit of manual review, right, as well. Uh, but let's go ahead and let's work with this code base. Let's write an automated stateful fuzzing invariant test suite. And let's 
bang this out. So in order for us to do this, we need to understand the invariant. Now, we've already written it down here, and I want to tell you it can be a little confusing. The main thing that we just want to keep in mind is the ratio of tokens should always stay the same. We have this line here. Well, for the most part, since we add fees, our invariant technically increases. So this K technically increases. And they have all the math here. Now, this math is usually something where ChatGPT is very helpful, uh, but I've essentially written out the math of this X times Y equals K. Here's the invariant down here, and then here's the invariant with fees. So because we have this mathematical equation here, we can just use this and test for these, right? The core invariant here is X times Y should always equal the same K constant. So the token balance of X times the token balance of Y should always stay the same, which means, token balance of X times the token balance of Y should equal the token balance of X plus the change in X times the token balance of Y minus the change in Y. The idea here is, hey, whatever your current ratio is, it should be the same as whatever your ratio is after somebody does a swap. Remember, if I go back to the audit data branches because there's some diagrams here. Remember, whenever we do a swap here, we're saying the ratio should always stay the same. If I pull off some width, put on some USDC, I shouldn't be able to manipulate the price in any way that I want. The ratio should always stay the same. If this math is kind of difficult, that's okay. So this X times Y equals K is great as our invariant, but we want to make it easier. X times Y equals K is kind of hard to write in a cert for, but what's much easier to write in a cert for is saying the change in a token balance must always follow some formula. So we're actually going to use some algebra to get to the final invariant equation without fees, because that final invariant equation is going to say the change in token balance should always be this equation. And then what we can do is we can write a stateful fuzz test suite that does a whole bunch of swaps and then checks to see on any swap is the change in token balance equal to this mathematical equation, equal to this delta x. So let me show you how we go from this x times y equals k to this delta x equals this equation. And this is the invariant that we're going to use in our stateful fuzz test. Now, like I said, you do not have to fully understand this math. If you want to just for my word for it and say the math checks out, you can absolutely do so. But for those of you who are interested in learning how the math actually works and seeing the algebra, follow along with me now and I'll show you how we go from x times y equals k to this delta x thing. Now we have to do some basic algebra, but with this function, we can actually reach this function. Now, again, the math doesn't matter super too much. But for those of you who are interested, let's go through how we can get from this x times y equals k all the way down to this thing. OK, so we're going to do a little bit of math here. So here's our formula. X times Y equals X plus the change in X times Y minus the change in Y. We want to make sure this constantly stays the same. So what we can do is some basic algebra. So there's this thing in math called the FOIL, basically, where in order to do one parentheses thing times another parentheses thing, you'll do this FOIL stuff. So we'll say, oh, that's thick. We'll say this times this minus this times this plus this times this minus this times this. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that mathematical technique, ChatGPT can let you know. So we'll basically say X times Y equals X times Y. OK, so that's X, Y. We're going to say and now we're going to do X times delta Y. So we're going to say minus X delta Y. I should do this a little lower. X delta Y plus OK, this times this option J delta X Y and then minus finally delta X delta Y delta X option J delta Y on both sides. We have this X times Y, right? Which is just X Y. So we have X Y on both sides. We can actually just subtract that out from both sides. So this we're saying minus X Y minus X Y. I hope this is bringing you all back to college math days. So now we get zero equals minus X. Well, I'm actually just going to copy the rest of this. Delta Y. And now we want to get all these Delta X's to be together without this minus X Y. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to do a little plus X Delta Y, oh, Delta Y to one side. Let's just make this a little bit more obvious. And then we're going to say 
plus x delta y on both sides. So now do a little copy pasty. We're gonna get this equation x times delta y equals delta x times y minus x delta x times delta y. Now we got all we gotta do is factor out the delta x from over here. So we're saying x delta y equals do some little parentheses y minus delta y times delta x. So these both have delta x's. So we're factoring that out. And now we're gonna do some wacko stuff to make our lives a little bit easier, hopefully. We're gonna introduce this new term at beta, which we're gonna say is equal to delta y divided by y. And what we can do now with this new delta y divided by y is we can now say, since we have this here, we say delta y equals beta, beta times beta times y. So if we substitute these delta y's for beta y's, we now will have, I copy paste this, we now will have y minus beta times y. And instead of delta y over here, this will just be beta times y. And now over here, once again, we can factor out this, this y. So we say one minus b equals delta x times y. And since we're solving for delta x here, we can now divide both sides by one minus b times y. We're getting very mathy here. So this will just leave us with delta x, x b y divided by one minus beta, beta times y. And these y's go ahead, obviously, and they cancel out. And now this is how we reach that final expression with just some algebra here. So, and actually, if we go back to the T-swap audit data, this is the same equation, the same equation, delta x equals b over one minus b times x. Go to here. Um, it looks a little bit different because we don't have it in the same format. Let's put it in the same format. Delta x equals, and actually we can kind of pull this x out. We could say, just copy this, and just say times x. Beta over one minus beta times x, and that's the exact same thing we have over here. So using this formula, x times y equals k, this little differentiator stuff, we can finalize with this formula down here. Now, like I said, the actual formula for invariant with fees is down here. We're not gonna go over that because like I said, the way that we're gonna calculate the differences is actually going to include the fees. So that's how we're going to arrive at the same answers. Make the math a little bit easier for us. But for those of you who are math nerds and who are interested in the formula, this is how you go from x times y equals this thing down to isolating the delta x. And all of that, and that little math diagram I just did will of course be in the GitHub repo associated with this section. So you can go back. But again, ChatGPT is great at this stuff. So I would definitely recommend you talking to ChatGPT because it's really good at this stuff. And then additionally, additionally, if you want to cheat a little bit, if you go into audit data, you into the readme, scroll down to the bottom, we actually have this runtime verification, formal verification, which again, we're going to learn later in the port which if you want to read more about this x times y equals k market maker model, this is actually the, the more math heavy paper of how it works from a, a formal perspective. If you wanna see all the math, you can see that uh, in here from runtime verification. If you're like, hey, there's some equation that makes them the ratio good, that's good enough to be totally frank with you for, for this next section. So we're gonna use these equations to write some stateful fuzzing, some invariant test suites to break this T-swap code base. Let's get cracking. So, you already know to do this, we're going to pull up our code base, our T swap audit. Pull up the Explorer. And the other thing is, this is phenomenal if you're doing a private audit. If you come back, if you're doing a private audit and someone's like, uh, hey, like, can you, you know, help help me stay secure? And you come back with a PR, hey, I got your invariant test suite written, you're gonna be so sick. That is phenomenal. So very helpful. Let's do this. We're gonna do exactly what we just practiced. We're gonna create a new folder called invariant. And in here, we're gonna create two files. Guess what they're gonna be called? invariant.t.sol and what else? t or just handler.t.sol. Exactly what we did 
in our practice right before this. And now this is in a real live audit. And remember, we still haven't even looked at the code base yet. All right, we're going to be able to find bugs without even looking at the code base. Crazy, I know. Yeah, let's first build our invariant and then we'll build our handler to actually restrict the scope of the T-swap audit so it's only doing what we want it to do, okay? When we build the handler, yeah, okay, we're gonna actually have to read through the code base a little bit, but the invariant, we can kind of just go in a little bit blind, right? So let's do the invariant first. SPDX, license identifier, MIT, pragma, solidity, 0.8.20. Contract, invariant, how do we do this? We're gonna have to import those two files, import test, from forge std slash test.sol import std in variant from forge std slash std in variant that s.sol contract invariant is std in variant comma, comma test so now function setup how do we set this contract up well luckily there's this deploy bit we can kind of copy from and what is it doing in here Okay, we're getting the weth token from here. We create a pool factory. We create a mock weth. Okay, so it looks like we're dealing with the weth token. And the pool factory takes this weth token as an input parameter. Okay, so since we're going to be working with some fake tokens, let's go ahead and create a mock folder where we're going to create some mock tokens. Let's say mocks, new file, erc20 mock dot soul in here, spdx license identifier MIT pragma solidity 0.8.20 contract ERC 20 mock is ERC 20 we're going to grab that from open zeppelin port ERC 20 from at open zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC 20 slash ERC 20 dot soul because it's an ERC-20, this needs a name and a symbol. So we'll say constructor ERC-20. It's going to be named mock. Symbol is going to be M-O-C-K, like that. And then we're just going to have a function called mint. We're going to say address 2, uint 256 amount. This will be public. And then we'll say... Just do mint to amount. So this is a mock token. We're going to be able to just mint ourselves unlimited tokens because we're testing. But great. So we have an ERC-20 mock. And it looks like we're going to need, based off the deploy, we're going to need at least the weth, right? Uh, we can even look into the unit test real quick. Tswap pool .t. It looks like there's weth and there's pool token. This makes sense, right? We have a little bit of the context, right? These pools have two assets, right? to swap between each other, right? We saw that in the diagrams. So let's create two assets to do some testing. So we'll do import ERC20 mock from, this is dot dot slash mocks slash ERC20 mock dot soul. And we'll create two mock tokens. So we'll do ERC20 mock. This will be pool token, ERC20 mock with, right? Cause back in the readme, it's saying you can think of each T-swap pool contract as its own exchange between exactly two assets, any ERC-20 and the WETH token. So our pool token is going to be our any ERC-20, and then we're going to have a WETH token as well. And then maybe we'll even do more tokens. It looks like, based off those diagrams, once again, it looks like the pool factory creates the pool. I guess this is the important bit to look at. It looks like the pool factory creates the, the T-swap pool with the token address and pairs it up with the wet token. So if I kind of skim through this, I see, okay, T swap T pool equals new T pool token address, wet token, liquidity token name, liquidity token symbol. So this is probably that LP token that they were talking about, which represents the shares of the pool, which is deposited, but it looks like they're passing in the wet token and a pool token address. Okay, cool. That's very helpful for me. So we're probably gonna need to import both of those. Looks like the pool factory kicks it off. Import pool factory from dot dot slash dot dot slash src slash pool factory dot sol and we're probably going to need to import the t swap pool from dot dot slash dot dot slash src slash t swap pool dot sol okay cool like so 
And then we have two assets. We are going to need the contracts. So we'll say pool factory. Uh, we'll just call it factory and then T swap pool pool. So we could have multiples of these, right? Because the factory could create multiple pools. Let's just create one and this will be our pool token slash weth pool, right? So we'll just create one pool and we'll just play with that. Maybe there's a case where multiple pools can mess with each other. And that is something that we would probably want to write an invariant or stateful fuzzing test suite for. But for now, let's just set it up to work with one pool. We could, we could always iterate on that later. And then of course, we're going to have to deal with, we're going to have to create a handler at some point. And we're going to kind of go back and forth between making these. So setting up with equals new ERC20 mock pool token equals new ERC20 mock factory equals new pool factory. And if we go back to the pool factory constructor, it needs the with token as an address. So we'll say address with like this pool factory. The pool is going to be created by the factory. So our factory is going to call create pool with our pool token address. So we're going to say factory dot create pool address pool token like this. And then we need to wrap this up as a T swap pool. So great. This creates our pool. This is how we do our factory. And from our explainers, there's going to be liquidity providers who need to put money in to kind of jumpstart the pool. We should probably put money in to jumpstart the pool as well. You know, maybe there's something that messes up there, but we want to create those initial X and Y balances to jumpstart the pool. So we're going to say pool token dot mint, let's say address this. And let's figure out like a starting X value, right? Because remember, it's going to be this X and Y that's our invariant here. So let's create a starting X. So up at the top here, we'll say, uh, I'm actually going to do an int 256 and you'll see why in a bit, but int 256 constant starting X equals 100 E 18. And this will be the starting ERC 20 slash pool token. And then we'll do an int 256 constant starting y equals, we'll say 50 e uh, 18 And this will be our starting weth amount. So this is our y and our x that we're going to be using for this here math that's going on in our core invariant here. So pool token dot mint, let's create those initial x and y's. The pool token is going to be uh, uint 256 starting x because the mint function takes a u in 256. Again, I'll let you know very soon why we're doing that. And then we're gonna say weth.mint address this comma. Uh, u into 256 starting y like that. We're probably gonna, we need to figure out how to actually get these tokens into the pool. So actually we do need to read the contracts real quick. Let's do a quick skim. Is there like a deposit function constructor? Oh, there it is. Deposit. Maybe there's like an add liquidity. Oh, there's an add liquidity. Looks like it's in a private function, so we can't call that. One of the other things you could do in Foundry, which is pretty cool, is you can run forge inspect t swap pool methods. You can actually see all the methods in the function. And wow, there's a well, it's an ERC20, so. Uh, but we could skim through these and be like, all right, which one of these looks like the function where we deposit stuff? Okay, there's deposit, uh, get with, sell, sell pool token. No, that's probably selling. Uh, all right, cool. Yeah, none of those. It looks like it's it's just deposit. So cool. So we'll use this function deposit. We will have to read deposit real quick. What's deposit do? Okay, adds liquidity to the pool. Okay, perfect. This is exactly what we want. The invariant of this function is that the ratio of weth pool tokens liquidity tokens is the same before and after the transaction. Great, we're in the right spot. What are the parameters? Okay, weth to deposit, minimum liquidity tokens to mint. So this is like the LP tokens we get back for, for minting. Maximum pool tokens to deposit. Why is it not just the same amount? Ah, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna kind of give you the answer here. 
uh, when we when we deposit WETH, we need to use the amount of WETH we're going to deposit to calculate the ratio to calculate how much pool tokens we need to deposit. So we're going to say, hey, I'm going to deposit 10 WETH. How many pool tokens do I need to deposit based off the 10 WETH that's going in? So and we would have had to we would have had to read the function to figure that out. Um, but I'm going to cheat a little bit and just tell you that's that's how it works. So great. So we've minted them. Now what we can do is we can say pool token dot approve address pool. We'll give it approval for the whole thing. We'll just say type UN 256 actually dot max. So give it all of the approvals forever. Say weth dot approve address pool type uint 256.max and now we're going to deposit into the pool get those starting x and y balances and so back in the t swap pool this is where we would already start having some questions right and again we would use put some questions right in here we would say hey if it's empty how does it warm up you know if there's no ratio already how does it know how much to put in right and so we would scroll down and we'd say, ah, OK, there's this little if here. If total liquidity token supply is greater than zero, do some stuff. Let's minimize that. Otherwise, just add it. So OK, so if there's no liquidity, we're just going to add the liquidity in here and just use the ratio of tokens that the user says is the ratio. So cool. So we can basically pick the starting ratio ourselves. Cool. So we will say pool.deposit. UN 256 starting Y comma UN 256. Let's see what this takes. WETH, minimum liquidity tokens, maximum pool tokens to mint. Uh, okay, so maybe it's starting Y, starting Y, UN 256 starting X. So WETH to deposit. That's Y, right? Y is our starting with. Okay, great. We're going to deposit everything. What's next? Minimum liquidity tokens to mint starting Y. Again, if there's if this hasn't been warmed up, we can basically pick. If empty, we can pick because, right, it's just going to be 100%. So if we say 100% equals 17 tokens, the protocol is going to go, okay, cool. Here's 17 tokens. That's now 100% of the pool. Um, and then a UNTIF is starting X, of course, for the pool tokens. Right. Oh, and then we have a deadline as well. Well, we don't really care about the deadline, so let's just do block that timestamp. But actually, this is a UN64. So let's do UN64 block that timestamp. Okay, great. So we have the pool. We have everything set up. Now, if we didn't know about the handler base method, we probably would just do our invariance, right? So we might say like function stateful fuzz underscore constant product formula formula stays the same public maybe we would just do it like this right but the question is okay how do we actually do this in a test uh assert what 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 are we what are we asserting well if we go back to our math here we want to assert the change in x is equal to this and the change in y is equal to this so we want our test to basically say the change in the pool size of WETH should follow this function, right? And that's going to be this function here. Boom. Uh, how do we write this in a stateful fuzzing test? Well, I'm going to be honest. It's very difficult here. Uh, there's a couple of ways we can do it, but they all basically go back to the handler function, right? Uh, if we go into this contract, we look for a function swapped. We basically are saying, hey, anytime somebody exerts a swap, this is the math that how we calculate how much they should end up with at the end. So basically, in order to check that, we would have to calculate the balance of X before the swap and the balance of X after the swap. And what we could do is we could say, you know, we could we could go right into the T swap and we could do like we create like a variable, you know, UN 256 X before. And then just whenever we do a swap, we say like, OK, X underscore before equals, you know, input token dot balance of or whatever the weth is. I don't know what this input token is yet. And just do before and after we could do that, but we'd be kind of messing with the contract. So a better way than just messing with the contract directly, obviously, is going to use a handler, which is going to give us the same desired effect. If we're going too fast, if I'm not making sense, again, this is where you want to 
use the discussions because again, this is hard. It's okay if you're not understanding it right away. Follow along with me, I promise you will get better. It's a little confusing how to do this, but what we could do is in a handler, we create a variable for the actual delta x and compare it, make sure it equals to the this expected delta x. That's something that would be super easy. That'd be a one line assert. And then in our handler function, we would just keep track of the delta x and then just compare it to what the math says it should be. Perfect. So let's do that. Let's try to make sure this math always holds no matter what. You know what we're going to do? We're popping over to a handler. And then once we have the handler, we can drop it back in here. This is a good time to pause. Make sure this is making sense. If it's not making perfect sense to you, like I said, it's OK. You're doing great. This is complicated stuff. We're mixing DeFi with invariance with very advanced testing. You're following along with me, which is already phenomenal. So let's keep going. Now, handler. Let's build this handler. How do we build this handler? Well, let's start off simple. The easiest way to solve a large problem is to break it down into smaller problems. So let's break it down into smaller problems. So SPTX, license, identifier, MIT, pragma, solidity, 0 0.8.20, contract, handler, is test because we're going to use a whole bunch of cheat codes. So import test. I'm also going to import console two to do some console logs. Say from forge std slash test dot song like this. And same as what we did before, we're going to say constructor. We're going to need that T swap pool import T swap pool because it's going to be the one that we're playing with dot dot slash dot dot slash src slash t swap pool dot so say t swap pool pool and our constructor is going to need to take in a t swap pool and we're going to say pool equals underscore pool great so this is our starting point we want to make sure we can test this invariant the change in x is equal to the expected change in x or the change in the token balance should equal this math that we've done or that the protocol team has done, or that we as security researchers have figured out must be the case. And what are the main functions that we can do in here? Well, we should probably at least have this deposit thing. You know, maybe there's some way that it all gets screwed up by us doing deposits, and we probably wanna have one of the swap functions. So we'll probably wanna put the withdraw in there at some point, but let's keep scrolling down, get output. Eh, we probably don't care about getting the output. It looks like there's a ton of math in here. Okay, it looks like swap exact input is one. So it looks like for swapping, we have swap exact input and there's no documentation here. Ah, but we have this one swap exact output where there is some documentation here. Now again, the only reason we're able to do this is because the docs are good enough that we can just read the docs and try running some invariant tests just by reading the docs. If there are no docs, you got to read the code, which makes your life a lot harder, right? And this is why it's so important for you to ask the protocol, hey, have you written docs? Can I speak with your team, etc. We have this swap exec output function here. It says, okay, figures out how much you need to input based on how much output you want to receive. For example, I want 10 output width and my input is die. The function will figure out how much die you need to input to get 10 width and then execute the swap. So I guess if we go back to... We go back and we cheat a little bit. We go to the audit data branch here. We scroll down. We look at this. This is basically us saying, hey, I want to get one WEF back. How much USDC do I need to put in? And just, just do that. So I expect to get one WEF back. Just take from me however much USDC you think it's going to cost to do that. So that's what this function is saying. Parameters are going to be the input token. Obviously, this is like, hey, I want to send you the output token. I want to get WEF the output amount, I want to get one WEF, and then the deadline, of course, is just gonna be blocked a timestamp. So, and it looks like they're missing that deadline there, so we would uh, wanna call that out in the audit. So actually, maybe we even just start making a note right here. Notes, or dot report, whatever you wanna call it. We're definitely tagging this. That's audit. This is probably gonna be info, missing param in nat spec. Missing deadline param in the nat spec. That should definitely be in here. It's only three. That should be in there. So we're probably gonna do at least swap exec output and deposit. 
right? Those are the two functions we're probably going to want to start with. Let's start small. Let's just go with those and build from there. Cool. So that's what we're going to do in our handler here. Yeah, well, we can add it to our report or our, or our notes later. Anyways, back in the handler. So we have our pool. We're going to want to call at least, what do we say? Deposit. And what was that other one? And this swap exact output. Let's just start with these. Let's start with these runs of fuzz tests. And if just these break our invariance, we know there's an issue, right? This is something that you can do. Like you just writing a fuzz test suite will already provide a ton of value for the client. This, this code base will be better if you write this. If you're doing a competitive audit, you might think this is a waste of time, but especially if you're doing a private audit, no matter what, you writing a test suite, an advanced test suite is going to make the protocol better. It's gonna make the protocol safer. So it's usually a good idea to do this regardless. These are the two functions at least that we want to do. So let's let's start with deposit here. So we'll say function deposit public public like this. Okay. And in this pool, okay, so so since we're gonna need to deposit, all right, let's go back to this. It's gonna be WETH or USDC or WETH or whatever token. So we're gonna need to get those tokens. Let's see, let's go to this pool, this T swap pool. Is there a way for us to pull the tokens out of here? Okay. Let's scroll down the contract. Okay, so there's private immutable iWeth token. Is there a getter in here? Let's let's look. Let's look. Oh, what's this? Okay, get weth. Okay, cool. So that means I can get weth. So we can say ERC20 mock weth. Let's pull an ERC. Let's create ERC20 mock. Import ERC20 mock from dot dot slash mock slash ERC20 mock dot sol. Cool. We're gonna say weth equals underscore pool dot get with right because we see in here get with returns an address i with awesome it's going to give us an error because i got to wrap it as an erc20 mock great can we get the pool token itself oh actually get pool token look at that perfect so we're going to say erc20 mock pool token we're going to say pool token equals ERC20 mock underscore pool dot get pool token like this. Great. So we have the pool token and we have the WETH here. We're going to want to deposit some random amount of WETH. So we're going to say UN256 WETH amount. Uh, this will be public. So how are we going to do this deposit bit? Well, let's make sure it's a reasonable amount, right? We don't want to run into any like weird overflow errors. We want to avoid any weird overflow errors, right? If we do like a un256.max plus one, it's going to overflow, right? And we don't want to do that. So let's bound this, this amount. So we'll say weth amount equals bound the weth amount. And we'll say, we'll just say zero and we'll do type uint64 dot max hopefully this is like a reasonable amount and hopefully we're not restricting too much right if we pull up chisel type un64.max is this much let me copy this one two three four five six seven eight one two three four five six seven eight nine ten okay so it's kind of low it's only 18 eth but let's just go with it for now and remember what we're trying to do here in this handler is remember we're trying to get the actual delta, the actual change, and then the expected change as well. Remember this equation, this beta thing, right? The readme, this beta thing is delta y. So we're going to have to get the actual delta y as well. So this weth amount, this amount to deposit, this is going to be the change, right? If we're going to deposit, you know, 10 weth, what do we say? Which one was which? Starting x is going to be the ERC20. So the y is going to be the weth. The x is going to be the ERC20. So great. So we already have this starting weth amount, right? So we can actually create this UN256 starting y. And we could say, hey, if we're going to deposit weth, we are going to change the delta. So starting y is going to be equal to this weth amount. Now what we're going to need is we're going to need to get this starting or the starting delta x. And we can actually take a look in here see if there's a function that will help us do that. So I'm going to cheat a little bit here and I'm going to tell you that there is a function. Uh, this would be something you would have to do to read through it. This is get pool tokens to deposit based off of width. 
And then you would, we would have to do a manual review to make sure this function is actually doing what we want it to do, right? We would actually have to do some manual review on this, right? So we're just going to grab this though. And we're going to say starting X equals pool dot get pool tokens to deposit base off with, with amount. So I am cheating a little bit. Uh, it is what it is. Just, just roll with me here. <laughs> so, okay. So not, not zero code review, but very little code review, right? So this get pool tokens to deposit based off with, if we come back here, it looks like this is being used in our deposit function. Okay, great. It looks like it looks like it's saying, okay, pool token reserves, pool token to balance of this, wet token reserves, wet token to balance of this. And we're just doing, oh, this is just getting the ratio. Wet tokens times pool tokens divided by wet reserves. So this is just getting the ratio based off of how much is going in. So this is actually a pretty easy function to, to verify and make sure it's actually good. So, excuse me, these are actually the expected starting wise. So this is what we're expected, expected starting wise and expected starting X. So we're expecting to deposit this much wealth. We're expecting to deposit this many pool tokens, and then we'll do the actual deposit, and then we'll see what the actual amount is. So the actual starting is going to be starting Y is going to actually be the wealth dot balance address of this and the starting X is going to be the pool token. Thank you. Get up copilot pool token dot balance of this starting X. So now we're going to create these other variables and these are known as ghost variables. They're called ghost variables because they don't exist in the actual pool contract. They only exist in our handler, but we have a U256 expected starting X starting X. Copy paste expected starting Y. So now if we scroll back down, expected starting Y, expected starting X, we'll do the deposit and then we'll check what the actual stuff is here. So now we're finally going to do the deposit here. So we'll do vm.start prank. Maybe let's create a new address called like liquidity provider. So we'll say address liquidity provider equals make ADDR LP. So we're going to prank this liquidity provider now. Now, in order for them to actually deposit anything, they're going to need both the weth and the pool token. So we'll do a little weth dot mint liquid fighter weth amount. We'll do pool token dot mint liquidity provider. Um, and this is going to be the expected starting X. This is how much uh, how much weth they're going to deposit, how many pool tokens they're going to deposit. We'll do approvals on those weth dot approve address pool and then yeah we'll just do type you in 256 max so we never run into weird approval issues we'll do pool token dot approve address pool comma type you went 256 dot max and then we'll actually do the deposit function so we'll do pool dot deposit what do we need let's go back function deposit okay wet to deposit minimum Yep, we already went over this. Okay, so the wet to deposit. This is going to be wet amount. What's next? Minimum liquidity tokens to mint. This can be kind of whatever we want. So maybe we'll just say zero here. No minimum. Maximum pool tokens to deposit. Doesn't really matter to us. So we could do this is going to be our expected X and the deadline you went 64 block dot time stamp. Perfect. So we actually did the deposit. We'll do a VM dot stop prank. And now that we've actually done the deposit, now we can see if our our X's and Y's have actually changed, right? So starting X, starting Y, those aren't going to change. But this is where we want to get some actual deltas, right? So we have our starting Y, starting X, expected starting Y, expected. Oops. Oh, excuse me. This should not be expected starting. This should be expected delta, right? Not expected starting. Sorry about this. Delta, because we're saying, hey, we, we're expecting this to change by this weth amount. We're expecting the pool to change by this weth amount. We're expected the pool to change by this pool token amount. This is how much we're expecting this deposit is going to do. And this is our starting Y. And then we can get U into 256 ending Y equals wet that balance of address this U into 56 ending X equals pool token dot balance of address this oh and these should be deltas 
expected. Sorry about this. Pull token dot mint. Expected. Delta X. Pull deposit. Expect delta X. Okay, cool. And now with the ending Y and the ending X, we can actually get our actual deltas. So up here, we're saving expected deltas. And now we can do UN256 actual delta X, UN256 actual delta Y. So this function here is basically giving us the wet to deposit, which is going to be our delta Y, times the pool tokens to reserve, which is going to be our X, divided by weth reserves equals get pool tokens to deposit based off weth equals this delta x. It's a little bit different from the formula that our readme says, right? Our readme says this is the formula for delta x. So why is this giving us a different formula? So maybe this code is wrong, so we would want to check. Is this correct? Now you might also be thinking, hey, Patrick, uh, why did we do all this math over here? Uh, we're not doing any of that in this deposit thing. What's what's going on? And you're absolutely correct. So that function is only for swaps. So for the deposit, we still want to make sure our expected and our actual makes sense. But that function is really just for doing the swaps and not necessarily related to the deposit function itself. So the deposit function actually might have its own invariant uh, for adding liquidity. We are going to ignore that for now. We're just going to focus on the swaps, but we need to deposit money first in order for us to swap. So bear with me. I promise this will make sense soon. It's probably not making sense right now, but it's okay. So uh, we're getting our expected delta X. Our expected change is going to be based off of this function, which again is just getting the ratio based off the pool. No super difficult math here. Our expected delta Y is just going to be the weth amount. Now we have the actual ending balance and the actual ending pool token balance. So what we can do, the actual delta Y is going to equal the int 256 ending ending X minus int 256 darting X. Oops, actual delta Y, excuse me, let's do Y's here. And then the actual delta X is going to be the opposite, right? into six ending X minus into six starting X. This should 100% be int 256 because, you know, maybe we subtract from here instead of add, right? So these should all be in 256s, which means we might have to change these a little bit. We're gonna have to wrap these as ints. We're gonna wrap these all up like ints. Int, 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 int. We're gonna wrap these all up like ints. Int, 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 int. This is going to be a uint 256. uint 256. We know this is going to be positive because we're doing a uint 256 for a bound. So that's no problem there. Cool. So we wrapped all those up. Okay, great. The ending balance could be less than the starting balance because we swapped. So the actual delta could be negative. Cool. So we have a way to deposit, which is cool, but that's like not what we came here for. We want to check the swap invariant. Um, let's finally do the swap function and let's see if we can use this to find an issue in our protocol. So we're going to do function swap pool token for weth based on output weth. You went 256 output with public like so public like so now we'll say the output with equals we're going to bound it the out put with between zero and maybe type you went 64 again dot max just to give it a more realistic bound okay now we probably don't want to swap out all the money in the pool. So we'll say if this bound is too high, if output width is greater than or equal to the amount of money in the pool with that balance of address pool, we don't want to do that. So we'll just go ahead and return if that's the case. Now we're going to get the uint 256 pool token amount is going to be, this is where we're looking for that delta X, right? We're looking for that expected X here. 
And this is where back in our readme, we want this, this little function here. Okay, what are we expecting the pool token amount to be? Now, again, I'm going to cheat with you a little bit. So in this tswap pool, there's a function in here called get input amount based off of output. And this is exactly the function to get that delta x. And we're going to do a little bit of math to show you why this function works. And this is again where we need to do a little bit of manual review. So this is the function that we're looking for here. Paste this in here. Delta x equals beta over 1 minus beta times x. But it derived from this. x times y equals x plus the delta x times y minus delta y. And so what we can do is we can say, okay, so this is x times y equals x plus delta y or excuse me, delta x times y minus this output amount, right? Because the handler, the pool token amount, right? Because the output amount is going to be the width that we're putting in, right? We're putting in width. So y minus the delta y, aka the output amount, aka that width. And then we can do a little algebra, say x times y equals a little foil again, right? Same as what we did before, x times y minus x times output amount plus delta x times y minus delta x times output amount like this. Then to do some isolation, we can subtract x times y from both sides right here. And then we'll also add x times the delta amount on both sides and that'll cancel out here. So what we'll get is we'll get this equals this got canceled out by the subtraction this gets canceled out by the addition just this second part boom then we can do a little bit of then we can factor out this delta x and so we're left with x times output amount equals delta x times y minus output amount so we know now that we've done this math here we know that output amount is going to be this here output reserves is going to be this y so this could be output reserves we have the output amount output reserves the x delta x is going to be this is going to be the input amount and this x is going to be the input reserves so now we have input reserves times output amounts equals input amount times this subtraction bit here well, we're starting to look kind of similar to this huh Input reserves times output amount equals this bit here. And all we have to do is divide now and we get input reserves times output amount divided by this equals the input amount. So I know that was a lot of math. And then these are the fees um, plus fees. And we can just ignore them for now, plus the fees. So we've used this X times Y equals this math bit to calculate our input amount or as we've talked about before, our what? Our input amount is gonna be our delta x. So it looks like we can use this function. We could have gone ahead and done this ourselves. Either way works. Um, but since there are fees on this protocol, it's better for us to use this get input amount anyways, because this is gonna be more correct to what the protocol is actually doing. So I know that was a lot of math, but again, understanding the math isn't really the important part. And using something like ChatGPT can often help you with the math if you have the invariance. So we've got the math, we're nailing it, let's move on. So pool token amount is gonna equal that pool.get input amount based on output. Weth is gonna be the input amount. Pool token dot balance of the address pool. And then finally, the weth dot balance of address Cool. Great. So this is how we're going to get our delta x using this function in the actual protocol. Now, normally, if you're doing a test, maybe you do the calculations in the test itself, but we're going to borrow that function because we did a little bit of manual review. And as far as the actual ratio stuff goes, it looks right. We haven't verified these fees are right, but whatever, we can do that later. Pool token amount is right there. Now we'll say if this is too big, we want to return. So if pool token amount, you know, is greater than type, let's just say UN UN64 UN dot max, then let's just return, right? We don't want to do any crazy, crazy stuff here. 
But now that we've gotten the pool token amount, this is going to be what? Our delta x. We also have our delta y. What can we do? Well, that's right. We can update our starting deltas. So I'm going to copy this. Starting y is going to be wet at the balance. Starting x, pool token dot balance. Expected delta y is going to be the output wet. And the expected delta x is going to be this pool token amount that we just calculated is this function right here using using this formula to actually learn that ah this function actually gets us that formula. OK, cool. Uh, this is how much we're going to do. Uh, we obviously want to mint our user this amount of tokens if they don't have it already. So let's create a new person address swapper. This is the person who's going to be doing the swapping. Make ADDR swapper. So now we're going to say, all right, mint those tokens. Oh, and actually, this is going to be slightly different because the expected delta y is going to be negative one times this. Because we're not gaining weth, the pool is actually losing weth. So this is why we made these into 56s, because when we're losing weth, the expected delta y is going to be negative. When we're gaining, it's going to be positive. But if pool token dot balance of user is less than the pool token amount, we'll say pool token dot, we'll just mint the user that pool token amount. We'll say, you know, minus the pool token dot balance of user plus one, just to be very explicit here. Oh, and this is actually swapper. And this is pool token amount, pool token amount, pool token amount. OK, cool. Now, finally, we'll do the actual swap VM dot start prank. This is going to be the swapper. Pool token dot approve address pool comma type you in 256 dot max. So they're sending in the pool token. They're going to get weth back out. We'll say pool dot swap exact output the function that we looked at before it's going to be the pool token it's going to be the input token so let's pull this back up function swap exact output input token that's going to be the pool token output token that's going to be our weth token output amount that's going to be the weth amount here output weth and then finally block dot timestamp for the actual deadline. And this needs to be a UNT64 VM dot stop prank. And now that we've done the swap, now we can update our ending deltas. We can get those actual deltas. So we're going to copy this, copy what we did here. So ending Y, wet balance of address this, ending X, pool token actual y actual x so we're just about ready to start running this there's a couple tweaks we're gonna have to make and we're also going to need to go write our invariant test here but this sometimes will be the process of doing these invariants these can be quite difficult right but the important thing is what am i doing what are we doing we are trying to make sure that this function holds so we're saying the expected delta x is this pool token amount we used one of the functions inside the protocol to actually get this. We cheated a little bit, but we verified kind of hand wavy mathematically that this actually works but using some math here, right? We used some algebra. We found out, ah, okay, this is a good function to get us that response, to get us that output here. Our handler is going to calculate our expected deltas and then our actual deltas. And remember, the actual deltas are just going to be the change in token balances. Right. So the expected change in the token balances and then the actual and then the actual change in the token balances. And we're going to compare them. Right. So this pool token amount, this is kind of what we're expecting using this X time. Well, I guess this is using this equation, but it's also using this kind of the, the more important one. X times Y equals K where K is all that Delta stuff. So, again, if the math doesn't really make too much sense here, don't worry about it too much. Just focus on the process. Focus on what are we doing? We're creating a handler to make it so that dealing with this T-swap pool running stateful fuzzing tests is a lot easier.
So now, now that we have all that, we can come back to this, back to our invariant, and just write a really basic test here, right? I can just say assert the handler dot actual delta x is going to equal the handler dot expected delta x. And that's it. Now, usually I like writing assert equal because it usually gives a little bit more information if we do this. But this is all we would need to do. And this is how we're going to check, hey, the actual delta is our expected delta in our handler. Our expected delta is being set with this. We're using this x, this y times x equals k function to try to calculate the expected deltas. And then we're comparing it to the actual deltas. So what do we need to do? We need to scroll up. We need to actually finally set up the handler. Uh, so we need to finally set up the handler. Let's first import it. Import handler from dot slash handler dot t dot soul. And we're going to say handler handler. Scroll down. Handler equals new handler with the pool. Bytes for array memory select doors equals new bytes for array two select doors of zero equals handler dot deposit dot selector selectors of one equal handlers handler dot Swap pool token for web base or blah, 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 whatever. <laughs> selector. Finally, target selector ADDR address handler, comma, selectors, selectors. And then finally, target contract address handler. And finally, actual delta X cannot be found. Let's make these public make these all public so now this actually works okay now i'm going to tell you this is actually going to break and i just want to show you it breaking so we can kind of learn to to debug these things right so let's go to the foundry.toml fail on revert is true great let's run this Let's quit chisel, forge, test, dash, dash, MT, paste. This is going to fail. I know it's going to fail. Let's see where it fails. Okay, deposit failed. Okay, let's rerun it. Dash, one, two, three, four, five. There's a couple more Vs in here. We got a whole different stack here. Again, we, this is where, why we're going to go to the foundry.toml for the invariant tests. And this is why we want to go create this new fuzz seed equals... 0x1 or something clear. Let's run this again. Let's just see what we get. Okay, cool. It failed like that. Let's run it again. We should get the same fail. Okay, great. Now it's failing the same way. Much better. Okay, cool. So we're getting our first error. T swap pool must be more than zero. Ah, okay. So let's go back to our handler. We're calling deposit with zero and it must be more than zero. Okay, so we got to bump this up a little bit higher. Is there like a minimum deposit? Let's go to the T swap pool must be more. Uh, okay, right here. Revert of zero. Okay, so deposit revert of zero. Okay, oh, look at this. There's a minimum weth liquidity right here. Okay, can we get this minimum weth liquidity? Okay, great. Get minimum weth deposit amount. So let's use this instead of zero. Let's go back to our handler, back to deposit. So instead of zero, we're going to say UN256 min weth equals pool dot get minimum wet deposit and we'll say we're going to bound this between the min width and the max there so that's what we'll do instead and let's run this test same exact seed so hopefully it passes we don't get the same issue here hopefully we get a different issue okay we'll scroll up okay great t swap pool must be more than zero okay so we're calling get input amount based off of output and we're giving it zero. Let's see. Ah, okay. So we're saying, whoops, we're putting zero here again. So this should also be pool dot get minimum with deposit amount again, so that it's not zero. 
Great. I'm doing this on purpose. I'm, I'm doing a lot of wrong things on purpose because you're going to run into debugging this stuff. You're going to run into these issues and you need to be able to very quickly scroll through the log and be like, what happened here? So I'm doing this intentionally and I know there's, we're learning a lot here. Let's run it again with all these V's. Okay, great. We have a different issue here. We're saying swap pool token for blah, blah, blah. It sent argument two. Did the assertion fail or did it fail? We'll scroll up and we can see the sequence and it looks like it was an assertion fail. Okay. A does not equal B. So the left side was zero. If we go to the invariant. It's saying the actual delta X was zero and the right side was this big number. So why is this? Why is this zero? It's called our swap function with an input argument of two. What happened? So we can scroll down in here. We can see kind of what happened. All right, so we have an issue here and we can actually scroll down in here and do some debugging. So we have our invariant setup, whatever. We have a call in the actual handler swap pool token for weth output based off of weth. It looks like we ended up saying output weth was gonna be this amount here. We check some balances, whatever get input amount based off output, ERC 20, zero, zero, fine. Uh, and it's because in here I have address this, this should be address pool. Let's see if we screwed that up anywhere else. Address, uh, whoops, address pool, not the address this. Okay, much better. Let's try this again. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Now we're saying the left side is this huge number. The right side is much smaller. So we're saying the actual delta X is huge. Oh my goodness. For the starting pool, pool. Let's see, we screwed that up elsewhere. We sure did. Pool, this should also be pool. Okay, cool. Now let's run it again. Okay, and let's scroll up. Let's see what the output was. Okay, so we did a swap. The left side is a lot smaller than the right side. That's actually really interesting. Looks like it's almost like double. So this times two. Looks like it's 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 straight double. So either we have a legitimate issue or I coded some other stuff wrong. And this can be some of the hard part of this. You have to reach a point where you're good enough to know, okay, is it my code that's messed up or is there actually an invariant that's broken, right? And that's why debugging these is going to become so important. So let's look at this again. So on the left hand side, there's this big two number. So we're saying the actual is kind of this big two number. And on the right hand side, the expected is this, like basically exactly double in size. So to me, that says, okay, I probably did something wrong here. Let's go back to the handler. Let's see. Oh my goodness. And I let ChatGPT lead me astray. The delta X is just going to be this pool token amount that we calculated up here. And of course, it's going to be int 256. And this is safe to cast because it's going to be positive. So I'm actually looking through this and I'm, I'm getting a feeling it's because of this. The bound is too big and it just keeps returning, right? So again, this goes back to, hey, you, you got to be very careful with how you do these. So I'm going to change this to weth dot balance of address pool. I think what's happening is the outbound width is so big, basically, you know, I figured this out from looking at the logs that this just keeps reverting. So I want all of my transactions. I want all of my fuzz runs to not revert. So we're going to make it a lot smaller and we're going to run this again. There's a lot of trial and error when it comes to running these stateful fuzz tests. And I really did want to give you the feel of, hey, you know, it might not be super seamless the first time. And that's okay. There's going to be trial and error. That's all part of the job. And wow, we finally got it to pass. Hooray. Oh, the, uh, that means the code is safe and we didn't find any bugs. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. But our sniffer still smells something. So at this point, you might be thinking, ah, okay, Patrick, there's probably not a bug here, but I have some resolve. I'm like, you know what? Just let me try one more thing. We've been trying X. What if we try Y? So let's compare this to Y. And let's just crank up these stats in here. So let's let's keep the 32 and let's go for a thousand 
runs and we'll we'll do a seed equals zero x one let's just crank this up let's run the y test let's see what we get oh oh what what the heck is this okay i scroll up we have an assertion failed oh man what did i screw up this time well let's read through the logs and see what happens okay deposit deposit swap 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 deposit yeah yeah it's a whole bunch of deposits and swaps but it looks like somehow this core invariant is breaking what are the what are the final bits here if we scroll all the way up to the top of the log we can see there's some bound results and we see we get a crazy difference here between the left and the right so what i might do is i could obviously read through the whole log but usually there's a lot of alpha in this last section like what happened in this last swap which caused this to get way out of whack because everything was fine right beforehand but then all of a sudden it started not getting fine so we can read this swap pool token for width based on output width which is exactly the function that's going to be in the handler right it's going to be exactly this function here so we get some minimum balance we get the balance of yeah yeah we do some balance stuff yep more balances get input amount great balance 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 we do some minting okay blah 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 okay cool so down here now we're actually in the t swap pool and we're calling this swap output so it looks like we do a balance we do a balance we do a transfer looks like we're sending from the swapper thousand okay interesting it looks like we do a transfer to the swapper okay emit transfer from this the t-swap pool to the swapper and this is another reason why events are so nice okay cool and we're emitting a swap a swapper okay blah, blah blah erc20 mock transfer from the swapper to the t-swap pool okay great not a big deal uh transfer the swapper from the t-swap pool to the swapper okay guy okay. oh, wait a minute okay so here's the actual transfer now we, we'd expect two transfers right we'd expect our swapper to emit a transfer in and then the t-swap tool to emit a transfer out so this is kind of weird it looks like we're calling we've got a transfer emitted here a transfer emitted here and then another transfer why do we have three transfers being emitted in this looks like it's going from the t-swap pool to the swapper this very specific amount then we're going from the swapper to the t-swap pool for this weird amount and we also have from the t-swap pool to the swapper for this weird amount where is this what the heck is this why are we, what what is this okay so now something's fishy here so now this is where i might go okay how does this swap exact output work and this is where now I'll go into the code base because my stateful fuzzing tests are telling me something something weird's going on there's a whole bunch of swaps happening where maybe I don't want them to so okay so we're getting the input reserves output reserves fine get amount based on output we've actually already looked at this this function uh, but now we do this kind of low level swap here let's go to that function swap swaps a given amount of input for a given amount of output tokens every 10 swaps we give the caller an extra token as an extra incentive to keep trading on t swap oh my goodness we've got this swap counter here and if the swap count is greater than some number we actually give a whole bunch more money back to the swapper so oh my goodness well of course this invariant's breaking we're doing some real dumb stuff right here on our erc20 token oh my goodness Additionally, if this was a fee transfer token like we saw recently, this would also break. This would also break the invariant because we're going to be transferring out more tokens than is expected in the protocol. So this is going to be an issue at audit. Breaks protocol invariant. Why are you doing this? You're ruining the X times Y equals K. <laughs> Whew. And all of that was because we wrote a phenomenal stateful fuzzing test suite now i know it seemed like it was a lot of work and it definitely was i'm not gonna lie that was definitely a lot of work to find this protocol bug here i did want to show you it because it's so powerful manual review is the tool that you will always have and you will always use and it can be used to find every single bug
But we want to use as many tools as possible. We want to automate our job as much as possible to find bugs more automatically. And writing really powerful stateful fuzzing and really understanding protocol invariance is how you can do it in a much more automated way. It's where you can very quickly, without doing very much manual review, find bugs and break protocols. And doing this is kind of more of the developer hacker mindset, where you're actually building a suite. You're actually building a test suite to break a code base. So that was a lot of work. And like I said many times, if that didn't make sense to you, that's 100% okay. But what you do need to know, what you do need to understand is back in this SC exploits minimized, in this test folder, in the invariant break folder, you do need to understand how handler stateful fuzz, stateful fuzz catches, all these fuzz ones work, not the formal verification yet. You should be able to do all of the fuzz ones. If you can't do the fuzz ones in here, ask questions, etc. If you don't completely understand what we did with the handler for the T-swap, that is okay. There's a lot of math, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of invariance going on, it's okay. But in any case, we were able to find a bug in the protocol by writing an effective test suite. And this is a tool I want you to have in your back pocket at all times. Because once you see it, once you see, oh my goodness, this protocol has a invariant and they're not testing for it, you're probably gonna find a bug. And let's say you work on a code base that's like 10,000 lines of code, it's very difficult to audit 10,000 lines of code. That's very time intensive. But writing a stateful fuzz test suite could take maybe a day, maybe a couple days, and you'll be able to find bugs much quicker. So we learned a couple of things already here. We learned that there are some weird ERC-20s and that weird rebase and fee and transfer stuff can break our protocols. In fact, these rebasing and fee and transfer tokens also break our T-swap pool in the same, because they will break our protocol invariant the same way that this stupid give the person a bunch of extra tokens breaks our protocol invariant. These weird ERC-20s break a lot of protocols. So whenever you're working with a protocol, you wanna make sure that the tokens that you're working with, you understand what they do, you understand the pros and their cons. And then definitely you want to understand invariance. There's a really interesting case study about Uniswap versus Euler and this there's a phenomenal article called Your Writing Requires Statements Wrong by this guy Brock, who does a lot of fantastic work on the Foundry Protocol. And he talks a lot about how protocols like Uniswap have this protocol invariant baked into their code versus a protocol like Euler could have had this invariant baked into their code. So we're talking about writing tests for an invariant. Sometimes it makes sense to have a check directly into the code base. Uniswap has a check directly in the code base. This T-swap that we're working with right now does not. Euler is an interesting case study because Euler did not have an invariant baked into the code base and was unfortunately hacked. So if you want to, so if you want to learn more about this other paradigm where the protocol invariants are actually baked directly into the protocol, check out this article by Brock. He talks about a new acronym instead of CEI called FreePy, which stands for functions require effects interactions dash protocol invariants. And the idea is to combine Reentrancy prevention of CEI with this just protocol invariant prevention as well. There's some debate on if it's the right acronym, but it can be helpful for you if it's if it helps you remember to look for protocol invariants in functions. Or what you could do is you could just say, hey, checks affects interactions, and then we should do pre and post protocol invariant checks. Either one of these work for design patterns for you to remember. We've already done a ton, and I know that part was definitely a little bit confusing, but we've seen that we can use a fuzzing tool to actually find and break invariants, find issues in protocols very quickly. We learned about weird ERC-20s, and we got to just briefly see it, but we'll see this issue come up in later sections as well. So we mostly just got introduced to it. And finally, we talked about core invariants breaking. We talked about free pie a little bit, or if you will, CEI and then post and pre-checks where Uniswap is a protocol that has an invariant baked right into the code base, whereas the Euler protocol was, was an example of one that did not. Euler was a massive hack that happened recently. And Tincho from the Red Guild does a phenomenal job of breaking it down on the Red Guild YouTube. So I highly recommend you pausing the video right now to go watch that Euler breakdown by Tincho. It is absolutely phenomenal and will teach you a ton about 
why it actually broke down and why invariants are so important. Now, two types of testing that we didn't really cover here. So we talked about forged fuzzing, staple fuzzing, invariants. We didn't go over echidna, but echidna is another phenomenal fuzzing tool that you can use. We, we did use the foundry fuzzing. Consensus has a, a paid fuzzer as well that you can try out. We didn't talk about mutation or differential testing, and we, we won't go over mutation testing too much in this course. But if you go back to the Git repo associated with this lesson, you go to audit data, and then you go to test. There's like a little note in here about differential testing. There's a differential folder in here with just the original Uniswap. And what you could do is you could do fuzz testing against the output of Uniswap, and we'll do that later on in the course. Uh, we don't do mutation testing, but there's a little note in here with a link to what mutation testing is. And there's a, a hint to one of the bugs is mutation testing is essentially like changing some parts of the code to see if it breaks tests. So maybe you would come in here to the tswap pool.sol and you would just pick something and, and just like change it. So like what if got rid of this line or something? Obviously it wouldn't even compile, but we we change things. You know, if there's some math, we change the math, we change the, you know this from a a greater than to a less than, you know, we make sure our tests are actually catching stuff. So we're, we didn't do any mutation testing here, but mutation testing is a great way to actually test your testing framework. How good are your tests? But anyways, so with all that being said, we've done a lot of this tooling stuff. We've learned a lot. Um, we definitely want to go to solid as well, right? And we could look for the weird ERC 20s. You will search, you'll find tons and tons of outputs on weird ERC 20s causing issues. We could also look for invariants, invariant to look for invariant findings. And we can find tons of different outputs on invariant findings. And we can use solid to learn more about historical findings and grow from them, right? Cool. So we've done most of the tooling stuff, but the thing that never gets replaced is the manual review. So now we're going to jump into the manual review of the T-swap pool. We're going to come across our findings in the manual sense and not the testing sense. But obviously when you're doing this, sometimes you're still going to want to tinker and test. So right now, if we had to write a port, there's some type of high where that underscore swap breaks invariance because, and we found it with our fuzzing test weight. So maybe there's a whole bunch of other stuff. We probably could have written more tests and find more broken invariants. But now let's walk through the code base, do the manual review, and let's find some bugs. So be sure to grab a cup of coffee, take a break if you haven't yet, because we're about to dive in to the manual review section of PoolSwap, and we're gonna write our report. And then of course, we're gonna practice again, writing our report. Remember, repetition is the mother of skill. You might be thinking, oh, Patrick, come on. So boring, blah, blah, this is how you're gonna get better. In later sections, we can skip over the report writing, but for now, you gotta follow along with me and write the report with me. All right, let's do the manual review. So now we're gonna jump into manual review, but before we do that, let's run our tools. So this group has a Slither config, which is already all set up for us, which is great, and a make file with a make Slither which looks good. So let's go ahead and let's run make slither and let's see what we get at. Let's walk through this and let's see if everything in here makes sense. Pool factory is never initialized. Create pool, get pool. S pools and S tokens is never initialized. So let's go see that. Okay, this is a mapping. So that's not a big deal probably, but it's giving us an error because it's saying, hey, our, our S pools mapping could be empty and we're doing a check on it, but that's fine. That's what we want. S underscore pools. Uh, this is still fine because it's in that same function. Okay, cool. So that's fine. And then S underscore tokens is probably the same thing. Yeah, okay. S tokens is the same thing. Not a big deal. This is red, but it looks like it's fine. Uh, lacks a zero check. Okay, this is probably an issue. This is definitely more informational. So maybe up, it looks like in the constructor. Yep, we're not doing a zero check. So this is, would be like audit info, lacking zero address check. Great, so this is already paying off, nice. Okay, reentrancy in tswap pool dot swap. Oh, interesting, let's come back to this. It's green and we're gonna have to really get a lot of context for whether or not this is a legit reentrancy. Different versions of slitties are, are used. Okay, yep, not great. Um, looks like our main ones are fine. Thanks, Slither. Now let's run a Darren. And since I started filming, 
we used to have to do a Darren dash dash root. Uh, I went ahead and upgraded it with, you know, cargo install a Darren. And now in the new version, you can just run a Darren dot, which is really cool, or just make a Darren. Okay, lovely. We now have report.md. Let's go peep this. Okay, it looks like there's not a whole lot of issues, only some NC or non crit issues. Looks like functions are not used internally, could be marked external. T swap pool, line 307. Scroll down. Where's 307? 307 swap exact input. Ah, okay, yes, perfect. So this isn't used internally. So having it be public is a waste of gas. So we say add audit info. This should be external. Okay. Constants should be defined and used instead of literals. T swap pool line 303. Three. Ah, yes. At audit info magic numbers. These should not be just literals. They should be they should be defined as constants. Absolutely. Event is missing index fields. Ooh, T swap pool line 62. Yeah, so I, I actually don't love this. I, a, a lot of people like having events be indexed. I, I'm actually of the camp where I think less index field is, is better. But you know, depending on who you are, you might do audit info, three events should be indexed if there are more than three params. But this is kind of opinionated This is kind of optional. So but cool. So tools looking good. We've found some bugs just by running our tools. Let's go to continue with doing some manual review. Okay, so we're gonna follow the Tincho methodology as well. There's only two contracts in here. So not a big deal. We're only looking at pool factory and T swap pool. So let's jump in. Let's start taking some notes. So pool factory here uh, looks like we have some imports. We have this IERC 20 looks like it's importing from forge. Oh, that's kind of interesting. I might look into this more to say mm, I'm not super familiar with the forge interface, but that's probably fine. Obviously, we're going to import T swap pool. And then I know this is the kind of the main package, right? Because in this script, it looks like they're doing some weird stuff, but they're mainly deploying the pool factory. And then I know from the diagrams that the pool factory launches the pools. So this is kind of like my starting point. I want to see if there's any issues in here. Okay, we have two errors. It looks like pool already exists. Pool does not exist. So there's probably something. Let's see. Okay, so when we create the pool, it looks like it's checking if a pool exists, it's going to revert. Uh, I guess we'll come back to that. And something to do with pool not existing. Uh, is this used anywhere? A quick check. Pool does not exist. Oh, audit info. This error is not used. That should not be in there. So cool. We just did the two seconds of doing manual review. We already found a bug. Hey, this shouldn't be used. Now it's informational. This probably isn't going to break anything, but you know, still feels good. I right, keep going. All right. We have some private mappings. It looks like token to pool. Oh, so, okay. So this is probably a little E for explainer, probably the pool token to the pool, right? It's probably because every pool is paired with weth. So this is probably the pool token to the pool, pool to token private to Oh, so it's it's a mapping backwards as well. So it looks like they can go from token to pool or pool to token looks like they just kind of have like both mappings. Obviously, the weth token is going to be immutable, because that's what every token is paired with weth. Okay, cool. There's some events pool created. That's not very many events. What other external functions are there? Oh, it looks like that's the only Looks like create pool is the only main event. So that's probably fine. Okay, great. We have an event here. Neither one of these are indexed. I, I think that's fine. Some people might have it informational. Constructor. Okay, we're just setting the wet token. Okay, now create pool. This is probably one of the more important ones. And why is the formatting? Why is this auto formatting like this? Okay, there we go. I had to fix my formatter. So it's formatting my way. Okay. Um, Create pool token address. So it looks like, okay, so this is probably token address is going to get mapped with the weth for a token slash weth pool. So that's probably what's going to happen here. So if the pool address of token address does not equal address zero, we're going to go ahead and revert that the pool exists. Okay, this is great. So we cannot create a pool of a token that is already there. Okay, cool. We could create a name. Mm, not super concerned about the name. Uh, maybe there's some weirdness here. Symbol dot name dot name. So we're getting the name of the ERC 20 for this. So we're like, so the liquidity token is going to be the token we give to the LPs, right? For to show their shares of the token. 
So it looks like we're doing like T swap and then the name. So right, so this would be like the full name would be like T swap die, right? Because we're just adding the name of the token to it. This is again where we might do like some weird ERC twenty stuff. What if, or we'd ask the question, what if the name function reverts? Is that an issue? Uh, this might be something we would put into the audit report. Uh, for now, I'm going to skip it though. So yeah, okay. So we're going to do T swap like die down here. Oh. It's going to be like TS USDC. Uh, this should probably be symbol, right? Instead of ERC20. So we have name symbol. Yeah, this should probably be symbol, right? Because right now we're saying we're just adding the whole name as the symbol that might be really big. So we might do audit info. This should be dot symbol, not dot name. So we found another little informational bug there. Not a big deal. So we have the name, the symbol. Now we create a new pool. Token address, weth, token name, token symbol. Let's go check the constructors. Pool token, weth, name symbol. Pool token, weth, name symbol. And remember, I'm do hitting command click to like go to the constructor and then control back or control minus to go back, right? And control shift back, that goes forward. It's like kind of the back button in VS Code. So, so this looks pretty good. Now, okay, cool. So we have this check up here. It looks like we do indeed add that pool to the list. And then we map it the other way as well. We emit an event and then we return the address to the pool. Okay, this looks pretty harmless to me. It doesn't look like a big deal. And then we have a whole bunch of external public view and peer functions. They're all external, which is nice. They're all view. Okay, cool. Get pool, put the token address. We return the pool token address. That looks fine. Get token, we add the pool, returns the tokens, that looks fine. And then get what token, return iWet token. So this contract looks pretty good to me, right? There's a couple informational findings, but this feels pretty good, right? Like if I have, if I've created my little notes.md, you know, maybe right now I say factory or pool factory is looking pretty good. Maybe I'll put a little check mark next to it. Looking pretty good. T swap pool. We haven't gone over yet, but I'm feeling pretty good just by going over this pool factory. This seems very straightforward. Stuff looks good. Cool. Let's move on. And now we get to the bulk of the security review, the T-Swap pool. And this will give you a really good understanding of Uniswap V1 or Uniswap in its most basic sense. So we got a high level. Now we'll actually see more of what the code of the T-Swap pool looks like. And we'll get a good understanding of Uniswap as well. So. Let's start ripping through this code base. So great, we got a whole bunch of errors at the top. T-Swap pool is ERC-20. This makes sense because it's a liquidity token, okay? Using safe ERC-20, this is really nice. Whenever we see this library being used, right? This is gonna do safe transfer from. This helps protect against some of the weird ERC-20 stuff that we'll see later on. We've got some immutable state variables. IWETH token, okay, that makes sense. Pool token, this makes sense that these shouldn't change because every contract is just going to be two tokens. Minimum WETH liquidity. What's this do? Let's look for this. Ah, this is actually something we found for the invariant test suite. If you're going to deposit WETH, you have to deposit a minimum amount of WETH. So looks like that's hard coded in here. We might go, uh, is this too high? Something weird going on here. Then we have this swap count and swap count max. This was the cause of one of the bugs we found with our invariant or our stateful fuzzing test suite. There's this weird, if we go back down, there's this weird swap counting thing that happens where every 10 swaps, they just give extra money, which just totally breaks the protocol invariant. So this doesn't make any sense to do. So cool. So we know what those are. We have some events. We already put some audit notes about the events. We have some modifiers. Okay, revert if deadline passes. Let's see if this actually does what it says it does. If the deadline is less than the current timestamp, we'll revert what the deadline has passed. That looks good to me. Revert if zero, really well named modifier. I'm gonna pass amount and it says if it's zero, revert. That looks good to me. The constructor, you know, we might do again, you know, at audit info, you know, zero address check. Not a super big deal here though. Okay, tokens names. Okay, okay. Now we're getting to the brunt of this. Add and remove liquidity. Let's do a little toggle word wrap here to read this a little bit better. So here's our deposit function. If we go back to the git repo associated with this, we go to audit data. 
we scroll down, this is going to go back to this liquidity provider stuff. Uh, where is that? Here, where the liquidity providers are going to be adding liquidity. So that's what's going on here. So what does it take? It takes amount of WETH a user is going to deposit. The minimum liquidity tokens, remember, in this diagram, they're given liquidity tokens. So whenever they deposit, they'll deposit the funds and they'll get the liquidity tokens, which represent how much money they have in the pool. So this is how many liquidity tokens to mint. And it looks like we derive the amount of liquidity tokens to mint from the amount of WETH the user is going to deposit, but set a minimum so they know approximately what they will accept. Okay, that seems very helpful. Maximum pool tokens to deposit. The max amount of pool tokens the user is willing to deposit. Again, it's derived from the amount of WETH the user is going to deposit. So they say, I'm going to deposit 10 WETH. How much, you know, USDC should I deposit? And hey, just so that you know, I only want to deposit at, you know, a maximum of 10. So that seems like that makes sense. And then we have this deadline and we're our VS code is even giving us a little issue here. Unused function parameter. Remove our comment out the variable name to silence this warning. Oh, I think we saw that when we ran forge build. When we ran forge build just by running the build command. We actually have a few warnings. Unused parameter. So this deadline thing is not even being used. Oh my goodness. At audit potentially info. But what is it? Let's see what this does. The deadline, the transaction to be completed by. So we have this deadline function. This actually might be a lot worse than just informational. We have this deadline parameter that we're just completely not using in this function. Yikes. So this means if someone sets a deadline, let's say next block, right? Let's say, hey, someone wants to deposit some funds. If someone deposits some funds, they set a deadline of next block and the next block passes, they could still deposit. Oh my, actually, now that we're thinking about this, this is actually way worse. This is probably going to be a high. Well, why is this a high? Well, let's look at the impact. Impact of this is going to be a user who expects a deposit to fail will go through. That could be argued to be a severe disruption of functionality. Severe disruption of functionality. What's the likelihood? Well, the likelihood is going to be high. So impact is going to be high. The, the likelihood is going to be high because anytime someone wants to deposit, the deadline's always going to be ignored. So this is going to be high because it's always the case. So this is probably definitely going to be high. Maybe we'll take notes of it in our notes.md, but we have audit high here, so we can come back to that later. Oh my goodness. What a bug. Great bug to find, huh? And this is just by the compiler running. Oh my goodness. Okay, so we missed this. Let's let's check out these compiler stuff now. Tswap pool, unused local variable. It looks like in our deposit function, which we're looking at, pool token reserves is ignored. Why is pool token reserves ignored? It looks like we have some math here, and it looks like we could have used pool token reserves and wet reserves to do some math. Wet reserves, which is y plus wet the deposit, delta y divided by pool token reserves, x plus pool tokens to deposit, delta x. So this is kind of that same function we were doing before. And pool tokens to deposit based off of wet this does the math for it. I'm not going to spend more time on the math here. I'm going to just tell you the math here makes sense. <laughs> the math here works. You can spend more time fiddling with the math if you want. But it looks like this was probably put in here because they were originally going to manually do the calculations and then they just had this function and they went, oh, I could just use this function. But this is definitely a waste of gas, right? So we'll do audit, you know, gas or audit info. Um, don't need this line because it's not used. Maybe they do need this line. They forgot to use it, but it looks like it's they don't need it. Uh, and then finally, we have this unused function parameter. So for swap exact input, we have this output that's unused. This probably isn't a big deal, but this is probably at least going to be a low. So, and let me tell you why. So this is going to be audit low. So we have this output and it's never actually being called. So let's let's look at this. So what's the impact? So I don't, we don't really know if this is being used elsewhere. Actually, it looks like this should be marked external, so it's not used internally. At first glance, the impact of this looks like it's probably low, where protocol is giving the wrong return, right? Because this is just always going to return zero, where it probably should be something else. Uh, likelihood is going to be high, where it's always the case. One could argue, oh, it's low and it's high. It's it must be a medium, but maybe you all, maybe you say like medium, um, maybe you say like this is super low, 
this is so low that it kind of trumps the likelihoodness. This again kind of gets into the subjective nature of these findings. Unless we find some place where this output is used, this probably isn't a big deal. So we're probably going to just have this be audit low. Cool. Just by compiling this and checking these warnings, we found a couple more bugs. All right. Great. Let's keep going. All right. So we're back on deposit. So this, we don't need this line. Let's keep going down. So we're trying to figure out how much we should deposit in here. So we're saying, okay, revert if zero, if there's zero weth, let's revert. Great. We're saying if the weth deposit is less than the minimum weth liquidity, deposit amount too low, weth, weth to deposit. Let's see if those are right. Minimum weth, weth to deposit, minimum weth, weth to deposit. That's correct. We probably don't need this minimum weth to be emitted. And this again, I might be like an audit informational just because this is always going to be this. So we're like, we're not getting extra information. So I probably would do like audit info. Minimum weth liquidity is a constant and therefore not required to be emitted because anyone could just look to this contract and see what this value is, right? Great. Keep going. So now there's two different times that we would warm this up. If somebody has already deposited in here, then we're going to do something different than if it's the first time someone's deposited. So if this is the first time the initial funding of the protocol, we're going to run this. We're going to run this bit. And actually, I do want to look into this bit first. So right when we're warming up, right when we're depositing, looks like we're calling this internal function. Let's go check out what this does. Oh, it's right here. OK, cool. This is a sensitive function and should only be called by add liquidity. Oh, well, let's make sure that's happening. OK, it looks like that is happening. OK, cool. It takes in weth to deposit, the amount of weth the user is going to deposit, pool tokens to deposit, the amount of pool tokens the user is going to deposit, and liquidity tokens to mint, the amount of liquidity tokens the user is going to mint. So weth to deposit, pool tokens to deposit, liquidity tokens. It's private. That's good. So nobody else can call it. And it looks like we call mint, the message dot sender, liquidity tokens to mint. OK. OK, we have a we have an event called liquidity added where it's message sender, pool tokens weth. Let's see this event. Liquidity with pool tokens. Wait a minute. Message sender pool tokens with message sender with pool tokens. Oh my god, it's backwards. At audit low, this is backwards. Should be like this. Oh my goodness, this is backwards. So whenever events are wrong, I always mark these as low. Now there's some debate on what they should be marked as, but let's go back to impact likelihood. Right? What's the impact? Well, the impact's going to be low. The protocol is giving the wrong return slash information, right? In its current state, this is saying pool tokens is weth and weth is pool tokens. So impact is low. Likelihood is high um, because technically it would always be happening. But I would say the impact is like super low. It's really hard for me to justify making this be a, a medium. So uh, I argue that events being wrong or events missing are always low unless you know you need that event for something. And then later on, when we talk about oracles and chains and bridges and stuff, that's when an event being wrong might actually be a medium or even a high. But for now, this is probably a low, just the event being wrong. Um, but cool. Let's keep going. This event, and then we do these interactions. So this is really good. This is like, you know, I might even put like a note here, um, you know, like follows CEI so that next time I come back to this, I can see if it follows CEI, right? We're doing the external transactions at the end of this function. So that's really good to see. And it looks like we're transferring the tokens from sender to this. So we're depositing it in. OK, cool. Looks good. And then we're setting liquidity token cement equals to wet to deposit. Oh, I don't love that. Ooh, why don't I love that? Well, liquidity mint and transfer is going to make an external call. And then we're updating liquidity token cement. I guess, is this a state variable? I guess it's not a state variable, so it's fine. So I might do like E, not a state variable. And the reason I might go, oh, this is this an issue? Is because in this function, we do an external call, and then now we're updating a variable, right? And so anytime you see that, anytime you see someone make an external call and then update a variable, like you're doing here, you should get nervous. <laughs> so this is going to make me a little bit nervous. It's probably fine because this isn't a state variable, but I still might do audit info. It would be better if this was before the add liquid transfer call to follow CEI, right? So we really probably want this line to be up here, but you know, informational, not a big deal. Cool. So this looks okay to me. 
Now we've understood how it warms up. Let's go ahead and see how it, what it does when it actually has liquidity already. So we get the Weth reserves, pool token reserves is ignored. We do this get pool tokens to deposit based off of Weth. And we do a little bit of math here. This again is just kind of checking the ratio to figure out how much, how many pool tokens you should deposit here. For now, for the purpose of this course, I'm just gonna tell you it's, that looks, that function looks fine to me, but maybe you wanna pause and, and take some time to look at it yourself. Now we're saying if maximum pool tokens to deposit is less than the pool tokens to deposit. So where is that? Okay, so if we calculate too many pool tokens, so this is, we're saying, if we calculate too many pool tokens to deposit, we revert. This is good. Let's say we deposit 10 WETH and then get pool tokens to deposit based off WETH returns, you know, $1 million. We don't want to have our $1 million deposited, right? So this is why we have this maximum pool tokens in here. Say, hey, like if it's more than a million, if it's more than $500 revert. So if it's, if that happens, we revert. Let's look at the revert message. Max pool tokens deposit too high. Max pool tokens to deposit, pool tokens to deposit. That looks like it's probably fine. And then it says we do the same thing for liquid tokens. Similar math here. Liquidity tokens to mint is going to be worth to deposit times total liquidity token supply divided by reserves. So we're saying, you know, let's say we want to deposit 10 WETH. I'm going to do a little example for myself. 10 WETH times, let's say there's 100 LP. We would divide that by, you know, let's say there's 100 WETH right now. That means we'd be minted 10 LP, which I think makes sense. I think this math checks out. And same thing, if the liquidity tokens to mint is less than the minimum, where we would talk about the other way around, let's say we want to deposit 10 WETH, and I'm expecting to, you know, get 10% of the LP tokens, but I, you know, but I deposit 10 WETH, and it says, hey, you're only gonna get 2%. You know, maybe I revert because that math is wrong. Cool, that looks good to me. And then add liquidity, mint and transfer. That looks good to me. Weth, pool tokens, liquidity tokens, that looks good. And is this setting the liquidity tokens to mint here? Oh yeah, it's setting liquidity tokens to mint up here. So that looks good. So this function looks pretty good to me. Cool. And so after you go over a function, you know, maybe you do like a, you know, E looked at it. You know, you could do like at follow up if you want to look at it again. But just again, we're dumping our thoughts places anywhere we can. So deposit function, we found a couple of issues. We found a high where this deadline thing is just being completely ignored. But the function itself looks all right to us. So let's keep going. We looked at add liquidity, mint and transfer already. Nice. So now withdraw. This is going to remove the liquidity from the pool, right? Back in our little diagram here. So this is going to be taking the liquidity out. We're gonna burn LP tokens in exchange for the underlying money. Removes liquidity from the pool. Great. Liquidity tokens to burn. The number of liquidity tokens the user wants to burn. So again, they give their LP tokens in exchange for their money. The minimum WETH the user expects to withdraw. Minimum pool tokens user wants to withdraw and the deadline the user wants to withdraw by. Now these minimum things might seem really weird, but later on in the course when we learn about MEV, they will make a lot more sense. We have these in here. It looks like the deadline is actually being used in revert if deadline is passed. It looks like we checked this out. This looks pretty good to us. Revert of zero, revert of zero, revert of zero. Great. We're gonna do the same math as we did kind of in deposit where we said liquidity tokens to burn times the balance divided by total liquidity. It's gonna be WETH pool tokens. So we're basically just getting the ratio of WETH tokens based off the LP tokens, right? So if there's, you know, 100 LP tokens and you have 10, that means you have 10% of the pot. That means you would withdraw 10% of the WETH and then 10% of the pool tokens, right? So this is just getting that ratio and doing the math here. We would 100% be checking to see if this math is right, but I'm gonna kind of skip over it for now. Uh, but in a real audit, we would definitely be doing that. Then we wanna check if the WETH and the pool tokens to withdraw is greater than this minimum amount, greater than, cool, that looks good, greater than, cool, looks good. Output too low, output too low, looks like they combine these um, into the same air, that's, that's fine. It's just actual and minimum, actual, minimum, actual, minimum, yep, looks good. Cool, that looks fine. Now we burn the liquidity token. Now you might be thinking, hey, Patrick, isn't this an external? And the answer is no. 
right? This burn is actually part of the T-swap pool, right? If we command click into it, this is from the ERC-20. This is an internal function from an ERC-20 that our contract inherited from the ERC-20. So our T-swap pool has this burn function as a result of being an ERC-20. So that's not an external function. So that looks good. Then we emit some events. We emitted the events before the transfers. That looks good. And then we do the transfers here. Okay. So withdraw looks pretty good to me. Let's keep going. Get output amount based off input. So this is where there's a whole ton of math in here. I'm going to tell you for the most part, the math here looks pretty good, but there is something important for us to understand here. We have this times 997 and times a thousand, right? And obviously this can be at audit info, you know, magic numbers. Why are these not like constant variables? So we have this variable amount input minus fee. And so what's happening is we're taking the input amount that a user is sending, multiplying it by 997, and then in the denominator, we're going to end up dividing it by 1000. So this is where that 0.0% fee is coming in. So users actually are going to continue to get slightly less money whenever they do swaps. And the liquidity providers are going to gain these fees because of these numbers. You know, if this was a thousand, there would be no fees. There'd be no incentive for liquidity providers to put money in here. We're not going to spend too much time on this because again, it's it's kind of, it's very math heavy. I do recommend you pause uh, if you want to kind of read through all my comments on how we came to this equation from X times Y equals K. Uh, feel free to do that. I even put a little link to, to FOIL, which is like an algebra cheat method. ChatGPT is great at this algebra stuff as well. And this is where it's actually become a lot easier to do the math parts of security review because of ChatGPT. But for now, I'm just going to say, hey, this, this function looks pretty good. And we're, I'm going to cheat a little bit. So get them out, out based off input. So this is like, you know, if I send one with, you know, how much die should I get out? Right. That's what this function does. And if we look for this, sure enough, you know, when we do swap exact token later, we're going to be using that function. Cool. All right. Next, get amount, get input amount based off output. OK, so cool. So this is looking like the same thing. We've got a whole bunch of math here, but this should stick out to you a little bit. Oh, we have this nine, nine, seven, nine, nine, seven. But is there something else slightly different? Right. The 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 division and the multiplication order is going to be a little different. But is there something else awry here? Oh, my goodness, there is. These are different numbers. This is a thousand, right? There's a little psh, underscore right here. And this is 10,000. So this one down here, get input is doing 10,000. It's doing 997 divided by 10,000. Whereas this one is doing 997 divided by 1,000. So this one actually isn't doing a 0.3% fee. This is actually doing so 997 divided by 1,000 is 0.997, representing a point. 003 fee, but this one's doing 997 divided by 10, 10,000, representing a 0.9113. So this is saying there's a 91.3% fee. So this is stealing way too much money here. Now, this might be intended, but this is probably going to be an audit high. In our README, do we talk about fees at all? We do. Why would I want to add tokens to the pool? The T-Swap protocol accrues fees for people who make swaps. Every swap has a 0.3 fee represented in this these two functions. Each applies 997 out of a 1000 multiplier. Yikes, that number is too big. So let's look at this again. Impact is what? Well, it's going to be high. Users are charged way too much. Likelihood is also going to be high. This is going to be for what? Every single time this is called, which is called in swap exec output, which is one of the main swapping functions. So swap output is one of the main swapping functions. Impact high, likelihood high. This is definitely an issue that we're going to do a write up for. And this also shows where some of these little things like, hey, maybe don't do magic numbers. Maybe do like constant liter constants at the top. If this protocol did constants at the top, these two numbers would have been the same, right? If they did uint 256, you know, private constant precision equals a thousand, they could have just said, okay, precision, precision, and they would have avoided this issue, right? So these coding practices that we talk about here are not just for, for fun and games. They're actually to help you write code in a more secure, more preventable fashion. All right, let's keep going. Swap exact input. Uh, this is a pretty important function. I might even do like an audit info here. Where's the net spec? 
like, yes, you should have NAT spec on most functions, but like the important functions, like the one responsible for swapping should definitely have NAT spec. Swap exact input. So we can actually look at the swap exact output, which has some NAT spec, which will give us a little bit more information. So this is going to say figures out how much you need to input based out off of how much output you want to receive. So this is swap exact output. So let's just assume swap exact input does the opposite. And this again is where we pull up our text and we would ask the client, hey, what's this function supposed to do? Because right now it's supposed to do nothing. <laughs> so for now, let's assume we ask the client and they explain it to us. This is going to be obviously the input token to swap or slash sell, like, you know, i.e. somebody wants to sell their die. And this is gonna be the output token to buy. So i.e. they wanna buy, you know, weth. So they want to swap their die for weth. Oh, excuse me, all the way around. This actually goes down here. So this would be the amount of input token to sell, like i.e. you know, die. So now we have the min output amount, and this is where kind of the math bit comes into play. So we're gonna say, you know, if I buy if I want to sell seven die, I expect to get at least one weth, right? So the min output amount would be the minimum output amount expected to receive. And then finally, a deadline for when do the E here for when the transaction should expire. This should be timestamp. So we have revert zero. We already have some notes from before. Revert if deadline passes. Yep, we have a block timestamp. That looks good. And we already checked this audit bit here. Okay, great. So now we can come on in, toggle the word wrap. We have input reserves. It's gonna be the input dot balance of, that looks good. Output reserves, input dot balance of. Okay, cool. Or output dot balance of. Get output based on input. Okay, we're gonna command click this function. Uh, there's a whole bunch of math here. Again, I'm gonna tell you right now, if you want to drop through here and check out the notes that I put in here for doing some of the math for converting the x times y equals k to this function, feel free to do so. You know, we've already kind of spent a lot of time in that, so I'm going to skip over this now. Obviously, these are magic numbers, though, which isn't good. And we have the the audit tag there. So let's go back. So I think this looks good getting the output amount. Now we're saying if the output amount is less than the min output amount, is that right? If output amount is less than the min output amount. So this output amount is the calculated output amount. And when a user says, hey, I expect to get at least one weth, if this is less than the one weth, then this should revert. We have this T swap pool output too low. That looks good to me. And then we have our swap function. Now this is gonna be our really important swap function. And we've already found it has a protocol invariant break with this weird swap counter nonsense here. So if after every 10 swaps, we do an extra output token. Well, this extra token that gets swapped out breaks x times y equals k. So this would obviously need to get removed. But we can also take a look at this function and read it to see what else is going on here. So, so this is going to be a private function. It's going to swap a given amount of input for a given amount of output tokens. Every 10 swaps, we give the caller an extra token for an extra incentive to keep trading on T-swap. So this is obviously bad. And this is essentially like the low level function that does the actual swapping of tokens. So input token, ERC20 token to pull from the caller, input amount, uh, output token, and then output amount. So these all look good to me. We have some conditionals here, is unknown, is unknown, or if the tokens are equal to each other. So what is this is unknown? If token does not equal what token and token does not equal pool token, return true, otherwise return false. Okay, that makes sense to me. Right, we're basically saying, hey, if the input or output token either are the same or they're not the weth or input token, we should revert. That looks good to me. We probably could make this audit info so that this error is actually a little bit more sensical, like it has the actual tokens that are broken, but no big deal. We emit the swap, which is great. And then finally, we do the external calls down here. So let's see, does this follow CEI? Okay, yes, we're doing our checks here. Then we're doing our effects inside the contract, and then we're doing our external interactions at the bottom. So this looks good to me. It looks like it does follow CEI. It looks like it would follow the protocol invariant, except for it breaks it here. So uh, that's no good. What we see some protocols do, they'll actually add like an invariant into the actual functions. Maybe sometimes you'll see uh, require or like, you know, some conditional X times Y equals K or still require that x times y equal, equals k hasn't been broken. 
So sometimes we'll actually see protocol checks, protocol and variant checks built into functions. And that's actually great. That's cool to see more protocols do stuff like that. And that would follow that free pi, that F-R-E-I, that free pi pattern that we talked about before. So cool. So this looks pretty good. So now we can go all the way back to swap exact input. Great. That looks pretty good to us. So cool. Let's keep going. All right, next, swap exact output, All right? So this is kind of the reverse of swap exact input. So in swap exact input, we gave it exactly how much input we wanted to get and then said, hey, like, give us the output. In this one, we're saying we're going to give it the exact output we want to get and we're going to, oh, we're going to give it the exact output we want to get, but there's no minimum input. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Why are we not getting the exact maximum input? So this is kind of interesting. So we're giving an input token, an output token, but we're only specifying an output amount. Okay, so let's see. Example, I want 10 output width and my input is die. The function will figure out how much die you need to input and you'll get 10 width and then execute the swap. Okay, okay, input reserves, output reserves, input amount, get input amount based on output. And this, we've already kind of gone through this one. We figured out there was an issue here with the fee being too high, but the function itself looks okay. But Oh man, this one up here had this conditional about if output amount is less than the min input amount, but we don't have a conditional down here. Ah, no slippage protection. So there's an issue here where let's go with the example it has up here. I want 10 output width and my input is die. So if we go, if we use that example, I want 10 output width and my input is die. Let's say we send the transaction. The pool gets a massive transaction that changes the, the price. And maybe that 10 output die requires 10 bajillion input die, or excuse me, the 10 output weth gets 10 bajillion output die. You're gonna end up spending way too much money. So similar to the swap exact input where we have a min output amount, we probably should have another one down here, like min, or actually better yet, max input amount, right? So in here we could say, at audit, we need a max input amount. So that if there's like a really weird or bad price, the person doesn't get destroyed and spend all their die. This also represents an MEV attack, but we'll come back to this later. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because we're gonna learn about MEV later. So great, we found another bug. Nice work. All right, let's keep going. Sell pool tokens. Okay, wrapper function to facilitate users selling pool tokens in exchange of weth. Oh, so it looks like it's just calling the swap exact output. Okay, so all you do is you, you put the input pool token amount. Okay, and then you just call swap exact output. Amount of pool tokens to sell, amount of weth by the caller. Swap exact output. Okay, let's see what the parameters are. It's going to take input, output, output amount, deadline. Input is pool token, output is wet token, amount, and the block. Swap exact output. Input, output, output amount. Wait, hold on a second. So we have pool token is going to be what? Pool token is going to be the input, right? So this is going to be the pool token, PT. And then we have the wet token is going to be the, oops, the output token is going to be the wet token. So this should be the wet token amount. Oh no, this is the pool token amount. Oh my goodness. At audit, this is wrong, right? And again, this isn't like a solidity issue. This is just like a business logic issue. It's a whoops, you put the wrong thing in here. So maybe instead of swap exact output, they should have done swap exact input with instead of pool token, maybe they use min weth to receive, to receive or something like that. But in any case, this is backwards, so this is wrong. Got another one. Let's keep going. Swap. Okay, we've been through this function. Is unknown. We looked at this. Get pool tokens to deposit based off weth. We have looked at this token a little bit already. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because this is that x times y equals k math a little bit again. Total liquidity token supply. Okay, just a more verbose way of getting total supply of liquidity tokens. That looks cool to me. This, you know, at audit info, this should be 
external, you know, not public. Boom, right there. Get pool token. Okay, nice. Just a wrapper for the I pool token. Get weth. Okay, great. Get wood, get minimum weth deposit amount. That looks good. External, external, external. Cool. Get price of one weth in pool tokens. Okay, they're calling get output amount based off input. Just input one. Input uh, input one, weth amount, pool token amount. Okay, great. Get price of one pool token in weth. And looks like we're doing the opposite of that. That looks okay to me. So we've done a pass through of the code base. So the question is, is our audit done? Well, do we have any questions? Hey, if it's empty, how does it warm up? Maybe this is something we go back and we figure out. What other cues? Okay, looks like that's the only question left. But again, we could always look at this again. We, if we're unsure about things, we can always go back and you can always do more than one pass. We only did one pass here and that's okay because we're kind of learning, but maybe it makes sense to go back and do another pass. If you're unsure, if you have questions left. But for us, it's time to actually do some report writing. New file findings.md actually let's create that new folder we'll call it audit data put findings.md into here and let's create this list so at audit let's walk through this and start writing these reports this error is not used oh my goodness and of course again i might open back up that security course bit go grab our layout finding layout copy that bring it back over here Great, now we have our finding layout in here. And we'll copy this. We'll make our first finding. We'll go piece by piece. Let's do it. At audit. Okay, informational. This error is not used. Okay, easy enough. So that's gonna be an informational. We'll say that's informational one. Since it's an informational, we can be kind of lax about it. Pool factory does not exist, is not used, and should be removed. Puppy. Oops, sorry, not puppy raffle. This is in pool factory. We can be a little bit lax on this one. Just do like a little diff here, minus sign. Just do a double check, make sure it actually doesn't exist. Great, copy that, paste it in here. Cool, we have an informational, great. What's next? Copy paste the finding layout, okay? So that means down here, this is gonna be informationals. Great, written or whatever you wanna call it. Audit info, lacking zero address check. This can be informational as well. I2, lacking zero address checks. And then maybe we'll make this a little bit more verbose, but we're just gonna be a little lazy here. And we're just gonna do a little plus sign. If with token equals equals address zero. Revert. This obviously will be a plus as well. We're going to copy this under our informationals. Okay, cool. Finding layout, paste it here. Done. Written. Cool. What's next? Audit info. This should be dot symbol, not dot name. Aha. Okay, this is an informational as well. So this will be I3. I3. Is this uh, liquid token symbol? Or is this pool factory? Uh, create pool. Should use. What is it using right now? Symbol, dot symbol instead of dot name. I'm gonna be a little bit quick here, but ideally we'd be a little bit more for as well. So we're gonna cheat a little bit. We're gonna copy this line, paste it in here, do a little minus sign, do a plus sign here, paste it in here. Dot symbol. Great. I3. Again, we're cheating a little bit here. We're making these kind of easy written. And I notice here we have this weird ear 20 bit. We don't have an audit tag for the weird ERC 20 stuff, but we're definitely going to add the weird ERC 20 stuff to this report. Great. Let's keep going. Three events should be indexed if there are more than three parameters. Another informational. We're going to go a little bit quicker. We're just going to, I'm just going to say written for now. But if you want to practice writing more informationals, you 100% should. Additionally, some of these actually are in the Adarin report event is missing index fields. So you could actually just copy paste this into your findings list. So maybe we just go like this. This will be like I4 
you know, if you want to use the Darren syntax, you can as well. Great. We just copied that right in here. Excuse me. I five four. Boom. So very nice. What's next? Zero address check. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We could add that zero address check in here, but again, it's informational. So I'm going to kind of be cheaty. Okay. Great. We come to our first high. Deadline is not being used. If someone sets a deadline, let's say next block, they could still deposit. So we have a deadline issue. Here's our first high. Let's make a new high section. Finding layout, copy this into here. Here we go. This is going to be our H1. H1. So what's the issue here? Okay, there's no deadline. So this is T swap pool. What's this deposit? T swap pool deposit is missing deadline check, causing transactions to complete even after the deadline. Description the deposit function accepts a deadline parameter, which according to the documentation is right here. I would just copy this whole thing. The deadline for the transaction to complete by. However, this parameter is never used as a consequence operations that add liquidity to the pool might be executed at unexpected times in market conditions where the deposit rate is unfavorable. And this also makes it susceptible to MEV attacks, which we'll learn much later in the course. Impact is going to be transactions could be sent when market conditions are unfavorable to deposit, even when adding a deadline parameter. It's no good. Proof of concept. We could write a POC here, um, and this would be a great time to write a POC for MEV. Like I said, we'll learn that later in the course though. For now, we can just say the proof of concept is the deadline parameter is unused. And maybe we even copy paste out the compiler. Recommending me to consider making the following change to the function. Do a little diff. We'll grab this whole function here and we'll just do a revert if deadline passed. Get rid of our notes. Do, 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 do. We have revert if zero. There's also a revert if deadline passed. We'll copy this line. Revert of zero, revert deadline passed. We'll plus sign here. Ta da. And that's it. Do a little preview. Boom. Revert if deadline passed. Very nice. Okay, cool. Reported or written. Reported. You know, on second thought, I think I would have this as a medium. So I'm actually going to copy. Why? Why is this a medium? Well, let me tell you why. Medium. If we talk about impact and likelihood, what's the impact here? Well, transactions can be sent when mark conditions are unfavorable or to deposit, even when adding a deadline parameter. Transactions can be sent when mark conditions are unfavorable. This isn't a swap; it's just a deposit. So we're still getting liquidity tokens, which represent ownership of the pool. If everyone dipped out of the pool, we would still get liquidity tokens. So actually, I'm going to argue this is a, a medium and not a high. Next informational. Yep, this is a magic number is a constant. And uh, okay, this is a constant shouldn't be emitted. I'm going to skip informationals for the rest of this reported. Let's just say we reported it. Audit gas, we don't leave this line. Yep, we can just say reported. This is a pretty simple one as well. Audit info, it would be better if this was above. Yeah, okay, we're just gonna say reported for now. Okay, audit low, this is backwards. Okay, liquidity added is backwards. Should be message.sender, wet to deposit, pool tokens to deposit. Okay, great. So this one, okay, great. So let's go to the layout, copy this. This is gonna be a low, so we have highs informationals. Let's make a low section. So this is going to be our L1. Put this in here. What's the root cause? Okay, the root cause is root cause is T swap pool. Liquidity added has parameters out of order. Uh, and this again, we do root cause impact. The impact for this one is kind of obvious. The event has parameters out of order. You know, we could say causing 
event to emit incorrect information. This might be a little bit of overkill. You probably could just do this because with this root cause, the impact is pretty evident, but it's up to you. Description, when the quiddity added event is emitted in the, what function is this? Add liquidity mint and transfer, T swap pool, add liquidity emit, add liquidity mint and transfer function. It logs values in an incorrect order. The pool tokens to deposit value should go in the third parameter position, whereas the weth to deposit value should go second. Impact event emission is incorrect, leading to off chain functions potentially malfunctioning. Proof of concept, we can kind of skip this one uh, because it's a little bit evident here. But if you wanted to, you could write, you know, a POC for recommendation here. We're just going to do a little diff once again, minus here, plus here. We're just going to swap the order of these two. Boom. Nice. Okay, let's keep going. Written. Okay, info. Yeah. Okay. Written. Let's just say this is written info. Yeah. Written. Let's just say that's written audit high. Okay, cool. So which what's this one? Users are charged too much right here. Okay. Yep. Again, we learned before this should be nine, 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 seven over 1000, not nine, nine, seven over 10,000. So this is just way too high of a fee. Uh, and that's not what the protocol intended. So Let's grab this finding layout. Let's go back into findings. This is going to be the next high. So this will be high two. The root cause is what? You could say incorrect fee calculation in what function is this? Get input amount based on output in T swap pool. Get input amount based off output causes protocol to take too many tokens from users. What's the impact resulting in lost fees? Description, the get input amount based off output function is intended to calculate the amount of tokens a user should deposit given an amount of tokens a user, oops, given an amount of output tokens. However, the function currently miscalculates the resulting amount. When calculating the fee, it scales the amount amount by 10,000 instead of 1,000. And again, if they weren't using these magic numbers, it would have been a lot easier to spot. Protocol takes more fees than expected from users. If we're doing a competitive audit, this a hundred percent is where we write a little code base with a test showing how much we expect the protocol to take as a fee and then how much is actually taken. We could also write, you know, we could also say the steps, but the steps here are pretty obvious. The steps here are just, you know, anytime a swap happens, this is going to be wrong. So we're going to skip the POC here, but for a competitive audit, you would want to write one recommend an impact it's real easy. We're just going to copy this. Do a little diff, get rid of all my comments. Do, 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 oops. And we're just gonna do a little minus sign here. Paste it in, a little plus sign here. And this is just gonna be 1000 instead. So for this H2, if you go back to the Git repo associated with this, if you go to audit data, we actually have in here, right in the report, I'm going to scroll down to H2, we'll scroll down a little bit. We have an example proof of code that you can use to check to see how you did. What I would do, what I challenge you, what I want you all to do is write your own proof of code for this function and then compare it to what we did. Okay, I'm not going to walk you through this. I want you to pause the video right now and actually try to write it yourself. And it's really important you get really good at doing these. Well, why? The more you do them, the better you will get. And this is how you both prove there's issues, but oftentimes this is how you're gonna test their issues in the code base. So we get really good at writing these proof of codes. Pause the video right now, 
try doing it yourself and then come back and check to see how you did. Okay, nice. Let's keep going. Audit, hi. Audit, written. Next. Info, where's the NAT spec? Yeah, that would be an important one. Info, this should be external. Yep. And Adarin actually caught a bunch of this for us. So we can just copy paste a lot of the Adarin stuff. Impact, audit low. So this output is never updated. So swap exact input is always just going to return this output amount, right? So since the rest of the protocol isn't really using this, it's not a big deal. But again, this is giving the protocol the users wrong information. So this is an issue. Let's write it up. Let's copy our finding layout. This is going to be a low. So we'll paste it here. This will be low to title root cause. Root cause is what? Root cause is default value returned by tswap pool. What's the function? Swap exact input results in incorrect turn value given. All right, description. The swap exact input function is expected to return the actual amount of tokens bought by the caller. However, while it declares the named turn value output, it is never assigned a value, nor uses an explicit return statement. Impact, the return value will always be zero, giving incorrect information to the caller. Proof of concept, again, this is where we would do, you know, this is where we would do a POC, a proof of code, just to show it. I highly recommend you practice writing some of these proof of codes here. For now, I'm gonna skip it, but this would be really easy to do a proof of code for. You would just write a test case and see, oh, no matter what we swap, we always get zero, even though that's not what we want. Recommend a mitigation. Once again, we could do a little diff, put some notes in here. So instead of output amount, we could say just output, right? Like so. So we could just copy this whole section, paste it in, minus here, copy this line, do a plus sign, just output instead. And then minus here, or minus here, plus plus, which is output, instead of output amount. And then same thing, add a minus, oops, minus here, paste plus here, instead of output amount, we just do output. So something like that, great. Okay, written. Next, so let's info, skip that, audit, okay. This is going to probably be a high. This is one of the last ones that we found. Why is this one a high? Well, what's the impact? What's the likelihood? Impact is gonna be high. A user may get a way worse swap. You know how when you send a transaction on MetaMask, it just kind of sits there? Well, if it sits there for a few blocks and market conditions turn, you're screwed. So we don't want that. The impact could be really high. Likelihood is gonna be medium to high because market conditions do change all the time. And then later you'll learn about MEV and learn why this is like extra high. So, so this is going to be a high, right? So finding layout, go back to findings. This is gonna be a high H2. This is gonna be our H3, H3. What is the title? What is the root cause? No slippage protection. Our swap exec input has a min output, but we don't have a max input. So lack of slippage protection in swap exact output t swap pool swap exact output causes users to potentially receive way fewer tokens description the swap exact output function does not include any sort of slippage protection and if you're confused as a slippage protection this is once again well, we can pop into solid it. We can look up slippage protection and we can see there are a ton of reports about slippage protection across different protocols. So for example, we can look at this one from C4 code for arena harvest has no slippage protection when swapping to random tokens. And you can learn about slippage protection from other protocols, what they do, how to protect against them, etc. 
So slippage protection is a pretty common type of attack here. Anytime you do a swap on a token, you want to make sure that you're not just saying, hey, whatever the market gives me, that's the price I'll take. You know, you can't just walk up to a, a protocol and say, here is 10 weth. Give me however much die back that's worth. You got to say here is 10 weth and you need to give me at least 100 die or the other way around. How much weth do I need to give you for 100 die? You can't just say that. You can say, how much weth do I need to give you? I'll do a max of 10 for 100 die, right? You always need to just do something like this. I'll give you 10 weth for at least 100 die. You don't want to do here is 10 weth. Give me the die equivalent. You also don't want to do I want 10 die. Charge me as much weth as needed. Both of these are bad. So these two are like what's not having slippage protection, and this is having slippage protection. Really important to do. So let's keep going. Does not include slippage protection. This function is similar to what is done in, and you notice how I'm just doing swap exact output. Uh, usually after I say the file, the function is in, I kind of stop, but whatever you want to do. Now that I'm going to refer to swap exact input, I'm going to add that tswap pullback in here again. This function is similar to what is done in tswap tool, tswap pool swap exact input, where the function specifies min output amount, the swap exact output function should specify a max input amount. If market conditions change before the transaction processes, the user could get a much worse swap. Proof of concept. This is 100% where you would want to write a POC. This is 100% where you would want to write. You would want to prove this exists, especially when you're talking to a protocol, because a lot of times they're not going to understand what this is. But for this one, I'm just going to walk through a scenario, right? One user inputs a swap exact output. Actually, actually better yet, where the price of WETH is 1000 USDC. Price of WETH right now is about 1000 USDC. User inputs a swap exec output for price of one WETH right now is 1000 USDC. Looking for one WETH. So the input parameters would be input token equals USDC, output token equals WETH, output amount, output amount equals one, deadline equals whatever. So somebody's looking for one weth. The function does not allow a, does not offer a max input amount. As the transaction is pending in the mempool, the market changes and the price moves huge to one weth is now 10,000 USDC, 10 times more than the user expected. Five, the transaction completes, but the user sent the protocol 10,000 USDC instead of the expected 1,000 USDC. So they got charged way more money because they don't have this slippage parameter. And so this is what a proof of concept for slippage looks like. And a challenge for you would be to write the POC, the proof of code. Yeah, I know proof of concept and proof of code are both kind of confusing. To write the code example, to prove that. Recommended mitigation. This recommended mitigation is actually really easy. In this section here, where we have all this, these notes that we wrote, we're just gonna copy this, these two lines. We just do like a diff, paste this in. We're gonna add a couple of pluses here. We're gonna say if input amount is greater than some max input amount, then we're gonna revert plus here, plus here. And then up at the top, we're gonna add that as a, so, and then we're going to grab at the top, grab these two lines, paste it in, get rid of our comments. We'll do another little line here, plus you into 256 max input amount, comma, and then I'll just do like three dots to specify, hey, there's some other function stuff happening in here. The more severe the issue, the more you want to write. So for this one, we should include a max input amount to so the user only has to spend up to a specific amount and can predict how much they will spend 
on the protocol. Now, some backlash to this might be like, hey, well, if you didn't want to spend that much, don't approve that many tokens, but maybe you're doing batch transactions. Maybe, maybe there's a whole lot of reasons for you to have too much approvals. In any case, this is going to severely limit the amount of loss the users of this protocol are going to run into. So one could argue that this is a medium. We're going to leave it for high now, but one could argue that this is actually a medium. So because the approver could approve less tokens, because you could reject the transaction, you could run a simulation. There's some might argue this is a medium instead of a high. We've got another high looking juicy. Next. Okay, we've got another high. This is wrong. Whoops. Sell it for tokens. This is backwards. Oh, man. So this one's pretty easy, though. Uh, clearly a high, but let's do the write up. Let's grab the finding layout. You can even minimize our H3 here. Paste it this one in. So this is now going to be H4. What's the title here? Sell pool tokens. We're going to say T swap. Put in the function sell pool tokens. Mixes, uh, matches input and output tokens causing the swapped amount to be miss or what's what's a better impact causing users to receive the incorrect amount of tokens description the sell pool tokens function is intended to allow users to easily sell pool tokens and receive weth in exchange Users indicate how many pool tokens they're willing to sell in the pool token amount parameter. However, the function currently miscalculates the swapped amount. This is due to the fact that the swap exact output function is called, whereas the swap exact input function is the one that should be called because users specify the exact amount of input tokens not output impact users will swap the wrong amount of tokens which is a severe disruption of protocol functionality Proof of concept, again, this is where we'd want to write a proof of code where we do a swap, we call sell pool tokens, and we get the wrong amount, right? So this is 100%. This is another place where you want to practice writing your proof of codes. I'm going to say write POC here. Let's see how you do. And then finally, recommend a mitigation. Consider changing the implementation to use swap exact input instead of swap exact output. Note that this would also require changing the cell pool tokens function to accept a new parameter, i.e. min weth to receive to be passed to swap exact input. Do a little diff. Grab this cell pool tokens function, paste it in here. Get rid of my comments. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a new line here. Oh, ChatGPT, thanks. Min width to receive. And instead of swap exact output, we're going to remove this line. I'm going to copy this, paste it in here with a little plus. This will be swap exact input pool token. We'll do the pool token amount, width token, min width to receive and then block the timestamp. This obviously is still an issue because we're not using the deadline. So additionally, down here, additionally, it might be wise to add a deadline to the function as there is currently no deadline. But again, we're going to learn about MEV later. So for now, uh, we're just going to ignore that <laughs> MEV, MEV later. Cool. Next, written. Next, this breaks the protocol invariant. Okay, this is the big one. This one we are going to write the proof of code for because we know we've written most of the code to do this. So, ran our test on this, right, on invariant.t.sol. We could have, we could run this one, forge test dash dash mt, paste it in here, and it'll give us a sequence. 
Now, for fuzz testing, we don't want to use the fuzz test as the proof of code. Why? Because they're a lot more complicated to understand. And then additionally, the sequences that they give could be not the most efficient. So what we want to do is we want to look at the sequence that it gives us and use that to write our own proof of code. Because this sequence is good, but it's like, really confusing, right? It's kind of really big. Uh, a lot of people aren't going to be able to read this or understand the output of a fuzz test. So we want to take the sequence, the output of our fuzz test and convert it to a unit test to exactly how the protocol should fix it. So if we look at the fuzz test, we can see we just basically do 10 swaps and that's all that takes to break the invariant. So what we can do is we can actually go to our invariant setup and just copy this whole setup into a new unit test and then just swap 10 times, right? So what we can do is we can come into our test bits here and we have some test withdraw, test collect fees. Let's copy this test deposit swap because it looks like we do a swap in here. So we're gonna copy this, paste it down here and we wanna replicate the sequence that our fuzz test gave us, which is gonna be doing you know 10 swaps and then comparing those deltas. So we can copy paste that and rename this to you know test invariant broken. Approve deposit. Great. We can keep the deposit bit. Let's delete all this and let's use this second half to actually replicate what our handler was doing. So in here we have the swap bit. Let's scroll up to the swap pool tokens amount. We're going to get the starting Y and the starting X ending Y ending X. So let me just copy this. It's the Y that was broken. So we'll keep the int 256 starting Y. We can get rid of the X's. We can say int 256 expected delta y with we'll do u int 256 output with equals this can be whatever we want we'll say 1 e 17 we'll just do a tiny amount of output with here so now if we do just one swap kind of like what the handler does we can do this little this bit here i think in the test they do somebody else they say user so we'll do vm to prank user if we do this swap exact output, kind of as the handler did, we can actually get the Y and the ending Y and the ending X. We don't care about the X, we only care about the Y. We'll say in 256, actual delta Y. And then we can say assert actual delta Y equals expected delta X. If we do only one swap, and I know I did this kind of quickly, if we do only one swap, this should pass, right? Forge test dash dash MT, test invariant broken because it's not one swap that causes an issue, it's when you do 10, right? So this does indeed pass. So instead of doing just one swap, like we do here, we can do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's do nine swaps, and then we'll even put the put the expectations here. If we do nine swaps, oh, output with, oh, sorry, we want just uh, output with, you wanna be at the top here. Let's do pool token dot mint. Oh, assert equal. That's why. Let's do assert equal. Now let's run it. Now it should give us the equal signs. There we go. Great. So we get a, we're getting a whole extra token because of that weird swap. Perfect. We now have a proof of code that we're gonna copy into our report, which we haven't written yet. So we're, we're gonna write that first. So uh, let's go grab the finding layout, copy that, bring this over to our findings.md. Was this H5? Wow. So pool tokens, slippage protection, fee calculation, and deposit. And now, wow, H5, Ooh, there's so many bugs in this. Paste it in here, five. And what is the issue here? Well, the root cause is down here. And we could say in, T swap pool underscore swap the extra tokens given to users after every swap count breaks the protocol invariant of X times Y equals K description. The protocol follows a strict invariant of X times Y equals K where X the balance of the pool token, Y, balance of WETH, K, the constant product of the two balances. Thank you, ChatGPT. This means that whenever the balances change, 
in the protocol, the ratio between the two amounts should remain should remain constant, hence the k. However, this is broken every tenth uh, due to the extra incentive in the swap function, meaning that slowly over time, meaning that over time, the protocol funds will be drained. So impact, a user could maliciously drain the protocol of funds by doing a lot of swaps and collecting the extra incentive given out by the protocol. All the funds are gone. Um, more simply put, the protocol's core invariant is broken. And then we'll copy this into our findings, proof of concept. Uh, and then actually, actually up here, we should also write JavaScript. Let's point to that function, point to this bit here. And our findings.md, paste this in. The following block of code is responsible for the issue. Great, proof of concept. One, a user swaps 10 times and collects the extra incentive of as many tokens. That user just continues to swap until all the protocol funds are drained. And now we'll do a little details, backslash details, summary, proof of code, summary, place the following into tswap pool.t.sol. And then we'll just copy this, paste it in, bada bing, bada boom. Recommended mitigation, remove the extra incentive. If you want to keep this in, we should account for the, the change in the x times y equals k protocol invariant, or we should set aside tokens in the same way we do with fees. For me, again, we shouldn't recommend changing the protocol functionality. You know, if they want to say, hey, every 10 swaps, send extra tokens, great. We should give them a recommendation to enable that where, you know, maybe setting aside tokens kind of similar to the fee would accomplish this. For this section, we're just going to recommend removing this completely because it's kind of terrible. Boom. 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 Mechanism. And so that'll protect them from breaking their core invariant. Very nice. Okay. Almost done. Written. And the audit info. Huzzah. We're going to pretend this is written. The only thing that we did not do, we did not talk about, was that tokens thing. Right? So we did, in our unit tests, in our invariant break, we did play with this and we did find in our handler stateful fuzz in our invariant.sol, we did find an issue here, right? And it was with these weird ERC20s. Because our this yield ERC20 had this fee on transfer thing, it caused the invariant here to break. We didn't do a test like that for tswap pool. However, going into the tswap pool function, our swap function broke the invariant because it did this extra transfer here. And guess what? A fee on transfer tokens are going to do the exact same thing where they send extra tokens. So fee on transfer tokens will also break the protocol invariant. And what's cool about this is if you go to the tswap audit git repo associated with this course, we go to audit data. Actually in here, if you go to the readme, scroll to the bottom, we can see two of the original audits done for the v Uniswap v1. And if you go to the Uniswap v1 audit report by consensus diligence, in here, there's a couple of, you know, there's some issues with the website. There's some issues with liquidity. The v1 of Uniswap actually had an issue called liquid pool can be stolen in some tokens, example, ERC777. If token allows making reentrances on the transfer from, then all the liquidity could be stolen. So these weird ERC20s in the original Uniswap v1 was an issue for protocols. And it's the same thing for our T-swap. Fee on transfer, rebasing, 
reentrancy tokens, all these different tokens can actually break the protocol. And we did this in our little smart contracts exploit in variant.t.sol, these weird ERC20s. Now, these weird ERC20s are a pretty common big issue in DeFi in general. They're really annoying. <laughs> ERC20s are really annoying to work with because a lot of them are just weird. It would be great if they were all the same, but they're not. So you'll find that this comes up a lot, especially in competitive audits, because a lot of protocols are not privy to this information. They don't know about this yet. So in our findings, our final medium in here, uh, we're not going to write this out fully, but I do challenge you to once again, write a proof of code, play with this yourself and see what you can find. So M2 would be rebase fee on transfer and ER777 tokens break protocol variant. And then, you know, the rest of our finding here. And the reason these break it is because of the same thing here. Whenever we do these swaps and we send too many tokens out, protocol invariant breaks. That X times Y equals K invariant no longer works. So I challenge you to write this, write this report, medium, high, whatever you think it is. And you'll see this weird ERC20 is coming up over and over and over again. Oh, beautiful. So we have a report written. Kind of, we have our findings written. Let's wrap this up by turning this into a report so we can build our portfolio some more. So we've already done this a couple of times. Let's grab that logo.pdf, put it in our audit data folder. Let's, uh, let's actually, let's go back to the course. We'll scroll up, we'll grab that little template. Where's the template? We'll go back to that audit report templating. Let's just get the raw of this. Let's copy this whole thing. Let's paste it in here and we'll call it report template.md. Paste this, looks good. We'll copy the report template and we'll call it 2023-1101. This is tswap audit.md. Let's grab our findings, copy it, scroll to the bottom. Audit details, scope, roles, executive summary, issues found, findings, blah, blah, blah. Paste that in there. And if you want your portfolio to be even better, go ahead and write up those informationals. Go ahead and add the findings from a Darren in here as well. Let's just update this section here. We could add the audit details, the scope. Let's just go ahead and add the issues found. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Let's look. Uh, this should be, this should probably be in the template, but it's not. Port.md. Uh, let's grab this little chart here, paste it in here. Okay, how many highs do we find? Okay, we're gonna say four, we're gonna say four highs, two mediums. How many lows did we have? One low, two low, we'll say two lows. Informational is like a billion, but <laughs> however many you want to put here. I think we probably found like at least nine, right? Four, six, eight, seventeen. Seventeen. Got the findings in there. Let's do a little bit of update. So protocol, let's go in here. This is the T-Swap protocol audit report. We put our names in here and stuff. Great. Put the protocol summary here, risk classification. We put the audit scope details here. Great. Once that is all done, we're going to run Pandoc on it. See the audit data. Pandoc 2023 T-Swap audit dash O. And we'll call report.pdf from markdown dash dash template equals e i s v o g e l dash dash listings. Let's see if we did it halfway decent. Okay, looks like we did. Report.pdf. Bada bing, bada boom, boom. We now have a little PDF here with that we can send to the clients, make them super happy with all their you know, beautiful code and proof of codes and findings and everything. Okay. Okay. We learned a lot doing this. And now you have another auto report. You can go to your GitHub, you can go to your portfolio and you can add a new auto report to your portfolio to keep building that out. Or you can start looking at competitive audits because guess what? Oh my goodness. You getting this far, you have learned a ton. You've learned so much. Congratulations for completing this section. And here's the best part. Because we went through this T-Swap contract, which was a variation of Uniswap, you also now know the basics of Uniswaps, of DEXs, of decentralized exchanges at a high level. 
So now you could go into Uniswap V1 and you could probably audit Uniswap V1 by yourself and probably do as good of a job with all the information that you now have. In this course, I'm kind of tricking you. Uh, we're doing these audit reports, you're learning all these exploits, but we're also teaching you DeFi along the way. Haha, <laughs> very sneaky, aren't we? So, let's do a quick recap of everything we learned in this course so far. So, number one, we learned that just by understanding protocol invariance, we can actually find bugs in our code bases. We didn't even look very deeply at the code base. We didn't even do a manual review, but we were able to write an invariant or a stateful fuzzing test suite, which found a bug in the swap function without even doing manual review. So we learned that tooling, especially stateful fuzzing, is a great way to find bugs quickly. We learned about what an AMM is or what a DEX is. In our T-Swap audit GitHub, we learned kind of the basics of what an AMM looks like, which, yeah, okay, for this T-Swap audit, was it's a fake protocol. However, it's based off of Uniswap, and this X times Y equals K thing is exactly how Uniswap works. We learned that it's an automated market maker because there's no order book. You just have basically pools of tokens, and when you want to pull tokens off of one side, you just have to put tokens on the other side, and the ratio must always stay the same. People want to keep their money in these pools because every time a swap happens, people get a fee. We learned about a core invariant and some math that goes on behind the Uniswap protocol with this X times Y equals K, where K is just some constant. Or basically it just means, hey, the ratio between these two tokens always must stay the same. So whenever you want to take a token, you have to give an equivalent amount back. And we learned more deeply about how important invariants are, especially for a protocol like an AMM, where the math is so important. We learned all about Uniswap. We learned all about how these DEXs work. And we learned one of the core principles of DeFi, which is an AMM. We learned about how to onboard a client extensively. Before, they didn't have any of these cool graphs or anything. If you go back to main, all they had was nothing, really making it really difficult to work with. Some of their functions were even undocumented. We learned that we want to work closely with the protocol because they're always going to have the most context and we need to understand what they're trying to do. We learned in the client onboarding document in our extensive one here anyways, let's go back to the audit data branch where we scroll down to swap onboarded. We learned that it's really important to onboard our protocols and get as much information from them as possible. For example, we see that they have really low test coverage and we definitely want to tell them that that's not okay. We learned that, hey, they're going to be working with many ERC-20s and we learned that ERC-20s are weird. So we now can use that knowledge to help protect this protocol against a lot of the weirdness of these ERC-20s. If we scroll down, when we onboard our protocols, we want to ask them a ton of questions to know as much as possible so that we can get some context for what they're thinking about. For this protocol, they said they want to work with any ERC-20. <laughs> well, guess what? A lot of ERC-20s are weird. So we probably don't want to work with any ERC-20. We probably have a, want to have a restrictions list or at least in the documentation say, hey, if you work with rebasing tokens, fee and transfer tokens, reentrancy tokens, maybe don't use those. So we learned it's really important to have an extensive onboarding document and work with the client as much as possible. We learned about protocol invariants or properties of the system that must always hold. And we learned how to write fuzzing or stateful fuzzing tests to work with them. We learned about FreePy, which was a pattern in DeFi smart contract security where a protocol actually has protocol invariant checks in the system. Uniswap is a good example of a system where the protocol invariant checks are directly in the code base. And a good example of a protocol that got hacked because they didn't have such a check was the Euler Finance attack. Some people don't like the term free pie. Some people like CEI and pre and post checks, whatever you want to do. We learned more about DeFi. We learned about the constant product formula, X times Y equals K, which is a, a formula that a lot of DeFi protocols use, a lot of these AMMs use. And you can learn more about DeFi, obviously from DeFi Llama, see some of the biggest DeFi protocols in here. We learned about a ton of tooling. The biggest one obviously being stateful and stateless fuzzing. But again, Echidna, Consensus are other fuzzers that you can use as well if you want to go practice with a different fuzzer. We didn't learn about mutation or differential testing, but we will definitely at least go over differential testing later in the course. We learned that in Solidit, if we want to see, hey, uh, is this a real issue? We could look up something like slippage in Solidit and see, has anyone else like said something about slippage? And sure enough, a ton of people have said stuff about slippage. So we can use Solidit to get a good idea of, hey, has someone else reported this? Has it been valid? How did they report this? How did they talk about this? And we can use Solidit to learn about new findings, but also 
bounce our ideas off of different findings in SolidIP just to see if we're on the right track. And then of course, we found the properties repo by Trail of Bits, where you can look at some of these core invariants or properties for tokens like ERC20s, NFTs, token vaults, math, et cetera. And it's a great place to look if you wanna see, okay, how do other protocols work with finding invariants? We learned about weird ERC20s. We learned that ERC20s are weird and a whole bunch of them are weird and they will probably continue to be weird. Trail of Bits has a phenomenal checklist where you can go through, make sure you're working with ERC20s in the correct way. And there's also this fantastic repo called Weird ERC20s where it literally just lists a whole bunch of weird ERC20s. And there's a lot of weird ERC20s, including ones that are used a lot, such as USDC. That is a weird ERC20 token. Any ERC20 token behind a proxy is going to be weird, and that just is already weird. We learned that ERC's 777s actually are tokens with reentrancy callbacks. We didn't do a case study on these reentrancy callbacks. We looked at fee on transfer, but some ERC20s actually, when you call transfer, allow you to do other stuff when you transfer them. And so they can re-enter functions, and that's pretty scary. We learned about different exploits, core invariance breaking, pre and post checks, etc. And of course, we did another round of manual review. We found some amazing findings in here, right? We found protocols were missing deadline checks. We learned about slippage parameters learned about incorrect fee calculation and how to test for that, how to look for that. More slippage parameters missing. We learned about, hey, sometimes a protocol is gonna mess up their own business logic. And then of course, breaking the invariance. We learned about missing events. We learned about missing math and a whole bunch of informational findings as well. So in this lesson, you've learned a ton and I wanna give you a congratulations for getting this far because if you've gotten this far, you're doing really well. This was not an easy lesson. You essentially audited Uniswap. You essentially just audited the Uniswap code base. My horrible rendition called TSwap, where I you know, intentionally messed it up the code base to make it worse, to make it more fun for auditing. But really, I have on the course curriculum, congratulations. Because honestly, if you've made it this far, if you've understood what's going on, you can honestly get into the security world and start doing well right now without even having completed the rest of the course. Now, of course, you should complete the rest of the course because there's so much more to learn, but you understand what's going on. You have the skills to start getting paid as a security researcher, doing competitive audits, bug bounties, or maybe even getting hired. Now, of course, to get even better, you 100% should finish the course, but right now you should be incredibly proud of yourself for getting so far. And I wanna just give you that round of applause. Now is a great time to go get some ice cream, to go take a break, to go get a coffee. And when you come back, I highly recommend trying out some of these challenges. So Tint has written this wonderful gist of an issue of a code base, which has a glaring issue. And this is to start sharpening your smart contract fuzzing skills with Foundry. Scenario is simple. There's a registry contract that allows callers to register by paying a fixed fee in ETH. If the caller sends too little ETH, execution should revert. If the caller sends too much ETH, the contract should give back the change. Things look good according to the unit test. Your goal is to code at least one fuzz test to the registry contract. By following the brief specification above, the test must be able to detect a bug in the register function. So this is something you should 100% do before continuing on because this will help you write better fuzz tests. This will be another exercise for doing fuzzing. And then additionally, you should write a tweet about some finding from Solidip. Remember, you are a security researcher. Keyword, researcher. So you wanna get incredibly good at researching issues, going into issues, understanding issues. Go into Solidip, look up something that you understand. Maybe it's as simple as reentrancy, right? That's one that we've been over a bunch. That's one that we will continue to go over and just pick one and see if you can learn something from one of these reentrancy attacks. Maybe you only want highs, right? Look for some crazy reentrancy attack, write about it, tweet about it, tweet what you learned and continue that learning journey. One of the best ways to learn is something called the teach back method, where if you teach something back to somebody, that is a great way to learn. And then of course, we'll have the section five NFT out once this course is completed. But with all that being said, now's a great time to take a break, go take, go get that coffee. If you haven't signed up for Code Hawks, definitely do that because we're going to have some phenomenal more first flights if you're nervous. Next up is section six with centralization proxies and oracles with the badass Thunder Loan audit. Then we're going to do Boss Bridge. And then finally, you'll be able to attack 
the Vault Guardian's boss code base. All right. With that being said, get that coffee and I'll see you in a bit. All right. Hope you took some time to do that fuzzing exercise because guess what? In this lesson, we are doing a lot more testing. And I mean a lot more testing. We're going to learn a ton this section, this lesson. Let's scroll down and let's talk about what we're going to be learning here. So we're on to section six, centralization, proxies, oracles, thunder loan audit here. So this is going to be what we're going to be auditing. We can pull this over, do a little get clone here and see what we're working with. So I'm back in my VS code. I'm back in my security course repository. We'll do a git clone, paste this in here, CD6, Thunderloan audit, code period. And let's go ahead and open this up in its own code here. Pop it to match the screen. Looking good. So let's do a quick walkthrough of what we're going to be talking about here. So we're going to be going over this Thunderloan protocol, which has a super sick logo. Uh, I mean, it's like a frog with a thunder bolt on its chest standing over a pile of money. I mean, how much cooler can you get than that? But there are a ton of bugs in this code base, so it's a little less awesome. So we're going to go over the same process we've been doing, and we're starting to get a lot hotter. We're getting more advanced with DeFi. We've learned a ton of tools and a ton of skills, and now we're going to double down. So first off, we're going to open this up by understanding DeFi, borrowing and lending. This protocol is based off of the Aave or the Compound Protocol, which are two of the largest and most important DeFi protocols in all of DeFi. They do borrowing and lending, an important financial primitive in DeFi. So in auditing our Thunder Loan code base, you're secretly going to be learning about Aave and Compound. We've touched on this a little bit in Puppy Raffle with Oracles, but we're going to be looking at pricing information as well and how important getting pricing information for assets is and how to do it effectively. Additionally, this is the first time we're going to be working with an upgradable contract. You're actually going to see a lot of upgradable contracts in the wild in real life, and they're really important. A lot of people use them. Now, there's some debate on as to how good they are, but a lot of people use them, so we need to know how to keep them secure. We are not going to be going over the multifacet proxy, aka the diamond standard, but we will talk about it a little bit and what it does and, and some of its differences. Now, one other tool that you can use, something called like Upgrade Hub, uh, is a great tool to actually figure out who's done upgrades, who's trying to rug pull people, what's going on. So you can put in a contract address and see how it has changed, how it has been upgraded over the history. And this can give you a good idea of, hey, here's what's happened to a certain contract, right? And it looks like Git diffs. So this can be a way to see, okay, is a protocol trying to do malicious upgrades? How can I see the history of upgrades? This is a great tool to see protocols actually doing upgrades, right? To check for some of that maliciousness, to check, you know, upgrades are very sensitive in the Web3 world. And so this is a great place to actually learn about and work with proxies and see the history of them. So another tool for your blockchain sleuthing arsenal. And we're going to be talking about centralization, whereas the T-Swap or the Uniswap audit that we did really was the introduction, talk about invariants, talk about a lot of important DeFi protocols. DEXs are surprisingly a little bit easier to understand, even though the X times Y equals K can be a little bit confusing. This is going to be probably the most important because this audit has so many common DeFi bugs packed into one that we're going to learn a ton. And we're going to learn about flash loans. We're going to learn about just, just an absolute monster amount of information here. But at the end of this, you are going to have audited this actually really large code base, right? If we go into the SRC, this is one of the first times we have multiple folders with multiple contracts. We have an upgraded folder with an upgrade contract. If you go to the test folder, even this code base is starting to get more advanced tests, although the fuzz tests are kind of broken right now. <laughs> There's nothing in here. If you want to add fuzz tests, you absolutely could. You absolutely should, actually. Uh, but more mocks, more unit tests, etc. So we have a much more advanced protocol here. As far as DeFi security audits go, I would argue this is probably going to be one of the most important audits or security reviews of the whole course. And let me tell you why. Price Oracle manipulations. Let's scroll back to the top, shall we? Let's do a little. Let's scroll back up here. Let's look into curriculum. Let's scroll down a little bit. Uh, where did I put that image? Ah, right here. Boom. Top DeFi attackers by risk. Again, I'm going to be updating this image. Price Oracle manipulation is the number one attack vector for the first half of 2023. Wow. We looked at reentrancies right over here. We've looked at 
some reward manipulation already actually, but we're gonna be looking at price oracle manipulation and actually we are gonna go over reward manipulation in this one as well. At the end, of course, if you go to the Git repo associated with this lesson, we can scroll over to the audit data branch as well. As usual, the full report that we did is gonna be in here as well as some notes as to how to generate the audit report. Per usual, there might be bugs that we missed in here, but we are gonna find so many bugs, it's gonna be ridiculous. So, so with that being said, buckle up and let's start doing the security review of the Thunder Loan protocol. So our step one per usual is going to be scoping out, scoping it out, understanding what the code base is, understanding everything about this protocol. So let's go to the readme, do a little preview. Let's scroll down. Okay, quick start, blah, 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 whatever. Okay, here are the audit scope details. We have the commit hash here which normally, you know, I would grab, I would do like a git checkout, paste it, etc. But I'm going to skip that. We're just going to use the main branch. And for all lessons in here, just use the main branch. But normally you would actually do that. Next, we have the contracts that are in scope. So if we go to SRC, okay, it looks like it's everything in interfaces. Oops, looks like it's everything in interface. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, for protocol, it's everything in protocol, upgraded protocol. Okay, it's upgraded protocol. Oh, that's kind of weird. What's up with this upgraded protocol? I guess we'll see in a little bit. Sulk version 0.8.20, chains to deploy contract to Ethereum. And we have some ERC-20s, USDC die link with. Now that we've learned more about these ERC-20 attacks and the weirdness of it, this is incredibly helpful. And we know from our last course that the USDC is an upgradable contract. It also has a block list and an allow list. So so we will have to consider how this protocol handles a token who could completely change. Okay, we have some roles. Okay, it looks like there is an owner, a liquidity provider, and a user. So, okay, so, so now that we've done the T-swap audit, we're actually starting to build a base for familiar DeFi terms, right? Liquidity provider. This is probably similar to what happened in T-swap. It's probably somebody who's going to deposit assets. And if we read this, a user who deposits assets in the protocol to earn interest. Okay, great. User, a user who takes a flash loans from the protocol. Ah, so maybe this is a flash loan protocol. And then there's an owner, the owner of the protocol, who has the power to upgrade the implementation. Interesting. We also have some known issues. We'll come back to these in a little bit once we get some more context. So, okay, so we're scoping it out. It looks like we've done at least some slight onboarding. Maybe we would want to do more onboarding in the future. And if this is a private audit, I'm probably asking the protocol, hey, have you thought about gradeability of USDC? What are your thoughts on that, et cetera? It looks like they have some good stuff in here, like there's a Slither config. Okay, so let's go into that make file. Okay, cool. It looks like they have Slither in here. They've got a scope thing. We've got a Darren. We've got a ton of really good tools in here, but all right, great. So let's just do a quick double check. Let's run Solidity Metrics on this bad Larry. Let's see what this gives us for an output, give us a good idea. Okay, so this is gonna be a 391 NSLOC and a 327 complexity score. It looks like most of the complexity is gonna be in Thunderloan. Some of the complexity is gonna be in the Thunderloan upgraded. Um, okay, cool, makes sense. So that gives us an idea. So maybe we'll drop some dot notes, dot MD. We'll say around 350, or 350 NSLOC slash complexity and again the reason we want this is because as we get better at auditing as we get better at doing these security reviews we're going to get a better idea of how long these take us to do all right cool well the first part of any and all audits is going to be as you know it get some context do some recon so let's do some recon So it looks like most of this is right at the top. This is going to be a flash loan protocol based on Aave and Compound. You can learn more about how Aave works at a high level from this video. So there's a video in here, which leads to whiteboard crypto. If you wanna learn a little bit more about how borrowing and lending protocols work at a high level, this is a great video to watch to understand. But of course, we're gonna give a much deeper technical dive as to how these lending and borrowing protocols work for our Thunder loan, of course. So let's do a quick little bit of reading just to understand what's going on here. So the Thunder Loan protocol is meant to do the following. Give users a way to create flash loans and give liquidity providers a way to earn money off their capital. Wow. Okay. A couple of new things here. What the heck is a flash loan? Give liquidity providers a way to earn money off their capital. So if we go into our notes, we'll say like make it like a term section. Liquidity 
provider. We know what this is. It's just someone who deposits money into a protocol to earn interest. And a question you always want to ask is, where's the interest coming from? And this is something you should even ask as an investor, but definitely as a security researcher. In T-Swap, where was the interest coming from? Well, the interest was coming from fees from swapping. The more people swapped, the more fees, the more interest people got on their collateral. So what about Thunder Loans? Where is its interest coming from? Well, I guess we're going to find out by reading on. Okay, great. Liquidity providers can deposit assets into Thunder Loan and be given an asset token in return. Oh, whoa, that's kind of weird. So we're saying in Thunder Loan, we take our token, we deposit it, and then now we get asset token. Is that what it's saying? These asset tokens gain interest over time, depending on how often people take out flash loans. So we're probably going to assume we're going to get fees from loans, fees from flash loans. That's how we're going to get interest. Let's keep reading. What is a flash loan? Ah, that's kind of nice. A flash loan is a loan that exists for exactly one transaction. A user can borrow any amount of asset from the protocol as long as they pay it back in the same transaction. If they don't pay it back, the transaction reverts and the loan is canceled. Users additionally have to pay a small fee to the protocol depending on how much money they borrow. To calculate the fee, we're using the famous on-chain T-Swap price oracle. Oh, the one we just audited. Okay. We are planning to upgrade from the current Thunder Loan contract to the Thunder Loan upgraded contract. Please include this upgrade in the scope of a security review. And then they have all the docs here. So my first thing, oh, and then of course we have some known issues at the bottom. Like I said, we'll get to it. So my first thing here, obviously, is we need to understand these flash loans a little bit better. We need to understand this borrowing and lending protocol much better. And ideally, we get some diagrams here. So we have a lot to learn. Let's first look at flash loans and understand what is a flash loan, because these are incredibly important DeFi primitive. So let's talk about what is a flash loan. So what is a flash loan? Now, let's say you're a user, and there are two decentralized exchanges, DEX A and DEX B. DEX A, Ethereum is $5, and on DEX B, Ethereum is $6. You might think to yourself, hey, I can use this to make money. I could buy one ETH on decentralized exchange A, it would cost me $5, and then I could go ahead and sell that one ETH on decentralized exchange B, since the price over there is six, and I would get $6. So I would lose $5 from buying one ETH, and then I would gain $6 from selling it on the second exchange, and I would net a profit of $1. This process is known as something called arbitrage, where you see the market is inefficient, you see there's different prices of an asset on different exchanges, and you leverage the differences in price to make a profit, doing exactly what we saw here, you know, you know buying for $5 and selling for six. Now here's the thing, in my wallet, to kick this whole thing off, I need to start off with $5, and obviously I ended up with, you know, plus one to make $6. But the thing is, if all I have is $5, I'm kind of broke. If I see this crazy opportunity here, I'm like, oh my goodness, I can do this a whole lot, but I only have $5, I would have to just keep doing this one at a time. And because everything's on chain, other people can see this transaction. Now, what if this user, instead of having $5, they had $5,000 to start? Instead of a $1 profit, let's see what they can make for a profit instead. So if ETH is $5 over here, instead of buying one ETH with their $5,000, they could buy 1,000 ETH for minus $5,000, and they can then sell that 1,000 ETH on the second exchange where ETH is $6, and instead of making a $6 profit, they would gain $6,000 from selling it over there. Assuming, of course, that the liquidity pools aren't impacted too much, you know, we just audited T-Swap, so we know how this works. In this second one, instead of it being six minus five, it's gonna be 6,000 minus 5,000 equals $1,000 profit. So in this second example, simply because our user has, could start with $5,000 instead of just $5, they were able to get a much, much bigger return. They were able to leverage this opportunity much harder. Now, typically in the Web2 world, this type of move is only possible by whales or people who have a ton of money. Whale is kind of a slang term for people who have a ton of money or hold a bunch of tokens. Typically, only whales can do this type of thing. But what if we were able to take out a very, very large loan but pay it back immediately. And that's where flash loans come in and kind of level the playing field and allow anybody to be a whale for a single transaction. So we'll come back to this example in a bit and we'll see how our $5 friend will be able to compete and actually do the same thing as our $5,000 whale. 
How can flash loans help level the playing field and allow anybody to be a whale in Web3 and make finance more fair? Well, okay, let's learn about what a flash loan is. Well, we know that from dealing with T-Swap that in DeFi, a lot of protocols have money inside of a contract, you know, like a thousand USDC or something like that. And these contracts are governed by a mutable code, right? Well, it would be cool if the contract could just give us the money, let us go back up here, do this arbitrage thing, and then come back and just give the money back. But if the contract gives us the money, we might actually be robbers the whole time and just run off with the money. So the contract's not just going to give us the money. It needs some assurance that we're going to pay the money back. But this is where DeFi and smart contracts are amazing. But in DeFi, we can encode stuff. So we can encode the smart contract to say, hey, you can have this $1,000 in a transaction. But at the end of the transaction, you better give it back. Otherwise, we're going to revert your entire transaction. So if we do something where give the money to the user and they try to run off, well, in Web3, we can actually revert transactions. And instead of the money ending up over here, the whole transaction reverts back to its initial state as if the transaction hadn't happened. So we can actually encode this in our smart contracts. Now, the code for a flash loan in the smart contract world might be as simple or as minimal as this. So we have the starting balance, which we can say is the ERC-20 token balance of some contract. We transfer those tokens to some receiver address for some amount. And this transfer underlying function calls their contract that we send it to. So if we once we do this line, we send it to some other contract, right? Where the contract says, OK, now do arbitrage or something. And then in this calling contract, this calling contract can then send the money back before the next line happens. Let me make this a little bit obvious, more obvious here can send the money back before the next line happens because then the next line checks the ending balance. And if the ending balance is less than the starting balance, then revert. And this is going to be really similar to the code that we're going to find in the Thunder Loan audit. So let me finish this diagram just to kind of show you what this way, what this is going to look like. So we have this bit encoded into our contract. This is now a flash loan contract, hence the Thunderbolt. We're going to move these over here. We're going to move these back here. So the contract encoded says, hey, you can have this $100,000 so long as you pay it back at the end of your transaction. And this all can only happen in a single transaction. So what happens is we take this money, we send it to ourselves, or more specifically, we send it to some contract that we control. This contract says do stuff. This contract does some stuff with the money. We go to arbitrage or whatever we want to do. We make the money back. And then we send the 1,000 USD back to the contract and then this does a little revert check. Hey, are we good? So let's see this whole thing in action. Let me actually move this money for you and show you what it exactly looks like. Contract has this curfew. Basically says, I need to have $1,000 or I revert. So this is going to be the last check in our contract. So we go ahead, we call some flash loan function. This $1,000 goes to us. We do some stuff and this transaction is still valid because this line hasn't hit yet. Maybe we go sell it for ETH. Maybe we go do some arbitrage. We do whatever the heck we want with this money. Maybe we do nothing. Maybe we just want to hold it for a single transaction to be slightly richer. Then we repay it back to the contract. This line hits. It goes, oh, I have a thousand dollars. I'm good. I don't need to revert. Obviously, if we take this money and we don't repay it back, this line hits. Our whole thing reverts and our blockchain goes back to its initial state. So that's essentially how a flash loan works. And you can see this flash loan thing can only happen in the Web3 world. And that's why this is so cool. Now, similarly to our to the T-Swap protocol that we saw, this $1,000 isn't going to come for free. It's going to come from some liquidity provider, right? Some other user. And actually, more specifically, this is probably going to be a whale, right? Or somebody with a lot of money. They originally had the thousand dollars. They went ahead and they deposited it, that money into the contract here. So we'll do a little deposit. They are given shares of the pool. So now they have a little little receipt that says I deposited one thousand dollars token so that they can withdraw their money at any time they want. And then usually what happens is when I take a flash loan or when some user takes out a flash loan, some user takes out a flash loan get the money and we immediately pay it back like this, right? right? Because the USDC is going to go to us real quick and then immediately come back. And when we do this flash loan here, we borrow the $1,000 and usually there's something like a plus zero 
0.01% fee or something like that. And this little fee starts accruing in, in the contract. So instead of a thousand, maybe it's a thousand one, thousand two, thousand three, thousand four. It keeps accruing money. And so this I deposited one thousand dollars, give me fees takes place. So because they deposited money to the protocol, they're going to get fees for people taking out these flash loans. Now that we kind of know what this looks like, let's go back to this example and let's do an entire walkthrough of how a flash loan might work and how our poor little fox here might do as well as one of these whales because of these flash loans. OK, so let's go down here. Now we're going to look at the same exact scenario, but with flash loans. So we have two decentralized exchanges again. Dex A with five dollars, Dex B with six dollars. And we've got our poor little guy whose starting balance is five dollars. They want to take advantage of these, but they only have five dollars. They could 100 percent use it to buy one ETH and then resell it and then just like keep doing that back and forth. But that's going to cost a lot of gas to do that. And other people are going to see this and maybe try to to copy him and ruin the opportunity and the opportunity won't last. Right. Because eventually, if you keep doing this, eventually the price of ETH on Dex B will switch to five dollars or they both will eventually even out at five fifty. However, our little fox guy knows about this protocol that offers loans over here. There's a protocol for flash loans. Obviously, it starts off as empty, but some whale knows that people want flash loans. So what they do is they take one hundred thousand dollars and they stick it into the protocol and they deposit it because they did this. They now own one thousand flash loan tokens or FLT. This represents one hundred percent ownership of the pool. Since they're the only one in here, they have 100% of the pool. Any money in here belongs to them, and they will just use their FLT, this FLT token, give it back to this smart contract, which will then give them their $1,000 back whenever they want, or their 1,000 USDC. So, and they know that this is going to accrue fees. Actually, better yet, let's give them, let's have it be $5,000 because math. So our person here sees this, and they go, hey, I want to use that to take out a flash loan. So what they're going to do is they're going to call the flash loan function on this contract. What it's going to do, it's going to give us the $5,000 that it has in here. Now, this pink line is going to represent one single transaction happening. Because remember, this flash loan contract says, hey, you better have my $5,000 by the end of this transaction. Otherwise, I'm going to revert. So we now have the $5,000. So what do you think we do? Oh, you know what we do. Well, we're going to take this $5,000. And remember, it's still going to be pink to show it's all one transaction, right? And we're going to go ahead and buy. We're going to buy some ETH. And this buy means we're going to minus $5,000. So we had 5,000 come in. We immediately sell the DEX A and we're going to get 1,000 ETH. Let me do a little whoop. We're going to get plus 1,000 ETH. And now that we have 1,000 ETH, we're going to go sell it on DEX B. And we're going to start getting a lot of arrows here. I know. Stick with me. So pretend this arrow is still pointing to the MetaMask. We're going to sell it minus 1000 ETH. And this is still all one transaction. And for the minus 1000 ETH, we're going to get plus $6,000 because the price here of one ETH is six. And then finally, now that we have $6,000, we can finally pay it all back to the contract so that this line pay the $5,000 back into the protocol that we originally took out so that this line doesn't revert and all of our transaction goes through. So there's a lot of lines here. The protocol gave us $5,000. We use that $5,000 to buy a bunch of Ethereum to which we got the Ethereum. Then we use that Ethereum to sell to Dex B for for $6,000. And then we split the $6,000 into $1,000 and $5,000. And we sent the $5,000 back over here. And then we kept a positive, a plus, a juicy plus $1,000 profit on doing this arbitrage, even though we only started with $5. Now, the only additional thing then is we sent back $5,000, but it's really $5,000 maybe plus a $5 fee. So this really is going to be 5,000 plus five. And so this will drop to zero. So we were able to get the same $1,000 profit that the whale up here got although we only started with $5. Now we had to pay the $5 fee. So we actually ended up doing a little bit worse than the whale did. We also had to spend more gas, but we were able to net around the same profit. This is incredibly advantageous for us. 
This is one of the ways flash loans can actually help us gain money by doing arbitrage. Now, there's a ton of other things that flash loans are helpful for, arbitrage being one of them. And a lot of people look at flash loans like a negative in this space, but I actually think they're a positive because they, like I said, they allow anybody to be a whale. In the traditional finance world, stuff like this, these arbitrage opportunities, they exist. And it's not fair because you have to be super rich to take part in them. In the DeFi world, because of flash loans, the playing field is leveled and anybody can be this whale for this single transaction, which is incredibly powerful. I've got another diagram that's going to be in the Git repo associated with this lesson as well, which breaks it down even more if you want to follow along. To give you the quick walkthrough, whale deposits $5,000 into the flash loan protocol. User calls flash loan, pulls out a $5,000 loan. They need to repay the $5,000 plus a fee, otherwise the transaction is going to revert. They use that $5,000 to buy $1,000 worth of ETH. They then sell that $1,000 worth of ETH for $6,000, and then they return the $5,000, obviously keeping $1,000 for themselves, netting themselves $995. They also pay the $5 fee. So then in the protocol, the protocol will then have $5,000 plus $5 with the fees, and then finally, whenever the whale wants, if they decide that they're done with this whole charade, they can withdraw their initial deposit by trading back in the 5,000 FLT, the flash loan token, which represents 100% of the pool. And since they have 100% of the pool, they get $5,005, the initial deposit plus the fees. So I know there was a lot to cover there, but that essentially is how flash loans work at a high level. This essentially is both how flash loans work and an example of why someone might want to use flash loans with arbitrage. So this is what we're going to be looking for in this protocol. Does it do this? Can we break this? Is there any way that this doesn't make sense? Now we've learned a lot about flash loans. So quick summary of what we've learned about flash loans because we learned a lot here. So first off, we learned what arbitrage was. Arbitrage is one example of where a flash loan might be useful. Now there's tons of other examples. Feel free to read online, but this is one such example. And arbitrage is when you take advantage of a price discrepancy on two different exchanges. Maybe exchange one says ETH is $5, exchange two says ETH is $6. Easy way to make money is you buy ETH on DEX A and sell ETH on DEX B. That is arbitrage. Then we learned about flash loans. Flash loans allow us to take out very, very quick loans for a single transaction. The reason that we can do this in Web3 is because if we don't pay the money back, the transaction can be codified to automatically revert. So these are loans that happen in a single transaction. And then finally, we went over kind of a larger example where somebody might use a flash loan to do arbitrage, to capitalize on a price discrepancy in the market. And then finally, finally, we have this flash loan protocol arbitrage example in the audit data branch of the Thunder Loan GitHub repo. We will have all these diagrams if you want to use them. All right, so we're getting context, right? We're still in this recon phase of the Thunder Loan. Yes, sometimes when you're doing security reviews, you got to go look up stuff that might not seem related, right? We just spent a ton of time learning about flash loans and borrowing and lending because this Thunder Loan protocol is based off of borrowing and lending and is based off of flash loans. So we need to know how those work. And again, you can learn more about these protocols by checking out Avan Compound. You can watch some of these videos as well if you want more context. But now that we know about flash loans, we've actually done a pretty good job of learning the vast majority of how this protocol works with one little caveat, right? So we have what is a flash loan. So this protocol does flash loans, liquidity providers deposit. They get these asset tokens, which represent their stake in the protocol. What is a flash loan? Users have to pay a small fee to the protocol, depending on how much money they borrow. To calculate this fee, they're using the famous on-chain T-Swap price oracle. Wait, what? They're using T-Swap, the protocol that we just did a security review on, that we just audited. This happens a lot. DeFi is composable. So oftentimes, DeFi protocols will depend on other DeFi protocols. So if there's any issues in that DeFi protocol, it might also be an issue in our DeFi protocol here. It says to calculate the fee, we're using the famous on-chain T-Swap price oracle. Now, if you watched any of the Foundry courses that I've done, or really any of the courses, you should 100% know what an oracle is, right? An oracle is going to be a device that takes external real-world data or computation and, and brings it on-chain. However, 
You can also use other contracts as an oracle, as we may see here. So the price of an asset, the price of Ethereum, for example, is technically a made up construct off chain. The price of Ethereum is something that we humans give to it. So they're saying they're going to use T-Swap as a price oracle. They're using the T-Swap DEX that we did a review of in the last section to be a price oracle here. So immediately we have some questions. Okay, why do they need a price oracle? What's going on? I guess we'll find out when we go through the security review. And then finally, we have this additional bit, which seems actually like a lot. We are planning to upgrade the current Thunder Loan contract to the Thunder Loan upgraded contract. Please include this upgrade in the scope of a security review. Whoa, so what are you telling me? So if we go to the SRC in here, we go to protocol, go to Thunder Loan. I've already run Forge Build and Make and everything just so that we have all of our contracts compiled. If we go in here, we can see that this actually is a number of things. It's ownable, upgradable, and it's UUPS upgradable. And it's this other thing, Oracle upgradable. So we know that this Thunder Loan code base is actually an upgradable smart contract. We're not gonna go over upgrades. We're not gonna go over the UUPS method in this. We've gone over that in the Foundry Flow course. There will be a link to this if you wanna go back and do a little refresher on upgrades, on proxies, and how they work. But all right, so we've gotten a ton of context here. We've learned about what flash loans are. We've learned that this protocol does gives out flash loans. People can add liquidity to this protocol. They can deposit money in here. They get this asset token in return. These asset tokens gain interest. We learned about flash loans, about Arbitrov. We're doing some weird stuff with T-Swap and all these other goodies. Now might be a great time to go reach out to the protocol and say, hey, can we get some diagrams? How does this whole system actually work? Or maybe they're terrible at doing diagrams and you can actually make diagrams yourself for some of these protocols. And that might be really helpful so that you understand what is touching what. So we've got a little bit of context for what this is supposed to do. We don't have any diagrams, which isn't great, but we should 100% run our two tools because this is a Solidity Foundry project. So we know we can run Slither and we know we can run Adarin. So let's at least run these two tools and in this project and all moving forward in all these make files, I'm actually going to have them come with a little slither command right in the make file. And I'm going to have it come with this slither.config.json. So this is a slither config JSON that I usually like to use. You can make your slither config however you want, but it just has a whole lot of flags that we turn on or off to make the slither output more meaningful to us. So there's a couple of detectors that I, I usually don't like to include, like conformance to Solidity naming conventions, because I use some weird naming conventions or incorrect versions of Solidity, because a lot of people aren't using 0.8.18, they're using 0.20. I'll also filter the paths so that no mocks, no tests, no scripts, or in this case, no upgraded protocol accidentally gets pulled in, and then exclude dependencies so we don't do anything with libraries. So to run this, pull up my terminal, I'm going to run make slither and we're going to get an output and this can actually be our starting point to actually looking for issues in this code base and this slither output is a lot smaller than we've seen in the past so the slither outputs going forward are actually going to get easier and easier but even slither right here we found a bug right the first info detector thunderloan.update flash loans should emit an event for s flash loan fee equals new fee so right away, this is saying this says Thunder Loan line 269. So let's go to Thunder Loan line 269 right here. We have this function called update flash loan fee. We have this S flash loan fee variable. Let's go to the top. Aha, uh -huh, sure enough, this is a storage variable. Yep, it's a storage variable. When we're updating storage, we got to emit an event. So we can do add audit low must emit an event. Boom, and just like that, we found a finding just by running Slither. Okay, let's see what else Slither is gonna give us. All right, detectors, reentrancy in thunderloan.flashloan. It looks like we make some external calls. This is going to be the reentrancy vulnerabilities too, so we can command click this or copy paste this. Looks like this is severity low, confidence medium. So we we might have some type of reentrancy. We're not sure how confident we are. We can go to these. For example, we can go to Asset token dot update exchange rate fee. This is in Thunder Loan 204. Let's go to that line. Okay, 204. Okay, so it looks like we do call some external contract here. And it looks like we have some slither disables that are being ignored for some reason. Um, 
but we call some external contract. So maybe we do like an at follow up so we can follow up with this later. Looks like we have a couple of these ranch C and thunderloan.flash loan. Let's go to this line as well. So this is thunderloan 181. We have asset token dot transfer underlying two. Oh, actually we have a whole bunch of these. Oh, asset dot update exchange rate. Let's go see what this is. Okay, follow up there. Good. Asset token dot update exchange rate. Asset token dot transfer underlying two. Okay, yep. We might do at follow up reentrant. We have this receiver address dot function call. Let's see where this is. Okay, yep, right here. Let's do a little, let's add a note here as well. At follow up, reentrancy. Uh, and these actually slither disable are supposed to disable um re uh, disable slither from calling these out, but uh, I guess I, I messed them up. Looks like they messed up their slither disables here. So this might be like an at audit info messed up the slither disables. Whoops, that was a mistake. Okay, cool. And then update exchange rate fee. Uh, great. It looks like we've marked all of them. And the great, the next detector is incorrect versions of solidity. Looks like in my slither.config, instead of incorrect versions of solidity, we should change this for sulk version because the check on slither is actually sulk version. So let's actually rerun this. Let's see if we can get rid of that check at the bottom. Okay, cool. We got rid of the checks at the bottom. So I was putting the tag here as the uh, ignore when it's actually the check. So whoops, my bad. So I'll fix this in the actual code base so that you won't have the wrong config in there. Great. So we've marked a lot of these reentrancies that we're going to go check on later. And then finally, we do have this yellow one, which is kind of terrifying. Ignores return value by receiver address dot function call. Ooh, yikes. Let's go click on this command click or control click on it. Go to the documentation or copy paste it. The return value of an external call is not stored in a local or state variable. Aha. So if we go to this line here, thunderloan.sol at number 215. And in VS Code, if you just command click like one of these line things, it'll pop up like this. And then you can just backspace to get to like the actual line number and just click it and it'll automatically go to this line number. So we also want to add follow up. Do we need the return value of function call? Great. And we can find out later if that's an issue or not. So cool. So we've run Slither and it looks like there wasn't too much there. Next, let's go to our make file. Our make files will also now come with a Darren. So you can just run make a Darren or a Darren dot. That is the other tool we want to run. So let's run a Darren dot and we'll get a report here. All right. Report printed to report.md. Okay. Let's go check out our report, report.md. Nice. Okay, got a little updated a Darren going on here. And we scroll down. Actually, let's just go to the, the preview here. Our first issue is actually a medium issue, centralization risk for trusted owners. Contracts have owners with privileged rights to perform admin tax and need to be trusted to not perform malicious updates or drain funds. This is actually a big deal and can be a big deal. Most of the time when you're dealing with protocols, they will just go, oh yeah, that's a known issue and they don't care. However, for a hundred thousand reasons, you should always report this on a private audit. But for most competitive audits, these are considered known issues or non-issues. So it looks like there's some privileged actions that this protocol has. If we go to the SRC protocol, Thunder Loan, we go in here, it looks like there's some ownable stuff. So if I look for only owner, Aha, okay, there's this set allowed token function, which is only owner, update flash loan fee, which is only owner, authorize upgrade, which is only owner. And this is a proxy contract. So technically the owner of this contract could rewrite all of the functionality of this protocol completely at any time. That's technically a security issue. There's a lot of power in one person's hand to completely blow away this entire protocol if they wanted to, because it's going to be behind a proxy, right? Because they're using UUPS. In a private audit, you must, must, must report this. At least, at least for the reason to cover your ass in case it's a rug pull. So rug pulls are when a contract is deployed. It says, hey, look, we're immutable code. We're immutable decentralized. And they're behind a proxy. And whoever owns the proxy just upgrades the contract to add a function called like steal all the money or something. It's pretty not cool. In the SC exploits minimize Git repo associated with this course, if you go to SRC, there's actually a centralization lesson in here as well. If you go to centralization.sol, 
we can see we have a contract in here and at the bottom we have this function called change balance only owner which allows the owner of the contract to change balances of users to whatever they want so users can deposit eth they can withdraw eth but the owner of the contract can basically steal their eth and so that's the centralization issue if you want to play it more with centralization and see how it works you can obviously come here scroll down go to centralization play with it in remix there's a phenomenal damn vulnerable DeFi challenge an absolutely phenomenal case study with oasis that we're going to go over and then of course every rug pull ever is basically comes from some type of centralization issue so a darren looks for these centralization issues and automatically reports it in this report which is great because it saves us time from having to write this real basic real easy one before we keep going let's take a look at this oasis case study and understand why centralization can and is often a security issue So here's this article that I highly recommend you read. Uh, it was crazy watching this happen real time. It happened earlier this year, but a UK court ordered this protocol called Oasis to exploit their own security flaw to recover 120K wrapped ether stolen in the wormhole attack. You can skip over this part of the video if you want to just read this. Basically the Oasis app is a website that allows users to lend and borrow digital assets on the maker protocol. And they toted themselves as, hey, we are decentralized. If you use us, we're permissionless. There's no centralized intermediaries that can come into this. But what ended up happening was a hacker stole a bunch of money and they put their money in this Oasis application. So the people who built this Oasis application were based in the UK. And the people who had their money hacked were pretty pissed that they got hacked and that this money was sitting in this, this protocol. So they got some security researchers to look into it and say, is there a way to force some type of smart contract upgrade to get that hacked money back out? And there was. So they went to court and they, they said, hey, we found this exploit in this code base that has hacked money. We would like you to force them to upgrade and do this exploit to get the money back out, which was wild. So they had to do this because their protocol was not decentralized, it was not censorship resistant, they had to upgrade the protocol to take the hacked funds back out, basically hacking the hacker and give the monies back to the, to the company that wanted it back. According to the research article by Blockworked, it in entailed a coordination between the, the Oasis kind of founding team and the wormhole developer from Jump Crypto. This was the training firm that was pissed that their money got stolen and they gave a court order to the Oasis team to get their money back out. So centralization, if Oasis was developed in a way where it was not centralized at all, this would not have been possible. So some people might say this is a happy ending. Some people disagree. So the good of this situation for Oasis was, yay, we recovered the hack funds. But the bad of this situation was, oh, yikes, it was never actually decentralized. And that's something that we as security researchers want to and need to figure out. So right in our report, we know, hey, there's a centralization risk for trusted owners. We'll put that in the report. And hopefully users will read this and know that there's a centralization risk. Although, unfortunately, we'll find out that most of the time users will not read this and they will ape in. But we'll talk about that much, much later in the course. Great. Next. And now we're into the NC or the non-crit or the informationals or the gas or whatever. Missing checks for address zero when assigning values to address state variables. So it looks like orable upgradable .sol. Open this. Let's go to, aha, we have some addresses in here. So we might do a little, you know, at audit info. Need to do zero address checks. That can be a nice little helpful bit here. It looks like there's a couple. There's one down here as well that we should do. Oh, it looks like this just calls this. So. We should add zero address checks. Great. All right, what's next? Functions not used internally could be marked external. So this is a great finding. We can look at some of these. Maybe we'll look at, you know, thunderland.sol 282, number 282. We'll see, okay, we have get asset from token. Let's see if this is used anywhere. Function get asset the token. Let's go files to include dot slash SRC. Okay, it's just in Thunderloan at Soul, and it's also in the Thunderloan upgradable, which or Thunderloan upgraded, which is the which is we're assuming the upgraded contract. So yes, this is great. We probably would do you know at audit info, but we're probably just going to copy paste it from the report.md. So we probably can just even do 
written in a Darren or something like that. Great, let's keep going. Constant should be defined and used instead of literals. Absolutely. Line 144. Let's see this. That's so line 144. Aha. Yep. So this is at uh, written in a Darren. These are these magic numbers that we're talking about. Why are these magic numbers? Those are not good. Missing index fields. So some of our uh, events that we're emitting are not using an index field. So it looks like we're probably just going to copy paste some of these as informational findings into our final report. Cool. Thank you, Darren. Thank you for finding those. So now we've run Slither. We found a bunch of little issues. We run a Darren. We found a bunch of little issues. We found a centralization issue, and we can probably even in a private audit, we would go to the protocol and say, hey, this is centralized. Are you guys cool with that? Are you guys aware of that? And most of the time they're just going to say, yeah, we're aware of this. And then that's when you, we can advise them, hey, like maybe don't do that. Right. If your protocol doesn't need to be ownable, if it doesn't need to be upgradable, it shouldn't be because it is a centralization vector. This Oasis thing is a perfect example of them saying, hey, you know, we want to have a little bit of control. We want to have a little bit of fl flexibility and it ended up proving, hey, your protocol is not actually decentralized. If you do that, you can be happy that, hey, people got the hack money back, but maybe it's the other way around. And instead of a court ordering them to return stolen funds, it's a bad guy who gets in there, upgrades the protocol, and steals all the money themselves. We want to reduce the attack surface of these protocols as much as possible. All right, but now we've got our context, we've run our tools, it's time to start doing some manual review. Now, same as our last one, if we wanted to, we could probably even just start with the test suite. We could look at the test suite. They have this invariant test suite that does nothing. They have some unit tests. Let's run forge coverage, Let's see what their test suite is. We could go ahead and we could say, okay, you know what? We're just going to go through the test suite. We're gonna figure out the invariants and we're gonna write an invariant test suite for them. Their test coverage is terrible. This is not good at all. This is very bad test coverage. So we know that if anything, they need to improve their test coverage. And that's probably going to go into the report as an informational. Hey, your test coverage needs to be better. So same as last time, if we wanted to, we could probably just start with their test suite and buff up their test suite and probably find bugs just by doing that. But we're going to go through manual review and we're going to be doing a lot of proof of codes in this audit, in this security review. So again, there's no silver bullet, but we are going to take the Tincho method a little bit more seriously here. So if we go back to the SRC, We'll hit Solidity Metrics. We're going to get this output here. I'm going to scroll down. I'm actually going to copy all these lines. And you can create a Notion or a Google Doc or a Google Sheets or whatever you want to do. I'm going to, going to use a Google Sheets or create a blank Google Sheets here and then just paste all of those in. And now we're going to delete this column and let's just sort by Z to A or excuse me, we'll sort by A to Z. And now we have this little list of where to read, where to start, right? And we'll do the Tincho method. We'll start with really small and then we'll get bigger. And this will be one of the ways that we can actually work. We can actually start. Like I was saying, if I was doing this myself, I probably would start with the thunderloan.sol and just start with the deposit function, right? Because I know that someone's going to need to deposit. So I want to understand that. And I would want to understand how the flash loan function works because I want to understand like kind of the main functionality, but we're going to Tincho it. So since we're tinchoing it, we're going to start small and get bigger. We're going to start with ifactory.sol. It's the smallest bit. Let's review that first, just so we can get some little wins. Boom. I pull factory.sol. First contract that we're looking at. Okay. That's it. Get pool with a token address. I pull factory. So we know that this is actually working with T-Swap. So this I pull factory is probably going to be the interface for working with the T-Swap pool factory. Now, if we go back to our course, we go back to the code base of T-Swap. I believe if we go to SRC, we go to the pool factory, we scroll down, there is a get pool function. There sure is. So this interface in here, I pool factory is probably the interface to work with the pool factory dot soul. And maybe we'll put like a little explainer. This is probably the interface to work with pool factory dot soul from T-Swap. And then I might even pull up my notes here and I'm going to make like make like a little section and delete a lot of this stuff. Like I said, I usually like to do an about, write the protocol 
in my own words. Maybe I'll even do diagrams here. Then I'll also do maybe like potential attack vectors, maybe an ideas section, and then maybe a question section. Although sometimes I might just put it right in here. My question might be, why are we using T-Swap? And then maybe I'll put this in here. You know, why are we using T-Swap? What does that have to do with flash loans? And then hopefully I answer this later. Just by using T-Swap, I might have some ideas on attack vectors, but again, this can be, there's no format here. This is just your dump thoughts here. Try to organize them in a way that makes sense to you. This is how I'm gonna do them. Why are we using T-Swap? It's an external view, returns an address. This looks pretty good to me. I don't see any glaring issues in this. We got 0.8.20, we've got a license. This code base looks pretty good to me. I don't see any issues. So we got a little win on the board. So maybe we'll even do a little check here. Maybe in here, we'll add a little check mark. Boop, huzzah. Maybe we'll do insert row above, reviewed, uh, first pass, review. We've done a first pass. You know, some people have like second pass, third pass, whatever. For us, we're just gonna say, okay, let's look for a first pass review. Poolfactory.sol, boom, first pass review. And you know, I'm gonna even gonna delete all these. We're gonna delete all these. We're gonna delete this. And this way I can zoom in. That's why I can zoom in on this, make it a little easier to see what's going on here. Bada boom. I pull factory .soul. It has been reviewed. First pass. Cool. Get a little win. We're using an external contract. We're using the pool factory. Okay. Next, tswap pool .soul. This is looking like another interface. Let's pull this up. So we have SPDX license identifier. That looks fine. Pragma solidity, whatever. Interface IT swap pool get price of one pool token in WETH. So let's scroll back over. Since we know this is working with T-Swap, we can go to SRC, T-Swap pool, get price of one token in WETH. This is an external view function, which is getting the price of one pool token in terms of WETH. Doesn't, doesn't have any parameters or returns a U in 256. No parameters, returns a U in 256. This looks pretty good to me. So then my question obviously is gonna be, again, why are we only using the price of a pool token in WETH. This is the only function that they have in this interface. So maybe a question I have is like, why is this the only one they're working with? But other than that, this interface looks pretty good. So guess what? Check, boom. Wow, thanks Tincho. This met the Tincho method makes you feel really good about yourself, especially when you have a lot of interfaces, right? Because now we've done both of these, both of those look pretty good. What's next? Oh, we have got another interface. Let's pull that up. Let's see if there's anything weird there. Okay, interface I Thunder Loan. Okay, so cool. So this is, there's a Thunder Loan contract. Awesome, let's see in here, does it actually implement the, the Thunder Loan? Oh, I don't think it does implement the Thunder Loan. It does not implement the Thunder Loan. So maybe this is, you know, like an audit informational. The I Thunder Loan contract should be implemented by the Thunder Loan contract. You have an interface which helps guide people making sure they don't forget functions, but we didn't implement it. So if we didn't implement it, maybe this interface is actually different from what's in here. So this repay function is taking a token, taking an address and an amount. So we can look for the repay in here. It's taking IERC20 token and an address amount. Aha, this actually is an issue. The parameters here are different. Oh my goodness, this is wrong. So if we take I Thunder Loan, right? If we were to come back in here and we were to import it, we were to import I Thunder Loan from, where is this? Where is this folder? You can actually see up here in VS Code, it's an SRC interfaces. This is an SRC protocol. So dot dot slash interfaces slash I Thunder Loan dot soul. If we in imported this and we had our Thunder Loan protocol inherit it, if I hit save, it even says, hey, Thunder Loan should be marked abstract because it doesn't implement this replay function or this repay function. If they had followed best practices and implemented it, if they had done this audit informational, they would have caught this issue, right? Now, if I do forge build, it doesn't compile because the repay function on iThunderLoan is actually different from the you know function repay. And here, this is taking an IRC20 token and a U256, and in the I Thunder loan, it's saying, hey, we're taking an address token and an amount. So I'm gonna go back in here. I'm gonna undo all my 
stuff with some command Z's. We're going to undo all that, but I might leave this in here and I might be like, should implement this interface. And this could be either low or informational. Now, why is it low or informational? Well, maybe there's an issue where the repay function is expecting an IERC 20. And if it gets an address token, it breaks. It's probably going to be informational just because there probably is going to be any actual issue. But we can leave this as like a question for now. Hey, come back to this. This is wrong. It should be fixed and it should go in the report. Cool. We found another issue just by walking through the Tincho method. Excellent. Feeling really good. OK, let's keep going. Is there anything else in here we want to look at? No, that's real small code base. Boom. That's looking pretty good. Next. I flash loan receiver. Let's pull this up. I flash loan receiver. Aha, this one's a little bit bigger. Still only three lines saying import I thunder loan from I thunder loan. Why did why are we doing this? We don't need to be doing this. So maybe I'm going to do at audit info unused import. Why? What, what is this? What does this do? Um, maybe something else uses it. Uh, so maybe. All right, let's see where this flash loan receiver is being imported. So also I'm using a keyboard shortcut. I'm doing command shift F to open that up automatically. It might be control shift F for a Windows user. But I'm going to look for this iFlash loan receiver file only in dot slash SRC. Let's see where it's being used. Let's see where it's being imported. iFlash loan receiver. OK, and we want to see if iThunderLoan is being imported through the iFlash loan receiver anywhere. Looks like not there. OK, not there. Not there, not there, not there. So it looks like that's just like an unused random import. Let's see what happens if we comment it out. Let's see if we can run forge build. Ah, OK, so it's using this mock flash loan receiver dot soul. So it's in one of our mocks. We're pulling both of them in. However, I would argue that this is actually bad practice. And if the I flash loan receiver doesn't need this and we're only importing it in here for our tests, I'd say as a general smart contract engineering principle, it's bad engineering practice to edit live codes for tests slash mocks. So we're only using this I thunder loan in this mock here. It probably would be better if instead we did just import, you know, I thunder loan from, oh, thanks, uh, GitHub Copilot from here. We rerun this compile, we rerun the forge build, and we see it does compile. So that would be better engineering practice. That way we don't, you know, bastardize production. We don't change our actual smart contracts so we can test better. You never, that's a very bad engineering practice. So I'm going to change this back. I'm going to put this back, make sure I can build again. Yep, looks like it's building here. Uh, leave this here. It's bad engineering practice. I had a live code for test slash mocks. We must remove the import from mock flash loan receiver dot sol. Right. So that's not good. Cool. Nice. Another little audit info. Awesome. So now we have here inspired by Ave. Well, we should go check out what this is. So we scroll down here. Okay, we have this I flash loan receiver. Looks like this is very similar to what Ave is going to be doing. And this might be a great time to pause and take a look and see how Ave does these flash loans. How is this working for Ave? Looks like they have some address call data, assets, amounts, premiums, all this other stuff. This code base is a lot simpler. <laughs> so we have this I flash loan receiver function where we have this execute operation. It takes a token amount fee initiator and params. So this is a great point to a great place to start asking some questions. Um, so for me, I might start to try to assume I might be like, OK, is the token the token that's being borrowed? Right, because again, there are no, there's no NAT spec here. I might even do, you know, at audit where the NAT spec, bruh. Where's the NAT spec? We can see amount. Be like, uh, Q amount is the amount of tokens. Probably, what's the fee? Is probably the fee of the flash loan protocol address initiator. It's like who called this params, maybe the callback function. So there's there's a whole bunch of questions here that we probably will come back to and we'll probably want to figure out how this execute operation function works, but we don't really need to figure it out now. So this returns an external Boolean. Let's see who is actually implementing this. It looks like thunderloan.soul is actually implementing this. So, okay, cool. Thunderloan upgradable is implementing it too. And that's pretty much it. 
but this looks pretty safe to me, right? It doesn't look like there's anything standing out to being really weird here. Maybe somebody implements something wrong here. Again, we're doing some weird engineering practices that we're going to call out for the most part. I think we're pretty good here. So guess what? We get another check mark for iFlashLoanReceiver.Soul. Yay. So we've done a pass on the interfaces and we've actually found some informationals. Not, not really lows, but we found some stuff that we can give to the client, right? Remember, the, at the end of the day, our job is to make the protocol safer, more successful, and better. So we're doing that even just finding these engineering best practices. Like I said, again, if you want to be a super savant, you could go into the test suite and actually buff out the test suite. And I bet you for this code base, just by doing that, you would 100% find bugs because of how abysmal the test suite is. And again, maybe you say, F it. I'm going to do a real light manual review and then go right into writing fuzz tests, figure out what the invariants are, how it breaks. This process is the, the level of meticulous that you want to take when doing this. And remember, it's a good idea to take breaks. So if you've been watching this video for a long time, great work. You're doing fantastic. We've been covering a lot of dense topics, so you're doing phenomenal. If you haven't taken a break in a bit, pause and take a break. Remember, you want to figure out a break taking strategy that works for you, because if you work just nonstop for 12 hours, you're going to be a little bit rough. A lot of auditors, a lot of security researchers have fallen into this, this Pomodoro pattern where they take time to focus. Maybe they go hard. They have like a little timer set. I have a little timer set when I'm doing this where they go hard for maybe 50 minutes and then they take a five, 10 minute break. Then they go hard for 50 minutes. They take a five, 10 minute break. They go hard for 50 minutes. They take a five, 10 minute break. There's a lot of great apps that help you with this as well. So if you haven't taken a five minute break in a little bit, pause the video, take a five minute break because now we're going to go into an actual contract with actual lines of code. So we pause and take a break and I'll see you in a couple minutes. All right, welcome back. Let's keep going. So the Tincho method. Thank you, Tincho, for this method. We already feel more confident because of you. But now let's open up this or.soul and let's figure out what's going on here because this is our first contract. It's still small, but this is our first contract with actual code base in here. So let's walk through it. And I'm going to turn on toggle word wrap just so that I can see things toggled here a little easier. Okay, so we have some identifiers here. Cool, pragma solidity, cool, whatever. We're importing IT swap pool. Looks like we're using it down here to do something. Okay. We're importing I pool factory. We're using that down there to do something. And we're importing initializable here. So this initializable package is something that it's coming from open Zeppelin, open Zeppelin contracts upgradable. And it's something that we definitely want to get familiar with because it looks like this is where some of the proxy stuff is coming into play. Right. And then for this, I might start to take a peek. Oh, OK. How are they deploying this? We already kind of went through. Oh, they're using a proxy. Good. It's upgradable. Fantastic. They're probably going to inherit this in the Thunder Loan. Right. If we go to Thunder Loan. Yep. Sure enough, there's Oracle upgradable and it's inherited in Thunder Loan. So this Oracle upgradable contract is inherited in that main Thunder Loan contract. Right. So this is part of that contract. OK, but if we command click on this or we open up this initializable .soul, we can learn a little bit more about this and read some of the NAT spec here and we can learn. OK, this is a base contract. Toggle the word base contract to aid in writing upgradable contracts or any kind of contract that will be deployed behind a proxy. Uh, so there's a whole lot of text here, but and you can pause and you can read this if you want. So upgradable contracts can't have constructors. Now, why can't they have constructors? Well, it's because storage is in the proxy but the logic is in the implementation. So if you have a constructor, that's going to happen in the implementation. And if you do some storage stuff in the constructor, it's not going to matter because all the storage is going to be in the proxy, right? And again, if you're unfamiliar with proxies, take time to pause, look up proxies, right? When a user makes a call to a proxy, the proxy looks at the implementation. However, all the storage is in the proxy itself, right? It's not in the implementation. However, if you have a constructor up here in the implementation, well, the constructor sets storage in the implementation. So now you kind of have this weird thing where you have storage happening in the proxy, storage having an in implementation, and that doesn't work. So this initializable contract helps initialize proxies with storage. So basically, instead of a constructor, you have initializer functions. Right? And 
in open zeppelins they usually have this double underscore init to signify kind of by convention that this is an initializer function uh, and then they also have this double underscore init unchained to signify that it's an initializer function but it's like not like the main one that's going to be called there's a nice little thread on the open zeppelin forum which talks about the difference between init and init unchained and the open zeppelin team answered this really well the unchained method groups all the logic that would normally be done inside the constructor or at the moment of deployment and the init one gathers all the logic the constructor header would have done so if you want to read a little bit more about this there's a link to this in the github repo associated with this course cool so this is initializable because this is an upgradable contract makes sense now let's go read this so we have this oracle init so this oracle init is going to be our initializer which just calls this Oracle init unchained. And it looks like in our Thunder loan, this Thunder loan contract should have an initializer and call, it sure does, has this initializer function, which calls uh, Oracle init, right? So this Oracle init takes a pool factory address, T swap address, pool factory address. Mm, I don't love that naming. I might do like an at audit info change name to pool factory address instead of tswap address just so it's more consistent so we call oracle init and then we call oracle init unchanged this has this only initializing parameter which i'm just going to tell you right now it has basically a boolean which makes it so that this can only be called one time so uh great oracle init unchained Return internal only initializing. Great. Nobody can call this function. And all we're doing is setting s pool factory equals pool factory address, right? So this whole setup here is just to initialize this upgradable smart contract, initialize the storage correctly because we're using a proxy, because we can't have a constructor. This would all just be done in constructor. So this makes sense to me. Now I see this, I see initializers, and I immediately think of an issue because I've seen this issue before. So this initialized function in Thunderloan, it's just external, it's an initializer, and I immediately know something because I've been doing this a long time. I can think of an attack vector right here. And yes, it's on the Thunderloan, but like it's but I thought of it over here, so I'm just going to, you know, report it now even though I haven't come to the Thunderloan bit yet. So, let me ask you a question. What happens if we deploy the contract and someone else initializes it? answer that would suck they could pick their own t swap address they could pick a different t swap address and this is an issue so this would be at audits these are often just lows uh, and i'll tell you why in a second and it's usually just initializers can be front run so if i deploy the contract i forget to call initialize somebody else calls initialize and they change the t-swap address or even worse the protocol works fine without being initialized that would be bad so right so we take this t-swap address and we have this s pool factory let's look in this thunder loan do we do anything with this in here no do we do anything in here with this yes so if we forget to initialize but we do get price and weth maybe we'll call the zero address of s pool factory and this will probably not this will probably break but the protocol won't work super well if this hasn't been initialized right so we want to make sure that this does get initialized that it, that it does get pointed out hey you could get front run somebody else could call initialize before you do you'd have to redeploy your whole contract what's the mitigation for this it's kind of tough to say usually for me I usually just say hey make sure in your deploy function you automatically call the initialize function right in your setup that way you won't forget to initialize something. And that way you'll be testing, deploying everything the exact same way every single time. Initialize upgradable. Here, we'll say at audit low, initializers can be front run. So this issue is actually a big deal. If we come to SC exploits minimize, there's actually an issue in here for failure to initialize. So if we scroll down, we can see failure to initialize. We've got this remix thing here. We've actually got some capture the flags that we can look at and we have this case study that we're going to talk about in a second if we click this link we go to remix we can actually play with this this failure to initialize let's compile this let's deploy this and now we're going to have a couple functions over here so if i hit initialize we get false my value is zero if we forget to initialize this and i hit start hitting increment 
you know, maybe I hit it three times or four times. My value is four. I hit it again. My value is now five. We're continuing to increase my value, but it hasn't been initialized. If then I go and initialize this to one, two, three, my value is now overwritten to one, two, three, and we have been initialized. Uh, additionally, this function doesn't have any protection against being initialized a second time. It probably definitely should, because otherwise this is this is not an initializer, this is just a setter. But if we forget to initialize something, we interact with the contract, and then we initialize it, we can overwrite and break a ton of stuff. And this does happen. So if we go back to the get repo associated with this, if we go back to the SC exploits minimized, and we go to failure to initialize, there is this wonderful, this wonderfully sad and horrible Git issue, or somebody put this issue into the parity wallet that said anyone can kill your contract, and they just said, I accidentally killed it, and then they have a link to Etherscan. If you scroll down one, we have this transaction from Etherscan that we can check out, and if we scroll down in here, we can hit click show more, we can see the exact function that was called if we do decode input data. Um, these are the parameters that they put in, they were just playing around, and they called init wallet. And this contract, they completely forgot to call their initializer function. So they were working with it, it had a bunch of money in it, they forgot to initialize, and then they initialized it, and it broke everything. Very sad issue that happened. It happened, and we learned a lot from it. Hey, don't forget to initialize your contracts, otherwise you may accidentally kill it. This is an infamous GitHub issue in the Web3 Ethereum ecosystem, and it should teach you, hey, always initialize your initializers. If you want to play with failure to initialize or more, again, you can check out the tests in here. Uh, you can read more about the actual case study, get really familiar with it because it is one of the most famous failure to initialize hacks ever. Great. Initializers can be front run. We should have something in place that we do not forget to initialize this. And the deployment isn't in scope, but maybe we recommend, hey, you should initialize right in your deploy script or have some other parameter to prevent the rest of the protocol to being interacted with until this is initialized. If we go through the rest of these functions, I'm just going to tell you right now without doing the review, there are, are no blockers on the rest of this contract to say, hey, you can only interact with this contract if it's been initialized. There's no only initialized. Uh, a lot of people don't do only initialized modifiers because they want to save gas, which is fine, so long as they have a guarantee like you know being right in their deploy script that they initialize so found an issue initialize can be front run boom hopefully this sticks with you and you do not accidentally killed it okay but we're still on oracle upgradable we've done a thorough review of this let's keep going next we have get price in weth this is a public view maybe this could be an external it looks like darren probably picked it up but we're doing address swap of pool tokens we're passing some token and we're doing i pool factory s pool token dot get pool so this is where that get pool tokens we're getting the pool swap token and then we're calling get price of one pool token in weth this is actually really interesting because technically t swap is out of scope so we could 100 percent not look at the t swap code and do continue our security review and continue our audit without knowing anything about t swap it's usually best you do know something about T-Swap, or at least what is going on with this call here. And the reason for that is because if we can break this function on T-Swap, maybe we can break something on Oracle Upgradable. So I see, oh my God, we're calling an external contract. I'm thinking attack vectors. What if the price is manipulated? Can I manipulate the price? Reentrancy attacks? I'm thinking a hundred things when I see something like this. And maybe it's a good idea to go check out these, these protocols. Hey, what is this actually doing? Okay, real quick, we'll pull up T-Swap. So what are the functions being called? It's like get price of pool token in WETH. So it looks like this is doing kind of this get output amount based on input. It's using the reserves to get the price of the asset. And then the get pool just gets the pool. So I would probably even use this to check the tests. Are they using forked tests? or are they using mocks? How are they testing interacting with this other protocol? If we go into the tests, go to units, thunderloan test.sol, or actually, excuse me, oracle upgradable.sol, 
uh, it looks like they're testing get price. If we go to this base test, which inherits it, it looks like they're using a mock pool factory to to actually work with the pool factory. And if I click on that, it's like a minimized T-swap. So they're using a mock. That's not great. You know, maybe I would do at audit informational. You should use forked tests for this. And this is where, so I'm not going to go into forked tests here, but uh, since T-swap isn't actually live, this might be, um, so we're not going to do a proof of code for this, but this would be a, a really good recommendation to give this protocol. Hey, you should use forked tests for live protocols so that you have a much higher guarantee of what you're actually doing. So I have a ton of questions and maybe I take this get price and I add it to here, potential attack, potential attack vectors. Can I break this? I don't see an issue here per se, right? But uh, it's giving me ideas. Okay, get price. This is kind of redundant, um, but but sure, you know, a different API to call get price, whatever, get price and WEF. Okay, cool. Function get pool factory address. Okay, so we have this private variable. This is just to get it. Okay, cool. That looks fine to me as well. So we've done a pretty good review. We've walked through this whole thing. We've actually found a potential low with initializers can be front run. Most of the time in competitive audits, those are going to be ignored. But they're still good to tell the protocol because of that infamous attack, right? Hey, ha what are you doing to make sure you're not going to get front run? And with that, we can be pretty happy. We can come back to our checklist and we can check off another one. Boom, Oracle upgradable, looking pretty good. All right, we've got another check mark. It's time to move on to asset token .soul. And now as we're going through Tincho's process, you'll see that this checklist becomes less and less important. It's really just a way to give us a starting point and to give us some context for these small building blocks and allow us to piece it together piece by piece, right? Sometimes we're just gonna have to bite the bullet and tackle this 129 you know, line monster, but, but at least, especially at the beginning, Doing this can be very helpful for getting some little wins under your belt. You'll see once we start getting to asset token, we actually might start to swap back and forth a little bit more. And now I know this Thunder Loan upgraded is smaller, but this is going to be the upgrade that they're going to do. So we're actually going to look at Thunder Loan first, and then we're going to look at Thunder Loan upgraded last. Once we really understand how the protocol works, then we'll finally look at how this upgrade stuff works. So, and though even though it's 327 lines of code here, it's actually a lot easier because it's gonna be 327, you know, minus 127. It's really only 200 because most of this code is probably gonna be the same, or hopefully, unless they changed everything. I guess we'll find out. All right, let's go into asset token now. So Oracle upgradable looks pretty good. Initializer issue, whatever. Asset to asset token dot soul. So if we go back to the readme of this, we scroll down. We believe this is kind of that receipt that we're going to get. Liquidity providers can deposit assets into Thunderloan and be given asset tokens in return. These asset tokens gain interest over time depending on how many people take out flash loans. We go back to our little diagram about flash loans. When a whale deposits money into the flash loan contract, they get some type of shares, some ERC-20 token that represents how much money they have in the contract. And this is gonna earn interest rate based off of the fees the people taking out the flash loans are going to give. Okay, cool, so that's probably what this asset token is. Great, so we have a license, Pragma version, that looks fine. ERC-20 from Open Zeppelin. obviously we're very familiar with Open Zeppelin. IERC-20, that's gonna be the interface, and then we have safe ERC-20, which is the wrapper. Okay, wrapper around ERC-20 operations that throw on failure when the token contract returns false and instead revert or throw on failure are also supported. Not averting calls are assumed to be successful. So this safe ERC-20 library is a wrapper contract for ERC-20s that do weird stuff. So it's a way to help a lot of the transfers for weird ERC-20s. And we have using safe ERC-20 for IERC-20. So we know, okay, anytime we're going to do a function call with an ERC-20, we're actually going to be using this safe wrapper. Okay, let me toggle the word wrap here as well. Nice. Cool, we've got a couple of errors here. Okay, great. All right, great. So we have some state stuff. There's some state variables. We have some immutables here. Some variables with some comments that are a little confusing. The underlying per asset exchange rate, i.e. S exchange rate equals two, means one asset token is worth two underlying tokens. Oh, so this is kind of interesting. So when, when they say underlying, if we go back to this example, we're talking about like the USDC in here, right? So underlying, 
underlying is kind of like USDC, whereas like the asset token is going to equal like the shares token, right? In this example here. So you deposit USDC, you get shares of the pool. So asset token, it's sounding like asset token is the shares of the pool and the underlying is going to be like USDC. So and to instead of like percentage shares of the pool, we're going to have this exchange rate here where based off whatever the exchange rate is, is how many tokens we can get. So for example, in here, if we have two shares and the exchange rate is two to one, I could probably get rid of my two shares for four tokens, right? If it's two to one for four underlying tokens. So we're doing this weird exchange rate thing. And this exchange rate bit is actually very similar to compound finance, the way that their C tokens work. And this, again, is where knowing more about the top DeFi protocols and how they work will make our lives better. So the compound protocol, they have a whole bunch of these C tokens in here, and they have this exchange rate concept as well, where they do a whole bunch of math stuff. But but they're doing something similar with this exchange rate stored internal or some of their other exchange rate functions where they have an asset that's deposited into this contract and people who do this deposit are minted these C tokens. And these C tokens accrue interest for the underlying based off of fees of the compound protocol. So this is a spot where I might actually do a side quest and go, oh, well, how does compound work? What are the issues with compound? What are issues that have been reported with compound? The more I know about compound and related protocols, the better I'm going to do on this security review. We aren't going to take this deviation. However, I do highly recommend you do look into compound and you do at least understand how it works at a fundamental level at some point, maybe even just go through the contracts and try to write an article and explain, hey, here's how the compound protocol works or here's how the Aave protocol works, because Aave and compound are actually very similar, but make a number of key distinct differences that make them actually pretty different protocols. So we have something with exchange rates. And because we are very familiar with the space, we're like, oh, this is something with compounds, maybe. But I might be asking the question, you know, what does this rate do? You know, what 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 is it? What are we on about with this? So we have this private exchange rate. And then we have exchange rate precision and starting exchange rate. So this is nice. This is the opposite of magic variables. These are constants which are named. We love to see that. Got an event, exchange rate updated. Okay, we've got some modifier, only Thunder loan. We don't have any, no NAT spec. Again, we might have a comment here being like, hey, where's the NAT spec? Like, it's very difficult to know what these are supposed to do. Only Thunder loan. We can probably assume what this does. Uh, only Thunder loan. Okay, we're checking if message us sender does not equal I thunder loan. Is that set? Uh, it's set in the constructor. Okay, yeah, it sure is. Then we're going to revert asset token only thunder loan. Okay, cool. It's modifier looks good. We have a, a little revert if zero address. Okay, that's nice. A little modifier to say, okay, if some address equals address zero, we're going to revert. Okay, that looks good to me. Then we have our constructor. Okay, so this is an ERC 20. So we have to pass an asset name and an asset symbol. We're using the Thunder Loan contract itself. So the asset token is a separate contract from Thunder Loan. We have underlying, which is probably the token being deposited for flash loans. Uh, and this actually tells us something else. Oh, are the ERC-20s stored in asset token soul instead of Thunder Loan? So it looks like maybe the tokens are stored in here. Like question, where are the tokens stored? Uh, okay. Asset name, asset symbol. Okay, cool. This is the constructor for the ERC-20. That looks good. Revert if zero address. Great. Revert if zero address. Address of the underlying. Okay, those are nice little checks for the constructor. We love to see that. And we say I Thunder Loan. We're doing some setting here. I underlying equals underlying. That looks good. Exchange rate equals starting exchange rate. Love to see that. This is a storage variable, so we're assuming this is going to change. Okay. Okay. So, so some setup here. It's still not super clear what this contract does. We're just going to keep reading. Okay. So mint. We have a mint function. So this is going to mint. So it's calling underscore mint. This is from the ERC twenty. So this is actually going to mint this asset token dot soul. And it looks like only the Thunder Loan, this has this only Thunder Loan contract bit here. So this is actually interesting, right? We might say, okay, only the Thunder Loan contract mint asset tokens. 
So that might be interesting. We might say, okay, is there a way to is there a way for us to break this? Is there a way for us to call mint from the Thunder Loan contract when we shouldn't, right? We're thinking of attack vectors. Okay, we have burn, which is doing the same thing. Only Thunder Loan. It's calling the internal burn function from Open Zeppelin. That looks pretty good to me. Transfer underlying two. Okay, this one's pretty interesting. I underlying dot safe transfer to amount. And then right here, we're saying, oh, weird ERC-20s. Is there any weird ERC-20 things we should be aware of? And this is where we're going to go back to the readme. We'll scroll down to some of these tokens. USDC, DAI, LINK, and WETH. So USDC is probably the only one that's an issue because this is a proxy itself. DAI, LINK, and WETH, those are probably going to be fine. Those aren't really super weird. But USDC might be weird. So we might ask some questions in here. Be like, question... What happens if USDC blacklists the Thunder Loan ca contract? What happens if USDC blacklists the asset token contract? And I'm probably going to add this as maybe a medium, maybe a low. We'll see how it affects the rest of the protocol, though, right? We're not exactly sure where this is being used, but I would say, you know, at follow up, weird ERC 20s with USDC. Is this broken somewhere? Can can we break this with like a weird crappy ERC 20? Cool. We're using safe transfer though. Safe transfer is really nice because it handles a lot of the, the callback stuff. Okay. Cool. Okay. Next we have this function where all the comments are under it instead of over it. That's weird. Maybe that's like an informational finding right there. This looks like an important function though. Okay. We have update exchange rate. And we have some comments in here. I mean, at least we have some comments. That's good. Get the current exchange rate for number one. How big the fee is should be divided by the total supply. So if the fee, so there's this fee input, how big the fee is should be divided by the total supply. So if the fee is 1E18 and the total supply is 2E18, the exchange rate should be multiplied by 1.5. So if the fee is 0.5 ETH and the total supply is 4, the exchange rate should be multiplied by 1.125. It should always go up, never down. Oh, this is an invariant, 100%. We love to see this, but obviously maybe I'm going to ask a question. Okay, but why? Why should it? Why should this exchange rate always go down, up, never go down? Okay, now we're going to set new exchange rate equals old exchange rate times total supply plus fee divided by total supply. Okay, so we're, we're kind of mocking this line here. We're saying new exchange rate equals one. So the old, if the old exchange rate is one, Total supply of asset tokens is four. Fee is 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 divided by four. And the new exchange rate is 1.125. Okay. So it looks like this update exchange rate is, is responsible, probably responsible for updating the rate, well, the exchange rate of asset tokens to the underlying, right? So if we go back to our little Excala draw here, when a whale deposits, or withdraws shares, there's an exchange rate, right? There's this little exchange rate, and I can even do a little exchange rate here. So the amount that gets deposited or withdrawn is based off of the exchange rate, and it looks like something is going to change that, right? And it looks like it's got something to do with the fee. Um, so basically, you know, if, this, if the exchange rate is two to one, if you deposit a thousand dollars and the exchange rate is two to one, maybe you get two thousand asset tokens back, right? So that's what this exchange rate governs the, between the shares and the underlying asset. Okay, cool. That makes sense. And for some reason, we're updating it. I guess we'll find out soon. So new exchange rate is going to equal S exchange rate times the total supply plus fee divided by the total supply. We just looked at this. My questions are going to be, you know, what if total supply is zero? Well, what would happen? S exchange rate starts at one times zero plus, you know, let's say the fee is zero divided by zero. This breaks. Is that an issue? Is there a way I can break this and make the total supply zero? I don't know. Maybe we can come back to it. Okay. If the new exchange rate is less than or equal to the old exchange rate. Oh, they even have actually the invariant right here. The new exchange rate must be lower than or equal to the exchange rate. So then, so we have this little revert here. If the new exchange rate is less than or equal to, it goes ahead and reverts, gives us a nice little revert message. Exchange rate can only increase. Then S exchange rate equals that new exchange rate, and then they emit an event. So, I mean, at first glance, this looks pretty correct to me. I, I don't see an issue with this. 
So we're gonna we're gonna keep going. I think it's gonna look okay. And then there's only two functions left. But even though we didn't find an issue with this, this gives us context, right? Hey, there's this update exchange rate thing. I think this is responsible for the the difference between the deposits, deposited assets, and kind of the the shares which represent it, right? And it looks like it's updated based off of fees, maybe. So you know, maybe when people take out flash loans and they give a fee instead of you know, having a higher percentage of the pool to pull out, this exchange rate gets updated instead. So we didn't find an issue, but we learned a lot more about the protocol just by reading this, just by going through this. Okay, cool. Uh, get exchange rates is just going to return this this variable up here. That looks fine. Get underlying is just going to return this variable here for I underlying. Okay, cool. Those are both privates. Okay, cool. We've got public constant exchange rate precision and then private constant starting exchange rate. Maybe we say, hey, you could make this private, but uh, I don't really see an issue there either way. I guess back in this update exchange rate function, I would look at calling an S load here, an S load here, and an S load here. And I know we haven't gone over assembly yet, um, but I would say, okay, at audits gas, maybe too many storage reads. Right. This reads from storage. This reads from storage. This reads from storage. It might be better just to store it as a memory variable. Right. So S S S boom. Right. And again, how did I how did I spot that? Well, been doing this a long time. Uh, and especially with this S underscore syntax, if you see a whole bunch of S underscores, you're saying, oh, storage, 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 storage. There's so many storage things happening. Storage is gas expensive. OK, maybe this is an audit gas or audit informational. Cool. But this contract looks pretty good to us. We have a vague understanding of what it's supposed to do. We didn't really find too many issues with it. We've gone through it and it looks good. Great. Now we have these last two Thunderloan upgraded and Thunderloan. Like we said, we're going to go through Thunderloan first uh, because the upgraded is the upgraded version of this. So we want to look at this first, understand everything that happens in Thunderloan so that we can go back to Thunderloan upgraded and see what the differences are. And we'll be using some tools to see the diff on that upgrade. And as you can see, we didn't really find a whole lot of issues. We found some informationals. Now you'll quickly see that we don't really, we're probably not going to need to come back to this. We've got our wins. We're feeling good about ourselves. Understood a lot of the little Legos of this protocol. Let's get into the hard stuff now. We're going to open up thunderloan.soul and see what we got working with here. Now, how do we tackle this? Where do we start from? Well, there's a ton of ways we could start from this. We could go top to bottom. We could look at all the functions this does. We could go for some of the main functions and go from there. Again, there's no silver bullet to this. For us, let's just go top to bottom. And remember that oftentimes you might need to do several passes. So maybe we do kind of a brief overview pass of this code base. And then later we do a more deep pass, right? Once we prime our brains for knowledge, you'll notice that in this course, every single lesson I go, here's what we're going to be learning about this lesson. The reason I do that is to actually prime your brain to learn about the things we're going to talk about. Studies have shown when it comes to learning, it's a good idea to get a high level overview of something before you go much deeper, which is also why we do, we go through these readmes and we understand what these protocols are doing at a higher level, but you can start wherever you want to start. I'm just going to go top to bottom and we'll see how we do. Since we're going to be going top to bottom, we're going to be asking a lot of questions here and that's good. So we've got a whole bunch of imports in here. Safe ERC 20. Okay. We know what that does. Asset token. Great. We just went over that. IERC 20. We know what that does. Metadata. We know what that does. Ownable upgradable. This might be new to us. Maybe we take a quick peek at this. Maybe we take a quick peek at this and open Zeppelin and we see, ah, this is the only owner contract, but is it the upgradable version, right? So we're probably going to have an ownable init in here because, yep, we sure are going to have an ownable init and we need to set an initial owner, transfer ownership. Again, we do it in this initializer function because, because we can't have the owner in the storage of the implementation. The owner must be in the actual proxy. So ownable, upgradable, looks like we're using that. Great. Initializable. We went over that a little bit. UUPS upgradable. This is the UUPS proxy pattern, which we went over in the Foundry course. This is a very common proxy pattern for smart contracts. We can even do a quick Google on this, right? Quick Google search, UUPS upgradable. We come right to the proxy documentation for Open Zeppelin, where we can learn about UUPS upgradable and upgradability mechanism to be included in the implementation contract. So 
UUPS and transparent upgradable proxy are two of the most popular proxies. The transparent proxy is where all the upgradable functions are in the proxy itself. UUPS is where the upgradability is in the implementation contract itself. Uh, the idea behind UUPS is eventually you just get rid of the ability to upgrade and that's how you fully decentralize. But if you are unfamiliar with UUPS, I definitely recommend you do a little study on it. Or if you did the Foundry full course, you can also go through the Foundry Upgrades F23 to see what UUPS upgradable code looks like. There's also a link to the video as well uh, for you to learn more. UPS, we got some proxy stuff. So this is going to be a UPS upgradable proxy. We have Oracle upgradable, which we've already looked through. We have this address contract. It looks like this is another library using address for address. This is one of Open Zeppelin's library, and it gives us functions like send value, where we do a lot of this like call stuff when we want to just send value somewhere, right? So it wraps it in a nice, easy to use function. So we don't have to have like bool success recipient dot call blah 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 whatever. We just have send value. And it's even got some docs in here about why we should use call instead of transfer. And it's got some other goodies in here as well. Address and then iFlash loan receiver. We looked at this as well. So imports don't see any big issues with them so far. Let's keep going. So Thunder Loan is initializable, ownable, upgradable, UPS upgradable, Oracle upgradable. Is there anything that it should be? No. OK, that looks good. Should be anything else. We've got a whole bunch of errors. Uh, we probably could go through here and say, hey, some of these errors should be more verbose for like an audit info, but I'm just going to skip over that for now. We have the two libraries defined here. Very nice. OK, uh, and we love how we see some of these comments for like the state variables. We have some state variables here. S token to asset token. What is this? Maybe we'll do a quick little search. S token to asset token. So it looks like in the deposit it's used, in the redeem it's used, in the flash loan it's used, in the repay it's used, set allowed token it's used. Okay, so this is kind of used all over the place. So maybe we'll do like an you know, E for explainer or Q for question. I'm going to do E. I'm going to say, I think this maps the underlying token to its asset token. So for example, if a liquidity provider deposits USDC, that USDC will mint USDC asset token, which will represent how much USDC you deposited. This asset token will represent that. So I'm assuming that's what this is. Okay. Next, the fee in way should have 18 decimals. Each flash loan takes a flat fee of the token price. Ah, okay. So we have this fee precision, which I might question right here. Why is this a storage variable? Is this changed anywhere? As fee precision right in the initialize function. Okay, it's not changed here, not changed here, not changed here, not changed here. So this is probably audit info, info. This should be constant or immutable, right? Why do we have this variable in storage that is never changing? Okay, why is this in storage? We probably should not have that. Okay, flash loan fee. Is, does this get initialized in the initializer? Okay, cool. These both get initialized in the initializer. Great. Uh, it says note here 0.3% fee. Okay, 0.3% fee. So 3E15. Okay, so if the precision is 1E18, that's like 1, 1, 2, 3. And then 0. Point, that's like 1, 2, 3, like this. So that looks about right, like a 0.3% fee. Yep. That looks about right. Okay, cool. And then what's next? Token to currently flash loading private S currently flash loading. So this is probably a mapping that tells us if a token is in the middle of a flash loan. Okay, that might I could see where that's very helpful. Cool. We have some events. We probably could look through these and look, hey, like not enough information emitted or too much information emitted. We're just going to skip this for now, uh, but that is something that we would want to look at. Great. Modifiers, revert if zero. That looks good, good to me. If amount equals zero, revert. Can't be zero. Revert if not allowed token. Oh, so we have this function is allowed token, and then we revert if it's not allowed. So this is actually great to see, right? And then I'm going to command click to see what this function looks like. This is allowed token. The fact that we have this, we know, again, that... When it comes to weird ERC-20s, we at least have some type of allow list, right? So it's not going to be every ERC-20 under the sun, which cuts down on the badness of the protocol, right? So we might say, hey, if you accidentally pass a bad token to this protocol, that could cause issues, you know, great. But at least upfront, it's not going to be an issue. 
So we have is allowed token. It's going to return s token to asset token of the token does not equal zero. So this s token to asset token, we're saying I think it maps the toggle word wrap maps the underlying token to its asset token. So we're basically saying if this hasn't been set, then the token hasn't been allowed. So you know, I'm going to ask some questions here. Is it ever unset poorly? And then maybe I start going down that route. OK, is allowed token. Let's see. Let's see what updates S token to asset token. S token to asset token. S token to asset. Deposit, mm, redeem. Mm, that doesn't do it. That doesn't do it. Aha, set allowed token. OK, so it looks like this is doing it. So we do have a way to change allowed tokens. So maybe maybe this causes an issue. I don't know. We can come back to it. Cool. So sorry, going back up, we're down to the modifiers now. And then sometimes it's easy to kind of like lose your place. So maybe sometimes like you'll do just like an OK, like like a comma like this to be like, hey, you've come here. This this looks good to you. OK, so most of this looks pretty benign so far, but that's because we're not really dealing with any functions yet. All right, let's get into the functions now. So first we have our constructor with at custom OZ upgrades unsafe allow constructor. This is a thing so that static analysis tools don't get mad at us for doing this weird initializer stuff. We have disable initializers. This comes directly from the initializable package where we're not allowed to do anything. We're not allowed to call any initializers in the constructor, which is what we want, right? Because this is an upgradable smart contract. It's behind a proxy. This looks pretty good to us. Uh, cool. Next, external functions. These are kind of probably the more important, important functions. We have the initialize function, which we went over this a little bit, but let's go over it a little bit harder. OK, we have ownable init. So we have the initializer um, modifier. We already talked about how it could be front run. Ownable init. Let's go see what ownable init needs. We're going to command click. Uh, where is ownable? Ownable upgradable. Own init. OK, initial owner. Cool. So this just transfers this the initial owner. Now I got to go back a million things. This is why this back button is so freaking powerful, right? So control back, control shift is go forward, you know, or whatever your, you know, Mac or Windows or whatever you're on, you should have some type of go back, go forward to do that. So ownable inits, that looks correct. So the message.sender is the original owner. UUPS upgradable init. We would go see what this function does, I'm telling you, it just it does the same thing for UUPS. It sets up storage for UUPS. I'm just going to ignore that one for now. Uh, in, a, in a real security review, we definitely would go over that. Oracle init T swap address. We already have, hey, this should be the pool factory. So we're using the T swap as some type of Oracle. So maybe a little E using T swap as some kind of Oracle, perhaps. I guess we'll find out. Then we have the initial fee precision and the initial fee for fat flash loans. OK, cool. Nothing seemingly out of place there. OK, finally, the deposit function, really important function. What the heck? Where is the NAT spec? This is a super important function and it has no NAT spec. This actually makes me mad, right? So call this out. Tell them, hey, this is a really important function. You need to put NAT spec on this. Yes, it's just an informational finding. But, you know, if you're doing a private audit, call this out. It makes it much harder for us to know what this is actually supposed to do. But OK, so this is the deposit function. If we go back to our little Excala draw, we know what this does. This is for the people to deposit their tokens into the contract so that other people can take out flash loans. OK, great. So how do we do deposits? So we have an ERC20 token, UN256 amount, external revert if zero on the amount. OK, cool. Revert if not allowed token. OK, cool. We're probably going to want to see how these allowed tokens are set in the first place. But this looks pretty good to me so far. Now we're going to say the asset token equals the asset token is going to be S token to asset token token. So maybe even at this point I go, OK, no, you know what? How are these tokens being set? You know, I, I'm pretty sure I know what this is doing, but how are these tokens being set? I, I'm going to scroll down to set allowed token because I know there's this function down here because we been bobbing around and we see, OK, set allowed token. This looks pretty important. It looks like this is the function that sets or removes tokens. So this is an only owner. This is a permissioned function by the owner of this protocol. We've already called that out in our report.md, right? We've already called out that it's centralized in our medium issues from a Darren. Thank you, a Darren. It looks like somebody could come in and just totally wreck people, right? They allow or disallow some tokens. Great. 
So now we have if allowed, if else. So uh, I usually like to do these little collapsing things so I can see stuff a little bit better. So we have if allowed and then else. If, if we should set it to true, do something. If we should set it to false, do something else. I think let's start with looking at if we set it to true. So we're setting some token to being allowed on the, on the protocol. So first thing we do is we do a little check to see if it's already been allowed. If it's already on this S token list here. Okay, that looks good to me. If it's already allowed, we're going to revert with already allowed. Very nice. You know, maybe we do like, you know, at audit info revert with token, right? Maybe, maybe the token should go in here, but not a big deal either way. Then we have some weird stuff here. So we have string memory name equals string dot concat thunder loan metadata address token dot name. So IRC 20 metadata is an interface which allows us to get like name, symbol, and decimals, some of the metadata for an IRC 20. Right here, I'm asking, oh, well, what if they don't have a name? And this is where I might go to, this is where I might go back to the readme, and I'm gonna look at the tokens that they're gonna have, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna check if these have names, if these have symbols, etc. I know these all have names. Granted, USDC might prove an issue because it's a proxy, um, but if we scroll down to the bottom, actually known issues, we are aware that weird ERC-20s break the protocol, including fee on transfer, rebasing, and ERC-777 tokens. The owner will vet any additional tokens before adding them to the protocol. So it looks like they're aware of this, which is good, um, but we should probably still point out at some point, hey, if you don't have a name or a symbol, you can't be added. Uh, you can't be set allowed token, and that might be informational. That might be fine. We might even leave that off, to be honest. This is this one's kind of subjective. Hey, set allowed tokens doesn't work with tokens with names. But again, they're aware none of the tokens that they're planning to use have have this issue. So maybe we leave it off, but up to you here. Then finally, so we, we're creating a name. We're probably creating a name for the asset token. Actually, if we skip a couple lines down, that's exactly what we're doing. We're creating a name for the asset token. We're creating a symbol for the asset token, TL, maybe for like thunder loan dot symbol. So this would be like, the name would be like Thunder Loan USDC, and then the symbol might be like TL USDC. Cool, those seem like decent names for stuff. Cool, and then this actually deploys a new asset token, address this token name symbol. So I'm opening up asset token, I'm going to the constructor, and I'm seeing if all the parameters are right. Okay, Thunder Loan, address this. Okay, this is Thunder Loan, cool. Underlying token, okay, that makes sense name symbol name symbol okay nice then s token to asset token token equals asset token so this is where we're actually setting that mapping with this new asset token and then we're going to emit an event allowed token set token asset allowed allowed uh token asset token allowed token asset token allowed okay great and then we're returning asset token so this returns an asset token nice cool so that makes sense so this is what happens if we add a token. I don't really see any issues with this. This is great. So what happens if we remove a token? So if we set this to false. So else asset token equals uh, asset token equals asset token to asset token. We're deleting it and then emitting an event. Hmm. So I might be saying I might ask a question here. Does deleting a mapping work right? Does it? because up here, we've got a lot of checks on, on asset zero, right? If deleting this doesn't work right, then this won't be asset zero. So maybe I'm, I'm not exactly sure. So maybe what I do is I pull up Chisel and I go, okay, Chisel, we're gonna make a mapping of, of the same thing, of an address to an address public, and we'll call it token to token. We'll say token to token of address one equals address two cool so now if i do token to token of address one i should get two i do indeed if i do delete into token address one now i look up token to token address one i still get two here hmm is this an issue so now i might double now i might be a little concerned let's pull up remix let's see what remix has to say and let's do a little contract here huh so i have contract mapping test we'll do mapping address to address public token to token function set and we'll say 
address token address token to public token to token of token equals token to and then we'll say function remove address token public delete token to token token and then function get address token public return token to token token oops returns address public view great compile is fine let's try to deploy this scroll down okay let's say this contract address we'll set it to just this account address boom set now if we try get on it we get that to oh, token to token is going to give us the same thing now if we remove paste it in there I hit get oh i do get zero so this is probably a bug with foundry and this is where we open an issue we go to foundry github and i kid you not oh, let's do a quick search for like chisel mappings and we would make an issue in here saying hey delete doesn't work great with chisel mappings so if by the time this course comes out if nobody has made this issue yet somebody should make this issue because we found a bug in one of our tools <laughs> good job everybody So we delete this, we tested this with Remix. It looks like it works in Remix. I'm gonna tell you right now, Remix is right, Chisel is wrong, uh, so that's fine. We did this omit, allowed token set. Uh, looks like this looks correct as well. And then we return asset token. So this looks pretty good to me as well. So again, I might do like an okay up here, and then I might do again, you know, at audit info needs NAT spec or something. And a lot of tools like a Darren will actually pick up this needs NAT spec as well. So, you know, maybe we don't report this, but in any case, so where were we? Okay, the reason we were looking at this is because we wanted to see the deposit function and we wanted to see how these tokens are selected. It looks like we can add and remove tokens at will of the owner, which is great. Maybe that could be an issue later on. I guess we're gonna find out. And now I do wanna pause because yeah, we've actually gone through a, at least a function now of Thunder Loan. We've gone through a lot of these already and we haven't found any bugs and that's okay. The thing is security reviews or audits are often not linear. It's not like, oh, found a bug here, found a bug here, here, oh, here, and then three bugs here and then done. Oftentimes they are exponential. And most of the time, really good security re researchers, really good auditors are actually find a lot of bugs at the end because that's when they have all the context. That's when they know the code base the best. If you find bugs along the way though, that's obviously great as well. Okay, deposit, asset token. We're doing asset token to exchange of the token. Okay, great. This is how we get, get that asset token, which is going to uh, remember again, it's the represents the shares of the pool, right? Just one more time. I don't know. I brought this up a hundred times, but it, the asset token is going to represent how much of this contract the whale or the depositor actually owns. Now we're going to do exchange rate equals asset token dot get exchange rate. Okay, so this is where, so this again is the exchange rate between, you know, the USDC and the, you know, I deposit $1,000, give me fees, flash loan token. What's the ratio between these flash loan tokens and the underlying tokens? So the mint amount, okay, so we have a little bit of math here. Okay, it's going to be the amount that is deposited. So like, you know, maybe for example, 100 USDC, it's going to be the amount times the exchange rate precision times the ex asset rate dot exchange rate precision. So this is the, I believe this is up here. Exchange rate precision, one E18, okay. So this is more like 100 E18, right? Times one E18 divided by the exchange rate, which I believe in here, it gets defaulted to starting exchange rate or one E18, okay. So divided by the exchange rate, so maybe 1E18, maybe like 2E18 or something. And this gets us the mint amount. So we can actually do some math here. So if the exchange rate is two and we deposit 100, so we're basically saying 100 times 1E18 divided by two would be 50E18, which makes sense. So if the exchange rate is two to one, we're gonna get, so if the exchange rate is two, we're gonna get half of the, flash loan tokens in exchange for the 100 USDC. So then a question becomes, okay, well, what if this is zero? Can we do a divide by zero? And that comes back to here where update exchange rate says it cannot be zero. It should always go up, never go down. And since we start with one, it should pretty much never be zero. 
So maybe I'll put like a, a note. This should never be zero because of the assets token conditional. Okay, so that looks fine. We emit an event. Okay, nice. We're emitting the event really high. We're calling asset token dot mint. This should pass fine. The message us sender. So the depositor is going to get the mint amount. Asset token is calling mint here. This is only callable by Thunder loan. That makes sense for us. Now we're doing calculated fee equals get calculated fee asset token to update exchange rate. And then finally we transfer from message us sender to address asset token amount. So this is interesting. So when a liquidity provider deposits, the money sits in the asset token contract. So the money isn't sitting in Thunder Loan. The money actually goes to the asset token contract. Okay, interesting. But what are these doing? Calculated fee equals get calculated fee token amount. Get calculated fee. Why is this to have no NAT spec? Where is the NAT spec? Token fee. Okay. So we're getting value of borrowed token equals amount times get its price divided by the fee precision. And this is saying, okay, fee equals the value of borrowed token times the flash loan fee divided by fee precision. Is this the, is this calculating the fees of flash loans? Why are we calculating the fees of flash loans in the deposit? What the, what the hickety heck is going on here? And then we're updating the exchange rate? Wait, 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 wait. Why are we updating the exchange rate? This seems wrong. We're going to do at audit follow up. This seems sus. There's, there's something, there's something weird going on here. We have some unanswered questions. Why are we calculating the fees of the flash loans of deposit? And then why are we updating the exchange rate? So if we deposit tokens in here, the exchange rate is different. So if I deposit more, the exchange rate would be what? Something seems wrong here. I'm not exactly sure. So I'm just gonna do audit follow up and we'll come back to it later because the rest of this looks pretty correct. We mint the user some asset tokens and then we take the tokens and we put it into the underlying. And now we might even go, ah, I'm going to, I'm going to start drawing some, some diagrams for this. So maybe I start drawing a little diagram and at the end of this, I'll have this in the audit data as well. And we're starting to learn some stuff. Okay. We call deposit that actually sends the underlying to asset token a or asset token USDC. And this contract is the one that holds the actual underlying USDC. And when a liquidity provider deposits their USDC, that gets sent over here and then the asset token mints the LP, the asset token. So, okay, so starting to draw some diagrams. This isn't great, but this gives me a better idea of what's actually happening, right? LP has the USDC, they call it deposit. This sends it over to the asset token. The asset token will then mint the LP, the underlying USDC. Okay, great, makes sense. Everybody at the deposit just calls transfer of the underlying token, this. So we've gone over deposit. This is our first pass. We might go over it again. Now we have redeem. So this does the opposite, withdraws the underlying token from the asset token. This has NAT spec. Oh my goodness. Thank goodness. So we have withdraws the underlying token from the asset token, the token we want to withdraw from and the amount of the underlying they want to withdraw. So is this the asset token or is this the actual token? I guess we're going to find out, but this is kind of unclear. Maybe we ask them to make the docs better. So token amount of asset token, we have revert of zero, revert if not allowed token. Okay, great. So this is actually the actual token that they want to draw, not the asset token. Okay, makes sense. Right, right here, we're going to get the actual asset token. Now we're saying if amount of assets token equals the max, okay, so this is like a user experience thing. Then we're going to say the amount of asset token is going to be asset token dot balance of message dot sender. So we're getting how many tokens how many asset tokens they're going to redeem. So basically they say, I have 10 asset token for USDC. Let me get my USDC based on the 10 asset token exchange rate. So that's essentially what this function is doing. I guess that's what we're hoping it's going to do. That's what we're thinking it's going to do. Okay, great. So we're going to do amount underlying is going to be amount of asset token times exchange rate divided by the asset token dot exchange rate precision. So we're saying if we want one E18 and the exchange rate is, 
you know, 1E18, divide that by 1, 1E18, we're going to get 1, right? 1E18 back. Let's say 1E18, we want to get times by the exchange rate of 2E18, divide that by 1E18, we're going to get 2E18. Okay, cool. So this does look like it's the opposite of the deposit, right? So the deposit multiplied by the precision divided by the exchange rate. This one's multiplied by the exchange rate divided by the precision. That math looks pretty correct to me. Emits a redeemed event. Nice. We call assets.burn. So we actually burn the uh, asset token from the user. That makes sense. And then we do asset token dot transfer underlying two, which I believe if we go back to the asset token, transfer underlying two is just a safe transfer. So that looks good to me. And then we probably, I don't think we need this. I don't think there's going to be a re-entrancy here unless this is like an ERC-777, which is said is out of scope as a known issue. So this looks pretty good to me. I'm, I'm thinking though, okay, well, what if we have a weird ERC-20 token? Is that an issue? Amount of asset token times exchange rate, asset token dot exchange rate precision. Hmm. So what if we do one like USDC has six decimals because it's a weirdo times, let's say the exchange rate is 2E18 divided by 1E18. Is this an issue? Okay, this is where Chisel is going to help us because the math on Chisel should actually be correct here. So let's do 1E6 times 2E18 divided by 1E18. Let's do some parentheses here. We should expect to get 2E6 right? And that's indeed what we got. 2E6, right? 2E6. Okay. So then it doesn't, it looks like it might not matter. So it looks like it might not matter there. Okay, cool. So redeem looks pretty good to me. I don't see there's any re-entry because we are following CEI, right? We do the checks up here. Effects are here. And even though the asset token is technically like an external, it's still part of the system. We know exactly what the code looks like. We know it doesn't have any callbacks. And then we do the transfer underlying as the last step. So we're pretty happy with this redeem here. Oh man, we, we're, we're having a hard time finding some bugs, huh? Oh, this is getting tough. So deposit looks okay. There's something weird going on here, but we can come back to it. Redeem looks pretty good. So we know, we know how to deposit. We also know how to redeem the asset tokens. Okay, cool. Now, finally, the big fat function flash loan. This is one of the most important functions and it has no NAT spec just to drive me crazy. And that's going to be an issue for sure. Okay, so no NAT spec. This is very frustrating, but we can actually start walking through this and start building the NAT spec basically ourselves. So we have receiver address. Mm, I think we can assume the address to get the flash loaned tokens. So the address to get the tokens. Okay, this is going to be the ERC 20 to borrow, probably e the amount to borrow and then params. Mm. So what's this? Let's look for params. Okay. It looks like emit flash loan. Ah, it's being called down here. Receiver address dot function call. And if you watch the foundry flow course, this looks very familiar to you. We are ABI encoding this, this function here and adding these parameters in here so we can call this function. So these call data params are going to be the parameters to call the receiver address with. So this receiver address should be a smart contract and we're going to send it params when we send it the token as well. So, okay, we're going to assume this is what this is. If we're unsure, we could actually go back and we could have these be questions instead of explainers, but maybe it's a good idea just to prime our heads and ask the questions. Okay, what are we looking for here? So, okay, revert is zero. Cool, revert if not allowed token. Let's see what that does. It checks for is allowed token. Okay, we've looked at that. We've already looked at that. It's okay, great. Asset token equals S underscore to asset token of the token. Okay, great. So this is going to be, so the asset token, as we've learned, this is the contract that actually holds the token. So we need to get this asset token contract because it, what's, it's what holds the underlying tokens, the actual tokens that we're gonna borrow. And okay, cool. We have this starting balance. So this is probably what we're going to use to check if the flash loan has been repaid, right? So we're checking this starting balance of the asset token contract. And we are probably going to have a check later on. If we scroll down to the bottom, we sure do. We check if the ending balance is less than that starting balance plus a fee, then we revert. So basically we're checking that we're going to have more money, more of the ERC 20 at the end, which is what we want to do. 
Okay, if amount is greater than the starting balance, so okay, so if we're gonna trying to borrow too much, it looks like we're gonna revert. Okay, cool. If the receiver address dot code dot length equals equals zero, we're gonna revert as well. So this is pretty cool. We probably want to double check that this actually works if we're unsure, but great. We revert otherwise. Okay, next fee equals get calculated fee. Ah, okay. So this is probably the fee of the flash loan. This is how those whales are finally going to get paid. So we probably want to check out this get calculated fee. Sometimes we might just skip it over. For now, I might actually just skip it over. Let's assume this get calculated fee works correct. OK, cool. Then we have asset token update exchange rate fee. Ah, OK, so back in asset token, we have update exchange rate with the fee. So this fee is actually going to be the fee charged by the protocol. So we're saying, hey, we've got a new fee. You need to update the exchange rate so that the math works out. Ah, now this example starts to make a little bit more sense. So we look at this example. Let's say the old exchange rate is one, which is the starting exchange rate. The total supply is four. There are four shares. There are four asset tokens, which mean, you know, maybe four USDC has been deposited. Plus the fee of 0 0.5 divided by four is now 1.125, right? So if the fee is 1.125, if we go to withdraw with our four total supply, we would take four times the exchange rate of 1.125 equals 4.5 USDC would get withdrawn because that's the exchange rate. And if we have a fee of 0.5, that does mean there would be 4.5 total USDC in there. So there's a little bit of math here, and I know I definitely kind of sped through that. So if any of that is a little bit confusing, feel free to take some time and pause to figure this out. Ask the question, hey, if if there's five asset token, five USDC and an exchange rate of one, and then we charge a one fee, you know, what would be the resulting exchange rate? And does the resulting exchange rate make sense? Well, let's try it out. So we have we do this math here, right? This is the new exchange rate math. Old exchange rate is one times the total supply of five plus that fee of one divided by the total supply of five equals. OK, well, we can do one times five plus one is six divided by five equals one point two. So the exchange rate would be one point two. So that means if we take our five asset token and we want to withdraw the USDC, we would times five by one point two to get the six USDC underlying. That math makes sense to me. So I went through the math a couple of times, but this calculated fee is starting to make more sense, right? The picture is becoming clearer. The more we do this review, the more we understand the protocol. And again, finding security issues is more about really understanding the protocol. So we've walked through this get fee, but now we might want to walk through it again because we have more context. So we're understanding update exchange rate a little bit more. We still haven't checked out how they're actually calculating this fee, but we will in a little bit. But for now, let's assume this is correct. Update exchange rate starts to make more sense. Cool. We emit a flash loan. Now we're doing S underscore currently flash loaning token equals true. So it looks like this is a mapping where we're checking to see, OK, is a token in the middle of a flash loan? So if we're setting this to true, we probably want to look down and see, are we setting this to false somewhere? Aha, right at the end, we set it to false. OK, cool. Makes a lot of sense. I wonder what this is used for. Let's do a quick look around. Ah, it's used in the repay function, which might be the function expected to repay. We have is currently. OK, cool. So sorry, we're setting this. Sorry, I just bounced around a lot. But OK, we're back to setting this to true here. Then we do asset token dot transfer underlying to. So this is the function that actually sends out the money. Transfer underlying to right here is only callable by Thunder Loan. So this looks good. And we're going to do a safe transfer of the actual token. OK, nice. We've got these. So they're disables, which seem to not be working super great. And now we're here and we already have some questions from running our tools. Hey, is this a potential reentrancy issue? Do we need the return value of the function call? So we are calling an external contract here. So we do want to keep this in mind. The only state, though, that we're updating is this S currently flash loaning equals false. So maybe there's a way we can we can break this, although mm, it doesn't look like the rest of the contract really depends on this other than repay, which seems to just repay, right? So maybe there's 
So maybe there's some weird attack vector here where like the owner pulls some money out and changes, removes a token or I don't know, I'm talking gibberish. So this function call is coming from the open Zeppelin package, right? If we do a little search on the entire project, including dot slash lib, right? We can look up function function call and we can see a whole bunch of stuff in here, but it looks like this is coming from this address library, right? Which we're using in Thunder Loan, right? Right at the top, uh, using address for address. So we have this address contract and we have this function call. If you want to pause right now and read some of these docs to get familiar with function call, great. It has a target data and then just calls this function call with value, which sets the value to zero. Okay, cool. And then we do a very classic piece of code that you should be familiar with now. Bull success, bytes memory return data equals target dot call value value and then the data. So we're doing a low level call with function call value. So in the Thunder Loan contract, this function call allows us to pass really any data to this receiver address stuff function call. We're ABI encoding the flash loan receiver execute operation. We're doing ABI.encode call, which turns these into our call data. We're grabbing the execute operation function. And then these are the parameters that we're passing. And then we're just encoding these, right? So the address of the token, the amount, fee, message sender parameters. And if we look at the flash loan receiver, flash loan receiver in here, it looks like this is the interface where it defines this execute operation, right? And we already have some questions here. Q is the token, the token that's being borrowed. I would say, uh, yes, it is the token be borrowed. So now I might say this is uh, Q answered or something, right? Uh, where's the NAT spec? Yep, that's really annoying. Q, amount is the amount of tokens. Maybe I'll do Q answered. Yes, or whatever you want to put in here. We're getting even more context about this code base. So, okay, we go back to here. We do this call. We're definitely going to play with this. Is there any way we can break this? So, okay, so we're doing the function call. So this is actually the call, right? If we go back to here, where so we're sending us, it's this part right here. So it's so the user calls the flash loan. The flash loan contract sends us the money. Well, they almost kind of do two things. They send us the money and then they also go, hey, I'm going to call this what execute operation right and they're almost like leaving it up to us in this contract to eventually at some point return the money back right Re or some repay function right so I, I know i'm not really pointing to myself but this should be pointing to <laughs> point to the metamask and then the repay well point of the metamask so they're like hey hey go ahead execute the operation i trust you're going to repay us because if you don't we're going to revert your transactions right so that's what's happening here and in this iFlash loan receiver, it should repay us, right? They should re they should have some contract that should repay us. And we can actually look in the tests to see if they have something like this. Let's look up re repay. Oh, goodness. Set allowed, can set, create token assets, deposit, set allowed token, updates balance, has deposits, test flash loan. Okay, cool. So they do have a unit test where they do a flash loan. So we can look at it here. So we mint some tokens. We call thunderloan.flashloan address mock flash loan receiver okay so this test flash loan gives us an idea of what they're expecting kind of the functionality to look like we can look in this mock flash loan receiver contract here and they got a whole bunch of stuff in here but this gives us a good idea of what they're expecting an execute operation to look like right so we can look at these tests to get a better idea so they're doing receiver address dot function call this is going to call something like this mock flash loan receiver it's going to call execute operation here so we're going to go Boom, and code call, execute operation, point to this mock flash loan receiver. It looks like this is running, doing some stuff, balance of flash loan. Okay, so it's getting how much tokens it has. It's doing some checks here. Token.approve as Thunder Loan amount plus fee. Thunder Loan dot repay. Okay, so this is not really doing anything. All this is doing is getting the money, going, cool, I got the money, and then just immediately repaying it. Right. And it looks like the way they're repaying the money is with this repay function down here. So we can see another minimized diagram of exactly what this looks like. So we first have our user calls flash loan on the contract. The contract goes, OK, great here. Right. With with this line here, you can have a thousand USDC or whatever. So we get a thousand USDC to some flash loan receiver contract. It then says, OK, I'm also going to execute whatever contract call you want me to do. So it does execute operation. This flash on receiver, whatever their execute operation code says to do, it's going to do some stuff. 
And then in this execute operation, as part of this stuff that it does, it's going to send back the $1,000 USDC. We can see that in the mock flash loan receiver. It's calling this repay function, which we're going to read in a little bit. And then boom, this little revert here. I need to have $1,000 or I revert, right? We see that back in the flash loan. Hey, if the ending balance is less than the starting balance plus fee, go ahead and revert. And then it's done. And then it says it's no longer currently flash loaning. So this looks pretty good to us. And what we might want to do with this too, maybe go compare, hey, how does Aave do flash loans? Is there anything weird that they're doing here that Aave is doing differently, right? Or how does any other flash loan protocol do this, right? You want to ground yourself in reality, ask the question, hey, how do others do these? How do others do the same thing? So, okay, so this is starting to make a little bit more sense. Then we check the token balance of the address of the asset token. Okay, that looks good. If the ending balance is less than the starting balance plus fee, because we want to make sure that the ending balance is greater than or equal to the starting balance plus fee. So we want to check if it's less than, then we revert. Okay, so cool. This is correct. Nice. And then currently flash loaning said false. Okay, cool. This looks pretty good to me. Okay. I don't see any big issues here. This function itself looks fine, huh? And then maybe now we might be starting to get a little discouraged, right? Because we look in our code base, we look at all our notes, we look at S or C. Do we have any audit highs? Oh man, audit highs? Oh, we haven't found any highs. Any mediums? Oh, we haven't found any mediums. Oh, what's going on? Remember, security reviews are not linear. We've got a ton of questions in here that we have yet to answer. And maybe one of these questions lies one of the bugs. Maybe you've actually already spotted some of the bugs because we have kind of gone over them. Security reviews are not linear. Let's keep going. Okay, so we have this repay function. Ah, okay, so this is what, this is what the contract expects people to repay using, right? There's kind of this nice helper function. We do know that users could just call transfer and directly transfer tokens to the asset. But it looks like this repay function is kind of like a nice helper function because all it does is it's going to get the asset token and then transfer the tokens from the message to sender to the asset token, right? So you could probably use this repay function or you could just directly transfer. Cool. This needs net spec as well. This looks pretty good to me. Okay. We went over set allowed tokens. This is why like marking this with this okay is good. Aha. Okay. Finally, get calculated fee. Okay. So we know what this is. We have this question, is this calculating the fees of the flash loan? We can Q answered. Answer, yes, it is doing that, right? Because in get calculated fee up here in, oh, we're we using it in deposit as well. Oh, that's kind of weird. Uh, but we're using in the flash loan here, get calculated fee. Okay, great. So the question is now, how is it calculating the fee? Where is this fee coming from? Okay, so get calculated fee. So first off, value of borrowed token equals the amount, what is this amount? So we look up get calculated fee. Uh, ah, okay. So in the in the flash loan, amount is going to be the amount being borrowed. Okay, cool. So the maybe we'll put like a little at param amount, the amount being borrowed, at param token, the token being borrowed. Okay, so value of borrowed token is we're going to say amount times get price in WETH. Oh, so this is why we need T swap. So this is why we're using the T swap Oracle. So we're actually getting the value of the borrowed token based off of its fee here. So we're actually calculating the value of the borrowed token as opposed to just some blanket amount of the borrowed token. So we're doing amount times the get price and weth. And remember this get price and weth, where is this coming from? Where's this get price and weth coming from? Well, if we go to this comes from the Oracle upgradable get price and weth. This is coming from the T-Swap pool. Ah, okay. Okay, so we're getting the price of the asset from by looking at the T-Swap pool. Okay. And then we're timesing this by some flash loan fee, dividing by some fee precision. Okay, so if we click on command click on flash loan fee, that's right. This is the 0.3% fee, fee precision. Let's scroll down. Yeah, so 1E18, E15. Uh, okay, so this this is where it's getting that 3% fee, but it's basing that 3% fee based off of the value of the token and not necessarily the amount of the token. Ah, okay. Hmm. So now maybe we go, oh, okay, well, we've looked at this Oracle upgradable. 
this get price in WETH is going to say get price of one pool token in WETH. And this is where it'll behoove us as security researchers to go back to T-Swap and go to this again and say, uh, get amount based off of input 1E18, input amount 1E18, output reserves, output, um, output input reserves, output amount. So this is that that weird math stuff that we did before, but it's just saying get price of one pool token in WETH teen. Hmm. Did we have a security issue with get price of one pool token in WETH? And here is where you can go super hard and go, oh, what, what are the, is this, is there, is this in the, in the audit report somewhere? Okay. No, maybe we, maybe it hasn't been audited correctly. Okay. I don't see it in there. But something that definitely is sticking out to me is I see one E18 and it looks like this is actually ignoring decimals. Uh oh, ignoring token decimals. Little question here. So maybe I ask a question. What if the token has six decimals? Is the price wrong? Oof. Uh oh. So we're doing something. We're, we're checking the price of these tokens based off of the T swap decks and we're using that to get the price for our T loan to get the fee for the flash loan. I know there's a lot of words there and there's a lot of context there, but but okay, it looks like that works. that's what we're doing. We've asked some questions that we can probably come back to. Let's leave the questions in here for now and we'll come back to this. So I might say, hey, Q, is this correct? Is this right? It looks like it might be sus, but I, uh, I'm i not exactly sure. So let's leave this question here. Let's go, let's keep going. Okay, update flash loan fee. Uh, this should have some NAT spec too, obviously. External only owner. If new fee is greater than S fee precision, we're gonna revert. Okay, that's fair enough. So it looks like the fee must be less than 100%. Cool, that's kind of a design implementation, not a big deal. Then we set the S flash loan fee to new fee. That looks fine. We have is allowed token. Now we're getting to some of the view functions. Okay, that looks fine to me. Uh, get asset from token. Public view returns asset token. That looks fine. Is currently flash loaning. Public view. Mm. We already talked about how this should be external probably. This looks fine. Get fee is just going to return the S flash loan fee. Cool. Cool. And then what the heck is this? Authorize upgrade. So this is where if we don't understand proxies, we really should. If we scroll all the way back up and we go to this UUPS upgradable, I'm going to command click into it. Whenever we upgrade a UUPS upgradable smart contract, we call this upgrade to and call, or we just call upgrade. And what it does is it calls this authorize upgrade function. So in our Thunder loan contract, we have this authorize upgrade and it looks like we've set it to be only owner. So adding this line in here means that anytime we call authorize upgrade, it can only work if the owner calls an upgrade. So this is actually seemingly like an innocuous, oh, what's this last line do? It's actually really important, right? If it didn't have only owner, this would mean anybody could upgrade this contract. So it's really good that we found this. It's really good that this line is here. Uh, and this makes us go, ah, okay, this, this looks pretty safe, right? But if they didn't have this line, this is where it gets a little bit scary. It would be hard for us to know, oh, uh, are they missing something here? You know, luckily this actually just wouldn't compile because if you're gonna be UUPS upgradable, you need to have that authorize upgrade function. So it's good that they have it in here. This is kind of showing, oh, there could be some stuff with some library that you're using that you need to add, you forgot about, so. But all right, cool. So we've gone through this whole code base in a first pass, hooray. And we found nothing, oh man, what? And then ugh, the Thunder Alone upgraded. That's just the upgraded version of Thunder Alone. Maybe there's some issues here, but like we haven't found any issues. Oh my goodness. Do we need to go one at a time through all these contracts again? Well, maybe, but maybe a better approach is let's go back to some of those questions that we had and let's see if we can answer some of those questions and maybe trying to dig deeper into some of these questions that we had, maybe that'll give us more information. So let's go back into our search box. I'm gonna look for the double Qs. I'm gonna look for the backslash space Q and then a space. And let's see what we can figure out here. All right, first question, why are we using T-Swap? Oh, well, okay, we actually answered this. Answer it, you know, answer. We need it to get the value of a token to calculate the fees. All right, cool. So we've answered a question. All right, next question. 
why are we only using the price of a pool token in WETH? Get price of one pool token in WETH. Ah, oh, that is that is weird. Why, why are we getting the... Okay, well, what, what are we using this pricing for? We're we using this in calculate fee or calculated fee, right? Get calculated fee. This is calling the get price in WETH. Wait a minute. When we do the flash loan here, when we do the flash loan here, this is, this is starting to not make sense. We're saying the ending balance should be the starting balance plus the fee, right? And these are all in units of you know, token. So the token is the ending balance less than the token plus fee, which is also, you know, token, right? But in this calculate fee, get calculated fee, get price and WETH. So we're saying, you know, one USDC, maybe the price and WETH is like 0 0.1 WETH divided by the fee precision, which might be 1E18. Why is the price, why is it get price and WETH if it's the price of the token that doesn't this is this is wrong. This is very clearly wrong. Why are we getting the price in WETH? If we wanted to get the price in WETH, the fee should probably be in WETH, right? So if we're saying, okay, one USD equals 0 0.1 WETH, we should require one USD C plus maybe 10% of 0 0.1. So maybe 0 0.00 or 0 0.01 or 0 0.01 or 0 0.03 or, or whatever WETH. But right now we're saying one USDC plus 0.003 USDC. That doesn't make sense. This get calculated fee is definitely wrong. Oh my goodness. At audit, let's think about this. For this one, we would definitely want to write a POC. We're going to skip the POC on this one because this is almost kind of a, a design implementation failure. They could 100% say, oh no, we want to do this weird wonkiness, but it's probably definitely wrong. So for this one, we're going to skip it, uh, but we're definitely going to report it. So at audit, what's the impact and what's the likelihood? How do we figure this out? Okay, the prices are all gonna be wrong. So prices are wrong, which means that what? If the prices are wrong, we could say this is either a severe or medium disruption of the functionality. So, so impact is gonna be medium or high because it's a medium or severe disruption of the, of the protocol. Likelihood is gonna be high, right? Because every single time a fee gets calculated, they're using this. So we might say at audit, high or at audit medium. More likely though, this is going to be a high because this is highly likely this is not the intended functionality. So audit high, if the fee is going to be in the token, then the value should reflect that. Right now, this is super weird. We're getting the value of the borrowed token. This is in units of WETH and we're increasing the fee in units of WETH and USDC. What the heck? If this isn't super clear to you what I'm talking about here, I know I say this sometimes and it's kind of annoying, but really don't worry about this. This is kind of like a really weird edge case issue that I didn't mean to put in here, but it's a bug nonetheless. So, all right, cool. We've answered some more questions. Great. And we found an audit high. Yay. Now we might want to write up the report. We could hold it for later. I'm going to say we're, we're going to skip the report. We're going to skip the POC for this one because, like I said, uh, I didn't mean to put this bug in here <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, it's actually kind of confusing. So... We're, we're going to kind of skip over it. Okay, let's keep going with the questions. Dash, dash, Q. Great. Why are we using this? You know, Q answered. Answer, we shouldn't be. This is a bug. Whoops. All right, cool. Let's keep going. What does this rate do? Aha, Q answered. Answer, it's the rate between the underlying and the asset token. Next, where are the tokens stored? Ah, Q answered. Answer, they are stored in the asset token contract. Great, we know that as well. Next, what happens if USDC blacklists the Thunder Loan contract? Ooh, follow up weird ERC-20s with USDC. If this gets blacklisted, this is all gonna be blocked. Uh, I'm not gonna write a POC for this one either, but this is probably an audit medium, maybe even an audit high, depending on how much you trust USDC. But this is definitely the protocol will be frozen and that would suck. Let's do Q answered now in competitive audits this is kind of a caveat here so this would be this is good for a private audit in competitive audits these often don't count usually the rules in competitive audits are something like if a user is blacklisted or excuse me deny listed if a user is deny listed or you know removed too bad however if a user is deny listed and it affects others that's usually an accepted finding in a competitive audit so in a private audit, you do want to let the client be aware of this. But in competitive audits, 
these are often not considered valid findings, right? Because these are kind of gimmies, right? Everyone kind of already knows this is a thing. This might be the first time you're hearing about it, but in competitive audits, these are gimmies. So we're going to skip this. We're not going to write a write up for this one, but this would technically be an audit medium, maybe an audit low. In a competitive audit, this would not be accepted. Yes, if USDC decides to upgrade, the whole contract is kind of screwed as well. You definitely want to put that on the audit report somewhere. If we go back to the readme, USDC, die, link, weth. USDC is behind a proxy. They could upgrade at any time and totally wreck the protocol. We'll put somewhere on the audit report, hey, if USDC gets upgraded, the whole protocol is screwed. Again, ERC-20s are a nightmare for DeFi. All right, but let's keep looking for questions. Okay, but why? All right, we kind of already went over that. Cool. What if total supply was zero? We kind of played with that a little bit. It doesn't look like it can really be zero. What if the token has six decimals? Is the price wrong? Now, for the purpose of this video, we're actually going to skip over this question. I do want you to be aware that you should be thinking about this type, these types of things. But for this video, we're going to skip over it because it's not really what I want to spend a lot of time teaching you for this bit. But it is good to consider. And if you want to spend some time later on after the course to come back to this and say, huh, I wonder if I could break this. I wonder if if these if the tokens actually do break this, then I would love to challenge you to write some proof of codes and see if you can answer this question yourself. So that'll be your question. Hey, if the tokens have weird and different decimals, is the price wrong? Is there anything else wrong or weird? And I'll give you a hint with the deposit function. There is something weird that happens, but not necessarily wrong. And this is another reason why I don't really want to spend a lot of time on this, because there's an issue that might actually not be an issue, depending on what the intent of the protocol was. And I feel like it's going to be more confusing than actually helping. <laughs> but it is good to think about weird tokens, weird decimals, etc. But like I said, for this for this course, I don't really want to spend a lot of time on it because it's not like super important for this one. But in the future, you should definitely be thinking about this. But I do challenge you to see if you can get this protocol to fall apart by using weird tokens with weird or different amount of decimals. And remember, if it does fall apart, this would be an issue because USDC has six decimal points. All right, cool. Let's keep going, though. So for now, we're going to skip over this. But like I said, if you want to spend more time and go over it, absolutely. OK, what about our next question? Why is this a storage variable? Uh, do we ever change this? Fee precision, precision, precision. Nope, this shouldn't be. So this is going to be, you know, at audit info. This should be constant slash immutable. Cool. Great. What would happen if we deploy the contract and something else initializes? Oh, we talked about that already. OK, OK, why are we calculating the fees of flash loan in the deposit? And why are we updating the exchange rate? Oh, yeah, that does seem kind of odd. Does it make sense for us to to do this here? Yeah, audit follow up. This seems sus. OK, let's uh, Let's see. OK, well, so first off, from a conceptual level, I, I don't think this makes sense. So this exchange rate thing is to update the exchange rate because we added fees. Since there's more money in the asset token, we need to update the exchange rate so people can pull the money out. Deposit doesn't accrue any fees, does it? Well, let's go check out their tests here. OK, so we have test flash loan, has deposits, test deposit mints assets, set allowed token, test can deposit on approved token, sets. Mm, these are all their tests. There's no test in here for, oh my goodness, there's no test in here for redemptions. Oh my goodness. So we have this redeem function. But if we go over to their tests, oh my goodness, they forgot to test the redeem function. Well. Let's let's try just writing a test for the redeem function. And we're using this test for the redeem function to figure out, OK, well, if this update exchange rate is broken, well, in the redemption, this is going to break because the exchange rate has gotten in the redemptions. So maybe there's there's some mistake up here. So let's let's just write a test for the redemptions. So let's just do function test redeem after loan. Zoom in a little bit. So be public. And one of the good things about this is it looks like they have these modifiers up here, like set allowed token and what else has deposits. So we can even just use some of these modifiers as well. It looks like has deposits, deposits some tokens and then set allowed tokens. If we command click it, obviously sets the allowed token, right? So if we're back down in here, test redeem after loan, we can add set allowed token and then has uh, has deposits so that we know we have some deposits and we have some allowed token. So now that we've deposited, 
We know that the deposit updates and changes the exchange rate. Let's do a flash loan, kind of borrow from this test flash loan, and then just try to redeem, right? We can actually just copy most of this, paste it down here. So we're gonna say amount to borrow, amount times 10, calculated fee is thunderloan.get calculated fee. Okay, cool, we're gonna get the fee. We're gonna prank the user. And they're going to they're going to mint some tokens for the flash loan receiver. This is going to be the fee, I believe. Actually, let's just have them mint the fee. Let's see if that works. So yeah, that's weird that they're not using the calculated fee up here. So we're going to do we're going to mint our flash loan receiver with the fee so that they can pay the fee. We're going to do thunderloan.flashloan, address the mock flash loan receiver, token A amount to borrow. And so our mock flash loan receiver, as we know, all it's going to do, it's going to basically get the money, do some checks and then just send the money back with the repay function so we know that the deposit is going to change the exchange rate this is also going to change the exchange rate but the depositor should now be able to pull out their money out and if not maybe it's that weird exchange rate update and deposit that's screwing with it so let's try this let's do un 256 amount to redeem let's say is type un 256 max and we're going to do type un 256.max because in this redeem function we have here if amount of asset token equals type un 256.max just grab the entire balance of their asset token they're going to use their entire balance to try to pull out as many funds as possible okay great now we can do vm.start prank it looks like these tests have a liquidity provider it looks like this liquidity provider is the person who has deposited stuff so let's copy that vm.start prank the liquidity provider uh, they're going to run thunder loan dot redeem and what are they going to redeem well let's look at the has deposits bit they're depositing okay they're doing thunder loan to deposit token a so let's have them try to redeem token a what is this token and amount to return so token a and then amount to redeem like this and we can just run this test as is let me zoom out a little bit we can just run this test as is and if it fails maybe it's because there's an issue here forge test dash dash mt paste it in Hmm. Well, that doesn't sound right. Insufficient balance. Uh, okay. Well, let's do dash v v v v. Let's see who's missing a, a balance here. Okay. And now in Foundry, we can actually go through this, and we can see it's the redeem function that's messing up. So who doesn't have a balance? Let's read this. So we call redeem, and if we hide this, we're calling redeem. Okay. Cool. Pull it back up. We're calling get exchange rate. That is ah, okay. This line here, calling it get exchange rate. Great. Then we're doing balance of. That looks fine. Exchange rate precision, right? So we're doing balance of exchange rate precision. What's next? Oh, we're emitting redeemed. Okay, we're burning the asset token. Okay, and then oh, transfer underlying two is erroring. So it's calling transfer underlying two to message our sender and then amount underlying. And it's saying the amount underlying is this. So wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's saying it needs to transfer a thousand three tokens back. How many did we deposit in here? So has deposits. We deposited, okay, deposit amount. So we initially deposited amount times a thousand times a hundred. That's kind of confusing. So ten times a hundred, we're gonna talking one thousand e eighteen was the initial deposit. Okay, so we took out a flash loan. So yeah, it should be a little bit more than a thousand because this accrued fees, right? But what was this calculated fee? Uh, well, we can scroll up. We can look back in the longs here. We can see where we got this get calculated fee. Deem some pranks, flash loan, get calculated fee. Looks like the fee was this much. So, so we had to scroll up a lot to see this. We have ERC proxy, get calculated fee, which calls get calculated fee so we get this as the fee so okay so hold on a second so initial deposit was the initial deposit was 1000 e18 this is the fee one two three four five six seven eight nine ten one two three four five six seven eight so basically three e17 was the fee but they're trying to pull out this much money what this is this is way more so hold on hold on a second 1000 e18 plus 3e17 equals it should be like this e17 right 1000.3 this would be like 1000.3 e18 or just you know 1000 e17 but we're getting this weird extra 
Nine thousand. What? The, what the heck? Where is? Why are we getting this weird update? We should have one fee. It should be this. Oh my goodness. Maybe the deposit. Those two lines of the deposit is screwing with the fee. Oh my goodness. It's updating the fee incorrectly. Oh my goodness. In the deposit, it's updating the fee here, and it shouldn't be doing that because it's not getting any fees. It's up. This exchange rate is responsible for keeping track of how much money is in the protocol at all times, so that people can redeem their asset tokens for the underlying. Hold on a second. We got to test this out. Let's comment out these lines in the Thunder loan. Let's run this trust again. And if that's the issue, this should pass. And it does indeed pass. Doing this, we have just written a test, written a proof of code that proves the issue. And we found clearly a high. People can't redeem their tokens because of this stupid update in here. So this, congrats all, at audit high. We've got them. We shouldn't be updating the exchange rate here. This is so stupid. Why do they put this in? And this usually feels really good, right? Once you find a high, you're like, oh my goodness, I got to celebrate. You're feeling like the smartest person ever because you've just done a lot of amazing things. Number one, you wrote a proof of code. You proved it. You said, hey, I've proven that this is an issue. We are now going to help make this protocol safer by telling them, hey, your protocol is going to brick itself. What are you doing with that? That's so dumb. Obviously, we don't tell them it's dumb, but this is something to get really excited about finding a high. And you'll notice how long have we been working on this? We found this high towards the end because we've got a deeper understanding of the protocol and we've really been able to say, oh my goodness, it's clear as day to us now that this is actually an issue. Most of the times, a lot of the bugs will actually come at the end of the audit journey. Security reviews are not linear and you'll find we're actually about to find a ton more bugs and these are all coming at the end of this security review because we're really starting to understand the protocol and we're really starting to answer some of these questions that we have. So this is clearly an issue. And you might think, oh, this is kind of a silly issue, Patrick, right? Well, guess what? We go back to the to this image of the top DeFi attack vectors by risk. Number two is reward manipulation. That exchange rate is getting updated incorrectly. So somebody could use that to their advantage. Luckily, it's upgradable, so we would have to rely on an owner to upgrade the contract, but this is an issue. This is a severe disruption of the contract functionality. This is a high. Now, for the rest of section six here, we are going to be writing our proof of codes and our findings as we find them. But again, a lot of the times you're going to do this at the end. I just want to drill some of these findings into right now because the next couple of findings are really interesting and they all involve pretty common attack vectors that I really want you to dial in because you are going to find them in the wild and you should get really good at spotting them. So let's do the write up for this unnecessary update exchange rate. So, of course, if you come back here, we scroll all the way to the top or we just hit that back to top button wherever it is. We can go to the finding layout, .md. let's go to raw, and then we can grab this, copy paste it into our, our folder here, new file, audit data, let's create a new file in here, finding layout, .md. paste it in, and we'll create a new file, findings, .md, where we'll start adding some of our findings. So this issue that we just found, definitely a high. This issue that we just found, Definitely a high. Why is it a high? Well, the impact is going to be high. Users funds are going to be locked and the likelihood is also going to be high. This is every time someone deposits. So this is clearly a high. We can leave the number off. You can add the number if you want, whatever you want to do. So let's practice writing a really good title here. What is the issue? We have an erroneous update exchange rate, which causes the protocol to think it's collected more fees than it has. And the impact is obviously going to be Blocking redemptions. Erroneous update exchange rate. Or we can do Thunder loan in the posit function causes protocol to think it has more fees than it really does, which blocks redemptions and incorrectly sets the exchange rate. So we just found one attack vector, right? The attack vector that we found was, hey, it blocks redemptions. But really, this root cause actually causes a lot of attack paths. And if a finding has the same root cause, there's a rule of thumb that that is one finding. 
So this blocks redemptions and it probably incorrectly sets the exchange rate, which we didn't go over, but it does, I promise, um, which we kind of went over, but we didn't really see the attack pack for it. That actually does add another attack path where users can be MEV'd and that actually adds a several other attack paths with reward manipulation being wrong. But again, they all have this same root cause. And usually if something has the same root cause, it's going to be one finding. So it wouldn't be like erroneous update exchange rate causes a blocks redemption and then like another finding erroneous exchange rate sets wrong rate and rewards are manipulated you know it's the same finding because it has the same root cause cool all right description in copy paste this in this now again i'm going to write this out you should pause the video try to write this out yourself fast forward me or follow along with me whatever you want to do the protocol in actually the deposit function actually no Actually, no. In the Thunder Loan system, the exchange rate is responsible for calculating the exchange rate between asset tokens and underlying tokens. In a way, it's responsible for keeping track of how many fees to give to liquidity providers. However, the deposit function updates this rate without collecting any fees. This update should be removed. Although that's kind of the recommended mitigation. So let's actually just get rid of that. Boom. And you already know, we're going to format this really nicely. We're going to go back to Thunder Loans. We're going to copy this function, paste it in here and get rid of all my comments. Boop, boop, boop. Maybe I'll leave the audit high. All right, impact. There are several impacts to this bug. The redeem function is blocked because protocol thinks the owed tokens, the redeem function is blocked because the owed tokens is more than it has. And then two rewards are incorrectly calculated, leading to users potentially getting way more or less than deserved. Instead of users, we'll put liquidity providers. Proof of concept, one, LP deposits, user takes out a flash loan, it is now impossible for LP to redeem. And then you already know, we're gonna do a little details, details, summary, proof of code. And again, this would go in a competitive audit, maybe less so a private audit, but what we're gonna do, we're just gonna copy our test here, paste it in, get rid of these comments, JavaScript. Cool, proof of code. Place the following into thunderloan test.t.sol. Recommended mitigation. Remove the incorrect updated exchange rate lines from deposit. Little diff bit. You already know because we've done this a couple times. We're going to grab these lines. Oh, we can just grab the whole thing. Why not? Paste it in here. Minus, minus. Perfect. Do a little preview. Formatting looks good. Proof of code. That looks good. What a beautiful, beautiful report. This could very potentially be the selected finding. Amazing. Well done. We've found our first high. Good job. Let's keep going because guess what? We got more questions. Hmm. All right. Now we're cooking though. We've got a high. We've got a bunch of questions left. We've got a POC. Let's keep going. You're going to see... And once you get one issue, sometimes you just start to snowball. So let's snowball here. Okay, next question. Does deleting a mapping work, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, we, we looked at that. <laughs> How is it calculating the fee? Okay, get calculated fee. We already found that there's like some weird issues with the fee being in the token, but let's, let's look past that. Is there another issue here with them using T-Swap as the protocol? Well, this is another one where just the more you do this, the better you get. Because the answer is there's a huge issue with them using the reserves of a DEX or an AMM as an issue. Because the thought is, if you can change the reserves in T-Swap, that would change the price ruining the protocol. Is there a way for this to break? And to learn the hack that is very obvious here, we got to learn about Oracle manipulation hacks. As you know, Price Oracle manipulation for the first half of 2023 was the number one attack vector. So we're gonna learn how this is done, how you can avoid it, 
and how to spot this unfortunately all too common issue in competitive audits, private audits, and in the wild. Let's learn about. So to do that, we're going to look into SC Exploits Minimized, SRC, scroll down to Oracle Manipulations, and all the images and diagrams we're going to be working with are in this Diagrams folder. So we're going to come back over to Excel and Draw, and we're actually going to move this bit down here. This is what we've been looking at for a real basic flash loan, right? Somebody calls flash loan, they get a price, they do some stuff, they execute some operation, and then they return the money. And we saw way up at the top when we were originally doing this, this is a great way to leverage an arbitrage opportunity on an exchange. Well, these flash loans can also be used to actually change the price of an asset. Let's go down here and let's think about how this actually can happen. So let's say over to the left here, we have a decentralized exchange, just one, not two. Let's say you have a decentralized exchange called T-Swap, right? <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. And in this T-Swap, you have kind of the classic pools thing going on, right? Let's move all this stuff over. Let's focus on this exchange for a bit. You have this T-Swap thing. And inside of T-Swap, you've got two pools, right? Let's say you got 100 USDC in here and then 10 WETH, right? So based off of this, we know, okay, if we look at the ratio 10 WETH to 100 USDC, we're basically saying one WETH equals 10 USDC, right? Because that's the ratio in here. So if I wanted to swap, do a swap on here, I would get approximately one WETH for 10 USC and then some slippage will happen and stuff. But that's the ratio right now. According to this TWAP exchange, the current price of one WETH is maybe around $10. However, what happens with our flash loan stuff? Well, back over here, we know we can take out a flash loan and do all this good stuff here, you know, Take a flash loan, give us a thousand USDC. We do some stuff, we pay the thousand USDC back. What if in this do stuff phase where we have the USDC, what if we call instead of do stuff, we call a swap function and we have a thousand USDC that we want to swap onto here and we swap it into this exchange. So this is now a hundred plus one thousand USDC. So this is going to be number is going to be way bigger. And we're probably going to take out most of, if not all of the WETH, right? Some slippage is going to happen. So this might end up being like 0.1 WETH. Now, during this flash loan, instead of it being one WETH is 10 USDC, it's like one WETH is like a ton of USDC, right? This number is not quite accurate. But if you look at the ratio, the ratio is going to be way different. It's going to be way bigger. Let me change the outline of this. The ratio is going to be way different because we just did this, this massive swap. Of course, you know, we can't just leave it in here because we need to pay it back. But what if, what if, just, just stay, stay with me here. What if some other protocol down here, we're going to call it protocol whoops because of what it's doing. It has some internal function that says maybe buy an NFT based on the price of USDC. And it's reading based off of the reserves of this protocol reads the price. When we do this flash loan for a small part of this transaction, the price is going to be totally screwed up. It's going to be totally wonky because we did this crazy flash loan. So maybe in protocol whoops here, it says one NFT equals 100 USDC or actually better yet, one NFT is 10 USDC. Now, normally 10 USDC is one WETH. Normally this is just one WETH. But now because we've totally screwed up the ratio, if it's one WETH equals this much USDC, previously, if this is the price, let's say the current DEX says one WETH equals 10 USDC, or maybe we could say true DEX, true DEX price, one WETH equals 10 USDC, then basically one NFT would equal 10 USDC, which is going to be, yeah, like we said, one WETH. But if we screw up the price for a hot minute and do this, now, what's the price of the NFT in terms of WETH? Previously, it was one WETH. Well, now we got to do some math here. Now, over here, one NFT is still 10 USDC. So if this is still 10 USDC, how much WETH does 10 USDC buy? Well, 10 USDC buys like almost no WETH because you need this much USDC to equal one WETH on this exchange. So one USDC is like nothing. It's like barely any WETH. So what I could do is I could then buy this this NFT for like, you know, one NFT equals like nothing for the WETH because this price is reading off of this. 
then sell the NFT for 10 USDC, repay the loan and make a profit from selling the NFT. I'm not making sense. So let's go over this again. Let's backspace any, everything. Let's go over this once more. Current DEX says one WETH equals 10 USDC. I call swap as part of my flash loan. I call flash loan. I get a thousand USDC. I call swap and bump up the reserves by 1000 in this decentralized exchange in this T swap. Boom, sending this number skyrocketing. And this number is so much smaller relatively. So now this is going to be way lower, maybe like 0 0.1. And this number is now way higher, maybe like 100 plus a thousand, maybe 100 plus a thousand USDC or something like that. Now the ratio is all messed up. So now maybe we'll say one WETH equals instead of 10. Let's say it's let's say it's a thousand USDC. Maybe let's do this one WETH. Yeah, let's let's make the math nicer. Let's say we only put 900 in here. So now it's 1000. One WETH equals 1000 USDC. We have another protocol which reads the price of T-Swap to mint slash buy an NFT. It's reading this. It's reading the price. The price right now says, hey, one WETH is $1,000. And it says, hey, NF for sale. And this protocol says NFTs for sale. One FT for 10 USDC for 10 USDC or whatever the equivalent in WETH is. Previously, that would be one whole WETH. Now it's reading the price and it's saying, oh, well, one WETH is worth a thousand USDC. So if if my price is 10 US dollars, then OK, let's pull out the calculator. 10 divided by a thousand, 0 0.01 WETH. Ah. Let me check T swap. It says 10 USDC equals 0 0.01 WETH. So you can have the NFT for 0 0.01 WETH. So you do this little swap arena thing. Then, and continue it as part of your, once you do your swap, then what you do is you continue this call and you go, okay, well, now I'm going to buy the NFT because I've totally destroyed the price. Then you continue this call. Maybe the, you then sell it sell nft for plus one weth and now you profited so then you go back and you undo all this stuff whoop we're gonna undo everything thank you for undoing everything we're gonna put these back to normal we're gonna unswap so now this goes back this goes back and sure maybe there's a fee here but you just made a profit from selling the nft you sell all this back and then you repay the flash loan what just happened you made money buying an NFT for cheap by manipulating the price of the NFT. So because our protocol here was reading the T-swap price as its pricing oracle, we were able to manipulate the reserves over here to screw the pricing of this NFT thing. So this is a bit of the high level. We're actually going to see this in process in our Thunder Loan contract. Because in the Thunder Loan contract, guess what we're doing? We're getting the price in WETH. We're using a T-Swap decentralized exchange as our pricing oracle. And this is terrible. We should not, we should never ever do this because flash loans allow us to actually manipulate. So somebody could use a flash loan from Thunder Loan to screw over Thunder Loan. Crazy. I know. Thunder Loan is screwing over itself. Now, if you want, you can go over to SC Exploits Minimize and grab all these contracts and pop them into Remix to test it and play with it yourself. Now, there is a lot of setup to do this. So instead, alternatively, you can just go to the Foundry testing section of this and see all the steps one would take to actually exploit this minimized example of Oracle manipulation. This is a really unfortunately common hack and should be 100% be an attack vector that you understand and is something that you look for in all protocols moving forward. So if you want to play with it more, head over to the repo. And if we're in the SC exploits minimize repo, we can scroll down. We can look at there's a couple of games that actually have this exploit in it. Dex2, Damn Vulnerable DeFi has a ton of these. There are a ton of these hacks. One of them in particular that's really interesting to look at is going to be the cream finance attack. It's happened back in 2021. But if we look down to where they explain the attack in rect.news, the hacker was able to take advantage of a pricing vulnerability by repeatedly lending and borrowing flash loaned funds across two addresses. And if you want to go over this attack in details, I highly recommend you check out the transactions. We're going to learn a little bit later how to do some blockchain sleuthing, how to go over these postmortems so that you can learn much easier how to 
how to learn from them, how to read about them, etc. But now it might be a great time. Pause the video, read about this hack and try to really understand, OK, how do these Oracle manipulation attacks happen? Because these are unfortunately all too common. So now that we've learned about Oracle manipulation attacks, we can go back to our code base. We see this line. We immediately know, hey, using Dex reserves as an Oracle is a horrible idea. We're going to bust up the reserves in T-Swap and we're going to break this and give us cheaper fees in this Thunderlone protocol. Now, to do this, I have actually given us two mocks. One is buff mock pool factory and one is buff mock T-Swap. These are kind of stripped down versions of the T-Swap protocol, making them a lot easier for us to work with. They also don't have any fees and they're just, they have a little easier API, so we don't have to do quite as much set. We're gonna be using one main function to do our swaps, this swap weth for pool tokens based off of input weth, just to make swapping a lot easier. And our pool factory is minimized as well. All it does is take weth as a constructor parameter. So we've stripped it down for this. It's essentially T-Swap. We got rid of the fees just so that the resulting exploit looks a little bit more dynamic, but you could keep it in, you know, whatever you want to do. Additionally, we have our ERC20 mock, of course. So to actually write this test, we're going to need to do a lot. And this is going to be a very advanced test. But the reason I want to do this and the reason you should do this with me and write this with me and try to figure this out with me is because it is advanced. When you see an exploit, a lot of hackers have massive amount of transactions combined to make a hack. So you need to get good at thinking about these types of hacks, thinking about these ways to approach protocols and how we can do even small things like reducing the fee on a flash loan. At the end of this, all of this work is just going to find a medium. In any case, it's an issue and you'll see why as we do this flash loan. So first, we're actually going to need a slightly different setup. Why? Because the mock pool factory and the mock T-swap pool that the protocol used are terrible. Look, this is all it does. Get price of one pool token in WETH. Is 1e18, right? They're not thinking about how the T-Swap pool factory can be attacked to break their protocol. And that's not good. So we're going to think about it for them. So function test Oracle. We're going to write a lot of code here. So first we need to set up contracts because we can't use what's in the base test because the base test uses the mock pool factory, which isn't as verbose as we need it to be. We need we want to use our buff one our buff mock pool factory. So, uh, and if you forked the main branch, this will be provided for you. So you don't have to go copy paste, but the protocol probably wouldn't have done this. This probably would have been a step that you would have needed to do, create your own little mock, but I'm being nice because this is going to be a huge test and I did it for you. So, all right. Thunder loan equals new thunder loan. We got to make a brand new thunder loan contract token. A equals new ERC 20 mock. And we already have weth in our base test. We can already use weth. That's fine. But we are going to use this new token that we have. We can use the same weth. We got to do a new proxy, just like in this base test, right? They have a new proxy. Boom. They use a proxy. We're going to do the same thing. Proxy equals new ERC one nine six seven proxy with an address of thunder loan comma da da. And we need to import this. Of course, from Open Zeppelin. Oh, whoops, I already did it. Import the proxy from at Open Zeppelin contracts proxy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, while you're up here, you want to import the buff mock pool factory and the buff mock T swap as well. And this iFlash loan receiver. So you want to import all of these. I already have because I was fiddling with the tests um, before I started filming. So import all those. Great. We're still setting up the contracts. Well, what else do we do in the base test? Aha, we got to initialize it, but we need a pool factory with a pool to do that first. So let's go ahead and let's say buff mock pool factory PF for pool factory equals new buff mock pool factor factory. And this is going to take the address of weth as its input parameter pool factory dot create pool buff mock pool factory. Do you return an address? Create pool returns an address. Yep, sure does. Okay. Address T swap pool equals PF dot create pool with the address of token. So what are we doing here? Create a T swap dex between weth and token A. Okay, we got a pool there. Now finally, thunder loan equals thunder loan address proxy 
So we're going to use that proxy address as the Thunder Loan contract. And now we can do Thunder Loan dot initialize address PF. All right, let's see how we're doing so far. Forge test dash 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 MT paste that in. Beautiful looking good so far. Okay, contracts haven't been set up next. We need to fund T swap. Actually, let me just give you the rundown of everything else we're going to do. We're going to fund T swap with some money. Then we're going to fund Thunder loan with some money. And then finally, number four, we are going to take out two flash loans for a is going to be to nuke the price of the West slash token a on T swap and then B to show that doing so greatly reduces the fees we pay on Thunder Loan. We found a way to chart, get way cheaper amounts of money out of the Thunder Loan protocol. So, okay, let's fund the T-Swap. BM does start prank. Liquidity provider. Token A.mint. Liquidity provider. We shouldn't do 118, but I want to do that. This is a magic number in our test, which is no good, but this is kind of a quick proof of code. So, okay, token A.approve. T swap pool for 100 E18. Let's also do weth.mint liquidity provider for 100 E18. Weth.approve address T swap pool for 100 E18. And now we want to deposit. So we'll do buff mock t swap t swap pool add li or excuse me dot deposit so what is this buff mock t swap function deposit what to deposit minimum liquidity to mint minimum pool tokens to deposit deadline okay so we're just going to deposit everything 100 e18 100 e18 100 e18 Deadline doesn't matter. Block dot timestamp. Cool. So now the ratio is going to be 100 WETH and 100 token A, meaning the price is one to one, or the ratio is one to one. One WETH equals one token A. And that's important because we're going to brick this price very soon using this flash loan. And then let's do VM dot stop prank. Next, we got to fund a Thunder loan. But before we do that, we need to actually allow set up token A on the protocol. So we'll do VM that's uh, prank thunder loan dot owner. So the owner of the thunder loan, thunder loan dot set allowed token, token A to true. Now token A is allowed on that. So now that we've set the allowed token, we can do VM dot start prank liquidity provider token A dot mint liquidity provider 100 E18 token a dot approve or actually let's do let's do a thousand token a dot approve address thunder loan comma 1000 e18 magic numbers are bad but i'm using them thunder loan dot deposit token a 1000 e18 vm dot stop prank set allow and then fund it so now there is 100 west and 100 token a in t swap mean the price is one to one and there's 1000 token a in thunder loan to be borrowed from we definitely don't need that much but no worries now we're going to nuke it we're going to make it get a much cheaper price and how we're going to do that is we're going to take out a flash loan of 50 token a swap it on the decks tanking the price because now the ratio will be like 150 token a to you know whatever with, you know, maybe it's like 70 or 80 or something. So we're going to ruin this ratio. And since the ratio will be ruined, this get price and with will return a wonky number, a fake number, because we've totally screwed with the reserves. And then finally, we're going to take out another flash loan of 50 token A, and we're going to see, and we'll see how much cheaper it is. And then we're going to prove that we can actually do all these flash loans. We can do multiple flash loans to get way cheaper flash loans. 
and basically screw over the liquidity providers because they're going to get way worse deals because people are basically circumventing the fees or just making the fees way cheaper. We're going to take out two flash loans to do this. This is going to be our, our biggest POC to date. Let's do this. All right. So first off, let's let's figure out what the normal. So we're going to take out two flash loans, two fifty dollar ones. So let's see what a, a regular one would be. Right. You and two fifty six normal fee cost equals thunder loan dot get calculated fee of token A and one hundred e eighteen console two dot log normal fee is comma normal fee cost. Let's even run this. Just so we can see the fee cost dash VVV. I think it's three V's for console logs to show up. It sure is. So this is the normal fee cost. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Zero point two nine is the normal fee cost. Great. Let's reduce this. Okay. UN 256 amount to borrow is going to be 50 E18. Why 50? Because we're going to do this twice. So do it two times. It'll equal this, but we're going to get way cheaper fees doing this. And now what we need to do is we need to make, if we look at the Thunder loan, when we call flash loan, where is it? We need to make a contract that will allow us to do this, to do this malicious stuff. It's going to need to swap it out on the decks, tanking the price of the token. And then it's also going to need to take out another flash loan so we can see how much cheaper it is. So we have to make a brand new contract. Let's do this. Contract malicious flash loan re and this needs to be is I flash loan receiver like this and we need this to do what we need it to take uh, we need to swap token a borrowed for with then we needed to take out another flash loan to show the difference. So in our constructor, we're probably going to need to know about a couple different addresses. We're going to need to know about the T swap pool address. We're probably going to need to know about the Thunder loan. Let's do this underscore so that we can pay it back so that we can actually take out the second flash loan. And then we're probably going to need to know about the address underscore repay address. So we know, OK, where do we send the money back to? So create some state variables. Thunder loan, Thunder loan, address repay address and mock buff t swap t swap pool great mock buff t swap oh excuse me buff mock other way around buff mock t swap t swap pool okay great so in here thank you github copilot t swap pool equals buff mock t swap t swap pool thunder loan equals thunder loan thunder loan repay address equals repay address and this is giving me an issue because it's saying, hey, you need to implement the I flash loan receiver, which we're going to copy this, bring it over here, paste it in. And this is the function that needs to do all of our stuff. It needs to do all this. Right? So let's do this. So it's got to do this twice. And execute operation is going to get called both times. So let's actually add like a Boolean in here called attacked. It'll get started off as false. And we'll say if not attacked then we're going to do all of our swap stuff we're going to do this swap stuff I mean, but if it is attacked we'll just you know calculate the fee and repay so this is going to be, do the bulk of our work and we don't care about the initiator so we're going to comment this out we also don't care about the call data params so we're going to comment those out as well so what are we going to do well in here let's keep track of how much this fee will cost because the combination of the fees of the 50 borrow and the 50 borrow that we can use to compare to the normal 100 borrow. So we're going to do uint 256 fee one and uint 256 fee two. So we're going to say fee one equals fee because when we call execute operation, it actually passes how much it's costing us as a parameter. So that's really good for us. That also helps us repay. We're going to say attacked now equals true because the next time we call flash loan, we want to just like not call flash loan again and now we're going to use the tokens that we flash loaned to dump onto the t swap exchange right so t swap or buff mock t swap we have this function swap with for pool token based off input with we're going to grab that well actually before we grab that we're going to need to get output amount based off of input we're going to need to figure out exactly how much it'll cost so input tokens input tokens output tokens so we're going to say 
U into 256. With bot equals was it T swap pool dot amount based on input. So since we're borrowing 50 token A, it's going to be 50 E18. Then we add the reserves in here. So we know we deposited 100 E18, 100 E18 to get that amount. We could have probably just say zero for this too, by the way. Uh, this is like the expected amount. But then we can do IRC20 token dot approve address T swap pool comma 50 E18. So all of the tokens that we're going to borrow. Oh, did we not? Did we not import IRC20? Oh, let's go ahead and import that. Import IRC20 from at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC20 slash IRC20 dot so that looks good. And then we can finally do the swap T swap pool dot swap pool token for with based on input pool token. We're just gonna say 50 E18. We're gonna do with bot and then just block dot timestamp. Great. And this will tank the price. Let me toggle the word rep. This is going to tank the price right here. So then now the next time we call it a flash loan, it's going to be way cheaper. So we're going to call a second flash loan. And remember, at some point, we're going to need to repay, right? We're going to need to repay all this at some point. So in here, we're going to do thunder loan dot flash loan again, right? And we should give the tokens to address this again. We're going to say I through 20, the same exact token the same exact amount of 50 again, and then no bytes. Once we call flash loan again, it's going to call execute operations again, but this time it'll be attacked. So it won't go here. It'll go here and we'll do some other stuff here. What's it mad at me about? Flash loan could not be found. That's because this is lowercase. Great. And then finally, we're going to repay, but we'll, we'll do that in a second. So flash loan, whoosh, it's calling flash loan again, which means it's going to call execute operations again. We've basically re-entered our own function. But now we can keep track of fee two. Fee two equals fee, and this should be much cheaper. So when we add them together, we will be able to see that we got a cheaper fee by nuking the price. And then, of course, here we need to repay as well. So in the Thunder Loan contract function repay, it has this repay function. Let's go ahead and try to use that. So to do that, we're going to say I year 20 token dot approve address thunder loan comma amount plus the fee. And because there is a fee, we are going to have to give ourselves mint ourselves a little bit of extra money um, to cover that fee. But we're going to see it's still way cheaper. And then we're going to call thunder loan repay token amount plus fee. And then let's do the same thing down here. IERC20 token amount fee. Nice. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. This isn't going to work. And you'll see why in a minute. Hoo -hoo -hoo. Returns bull. Oh, yeah. Return true. Great. So we have our attack contract. This looks pretty good to us. It's actually not quite done, but that's OK. We're going to fix it in a bit. So now that we have our attack contract, what we can do is let's create a new one of these malicious flash loan receiver. That's too many words. FLR equals new malicious flash loan receiver with the address T swap pool address of thunder loan address of the repayment, which is going to be, oh, I guess we're not even using that, but we will. So I'm just going to do it right now. Thunder loan dot get asset from token token a remember we repay to the asset token we're not using it right now but we will trust me now finally vm dot start prank user token a dot mint address flr we got to mint some tokens to cover the fee so maybe we'll just mint you know 50 e80 that's probably way too much we probably only need to mint one but you know, whatever thunder loan dot flash loan Callback address is going to be the address at FLR. We're going to flash loan token A amount to borrow, which is going to be 50. No data. And this line is going to call flash loan on the Thunder loan, 
which is going to call this, which is going to go back to this, which is going to do some stuff. And then we're going to take out a second flash loan, which is going to go back to this, which is going to call this, which is going to go back to this. But since we'll be attacked, it'll go down here and we'll repay everything and we'll get to see how much cheaper these fees actually are. Ah, VM desktop prank. And we'll get to say, you and 256 calculated or attack fee equals FLR dot fee one plus FLR dot fee two. Do we set these to public? Let's set these to public. Okay. Console dot log attack fee is comma attack fee. And then we'll assert the attack fee is less than the normal fee cost. Console2.log, excuse me. And I don't need user in there. Nice. Okay. So this isn't going to work, but it's almost right. <laughs> but let's give it a whirl. Forge test dash dash MT, paste this in here. Why is this not going to work? Oh my, what? Currently not flash loading. Dash one, two, three, four. What's the issue? Oh my goodness. We call repay in here, which if we go back to Thunder Loan, we can actually call repay. When we call repay in here and it sends the tokens back, this call up here finishes running and we set as currently flash loaning of the token to false. Oh my goodness. This actually could be a bug. This could be like audit low. You can't use repay to repay a flash loan inside another flash loan. If you call two flash loans on the same token, it'll up at the top. It'll do what? It'll set it to true. It'll set it to true again. You'll finish the call. You'll set it to false. The other one will come back and try to finish the call, but you try to repay and you can't because you're currently not flash loaning in reverts here. Oh, whoops. That's, that's not right. That's an issue. So wait, but if I can't repay, is there another way I can get the tokens in here? Am I just crap out of luck? Oh, wait a minute. I can just send the tokens directly to the contract. I don't even need to call the repay function. It's just checking the balance, right? It's not checking if this was called. Let me just do that instead. I don't even need to call repay. So in my test now, instead of me calling repay, psh, that doesn't even work because of the weirdness of that contract. And there's probably an issue there. What I can just do, IERC20, token dot transfer address repay address comma amount plus fee grab this whole line and do it down here moment of truth you ready oh it looks like we're a little short on cash on the repay here Maybe we got to get a bigger starting balance. I mean, this whole contract's all type of messed up. So yeah, let's give ourselves, yeah, let's give ourselves a bigger starting balance, huh? There, there might be some other weirdness going on. So let's just try 100. Now, moment of truth. Boom. Oh, and if we scroll up, oh, wow, that's some weird spacing. But 2141 is definitely less than 2961. So we found an issue. Now let's talk about the severity here. What's the impact? Well, the impact might be, you know, medium or even low, right? We're just, users are getting cheaper fees. So that's not really a big deal. I mean, the likelihood is gonna be high because they can pretty much always do this and they're always incentivized depending on how much gas it costs and et cetera to do this. Um, GitHub Copilot is saying this is a very simple attack. You just saw that it was not a very simple attack. So this might be a medium. It might be a high if we can figure out another way to maybe get free stuff, if we can tank the price even harder. But this this feels like a medium. And it's kind of a lot of work for a medium, but guess what? Sometimes that's the way it is. In fact, a lot of the times that's the way it is. If you're using this protocol and people are basically circumventing the whole fee thing, well, you kind of don't want to use this protocol. So this is definitely a medium. And in our findings.md, we 100% would report this. Now, I'm not gonna walk you through writing this because we just spent a lot of time writing the POC, but basically using T-Swap as a price oracle leads to price and oracle manipulation attacks. 
or you can be more specific and it probably would be better to be, to be more specific here leads to users getting much cheaper fees than expected and we've got an example where we kind of walk them through we kind of point to the code that's an issue and then the biggest thing i want you to know is the recommended mitigation if you ever see this in an audit if you ever see people using reserves as a pricing oracle that's usually a medium or a high or often even a crit we have seen this type of attack over and over and over again in web3 and here's your recommended mitigation Consider using a different price oracle mechanism, like a chain link price feed and then maybe a Uniswap TWAP fallback oracle. So Uniswap is a DEX, so we don't want to use reserves, obviously, from Uniswap as an oracle. Uh, but Uniswap does keep track of something called tick rates, where they have this thing called like a TWAP and it's flash loan resistant. But there's been a lot of talks about how even TWAP is very susceptible to a lot of these on-chain attacks. If you're going to be using pricing, you've got to use a decentralized price feed like chain link price feeds. So that's really just it. What a finding. And this was just a medium. This wasn't even a high. But this actually gave us some really good thoughts, right? It gave us some ideas. Oh, we don't need to call repay. We can just send the funds to the contracts other ways. And that actually works fine. Well, that's pretty interesting. Maybe we can go down that route and uh, find another bug by exploring that idea some more. But in any case, that was a very difficult to understand concept. We talked about a lot of things in there. We talked about price manipulation, manipulating DEX, DEXs, flash loans, Oracle manipulations. We talked about a lot of stuff in this section. So I do want to do a quick refresher over what we just learned because this was challenging and I know it was challenging. And even if you're not 100% understanding what's going on, that's okay because this is challenging. Do your best to understand this. Definitely at least understand in the SC exploits minimized definitely at least understand this because this is a much more minimalized example we have this oracle manipulation contract which allows people to buy nfts and you can manipulate the decks to get a much cheaper nft using flash loans so if you can at least understand how the oracle slash price manipulation in this sc exploits minimized works that's phenomenal if you want some extra practice there's a phenomenal ethernaut challenge as well as some damn vulnerable DeFi challenges, which are great as well. Oracle manipulation attacks are crazy, and there's a lot of them, and it's really, really unfortunate. So you should be able to know how they exist, and you should know that, you know, we used flash loans to do this, but oftentimes, if you just have a lot of money, you can do these attacks if the contracts are not built in a resistant way as well. So you might be thinking, oh, well, flash loans are clearly bad. It's the fact it's the flash loans fault. The flash loans actually allow just anybody to be a whale for a very short period of time. These issues exist even without flash loans, but just only the rich would be able to take advantage of them. And that's not fair. So if you don't understand this completely, that's OK. Come back to this Oracle slash price manipulation challenge in these examples and try to understand this and go through the foundry code because these are going to be really, really important for your security career. Anyways, let's do a quick refresher on all the things we learned in this because we learned a huge amount. Let's go all the way back to the top. Arbitrage is a thing and it's a thing where a flash loan might be useful, right? You see a price discrepancy on two different exchanges. You can either be a whale to buy on one and then sell on the other or you can use a flash loan. What is a flash loan? Well, it is a loan that lasts exactly one transaction, and it only works in the DeFi blockchain realm because you can encode, hey, if you didn't pay me back, revert everything that you've done. Often we have whales who deposit money into these protocols because these flash loans charge some type of fee. And because of those fees, they're incentivized to keep the money in those protocols. We went over an example where a flash loan can be useful to do this arbitrage so that even poor people can do these flash loans and engage in this arbitrage. And again, it levels the playing field of DeFi because in the Web2 world, these arbitrage opportunities exist, but it's usually only the rich and the already wealthy who can take advantage of it. DeFi levels the playing field and allows anybody to take advantage of these opportunities. We've gone through a much more thorough example of how these flash loans worked end to end. And then finally, we learned about how, oh, well, yeah, we can take advantage of arbitrage opportunities. But additionally, if a protocol looks at that DEX to get pricing information, we can actually tank or destroy the pricing on one of these DEXs to take advantage of them. In our test here, we did exactly that. We said, hmm, I wonder, can I take a flash loan out of Thunder Loans in order to reduce the cost 
reduce my fees on future flash loans? Can I do that? And the answer was absolutely yes. It sounds kind of crazy, but we took out a flash loan on Thunder Loans so that our future flash loans on Thunder Loans would be even cheaper. And that's not fair to the liquidity providers because they're the ones getting snuffed. To do this, after we funded everything and set everything up, all we really did was call thunderloan.flashloan, which went to the Thunder Loan contract. It went all the way through all this code here, finally calling receiveraddress.functioncall. And we had this malicious contract first get use the tokens it borrowed to actually swap on the exchange, tanking the price, changing the reserves from 100 and 100 to being 150 and like 70 or 80 or whatever it ended up being, destroying the price of one to one to now being like one to two almost. Now that the price is one to two, we call another flash loan, which goes back here, ends up calling back to us. And in this second one, we see that we get a drastically cheaper fee because we destroyed the ratio of reserves by taking out this flash loan. But then we repaid, and this is going to spark us with an idea, oh, we don't even have to call repay. Is there something else we can do with that? This was a really hard section. Now's a great time to go get some water, go get some coffee, go get some ice cream, and I'll see you in a few minutes. All right, welcome back. I'm going to tell you we have two more bugs that we're going to find. We will uncover them, and these bugs are juicy. These are big ones. One of them is still in Thunderloan, and the other one is in the Thunderloan upgraded, which we haven't gone over yet, but I promise you it's going to be real quick to go over that. So we're almost done with this section. Stay with me. I know this has been packed with information, and if a lot of this DeFi stuff is new to you, this was probably a hard section, but you're killing it. You're doing so well. We're almost there. These next two bugs are really cool though. So let's keep going. From doing our flash loan stuff, we got way better at doing flash loans, trying out exploits, etc. We did this thing where we just went ahead and sent tokens directly to the contract. So that was cool, but we don't even have to call repay. Hmm, that seems kind of like a nice little twist. So is there any other way we can get money into this contract other than repay and other than sending it that we could pull it out later? Are there any functions in here? So this is where I might do a little forge inspect Thunder Loan methods. And this will give us all of the methods that Thunder Loans has and their function signatures as well. Okay, and we can take a little look. Upgrade interface version, no. Posit, maybe. Flash loan, mm. a lot of these gets or whatever. Initialize is allowed, mm. Some proxy stuff, redeem. No, renounce, repay, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. What does deposit do again? Okay, so so deposit is the thing where the whales put their tokens in and then they can redeem them later. Well, what if instead of repaying, I just deposit the tokens? If I deposit them, that means I can redeem them later or I should be able to redeem them later. But the flash loan is just checking to see the balances. So if I just deposit them and I don't even repay them, will that work? Well, let's go try to write a proof of code for this. So back over here, I'm going to write a new one. Function test use deposit instead of repay. Uh, to steal funds. So, and then we are going to use some of these modifiers, set allowed tokens and has deposits. Set allows tokens has deposits. So let's try this out. So I'm, we're going to call a flash loan, but this time in our flash loan, we're instead of repaying, we're going to call deposit. We're going to try doing that. So we're, we're going to use another malicious flash loan contract. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it and we're going to we're going to minimize it though. So we're going to call this uh, we're going to call this instead. We're going to call this deposit over repay and we're going to leave Thunder Loan. We don't need a repay address because we're going to call deposit. We don't need T-swap pool. We don't need bull attack. We don't need fees or any of these comments. All we need is Thunder Loan. So let's get rid of all this. Get rid of all this. Bye. Goodbye. Looks good. Execute operations. We can just get rid of all this stuff here. Okay, cool. Return true. Okay, cool. So now in here, in our deposit over repay, we want to call deposit instead of repay. So we're going to get a whole bunch of tokens. And let's just do 
fundalone.deposit token amount. Uh, and let's do amount minus fee and then just do IERC20 token dot transfer thunderloan fee oh we don't even need the f oh no we can deposit the whole thing let's just do amount we should actually do amount plus fee deposit or transfer so all we need is the fee as our starting balance we should be able to steal all this right i here's your 20 token is that it yeah, that's a pretty simple attack vector right oh no we don't even need this we can just straight up call deposit let's just straight up call deposit for the whole amount so all we would need to do in our test here is we would need to do a little vm dot you know, let's do vm dot start prank user they would just need to start out with the fee so let's do un256 amount to borrow let's say this is just you know 50 e80 again let's see if we can steal all 50. un256 fee equals thunder loan dot get calculated fee token a amount to borrow and then this is the only starting amount that we need because we eventually need to deposit everything. So we probably will need some fee. So we can do token a dot mint user fee. And then what we can do, let's try thunder loan dot flash loan. We need to, de we need to deploy this deposit over pay, uh, deposit over repay door equals deposit over repay with the address of the thunder loan and let's do thunder loan dot flash loan address of door is going to be the receiver address what else needs to go in here function flash loan token amount params so the token is going to be token token a amount to borrow and the params are going to be blank nothing so this should call oh, what do we do wrong here lowercase whoops so this should call eventually call our execute operation where all we do is deposit the amount plus the fee up oh, so let's actually not mint the user let's mint the dor this because they need that extra fee and then what we should be able to do once it's deposited we should just be able to pull the money right back out right so maybe we do another function redeem money uh let's see thunderloan.deposit this re does this return amount no we should probably also actually get the asset token asset token so we'll do thunder loan right here then we can do say asset token equals thunder loan dot get asset from token oh let's actually do this down here boom let's do it in here asset token equals thunder loan dot get asset from token token now we get the token uh irc20 token and then to redeem money, we can just say unit256 amount equals asset token dot balance of address this. And we can say thunder loan dot redeem address. Let's see, where is the, how does the redeem function work? Function redeem. It's going to be the token and the amount of the asset token. So actually, we got, we want to do IRC20 token. Uh, let's do s underscore token. No, it's kind of more confusing. In here, we'll do token s token equals token asset token dot balance of address this, and then we'll do address s token comma amount. So we should be able to call redeem. Oh no, this is not right. And this is going to be irc twenty token. Okay, cool. So this will give us the token. If we call redeem money after doing a flash loan, we should be able to do dor dot redeem money. And then finally, we can assert equals. Actually, let's do a vm dot stop prank. The token a dot balance of address dor is going to be 50 e18 plus the fee, right? We just take everything back out. Oops, I forgot to do new here. My bad. All right, let's see if this works. Test this. The exchange rate deposit over repay. I forgot to do some approvals. Whoops. Token A dot approve. Address Thunder Loan amount plus fee. Oh, excuse me. This is just token. Let's try this again. 
Uh, whoops, this is an IERC20. Let's run this. Aha, okay, good. We're getting closer. Assertion failed. What did I assert? Whoa, left, right. Did I do some type of assert? Assert the balance of token ADA balance is that plus fee. So we're saying the balance is actually higher. So we can do assert, just straight up assert. The money that we stole is actually greater than the amount plus the fee. Oh my goodness, because we updated the exchange rate by calling out a flash loan. And oh my goodness, we found a way to steal all the money. So this is clearly a high. All a user has to do is just call a flash loan, deposit it, instead of repaying it, and then they can just steal all the money from the whales and the liquidity providers. This is clearly a high. We found this bug much easier than we found the last bug. And that will happen sometimes. Sometimes highs are easier than mediums. Sometimes lows are harder than highs. Bugs come in all different shapes and sizes. I'm not going to walk you through writing the finding. You can, of course, go to the Git repo associated with this course, go to the audit data branch, and actually find the write-up that I did. But I challenge you to pause the video and do your own write-up for this and then compare it to mine to see how yours fared. And because mostly we wrote the proof of code, which is the more important part, especially for a competitive audit, we've proved that this really is an issue. Bang on. Awesome. Okay. So we've answered most of our questions. Like we've always said, we can always spend more time fiddling and playing with this. There might be something weird with the decimals, but like I said, we're just going to ignore that for this course. There might be some more missing events. We might not be super gas efficient. There's, you can always look at one more line of code, but we're going to move on. If we're going back to the spreadsheet, we've looked at Thunder Loan and we're feeling pretty good about it. Now we want to look at Thunder Loan upgraded because the protocol said, hey, we want to upgrade at some point. Now we could walk through this line by line and do exactly what we did. We could 100% do that, or we could do a diff just to get started. So diff is a command that comes with most Unix based systems, and it allows you to see the difference between two files. And this is really good for seeing the difference between a protocol that's going to upgrade. Uh, you could also look at like a PR. That's a great way to see a diff as well. There's tons of different ways to do diffs. For us, we could just do diff dot slash SRC thunder loan SRC protocol thunderloan.sol and dot slash src protocol or excuse me upgraded protocol thunderloan upgraded dot sol and see all the diffs in this kind of horribly put output and oh my goodness all of our comments are in here which is really annoying so let's see we're on git branch so i'm on a special branch that i call demo if you do not have one you can do git checkout dash b demo it'll create a new branch for you you can verify it by running git branch. Then you can add all your comments. If we do a little git status, we can see all this stuff. We do git add period, git status. Sorry, I already did git add, which is why these were all green already. Uh, and we can do git commit minus m added comments and stuff. Clear git status. Great. Now we can do git checkout main, git status, git branch, and I'm on the main branch. And yeah, we, we did some, there's some some wacko stuff in here. It's not really a big deal for us uh, because we're back on the main branch. We can do a little git pull just to make sure we're the most up to date. Great. Now we can do diff dot slash SRC protocol, thunderloan.sol, SRC, upgraded protocol, thunderloan upgraded.sol. And we can see this is the entire diff. So this might be hard to look at. There's a ton of different ways to make this a lot easier to look at. One of them would be just, all right, I'm just going to put this into a PR and view it on GitHub, or you can suffer through this as well, whatever you want to do. If we have a caret that points to the left, we say this line is in the file on the left. And if you have a caret to the right, we're saying this is what it looks like on the right. So they're both importing asset token, but on Thunderloan upgraded, it's doing dot dot protocol instead of dot slash asset token. So so we can actually kind of quickly go through this and find all of the changes. Okay, this looks fine. Okay, those two lines look fine. Okay, these two lines. Contract Thunderload upgraded. Okay, it's just changing the name. That looks fine. Oh, fee precision changes from a storage variable to a constant. Oh, that was one of our findings. Oh, great. Okay, cool. That's great. Oh, there's this fee precision getting set. Okay, that doesn't exist anymore in the upgraded version. Okay, cool. 
Uh, and then, okay, later on in the code, they're swapping out SV precision for fee precision. Okay, they're doing that again. They're doing that again. And they add a getter. Oh, okay. This is this is really cool. So let's let's go to this Thunder Loan upgraded contract. And it looks like that's kind of the big difference here. All they're doing is, you know, they're really just adding this fee precision as a constant. That looks good to me. We, I think, versus kind of in this Thunder Loan, right? If we scroll down. Ah, okay. Yeah, right. That's that's all that's the only difference that they're making. It's really just this line and going it throughout the code. Cool. So this looks good and we're done. But are we done? Remember, this is an upgradable contract. Are we done? What do you think? You think we're done? You think there's an issue here? Or anything weird here? Anything you know about storage that might be tipping you off here? Well, guess what? This is an attack. And this is one of these attacks that you just doing this long enough, you will figure out and you will run into. This is a storage collision attack. This is a storage collision issue. Let's pull up our terminal. If we do forge inspect thunder loan storage, we can actually get a storage layout of the entire contract, which is really cool. It's fantastic that Foundry gives us this tool so we can actually see the storage layout. It's got a whole bunch of stuff in here, but if we go to the top, we can see, okay, where each variable is set. Okay, S pool factory slot zero. Cool. S token to asset token slot one, and it's a mapping. So there's some other stuff that goes on. Cool. S fee precision slot two, S flash loan fee slot three, currently flash loaning slot four. And then there's some other mapping stuff. Okay, great. What if we do forge inspect thunder loan upgraded storage? Okay. If we scroll to the top, it's got fewer storage slots because it turns something into a constant, but pool factory. Zero. S token to asset token. One. Great. S flash loan fee two. What was it up here? Uh, what was it in the regular one? S flash loan fee three. Oh my goodness. They swapped the storage spots. You can't just do this. Oh no. Fee precision is a constant variable. So it's not going to have a storage slot. In doing this, you're basically just bumping up this flash loan fee up to here. You know what? It would have been even scarier if they just did this because it might have been even harder to spot, but they flipped it and they made it a little bit easier to spot. If they do this upgrade, they're going to screw up storage. And this is a storage collision issue. So to really understand this, we're going to do a quick refresher on storage, but if you already know storage, then feel free to skip this part. And you can find this in the SC Exploits Minimize as well. Boom. How does storage work? Well, storage works like this. If you have a variable, like so, it gets put into this giant, essentially, array called storage. And it works chronologically. So if you have a variable, u in 256, favorite number, it gets put into storage slot zero. Makes sense. Well, if you have a second variable, like a Boolean sum value, guess what? That's the second variable. It gets put into storage slot one. Now there's some fun stuff Solidity does with like packing variables, but don't worry about that for now. Cool. That makes sense. No worries. Well, what about mappings and arrays? Arrays and mappings are kind of weird. <laughs> An array will go, the array length will go into storage slot two, and the array elements will go into some hash of the storage slot that the array length is in. But cool. So that's going to go into the next storage slot. Okay. Well, what else? Constant variables do not go in storage. They're stored directly in the bytecode. They don't have a storage slot. We don't need to care about constants when we're dealing with storage. Variables that are initialized in functions are also don't have storage slots. Why? Well, because these are just memory variables, right? They only exist for the duration of the function call. So they do not get a storage slot. Now, if we upgrade our contract to have different variables, what happens to the storage slots. Well, the order of the variables will get mapped to the order that they should be in storage. So we have favorite numbers still being mapped to zero. Some bool used to be mapped to storage slot one, but now it's mapped to storage slot two. So whatever was in there previously is now mapped to some new number. So we've just totally messed up storage by upgrading our contract to some new nonsense. Let's walk through an example, shall we? And again, this graphic is going to be in the SC exploits minimized if you would like to have it later. So in a regular proxy interaction, 
like let's say this is our implementation contract. When a user calls set value, it goes to the proxy, the proxy contract. The proxy looks at the implementation contract, which does this stuff. And this contract says, okay, set value to whatever new value is and in storage slot zero. That logic is sent to the proxy and inside the proxy, the proxy storage goes, okay, now at storage slot zero is going to be that value five, if we call it set value for five. So this is the normal logic implementation. If we scroll down, okay, what does an upgrade look like? Okay, well, when we do an upgrade, the proxy used to be pointing to A, but now it points to logic of B. However, storage on the proxy doesn't change, right? It just points to this new contract address for its logic. So if we do an upgrade and the logical upgrade has messed up the storage slots, if when we scroll down here, when we do this upgraded logic interaction, let me copy paste this down here so it can make a little bit more sense. A user, once again, is going to call, you know, maybe set value of 10. They're going to go to the proxy. The proxy is going to go to the implementation B, this new contract. They say, okay, set value, new value, value equals new value plus two. Okay, value is in storage slot one because bool public initialized is in storage slot zero. And now our storage looks like this at storage slot zero is still the five, but at storage slot one is going to be the 10 because we just messed up our storage slots. So this can break a lot of things. We can override storage slots. We can put storage slots in places that they're not supposed to be. Stuff can be uninitialized. This can cause all types of issues. Let's dial this in. Let's dial this in with a remix example. So scroll down in here. We're going to scroll down to storage collision. We're going to open this up in remix. Now that we've seen the drawing, we now have this storage collision proxy is proxy. All it really does is call set implementation. It's got this implementation function, which like whatever you can kind of ignore. But then we have these helper functions to help read the actual data, right? We have this function read storage, which reads the value at its storage slot. Instead of reading the value, it's like, hey, what's at the storage slot? So below we have two implementations, implementation A and implementation B, exactly as we showed in the diagram. Implementation A has value at storage slot zero. And in implementation B, it has initialized at storage slot. Initialized usually defaults to false. But if there's something in the value area, initialized will be true. And maybe that's a huge issue. So let's compile these. We're going to go ahead and we're going to deploy implementation A. We're going to deploy implementation B. We're going to deploy storage collision proxy. And this one, we're going to grab the contract address for implementation a we're going to call set implementation with implementation a boom so now storage collision proxy is currently pointing to implementation a now what i can do to interact with this on remix i can copy that proxy address i can go up here to implementation a i can say let's work with implementation a at the proxy address boom and now i have this if i hit value value zero because it's blank obviously if i put 15 in here Set value, value is now 15. But I'm calling through the proxy because that's how we've set it up. Now, since this value is at storage slot zero, it's set to being 15, anything other than zero in solidity is considered to be true. So this bool public initialize should default to the Boolean default, which is false. But if we do this upgrade, initialize will, will default to true. And we'll see now we'll grab the address of implementation B. We'll go to our storage collision proxy. We'll change the implementation address. Now, if we go to implementation here and I click value, wait, what the heck? I got zero. Well, we did an upgrade, so I guess that makes sense. But what I can do, same thing. We're going to do implementation B at the proxy address. That address. Now, if I call initialized, it should have defaulted to false, but it's actually true. Because if we go up to the proxy again, if we go to read storage at zero, it's currently 15 at zero. And initialized is pointing to storage slot zero, and 15 is not zero, so it's going to return true. Storage slot one obviously is going to be blank. Now, if I go down here, I set value to one, two, three, set value. Now it's storage slot one is going to be or one, two, five. 
So this is a collision issue. And guess what? Our Thunder Loan upgraded is running smack dab into it. Now let's practice writing a proof of code for this because the proof of code for this really easy to write. So test unit Thunder Loan test.c.sol. We go right to the bottom function test upgrade breaks public. You went 256. Let's get the fee before upgrade equals thunder loan dot get fee vm dot start prank. We got to be the thunder loan dot owner thunder loan upgraded upgraded equals new thunder loan upgraded. So we got to deploy the new logic address. Oh, we got to import that as well. So up at the top import thunder loan upgraded from dot dot slash dot dot slash src slash up rated protocol slash thunder loan upgraded dot soul. Okay. Now we have this upgraded bit and we do thunder loan dot upgrade to and call. We're going to upload upgrade this proxy to the address upgraded with no data to call. And then we're going to do unit 56 fee after upgrade equals thunder loan dot get fee vm dot stop prank console two dot log fee before comma fee before copy paste fee after after upgrade we got to import console two console two and then we can do assert fee before upgrade does not equal to fee after upgrade. So we get a storage collision. Fees are now out of whack. This is no good. So test upgrade breaks. Let's run this. Forge test dash dash MT paste dash one, two, four. Four is too many. I should have only done three. Oh, well. Aha. Fee before was this. Fee after was completely different. Oh, my God. That fee is so big. It's because our storage slots are all janked up and everything's messed up. So this is no good. This is clearly wrong. This is clearly high. We've found another high. So this is actually going to be the last finding that we write up. So let's go ahead. I'm going to walk through doing this write up with you. Let's open back up our Thunder Loan test actually and let's copy this. We'll go back to our branch. Clear. Get to check out demo. Get. I'm going to stash them, but you should probably commit them. Get check out demo. My branch here, I'm going to paste, I'm going to paste our POC in here. We just need to import the Thunder load upgraded. Import Thunder load upgraded from dot dot slash dot dot slash SRC slash protocol upgraded slash Thunder loan upgraded. That's all upgraded protocol, not protocol upgraded. That looks good. Let's run this, this test that we just added again. Just to make sure it works. Forge test dash dash mt paste. Wonderful. So since this is our last little little write up, let's walk through it together and let's make this a banger. So in our findings.md, paste this in. What is the impact? What is the likelihood? Impact of this is going to be high. Fees are going to be all janked up for the upgrade slash storage collision is real bad. Likelihood actually might just be medium or low. So one could argue this is a medium instead of a high, but I'm going to leave it a high because this needs to happen only if the protocol upgrades. However, they did say they wanted to do an upgrade and they are planning on doing an upgrade. So likelihood might actually be high, right? Because they said, hey, like we're going to do an upgrade. So I think this makes it a high. So high number, whatever. What is the root cause of this? Well, the root cause is going to be mixing up variable location causes storage collisions in thunder loan score flash loan fee and thunder loan score currently flash loaning. Oh, and, and actually that the other thing is in thunder loan uh, it's actually going to mess with currently flash loaning as well. And that could be a probably even bigger issue because if, if a token is considered to be true currently flash loaning and you can't repay it that's a really big issue so actually this is like super high this is going to break the whole protocol um because those are mixing up the storage locations 
mixing up variable locations cause storage collision in this. And we might even give like the direct impact saying freezing protocol and we could just say freezing protocol, right? A lot of issues here. So thunderloan.soul has two variables in the following order. Let's go to thunderloan, go all the way to the top, come on down in here. Let's grab these, paste it in here. We'll get rid of these comments, JavaScript. However, the upgraded contract, thunderloan upgraded.soul, has them in a different order. JavaScript, thunderloan upgraded, boom, that. Due to how Solidity works after the upgrade, the S underscore flash loan fee will have the value of S underscore fee precision. You cannot adjust the position of storage variables or take um, storage variables and introducing and removing storage variables for constant variables breaks the storage locations as well. Impact. After the upgrade, the S underscore flash loan fee will have the value of S underscore fee precision. This means that users who take out flash loans right after an upgrade will be charged the wrong fee. More importantly, the S underscore currently flash loaning mapping will start in the wrong storage slot. We'll start in the wrong storage slot and we could get some storage collisions there, which would be really funny. Proof of concept, you already know. Details, backslash details. This is more of a competitive audits proof of concept. Summary, summary, POC. Go to our test now. We'll first grab this import line. Boom. Paste that in here. JavaScript dot dot dot. Then we'll go down to the test. Grab this. Paste it in here. Boom. Place the following into under loan test dot t dot soul. And then we might also say like, you know, one upgrade, you know, do upgrade, blah, 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 whatever. It's usually good to have some text in the proof of concept as well. I'm going to skip over it for now. Recommendations. And then maybe I'll say something like this. Hey, you can also see the storage layout difference by running forge inspect thunder loan storage and forge inspect thunder load upgraded storage. Recommended mitigation. In here, I might say, if you must remove the storage variable, Leave it as blank as to not mess up the storage slots. Do a little diff here and it will grab these two lines. Oh, actually we want to look at the Thunder Loan upgraded. Let's grab these two lines, paste it in here. Minus, minus, this should be plus, plus, S underscore blank. Then we can have the flash loan fee and then the fee precision, boom. So we just learned a lot about storage. We learned a lot about proxies that can get screwed over. And unfortunately, these upgrades happen all too often. We also learned that just having these proxies introduces centralization as well. Proxies introduce a lot of issues and these issues are complex and they're difficult. So a lot of people think proxies are bad news bears. If you think proxies are bad news bears, or if you think they're great, you should tweet about it. Let the community know what you think, because this is an ongoing conversation, what people think about proxies. But all right, with that being said, the next step, the next stage of this, of course, is to do the reporting. So I'm not going to walk you through the reporting because there's a ton of issues we need to clean up. There's a ton of issues we need to make look nice. But once again, of course, if you come to the audit data branch, of the Git repo associated with this lesson, go into the audit data. There is a readme in here, which you can follow along with to build your own audit report using Pandoc, which we've shown you before. So you can get a lovely looking PDF that looks something like this. You can even change your logo, you can change your name, all this stuff. You can add your own findings. You can add more findings, less findings, whatever you want to do. But I do challenge you so like I said, actually do this, actually write up your report, because like I said, then you come back over to your profile, 
go to your security portfolio. You can add another badass security review or audit to your portfolio. We found a lot of bugs. This Thunder Loans code base was on the Codehawks first flights. It's in the middle of judging period as I'm filming right now. And as you're going along with this, because you're learning so much so well, now is a great time for you to sign up for first flights and start doing them. Because guess what? If you understood everything that happened in this, you're freaking ready to do some of these first flights. Now, there's a bunch of stuff you still got to learn. The boss bridges, we're going to go over some real advanced signature stuff, but the code base itself is actually going to be a lot easier. And then, of course, after doing that, you must sign up for code hawks and actually start doing some competitive audits because you will learn so much so fast. We've got a lot more to go. But section six was hard. This was not easy. There's a lot of stuff in here. There's DeFi. There's advanced hacks. There's all this stuff. I want to give you a congrats for getting this far. Amazing job. But before I let you off the hook for section six, let's do a quick refresher of everything we've learned so far just to really dial it in. So section six was this Thunder Loan audit. So first off, we learned a ton of stuff, right? We learned that this was a borrowing and lending protocol, specifically with this thing called flash loans. What the heck are flash loans? Well, flash loans are ways to borrow a ton of money from a flash loan protocol for exactly one transaction. One popular method that flash loans are used for is to exploit arbitrage opportunities. And they're a phenomenal DeFi primitive because they turn anybody into a whale. Normally, these opportunities are only available for whales, but with flash loans, they're available for everybody. We learned that it's really good for us as security researchers to know about top protocols like Aave, like Compound, because having that knowledge is going to allow us to get context so much quicker. It's going to allow us to get context for future projects so much quicker because we can compare and we go, oh, this is how... Ave does this, and this is how you do it a little bit differently, and here's some of the risks associated with that, et cetera. We learned that using a AMM or a DEX as a pricing oracle is a horrible idea. Do not do that. We want to use a decentralized price feed, something like a chain link price feed. We learned about how proxies actually can cause centralization and how they can cause storage collisions if you do them wrong. And they're big issues. We learned about UUPS in particular. We didn't deal too much with the transparent pro proxy or the multi-faucet proxy. Those might be things that you should look for. Now on here, I had this thing called malicious scope, which we didn't talk about. I'll talk about it real quickly. Sometimes a protocol is going to come to you and they're going to say, hey, can you audit this code base? By the way, don't audit this part. And the part that they tell you not to audit is going to be the part where they have a rug pull. Try your best to sniff that out. If all the products you do security reviews or audits on end up rug pulling, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You look bad. So try your best to sniff out malicious actors in this space. And at the very least, when you smell centralization, be sure to put that on your audit report so that at least the people who read it will say, ah, there's rug pull potential here. I'm not going to ape into this. So we learned about some tooling. We didn't talk about too much, but we learned about Upgrade Hub. There's a lot of products out there that actually do silent upgrades and do silent centralized garbage, and it's really bad for the ecosystem. <laughs> so if you want to call out projects for silently upgrading or doing, doing malicious upgrades, you can use Upgrade Hub to see exactly how often protocols have upgraded. We learned about some crazy, amazing exploits, such as failure to initialize with the infamous, I accidentally killed it. You want to make sure you initialize your contracts and you want to make sure the protocols who have initializations have some way to make sure that they're initialized. We learned about storage collisions and we actually got to see a whole bunch of really cool ways storage collisions work. Once again, both failure to initialize and storage collision are in SC exploits minimized. We learned about centralization, especially with the Oasis case study. In my opinion, one of the most important case studies in all of Web3. A VC lost a lot of money due to a hack. They went to the government. Government forced the protocol to upgrade and give them money. Well, guess what? That protocol wasn't really sufficiently decentralized. We didn't really talk about missing events. We've kind of talked about that already with a Darren. Anytime you do something to a storage slot, you should emit an event. It helps for a ton of reasons, such as indexers dealing with it. If you want to do a social migration upgrade at some point, emit events. We learned about doing a bad upgrade, which was basically the storage collision. Hey, you can upgrade and it'd be really bad. And then probably the most important piece of this entire section was the Oracle and price manipulation. Here, it only ended up being a medium. However, for a ton of, probably if not most of, 
Oracle manipulation attacks end up being some type of high. And there's case study after case study after case study of Oracle manipulation causing issues. Do not use an AMM as your pricing Oracle. You will get hacked. And then we didn't really talk about these design patterns. So we learned a ton here. And this section was probably confusing. Be sure to, and I know I've said this to you before, and I'm gonna say it again, scroll, go to this repo, go to discussions, and actually talk with other people about this. Also go to the Cypheron Discord as well, ask people about this, and there will probably be communication pieces on Cypheron Updraft. And be sure to sign up for Cypheron Updraft if you haven't already, because we're going to make this content so much more digestible on this website. So you've learned a lot here. Hopefully you've got another audit for your portfolio. Guess what? Now's a great time to take a break and go get some coffee because the next one we're going to do is Boss Bridge. And Boss Bridge is really cool. We're getting into signatures, intro to Yule, Decem intro to Yule and assembly. And this one's actually going to be a lot quicker and a lot easier than the last one that we just did. But this one has some really interesting exploits. We're getting more advanced now. So take that break. And then, of course, I want to say to you, congrats. That was a really hard lesson. Thunder Loans was really hard. There was a lot there. Just by getting this far, you are doing absolutely phenomenally. So huge congrats on getting this far. Give yourself a pat on the back. Go tweet about it. Get excited. Whatever you want to do. I like to go to the gym. Do something fun. But take a break. Because you're doing great. There's a lot of content here. Get some rest and come back. And we'll begin Section 7. All right, welcome back to section seven of the security and auditing EVM DeFi, where we're literally going to do at least five security reviews or audits. And then in part two, we're going to do a couple more. You just finished the Thunder Loan security review and or audit, and that was a banger. We're talking DeFi, we're talking flash loans, we're talking Oracle manipulation, we're talking a lot of the main attacks that actually happen in DeFi today. We'd cover price Oracle manipulation, we've covered reward manipulation, insufficient function access control, a whole bunch of logic errors, function parameter validation, misconfiguration, and reentrancy. We haven't really covered governance attacks, still in private keys, but there's actually a ton more attacks that happen, unfortunately. And we're going to go over them in section seven here. As always, let me give you a quick primer on what we're going to be talking about here and how this one is going to work. As usual, we have a code base, which we're going to be going over. It is the 7 boss bridge audit that we're going to be going over. This right now is actually on the CodeHox platform as a first flight. And if you like doing some of these security reviews to level up, which you should, more first flights are coming. And like we said 100 times, definitely at some point, if not now, definitely at the end of this, be sure to sign up for CodeHox and do a competitive audit on there, whether it's a first flight, whether it's a real one, whatever you want to do. So we have two branches in here, as usual, main and audit data with the answer key obviously being in audit data. And this is the project that we're going to be working with here. We're going to be going over EVM diff. We're going to be looking at different EVM chains. What are the difference? What's the difference between Arbitrum, Optimism, ZK Sync, Ethereum? Are these all the same? It doesn't matter. We're going to be talking about AI. We're going to be looking at Tenderly. We're going to be leveling up our tooling here. And then additionally, we're going to learn the Hans. This is a checklist-based approach for doing smart contract security reviews. We named it after Hans, the Cypher co-founder, because this is what he used to become the rank one competitive auditor in the world for the first half of 2023. And he used Solidit to get there. Going through this, understanding issues, understanding protocols, and he used a checklist methodology to actually get there. So we're going to be looking over his checklist towards the end of this. And at the moment in this course, we're working on releasing that checklist onto Solidit. It's not there yet, but at some point there will be a checklist on here where you can actually download the checklist, use your own checklist for going over security reviews. Hey, you always want to check for weird ERC-20s. You want to check for rounding errors. You want to check for this, for that, the other thing. It's really good to have a list of ideas. It's really good to have a checklist where you can kind of just go down and look for those ideas. We're going to be doing our classic steps, scoping, recon, vulnerability write-up, vulnerability identification, and reporting. We're going to look briefly into pre-compiles with a really fun case study from Polygon. 
we're going to look at how different chains actually have different opcodes and they don't support the same opcodes. And we're going to look at a case study on ZK Sync. We're going to look at a really crazy attack vector called signature replays, ERC20 contract approval, unlimited minting. And then we're going to talk about a lot of bridge hacks because 2022 was literally the year of the bridge hacks. And unfortunately, most of them actually had a really similar attack vector that we actually learned in our last one. Most of the bridge hacks that we saw were unfortunately right here. They were centralized and they were centralized and they lost their private keys and boom, they were exploited, which was really bad. However, some of them got exploited because of some really weird signature stuff. So we're going to learn about signatures. We're going to get a little bit lower level in here and this is going to be a badass platform. And there are some amazing exercises to do after this. Damn vulnerable DeFi. Obviously, since you're a security researcher, you want to research some attack and do a write up about it. And then there are these really cool historic attacks that have happened with signature replay, Merkle tree signature issues, Polygon double spend, Nomad bridge hack. There are some really cool issues that have come out of these kind of very difficult to spot mathematical or cryptographic issues. This is the code pace, same as normal. We're going to audit it. We're going to start with the scoping phase, which is going to go a lot faster this time. Then we're going to get into the actual security review. And as always, there might be more issues here than we actually cover. If you find some more, feel free to do a write up on it. So with that being said, let's start with our phase one, which is going to be scoping of the contract. So we're in our security course folder here. We're going to do a little git clone on the repo and we're going to open up seven boss bridge audits into its own new VS code. And by the way, this notes section in your security course folder should be filled with notes, should be filled with ideas, you know, checklist, where can I play with minimized attacks, et cetera. This should be filled with stuff. So let's get started with our scoping. We've downloaded the code. Let's understand what we're working with here. So we've got this SRC folder. It looks like we've got four bits in here. Let's open up this readme and figure out exactly what the scope is. So blah, blah, blah. Here's the about token compatibility, blah, 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 all this other stuff. Usage, blah, 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 blah. Okay, audit scope details. We have a commit hash. This might be a little bit different based off of when you watch this video. Uh, and we have the scope. So it's gonna be all the contracts in SRC. Okay, great. We have some compatibilities down here. So we have at least done some minimal onboarding. We're gonna skip over the onboarding for this video. Uh, assume that this is pr pretty good. But again, if you don't think this is pretty good in an actual security review, you would wanna reach out. You'd wanna ask them, hey, I need more information. I need more diagrams, et cetera. We are gonna be doing some diagrams in this as well. But for the most part, we're just gonna, we're gonna spend less time on this ramp up scoping period. So Silk version, okay, great. Chains to deploy to. Okay, these four, Contracts are going to go to Ethereum mainnet. And this is the first time where we're actually deploying something to ZK Sync era. We're deploying token factory dot soul. Okay, very interesting. And then finally, tokens are going to be this L1 token dot soul and copies with different names and initial supplies. So we have one single ERC20. So we just need to check to see what are the weird oddities of this ERC20. We've got a couple of different actors. We have a bridge owner. So this actually, there is gonna be a centralized issue here, of course. We can see some of their powers here, pause and unpause the bridge in the event of an emergency. This is known as the emergency stop design pattern, which is can be a really important, really good pattern, but obviously it adds a level of centrality. Signer, somebody who could send a token from L2 to L1. Vault, the contract owned by the bridge that holds the token users. Users can only call deposit token to L2. Known issues. We are aware the bridge is centralized and owned by a single user, AKA it is centralized, meaning on a competitive audit that would not count. We are missing some zero address checks input validation intentionally to save gas. Okay. We have magic numbers defined as literals that should be constants. Assume the deploy token will always correctly have an L1 token dot sole copy and not some weird ERC20. So, okay. So this protocol at least kind of knows their stuff. They're talking about weird ERC20s. They're clearly aware of, to some degree, security. They have make slither, make a Darren in here as well, which is awesome. They've got some forge test, blah, 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 tooling, etc. Let's see how their coverage looks. So they said to run make. This is going to install all of those wonderful libraries. Okay, cool. Let's run forge coverage. 
Okay, boss bridge. Uh, okay, I mean, at least it's green. It could be a little bit better, but we have some green here. Token factory is fully covered. So we're definitely a little bit low. Uh oh, vault is none. Oh, yikes. Uh, we're definitely a little bit low here, but this is probably one of the better coverages we've seen so far. And we can go take a quick peek in their contracts and their tests here. Uh, it looks like they just have unit tests probably. They don't have any fuzz tests, any fork tests. Ugh. Not great. It looks like they don't really understand their invariants. Ugh, not great. There's probably a ton of different ways we can attack this. Doing the invariant style approach would be fantastic here. Invariant testing is becoming basically a requirement for security at this point. And right now, if you kind of go down this route and you turn out to not be so good at manual review, you can always write stateful fuzzing test suites. That is something that projects will always need. And that is something that is hard and time consuming. So get good at that. Turn that into a service. All right, great. So we've done that. Is there anything else we want to do? Yep, let's go ahead. Let's run Solidity Metrics on this. We, we want to run at least our two tools kind of as part of this scoping bit. Yes, this kind of ekes into vulnerability, identification, and recon. But OK, complex. So this is actually much smaller than Thunderloan. 106 complexity score, 101 number of lines of code. There's actually a lot less code in here than Thunderloan, which is great to see. It's about half the size of Thunderloan, which is awesome. And what else? Anything else we need to know? Maybe there's some other stuff we want to know, but I mean, we have the README, we have the docs up here. Docs could always be a little bit more in depth, but for the most part, we're ready to go. We've scoped it out. We have the commit hash that we want to do. We've onboarded them. They've given us actors, roles, the scope. Looks like we can actually just start jumping in and get into some recon and get some context. So step one, as always, is to go ahead and read the documentation, but I'm feeling a little bit spicy. I feel like running my static analysis tools first. Like I said in the last bit, moving forward, we will already give you a make slither command and a make a Darren command as well. So we can just let's run both of those make slither because we should always be running Slither on these code bases as a bare minimum. Oh, yikes. Oh, there's a lot of issues in here. OK. <laughs> OK, um, let's check these out later. So <laughs> there's a lot of issues in here. And let's run make a Darren or a Darren dot. Let's get that report. Let's just see what we get in here. See kind of what we're working with. All right, we have this report done MD. All right, let's preview this. OK, we've got some medium issues centralized. It's centralized risk. OK, we know about that. Unsafe ERC-20 operations should not be used. For example, return values are not always meaningful. It is recommended to use Open Zeppelin's safe ERC-20 library. Hmm. So that's definitely something that we're going to check out. OK, some non-crits missing, some zero address checks. Yep, no worries. Functions not used internally could be marked external. OK, some gas updates. Constants should be defined, so they shouldn't use magic numbers. Events are not exactly right. OK, cool. So Darren's given us some nice feedback, and we're definitely going to copy paste all of that into the report. But let's actually do some recon now. So we could do the Tincho, where we could start from low to high. There's only four contracts in here, so I'm not even going to make a sheet. We 100% could do the Tincho here. But one thing you might want to do and this is something to write down is do the checklist method or the the Hans. So I'm going to make a dot notes dot MD. And like I said, if you actually go to the section seven, the GitHub repo associated with this course, now right underneath, we'll learn the Hans. We actually have this checklist link. And this brings us to this audit checklist repo, which has a massive repo of many of the different attacks, different links to solid it on where these attacks have actually been reported what they do etc and it is planned on being like i said hosted on solid it and now this might seem like an absolutely massive checklist and it is intentionally right now it's just hosted in json format it'll be hosted on solid it in a much nicer format but right now this is literally going to be the checklist that han used to become the number one competitive auditor in all of web3 and you see if we read this we start with the attacker's mindset and a general check items for main attack types and we start with some simple things. Hey, reentrancy attack. What does it do? What's the questions you can ask to make sure that it doesn't do this? Are there any state changes after interaction to an external contract? Every single function you want to ask this. We've got some remediation advice. 
We've got more descriptions. We've got references to the attacks. We've got tags, etc. Is there a view function that will turn a stale value during interactions, right? We've got all these reentrancy things. Denial of service, another attack that we've already learned about. Attacker overloads the system. What are some questions we can ask? Is the withdrawal pattern followed to prevent denial of service? Uh, of course, the withdrawal pattern should be followed. Is there a minimum transaction amount enforced? How does the protocol handle tokens with blacklisting functionality? Something we've learned about as well. We can keep going down. Griefing attacks, replay attacks. All of these questions we want to be asking about the protocol, we can go through this checklist, ask these questions to make sure we're following them. Like I said, for now, if you want to use this, you can go to the Cypheron GitHub audit checklist and go check out the JSON format. Like we said, we're going to make it a little bit nicer, host it on Solidit, and it's going to be awesome. Or you can take this, copy all the ideas that you like, and make your own checklist with it, whatever you want to do. We're going to be kind of following this checklist, but if you want to be super thorough with it, you would literally go through every single question on your checklist, on that checklist, and check to see if there's an issue. And then additionally, whenever you find a new issue that the questions didn't cover, you should add a question to your checklist. So this is going to be a living document. If you find a question that needs to be asked that isn't, make a pull request to hear them and say, hey, here's another question that we should ask when we're doing security reviews that we should add that we all as security researchers to add should add to our manual review checklist. Make sense? That's pretty much it. That's just the Hans. Literally, you do the exact same steps. But after you do a review of the code base, after you understand the code base, you start going down your checklist and checking things off, making sure the protocol is following the best practices. Great. That's the Hans checklist. Use it. It's amazing. And then maybe put your checklist in your notes or whatever you want to do. And we're going to run into some findings that would be very important for us to add to our checklist to make sure that we ask to make sure that we have. So let's get some context. Let's read the readme. Let's finally get into this. OK, Boss Bridge. This project presents a simple bridge mechanism to move our ERC20 tokens from L1 to an L2 we're building. The L2 part of the bridge is still under construction, so we don't include it here. In a nutshell, the bridge allows users to deposit tokens which are held into a secure vault on an L1. Successful deposit triggers an event that our four off-chain mechanism picks up, parses it, and mints the corresponding on L2. To ensure user safety, the first version of the bridge has a few security mechanisms in place. The owner of the bridge can pause operations in emergency situations. Because deposits are permissionless, there's a strict limit of tokens that can be deposited. Withdrawals must be approved by the bridge owner. We plan on launching L1 Boss Bridge on both Ethereum Mainnet and ZK Sync. Token compatibility for the moment, only L1 token.sol or copies will be used as tokens of the bridge. This means that all other ERC20s and their weirdness is considered out of scope. On withdrawals, the bridge operator is in charge of signing withdrawal requests submitted by users. These will be submitted on the L2 component of the bridge, not included here. Our service will validate the payload submitted by users, checking that the accounts submitting the withdrawal has first originated a successful deposit on the L1 part of the bridge. OK, um, a little bit confusing. This is where you would go to the protocol and maybe say, hey, can we get some diagrams? Or you would start going through the contract and start to make some diagrams yourself. And if you want to start making some diagrams, I encourage you to pause the video and to try to do some diagrams yourself first. So I've gone ahead and drawn a little diagram for you that I will put in the audit data section of the Git repo associated with this. But here's essentially a diagram of what's going on here. So on the left hand side of this dotted line over here, we have all these contracts on the L1. And on the right hand side, we have the contracts that are not built yet. They're not done. They're kind of imaginary right now that will eventually be on the L2. The L1 is the stuff that we're actually paying attention to. This is the stuff that we actually care about. We have this token factory .sol, and its only sole job is to deploy L1 tokens. So if we go to the token factory, we can see it's very minimal. Contract token factory, it's ownable. There's some mappings and stuff. It really just has one function, deploy token. Deploys a new ERC20 token contract. It takes as an input the contract bytecode, which isn't great. But in the known issues, if we scroll down to the bottom, we have assume the deploy token will always correctly have an L token, L1 token dot soul copy and not some weird ERC20. So technically, this could really deploy anything. We're going to assume that it correctly has the L1 token dot soul contract bytecode correctly. 
We still should put in the report. Hey, uh, did you know that you can actually deploy anything with that, which, uh, which isn't great, but we're not going to spend a lot of time here because this is in the known issues, right? This is part of the scope. Anything else is going to be out of scope. We're assuming this is an ERC 20. If there's some other issue in here with a valid ERC 20 L1 token put in here. Great. But that's all this is responsible for. And then the L1 token is, as you can see, a pretty minimal L1 token. It's got a max supply. It's called boss bridge token or BBT. Real, real minimal token. It doesn't do anything. Its job is to go back and forth between the L1 and the L2. The L1 being something like ETH, maybe the L2 being something like ZK Sync or something. Or maybe the L1 being ZK Sync and the L2 being Ethereum. It said that they're going to deploy this on Ethereum and ZK Sync. So cool. So this L1 stuff is going to be on both Ethereum and ZK Sync, even though it says L1 and ZK Sync is an L2, but it, it doesn't matter. Next, we have this main contract, the L1 boss bridge .soul. So this is kind of the main contract and what it is responsible for doing, it's responsible. So it has the pause and unpause. It has some centralized power there. But the main thing it does is it allows users to deposit tokens to L2 and then withdraw tokens from the L2 back to the L1. So we have this send to L1. If we look in the diagram, we can see, okay, this little red transaction deposit token to L2. The contracts are sent to this L1 vault.sol. And if we go to the vault.sol, we can see what this looks like. It's pretty minimal. It doesn't really do anything. All we have is approved to by some only owner. We're probably going to assume this is owned by the boss bridge and the boss bridge can call where to approve tokens to and from. But this vault is responsible for holding the L1 tokens. And whenever the boss bridge says, hey, it's time to send those tokens back, we send it back. So the vault locking and unlocking tokens allows us to send tokens from an L1 to an L2, if you will. What's really happening is let's say we send 10 tokens into the vault. You know, if we have 10 tokens in the L1, what really ends up happening is those 10 tokens on L1 get locked into the L1 vault.soul. They actually don't go over to this L2. On the L2, it has its own sort of fake L1 token that's locked in its own vault. And there's some watchful eye that's watching these deposits. This is going to be some centralized off-chain service that's watching these deposits. It says, oh, the 10 tokens has been deposited into L1 vault.sol. You're good to unlock those tokens here. And now they're unlocked and then people can use them on the L2. This is actually literally how most bridges work. You don't actually send tokens over on the L1. You just kind of lock them in a vault and L2 locks a fake kind of copy L2 version of the token for you to use. Or if you're using like a true L2, there's a bunch of cryptographic proofs that go along with it. but we're not going to get too in the weeds there. What then can happen is the 10 tokens on L2 can lock back into the L2 vault and these centralized units, right, which are known as the signers are going to be the ones to say, hey, you're good to go. You're good to unlock. And whoop, these tokens can come out and people can use them again. So this person is very important. So this is our signer. They are the ones, they are the ones making these transactions happen. They see, ah, someone's depositing to L2, someone's depositing to L1. I'm going to go ahead and unlock the tokens or relock them. So this is the centralized known issue with the protocol, but this is how it works. The token is free and out and about over here. It must be locked over here. Once a token on the L1 gets locked in the vault, it's, it's free to then frolic and play on the L2. Once you lock it back, the signer goes, oh, it's been locked back. You're now free to go back and do whatever you want to do. Make sense? Hope so, because that's the protocol in a nutshell. So cool. So we're getting some more context. Just by that, we have a better understanding of what this code base actually does. So we're going to go through this. We're going to use the Tincho again. We're going to start with the little ones and get bigger. And then at the end, we should 100% go through the checklist. All right, cool. So what is the smallest code base in here? Let's open up Solidity Metrics. Let's scroll down. Okay. The Smallest code base is going to be number seven, L1 token dot soul. Let's crack that bad Larry up and let's see what we can find. I find nothing. Um, this looks really standard to me. There doesn't seem to be any issues here. So we're minting whoever deploys this, you know, the initial supply times 10 decimals. We're pulling from Open Zeppelin. We're very familiar with Open Zeppelin. We've got a private constant initial supply. That seems great to me times 10 times decimals. Okay, so 
you know, maybe this is a magic number, but it's 10, so it's not a big deal. Let's look into there. Do they have a deploy? Uh, they don't really have a deploy. They have a token factory test, but uh, it doesn't really look like they have a whole lot of L1 token tests in here. Let's see. Import L1 token. Okay, so they do have some tests in here. Token, token to transfer. Okay, so this is the token that they use to transfer. And it looks like it's just deployed like a brand new token. I don't see any issues with this. It looks pretty fine. So I'm probably going to do like, okay, just to let me know later. Hey, you looked at this and it looks fine. Let's keep going. What's the next one? Okay, nine. Looks like nine's the next. L1 vault dot soul. Okay, if we go back to our little diagram, now that we've actually done a diagram, we know that this is responsible for holding the tokens so that they can frolic and play on the L1s or the L2s. Okay, let's go open that up. L1 vault dot soul. Yep, it's a little bit bigger, but it's not super big. Okay, L1 vault is ownable. Oh, we even have some NAT spec up here. Great. Author is boss bridge peeps. This contract is responsible for locking and unlocking tokens on the L1 or L2. It will approve the bridge to move money in and out of this contract. Its owners should be the bridge. Okay, this is really helpful. So we can start thinking, okay, is there a way we can make the owner not the bridge here, right? So maybe we, it looks like they don't have a deploy folder, which would definitely go in the report, by the way. Hey, like, how are you going to deploy this? You should have a, you should test your deploy methodology. That's like really bad practice. Um, but let's go into this. Let's see how they launch the vault. Vault equals token bridge dot vault. Token bridge. Okay, so we have this setup deploy bridge. Token bridge equals new boss bridge. Yep. Vault equals token bridge vault. Vault equals token. Oh, so the boss bridge actually deploys it. Oh, I'm kind of curious. Let's go into the L1 boss bridge. So vault. Okay. Oh, it's public immutable vault. Okay. And okay, right in the construct it's deployed. So there's probably no failure to initialize issues here because the L1 boss bridge is actually deploying this. Uh, so mm, no luck there finding issues. Its owner should be the bridge. Okay, well, the bridge deployed it in the constructor, set it itself as the owner. Okay, that looks fine. L1 bridge is ownable. I'm very familiar with ownable. I'm very familiar with IERC20. Constructor IERC20 token. It looks like each vault works with one bridge, right? So maybe, so I might put that into like a little notes file. Uh, little notes. I might say like each vault works with one token. That's good to know. The constructor looks pretty good. Ownable is going to be message.sender, which will be the boss bridge because it's what deploys this. And then this approve to function. Approve to. So this is approving some target and amount. Hmm, at first glance, this doesn't look like an issue because only the boss bridge can call this. Token.approve. Why, why do they have this? It's probably so that the bridge can move funds in and out of the vault, right? If we go back to this diagram, it's the bridge that's going to move funds in, in and out. So it's probably, this just probably approves the, the bridge. But I mean, my first question is, you know, why not just hard code the approval to only the bridge? Why are we giving approvals to potentially anybody? I don't, I don't love that. Now I'm thinking, okay, that might be a way to hack this. Let's, uh, let's come back to that question later. This contract looks pretty okay. No big deal. Great. What's uh, what's next? Solidity metrics. Okay, let's go in here. Vault looks okay. Token looks okay. All right, what's next? Token factory, complexity score of 23. Let's go into the token factory. Okay, title token factory allows the owner to deploy new ERC20 contracts. This contract will be deployed on both an L1 and L2. Okay, cool. So this is just a token factory. Deploy a new ERC20 contract. Pass it a symbol, the symbol of the new token, and the bytecode of the new token. So this is the bit where it said assume that this is going to be an L1 token bytecode. So this is kind of scary. Do they test this anywhere? Oh, that's right, they do. Okay, token factory test. Assume the test is correct. Type L1 token dot creation code. Okay, so that might be fine. I, I mean, this just makes me scared. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm still gonna put like a Q. Are you sure you want this out of scope? 
it seems like there could be better ways to do this. To be honest, even though they said, hey, it's it's out of scope in a competitive audit, yeah, sure. But in a private audit, I'm probably still saying, hey, you should really lock this down. I, I don't see a good reason to do this. I mean, it's, it's memory. It's not even call data. It's not that gas efficient. Maybe it would be better to, I don't know. It seems like there could be better ways to do this. And then if we look in here, we're using this assembly block. So this is the first time we've seen assembly in this entire course. And assembly in Solidity gives us lower level access to the EVM, not super low level because there is actually some abstraction in this thing, assembly or Yule. But what this assembly is, is yeah, it allows us to get much closer to doing EVM opcodes that might be a little bit unsafe. So in here, it looks like we're just using the create opcode, right? or the create Yule. And if you go to the Solidity docs, we can actually do a search for Yule in here and we can find all of the Yule stuff. Let's do a look for create, create. Okay, cool. And we can see what create actually does. It takes, it takes a VPN. If we scroll up to the top, we can see what these columns are. We have instruction, something, something explanation. Create, creates new contract with code mem p dot 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 p plus n and sends v way and return the new address return zero if error so and sends v way so what is so what are we doing here creates so zero value we're adding contract bytecode 0x20 to mload the contract bytecode so we're not going to get too deep into this but basically where this bit is saying the bytecode is x large based off the contract bytecode that is sent in and we're going to load the contract bytecode into memory and then create a contract. So a lot of the times in Solidity, in the EVM, pretty much anytime you do something with deploying contracts or variables or, or really reading a lot of things, you have to load it into memory first. And you have to say how much memory to load from, how much mo memory to load to, how much memory to save from. You got to be very specific. So we're saying we're getting very specific with how big it is and then we're loading it in we're not going to spend too much time on this on this lesson, but we are going to go deeper once we get to horse store and math masters. We're going to spend a lot more time when we get there. But we have our first chunk of assembly and it returns an address. So it does return this, this create opcode, this create Yule code it does return an address. So we're going to create this contract return address. So maybe this is like a gas efficient way to do this. Uh, so maybe I'm going to ask a question. Maybe this is a maybe this is a gas efficient way to do this. Like, why are they doing this? And then we have s token to address symbol equals address. So it looks like this token factory is actually going to keep track of all the tokens it deploys, and then it's going to emit a token deployed event. Okay, makes sense. And then we just have this function get token from address symbol public view. Is this used anywhere? No. So a Darren probably got this one that this should probably be external instead of public because because this contract isn't using it somewhere, but looks pretty benign. This is kind of weird. I have some questions about this. Now, here's where the checklist comes into play. So we have this checklist. If we go to checklist.json and we look up opcode, we actually can find some interesting things in our checklist. Is push zero opcode supported for Solidity versions greater than 0.8.20? Oh, that's interesting. Let's keep looking for opcodes. Are the EVM opcodes and operations used by the protocol compatible across all target chains? Hadn't thought about that. Let's think about that in this context here. Well, what opcodes do we need to use on this? Well, uh, well, one way to do it is we could run the Sulk compiler and see what we get. Let's do a little forge build. We're gonna build the contracts and we're gonna go into the out folder where these are and we're gonna see, well, what, uh, what our codes do we even need? Let's go to tokenfactory.sol, tokenfactory.json. We go to the op codes. We scroll down in here. Eventually we'll see the deployed bytecode. And this has a ton of bytecode in it. And these are all op codes. So like I said, we're not going to go too deep into this. But in here, you'll find the create op code. So let's look up create. Create is F0. This is a site evm.codes. We'll be using this much later in the course. Zero is the create opcode. So we can look up a little F zero in here. And sure enough, that is in here. 
Yeah, we'll uh, put the cruiser here, look up F0. Sure enough, there is a create opcode in here. Okay, cool. Uh, is that create opcode compatible on all the chains that we're gonna be working with? What are the chains that we're working with again? Uh, scroll down, okay, Ethereum mainnet. Okay, definitely on Ethereum mainnet. What about uh, ZK Sync era? Hmm, let's find out. ZK Sync era docs. Welcome to our docs, ZK Sync era. Is there anything here about compatibility? Okay, let's look at compatibility in search bar. Okay, they do have an, they have a technical references FAQ. Let's look up EVM compatibility. There's a lot of confusion amongst the community with regard to the impacts of being EVM compatible versus EVM equivalent. First, let's define what's meant by the two. EVM equivalent means that a given protocol supports every opcode of EVM, of Ethereum's EVM down to the bytecode. Thus, any EVM smart contract works with 100% assurance out of the box versus EVM compatible means that a percentage of the opcodes of Ethereum's EVM are supported, thus of a percentage of smart contracts works out of the box. CK Sync is optimized to be EVM compatible and not EVM equivalent for a bunch of reasons. Yeah, cool, whatever. Does create opcode work? So we've got a whole bunch more that we that I highly recommend you guys read because it actually is really important for working with different L2s and different chains. What are the compatibility opcodes? Are there opcodes missing? Triggering security audits. Uh, so let's scroll down. Let's find what opcodes are not on here. Okay, well, if we look around, we find EVM constructions create and create two. On ZK Sync Era, contract deployment is performed using the hash of bytecode and the factory depths field of VIP 712 transactions contain the bytecode. The actual deployment occurs by providing the contract's hash to the contract deployer system. To guarantee that create slash create two functions are operating functions operate correctly, the compiler must be aware of the bytecode of the deployed contract in advance. The compiler interprets the call data arguments as incomplete input for contract deployer as the remaining part is filled by the compiler internally. The Yule data size and data offset instruction have been adjusted to return the constant size and bytecode hash rather than the bytecode itself. The code below would work as expected. My contract equals new contract. My contract equals my contract salt, blah, blah. So this is like create this is Crate 2. You should definitely look into this later and understand how this works. Crate 2 is really, really cool. In addition, the subsequent code should also work, but it must be explicitly tested to ensure its intended functionality. Bytes array bytecode equals type my contract dot contract creation, assembly create. The following code will not function correctly because the compiler is not aware of the bytecode beforehand. Oh, oh no. Oh my. Oh, so, uh, wait, what is this token factory doing? Oh my goodness. The contract isn't aware of the bytecode beforehand. This won't work. Oh, wait. This is like nearly identical to this example. I wonder who could have written this code base and planted a bug here. What a ridiculous thing to do. So we found out that this is clearly going to be an issue. Right in the documentation, it says, hey, ZK Sync won't work if this is how you deploy your contracts. So right here, we can say at audit, hi, this won't work on ZK sync. And then we can put a little link to their docs here. Now, ideally we would then test this on ZK sync, prove that this doesn't work, but obviously the doc saying, Hey, this isn't going to work is going to be a really good sign. But this goes to show part of the power of the checklist as well. If you have a checklist like this at the end of your security review, yes, I know this is massive. If you go through this checklist and make sure that everything's checked off, you can find little weird oddities like this. Hey, are you sure it's EVM compatible with ZK Sync? So one of the first things you do is you go, okay, cool. How does ZK Sync differ from Ethereum? Let's learn about ZK Sync. And you read the docs right away. We would come to this code, which is saying, hey, this is bad. And granted, that's exactly what we're doing in here. So this is not good. And we've found a high, huh? That feels pretty good. We found a high just by going through the checklist. Great. There is an opcode support slash EVM compatibility exercise in SC exploits minimized coming soon. It's not up quite yet, but it should be pretty easy for you to deploy a contract to a chain that does not have certain opcodes supported, and you will be able to see that they do indeed break. And you might be thinking, hey, Patrick, that's a ridiculous example. That's never going to happen. People are smarter than that. However, there's actually a very famous case study that happened on ZK Sync with this exact issue. 921 ETH was stuck in a ZK Sync era contract because the transfer function fails. 
The transfer function works on Ethereum and other EVM chains, but at the time, not ZK Sync. I'm not sure if that's still true as of recording. So if they had just checked compatibility, that 921 ETH would not have been stuck in the contract. And this is a real thing that actually happened. I highly recommend you pause the video and read this blog post to understand more about how it happened and what went down, because this really does happen. All right, nice. So we found a high issue. Doesn't work with ZK Sync. Great. Let's keep going. So we've been up and down Token Factory, Token, the Vault. It's time to finally look at the boss bridge here. There's actually not a lot of code here, but it's kind of really hard code. <laughs> Let's take a look. Let's dive into it. So we have a whole bunch of imports in here. We're using Pragma Solidity 0.8.20. Looks good to me. Okay, IERC20, open Zeppelin, open Zeppelin, open Zeppelin, open Zeppelin, open Zeppelin, open Zeppelin, open Zeppelin. Okay, cool. So all of these are open Zeppelins. I'm familiar with open Zeppelin. I know these have been security reviewed. Uh, I'm happy that these are in here. This is probably pretty much a gimme for me, right? I don't really need to check any of these libraries. But we do have a couple of new ones here. We've got reentrancy guard, message, message hash utils, ECDSA. These ones we haven't actually been working with. So if you're not familiar with these, you definitely should look into them and get familiar. These three we've talked about, we know. These ones are new. So let's take a look. So pausable, real basically, it allows people to add some type of emergency stop, right? It creates these modifiers when not paused and when paused and allows us to have a pause function and a unpaused function. So in here, we can look for when paused or when not paused, right? It looks like we have a when not paused function. Okay, cool. So there's some functionality in here that only works when it's not paused. Let me also run forge, inspect, L1 boss bridge methods. Let's see if there is even a way to pause here. Okay, deposit limit, deposit owner. Okay, pause. Cool. So there's a pause function in here. We have the pause coming from right inside of here. We have pause and unpause, only accessible by only owner. Cool. And so we have this down here, when not paused bit. Very nice. So that's what Pausable does. Okay, reentrancy guard. This is one we haven't spoken about, but we did learn about reentrancy. So reentrancy guard allows us to create little something called mutex locks on our code base. So we have a entered and not entered private variables that are constant, and we get these modifiers: non reentrant, non reentrant before, and non reent after. And then here is where the code actually happens. So non reent before checks to see, hey, has this function been entered? If it has been entered, revert. Otherwise, set it to enter, do your code, and then set non reentrant after, where you just basically expire it. So it's basically kind of like putting a lock onto your function. It's really good for blocking reentrancy attacks. If you have any functions that might be susceptible to reentrancy, and you know that they are doing external calls, you can just add a reentrancy guard. So we might look for non reentrant. Great, so we have send to L1 is non reentrant. Awesome. So we'll probably look at that in a little bit. Okay, what's next? Message hash utils. This is one we're actually going to spend a decent bit of time on in this section. So this is signature message hash utilities for producing digest to be consumed by ECDSA recovery or signing. What? Now to understand this, we got to go way back to the Anders Brownworth blockchain demo. So what we can do is we can come to this public private key demo. There's a link to this in the GitHub associated with this lesson. And this actually allows us to run a server to do his blockchain demo. It looks like he's recently taken it down off his website. It might be back up. I don't know, but it's on GitHub so we can do play with it. You will need Node.js to actually run this and play with this. I highly encourage you to do that. Um, however, if you do not have Node.js, you can also just follow along with me. So first we're going to git clone it like so CD into it and we're going to run npm install to install all the dependencies for this. And then in here, we just to run the server, we run this command here. Boom. And now we have a server up and running. And all we got to do then is open up this in localhost while this is running, put this off to the side and ta-da, we come to the blockchain demo, public, private keys and signing here. And what we want to do is we want to go to signatures again. Remember how this works. If we sign something like, hello, we have our private key, we can hit sign, we get this message signature, 
right? Our private key was hashed with this message to make this message signature. What we can then do is we can verify that the public key and the message matches the signature. We can verify that. That's how this the signing works. It's a one-way method. So private key plus message equals signed message. And then signed message plus public key can be confirmed signed. So that's how classic public private key cryptography works, right? So we can sign a message, boom, like sign all this message. Only the person with the private key can sign the message. And then we can verify the public key by hitting verify. If this message was different, and we try to verify the signature, we wouldn't check out. We get this red checkbox and it's easily going, oh yeah, that uh, that doesn't make any sense. So this process though of signing transactions with private keys is how you know the blockchain works. It's when MetaMask pops up, we're signing these transactions, we're sending these signed messages onto the blockchain, and then the other blockchain nodes can verify them. We can actually do this process in our smart contracts as well. So going back to our message hash utils here, We've got a whole lot of information here that can be very confusing. But to make hashes a little bit more standardized and messaging a little bit more standardized, we came up with a couple of different EIPs. The first one, ERC-191, which is the sign data standard, and it specifically works for sign data in Ethereum smart contracts. And we wanted to say, hey, like, let's just come up with a format so that all signed data at least follow some format so we can verify it much easier. So the motivation for this came from a pre-signed transaction is a chunk of binary signed data along with a signature R, S, and V. So all signatures in blockchain have these R, S, and V things that make them up. And previously, this signed data wasn't really specified. Like, how do we interpret it? So the Ethereum community proposed the following format for signed data, OX19, one byte for a, for the version of the EIP-191, version specific data, and then data to sign. Here are the different versions. 000 is for 191, data with intended validator. The next version is gonna be structured data, which is 712, which we're gonna talk about. So if we scroll down here a little bit more, we've got a wonderful example using Solidity 0.8.0. We have function signature-based execution, target, nonce, memory payload, V, R, and S. So the VR and S are pieces of the signed data, and we can get the hash of them by, you know, basically hashing everything together to get kind of the full message. And then we can use this precompile called ECR recover to say, okay, who signed this message? Take the hash, the VR and S, and boom. And you can verify, hey, this is the address that signed this data. And this is essentially you verifying who signed some data. This example is helpful, but it's like, uh, dude, where am I getting this VR and S from? Well, if we go back to the Anders Brownworth example, when we sign the message, the signed message basically can get broken up into this V, R, and S. So they're totally fine to be sent because they're just part of the signed message, right? They don't show any information about the private key. You can sign them off chain. And to sign them, we use this elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. But essentially, we're just taking our message, taking our private key, sticking it through this algorithm, getting that signed message, and the V, R, and the S are part of that signed message, essentially. So this bit here on signature based execution says, OK, get a target, get a nonce, get a payload and then the signature. And we can use that signature, code everything together to see, OK, get the hash and then ECR recover to see, OK, who actually signed it. And this is how in our smart contracts, we can know that somebody actually signed something. So essentially how the signing works is we take the private key and some message. And this is usually like data, including like function signatures or function selectors, parameters, et cetera. Smash both of them into this elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, which we're not going to go into. For the purpose of at least this point, you can kind of think of it as a black box. If you want to go deeper into this actual algorithm, I highly recommend you do. Smashing them into this algorithm outputs are V, R, and S. And the signature here has is basically has these components V, R, and S in the signature. We can use this V, R, and S to verify that a message was indeed signed by a specific address. In a smart contract, we can use this lib message hash utils to help do this. So we have a couple different functions in here. 
These are specifically for EIP 191 structured ones, but also EIP 712 structured ones. So if we go to EIP 712 and feel free to pause and read about these some more. EIP 712 is a standard for hashing and signing of typed structured data as opposed to just byte strings. And nowadays, this is kind of the EIP where when you get a MetaMask, it says, hey, uh, sign this message from to contents, etc. Because previously, it's just like, hey, sign this message, and it would give you this horrible byte string. Now it says, hey, sign this message, and here's the data of this message. So this EIP helped format the way we do these signatures a lot better. Now this EIP 712 is a little bit more complicated. Uh, I have a, a minimal example of 0.4.24 solidity in the boss bridge audit code base in the Git repo associated with this course, which shows us how to actually work with it. If we look in this contract all the way to the bottom, we can kind of see this whole thing being put together. So we have this structured data in here, mail memory mail, mail is this struct of person from, person to, string contents. And we have some stuff in here. So it's kind of a pretty typical struct with structs inside of it as well. And we sign this, we can sign this structured data. We can get the V, the R and the S of this signed data by some private key. And then we can verify this data with this verify function, which we're going to scroll up to. And we basically call this ECR recover, which is a solidity precompile. This is essentially the verification part of the algorithm where we hash all that data into this thing called a digest. And then we can use ECR recover to make sure that the from is indeed correct. So in the GitHub repo associated with this course, there's this EIP 712 hashing.soul, which has this contract that you can play around with and look at to learn more. But essentially, this is how verification works. We get the signed message. We break the signed message into V, R, and S. We get the, the data itself. And then we use it as input parameters for ECR recover. And you can see that in the example.sol all the way down at the bottom, we get the data, we get the VR and S of the signature, and then we can use that to actually verify mail VR and S. If we go up to this verify function again, well, first we hash the actual data using this hashing standard from EIP 712 and EIP 191. So we hash all the data in a very specific way. And then we call this ERC recover on this digest. The digest is known as the hashed data put into this format here. And then we just call ECR recover to VR and S. ECR recover is a solidity precompile or a solidity built in. So if we go over to solidity documentation and we look up ECR recover, we can go down to function calls, ECR recover, and we can learn more about it in the documentation. One more thing on these low level signature signing stuff. There is an awesome case study on Polygon where a precompile, where a return value was forgotten to be checked. And we're going to watch a video on that. And, and it was a really interesting case study. Let's go ahead. Let's watch the video on that, on where they forgot to check the value of this precompile ECR recover. Hunting for smart contract bugs can be a ludicrously well-paying job if done right. And it saves the ecosystem from being hacked. I've had the luxury of being able to interview a developer who found a $7 billion bug and was paid $2.2 million for reporting it. In this video, we're gonna go over what was the exploit that he found, how it could have drained $7 billion from the Polygon ecosystem right at the Genesis block the most important strategies and tools you can use to find your million dollar bounty. And finally, we'll wrap up with a challenge that myself and Immunifier are gonna give to you, so be sure to stay for that. So let's get froggy. On May 31st, 2020, the Matic blockchain went live and eventually would be branded as the Polygon chain. Polygon is an EVM compatible blockchain known for its cheap gas fees, short block times, and as of recent, it has been entering into ZK technology. Now, if you go to block zero, the absolute first block in the blockchain you'll see 10 transactions in the Genesis block. And in one of these transactions, they created a contract called the MRC20 contract. Now, what is this contract? And we all know to send ETH or native blockchain token on a blockchain, we're gonna have to spend something called gas. So the Polygon team deployed this contract, which had the ability for someone to sign a transaction without sending it 
allowing them to offset the gas costs to somebody else. This is known as a meta transaction, and you can learn more in EIP 712. As you can see, right at the Genesis block, this contract was given almost 10 billion Matic to initialize the contract and facilitate these gasless transactions. However, this clever contract had a hidden exploit that could drain the entire contract. And on December 3rd of 2021, almost 1.5 years after the Genesis block, our hero, Leon Spacewalker, submits his exploit report to Immunify, laying out exactly how someone could exploit this contract. A second hero, who we'll call White Hat 2, also submitted a report a day later. And during this time that reports were coming in, Another person found this vulnerability, but this person was a hacker and ended up stealing 800,000 Matic tokens from this contract. And then on December 5th, just two days after the initial report went in, Polygon was forked, the contract fixed, and as of December 5th, 2021, that vulnerability was no longer in the MRC20 contract. So this, of course, leaves some questions. What was the exploit? How did it stay dormant for so long? And what was the fix? The function that facilitated these gasless transactions is here. At first glance, it seems harmless. It takes the signature of the user, how much to send, any data, an expiration, and then who to send the money to. It runs some requires, it gets the data hash in order to send the meta transaction and make sure the data hash hasn't been used, and then does this EC recovery function. This function is essentially a wrapper for a globally available Solidity function called EC recover, which is how we can verify where a signed transaction is coming from. But wait. What's this? If there's an error, it just returns the zero address. It actually, it doesn't revert. Now there is a check to actually make sure that this doesn't return zero. However, the ECR recovery function copied this and still returns zero on an error. Okay, well surely we'll check to make sure that this function returns a valid address, right? And not the zero address. Oh, looks like that line was forgotten. Well, no worries. The last line of transfer from here probably does some check, right? Well, here's the transfer function. Well, the transfer function actually calls this function that you're seeing now, the transfer function. And you'll notice here, when it calls the transfer, it doesn't check to make sure the from address has enough money. It just transfers the money out of the MRC20 contract. So to hack this, you just pass in any bad signature to get the zero from address, pick any amount, send it to whoever, and then you could get essentially that entire Matic balance. So what's odd to me is that this bug was dormant for about 1.5 years, and within the span of a few days, a number of people uncovered it. I ended up asking the Immunify team about this, and they said that this is actually a pretty common occurrence. There's a lot of bugs that stay dormant for a long time, and then some article or news outlet will release a new popular bug, and people will start finding that everywhere. Or maybe there's more to the story. But maybe not. But for us, one of the major learnings we can take away from this is how Leon managed to find this bug, disclose it, get his payout, and the tips and tricks he used to find this and many other security vulnerabilities. These tips assume you already know most of the Solidity and Smart Contract fundamentals. So yes, learning Solidity is a prerequisite to being a bug bounty hunter. And if you wanna become a bug bounty hunter, be sure to stick around to the end where we're gonna issue a challenge just for you. Let's get more froggy. Leon's biggest advice and takeaway for anybody else looking to get into the space is to find your edge. Find the thing that gives you the advantage over other smart contract developers, bug hunters, and protocols. But what does he mean by find your edge? He usually means figure out a strategy that works for you. And he categorized four different approaches to finding these bugs. Number one, find a project and search for bugs in it. This is the most common way to find bugs, and anybody who's looking to get into this space should try this strategy for themselves first. The way you find bugs with this is you know every inch of the protocol. Read the docs, try to implement the protocol yourself, etc. If you know every inch of the protocol, you'll sure know the bugs too. Now, Leon said that this strategy actually works for other hunters, but not for him. He focused on the next three strategies. Find a bug and search for projects. An easier approach to finding bugs is to find a bug that not a lot of people know about and look for projects that have that bug. That way, when you're looking through a project, you're only looking for one specific lump of code making it potentially easier to find for you. Now this strategy takes a lot of researching. You first need to understand all the different exploits and their advanced versions as well. You need to be aware of their best practices that haven't been considered. This is the continue to research and grow strategy. And I think everyone should continue to research and grow anyways. Become an expert on this specific bug and make sure that no smart contracts have this implemented anywhere. And if they do, that's when you can write your report. Number three, be fast with new updates. We need to protect each other in this space, but we also need to do it quickly. 
projects have to sign up for bug bounties to do a payout. And you want to be one of the first ones to find these new bounties and updates. Now, there are a few ways to be fast. And one of the tools that Leon actually used to get updates before others was having notifications for the Immunified Discord BBP updates turned on. This channel pings you anytime a new project comes in, but also pings you when one of these projects changes its scope, adds a new contract, or adds a piece of information that other bug hunties and other hackers maybe haven't found yet. And it was this strategy that is exactly what Leon used to find this bug before anybody else. Number four, be creative with finding your edge. One of the clever things Leon did was he would actually traverse community forums where they would talk about whether or not they might do a bug bounty. He'd then start looking at the smart contracts before they even submitted it for approval. This way, he was able to start digging into code days before any other developer or ethical hacker was able to take a look, giving him an edge. Number five, know your tooling. Bug hunters use tools like Solidity Visual Developer, Hardhat, Foundry, Brownie, Dune Analytics, Etherscan, and anything else that helps. A typical strategy might be to load up the contract in something like your VS Code and then turn on the Solidity Visual Developer, where it'll start to highlight important pieces of your code. After doing a manual walkthrough or finding any weaknesses, it might be a good idea to start setting up any tests to test this contract. And usually you can reuse a lot of the tests that the original developers wrote in their own GitHub repo. Number six, don't be afraid of audited projects. Nothing much else to say here. Audit firms up. And many of the projects Leon found vulnerabilities for were actually audited by top firms using the skills we talked about in this video. Number seven, find your niche. Find specific industry knowledge that only you know. For example, a lot of developers understand code, but don't understand all the financial information for DeFi. Maybe you get incredibly good at decentralized exchanges, borrowing protocols, or even just NFTs. If you can master security and a specific industry in Web3, you'll be positioned to be a golden defender against the hackers for that specific industry. And now you've heard the tips from a successful bug hunter who found a $2.2 million bounty bug. Okay, welcome back. We just learned a ton. Let's break it down to the simplest terms. How signing works is you're gonna take the private key and the message, smash it into this elliptical curve digital signature algorithm in a certain format. This will output the VR and S. We can use these those values of the signature to verify someone's signature using ECR Recover. These are safe to put on chain. They don't have any public information. Then to verify this, we take this sign message, these VR and S values, and then we get the data that they supposedly signed, input them both into this ECR precompile, which is part of this elliptical curve digital signature stuff. And this should output who signed the message. If it outputs the same person you're expecting, then great, that's what we want. So this has a lot of functions in here to do that. We have two ETH written in assembly. It returns that digest that we talked about for that formatted signing stuff. Th these are all basically ways to help sign and, and validate data. And this is important for us for reasons you'll see in a bit. And then finally, ECDSA, this library additionally from Open Zeppelin. This is kind of purely elliptical curve digital signature algorithm operations. The last one, the message hash utils, just kind of helped format these hashings into these EIPs into the correct format, whereas the ECDSA actually does the encryption, right? If we scroll down, we have try recover. We can actually see in try recover. We actually see in try recover, it's going to say returns the address that signed a hash message with signature or an error. So we can kind of look at try recover. It's going to take this signature, get the R the S and the V, and this actually tells us something really cool. A signature has to be length 65. We have a bytes 32 R, bytes 32 S, uint 8 V. We do some assembly here to load the values from the signature into these types. Then we call try recover, and this will put it into the try recover function, which has the hash and the bytes R, V, and S, which will bump it into this try recover function down here which has the hash, the V, R, and S. This is the hash of the data, and this is basically the signature stuff. And you can actually read the math here of how it's actually doing the signing and the unsigning. So if you're curious how the signatures and verifications and all this stuff works, you can look into and play with this library and see what you find. This actually does the elliptical curve digital signature algorithm, ECDSA functions. This one helps format these ECDSA hashings into the EIP ways. 
Got it. Makes sense. Great. We're going to do some signing in a little bit. And then finally, we have L1 Vault, which is obviously going to be our L1 Vault. So if you're unfamiliar with signing, now is a great time as a security researcher to look it up. ChatGPT is actually phenomenal with asking signature questions. A lot of the basic cryptography, it's actually really good with. So if any of that was confusing, please, please, please use ChatGPT, use Find, use your AI companion to help you here. They are phenomenal at this cryptography stuff. So now that we've learned a little bit about this stuff, let's continue with going line by line. Like I said, we are going to go over some signature examples and we are going to learn more about signatures pretty soon, but it's good that we have at least this kind of high level overview of how these work. And hint, hint, I'm going to tell you right away, there might be a bug related to signatures here. So, you know, we're actually going to go over a real example. Let's keep going. So contract L1 boss bridge is ownable, possible Rancher Seagar. Great. Using safe ERC-20 for IERC-20. Awesome. Safe ERC-20, as we know, has a lot of helpful functions for making dealing with ERC-20s easier. Lucky for us, we don't really have to worry about any weird ERC-20s because this contract is planning on using just that single token, the L1 token dot soul. Okay, we have this deposit limit thing. Uh, what's this? Looks like when we deposit tokens, it needs to be less than some limit. Okay, so maybe I'll explain this. Depositing tokens, you can't do too many. Okay, immutable token. So it looks like this bridge is going to be one bridge per token. Okay, cool. One bridge per token. Great, makes sense. Immutable vault. We already know there's one vault per token. So there's one vault and one bridge per token. Okay, cool. And we have mapping account to is signer. Okay, these are the these are who are the signers? It says it in the readme right at the bottom. Signers, users who can send a token from L to L1. Okay, so this is probably owned by the owner. They're probably the only one who can set the signers. Okay, we have some errors. We have an event. Very nice constructor. Okay, it's ownable. Token equals token. We launch a new vault. And then we have vault.approve2 allows the bridge to move tokens out of the vault to facilitate withdrawals. Vault.approve2 address this type un256.max. Okay, so, okay, cool. Makes sense. So, our L1 boss bridge is giving max withdrawal power, max approval of ERC20s inside the vault. Makes sense. Pause function, unpause function. Cool. That seems to be pretty straightforward. We can go into this. Looks good to me. Set signer. Looks like it's only owner. Great. These are all only owner. Great. Account enabled. Signer's account equals enabled. This is going to give us a question. Hey, what happens if we disable an account mid flight, right? You know, maybe there is no mid flight, but these are the types of questions we want to think about. Cool. And now we get to the big juicy function, deposit token to L2. Let's read what this does. Locks tokens in the vault and emits a deposit event. The unlock event will trigger the L2 minting process. There are nodes listening for this event and will mint the corresponding tokens on L2. This is a centralized process. Uh, good thing we built a little Excala draw. So right here, when we call deposit token to L2, these signers are listening and they're going to unlock it on the L2. Okay, cool. So the params are going to be from the address of the user who is depositing tokens, L2 recipient, the address of the user who received it on the L2, and the amount of the tokens to deposit. Okay, cool. So a user is actually going to call this when it's not paused. Cool. Makes sense. If token.balance of address vault plus amount is greater than deposit limit, we're going to revert. So there's only a maximum amount of, what is it, 100,000, it looks like. So there can only be 100,000 on the L2, perhaps. Token.safe transfer from, from to address vault. So we're sticking the money in the vault for that amount. And then we're emitting an event. This event is incredibly important. We do want to make sure this is correct. Let's go to the parameters from to amount from to amount. Okay, that looks good. Because our off chain service is listening to these events in order to do this process of unlocking the tokens over here, right? So cool, really important event here. And then we're locking the tokens in the safe, or hopefully locking the tokens in the safe. Now that we've read that function, I'm going to actually go back to Slither. And why am I going to go back to Slither? 
Well, because Slither is giving us some great stuff. And don't worry, we'll, we'll keep going with this. But just by going through Slither, guess what? We found a bit of an issue here. So the first issue in Slither is boss bridge dot deposit tokens to L2 uses arbitrary from in transfer from. OK, well, what is this? What is this issue here? Arbitrary from in transfer from detect when message sender is not used in from in transfer from. Here's an exploit scenario. Alice approves this contract to spend her ERC20 tokens. Bob can call A and specify Alice's address as the from parameter in transfer from, allowing him to transfer Alice's tokens to himself. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. This is definitely an issue, right? Let's walk through this scenario. So let's say Alice calls approve of, you know, token to bridge. And she's about to send a transaction. She's about to send a transaction to call deposit tokens to L2. Bob notices she called approve and goes, oh, uh, I'm going to call deposit tokens to L2 from Alice. Address for the L2 recipient is going to be Bob and the amount is going to be all her money. Since Alice approved this contract, if Bob calls this, this transfer from will pass and essentially Bob will be able to steal all of her money on the layer two. Oh my goodness. So Slither caught this at audit and let's figure out the severity impact. Okay, well, Bob is stealing tokens. So this is clearly high. What is the likelihood? Well, anytime somebody calls approve, this could happen. So this is high. This is like super high. This Some people could say this is a crit. Um, this is 100% a high. Audit, high. Big, big, big issue. And Slither caught it super easy. If a user approves the bridge, any other user can steal their funds. Whoops, that is not intended. That is not what we like to see. So let's take a quick pause and let's write a proof of code for this. So let's go to the test suite. Let's just use the current test harness to do this. Let's scroll down. We'll write a new test suite function. Test can move approved tokens of other users public. Let's verify this actually happens. So let's reuse some of this test suite in here. We've got a user deployer, user in L2 operator. Token, token bridge vault. Okay, cool. Let me scroll down to here. Let's do vm.prank some user. And this will be poor Alice, poor Alice approving. And she's going to do token.approve. We have a token, by the way, I believe. Yep, we have a token, L1 token, token. Great. Token.approve, address, token bridge. And let's say, you know, type 56.max. Because she's planning on moving her tokens to L2. So she has to approve the bridge to move her tokens to L2. And now Bob gets to swoop in and starts stealing. So we're going to say UN256 deposit amount is going to be token dot balance of user, our, our friend Alice. So is she actually given some tokens at the beginning? Let's take, let's check. Okay, token, token bridge. Oh, okay, so we deploy some tokens and we transfer to the user right in the setup. Looks good. So deposit amount token dot balance of user. Now we can do VM dot start prank. Do we have an attacker address? Let's see up in here. Deploy our user user in L2 operator. Nope, we don't have an attacker address. So let's create a little attacker here. So we'll do address attacker equals make ADDR attacker dot start prank the attacker. And now we're going to do a VM dot expect emit, right? Because here, this is going to lock the tokens into the into the vault and emit this event. And it's the details in this event that are paramount to get correct. So this is kind of really interesting because this is our first application where getting an event wrong is actually a critical or a high because it's this off chain service listening to these events that's going to trigger the unlock on the L2. So we want to prove that we're emitting the wrong data or malicious data, right? So vm.expect emit address token bridge. We'll do emit deposit. The user is going to deposit. So the user to the attacker the user is going to deposit to the attacker, the deposit amount. And then we're going to call token bridge dot deposit tokens to L2 user attacker deposit amount. And then we can do some asserts assert equal 
token dot balance of user. It's going to be zero. Assert equal token dot balance of address vault comma comma deposit amount and then vm dot stop prank. So Alice approves the token bridge, planning on moving her tokens to the L2. Bob swoops in. Bob goes, oh, I saw you approved, you big dummy. I'm going to deposit your tokens, but send them to me on the L2. All the tokens will be gone from the user because he will have stolen them, and they will be in the vault, which is very uncool. So let's try this. Forge test, dash dash MT, paste that in. Successful, and that passes. So we have our first high, and we found that pretty quick. Great job. Even in some of these more advanced code bases, tools like Slither can find really good issues. So thank you, Slither. Let's keep walking down Slither. Let's see what other goodies are in here. This turned out to be a high. Okay, cool. What's next? L1 boss bridge dot send to L1. Sends ETH to arbitrary user again. Oh no. Dangerous calls are right here. Let's go to boss bridge dot 123. Oops. 123. Let's go check out what this line is doing. And we can see the Slither documentation for this one. This is arbitrary send ETH, severity high. It's not completely sure this is an issue with confidence medium. Bob can set destination and withdraw. As a result, he withdraws the contract's balance. Uh, so this one might be a little bit tricky for us to understand without actually knowing what this function does. So maybe we'll come back to this. So I'll put like a note in here, question. Slither said this is bad. Is that okay? We'll come back to it. All right, next. Approve to ignores return value by token dot approve. Uh oh. So we have this vault number 22. Let's go see. Token dot approve has a return value that we're not really listening to. So uh, if we look at the documentation for this one, it's saying in this exploit scenario, my contract calls add of safe math, but does not store the result in A. As a result, the computation has no effect, right? So we do a dot add b, but we don't store it anywhere. So it's like kind of a waste of a function. For this one, this isn't a waste of a function. Approve does indeed do something. We probably should check the return. So maybe we'll do like an audit low unless we can prove this is actually a real issue or maybe an audit info. This should check the return value of approve. Since we're only using this L1 token, we go in here, we'll look for function approve. It's just always going to return true pretty much unless it breaks. So it's not really a big deal. So that's probably informational. So not a big deal. Good try, Slither. Good try. Thank you for the tip. Let's keep going. All right. Detectors send to L1. Lacks a zero check in this. Okay. I think in the readme, they said they know they're missing some zero checks. We're missing zero checks for input validation to save gas. Okay. So they don't care about that. Cool. Reentrancy in deposit tokens to L2. External call, we do a safe transfer from, and then we do a deposit. Uh oh. Let's go look at that in the L1 boss bridge. Deposit tokens to L2, the one that we just looked at. Aha. Yes. We do safe transfer from, and then we do an emit at audit. Now, this could be a low if we allowed any tokens, but since we're only allowing this L1 tokens ERC20, this super not weird token, it doesn't have any callback functionality. This actually isn't a security risk. However, this is at least informational, should follow CEI, right? This should ideally be before the transfer from, right? So informational, it's not technically a security issue, but, you know, we should call it out. Next. Deploy tokens, so Slither doesn't like assembly, so it just calls that out as a potential issue. Uses assembly, we're gonna skip that one. Different versions of Solidity are used in all the ones we care about. It's the same, it's just Open Zeppelin that is a library that has different ones, we don't care. Slither also likes very specific versions of Solidity. It prefers 0.8.18, as we know. We're using 0.8.20, we're fine with that. Low level call. It also doesn't like low level calls. We were fine with that. Deposit limit should be constant. Oh my goodness. Is it not? Oh my God. It's not. At audit info should be constant, right? And a Darren probably picked this up as well. And then finally, L1 token should be immutable. Let's go look at that. Uh, yes. Yep. So this would be at audit 
info you know should be immutable thank you slither really appreciate that slither gave us an actual bug it gave us some questions on future functions and a whole bunch of information so thank you slither and again this is where i want to highly stress how awesome this code base would be to write stateful fuzzing tests for in fact i highly recommend you pause the video right now and try to write a stateful fuzzing test suite because it is so crucial for protecting code bases to write stateful fuzzing and invariant test suites i'm not going to go over it now because we spent a lot of time on doing that in the tswap video but a part of me thinks that i should do this way more we're going to be going over formal verification later which is also really helpful but understanding the invariance incredibly important and i urge you to pause the video right now try to write down some invariance what are the invariance and then write your own fuzzing test suite but anyways so So this is kind of a crazy impact. This is kind of really cool. You know, if somebody approves a bridge, other users can steal the funds. This also leads to an MEV attack, which we haven't learned about yet, but we will. What else? Wait, 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 wait. If a user approves the bridge, any user can steal the funds. So if somebody approves the bridge, any other user can steal the funds? Wait a minute, didn't the, the vault approve the bridge? Vault.approve2, approve2 is only owner, Oh no. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. If the vault approved the bridge, can a user steal funds from the vault? Oh no. Is this another audit? Is this another high? So hold on. So hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. Since the vault gave approvals to the bridge, could the could a user say, okay, from the vault to the attacker for any amount for literally any tokens in the bridge? Oh my God, that seems pretty bad. Uh, can we write a test for that? Let's prove, let's see if this actually exists. Okay, function test can transfer from vault to vault. If we transfer from the vault to the vault and say we're the recipient, it'll emit a deposit event from the vault to the recipient on the L2, but the tokens will just like infinitely stay in the vault can we just like infinitely mint on the L2? That seems like that'd be pretty cool. Let's uh, let's try this out. So let's go ahead and create another attacker. We don't even need an Alice here. We'll just assume the vault actually already holds some ether, right? We can do U256 vault balance equals 500 ether. And Foundry has a really nice cheat code for this. We can just do deal address of the token to the address of the vault, vault balance. So this will give the vault the 500 ethers of this token. Really cool cheat code for dealing with ERC20s. Then we should be able to expect a trigger. We can trigger the deposit function or the deposit event, self-transferring tokens to the vault. So vm.expect emit address of the token bridge, emit deposit address of the vault, address of the vault which seems kind of silly, vault balance. Well, that's not what we want. From to, we don't want to send it to the vault. We want to send it to ourselves, right? So we're going to send it to the attacker. And now we can do call deposit to L2, token bridge dot deposit to L2, address vault, attacker, vault balance. And we should hypothetically be able to do this forever because... We're just continually sending the tokens back to the vault. Can do this forever. So we can mint infinite tokens on the L2. Well, let's try this out. We're just test dash dash MT. Oh my goodness, yikes. So we have a way for users to just keep minting themselves tokens on the L2. Even if they couldn't mint it to themselves, they would be able to mint essentially unlimited tokens. That's a big issue. This is clearly a high. We have the proof of code. I'm going to skip writing the write-up, but the proof of code here is very clear and straightforward. So the question is, why are we reporting these as two separate issues? Why are they not the same issue? They seem pretty similar. They're with similar functions. And the answer to that is the root cause is slightly different, right? So the root cause of the first one is the fact that, hey, somebody else approves this and then a user can steal their funds. It's still kind of the arbitrary send. The second one, yes, it's got to deal with that issue, but it's also more importantly, 
the fact that the vault always has maximal approvals here as well. So it's kind of a combination of two issues. The root cause is slightly different. And maybe there's some argument to say that the same root cause, I think they're interestingly intricate enough that I would consider them two different findings. But I would totally understand somebody who would argue that they're the same finding. So but in any case, we have two findings. We have two proof of codes. We're doing, we're cooking. All right, are there any other issues with this? Maybe, um, but I think we're pretty good here. I think we've, we've found uh, two really, really cool bugs. Let's keep going because we still have probably one of two of the more important functions left. Okay, finally, this is the function responsible for withdrawing tokens from L2 to L1. RL2 will have similar mechanism for withdrawing tokens from L1 to L2. And notice the signature is required to prevent replay attacks. Okay, so we just learned a little bit about VR and S. So we're saying, okay, parameter two is gonna be the address of the user who received the tokens on L1, the amount, the amount of tokens to withdraw, and then the signature of the signed data. So that's that VR and S that we learned about. So we have two and we have amount. It looks like we're calling this other function. And then actually, who can call this? Anybody can call this. Okay, anybody can call this. So anybody can withdraw their tokens to the L1. Okay, so this will be on withdrawing tokens from L2 to L1. So we call send to L1, VRNS. This ABI encoding here is part of this signing stuff. The VRNS signed essentially this message. So we're trying to verify that the signature actually came from somebody who signed it. And the reason that we have withdraw tokens to L1 via signatures is all, there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. This allows something called gasless transactions, something called relays. Allowing people to call transactions by signatures is often actually a really helpful feature. So you might be asking, hey, like, why are you doing this, you know, withdraw by signature thing? That's kind of weird. Maybe, but it's often actually really, really helpful. So uh, we're calling send L1 VRNS. We're encoding some data. Let's see what this function actually does. So we scroll down VR and S and then bytes memory message. Okay, so we're encoding this message and this VR and S apparently is the signed version of this message. So we're probably going to have to verify that. And oh, okay, cool. In this send to L1 function, um, that's one of the first things that we do. So we do this ecdsa.recover. If we go to this recover, we see it calls try recover and in try recover, you know, we have try recover again, um, which eventually does call the ECR recover down here. So ECR recover meshes hash utils to Ethereum sign message, Kachak 256 message VR and S. So this messes hash utils dot to ETH signed message hash Kachak 256 message. This whole line is basically putting this signed message into the right format. That's it, right? Because the signed message was kind of just this raw lump of data combined. So we're formatting it to the EIPs and then we're calling ecdsa.recover to verify the signer, right? If we go back to the readme, if we go back to our notes, I know it's very confusing, but off chain, what they did was they signed, they took their private key and their message, they created that VR and S that VRNS that we inputted as parameters with this message. And now on chain, we're verifying it. So we have the signed message, VRNS, and then we have the, the data itself, AKA the message itself. I guess we should also do format it. The data needs to be formatted. So right here, we're formatting the data to be correct. And then we're using it as an input parameter for ECR recover, which is essentially what this ecdsa.recover function does. So a lot of work here, a lot of crypto stuff here. And this might be a good place to, for you to say, hey, you know, I'm not sure I believe the open Zeppelin recover function works correctly. And I would say, hell yeah, you should go check it out. You're a security researcher. Go learn, go have fun. But this is going to get us the signer. And now that we have the signer, we can say, okay, let's verify this signer is correct. We'll say if the signer is not on the list, we're going to revert. So it looks like this withdraw tokens to L1. If we go back to this, back to our image here, the withdraw tokens from the L2 back to the L1, only the signer can do that, which makes a lot of sense. If a token is unlocked on the L2 and the L2 gets put into the vault, that's gonna signal to the signer, oh, cool, it's time to move the tokens back out of the vault on the L1. And nobody else should be able to do that. If anybody else could call that, you know, maybe a token is out and about on the L2 and someone goes, oh, well, I'm, it's also going to be out and about on the L1. 
right? And that's no good. So we're going to revert if that's the case. Then we're going to uh, decode the message with ABI decode message into address U256 and bytes. In the Foundry Flow course, we have a whole section on encoding and decoding. Highly recommend you watch that. I'll leave a link to that in here in section seven boss bridge. So if you want a refresher on encoding and decoding, you can have that. We decode it into the target, the value and the data after verifying that it was indeed a signer who signed it. And then finally, we're going to do this low level call target.call the value the value of whatever the signer put in there with the data. And then if it's not success revert. So this is going to be basically the signers unlocking the token over here. So there's a lot of stuff happening here. Is there any way we can break this? Well, this looks pretty solid, right? Ugh, like it's using this crypto math to get the signer and then we're verifying the signer is legit. Is there a way for some other rando who's not a signer, maybe somebody evil to come in and do something bad in here to, to pretend to be the signer instead? Well, let's think about this. So the V, R and S get placed on chain and this is kind of a signature. Well, once this is on chain, everyone will be able to see this signed message, right? I mean, I won't have access to the private key, but I will have access to the signed message. What if I also sent the same signed message as well? That would kind of be an issue, wouldn't it? Oh, I, I think it, I think it kind of would be. So let's talk about signature replay attacks, because these are unfortunately too common. To learn about signature replay attacks, we're going to go over to SC Exploits Minimized to signature replay. If you want to go ahead and play with signatures and remix, this is a great place to do it. However, I think it's a little bit easier if we pull up the SC Exploits Minimized test case unit signature replay test that's all, and we can actually see it in action. So we have this function test signature replay, where first a victim deposits some funds into the protocol. They do all kind of the encoding stuff. They actually sign the digest or the formatted message to get the VR and S. They then call withdraw by SIG with the withdraw amount. And then an attacker says, oh my gosh, you put your VR and S on chain and there was nothing to prevent from being used again. And so then they just keep calling withdraw by SIG until all the money is gone. Now, granted, they didn't steal any of the money in this example, but they essentially made it so that they can just kick the person out of the protocol anytime. So now that we know this, we can come back here and we can look at the VRNS in here. Is there any protection against the signature being used twice? I don't think so. Oh no. Let's try writing a proof of code where we can use this signature more than once. So we'll do function test signature replay public. Let's first assume the vault already holds some tokens. So we'll say uint vault initial balance equals 1000 E18. Say so uint 256 attacker initial balance equals 100 E18. We'll do some nice little deals here. Deal address token address vault vault initial balance deal address token address attacker attacker initial balance. And now an attacker deposits tokens to L2. Oh, we need to make an attacker here too. We'll do address attacker equals make ADDR a attacker like this now we'll do vm dot start prank attacker token dot approve address token bridge type you went to 256 dot max token bridge dot deposit tokens to l2 attacker so we're gonna say from attacker we're gonna say to attacker so this is gonna be the attacker and the l2 attacker initial balance. So we need to at least do this one time to get that signature. Then the operator, the signer slash operator is going to sign the withdrawal. So to do that, we can say you went eight V 
bytes 32R, bytes 32S equals, and this is where we're going to do a little bit of magic here. So founder comes with a cheat code called sign. We're just going to do vm.sign private key. Uh, actually, we're going to do, if we go to the top of this, we have deploy user operator. Operator is an account. So with accounts in Foundry, they actually come with two things. They come with operator.key, operator.adr, or address. So we can use the key to sign this. So we'll do vm.sign, we'll do operator.key, and then we'll sign the actual data, which we need to format. So we'll say message hash utils dot two ETH signed message hash key check. 256 message. Uh, yep, I know this is quite confusing. Let's get this message. Let's go ahead and let's get the message. So we're going to say bytes memory message equals abi.encode address token zero dot encode call i erc20 dot transfer from address vault comma attacker and the attacker initial balance. Okay, so I know this is a lot of code and let me actually toggle the word wrap here. So let's see what, what we just did. So first off, we got the message, we had to hash it correctly. So abi.encode, we use this to hash it. And then we hashed it into the ETH format using this here. And then we signed the message. And that sign message gives us the V and the R and the S. And that's usually when MetaMask pops up and goes, hey, do you sure you want to sign this? Haha, uh -huh, whatever. So the operator is actually signing this because they're seeing a legitimate deposit token L2. So they go, okay, cool. That looks legit to me. And they're going to put this VR and S on chain because the boss bridge, when they call send to L1, they have VR and S. So once they release that data to the world, well, while token dot balance of address fault is greater than zero token bridge dot with draw tokens to l1 attacker attacker initial balance v r and s because they signed our message one time and they put their signature on chain we can just go cool keep doing that here's the signature looks good and then finally, we can do assert equal token dot balance of address attacker attacker initial balance plus the vault initial balance and then assert equal token dot balance of address vault is going to be zero. Okay, so what do we just do? So we've created an attacker. The vault has some balance. The attacker has way less balance. We dealt it to them. The attacker did a single deposit tokens to L2. And when we did that deposit tokens to L2, did a single deposit tokens to L2. Somewhere on the L2, we called send the tokens back to L1. So the signer operator said, oh, okay, cool. I'm gonna send the tokens back to L1. In order for me to do that, I need to call send to L1 with my V, R, and S. I need to send it with my signature. So it went ahead and signed that, sent the tokens back. But it placed the VRNS on chain and the attacker went, ha ha, you fool. And then just kept calling withdraw over and over again until everything was gone. So let's try this. Forge, test, dash dash, MT, paste. And it passes. So if we go to the SC exploits minimized and we look for signature replay, I don't have an attack in here right now, but these have happened many times. Oh man, this is a pretty small code base, but uh, we've found several highs already. And again, I'm going to skip writing the actual finding here, but this will be in the audit data branch of the Git repo associated with this section. Now, how do you prevent against something like this? Well, the most common way to prevent against signature replay attacks is to use some type of nonce or some deadline, etc. Put some parameters in here so that when this gets hashed, when this gets signed, it can only be used one time. And maybe the first time it's signed, it has to be signed by the actual signer, right? The message sender has to be the actual signer. So there's a number of ways to actually hash this data so that it's one time use. You need to be putting some type of one type use data into these signatures so that they only work one time.
And then finally for this code base, there's actually two more big bugs in here. And I kind of want to go over them quickly because I do want to challenge you to write the bugs. And I actually want to challenge you to find the bugs too. But I'm going to tell you them at a high level. And then if you don't understand, please use the GitHub repo associated with this section to understand the bug. So down here, we said, hey, Slither said this was bad. Is that okay? Well, the answer ended up being, uh, no, it's not okay. It's actually quite, quite bad. And what's the issue here? Well, the issue here is that this send to L1, it's passing arbitrary messages, right? They're just kind of taking these people at their word. Well, guess what? The vault has this thing called approve to where it can only be called by the bridge. So if somebody passes some data to this and tells the bridge to approve the tokens for some hacker, well, guess what? The hacker gets all the tokens in the vaults. So this ends up actually being really bad and another exploit. Slither tipped us off, said this is a bad idea, and it ends up being very bad. And then finally, there's this thing called a gas bomb, where again, since this is a low level call, Solidity and the EVM have a hard time estimating how much gas doing this is going to call. And what a user, a malicious user could do is they could have some data with crazy gas costs and essentially charge these signers way too much money to call this function. That is something that has happened. People, some people just want to watch the world burn. They don't get anything out of it. They just screw the signers. So if you're like, what the heck is he talking about? I urge you to pause the video, try to write the proof of codes for these two exploits that I just mentioned, and then go to the GitHub repo and try to do it yourself. Because guess what? We've learned a lot of attacks. We've done a lot of proof of codes. I've walked you through a lot of these. So we've been walking. Pretty soon, you're going to need to start jogging or running. Ah, feels good. We've learned a lot in this section. After you finish the next section, I want you to do a competitive audit. Full stop. Do one competitive audit and then come back because wall key management is really important. But then even crazier, we're going to finally break open the EVM, go into Yule, go into Huff, go into opcodes, and then we're going to finally end it with formal verification. Well, well, kind of finally end it with formal verification. Real quick pit stop on a DeFi stablecoin, and then we're going to talk about the really importance of post deployment. But formal verification symbolic execution is going to be the last bit where we actually do a formalized audit, a formalized code review. Oh my goodness. So let's do a quick review of what we've learned so far, because, oh my goodness, there was a ton. There was a ton in this. Do a quick review of what we learned so far before going into the next. So first off, we learned about EVM diff. Oh, I actually didn't even walk you through EVM diff. So EVM diff is a great tool which can actually compare different chains. So I could compare, you know, Ethereum to you know, Optimism or Arbitrum or whatever and show what the differences are. So yeah, the chain IDs are different, the names are different, block explorers are different, but actually some of the pre-compiles work a little bit differently as well. Arbitrum has some extra pre-compiles that are not present in the EVM, which might be an issue, it might not be. Arbitrum has some different transaction and signature types as well. They have some slightly different account types. And most importantly, their opcodes work slightly different. With some of the most important opcodes being push zero. Really important opcode used a lot. It's not supported yet on Arbitrum. And maybe if you're compiling some code that uses push zero, it's not going to work on Arbitrum. So EVM diff, really powerful tool to compare different layer twos, to compare different EVM compatible chains to see how compatible they actually are. So we learned about some new tooling. Now we didn't talk too much about AI, but like I said, for the crypto stuff, use ChatGPT, use Find, use Grok, Elon Musk's new AI, whatever you want, you should be using AI to ask questions. Full stop. Updraft.siphon.io, we are planning on having an AI helper buddy as well. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. Tenderly isn't a tool that we talked about too much. We'll talk about it actually later in the course, but we did talk about the Hans, and how important having a checklist might be to your journey. So we're in the process of getting this checklist out, and it's a way for you to not forget to look for certain vulnerabilities and to make sure you have a formal programmatic approach to your manual review process. We learned about some pre-compiles. We learned about public and private keys and how those signatures can actually work on chain. We watched a case study with Polygon precompile not being checked, ah, causing a white hat to make a lot of money from it. We learned about signature replays and how if you put your signatures on chain, but you don't put some type of nunce so that they can only be used once, 
people can just continue to use them. We learned that some opcodes don't work on different chains. And when you're dealing with these protocols, you have to think about, okay, where are you deploying this? How EVM compatible is that chain? We learned about doing weird low level calls, dealing more with signing. And we kind of learned about L1s and L2s in the process. So we learned a lot here. We, we wrote a lot of POCs. We didn't do a whole lot of findings because at this point, you should be getting very good at writing them yourself. So I challenge you to write some of these yourself and then come back here, of course, and see how you did. Now, what we didn't talk about here was a lot of these bridge hacks, Ronin, Poly, Nomad, Wormhole. These were all multi hundred million dollar hacks. These were massive hacks. Unfortunately, most of these hacks came a, as a result of some centralized process and not some really cool bug, but such is life. I highly recommend you check out the Rect News articles for each one of these hacks, just so you can be familiar with some of these very historic, very important bridge hacks, even though a lot of them can be boiled down to, oh, it was a centralized bridge. This is why protocols like Chainlink CCIP are coming out so that we do not have to rely on centralized tech. Now, I've left some links and exercises down here. You can learn more about replay attacks, more about bridge attacks, et cetera, in working with damn vulnerable DeFi. I've left a ton of links for you to learn more about signature replays, Merkle tree signature issues, Polygon double slend, spend uh, nomad bridge hacks. A lot of this cryptographic low level stuff, like we saw here, can end up being an issue if not treated with the respect it deserves. So you as a security researcher, you should go out and learn about it. Speaking of security research, do another tweet on Solidit. Go to Solidit, look up something that's interesting to you, see if somebody else has reported it, and try to write a little tweet thread about it. And with that being said, huge congrats on beating the boss bridge. We're almost done with part one of this course, and you are doing phenomenal. This is heavy stuff. This is hard stuff. We're learning about a lot of concepts here, a lot of weird concepts here, and that's okay. You're learning a ton we're jam packing your brain with knowledge so you can go out and help make Web3 more secure. But in order for you to help make Web3 more secure, you gotta be well rested. So take a break, get a cup of coffee, maybe go get some ice cream, maybe go to the gym, but take a break because we're gonna do a quick pit stop at MEV and then let you loose on section eight, the final boss audit. But I'm also gonna say doing the Vault Guardians audit or security review is going to be optional However, learning about MEV and all the stuff we're going to learn about, you cannot skip because the thing is, all of our contracts have been susceptible to something to do with MEV. And we're going to learn about how and why and how to protect against it. With that being said, take a break. Congrats for getting this far. And I'll see you very soon. All right, welcome back. I hope you did take some time to do some of the exercises here because they are going to help you a ton. We've said this at the beginning, we'll say it again now. Repetition is the mother of skill. The more you do this, the better you will get. Doing these exercises is really important and really gonna level you up. Additionally, like I've said 100 times, we are security researchers, which means we're gonna do a lot of research. In this quest to keep Web3 safer, you will be continuously learning. You will always be on the path for learning. So learning how to learn is gonna be a great skill for you. And everyone learns a little bit differently. So try to figure out a process that works best for you and stick to that. All right, so originally we had section eight originally just be the final boss vault guardians security review or audit however i decided we're gonna split it up why did i do that well let me show you what this code base looks like so this is the vault guardians code base it is big here is some a quick sneak peek at some of the contracts vault guardians base i mean look at that ascii though oh my god there is a lot of code here there is a lot of code here and a lot of these contracts are quite large we're talking like maybe 800 source lines of code here. So this is not a quick thing for a video. This is a long, realistic security review or audit. And I did that intentionally. The reason that this is so big and this is such a monster of a final audit or security review is because you will get good and you will have to get good at coming to a code base and saying, 
I can do this. I can complete this. This looks overwhelming to me, but it's okay because I know I'm going to come out the other side triumphantly. So we're not going to go over this in the video. However, we are going to have an audit data branch where you can go check out, look at the answer key. And then one more final thing, teaming up with somebody else is incredibly powerful in the smart contract security world. So I don't want you to go this alone. I want you to find a buddy in the CodeHawks Discord or the Cypher Discord to do this together. And the purpose of that is so that you can learn how other people think about attack vectors. Team up with somebody, say, let's sync up in a week, in two weeks with our findings, maybe sync up every day, whatever you want to do, but get good at teaming up with people because that's how we're going to keep things safer. That's how we can get way better results, et cetera. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to go over all of the issues that we would find in section eight in this section 7.5. I want you to go to the Vault Guardians. I want you to team up with somebody and find as many bugs in this as possible, write your review, and then add it to your portfolio. Additionally, this Vault Guardians security review is really good because you're going to learn a lot about tokenized vaults or ERC4626 if you've never worked with that in DeFi before. And it is awesome. And this should be your final step. And then you can go on to your first CodeHawks competitive audit if you haven't already. So, so this is still going to be our final boss, but we're not going to review it in this video. I'm going to leave that up to you to review it. So it's really the true final boss. I'm not going to hold your hand through it. But we are going to go over the some of the attacks that do exist in there up in section 7.5. But for now, let's start with section 7.5 with one of the most ridiculous attacks. MEV. So MEV is an issue that plagues the world and it stands for minor extractable value or maximum extractable value. And it's when miners and block builders screw us over. So one of the best places to start learning about MEV is actually going to flashbots.net. It's a research and development organization formed to mitigate the negative externalities posed by maximum extractable value. If we go right to the docs, there's this new to MEV page, which is phenomenal. And I highly, highly recommend everybody reads everything that's going on in here. So to really understand MEV, we got to understand some lower level stuff about how the blockchain actually works. Typically, when we send a transaction, a user is going to send that transaction to some node and that node will then include it into a block on the blockchain. When you send like an RPC URL in MetaMask, that RPC URL is pointing to some node and that node is you know a node in the blockchain. However, when you send your transaction to one of those nodes in the chain, it doesn't just immediately include it into the block. What happens is each node has this thing called the mempool or the memory pool, where it takes this transaction and it sticks it into the memory pool first before adding to the blockchain. Now this mempool is kind of this abstract concept, but basically the idea is whenever we send a transaction, that transaction has to be validated by a node. But one node won't always get to validate a transaction, right? But other nodes might have to come in and validate the transaction because it's it might be their turn in a proof of state network. Node might not have enough power to do it, whatever. There are a lot of reasons for it to go into this mempool. The biggest one is speed. If the node doesn't put the transaction in the mempool, essentially you would have to wait for it to be the node's turn to validate a block for it to put it directly into the block. And that could take days, weeks, months. So nodes will pretty much always put it into this mempool thing. And this mempool, when they put it into this mempool thing, they basically fan it out to all these other nodes. They say, hey guys, I've got this transaction. Whose turn is it? Can somebody help me validate this? Can we, can we add this to the blockchain? And all these other nodes read and see this transaction that's going to be sent, but hasn't been sent yet. So what happens is we get some malicious users who want to use this to their advantage. A malicious user will be able to then read this mempool and see what your transaction is going to be. Since they're aware of your transaction, they can, in a way, predict the future. They can see into the future. Ooh, spooky. So these MEV bots can see that your transaction is going to go on chain, but isn't on chain yet. So they know that this transaction is coming. So what they decide to do is they decide to swoop in send their own transaction, maybe they put it on the mempool, maybe they don't, they send their own transaction onto the blockchain before your transaction goes through and they do what's called front running you. They beat you to the blockchain. They beat your transaction to the blockchain and you know they can do whatever they want here. So this is what the process looks like in a nutshell, but let's look at a more specific example here. 
A more minimized version of what this looks like is basically while a user's transaction is in flight, let's make the user green here because they're a green noob here, a malicious user might see their transaction and swoop in and do their own transaction before you get the chance. So here's a more minimal example of what this looks like. A user sends a transaction, some type of MEV bot sees this transaction in flight in this mempool, swoops in and sends a transaction themselves before yours comes in. Now this is just one specific type of MEV. This is called front running. And this is one of several different types of MEV or maximum extractable value. Let's look at an example where this front running thing could be could be bad. And let's use our puppy raffle as an example. In our puppy raffle, if we you know want to reload some of that context down here, we had this function called select winner. So a user would call select winner in a transaction. This transaction would be in flight. And this transaction, somebody could read this transaction and see winner equals A. MEV bot is user B. So winner is going to be user A, MEV bot or front runner is user B. Guess what? They see this transaction. They go, hold, wait, hold on just a minute. They see this transaction and they go, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be the winner. I don't want to, I don't want to be involved in this. I can't, I'm not going to win. So what they do is before the select winner transaction goes through, they call refund and pull their money out. So they go, nope, not on my watch. We're getting that refunded, refund, boom. So their transaction gets refunded. Select winner will eventually go through. And this winner, this user will get less money because user B front ran them and took their money out. So let's look at the full example. Let's say our raffle has 10 ETH in it and this user calls select winner. And this transaction says, hey, the winner is going to going to be user A. MEV bot user B sees this and they go, uh, uh, not on my watch. So they front run this transaction with their own transaction. They call refund. Let's say it was user B and all of user B's friends, they all called refund through this MEV bot. They subtracted nine. Now there's only one ETH in here because they called refund and took all their money out. So refund would be the second bit getting front run. Finally, the select winner transaction would finish going through after refund gets called and this winner only gets one ETH instead of what they should have got, which was 10 ETH. And it's because this MEV bot was able to swoop in and steal it. Well, what about in T-Swap? Was, was there an issue there? Uh, well, there absolutely was. If we go to SRC, we go to tswappool.sol. In T-Swap, in the deposit function, we had this input parameter deadline that was not being used. So what would happen if there was no deadline and someone called deposit? Well, let's go back to our example. Somebody calls deposit and they send it to a node who's friends with MEV bot user B. The node says, hey, wait, if they deposit, I'll have a smaller percentage share of the pool. And I know there's some big transactions coming through. So I'm just going to hang on to this transaction for a little bit. Let user B, this MEV bot, hit their deposit, hit their deposit first. And then only once user B has deposited, then finally let user A's deposit go through. So this is an example of front running, but the node, the miner actually acting maliciously. So it's not just user B scooping in front of them and front running them. User B and the miner of your transaction are actually colluding to give you a crappier deal. So this is still known as front running. This is with a node actually colluding with the MEV user. And then additionally, there's a worse type of attack here in T-Swap called sandwich attacks if you don't add a deadline to the swap. And just a hint, there's a big issue with that in the Vault Guardians audit. Okay, well, what about Thunderloan? Uh, does that one have an MEV issue too? There sure is. So our user is calling a flash loan to the Thunderloan contract, to the Thunderloan protocol, where the fee right now is 10 USDC. But remember, the fee comes directly from the T-swap pools. So MEV bot user B sees this flash loan coming in and goes, wait a minute, I want to make this fee way, way higher. So what they do is they come in, they front run this flash loan function and they do a malicious swap to change the balances from 10 USDC and one ETH to maybe 0 0.001 WETH and like a billion USDC. And since Thunderloan is using T-Swap as an Oracle, the fee now is like $1,000. The flash loan function finally hits and continues. Now that the fee has been changed, it goes on chain with the fee way higher. So let me one, two, 
three. The fee goes on chain with the loan way higher. And then the MEV person swaps back on step four and changes the balances back to being 110. This is known as a sandwich attack where somebody front runs you and then does something called back runs you where basically they see your, your transaction and then they step in and they do their transaction before and their transaction after. So even Thunder Loan is vulnerable to this. And then finally, the boss bridge is vulnerable to this as well. Once a signer sends that SRNV to the mempool, anybody else can see this and just front run their transaction with that same signature SRV. And this is why when we went over the boss bridge, we talked about protecting this with like a nunce or maybe saying the first time it must be sent by the signer. So you do like a check like message.sender equals equals signer maybe the first time this SRV goes through. You both need replay protection on the signer, but you also need front running protection. Every single one of our contracts was susceptible to this. To really drill this in, I'm going to show you live me getting front run in a even simpler example. And of course, if you go to the SC exploits minimized, you can scroll down to the MEV section or just look straight in the SRC folder for the code we're going to use in this demo. And I'm going to show you live me getting front run on the Ethereum chain with two different methodologies and show you how real this is and how hungry these bots are. So let's watch this video where I show you how I do get front run and then what I do to protect against it for this specific scenario. And the methodology that I use here is good for users to do, but ideally protocols want to have built in protections against MEV as well. The solution we use here is going to be this thing called flashbots, but a better solution would be to actually rewrite these contracts to make them MEV resistant. But in any case, let's watch this. How do you not get front run sandwich attacked and MEV'd in the ETH ecosystem? Let's find out. So for those of you who don't know, MEV is this thing where just by nature of you sending a transaction, there's a chance that you're actually losing more hey. money than what shows up in MetaMask. I'll leave some docs in the description for you to learn more. And the question then becomes, okay, well, how do we protect ourselves against this thing? Well, Flashbox has this product called Flashbots Protect, which if you go to the documentation for it, we can see here it says, Flashbots Protect makes it easy for everyday users and developers to use Flashbots for front-running protection. So, as scientists, we are going to test this theory by recreating the Scott B. How to Get Front Run on Ethereum Mainnet experiment. He did this experiment a few years ago. He shows how easily it is for bots to front-run you, and we're going to do the same thing. So, we're here in Remix. We have this contract called Withdraw Me. We're going to have an error here called bad withdraw. If something breaks, we're going to have a secret hash that's going to include some password, success and fail. We're going to have a constructor where we send money to it with this secret hash, right? So we're going to have a password. We're going to encode it so it's a secret hash. We're going to store that on chain. And only if you have the password will you be able to decrypt this hash. And that's what our withdraw function is going to do. It's going to take this password in. If the password cracks the hash, Great, we will get all the money back. Otherwise, we will revert and we will emit a success. Otherwise, we will emit a fail. And then we have a balance function to see what all of our money is. So this is our whole contract that we're going to be playing with. We can even make sure that this works by testing it in Remix. So I'm going to, it's called Withdraw Me here. We're going to give it one Ether on the deployment. We're going to give it a lot less when we test it. And we're going to come up with a password. We're going to use cast to come up with a password. Our password is going to be sign up for code hawks, one, two, three frogs rule. Enter. This is the hash of that password. So sign up for code hawks, one, two, three frogs rule creates this hash. So only if you have this password, should you be able to get this hash. So we're going to take this, paste it in for the secret hash. We'll hit deploy with one. We deploy our contract down here. If we hit balance, we see we have a balance of one. We can see this secret hash. Now, if we take this password, copy it, paste it in here. I hit with, oh, and actually if we scroll up, we see we have 97.999 ETH in here. If we pass this password in, hit withdraw, we scroll up, we see we have 98. 
we see the balance of this contract is now zero. And if we pull up our terminal, we see our most recent transaction. We should scroll down and we should see a success on this withdraw function here. Scroll down. We do, we do need to see a success. If we were to put anything else in here, like one, two, three, four, one, and we hit withdraw, it would still go through, but it would emit a failure right here, a failure event. Now that we've tested it out, we're going to go ahead and test it on mainnet. I'm going to spend some real money to do this. So the way it works is first, we're going to test it without Flashbox Protect, and we should see ourselves get front run. And then we're going to test it with Flashbox Protect, and we should not get front run. Let's see if that happens. So here we are with my MEV tester MetaMask. I have 0.05 ETH in here, or $94, hopefully enough that it's tantalizing for a bot to want to steal from us. We're going to go ahead and hit withdraw, but what's probably going to happen here is some other node is going to see our withdraw transaction in the mempool. They're going to copy our transaction and they're going to take the money out before we do. So let's go ahead. Same deal. And we're using a regular old Infura endpoint for this. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to delete this. We're going to go to injected provider MetaMask. We're going to have to go to way. So we're going to do how much money should we put in here? So we want to do 0.025 ether. So that's this much way. We're going to copy that. Paste it in here for way. Oh, excellent. We're going to deploy with this hash, which has, which has our password here. Let's go ahead and deploy this transaction to mainnet. MetaMask pops up. It's going to cost us another $16 in gas. Uh. We're going to confirm a few inches later and great we have our withdraw me contract if we hit balance we can see the balance in here we can see the secret hash we copy it we go to ether scan we can indeed see the contract here we can indeed see the value in here and we can refresh and nobody's going to steal the money because a they'd have to find this contract b they'd have to verify this contract and c they'd have to know our password so right now it's very difficult for a bot to come and see it but the instant the instant we send our transaction, a bot is going to swoop in and steal the money from us. I'm going to copy this address. I'm going to paste it in. I'll hit confirm. And just by me sending this transaction, I know it says completed now, but while it was pending, other bots got to sniff out and smell that transaction. So they probably front ran me. And if you can see here, you see that we didn't get that $2 back. We go to our transactions here. It says, oh, hey, there was a withdrawal that went through and this is our transaction, but if we look in our wallet, we didn't get that money back. There's definitely less than 0 0.025 ETH in here, so we didn't get it. You got scammed. The balance is clearly zero. If we click on the transaction, the withdraw, we can see zero money went through, but we can go to internal transactions and we can see some other jerk snagged it from us and took our money and they paid 532 guay for it which if we do eth converter they paid about 45 dollars in here to get 50 dollars worth of eth you can see in this internal transaction transfer 0.025 eth from somebody to somebody and then from that somebody to somebody else and we can even see who sent it we can see is this person here so this person is obviously an MEV bot. It looks like they've got about $16,000 from their MEVing, right? And it looks like they actually score a find every, you know, every once in a while, right? So it's just running, creating them passive money. So we've seen us successfully get front run by an MEV bot and lose our $50. What an expensive experiment. Maybe I'll do try to do a little bit cheaper this time. So we're going to run this again. But this time we're going to use Flashbots Protect RPC, and we'll see if we get front run. So we're in the exact same contract that we have, but I topped up our funds here back up to $100, 0.5 ETH here. And we're going to do the same thing, except now we're going to switch from Ethereum mainnet endpoint to our Flashbots Protect endpoint. They've got plenty of docs to teach you how to do this really easily. We're going to do a different password this time. This time it's going to be sign up for CodeHawks. Ka, ka, ka. One, two, three, four, five, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. Cat. Boom. Here's our hash. We're going to copy this. Come back over. 
get rid of this old contract that just rugged us. We're going to deploy this again. We're using the flash bots protect RPC, which shouldn't matter because we're just deploying. We're going to send 0 0.025 to 4 this time, a little bit less for these scammers. Paste that in here. We'll hit deploy. We get this thing comes up, confirm. MetaMask comes up now. And again, this is just us deploying this. Go ahead and confirm. And once this goes through, we'll have another contract. What's kind of interesting, if you look at this on Etherscan, you get, get this little pop-up. This transaction is made through the Flashbots Protect RPC and is not shared to the public Ethereum transaction pool. So that's kind of cool. It's going to take us a little bit longer to deploy this through Flashbots Protect because they have fewer nodes. Basically, they have to wait for one of their nodes to be able to submit a block. If we go back to our Etherscan, can see we've created this contract. It's got zero point. It's got about $42 worth of ETH in it. And Flashbots Protect should protect us. We should not get front run. When I send a transaction, that transaction should be the one to get the money out, right? Well, let's find out. So we know what the password, sign up for code hawks, caw, 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 this whole thing, cat, paste it in, withdraw. Let's confirm. Now we can view this on Etherscan and we should again see this transaction. This transaction is made through the Flashbots Protect RPC and not shared to the public Ethereum transaction pool. And we'll kick back and wait another 10 minutes. A few inches later. Actually, this one did not take 10 minutes. This one went through pretty quickly. It's already done. This one took about 60 seconds. The withdraw definitely went through. Do I have the money? Actually, surprisingly enough, in a great way, if we click our transaction and we scroll down, we see there's still zero value, but we can see we transfer 0 0.024 ETH from blah, blah, blah to this address. And this is us. So it looks like Flashbots Protect did protect us from MEV. So it looks like we do get front running protection. We didn't get a failed transaction, which was great. So we have successfully verified that Flashbots Protect does indeed protect you from MEV. Okay, now that you got to see that happen actually live, you might still have some questions. A, uh, I can probably block this with maybe some type of a bouncer contract. If I if I add a bunch of obscurity, that'll make it helpful, right? Well, we're gonna watch this next video just to really drill it in. These bots are very intelligent. And I'm gonna show you me getting front run again by an MEV bot. Even when I add some obscurities and some abstraction, these bots are still intelligent enough to, to read our transactions and front run us. So let's go ahead and watch this quick video on getting front run again, but with seemingly safer contracts. Today, we're doing science. Now, if you saw my last video, you know MEV is real. And if you haven't seen that video, go watch that video first before coming here. We had some users theorize easy ways to block the MEV. Like this one, hey, would you still get front run if there was an access control? Like if message.sender is not Patrick's address, then revert. Now, obviously, if our withdraw function had only owner, of course, that would block an MEV bot. However, most of the time, you're not gonna have access to the contract that you're trying to interact with. As you saw in the last video, if we as a user directly called this withdraw function without a private RPC, we would get front run. So the theory here is, well, what if we deployed an intermediate contract that had an only owner function? That way, if the MEV bot tries to front run this transaction, they will get blocked since they're not only owner. Sort of like an MEV contract bouncer. So let's potentially waste another 50 bucks trying to figure this out. To test this, we're going to build an intermediary contract called Don't MEV Me. And right in the constructor, we're going to have an owner and then the address of the contract that normally gets front run, but we're hoping this contract will block. And we're going to save the owner and the, and the contract that we're going to call as storage variables. In order for us to interact with the contract, we're of course going to use an interface. And the bulk of the work is going to be done in this go function, which is going to take a password to add to the withdraw function. And right here in the first line, we see if message.sender is not equal owner, we should revert. Then we're going to call withdraw. The money should go to this contract. And then we're going to send the money back to us. And of course, in order for this contract to receive any funds, we need to have a receive function. So this will be the full bouncer contract, the same mev -able contract as before. Let's ride. To get started, we can see in our MetaMask, we have around $76 or 0.45 
ETH. We're going to deploy our MEV contract with a password. The password is going to be the Foundry stablecoin had too many bugs, WTF. That's the hash. We're going to paste it in here. We're going to deploy this contract with 0.02 ETH or around $40. And we'll hit deploy. We'll confirm sending this. And great, on Etherscan, we can see our contract has been created with around $40 in it, and we can see it in Remix here. So now we flip over to Don't MEV, and we're gonna deploy our bouncer contract with the address of the MEV contract as the input parameter. I did top this up with a little bit more ETH in order to deploy this second contract. We've added the address in here. Hit deploy, confirm, and this has indeed gone through. So now we have two contracts here. One that's the MEV contract, and then one that's our bouncer contract. If we were to call withdraw right now, as we know, we would get front run. But if we call the bouncer contract, are we gonna get front run? <laughs> yeah, we'll be safe, right? Well, you know the drill. We're grabbing our password. We're gonna stick it in here. And we're gonna hit the go button. Here's how much money we currently have. Now, if this works, this number should go up. But if this doesn't go up, it means the MEV bots are smart enough to see this, dissect the bytecode, and go around our bouncer contract directly to the contract itself. All right, let's do some science to check this out. Confirm. A few inches later. We are definitely poorer. So if we go to our contract that previously had $40 in it and now has nothing, and we scroll down to transactions, you can see here, somebody did call the withdraw function, but this address is not our bouncer. This is somebody else. They skipped the line. In our bouncer contract, our go function did get called. We just didn't get any money. So we can actually see who called this withdraw transaction, who front ran us, and we can see it looks like, sure enough, this is indeed an MEV bot doing MEV. If we select their transaction, we can see how much they paid in gas for this. They only paid a dollar. So they made a $39 profit off of this front running transaction. Now this means the monsters are more terrifying than even you thought they were. The reason it's easy for them to do this is because again, in the mempool, they can see in the bytecode when a contract calls another contract. So. They just skip the line and just call the other contract directly. So if you think you're going to be clever and use a bouncer only only contract to block MEV, think again, you will still get front run. Hope you learned something. Stay froggy and we'll see you next time. So hopefully I've drilled into you that MEV is real and there are bots out there looking to steal your money. This is something we always want to think about when we're doing manual security reviews. And this is something that I feel like we as an industry right now are not that good at. To me, looking at the industry, there's two major, major bugs or ideologies that are being way under indexed on right now. Number one is MEV, and number two is writing stateful fuzzing in variant test suites. And then number three being wallet and centralization security. But to me, those are some of the top things that we can fix right now, and it would make Web3 a substantially better place. There's lots of different types of MEV, and some people would argue that there's toxic and untoxic MEV. Toxic MEV is gonna be like front running, maybe stealing somebody's funds, whereas non-toxic MEV would be something like arbitrage, right? Something we talked about earlier with doing flash loans. People, some people argue that that's actually non-toxic, that's healthy for the environment. I would love to hear your thoughts on this after doing a little bit more research. In my opinion, front running and sandwich attacks are definitely toxic, whereas stuff like arbitrage is actually fine and healthy for a market. And to help us go over different types of MEV, as well as see some case studies of different findings that people have actually submitted, we have independent researcher Peshav here to go over that with us. Take it away, Peshav. Hello guys and welcome. This is my guest lecture for uh, MEV or maximum extractable value. Um, I'm Pashov. I got invited by Patrick, who is a great guy. He's uh, creating the best content in the space, basically. He now decided to create his own Web3 security course, which is great. We will all benefit from it. And yes, I accepted the offer to create a guest lecture here and just to share my experience, my knowledge about MEV. So without further ado, let's get going and talk about what is MEV. Basically, MEV, as I said, is maximum extractable value, or some people uh, explain it as minor extractable value. But uh, basically, it has a few forms. Uh, and uh, how can I explain it more simply? It's like a very important part of the Ethereum ecosystem and the way it works. Because uh, with, without MEV, we would have uh, a lot of problems with pricing because we will have uh, different prices on different exchanges. Uh, we will have much lower liquidations um, and we will actually have a little bit less problems with some of the bad things with MEV, which uh, we're now 
I'm not now going to show you some of them. So yeah, here are the four forms of MEV. Basically, you have, as I already mentioned, you have arbitrage. So this is basically uh, when, let's say, we have a price on Uniswap for uh, BTC USDT. So selling Bitcoin for uh, USDT dollars, Tether. Um, we can have the same pool, the same price, uh, Bitcoin to dollar uh, with the BTC to USDT pool. And let's say somebody buys uh, like 10 or 100 Bitcoin from the first pool. Now the price will be much different because when we buy a lot of uh, BTC from the pool, the price will shoot up. This will mean that we will have um, different prices for BTC to Tether and BTC to USDC. So here an MEV bot, an arbitrager comes in and he will uh, rebalance the pools. He will do some swaps. He can use a flash loan, for example, and uh, the prices will become become roughly the same, which is a good thing because this way we have the correct price discovery. We can know the actual price. Otherwise, we will have different pricing prices for assets uh, on each exchange, which would be very bad, catastrophic, especially for lending platforms, for example, and oracles as well. Um, we have sandwiches. Uh, which I'm not going to explain right now because I will talk to you a little bit more about them later in this presentation. We have liquidations. So liquidations, uh, if you have used lending uh, borrowing platforms, you know that uh, usually, let's say you want to uh, borrow, let's say a, a thousand USDT, a thousand Tether tokens, and you have um, one Ether, one Ethereum token, which is um, valued at around $2,000, let's say. So you can lock that Ethereum token and you can borrow a thousand US dollars. But uh, then if um, this you have a loan now, and then if the Ethereum price goes below a thousand dollars, then your, uh, your loan will be possible to be liquidated and has to be liquidated because the platform will accrue bad debt, especially if it has already gotten below a thousand dollars, the value of ether of one ether, uh, it has to be liquidated like uh, immediately. So basically with liquidations, we need to do it as fast as possible. So platforms uh, do not get this, those bad debts. And uh, this is where MEV comes in. Uh, so a lot of bots, which bots are basically um, smart contracts. It's like code because it works the fastest. And uh, then we have some off-chain component, which is uh, tracking the and monitoring the, the blockchain and the current state of the chain. So it can just query on each Ethereum block, block if uh, a loan is liquidatable. And when it is, it can, it can immediately liquidate it. So this is a good thing, actually. It is good that uh, liquidatable loans are liquidated as soon as possible. So lending platforms do not accrue bad debt. It's a good thing. And finally, we have JIT, which is just-in-time liquidity. This is, uh, this is an attack. So this is a bad thing as well. Um, <clears throat> it's part of uh, platforms like uh, Uni Uniswap V3. So in Uniswap V3, you basically have fragmented liquidity. So you have price ticks or price buckets. And let's say for the Ethereum price, let's say the Ether token price is uh, $2,000. You can provide liquidity uh, saying uh, the Ether price is uh, $1,990. Uh, you can provide liquidity when it's $2,000. You can provide liquidity when it's $2,010, etc. So, um, when the price shoots up, if the price is $2,000 and somebody does a swap, this liquidity that you provided at this exact price will be used up. But somebody uh, bought an MEV smart contract, a smart contract with an off-chain uh, monitoring service can actually see that somebody is about to do a swap uh, on Uniswap for um, swapping Ether at $2,000. Uh, or 2000 USDT, let's say, and uh, the MEV bot can front run you 
uh, can front run this transaction and can actually provide liquidity exactly at that price point, exactly for this price bucket. This will make it so that uh, their liquidity will be used up before yours, quite possibly, or a part of it will be used up and a part of yours will be used up. But uh, the, the fees that the liquidity providers, so you and the MEV bot uh, get, will be split between you. So basically, they provided liquidity just in time. So that's why it's called just in time liquidity. And after the swap, they will just remove their liquidity. So they are doing something like it's like a sandwich because it's front run and a back run at the same time. And uh, they're stealing some of the uh, LP liquidity provider fees that should have been for you. So it's a bad thing. Um, here I shared, I think, actually, since this is a video, you won't be able to uh, open this link. I don't know why I put this link, but uh, you can look up on Google, just write down uh, Galaxy MEV. So this is a great article. They have a two, two parts, uh, two part blog post for MEV. Uh, Galaxy do great research for uh, blockchain Ethereum based topics. And the first part of their MEV series, block series, is absolutely great. Uh, you can do a deeper dive even than this video uh, to look more at exactly what exactly is MEV, um, how it is used on Ethereum, which part of it is good, which part of it is bad, can we do without MEV, and etc. Et but yeah, this is a security course, so let's continue with this. And... Uh, let's go deeper into sandwiches so who doesn't like sandwiches everybody likes sandwiches it's a great thing it's so tasty but on on ethereum sandwiches are not a good thing and they're basically a form of an attack so um here okay i have uh, two examples here provided uh, and of course, there are screenshots. I have links again, but links won't work. But with the screenshots, you'll be able to see them. Um, there are screenshots from Solidit, which is a great tool. It's uh, built by the Cyphering guys, so the company of Patrick. It's one of the best tools right now for Web3 security researchers. I use it almost every day. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'm about to show you two different vulnerabilities, high severity ones that can be, have been reported. I think one of them is on Sherlock uh, and the researchers have been paid quite well since it's a high severity vulnerability. And the other one is on Spearbit. Uh, it, it has been done on a Spearbit audit by, by the team there. Uh, but really quickly about sandwiches. So I mentioned already, I explained to you uh, what just-in-time liquidity is, um, which is again form of an attack. And actually when you're auditing uh, Uniswap V3 forks or contracts like this. This is, uh, I would say, an acceptable issue to actually uh, just share it with the team. Almost uh, 90 plus percent of the time, the teams who fork Uniswap V3 should be uh, well aware of this just-in-time liquidity issue. But I think it's still worth it to maybe include it in the report or at least uh, discuss it with uh, with the developers. But yeah, sandwiches are a bit close to just-in-time liquidity because, again, you have a front-run transaction and a back-run transaction. Uh, how it works is basically, uh, again, with the example where somebody wants to, uh, let's say somebody wants to buy Ether uh, from the pool ETH USDT, where Ether, one Ether equals 2,000 USDT. So basically... Um, if a user just, uh, let's say a user says, uh, I'm, he wants to buy Ether, but uh, of course the price can be moving, can, it can move up or down. So let's say he provides a little bit more in terms of USDT to buy the Ether token, uh, so that he can be certain that he will get it. Uh, and let's say he provides uh, $2,200 dollars, um, to receive one ether at a price of $200 and uh, he will expect whatever is left uh, I mean if the price is 2000 and if he, he has sent 2200 he should receive back 200 USDT plus one ether this is what he expects if the price doesn't change 
Uh, but this is not the case. And uh, if somebody sees this and if the user uh, has said, I am okay with paying up to 200 more, even if the price wasn't about to change, somebody can front run this transaction. So he can uh, do a pull imbalance buying so much ether um, with, with some, he can put in so much uh, USDT into the pool, buying so much ether that the price becomes 2,200. And then he, after the user buys for this price, he can actually dump his tokens that he just bought. He can dump the ether because now the, now the price will be 2,200 and they'll be able to uh, sell them at a profit with a back run transaction. So it's a bit more complex than this. This is a simplified explanation. But let's go through the issues really quickly um, and see how this works. Okay, I think this is better. So basically you can see that uh, the, the vulnerability says the vote executes swap without slippage protection. This will cause a loss of funds because of sandwich attacks. So what is slippage protection? As I gave you this example, uh, slippage protection is basically the user saying, uh, I'm, as I said, the user can say, I'm fine paying up to $2,200, let's say, uh, even though the price was 2000 This is like saying, I'm okay with paying 10% extra. This is my slippage tolerance. Uh, if it's more than 10% of a price difference, I just do not want the transaction to be executed or I want it to revert because I would lose too much. I cannot allow myself to pay more than 2200 so uh, Uniswap has a built-in mechanism with this. It's called slippage protection. Uh, but let's let's go through the finding to see what the problem actually is. Um, so slippage protection, slippage protection is pretty good. I mean, if you put in one percent a slippage protection, if you are if in our example ether is priced at two thousand, you would be fine with paying up to two thousand and twenty dollars which is perfectly fine. This is not a crazy big difference. Uh, but still, again, uh, if it's profitable for an MEV bot, you can still get sandwiched. But you have to uh, have in mind that bots have to pay. If they do a sandwich attack, they do two transactions. So basically, it's like a front run transaction and a back run transaction. That's why it's, it's called a sandwich, because uh, the, the front run and the back run are like the, the, the bread and your transaction is like the meat. So it's not good for you. It's not good for you to be between those front run and back, back run transaction. You will be losing money. But uh, but yeah, if you have um, the, the the attacker has to pay gas fees as well. So you, you have to have this in mind. If it's not profitable for them, uh, as I said, if they are just about to make $20 and if they have to pay $15 in taxes, it's quite possible that uh, they won't do it. But some bots are configured in a way that uh, five dollars is still a good profit, so you have to be really careful. It's it's like an art choosing your slippage uh, pr protection, slippage tolerance. So let's go through the through the finding. Basically, it says that in some contract, in some methods, swaps are executed through blah blah some library, and it basically calculates the slippage parameters itself. But uh, the vulnerability finding says this doesn't work because it would have been, it should have been the price so basically here if you go below to, through the code let's go a little bit here okay okay so here in the code we can see we call the quote exact input function of uniswap which basically says if we give the exact amount of input tokens let's say we have um 2000 usdt how much uh, are we going to receive at a minimum and basically later we do the swap the problem with this is that this is not slippage, slippage protection because when we did the swap, we sent this value and we said we want to receive at least amount out minimum tokens, which was calculated a second ago. But this is done in the same transaction. So the problem with this is that the quote exact input method from Uniswap, um, this should have been done in another transaction or not even in a transaction because it's a view method. It should have been done off chain. We should have seen uh, if we spend $2,000, how much are we expected to receive in terms of ether. 
Um, then we can add some slippage tolerance. Let's say uh, we are okay with uh, receiving at, at least 0 0.999 uh, of it. And um, if we receive if we receive less than this, the transaction should revert. And this is the intention here. But actually, since it's done in the same transaction, if uh, a sandwich attacker, if an MVV bot was trying to attack attack us and to do um, to actually front run the transaction, the swap transaction, to imbalance the pool, put it into an imbalanced state then this quote would have been done on the imbalance pool state. So actually, if uh, the front run transaction made it cost $4,000, here it would still say, uh, well, if you put in um, 2,000 uh, USDT, you would get at least 0 0.5 ETH. And you, st you still lose a lot of money. I mean, it was costing 2000 but you paid 2000 for half an ETH. So yeah, and then after the, this transaction executes, the, the MEV bot will, will just backrun you. He'll dump his tokens at the price of uh, 4000 um, US dollars or even more since you bought in as well. And uh, you lose money. I mean, you receive only 0 0.5 ETH. Yeah, this is how an MEV sandwich attack works. Now let's look at the second example, which is pretty similar to this one. Uh, let me just put it into the screen so we can all see clearly. So yeah, basically here it's a high risk severity vulnerability finding from Spearbit, from a Spearbit report on IRA vault. I think this is the IRA audit. And basically it says that some methods here are susceptible to sandwich attacks, which basically the issue is saying, let's read it together. Um, so these functions are susceptible to sandwich attacks. And let's see. And here, um, basically the proof of concept or the way that these attacks happens is uh, showing you that um, the treasury, so this contract that is vulnerable, uh, or whoever calls it actually, uh, wants to add another 3000 die into the vault, and it calls a deposit function. But uh, if an MEV bot or attacker sees it, who monitors the, the mempool, uh, he can just front run the transaction, he can swap some die into the balancer pool, and uh, then this uh, this will imbalance the pool. This will put it, put the pool into imbalance state. And now, as you see, the price of wrapped ether will become twelve thousand uh, dollars, which would mean let's let's just show it a little bit better. Now the three thousand die that uh, was deposited into the balancer pool are worth only zero point four ether, which uh, shouldn't be the case, wrapped ether, but. Uh, this is because of the inflation in the pool with the front run transaction. Now the attacker can back, back run the transaction and swap the half on uh, wrapped ether they got uh, into DAI. And now they will get a profit of 330 DAI. Basically, you can see also potential mitigations. So, I mean, always when you uh, see that some, uh, some code is doing swaps, on on chain, you should always have uh, a minimum amount received parameter. This is very important, and it should always be calculated off chain. Because if it's on chain, if it's in the same transaction, um, it will be calculated against the pool, which can be imbalanced uh, by an attacker who can create a, a big front run uh, swap transaction. So yeah, here we have potential mitigations where you can do a two-step deposit and withdrawal model, uh, which basically doesn't allow um, front running and back running. Another possible solution is to not allow swaps when another swap or not allow deposits or withdrawals here when another one has happened in the same block. This is possible by checking if this uh, last change block variable has changed. Uh, it just has to be different than the current block number. This is another possible solution, but as you see, this doesn't avoid multi-block MEV attacks, which are also possible. Another good solution is to add, similar to slippage protection, as uh, the reporter here says, 
basically you can add a minimum amount received parameter or something like a boundary, just slippage protection and revert the, tr the transaction if you received less tokens than expected. Again, this boundary, uh, should the number should be calculated off-chain so that uh, the quote, the calculation of this number cannot be front-run. And another possible solution, which is also great, this is great for all uh, front-running vulnerabilities, is to make your client uh, enforce them to always use flashbots, basically a private mempool, where uh, you get a, basically a guarantee that front-running is not possible and that your transactions are not getting sandwiched, uh, etc. So basically, those two... Uh, let me zoom out to show you this, which is the most important part. Uh, please don't ever miss MEV bucks. Uh, you can read a lot more on Solidit by uh, searching for MEV and for Sandwich, for um, even for JIT, just in time liquidity. You have some findings regarding this. But yeah, always uh, when it comes to protect, protecting from Sandwich attacks, whenever you do deposits into some pools, whenever you do swaps, you should always have um, when you can when you do even providing liquidity because providing liquidity also especially in Uniswap v2 for example you receive liquidity tokens so it's pretty important how many liquidity tokens you receive so again you have to have uh, minimum liquidity tokens received parameter this is very important otherwise um, somebody can front run and sandwich your liquidity provision is the same as in a swap but i will leave this up to you you can read more about uh, sandwich attacks on providing liquidity uh, on solid and uh, please don't ever miss mv bucks now let's talk about mv protection the first and probably most important thing we can do to protect against mv is our improve our designs if we go to, back to our puppy raffle here we go to the src we pop in here what would be a way that we could protect this from MEV? And a reminder, the issue again is that when somebody calls select winner, they can simulate that transaction in the mempool. They can say, ah, oh, I didn't win. And then they can just front run it and call refund and get their money back and not actually have to participate in the raffle. Well, we could do a couple things. Actually, let me pull this up in VS Code. What we could do is we could add another function in here, something like function end raffle. And then we could do all these, you know, all these requires in here as well. And then maybe add some state variable you know, like boolean is ending equals false have is ending be true and if is ending is true in the refund function we say if is ending revert and this would block people from being able to refund if they see that the select winner isn't themselves so this is the first thing we can do against mev we can add these protections into the contract itself and this should be what we as security researchers look for we do not want to put the onus on users to have to send all their transactions in a private mempool which is the next next piece of protection we'll talk about in a second there's no blanket statement for how to improve your designs to block against mev but you always want to be asking and maybe you should add this to your checklist you always basically want to be asking for every single function every single transaction if someone sees this transaction in the mempool how can they abuse that knowledge? For select winner, if someone sees select winner in the mempool, for puppy raffle, they go, ah, I'm not the winner, I'm going to refund. And that's not fair. So that's the first way we can mitigate that issue. And then what's next? Well, the next bit we can mitigate it is going to be using some type of private or dark mempool. Flashbots protect, MEV blocker, secure RPC. These are different ways where instead of you sending your transaction to a public mempool, make this public i'm going to put this public mempool way up here and, and super minimize it you can send it to a private mempool where it doesn't put your transaction into a public mempool it keeps the transaction for itself until it's ready to post it on chain now there's a little bit of trust here you obviously have to trust that this private mempool is actually going to keep it private and they're not going to front run you and there's some other cons as well like your transaction probably won't get put on chain as quickly right because the reason the public mempool works so well is because other nodes can come in and help validate your transaction in a private mempool it happens much slower if you want to see this in action I highly recommend you go over to Flashbots Protect, grab the RPC that they give you, stick it in MetaMask, add it to MetaMask the normal way, and see how much longer the transaction actually takes you. Now, especially when you're doing swapping, you can run into issues with slippage protection. 
this is definitely a big MEV issue. So for example, in the T-swap audit, in the, we had these weird function swap exact input where we put the input amount and the minimum output amount. If you set the minimum output amount to zero, what an MEV bot could do is they could do a massive swap, make the reserves balance a really crappy amount, so you get a really crappy output amount. So this is why we have this min output amount in the T-swap pool and in Uniswap and in most DEXs, so that you are protected against these MEV bots that want to give you really crappy deals. So those minimum output amounts are known as slippage protection and we will see this type of attack on a lot of protocols that forget to implement it. We've just learned a ton about MEV. Let's do a quick refresher of what we've learned. So MEV is when we send a transaction to the mempool and some bot or node or miner sees this transaction and uses the knowledge from our transaction to their advantage. There's lots of different types of MEV attacks like front running, sandwiching attacks, etc. The question that we want to ask to prevent against this is if someone saw this transaction in the mempool, how can they abuse that knowledge? And then how do we mitigate it? There are two ways to mitigate it are number one, using a better design. And then number two, using a private RPC or a dark RPC pool or a dark node that doesn't fan our transaction out to the public mempool like Flash Bots Protect, MEV Blocker, or Secure RPC. We saw that this is not some imaginary fake belief thing. We saw me get MEV'd in real time, actually lose real money on the Ethereum blockchain just to prove a point. These bots are real and they are scary and they are looking for any opportunity to make money. So congratulations, you now know about MEV. All right, next, governance attack. So our Vault Guardians audit is actually controlled by a DAO, which is really cool. DAOs are phenomenal, but if they're done incorrectly, they can have a lot of issues. So first, we're going to have Juliet give a high-level overview of governance attacks, and then we're going to have some people give a much more in-depth review of a governance attack, how it happened, and how it went down. Governance attacks. What are they, and why do they matter? Hello. My name is Julia Chevalier. I am the head of Debra at Siphon. And today we'll be going through governance attacks as a hacker side door into stealing a protocol's funds. So to kick things off, what are these? You can see governance attacks as attacks that are going through a governance proposal rather than usually some cryptographic way to exploit vulnerabilities within a protocol's code base. So, in order for these to occur, this perfect setting needs to exist. There needs to be a group of people, accounts, who are collectively managing assets through some type of governance mechanism. Of course, these assets may either be a protocol's code base, making changes like upgradability, changes to a contract state, ownership, etc. Or it may just be a contract with a bunch of assets, usually known as a treasury. Now, these types of governance mechanisms differ from organization to organization. Some organizations have one token, one vote. Others have one address equals X amount of vote. Um, some may require different uh, amounts of approval in order for a transaction and a proposal to go through. Essentially, there's tons of different ways. And what the attacker is doing is that it's using this governance mechanism in order to access the assets that that group collectively manages. So how are they doing that? Number one, the attacker will go ahead and publish a proposal for the DAO. Now, this proposal will come with an action. This action can either be hey, transfer all of the assets into my address, or often it'll go a bit more complex in granting X address uh, access to perform X action or change the contract state in a way that benefits them in the longer term. Now, once that proposal is published, it needs to be approved. So oftentimes, attackers will want to get more than 50% of uh, the voting power in order to get these proposals approved, or will work out ways in which the action is not really doing what the public may think that that action is doing. Now, assuming the proposal passes, at that point, that action can be executed. And ultimately, that is when the funds are stolen. 
So we can look at an example um, in which this scenario will come to life and in which the incentives are aligned for the attacker to steal the millions. We may have uh, a scenario where you have an organization that is using a one token, one vote approach. So in this case, we have an organization with a market cap of tokens uh, valued at 10 million and a treasury size that is also worth 10 million. In this scenario, why would I spend, say, 10 million buying tokens in order to access the treasury if this size is the same? You wouldn't. However, things may change. A token may lose value enormously, yet the organization still manages assets that are worth more than the value of that token. In that case, the setting is perfect for someone to buy, say, $5 million worth of tokens of that organization in order to access $100 million of the treasury. Another example may be that malicious transaction that I was telling you about earlier. Um, some examples where this has happened is Yam Finance, um, where the transaction was malicious and eventually ended up granting control of the reserves to an unknown third party. Alternatively, um, in Build that Finance DAO, the attacker essentially voted themselves into power and was able to control the entirety of the funds. Now, this is quite scary, right? How do we prevent this from happening? I think the most important point to always remember is that this is truly a people's problem. And so oftentimes, the way to prevent this is through that governance mechanism that the organization is having. Of course, centralization of power will solve that. If you're not having an open vote or an open discussion on how to manage your assets or your protocol, then the risk is minimized because the centralization of power is incentivized to keep things as they are. On a second layer, uh, you may want to think strategically about how to distribute the voting power across your members. The more aligned and the more permissioned that this is, the less likely this attack uh, is likely to occur as hackers are not um, able to enter into the ecosystem. Thirdly, we have guardians. Guardians have become quite popular in recent time, particularly for larger DAOs, at the expense of decentralization. However, they act as great buffers because in, before a proposal is able to be published for open vote, these guardians will review whether the, the transaction action is malicious, whether um, it's actually doing what we think it's doing, whether it's legal, whether it's financially viable for the organization to pursue. And so they act as a buffer so that proposal doesn't even get to the open vote if these conditions are objectively not met. Of course, gradual decentralization helps as well. And certainly having an emergency plan in case this occurs is a great way to ensure and have a last minute effort at preventing a critical attack on your protocol. Hope this gave you a nice overview of what these are, why these matter and how to prevent them and how they are this hacker side door into getting funds without actually having to exploit vulnerabilities within the protocol itself. Thank you. Hello guys, it's Johnny time and now we are going to learn about one of the biggest governance and DAO voting manipulation attack where $182 million were stolen from the Beanstalk protocol. This is the Beanstalk case study. So this is the main announcement from the docs about the Beanstalk hack. You can pause this video and read it. Let's talk about some numbers and highlights. So $182 million were stolen from the, this is the loss for the Beanstalk protocol. Out of it, $76 million were profited to the attacker who executed the attack and were laundered through Tornado Cash. Well, out of these $182 million, one of six millions were paid back in flash loan fees to Aave and flash swap fees to Uniswap. It's a governance manipulation attack, and it's also highly sophisticated with a lot of obfuscation on the attacker's side. But before we begin, my name is Johnny, known as Johnny Time, and I'm doing cybersecurity since 2011. I love teaching, I love education, and I'm educating people and students 
all over the world since 2011 about cybersecurity and these days about blockchain security. I'm a DeFi pro user since 2020, and I transitioned completely from traditional cybersecurity to Web3 security. I'm an educator in the space, and I'm teaching people through all my channels about blockchain security on YouTube, on Twitter, and LinkedIn, and I'm the creator of the famous practical smart contract hacking course. So what are we going to have today? First, we're going to talk about Beanstalk protocol and how it works so we can have some background. Then we're going to see that no one cares about governance among DeFi and Web3 users, but we do care about governance and we'll see why governance is important and why we should care about governance. Then we're going to talk about the issue and the vulnerability that existed in the Beanstalk protocol, the preparation of the attacker, how we prepared very, very thoroughly his attack plan and the execution, how we executed the attack and make this huge loss for the protocol and for the users. So before we dive into the attack that took place, let's understand what is Beanstalk protocol. It's a decentralized credit system. What? What does it mean? So we have a bean, which is a stable coin, which is supposed to be $1, like other stable coins, USDT, USDC, and DAI. But it's not collateralized, because if USDT is collateralized with, user, with US treasuries and with dollars, and USDC as well, or DAI is collateralized with other crypto assets, such as stable coins, and other assets such as ETH and RAP BTC, BIN is not collateralized. You might ask, how does it keep the peg? It creates incentives to stabilize trading and market incentive to stabilize its peg to the $1. So when it goes under peg, the supply is being decreased using something called pods. We won't get into pods on what they are in this lecture because the, protocol, the, pro, the whole protocol has a lot of features and a lot of layers and it's quite complicated. And if it's above a peg, if it's traded above one US dollar, then there is a mechanism to increase the bin supply, mint more bin and reward user more. So to basically inflate the supply of bins so the price will go down eventually because there will be selling power that sells bins tokens and the price eventually will go down to $1. So you can look at it like there is a stablecoin that is trying to always be stable and when it goes above peg, there are mechanisms that are going de to decrease the price and when it goes below peg, there are also mechanisms that are going to increase the price and incentivize people to do these trading actions that will do this thing to the price. So this is how a Bean's a protocol website looks like. We have seasons, we have the Bean price. As you can see, it's currently at peg, 99 cents, almost peg. We have something called pod rate and we have a chart of the liquidity. This is after the attack. This is the Bean's protocol which survived Bean stock protocol and exist up to deals this day. So before we dive deep into the attack and the exploitation, let's understand how the Beans protocol works. It works with diamond proxies. So you know already what are proxies and you, you know what are transparent and upgradable proxies. And diamond proxies basically allow the protocol to add features and add functionalities as models which are called facets very, very easily. So you can basically create a new smart contract or update, create a new facet, which is basically a smart contract that executes some kind of code and you can add it to the protocol and add functionality and remove functionality, remove facets and upgrade facets. So this is how Diamond Proxies calls. And obviously we use delegate call to forward the call from the proxy to the implementation contract. Now. As I mentioned, functionality can be added and remove it, removed upon governance, right? So Beanstalk protocol has a governance, on-chain governance mechanism where people can make proposals and other people can vote on them. And then we can add and remove facets, which is on other words means like code to the protocol, smart contracts that control the protocol and add and remove features and make decisions based on governance voting mechanism. Here I want to show you one very known and respected, which I like personally, DeFi educator that created a video about Beanstalk protocol and explained about what is the protocol about, how it works and all its features. And let's see what he has to say about governance. So we're gonna see now a small snippets from the Calculator Guy video, which is a great guy, by the way, I have nothing bad to say about it, but I just want to show, to show you 
what DeFi users and crypto users say usually and how much they care about governance. There is governance, but most people really don't care about governance. Um, and I've talked to enough people in this space to know that governance is kind of like, a, I don't want to say a gimmick, but you know, the creators of the protocol are still going to make the decisions. They're going to say, you can choose any color as long as it's black. Uh, to some extent, but I don't want to put down doubt. So as you can see in the video, he says that no one cares about governance because they don't really matter because the creators of the protocol can actually do whatever they want because maybe they have a lot of voting power and a lot of tokens and no one in DeFi really cares about governance. Well, we do care and we want to understand how the governance in Beanstalk works. So in Beanstalk, we have something called BIP. BIP stands for Beanstalk Improvement Proposal. And in order to influence these governance decisions and to vote on them, you need to have some token called stock, which is the governance token. How do you get stock? The more liquidity you stake and deposit into the Beanstalk protocol, you get stock, which has some kind of value in form of bean, and also you get voting power to vote on proposals. And here you can see some proposals, some BAPs on their governance. There were some proposals and some of them are here. Very interesting, as you can see here, BAP4 and BAP5 to get some funds for Trail of Beats audit and Omniska audit to audit companies that will audit the smart contracts of Beanstalk protocol and make sure they are secure. And this is the BIP5 proposal where $155,000 were paid to an auditing firm to make sure that the smart contracts and the protocol of Beanstalk are safe. So why do I show you this? I show you what governance look like and that actually the protocol was audited by multiple auditing firms, known auditing firms such as Trail of Bits and in the past and Omniska. And basically uh, just to show you how it works and that the protocol was audited. So how do we actually propose new proposal for the governance or vote on them? So basically you go to a page in the website called Silo, you stake either liquidity pools of Curve, of a Uniswap or maybe Beans token. And based on the amount that you staked, you get another token called stock. Using the stock token, which is the governance token, you can vote on proposals, you can create proposals and basically affect the governance and the future of the bean stock protocol. Anyone with some stock tokens can make new proposals and then anyone can vote on these proposals. Now, how do these proposals are being executed? These proposals are basically called to be executed with the permissions of the Beanstalk smart contract highest access control permissions. So basically it means that you can execute new code, new smart contract, new logic on behalf of the protocol and its liquidity. How do you ex execute it? You use the commit function as mentioned here in the slides. And this commit function is basically has some kind of cooldown or time lock of seven days. So from the moment a proposal was proposed and voted on, we need to wait at least seven days until we can actually execute it in case we are in favor, in case we have majority in favor of this proposal. So this is a security mechanism to make sure that no one is exploiting the governance mechanism to hurt the protocol. Sounds secure, right? Now, the problem is that there is also another function called emergency commit, which you can send a BIP, a proposal that, that includes all the proposal, all the voting, the smart contract, the, the facet, the implementation that you want to execute on behalf of the protocol. And if it's an emergency, you can just sub, you can use the emergency commit and you need to wait only one day. You don't need to wait seven days. So it's because it's emergency, right? So in order to execute a BAP with emergency commit, you need to have something called super majority, which means that you need to have more than 67% of the stock supply of the governance power of, of yes votes in order to execute such proposal. Well, now that we understand the, use, the issue, let's see the attacker side and see how he prepared the attack very thoroughly and how the attack took place. So one day later, we had a new malicious governance proposal. Before he made a proposal, he made some preparation. So he funded his malicious wallet through Synapse Bridge and through 
Tornado Cash. As you can see, we have 100 ETH that were sent to the attacker EOA account, the attacker wallet that initiated the attack. The next action that the attacker did is basically using this ETH to buy some beans token. You need to stake some beans token to get stock token so you can create a new proposal. So as you can see over here, the attacker swapped his ETH to bean and then deposited beans into the bean stock protocol, the bean stock smart contract in order to have some governance power. And right after he got some governance power, he created new proposals, BIP 18, which was an empty proposal. Yeah, that's weird, as you can see over here. And another proposal, BIP 19, to donate 250K USD to Ukraine and 10K actually also to the uh, one who initiated the proposal, so 260K in total, and the name of the facet, the implementation contract to run this uh, donation was init BIP 18. So the attacker deceived the community and the governance by basically the naming the, the facet, the smart contract with the implementation as init BIP 18. Like these both proposals are connected and they have the same cause to donate 250K to Ukraine and that's it. But this was not the case. As you can see, this is some kind of ancient proof where you can see that we have here the two proposals, EIP 18 and EIP 19, these two proposals. And beforehand, he created the malicious uh, EIP, EIP 19 faucet smart contract, uh, which is just sending money to Ukrainian association wallet. From just proposing two small proposals, how did the attacker able to drain so much money, actually all the money from the protocol? So this is kind of the end of the attack. As you can see over here, we have two transactions, one transaction for contract creation and right after the laundering phase, you can see already that right after the contract creation, the attacker is sending 100 ETH to Tornado Cash and laundering his stolen money, which tells us that the attacker happened upon construction. So all the logic of the exploitation happened upon this con malicious contract constructor. This is something that we learned from this order of transactions. So let's see what this malicious contract did and how the attack took place. The first step, the first thing that the attacker did is to take $1 billion flash loans and flash swaps from multiple protocols. As you can see here, he took a lot of money from Aave, he took $350 million of DAI, $500 million USDC, and $150 million of USDT. In addition, the attacker also took BIN tokens as a flash swap from Uniswap V2 BIN per smart contract. He also took some another flash swap from Sushi Swap per smart contract of $11.5 million of LUSD, which is another stable called coin, in order to basically fund his attack. We'll see in a minute what he did with all this capital and all this money. So what did the attacker do with all these flash loan and flash swaps? Okay, first what he did, he added liquidity to Beanstalk, right? So there are different liquidity sources. There is liquidity in Curve, there is liquidity in Uniswap, and he simply used all this capital to add liquidity. As we can see over here, the attacker is adding the liquidity to Curve, basically the triple, the triple DAI, USDC, and USDT. He's adding those stable coins to Curve, and then is using this uh, curve liquidity pools, convert them to some other LUSD tokens, and eventually is trying to get the most amount of bean curve liquidity and bean Uniswap liquidity to eventually stake in the Silo smart contract to get those stock governance token. He's using all his this liquidity that he got from the flash loans and flash swaps to add liquidity for bean and stake it in the smart contract to get governance tokens and governance power, as you can see over here. Now, after the attacker possesses so much liquidity in the smart contract, he has more than 70% of the voting power, which is more than 67%, which is the super majority. And therefore, he can recreate using create his original proposal for BIP 18, right? So 
in the constructor itself, he created the other malicious smart contract that is actually have, having the more malicious fluid logic, which is stealing all the liquidity from the bean stock smart contracts. So he deployed this real, not deceptive, the, the, he made a deception, but deployed the real smart contract and used all his voting power in order to vote yes and execute it. And this malicious facet of BIP-18 that was added later on to BIP-18 was basically taking all the liquidity and all the liquidity that was staked in the Beanstalk smart contract and set it to the malicious attacker smart contract, right? Because he need all this money eventually uh, to steal it and to pay back the flash loans and fees and flash swaps fees that he took from Uniswap, SushiSwap and Aave. And here you can see that after he exploited the protocol, he executed the malicious facet, the malicious BAP18 real proposal. Now he has enough capital to get to pay back all the money back to Aave, to Uniswap and to SushiSwap and is also being left with $79 million. Now, what are the next step of the attackers? Exactly like Homer Simpson meme. He is going to disappear into the darkness. And the way he's going to do it is through Tornado Cash mixing protocol. So the hacker is using Tornado Cash in order to mix to, he converted all the money to ETH so he won't get blacklisted by USDC smart contract or USDT smart contract. He knows that in ETH he cannot be blacklisted and then he's sending those ETH hundreds of ETH, hundred and hundred as you can see here on the on-chain transactions. He's sending them and deposit them, depositing them through Tornado Cash to mix them and launder them and get away with the profits. And the results are devastating. The BINS token obviously crushed to zero, he lost his bag and lost 100% of its value and all the users and the community and the protocol just woke up to a disaster. Now, the solution, you say, you might say, what is the solution? How come the Beanstalk protocol survived? They removed governance. They removed basically on-chain governance. Since the attack, there is no on-chain governance. There is no way to, to vote on proposals that will automatically be executed after a few days. They still have a voting and governance, but this is happening off-chain. So you can vote on proposal, you can create proposals, but you cannot execute them if they succeeded. There is the team, there is the protocol developers, which see which proposals succeeded and which one failed, and they execute them manually. This is their solution to this horrible attack. So let's summarize what we have today. We talk about Beanstalk protocol and how it works. We saw that sometimes, and most of the times, DeFi users don't care about governance and they should care about governance because we saw how a governance issue led to a very devastating and a huge attack. And we saw all the phases of the attack, how the attacker thought how he disguised his malicious proposals, how he prepared and funded his wallet with Tornado Cash and Synapse Bridge, how he executed all the steps of the attack and laundered the money. I was Johnny Time and this was the Beanstalk biggest DAO hack governance hack case study. Hey friends, welcome back. It's nice to see you. You've learned a lot recently. I wanna give you a huge round of applause for making it through part one of this insane curriculum. We have learned a t We've learned about MEV, signature replays, re-entrancy attacks, the audit process, stateful fuzzing, invariance, arbitrage, DeFi, borrowing and lending, flash loans, EVM compatibility between chains, Uniswap, compound, verifiable randomness, centralization, denial of service, failure to initiate, access controls, oracle manipulation, and so much more. And in doing these last five security reviews or audit, you've built up a portfolio. Like I was saying since the beginning of this, the way you get better is by continuing to practice this skill. Repetition is the mother of skill. And we had you go through five separate security reviews. And guess what? We've got some more for part two. But of course, the one that we didn't go through together was Vault Guardians. Now, like I was saying before, this is the most challenging security review or audit out of all of them. Why? 
Well, first off, it's the largest code base. So we saw in some of our security reviews that oftentimes bugs don't come until the end. And your first couple of audits or security reviews, this can be really discouraging. You can feel like you're stupid. You don't know what you're doing. Oh my goodness, this is so hard. This is overwhelming. There's so much code. I don't know how to... It's okay. Take a deep breath and relax. You have a game plan. You know what to do. You've done this five times already. You show up to the code base. You go through the scope. What are we doing? What commit hash? What compatibilities are you working with? What tokens? What chains? You know the game plan. And then what comes after that? Well, you start to do some recon with the first step being what? Understanding what it's supposed to do at a high level. You're going to read the docs. You're going to talk to the team. You're going to maybe write some diagrams, draw some diagrams. You're going to take notes. You're going to dump your thoughts down on paper. Oh yeah, Patrick, that's not that hard. We've already done it five times. What happens next? Oh, it's finally time to start looking through the code. That's okay. You know how to do that too. You know you're not going to find stuff in the beginning. You know that you're just trying to figure out what does this code do? How can I understand this code? Is this code doing what the protocol is intending it to do? That's not so bad. Yeah, it might take me a couple of days, but I'm just trying to figure out what the code is doing. That's it. I'm going to take notes in the code. I'm going to leave questions, questions for me to follow up on. I'm going to try to understand what the code does. Oh yeah, Patrick, I can do that. Oh, but, but then I have to actually start identifying vulnerabilities and figure out how to attack the code. Well, you know how to do that too. You've done that more than five times. We've found a ton of bugs. And the more you do this, the more bugs you'll be able to find. We've learned, we've taught you how to spot out a lot of common bugs. Oh, you notice their test suite isn't very good. You can write an invariant stateful fuzzing test suite to find bugs. You know of many different types of attacks that you can look for off of your checklist that you're going to follow. Are there any weird ERC-20s here? Are there, is there MEV I should think about? You've got a game plan. So this Vault Guardians code base is much bigger than any of the code bases that we've done so far. And it's going to be the most challenging one because I'm not going to be hand-holding you. And it's going to be the most challenging one because I'm not going to walk through it with you. And I want you to take this as a challenge. Get a partner. Find someone on the CodeHawks Discord, on the Cypher Discord, or wherever, and say, hey, let's go through this together as a learning experience. Or you can skip that, grab a buddy, and just go directly to CodeHawks and try to jump into a code base. I will recommend Vault Guardians, though, because I put a lot of bugs in there. <laughs> There's a lot of issues with the Vault Guardians code base so that you can rack up some wins and feel really good about finding bugs in a large code base and not getting overwhelmed by dealing with a large code base. But whatever you want to do, right now, I do not want you to go to part two. Patrick, right now, I do not want you to go to part two. I want you to do one of two things. Pause, do not go to part two until you do one of these two things. Number one, compete in a real competitive audit, you know, on CodeHawks or really wherever for real actual money. The extra adrenaline you'll get from these competitions will get you in the zone. The extra adrenaline from dealing with a real code base will get you in the zone, get you feeling pumped. You're going to use all the skills that you learned in this course in that competitive audit or do the Vault Guardians. Either way, you are going to get experience doing a much more sophisticated, a much larger code base and getting comfortable with the uncomfortability, with the overwhelming feeling of like, oh, I don't know if I can do this is incredibly important because the more you get over that feeling, it's kind of like going to the gym. You'll just keep getting better and better and better at it. And every single time you come to a code base and every single time you come to a code base, you'll gain the confidence looking at the code base and you'll be able to say, I can do this. I've done this before. Build that security skill. Go to, to the, go to the security gym and level up those security muscles. So first off, so to recap here, number one, huge congratulations on getting this far. Honestly, you have learned more than 80% of the security. Honestly, by getting this far, you are better than maybe 70% of the current security landscape. So congratulations on getting this far and learning everything that you've learned. Number two, do not go to part two until you do a CodeHawks competitive audit or you do the Vault Guardians audit with a buddy. It is incredibly helpful for now and in the future for you to learn how to do peer programming or peer auditing or peer security reviewing. Teaming up with a buddy is one of the quickest ways to learn new ways to think about attacking these code bases. And then finally, number three, for those of you watching this on YouTube, I'm not putting part, for those of you watching this on YouTube, I'm not putting part two on YouTube. 
Why? Well, because I need you to go to Cypher and Updraft and watch the rest of part two there. Why are we doing this? Well, number one, scrubbing through a video on YouTube sucks for those of you who have been doing it. In a long, long video like this, it can be very difficult to keep track of where you were, where your spot is, etc. We've specifically made the Cypher and Updraft website to increase your learning experience. And then number, and the second reason we want to push you there is because I'm going to be making a lot of changes to this course, to making it better, improving it, giving you more context. And on YouTube, I can't update my videos. On Cypher and Updraft, I can. So to always have the most up-to-date version of this course, be sure to follow this along on Cypher and Updraft. But at the same time, be sure to share and like this video so that the YouTube algorithm, but at the same time, be sure to share and like this video and maybe just keep it playing on in the background so that the YouTube algorithm, so that the YouTube, so that the YouTube algorithm likes this video and promotes it to other people. Your security journey, your security learnings aren't over yet. Part two is, part two is where we focus even harder on the tooling and some of the more philosophical best practices around this space. Stolen private keys are still one of the largest attack vectors in this space. And we need to make sure you know how to keep your wallets and your private keys safe. We haven't gone into formal verification, which is a mathematical way to prove our smart contracts do something a certain way. And we still haven't cracked open Solidity and the EVM. We got to look under the hood and we're going to teach you. We're going to make you an opcode savant so that you could go to a smart contract on Etherscan. And even if it's not verified, you can have a pretty good idea of what it's doing. Yes, this is possible. And we're going to teach you how to do it. And then finally, in part two, we're going to go over post deployment best practices because security doesn't stop with a security review. Security is a journey and an audit or a security review is actually just one small part of the entire thing. Granted, a very, very important part. It's still just one part. Post deployment practices are incredibly important and we're going to teach you how to do that. And additionally, if for the, and additionally, for those of you that want to become bug hunters or bug bounty hunters, we're going to teach you how to do that as well. So I must stress this huge congratulations for getting here. This has not, this has been a difficult course and I know it's my most difficult one yet. We've been beating the hackers, which is phenomenal, but we need to pump some more knowledge into your brain so you can get even stronger. So I need you to pause the video go do code hawks or vault guardians so that you can get the taste of what it really feels like out in the arena so that you can get a taste of what it really feels like once you do that come back and we'll keep going with the course to level you up even more do not go to part two until you've done a competitive audit or gone through vault guardians with that being said thank you so much for watching part one and i look forward to seeing you in part two